<laughs> there are two versions of this legend that I know. It's called the Devil's Footprint. The first is about a construction worker that was aggravated with a boulder that would not budge. The man stepped on the boulder and said, I will give my soul to the devil, this boulder will move. By the next day, the boulder had moved and there was an imprint of a human foot and a hoof print of the devil. The man was never seen again. The other version is about a farmer that was having a terrible harvest. He then said, I will give my soul to the devil if I had a bountiful harvest. Indeed, the farmer's harvest was bountiful, and he made plenty of money. The farmer was quite pleased with himself until the day the devil came to collect. The farmer refused to give the devil what he wanted, and a chase ensued. They ran all around the farmer's land, and the chase ended when they reached a cliff. I believe the footprints happened when they had their final fight at that cliff edge. I've heard many stories about the devil's footprint being haunted. My fiance told me about a occurrence that happened when he was there with his brothers when he was about 13. He said that his brother was contacted by a ghost, according to him, and his brother swears this very day he was standing in front of the church doors and being a rebellious young man that he was, he attempted to kick the doors open. At the moment his foot hit the door, it swung open and knocked him off the steps. Now, you may be thinking that there was probably someone on the other side of the door playing a prank, but keep this in mind, the doors open inward, not outward. I also know someone that was there very late at night and she swears that she saw hooded men walking in the edge of the woods. I myself had an experience of sorts. One night, a friend and I decided to go find the place. We drove and drove and we couldn't find it. When my friend was so sure she had driven too far, she turned back. We figured we better wait until daylight to look for it. So we turned on the road that we thought would take us home. And what did we see? The old cemetery in that unmistakable white church. Of course, we freaked out. My friend swerved and barely escaped going off the road. By this time, we were both feeling a little unsettling feeling in our chests. Now, whether this was due to some unwelcome presence or fear, I'm not certain. I'm assuming the latter. However, needless to say, we didn't stop there that night. My name is Bobby, and I was checking out your website, and I decided I should send in my own story. We live in Gross Point Shores, Michigan. This event happened on Monday, August 15th, 2005. One day, my brother named Vince was on the computer at about 4 o'clock when he heard a scream. He ran upstairs to find me and my older brother named Sam. Vince asked what was wrong, and we asked him what he was talking about, and he said he heard a woman scream, and we said nobody screamed. We were also the only ones in the house. We got scared but eventually thought that Vince was probably hearing things and forgot about it. But a week later, me and Sam saw this website and decided to check if something was haunting our house. We checked everywhere, but found nothing. But just as we were about to give up, Sam said to me that we never checked the attic. This was the first time that anyone was up there in the attic in a very long time. We got to the attic door and opened up the hatch and a ladder came unfolded from the top of the door. We started climbing up the ladder and got to the attic and it was all dark. I felt the wall right behind me 
and found a light switch. I flipped the switch and a dim light turned on. There was this old rocking chair rocking back and forth, the one that my grandmother used to have before she died. We totally forgot that we had gotten it and threw it up in the attic. Either way, we were freaked out. After about two seconds, we heard a scream so loud that it knocked me backward against Sam. We climbed as fast as we could down the ladder and shut the attic door. We were so scared that we didn't tell anyone except Vince about what happened. We checked the time and it was exactly 4.06. We now know that Vince heard the scream from the attic a week earlier. All we know about the people that lived here before us is that they were the Andersons and that they were an old couple that lived here and raised their kids here. I don't think it was my grandma's spirit because she was always a gentle soul and wouldn't scare us like that. Anyway, after all the kids moved out and Miss Anderson died, a short while after that, he sold his house to us about four years ago. I believe Miss Anderson was the one who screamed. I guess she was mad that we stole her house from her. When I was a freshman in high school, my parents moved us from the city in central New York to a big, empty house in the country. Little did we know that the house is haunted. So many things happened there that even my skeptical dad began to believe that we were sharing the house with someone or something else. My best ghost encounter occurred in the middle of the day. I walked into the bathroom and saw from the corner of my eye someone that I thought was my youngest sister. I said, hey, Lori, but she didn't answer me. Annoyed, I turned to find out what her problem was, only to realize that it wasn't her at the sink. An old woman with gray hair up in a bun, a pink flower dress, and a white apron was drying her hands. She turned to look at me, and then she disappeared. We weren't often frightened of the ghosts and miss them when things seem to be quiet for too long. We would lament that they didn't like us anymore. One day, I was in the house and I went into the shower. All of a sudden, there was a huge noise. I thought a plane hit the house or at least there was a terrible car accident outside. I jumped out, grabbed my rope and went to investigate. I found nothing out of order at all so I got back into the shower. Not two minutes later, I heard that huge noise again. I jumped out, shaking this time, and checked everywhere, but again, there was nothing to find. I decided to skip my shower. I had a ghostly nightmare about this house before even moving in. My family moved into the house, and from day one, things were creepy. People before had moved out in a hurry, and their family broke apart almost instantly in four months. They all spread to four different places. When we moved in, we all got terribly sick within the first month. My mom had a life-threatening experience. My sister ran away. All the pets in the house died mysteriously, with no known cause of death. My parents divorced. All of this happened in only four months. I walked into the house after school one day, and I heard my name being called. I knew no one was home because none of the cars were in the driveway. The voice calling my name sounded exactly like my mother, and I looked all around for her, even though I knew that she was presently in the hospital. Within the next few days, and a few more creepy, paranormal events, all four of us left in just as much of a hurry as the one before us, leaving most of our personal belongings. We all split, each of us in a different car, 
to different places away from each other and away from the house. I will never go back to see it, nor would I wish the haunting of the house on anyone else. Hello, I lived at this house from 97 to 99. It was in Atlanta. My family and many of my friends were witnesses to the occurrences, voices, electronics malfunctioning, dark figures. It happened day and night, but mostly at night. It is an older white home near the river, and for a while, we had a rat problem. The plumbers had left a hole under the bathroom sink. The rats, who are fond of shiny objects, left two human molars, complete with silver fillings, on the bathroom floor on two separate occasions. The back of the home had a foul odor off and on, and the crawl space had been cemented over. I'm an investigator for the state, not a hysteric. But the place made a believer out of me, my family, and half a dozen friends. My then four-year-old son complained of the man in the mirror with a string around his neck. Voices were male and female, also a small child. I have often felt the crawl space needed to be examined, just never could figure out a way to ask the officials to do such. I truly think that there is a body her bodies under that house. Myself and a girlfriend watched as a man-shaped shadow moved across the dining room wall into the kitchen where the light turned on. Well, we're checking out if you can get the new owner's permission. So when I was about 17, my family had just moved back to Canada from living in the USA. It was a bit sudden, and being a family of six, it was a little bit of a scramble to find a place to house all of us before the snow hit. So, my mom and dad decided to live in an old house that my grandpa had on his property, just for the duration of the approaching winter ahead. The house was my great uncle's, and my grandpa skidded from my brother's property to his place. Now my grandpa has two quarter sections, and this house is tucked way back away from the main house, so the powers ran from the main house, and with it being so far away, there is no running water. This house is old, so to add to the running water, there also is in heat, only a wood stove, just to give you an idea of where we were living in. Me, being a 17 year old. I often stayed in town and didn't stay there very often. I specifically remember the first time it happened. I was in my bed. I was the only one who would stay downstairs with the wood stove. Everyone wanted to sleep upstairs since it was warmer. So I was just starting to fall asleep and I started to feel the room get really heavy. I remember the feeling of not being alone. The doorway didn't have a door on it. It only had a beaded curtain, and I could feel it standing there. I then remember having the feeling of total fear rush over me and frozen to my core with it. Then, it moved closer, and I felt the bed move and someone crawl right beside me, not in a way that was super noticeable, but in a sneaky, slow, sloth moving type of way. I specifically remember wanting to vomit with fear. Then I felt it, the feeling of an unshaven face rub against mine. I scrambled out of bed, holding my blanket and ran up the stairs to my parents' room. I was so out of my mind with fear that I couldn't even scream. I slept on the floor with my dad's side of the bed. The next morning, mom was wondering why her 17-year-old daughter was curled up at the foot of her bed, and I told her what happened. Later that morning, we walked over to my grandpa's house to have breakfast and go chat. My mom brought up my wild story, 
my grandpa and grandma silently listened as my mom was laughing at the last bit of the story. My grandparents got really serious and turned to each other. Apparently, this has been an issue in the old house and they didn't want to tell us, hoping we didn't acknowledge it, then it wouldn't bother us. I can honestly say it didn't feel angry or upset, it just wanted to cuddle. I didn't stay there much after that. I moved in with a cousin in town. In 1978, my parents purchased a relatively new house in Niceville, Florida. The land the house had been built on had previously been a swamp that was drained to make way for the housing subdivision. Nothing bad had ever happened in the house, yet after living in the house for a short time, we all began to notice odd things. It started the night I broke up with my fiance. My parents had got out for the evening and I was in my bedroom crying. Suddenly, I realized I was not alone. I looked up and I saw a woman dressed in the turn of the century clothing. She had a look of extreme empathy on her face. I did a double take. Never take your eyes off of them, I've learned. And my visitor was gone. My brother brought her engagement ring into my room so that I could take it to work the next day and have it sized. When I woke up from my nap, I got the ring off the dresser and noticed that it wasn't quite right. I got on my lupe and discovered that the ring had been squashed. I took the ring to my parents and showed it to them. Dad examined the ring. As a scientist, he was a little more observant than I was. He pointed out that the ring appeared to have been squashed from the right beside the head that held the diamond, as if it had been sitting on the rear shank of the ring. And an incredible force put on it that literally broke the head from the shank without leaving a single scratch or gouge mark. That kind of spooked me since I had been sleeping with the ring on the nightstand next to my head and it had been fine prior to being placed by my bed. However, events would soon unfold that made us all realize that the house was indeed haunted by the lady, but she was a friendly ghost, provided you were nice to her family. After having moved to the house, my mom was in a terrible car accident, which almost killed her. She was in the hospital for over six weeks, and even after she got out, she was in and out of the hospital repeatedly. By this time I was married and out of the house, but my middle sister's kids would stay over while my sister worked nights. My niece slept in my old room, which seemed to soon become the epicenter for activity, perhaps because of the pre-adolescent age. It started with her being awakened by the feeling that someone was sitting on the bed. She turned on the light and saw depression in the bed as if someone were sitting there. As she watched, the depression slowly lifted out as if the person sitting there had stood up. She was too frightened to sleep in the room after that, so her brother slept there for her. She was awakened every night by the sound of a dresser drawer being pulled out and rattled. At first he thought it was Granny but then he turned the light on and there was no one there. The final straw for my sister's kids came when they were sleeping over one night. Mom had just been released from the hospital yet again and was sitting up in the den. Dad had gone to bed. Suddenly, Dad was awakened by the sound of the smoke alarms going off. He ran into the den and found mom passed out. 
She had been in incredible pain since her accident and had begun stashing pills for a grand escape. That night, she had gotten so depressed that she ended up taking all the pills that she had been hoarding. There was no evidence of smoke in the house, not even mom's usual cigarette smoke. By this time, the smoke alarms had stopped blaring their alarms, but dad stood there, surveying the scene and thinking about how much pain mom was in and how horrible her life had been since the accident and even going as far as to whether it was even right for him to decide that mom was not entitled to escape the horror her life had become. Then the smoke alarms went off again. Dad figured somebody was trying to tell him something and he called 911. The next day after we had all been to the hospital to make sure that mom was going to be okay, we all gathered at my parents' house. I asked Ed why he had called the paramedics. I felt like the doctors who had saved my mom's life after the accident had not taken into consideration the lack of quality of life she would have, and I felt like mom was entitled to a reprieve from the constant torment she was in. Dad looked at me kind of funny and explained about the smoke detectors. Then he said that when he had gotten home later that night, he had torn each of the smoke detectors apart and there was nothing wrong with any of them, nor was there any reason they should have gone off in the first place. Once Dad told us this, we all sat there with odd looks on our faces and started talking about the lady. By this time, I would seen her twice. My older sister had seen her once, and my skeptical scientist dad even admitted to having seen her. We began comparing notes and found us finishing each other's stories and descriptions. We had all seen the same lady dressed in the same clothing, and none of us had mentioned it to the others for fear of being ridiculed. As time went by, the lady continued to watch over her family. After my dad's death in 1998, my then husband and I were in the den of the house after we had cleaned out the possessions and cleaned the house up. I'd left a book on the counter and X went back to get it. Our marriage was on the rocks and he was becoming increasingly abusive to me something that the lady didn't seem to care for. He had always laughed at our family ghost stories up till the day, but when he went back in the house to get my book, he came out of the house shaking and white. He had felt a cold hand brush across his face. Then, when he didn't leave fast enough, he felt the same cold hand pushing him in the back, propelling him to the door. The lady was trying to tell him that she did not appreciate the way she was treating one of her kids, nor was he welcome in her home. After that, the lady began dropping by my house. I always knew she was around because the stove timer would go off for no reason and the dresser drawers would rattle. After I left the abusive hobby and moved to the Midwest, the lady would come by and visit me there from time to time, always setting off the timer on the stove, rattling drawers, playing tricks with the blinds, anything she could do to let me know she was keeping an eye out for me. I realized that this is unusual for ghosts to leave their primary residence and to actually follow people from home to home, but I talked to some friends who all felt like the lady was probably a female ancestor who had died in childbirth, so she felt responsible for looking out for her family. After going through the family archives, we found a photo of my great-grandmother. She had died of appendicitis when she was pregnant. The baby also died. The woman in the photo looked like the lady. My sister is now living in the house. 
when she first moved in, she put some pots in the cabinet, then went to the bathroom for a minute. When she came back out, the pots were sitting on the floor. Earrings and rings that had been lost for years, some in different houses that we lived in, suddenly appeared on the cabinet or in my sister's jewelry box. Unseen hands frequently pull back the curtains to look outside, and my sister's dog loves to romp and play with the unseen visitor. I could go on and on about all the poltergeist activity, some that seemed to be coming from the lady, others that seemed to be coming from my deceased dad. From fax machines that go off when they aren't plugged in, my deceased dad's voice calling me to wake me up when the gas fireplace developed a leak, even luggage being set on its end. Weird stuff just follows my sister and I around. Just two nights ago, while laying in bed, I was awakened by the bed shaking. I sat up and looked around and found my husband sound asleep and the door securely closed against kitty visitors. I laid back down and snuggled up to my hobby, thinking that he just had a chronic jerk that shook the bed when it suddenly hit again. The whole bed kind of went whop as if a 20 pound weight had been dropped on it. This time, I knew that there were no cats in the room and since I had been snuggled up to my hobby, I knew he had not jerked in his sleep. It's nice having your own guardian spirit to watch over you, but it can really interfere with your sleeping. I know that some people think that we're all nuts, or engaging in what shrinks call magical thinking, but every time I start to question my own sanity, I get another visit. It should be interesting when we move to my dad's hometown this spring. I imagine the visits will become a regular thing. Growing up in rural northern Wisconsin, there were few opportunities for earning cash, aside from service positions and agricultural work. Coming from a farm family myself, as a youth, I would hire myself out to farmers to help with the work on their respective farms, mostly crops and dairy cattle. If you never have this experience, it may come as a surprise that these farms are usually isolated and could be quite unfriendly, creepy, and sometimes dangerous. Physical injuries like losing an eye or a limb or even a life were not uncommon. This is the setting for my story. One January, I was a hired boy at a dairy farm owned by an elderly couple with whom I was acquainted with through a parish church. The farmer's house was heated by a wood furnace in the basement where I was lodged and among my other jobs. I had to bring in the wood and tend the fire. One day, while carrying wood down the steps, I felt pushed, which caused me to slip and fall down the stairs, landing on the concrete floor, which knocked me out temporarily. I must have been out only a minute or two, as I awoke in pain and found the wood scattered all over. The farmer was very stern, and I feared how you would react to a mess and me not being busy with the work to which I had been assigned. When he did see me, he asked where I'd been and what I'd been doing, and so I explained it to him. As I suspected, he was cross with me. Later that night, over supper, he told me a story which made me rethink my staying there. He related that some time ago, his wife, Although a Catholic like me had been dabbling in the occult, things like divination, astrology, cards, etc. Odd things began happening around the farm, 
and it was no longer prospering. He told me that the last straw had been when he awoke to find her levitating above their bed in the middle of the night. They decided to call the parish priest. The priest whom I will call Father X in the story was a mature, spiritual, and virtuous man whom I knew and respected. His brother was likewise a priest and an exorcist. The couple explained what was happening on their farm and house. Father X had to get rid of the occult books and the paraphernalia, and after hearing their confession and absolving them, offered to bless and cleanse the house with a kind of minor exorcism. Before getting out his handbook of rituals in his stolen holy water, he had them close and lock the doors and windows for some reason. He went through the residence, leading the couple in prayers and reciting the house blessing in minor prayers of exorcism, all the while sprinkling each room with holy water. When they reached the last room, which was the kitchen, Father X was finishing the prayers, and after everyone said Amen, the kitchen door, which led outside, unlocked by itself, opened, and then slammed shut. Father X then explained that this is why he had locked the doors previously, to make sure that by the door opening and closing by invisible force, he could tell by that sign that the spirit had really left. The farmer went on to explain that he liked the instruction that Father X had left him with, namely, that the devil is like a dog on a leash. The demons are all restrained by the power of God, he said, chained, as it were, and they cannot really hurt you directly unless you come within their reach. Occult practices, blasphemies, and even grave sins can put people in places within the perimeter of the influence of evil spirits, and so if you want to avoid being harmed by them, don't come near them any more than you would approach a vicious dog that has been chained. I asked the farmer if the basin where I was lodging was also blessed. The farmer thought for a moment and said he did not recall that it was. The door to the basin was right outside of the kitchen door. After the experience with my fall that day, in the story that the farmer told me about what had transpired, I determined that I would not stay there another week. I left and didn't return. I didn't explain why, except to say that I wanted to be closer to the parish church and I wanted to go to daily mass. I did not have my own transportation at that time, except my bicycle. The farmer was unhappy that I left as I was hardworking and well behaved, but for me, there were plenty of other farms where I could work that did not have such problems. Throughout my life I had seen and experienced a few things that I can only describe as supernatural. Everything I'm about to tell you about actually happened and I will describe each experience as I remember them. The first thing I can remember happened whenever I was only a young boy, growing up outside a village in Northern Ireland called Besbrook. It was during the winter because we had a heavy snowfall the previous night and I was outside playing with my two brothers. After a while, I went inside to warm up because my hands were frozen. My mother told me to take off my boots so that I wouldn't tramp snow all over the house. I sat down at the table with a bowl of soup in front of me, and it was then that I noticed something out of the corner of my eye in the hall leading from the kitchen to the living room. I turned to see what it was, and what I saw absolutely terrified me. I saw the figure of a woman walking down the hall towards the kitchen. I just got up 
and ran out the door without putting on my boots and jacket into the snow and refused to come back inside, even though my mother insisted that there was no woman in the house. Over the next number of years, nothing happened except what sounded like somebody walking around the house. Even when the rest of the household was in bed or away, everyone heard the noises but chose to ignore them. Then one Saturday morning while I was still in bed, I was shooken awake and told to get up and come down to breakfast. Whenever I opened my eyes, there was no one in the room, so I assumed that they had already gone downstairs. While I was getting dressed, a voice was calling from downstairs for me to hurry up. When I did get down to the kitchen, there was no one around. Everyone else was still in bed. A few days after, my youngest brother claims to have saw a young boy standing in my parents' bedroom who just stood there looking at him. Shortly after this, someone unknown tacked my brother in his bed, leaving him with a black eye. The next few years were quiet except for the noises. Nothing else that I know of has happened in that house, except for the noises, but I did tell you that. I lived outside a village. The best way to get to the village is through a wooded area, and this place is a very strange place. I could distinctly remember a moment when I had to walk through these woods to get to the village, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I saw a circle of people in white robes just standing in a circle and holding hands. I was so scared about what was happening that I ran the other direction and no longer wanted to run through those woods ever again. I actually had a friend of mine who was walking through the woods and he swears to this day that he saw a woman just flying from the distance from one side to the other looked like a witch, but she was floating, had really dark black hair, and it just looked like she faded out. These are the only things I've seen in my life, and with that last story, my friend has seen, but I've heard other stories by people I know. The shop at the bottom of the road is said to be haunted by the ghosts of the seven British people killed there in the 80s whenever the original patrol station was blown up. I mentioned earlier, I'm from Northern Ireland. There is a high viaduct in the area, which is used as a railway line. 18 people died constructing it, one for each arch, and numerous others have off themselves off of it. The stories are that at times, you can see these people, and they all look sad. There is also the blood on one wall in a friend's house, and no matter how many times it is painted over, the blood still comes through. All this is true, and has happened within a square mile of where I live. My friend from Arizona and I made our first trip to the Queen Mary together. We happened to run into a paranormal researcher when we were on a tour and decided to stay the night. We rented a room with two beds so the researcher could stay with us and show us around the old boat in the middle of the night when the most activity had been reported. We attempted to fall asleep around 11 p.m. I managed to sleep quite easily and wasn't scared about sleeping in one of the reported haunted rooms. About five minutes after I fell asleep, my friend wakes me up. The first thing I remember was hearing a staticky voice and thought it was a radio. It wasn't until she asked me if I heard the voice. That was when I realized there was no radio anywhere in my room. My instant reaction was to turn on the light and look around the room. I reached up and tried turning on the light and nothing happened. You're really freaking out now. 
the light had just been on. My friend finally turned her light on, and we laid there in bed for a few more minutes, and I decided to try the light again, and this time, it turned on no problem. We tried to fall asleep again, because we wanted to wander around the ship at 3 a.m. to avoid security guards. As soon as we turned off the lights and laid down, I saw my blanket pushed down and felt something on my arm. My friend also reported feeling things brush against her arm. As tired as we were, we just decided to ignore it all and go to sleep. 3 o'clock rolled around and we went to the pool room reported to be the most paranormally active area on board. We took several pictures, and the researcher and my friend called out to the known ghosts. I didn't want to, because I really felt like I was intruding. I felt sad and angry feelings throughout the whole area. I was looking around, when we all heard a man moaning. My friend and I booked it back up the stairs, and stood against the wall. After a few minutes, we joined the researcher again, and he continued to call out to a little girl named Jackie. I wasn't paying attention at the time, but I heard my friend gasp, and I looked over, and she asked me if I heard that. I missed it. The researcher heard it too. It was the voice of the little girl. She was singing for them. I will never forget my experiences at the Queen Mary, and actually plan on going back soon. I came aboard not believing, and left a member of a paranormal research group. I've had many paranormal experiences since I was a young child. At the age of four, my mother and grandmother would visit the graves of my father and grandfather, staying all day. I would play with the little girl there, while my grandmother and mother sat and talked. They believed I had an imaginary playmate. Both are now dead themselves. I decided to check the records of the cemetery, and had little trouble since it is a small place. I found one girl that could have been the one that I played with. Her name was Mary Jane Walker, and she died in 1866. At the age of nine years of age, my husband and I decided to see if we could find the girl's grave. I told him to check the back of the cemetery because that was where we played. He found the grave. I asked Mary Jane if I could take her picture. I took three of the grave, and one of my husband, sitting on a tree stump not far away. I had the pictures developed. All the pictures were normal except for the one of my husband where there appears to be a vortex in it. I've looked for all the usual problems, but can find no rational explanation for this. I now feel that I have proof of my friend's existence. My husband and I rented a home in southwest Detroit in the 1980s that was very haunted. The first thing that happened was when I was waiting for the gas company to come turn the gas on. I felt as though there was someone watching me, and I smelled pipe tobacco. I figured, okay, I'm alone in a strange place. I also thought that maybe the people who lived in the front part of the house used pipe tobacco. I found out later that these people were from India and were visiting that country. They moved out within a week of returning to the US. All the problems in the house seemed to originate in the attic. There was a log cabin built up there for children to play in. It was complete to glass in the windows, and a drawstring latch for the door. I was only in there once, but the feeling of uneasiness I felt was real. We never allowed our children to play in it. The attic door had no lock, but my five-year-old daughter got locked in and was screaming for us to let her out. Although you could hear any noise from upstairs, we never heard her. The door opened on its own. 
I started the dream about an old Indian woman with a pockmarked face. Since this was a dream, I never told anyone about it. One day, a woman I had become friendly with asked me if my mother was visiting. I told her I sure hope not, since my mother was dead. She said that she saw a woman with long black hair in my bedroom window. This sort of freaked me out, since I was dreaming of that Indian woman. She had long black hair. One day this friend was visiting me, and we were sitting in the kitchen having coffee and talking about nothing really. She seemed to go into a daze, and I was starting to go up to my attic. In fact, she was insisting that she was going. I got her back to the table and sitting down when something punched her head hard enough to leave a red mark. She left and refused to come visit anymore. My husband and I had cleaned out the basement, but yet my kids found a Ouija board down there. They showed us where it was, and we got rid of it right away. We don't mess with that thing. Things seemed to quiet down for a couple of weeks, when the apartment in front of us was rented to a young couple. They started to have problems right away. The keys hanging on the wall would begin to sway. The rocker in the front room would start rocking by itself. At first, things only happened at night, but people decided to contact this thing, and things got bad from then. She would get phone calls, and when she answered, no one would be on the line, except one time, she told me a voice told her to get out. We are Christians and decided enough was enough, we had to have help. I turned on the radio to listen to evangelical echoes and called a prayer line for suggestions on what to do. This program wasn't on yet, but another one was, and someone on that program was praying in the spirit. Suddenly from the basement came an unearthly howl. Needless to say, this woman and I got out of the house and waited on the front porches for our husbands to get home. While all this was going on, my husband never noticed anything. One night, my nephew was spending the night, and while he was praying, this thing shot from our apartment to the other one, banging things in its haste to leave. My nephew refused to stay another night. One night, my husband was in bed sleeping and I was on my way up when I asked a man in the next apartment to go wake him up and tell him to come sleep on the couch. He asked me what was wrong, and I told him I could see my husband in pieces. He did, and the couch was occupied that night. The only thing my husband noticed was that one night we were watching TV, and it sounded like a dresser was being dragged down the stairs. He heard that. We moved from there, and the next place was no better. Whatever was there caused arguments. My nephew and his then girlfriend were constantly fighting, and it got so bad that my husband and I started fighting as well. This was something we normally didn't do. We had the normal arguments that married people usually have, but this was getting serious. Even one of my children was being affected by this thing. It was appearing to her as a little girl talking to her. At first it was nice to her, but as time went on, it was turned to get mean. We had bought this one house, and it might sound silly, but the best thing that ever happened was that an arsonist burned us out, and we had to move. We have had no problems since. I don't believe this was a ghost, but rather a demon. And why it hasn't followed us, I have no idea, but I thank God that it hasn't. I have more stories, but I have taken up enough time as it is. I'm glad that I can finally tell this story without fear of people ridiculing me. There's a place in Smithfield, Virginia, called Bacon's Castle. It's not really a castle just a gigantic plantation home. 
they give chores there on a daily basis. It was in the summer of 2003 that I went with a summer creative writing group to tour this magnificent home and plantation. As we toured the home, the tour guide told us all of the kinds of stories of happenings and how the house was shifted from family to family. When we went up the stairs, we were greeted by a sudden draft. As my friends and I sauntered through the home, it didn't get warmer. In fact, it got colder. The best part was when we reached the room where the woman and her husband would have stayed. There was also a small cradle in the center of the room. The tour guide spoke of a woman during the Civil War who stayed in the room for months after her baby was born because something went wrong with the birth and the child was terribly sick. When the child died, the woman wouldn't leave the cradle. She remained there, convinced she had to rock her to sleep. She wouldn't eat her sleep and eventually she too died. As I stared into the room, I didn't notice anything. My friend Crystal had asked me if I felt a breeze. When I said I didn't, she said she didn't either and pointed at the cradle, which was swaying back and forth noticeably. I didn't really think much of it. And after everyone left, I took a picture and then followed my friends up the stairs to the attic. A few weeks later, I was looking through my pictures and something caught my eye in the picture of the room with the cradle in it. Sitting in front of the cradle was a woman dressed in Victorian style dress. She was transparent and a wispy hand had gripped the cradle. I looked even closer and it looked as though she was smiling. Hello, my name is Ray and I would like to share with you the experiences that happened to my small family in 1996. We had been transferred to the Houston area from San Antonio and found a two-story four-bedroom home in the Clear Lake City area, a real fix-it-upper, and it was the worst-looking home in a very nice community called Green Acres. My brother-in-law Robert and her sister helped us for six months in remodeling, cleaning up, and making the place a nice home. Robert had sold his own home two years earlier and lived in a travel trailer but missed his home. He jumped in and was happy to do most of the work and was proud of the results. A month after the house was finished, we found out that Robert had terminal cancer and had less than six months to live. The trailer was small and so my wife and I decided to bring Robert into our home for his final days. We put him downstairs in the formal living room, and with the help of hospice, we knew we could help Robert with a peaceful and quiet death. This was not the case. Robert fought hard for his life and was terrified of death because he had fought in Vietnam and had killed many. He didn't know what was waiting for him on the other side. The end came with Robert fighting to get out of bed. The look on his face was one of horror. As per his request, he was left in his room for six hours after his death. And then the funeral home was called and Robert left. Or did he? The week after the funeral, things started not being right. Odd bumps and sounds from downstairs. Late at night, our dog would not go downstairs after dark and furniture being moved. One morning, the living room sofa was standing on end with all the cushions still in place. Dining room chairs would be taken and lined along the living room wall and mirrors would vibrate. We called the hospice minister to the house and he blessed every room but Robert still didn't leave. We did. The house stood vacant for a while, and new people moved in, for their stay was short. Neighbors say two families came and left. It has been eight years now, and just a while back I was in the area and went by the home. 
It sits vacant again with a sale sign in the front yard, standing in front of the window of the room in which Robert died. As I stood there, remembering our last few months at home, a chill ran down my back, and I quickly got into my car to drive away. I sent a story to the site about two months ago. Is it my imagination or something paranormal? Well, since then, some new things have happened, and I found out some interesting information that I didn't know before. When I first sent out my story, I told my sister-in-law Jenna about it. She's a Jehovah Witness too, but a little bit more open-minded than my mother-in-law. Anyway, I told her what I had wrote, and she told me she had a girlfriend when she was a teenager, about 15 years ago that lived next door to her. The side where I heard the whispering, and the house where the old couple had died. I believe her family bought the house after the couple died. Anyway, she told her that her friend was a little odd, because she had been sleeping with her parents at night, but Jenna had found out later why. One night, she had stayed the night at her friend's house, and they slept in her friend's bed. Early in the morning, Jenna had woken up for some reason and noticed that her friend was squirming a lot and moaning, almost like she was doing the deed with someone, but no one was there. Her arms were at her side. So Jenna thought maybe she was having a dream. Then she thought that maybe she had seen imprints in her friend's body. She got startled with this and woke her friend up and told her what she had witnessed. Her friend got so upset about it that she didn't want to talk about it at all and never did. To say the least, Jenna never got asked again to stay another night. Then there is the other story that my mother-in-law told me recently about my other sister-in-law's house, Linda, which is ironically across the street from my mother-in-law's in the other house, about a shadow that lingers in her hallway shaped like a person. They have all seen it, including my mother-in-law. She swears that there is an explanation for this, but even she has admitted that she can't find one. When she told me about the shadow, I got real nervous and I started to get goosebumps and got real cold. I told her sometime last year when I stayed the night at Linda's house. I was sleeping on her couch in the living room, my back to the hallway. There was a small light on where the fish tank was, so it wasn't completely dark. For some reason I woke up and turned around, and I saw this dark shadow move from the open hallway and disappear into the instance of Linda's kitchen. I was startled at first, but then got up to investigate things to see maybe it was the shadow of the fish tank. But there was no way it could have been with the position where the tank was. So I went back to sleeping, thinking it was just my imagination, and I never told anyone of that incident. That was until my mother-in-law said something. She told me not to say anything about it to Linda because she gets freaked out about it, and she said she'll still be looking for a logical explanation for it. Good luck on finding one in all three houses, I was thinking to myself. But one last thing, back at my mother-in-law's house, a couple of weeks ago my niece Christine was staying the night, and my niece told me that when she got to the bathroom in the middle of the night, she came out running, screaming, and petrified out of the hallway. She told my niece crying hysterically that when she turned the corner to go into the hallway, that she saw a shadow figure walking towards her. My niece went to look, and nothing was there, and my two-year-old daughter will not go near that hallway at all. One time I went to carry her down there to show her nothing was down there at all, and she started crying real hard, and grabbing my neck, and wouldn't let go, shaking badly. So whatever is in my mother-in-law's house is probably the same thing, that are in the other two homes.
makes me wonder if it goes on in the other neighbors' houses. I was doing some just for fun ghost hunting with a couple of my friends one night in a cemetery on an old gravel road. Two of my friends were out in the cemetery looking around, and my other friend decided to stay in the car. As the two guys were out in the far corner of the cemetery, I looked to the center of the graveyard and seen something that made me lose my breath for a few seconds. A blurry gray figure floated above one of the gravestones and then looked to run through the air across three other stones and then drop right behind another stone. After it disappeared, I asked my friend in the car with me if he had seen it too and he said he did and he was just as freaked out as me. It was not light that created this, because it was pitch black out there. It was my first, and so far only time, I've seen something like a ghost. Thank you for letting me share my story. I know this one was kind of short, but I appreciate it anyway. Hi, my name is Louise, and I live in Oxfordshire, England. The story I'm about to tell you happened only a few weeks ago and scared me and my friend to death. It was about 9.30 on a Sunday night and I was bored so I decided to call my friend Heather. We were talking about the usual when all of a sudden you could hear someone on the line breathing. Heather and I both said at the same time, do you hear that? As we listened, it got louder until there was complete silence. At first we thought maybe one of our brothers or sisters were messing about and picked up the phone on the other end. We both checked our houses and no one was in there. My parents had gone out for a meal and my brother and sister were out and Heather didn't have any siblings and there's only one phone in their house. Anyways, we forgot about it and after about 10 minutes of talking, we heard it again. And this time, the voice said, help, I'm close. We both really freaked out and said what the voice repeated it again and then went. I told Heather that I would phone her later. And about an hour later, I phoned back and we didn't hear anything for a while until the shriek came from the phone from what sounded like a girl. We got so scared, and as soon as our parents got home, I told them what happened, and they said maybe our phone lines got crossed with someone else's. We still don't know who was on the line to this day. I know this wasn't very scary, but thanks for reading. Well, I've been a ghost hunter for quite some time now. I've submitted a few areas under the California section of the haunted places. I recently moved to Arkansas and bought a home in April. Three in one rock house with a huge pond on 1.6 acres in Boonville, Arkansas. I fell in love with this house as soon as I saw that it said for sale by owner sign right in front of it. I called the number and they were selling it for $48,000. I thought, my God, this is cheap for such a beautiful home. I moved in. I have a nine-year-old son and one cat. About the end of July, I started hearing and seeing things. To begin with, I was laying in bed one night, and my nine-year-old and six-year-old, who was visiting from California, were asleep in their rooms. All the lights were out. My bedroom door meets the living room. I was lying on my left side looking out into the plaque of the living room. And I heard what sounded like someone walking in it. Now, my son sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and come sleep with me. So naturally I thought it was them. I called out their name. No answer. Then I thought maybe it was my cat. But then I noticed her laying at my feet on the bed. 
it really sounded like someone was walking from the kitchen in the living room entrance towards my room. Second, my television is hooked up to the stereo because the speaker on the TV is blown. Well, when I have to be at work at 11 p.m., I usually take a shower around 9.45 p.m., and my nine-year-old goes over to his father's house. One night, I turn my stereo on and put a disc in it, five-disc CD changer. It was on disc four, song number 11. There were two songs, and it should have switched to disc five after it was done with song 12. I took my shower and had the stereo loud enough to where I could hear it. All of a sudden, I didn't feel the vibration of the music anymore. I thought, well, maybe it's at a quiet part. When I got out of the shower, I still heard nothing. I put my ear to the door. Nothing. I went out and looked at the stereo, and it was not on CD anymore, but on FM radio on 100.1 and that is not a station at all it's just fuzz there was no one else in the house but me and my cat that was on a friday night two days later on a sunday night my son and i were watching television around the same time between 9 45 and 10 p.m in the middle of television the radio goes from auxiliary to fm radio 100.1 Fuzz. My son says, Mom, what did you do? I was watching that. I told him I didn't do anything. On a Saturday, my son was at his father's, and I was there alone with a cat, and she started going crazy. At one point, she was standing in the doorway of my room in the living room, looking at me. She meowed and took off like crazy into the back bedroom, belonging to my youngest son. She came racing back into the living room. Just then I heard a loud boom coming from the room, like something fell. It shook the entire house. My stomach had butterflies in it then, and I got up to go see. My son one tall dresser with small bionicle toys on it, but they were still all on there. There wasn't anything else that could fall from any place. I have always heard pipes rattling under the house since I moved in. Out of the corner of my eye, I always see things dart quickly about. I haven't seen it fall on, but I know it moves quick. I haven't took pictures of my home yet, or of it for that matter. Also, I have a two-car garage. Sometimes when me and my son pull up from school, both garage doors are closed. In the morning, sometimes the right one is open. I've never really been a great believer, but for the past eight or so years, since me and my mom moved from our old flat to our new house, I've experienced numerous experiences. The first one I was about six, my bedroom is the box room, and so it's small. My bed touches each side of the room with the door to the left. I was laying in bed waiting for my grandma, who was babysitting, to bring me water. I looked up at the wall and saw a strange shadow. It was like a side profile of someone's head. I could see the nose, mouth, and hair clearly. It could have been my own shadow, since the only light came from the ceiling and I was lying down in bed. I watched it for a few seconds, then it seemed to fade before my eyes. I thought it was just because I was tired, and so I ignored it. I had no further experiences until seven years later, in 2003. I was laying in bed once again, the light off about 12 o'clock at night. I was really tired and was trying to fall asleep. My bedroom had been rearranged so that the door was opposite my bed, and one side of my bed was pushed against the wall. I had my back to the wall, and was staring into the darkness, when I felt a cold breeze in the back of my neck. Thinking it was just a drought, I rolled over the face of the wall. 
On the wall, probably three inches from my face, was another face. I could tell it was a man, and he had a black hood up. All I could see of his face was a pair of cold eyes, and what I can only describe as green paint, a face paint on his cheek. I closed my eyes for a few seconds, thinking I was just seeing things, and when I opened them again, the face was still there. I don't know how long I stared at it, but in the end, I fell asleep, and in the morning, to find no trace of what was there the night before. These sightings carried on for weeks, always appearing on the wall at night. I didn't tell my mom about the face, but asked if I could move my bed back to the original place. We moved it, and I slept peacefully that night. The following night I went to bed about 2 o'clock, since I had been up watching a movie on television. I got in bed as usual, and rolled over to face the radiator, like I had done for years, but the face was there again. This time, however, it was more vivid and real. It seemed to be snaring in the dark, and more threatening than before. I rolled over so my back was to the wall, but I could feel the cold breeze that I had felt the last few weeks whenever the face appeared. I pulled the covers around me, refusing to look back at the face. The incidents got less frequent over the weeks, and I believed that the face was going. One night, I was sat at my computer in the corner of my living room. I have a cockatiel whose cage is right next to the computer desk, who was asleep, and my mom was in the kitchen making a drink. I didn't really notice anything until I heard my bird start to hiss and back away into the corner of the cage. Wondering what frightened him, I heard a scraping noise. I looked to the side of the computer to see my glass moving towards the edge of the desk. There was no way it could be moving because of our house being set on a rise, because it is where it should be sliding the other way. I lifted my hand to stop the glass from falling off the desk. When I touched it, the glass was cold, even though I hadn't had a cold drink in it. The strangest thing was, was when I went to push the glass back, I couldn't. Something was trying to push the glass. I had to shove it quite hard before I could get the glass to move. When I did, my bird came back to the front of the cage and looked as though nothing had happened. I had gone to bed earlier than my mom that night, and must have been asleep when she came up. Once again, the face was there, but this time, the presence was really strong. My bedroom was icy cold when it normally is the hottest room in the house. Almost one o'clock I wake up shivering, and could feel something gripping my arm, but as I come to it released its grip. I rolled over to see the face once again. But it looked different. The smirk had gone, and it looked more angry than anything else. I didn't sleep that night, and I couldn't sleep in the room, so I spent the night sat on my sofa, with the lights on downstairs. When my mom came down in the morning, she was shocked to see me up, but I just said I had woken up early, and came down. I didn't want her to know. Later that afternoon, we were having dinner when she asked if I had a nightmare last night. I couldn't recall anything but the face and cold hand, so I asked why. She said she had heard me talking in my sleep, which I had never done before that. She said I was telling someone to get away and don't touch me over and over. Then after about five minutes, I was quieter and mumbling things like, why are you doing this? and just go away. When I asked her what time, she said it was about half past twelve, just before I woke up with a hand gripping my arm. I haven't seen the face or had any strange experiences since that night, and I'm not quite sure what happened after. I don't know if I did something to make it all go away, and that was why the man's face looks so angry, but I'm glad they're gone.
I still expect to see the face every night, but so far I haven't. I finally told my mom about it all, and she asked if I wanted to have the house blessed, but I said no, although the scary face did no harm to anyone, and it's gone now anyway. I'm a nurse and run our family's assisted living, and recently we had some strange things happen in our care home. I understand with caring for the elderly that sometimes strange things occur in doing this for almost a decade. Recently, I had a resident that started to decline at the age of 93. One night, after helping her get into bed, she asked me if Bernie, her husband, who died 10 years before, knew where she was. I reassured her that he did. It caught me off guard since her mind was intact and she was not forgetful. A week went by and again I assisted the woman into bed. She says to me, I hear Bernie in the hallway. Can you tell him that I'm in here? I told her to call for him and he would come in. She refused and asked me to. So, I went out to the empty hallway and said, Bernie, he is in here if you would like to visit with her. As a nurse, sometimes you do things out of the better judgment for yourself, as long as it helps your patient. Later that night, I heard the elderly lady talking to no one quietly. I've had some odd things happen in my personal life through the years since childhood, but that is another story. I was once told by an elder Japanese woman not to talk to the dead or invite them into my home. Another week goes by and my resident took a drastic turn for the worst by refusing to eat or drinking fluids. After a week's stay in the hospital, she returned on comfort cares in hospice. The end was near and we knew it. However. While she was in the hospital, I received a frantic call from one of her nursing assistants asking if I would please come back to work because she was really scared. When I got to work, all the lights in the house were on and she was sitting on the couch with her back up against the wall. When I asked what was wrong, she told me wide-eyed and pale that she had seen a mist down at the end of the hallway and was hearing weird popping noises coming from the residence room that was in the hospital. After checking the entire house and silently saying the Lord's Prayer, the house felt calm. He spent her last days being pampered and showed care and compassion from staff and family. Many of the staff came in on our days off to sit with her, including myself. The last couple days of her life she was sedated for pain and hallucinations. When no one was in her room and she didn't know we were checking in on her, she was reaching up towards the ceiling and mumbling. The day before she died, we had XM music playing on our TV. A couple of the nursing assistants were performing for their evening cares. When the TV changed to CNN for 30 seconds, and turn back to the music by itself. The TV remote was on top of the TV. Since our favorite lady passed away, things have stopped for the most part. My mother passed away June 5th, 2007. Me and my husband were in New Jersey at the time, waiting to get unloaded. We drove an 18 wheeler for a living. My sister had called me the day before and told me that my mom was in a coma and the home health care people said she only had about 24 hours to live and that I needed to come home. So I called our dispatcher and said we needed to be routed back to the Chattanooga terminal so that I could see my mom before she passed. He said no problem. After you and your husband have put tires on, go pick up that load 
and head for Chattanooga. Well, while they were putting tires on our trailer, we decided to get some sleep. The cell phone rang, and it was my sister. She told me that mom had come out of it, and was sitting up and laughing and talking to everybody, and that she was okay. So I called my dispatcher and said we don't have to go home. We can do one more load out here. So it was late that night when they finally got the tires on the trailer and we decided to just stay there in the parking lot till morning so we could get some much needed sleep. We get up that morning and pull out. As we're heading down the highway, my cell rings and it's my sister. She's crying. She tells me that mom passed away that morning early. So to make it a little shorter, our dispatcher gets us home 36 hours later. Now at this time, we are at my mother's house and she has already been picked up by the funeral home before we got there. Later that day, my husband's cell phone rings while we are nowhere near it to answer it. So when we do pick it up to see if our dispatcher is called, it shows we have one voicemail and no number. So my husband listens to the voicemail, and it's my mother, the day after she died. The message said, Connie, this is your mother. Call me. We decide to check if it was a delayed message, but it wasn't. I even took it to the cell phone company, and they said it was June 6th at 1.25 in the afternoon. My mom died June 5th, 2007 at the times between 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. It has really bothered me that we missed the call, even though she was already dead. She might have been trying to say goodbye to us. A few nights ago, a friend and I took a drive up Angeles Crest Highway. It was a clear night, and it wasn't too cold. As we entered the parking lot, we noticed there were no other cars there. As I made a U-turn in the lot to face the small building, there, we saw a man walking. What got my attention was the fact that my headlights shined bright on the building, yet we only saw the person from the waist down. The rest of his body was a shadow. The man was walking around as if he were looking for something. It appeared he had a flashlight in his hand, the way he was moving, but there was no light coming from it. The closer we got to him, the smaller the image got. When I shined my brights on him, it looked like he went down a small hallway. Even then, we could not see his upper body. We went back the next day to see if we could find anything. One thing we did notice was the hall we saw the figure walk through was now a wall. Not a wall that was just put up, but one that looked like it was part of the structure since it was built. Three separate spirits are said to walk the halls of the soon-to-be-abandoned Middle Tennessee Medical Hospital in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, as a new more modern hospital is being built right across the city. In the older section of the third floor, one room is said to be haunted by the ghost of a mental patient who jumped out of a window in the 1960s in the psychiatric ward. Thirty years later, in that section, administrative offices were constructed and employees reported hearing running down the hall of someone with bare feet in a light outside the room where the man was said to have jumped turns on and off periodically on some nights. The switch that turns that light on can be found only inside the room, which was not even in use at the time. When the lights were checked by maintenance, they seemed fine. Later, some orderlies enjoying lunch on that same floor reported seeing an IV stem being rolled up the same hallway. They left their food there and didn't return. In what was the pediatric area, the ghost of a red-haired girl in her early teens in a white hospital gown 
has been spotted at one point by a nurse who also had long dark red hair when the room was used for pharmaceutical storage. She claimed to see the spectral image of the girl staring at her through the glass observation window of the room. The nurse was also a redhead. Finally, the third spirit has been chronicled by the hospital's own sad history and has been spotted in a newer section. A young nurse, who had just started, was leaving for the night to go out with friends. As she hurried down the stairwell, she dropped her purse over the guardrail, a lunch too far, and fell down the center of the stairwell, landing on her head. She died three days later due to massive brain drama. Ironically, one of the hospital's employees who had the task of cleaning up the bloodstains was the son of the woman who had seen the red-haired girl's ghost as her family worked in the hospital. It is sad that sometimes you can see the girl repeat her fatal fall. I have many stories to share with you, but I'm going to start at the beginning. I grew up in Lawrence Harbor, New Jersey. From the time I was a very young child, I knew that something was not right in our house. Our house was the last house in a dead-end street that faced the marsh. In the winter, you could see Highway 35. The surrounding woods were equally as disturbing. I was the only girl in our neighborhood. All my friends were guys. They were like brothers to me. I was a tough kid and I did not scare easily. However, being alone in our house and going to sleep at night frightened me to death. My father died when I was a baby and it was just my mother, brother and myself. There was quite a difference in age between my brother and I. For years, I kept my experiences to myself because I thought it was my imagination and I also thought that if I told my mother and brother that they would think I was crazy too. It took me a long time to realize that I wasn't crazy. It was not my imagination and the hard part was that I was a gifted child whose family could not relate to me on that particular level. These are my experiences while I live there. My mother and father bought the house in 1962, and I was born in 1963. We owned the house right up until 2005. To this day, the events are burned into my memory. From the time I was about five years old, there hardly was a time that the house was at peace. I would lay awake in bed at night and watch orbs dance across the walls and ceiling. Then, I could feel someone sit on the corner of my bed. It was not a faint feeling either. In retrospect as an adult, you could actually see the corner of the bed being pressed down. My heart would pound in my chest so loudly that I couldn't hear anyone else, and I could feel every hair stand up on my entire body. I would pull the covers and pillows over me in such a way that only my eyes and nose would stick out, even in the summer with no air conditioning. Shadows were commonplace everywhere in the house. You could smell flowers in the middle of the winter as well. Then, just as I would start to fall asleep, I would be jolted awake because something pulled the covers of me so violently that they were on the floor at the foot of the bed. That would send me screaming out of my room to my mother. There wasn't a time that you didn't feel as though you were being watched or that you didn't feel that something was following you from room to room. If you came home and put your car keys down, turn your back for two seconds, they were gone. And then after searching the entire house, they would suddenly reappear where you originally put them in the first place, and you were the only one home the entire time. When I was in high school, I would come home and shower because I played sports. I always locked the bathroom door. Every time I would pull the curtain back when I was finished, 
the door would be wide open. Once again, no one was home, and our interior doors had no keys. Until now, I've been very vague with you about my experiences, but now I will tell you in detail my most frightening experience. I was engaged to Mitch. We were just both out of high school. My mom was out, and so was my brother. Mitch and I decided to go to my house to watch TV and eat some pizza. From the time we entered the house, I could feel that something was really wrong, really out of sync. The air seemed electrically charged. It was as though us being there had interrupted some unseen gathering. I ignored it, even though I was goose flesh from head to toe. Even with all the lights on, my mother's house always seemed dark. Mitch was sitting in the room watching television, and I went into the kitchen to heat some frozen pizza. We were having a conversation as I did so. My back was to the living room as we were talking, and I was placing the pizza on the baking sheet. I heard what I thought was Mitch leave the living room and walk into the kitchen. I became aware that he was standing directly behind me as I was still talking. I turned around to ask him something, but to my shock, it was not Mitch standing there. I felt all the blood drain from my face. My knees went to jello, and I gasped and screamed at the same time. Standing face to face with me was a huge black solid apparition. I could make out a head and shoulders, but the rest became more see-through as it went towards the knees and feet area. It felt like slow motion. I think that when I turned around and screamed, I scared it as much as it scared me. As I stood there screaming, the black figure literally whooshed through the kitchen wall. Mitch ran into the kitchen. I was shaking and white as a ghost. It took me a while to collect myself. I shut the oven off, and we left, and went to the local pizza place, where I told them what happened. We didn't spend much time at my mother's house after that. This is just one story, out of countless stories, that I'll be glad to share with you. I'm now 46 years old. My entire life has been one foot in this world, and the other in the spirit world. Years ago, I'd contacted Sylvia Brown, who told me that my mother's house had many spirits in it, but two stood out. There's the ghost of a baby, and its mother. She also said that I was a medium and a psychic, and she was right. This is what I now do. I'm no longer afraid. It gives me pleasure to be able to connect with grieving spirits with the departed loved ones. I consider this wonderful gift that I will not trade for anything. Thank you for listening. All of my life I had reoccurring experiences of the paranormal, starting at age 7, as far as I can remember, when my father died. I used to believe the experiences were dreams or imagination until recently. I was telling my fiance of my experiences, voices, mists, noises, marks my body, being touched, shirt tugged on, hair pulled, etc. His suggestion was that maybe I am a sensitive. So I started thinking about this possibility and decided to explore it further. My fiancé and I previously tried going to paranormal meetings, which would go on ghost hunts. There was one in particular that appealed to me, and we signed up. The building the group was going to was in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, at an old building that was previously the Elka Club, built in 1914. This information was given to us by the leader of the hunt, when we arrived, we went into a room to get the speech about which rooms to be careful of. They would be marked by the yellow tape. 
Nothing else was told to us about the history of this building. But as I stood there, a name entered my mind, and it kept repeating itself. Sarah, 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 over and over again. Well, as the group entered the basement, we divided into small groups of two or three. My fiance and I were in a small room, in the back, and I felt nothing. So we decided to head out into the main part of the basement. And just as we stepped out of the room, a man that was on tour with us, who has been there before, said, Sarah, if you are here with us, give us a sign. I was flabbergasted. I looked at my fiance and explained the other shock on my face. And we continued in to other parts of the area. I had entered a room just of the entrance of the basement and instantly was bombarded with intense sadness, so much so that I got tears in my eyes. I informed the group leader and they took pictures around me, but by this time I already knew that what they were searching for in the building wasn't correct. I knew that what I was feeling was the past and the child Sarah intended on proving just that to me. She, in what I would call it, attached herself to me. She started flashing images in my mind about what the building was before the Elks had been built there. It was her home. It was a beautiful Victorian with a large porch, parlors, a library, you name it, she showed me. She told me that she was sad because of the remodeling that was about to happen in the building. She got her point across by telling me certain rooms did not belong. I also picked up a persistent man in a room on the first floor. I was flashed an image of a podium and people sitting and listening intently to this man. In the ballroom, I was given images of people dancing only black shadows of such. And at last, the third floor, I approached the end of the main hall and was shoved by something not seen. I took a moment and continued on into a grand circular room with benches attached to the circular walls and had the feeling of being watched. And I kept saying, this feels like judge and jury. It was like you were being persecuted, watched, and the spirits were getting angry. So I wanted to step out of the room for a moment, and I took a step forward towards the door and received a sharp blow to my middle back on the left-hand side. I went out of the room and was telling the crew about the incident and decided to give it another try. And as I entered, I again got another blow to the right side of my back. At that point, I wanted out of there for good, so the group agreed to leave the third floor, and as I entered the hallway again, I got pushed in the same spot as the first time, which happened to be in front of a very large window. The interesting part was, I said before, I knew nothing of the place. But when we were leaving, I told the owner all the stuff Sarah had told me. I told her of the man in the room that in my mind, I'd seen the podium. I told of getting pushed and hit in the back. Well, she surprised me. Not only, but many in the group as well. Come to find out that this is where Sarah's home was. The rooms I was seeing were the rooms in her home. The man at the podium would have been the black preacher that occupied that room after the elk club closed down. That night, I came home exhausted. I fell asleep in front of Sarah. In the dream, she told me her last name, so I searched for her on the internet. I then found something more shocking. Not only did I find her, the year she was born, but I also found the names of her parents. Well, 
I'd spoken with someone that has been to the club and knows things about it, but they never knew her parents' names, which happened to be the same names I came across. And as far as the room on the third floor, the owner informed me that this room was the judging room for the Elk members and where they would hold their remembrances to the dead brothers. The interesting thing was, the women were not allowed in this room. And there was also an EVP that picked up stating, you are being judged. So needless to say, I'm no longer doubting my ability and am more open to my experiences, which have been many since that night. I come from a long line of psychics and I must have been about seven when during an afternoon nap, I woke up after a very frightening dream. At the time, we were living in Mount Butler in Hong Kong Island, and Mom's family lived in Capiz in the Philippines. I ran out of my bedroom into a room full of family and friends to tell my mom about it. I saw this Filipino man in a wooden box, dressed in a cream shirt and brown trousers, and lots of her family were around him crying. As a young child, I'd never seen a dead person before and was distraught by the experience. My family consoled me and told me not to worry, but it brought to their attention that I too had the gift. It was only a few years later that I was told that the person I saw was my uncle who had been shot by the local militia in my mom's village in the Philippines. And it surmises that the clothes I saw him in were the clothes he was buried in. So it turns out that I had a psychic snapshot of the actual Filipino funeral rites, whereby the body is kept in the family house for a period of weeks so grieving people can pay their respects to him. This brother of my mom's, she had been having prophetic dreams around the time, warning him to leave town because something bad was going to happen to him. He didn't believe her and was shot by the local militia after a dispute. It is Filipino superstition that during this period that the body was stored in the family house, the spirit visits the family on the third fifth and seventh day after their death. This, as it turns out, was during this time that we both had these visitations. Mom was in the kitchen washing dishes when she heard who she thought was daddy coming back from work. That's when she saw a man from the corner of her eye standing in the doorway wearing a light shirt and brown trousers. So she chatted to daddy for about five minutes about his day and what he had been up to when it occurred to her that he didn't answer her back once. She turned around to ask him a question and then she realized that there was no one in the doorway at all. It was at this point she was a little bit spooked as she remembered my description of Uncle Fred in his coffin and hurriedly went to check on Daddy. He had come in when she had heard him come in, but had just fallen asleep on the bed, fully clothed and knit wearing brown trousers and a white shirt. So it was her brother's way of saying goodbye and I guess to say sorry for not having listened to her when she warned him. A few years later, it was 1987, around about the time that Edward Yule, Hong Kong's governor at the time, passed away. We were still living in the same flat in Mount Butler, but my sister and I had moved from the room we were in, as that had been converted into mom's nursery, where she looked after preschool children during the daytime. We were now in the room where I would have my bedroom, until we moved over to the new territories. I must have been about nine, so my sister would have been four. We shared a bunk bed, and her being smaller stayed on the lower bunk. 
I awoke to pitch black and the sound of flip-flops walking up and down our corridor. I thought, this is strange, as it is custom to remove your shoes at the front door and to wear slippers around the house. As I heard these flip-flops getting closer and closer to my door, sheer terror took over. I whispered to my sister, Chris, can you hear that? No one answered back. So I was trapped on the top bunk with nowhere to go, with this noise coming closer and closer. I hid my head under my blanket, like most kids do, wishing it to go away. I said this time, more incessantly, Chris, can you hear that? And something hissed back at me, yes. That did not sound like my sister at all. At this point, I was terrified. I tried to gather all my strength to get out of the bed, but I was too scared. After what felt like a millennia, I eventually gathered enough courage to jump off the top of my bed, ensuring by no means that I touched the lower bunk and charged into my parents' room across the corridor from our room. I was so embarrassed being so old and being scared, I didn't actually get into their bed, but spent the rest of the night curled up in a ball at the foot of their bed. It turns out that my sister wasn't in our room at all that night. My question was, what was that in the corridor and in the bunk bed with me? The strange pink light. Around this time of the strange occurrences with the flip-flops, we were still living in flats in Mount Butler. My daddy, a complete atheist, had an experience of his own. Daddy does not believe in the supernatural, and if God actually spoke to him, he still wouldn't believe it. He was lying in bed one night, when he woke up for no reason, to this pink sphere to appear on the wall opposite their bed. It seemed to come out of the wall and sit there and go back into the wall again. He was puzzled by this and went to investigate. He checked out where the possible light source could be coming from, the curtains. No, we were on third floor, so it could have been vehicle lights. He went into the bathroom, all lights were off, and couldn't have come from there either. He got back into bed and tried to wake mom up to show her. She was having none of it and kept her head under the sheets. Well, the sphere appeared again and came out of the wall, suspended somehow, then sunk back in and disappeared. He never did figure out what that was or where it came from. Running Ghost When he was working in the Royal Hong Kong Police, he had another experience. At this point, he was the superintendent and managed a section of the traffic police. They were doing their rounds when a speed camera on the road flashed for no reason. They went to investigate, and it flashed again, with no cars in the near vicinity. They thought nothing more of it, until the pictures were developed, and on one of the photos, there is a distinct picture of a person, blurred apparently running very fast, so fast, it set off a speed camera. The Ghost Dog When we were living in Mount Butler, I had one other experience that reaffirmed my belief in the supernatural, and two other people I was with experienced it also. I must have been about 14, when my sister and my best friend at the time decided to go for a walk in the countryside. So where we lived was surrounded by Hong Kong countryside, which was perfect for me as I was a tomboy and spent as much of my time as possible out and about exploring and climbing trees. 
just before I started university in the UK. I was visiting some friends in Cardiff. I was feeling very odd that night, and as we're heading out into town, a premonition hit me. I turned around to my friend and said, something very big is going to happen tonight. He just looked at me like I was stark raving mad, so I dropped it. So when we went out and had a lark and came back, thinking nothing more of it, imagine our surprise when we woke up in the morning and splashed all over the news was coverage on Diana's death. This, of course, being the famous Princess Diana of Wales, who died tragically in a car accident. But I predicted it the day before. At least I feel like I did. Could be a coincidence, but I don't think so. Oodle Extra Cemetery experience. So, I started uni in Derby in the Midlands, and where I was living was student digs on Oodle Extra New Road. I was heavily into my goth influence back then. Not so much now, but I still love old cemeteries and dramatic clothing. There was this beautiful one on our road that I used to visit regularly and read and draw with many beautiful statues and old, old gravestones. One day, my ex-boyfriend and I went to visit it as it was a lovely day turning to evening. So I wandered around looking at all the gravestones and the statues, trying to find the oldest tombstone we could find. It must have been coming up to winter time as the sun set quickly and we realized in a panic that the gate had been closed so we were locked in and had to find another way out. So we walked along the perimeter looking for a likely tree to help us over the wall when the sun just disappeared and we were pitched into almost complete darkness. Then, for no reason at all, the mist appeared over the headstones so it was hard to avoid the graves themselves. So it suddenly looked just like a horror movie set, trying to avoid broken tombstones and holes in graves and that danged mist in the dark. By this point, I was pretty panicked, frantically trying to get out with this feeling of overwhelming dread descending over me and all cells in my body telling me to leave right now. We eventually scrambled over a wall into the student bar, and that feeling just lifted, just like that. It's only a few months ago that I was looking online about Ghost and Derby, that I found out that the very cemetery is haunted. Brilliant. My dreams. I thought that was the end of my experiences. But looking at the dream section, I've remembered some more I want to share with you. I've always had very vivid dreams, some not necessarily all coming true, but all seem to have symbolic importance in the coming days, weeks, or even sometimes years. I more often than not have deja vu experiences, even if I haven't ever A done this before, or B, seen places or people before, or C, really ever thought about these things when I am conscious. I haven't really wanted to tell people about them, as most people, I worry that most people think I'm quite mad. Haunted house. So this also happened just before I finished university in Derby, I think. It was just before my ex-boyfriend and I broke up. The importance of this dream is one that I've been able to break it down and understand it in its composite parts. So both of us were walking around this dark woods, and I was taking all that I had learned from watching horror movies into mind, and was very careful of not wandering off my own, made sure I had a weapon in hand, 
in case anything happened. We eventually came to this clearing where this ominous house stood at the end of this garden. However, I needed the bathroom, and even though we knew it was a haunted house, I was not one of those people who would go to the loo in a haunted forest. So we walked in, and there were people there. Thankfully, none looking like psychopaths or zombies. Strangely enough, they were people we knew too. There was a feeling of dreaded sadness throughout the house though, and refused to go anywhere by myself. We are directed to the bathroom, which was at the end of this corridor. He decided to sit and chat with people whilst I did my business. So, I started walking, but the corridor was like the one from the poltergeist. It just kept getting further and further away, until I had to break into a run, desperately needing to go, and leave this house as soon as possible. I eventually made it, and threw the door open, and did what I needed to do. Then I woke up, and realized that I still needed to go, so I ran for the loo. Luckily, I had the foresight to write this dream down once I had gotten back to bed, and knew that we were doomed. The haunted house was a reflection of our relationship, being hounded by our mutual bad doings, and that the end was near. It was just a matter of time, and so it was. Finally, before I finish another of my epic storytelling sessions, I have one more prophetic experience to share with you, but not one from my dreams. It has to do with my pet dog, Sophie. Her name was Sophie. She was lovely, with her white and black patch over her eye and black patch in her back. She was only six months older than me and had been with her family for 16 years. She was the loveliest, sweetest dog in the world, apart from having a penchant for biting socks, eating tissues and rubber bands, and attacking the hoover. She was suffering from basically her insides giving in. She had serious kidney problems, and she couldn't walk very well because of arthritis in her back legs. And because she couldn't help herself anymore, she was kept outside. So one evening, when her parents were out, my sister and I were playing with her in the garden, and I had this weird feeling come over me. I seemed to be able to predict death unfortunately amongst other things. I turned to my sister, when I saw the shadow fall on her Sophie that looked like a cross, it was like it was a sign saying she was going to die tomorrow. So that's what I told my sister, and she kind of brushed it off. She didn't believe me, being much younger than me. But sure enough, after a hard day at school, I was only 14 or so at the time, we came back, and our parents were in pieces. And that's when I knew it had happened. They had to take her down to the vet and have her put down, as it was too cruel to keep her suffering like that. I've never seen my daddy in pieces like that, but because I was strengthened by my foreknowledge, I supported him in his time of need. My poor cat was distraught, as she basically brought him up from when we adopted him as a very small kitten. On a happier note, I had a dream after this terrible day. I was watching my crazy dog run from the front of the house, in and up the stairs with much zest and energy like she would have had as a younger dog, running up to our level of the house, looking like she was having the time of her life, back and forth, giving little yips of happiness, grinning in her quintessentially silly Sophie way. As because of her health problems and her incontinence, she was not allowed in except for very cold weather. I think this was her way of saying 
that she was free and happy at last, and I knew she was in peace. She still does come and visit us occasionally, when we walk by the front of the house, and you can, still after all these years, smell her, and we know she's still looking out for us. I keep meaning to write a dream diary. I'll do that this year, as these dreams seem to be too important to miss. My husband and myself and my brother were all watching our mother's house while she was out of town on vacation. We had been there for a few days, and all happened to be on this particular evening and night. Well, we had finished dinner, and we were all just hanging out in the living room watching TV. My brother said he was just going to sleep on the couch, and my husband and I said goodnight and went to bed in my mother's bedroom because that's where we had been sleeping. We kissed goodnight like usual and turned off the bedside lamp. I myself just can't close my eyes and go right off to sleep, so I was just laying there, looking off into the darkness and trying to wind down. Suddenly, I noticed a very, I mean very dark black mass, right by the bedroom door. I blinked my eyes a few times, trying to make them adjust to the dark better, but realized they already had, because I could make out the mass that was so much darker than the dark. I began to feel afraid when I saw it moving. I laid there and watched it approach the bed over our bodies. It looked larger than it had by the door. I began to nudge my husband, but I decided to lay there a little bit longer to see if it continued to move or even get larger. I laid there and marveled at its darkness and its extremely dark color as opposed to the regular darkness. It was pitch black and just floated there above us. Unbelievably, I fell asleep. The next day at lunch, my brother said, Hey, last night I saw the weirdest thing when I was trying to fall asleep. A large black mass was hovering above my head and scared me half to death. I stuck my hand in it and it was freezing cold. Before I had a chance to speak, my husband said, me too. I thought I was seeing things. I spoke up, and I said I saw it as well, and was frightened by it. They both said, wow, I wonder what it was. I had read somewhere that these could possibly be evil. Needless to say, we didn't spend the night there again. About two years ago, my boyfriend Luke and I were at our friend's house. He lived about a half an hour away from us in a small beachside suburb called Two Rocks. To get there from our house, we have to travel down a road called Winero Road. It's a very long winding road and has no street lights. Lining the side of the road are white gum trees. These stretch on for a few kilometers. A lot of people have crashed their cars on this road. Most end up as fatal crashes. There are quite a few crosses, especially in the white gum area. Anyway, it was about one in the morning when we decided to head back home as we were both really tired after a long day. We turned, as usual, onto a narrow road and were chatting to each other about what to do the next day when we reached a high-end death toll area. Luke always slowed down near here because there's so many windy sharp turns that you have to be careful. As we were driving, I looked out of the window and to my absolute astonishment, there was an old man walking down the road with a bag in his hand. I pointed this out to Luke, but he just thought it was some weirdo who had one too many to drink. About a minute later, Luke slammed on his brakes and we skidded around, doing a 180 degree turn. 
We had both just seen the same man, carrying the bag run out into the road waving his arms. We sat dead silent watching where he had come from, but nothing was there, just the trees and the butte men. Not far away from where we had stopped, there was a white cross where an old man had flipped his four-wheel drive and died instantly. On another occasion near the same spot, I saw a young girl, about 17, wearing blue jeans and standing next to a white gum tree. Luke didn't see her, but I can remember that she looked sad, almost lost. There have been a lot of claims from a lot of different people about the white gums on one narrow road, mainly about figures darting out trying to make their vehicles come off the road, or of an old man walking along carrying a bag. We don't travel down that road anymore. They've built up a new road that's more convenient for us. A few other things have happened to me in the past 18 months. I just bought a new kitten not too long ago and she is always very alert when she is in my bedroom. Usually, she will cuddle up and purr or go to sleep, but in my bedroom, she can't settle down. A few weeks after we got her, Luke was working a night shift and I was home alone in bed because I'm not fond of being on my own in a dark house. I decided that my kitten would stay with me in my room until Luke got home. At about 11 p.m., I just finished watching a movie on the TV and grabbed the kitten and headed to bed to read a book. I was a few pages in when Lottie, my kitten, started trying to hide underneath my arm. At first, I thought she was just getting comfortable, but that's when I noticed she was hiding. She then started to walk up onto me, looking up at the ceiling. Her pupils were huge and her ears were back, and her tail was wagging angrily. I tried to settle her, but she started to follow something along the roof with her eyes. I looked up, but couldn't see anything, so went back to reading, although I was very uneasy. Lottie kept following this invisible thing for about a half an hour. Then she eventually went to sleep under my blanket. From then on, when I'm alone in my room, I always feel uneasy, like I'm being watched. Okay, this isn't the first supernatural type thing that I think I may have experienced, but it is the only one that I know for sure was real. My best friend moved here to Kentucky when I was in kindergarten from Chicago and moved next door to me when I was about 10. After that, me and her were always together and always spending the night with each other, loved her parents to death. That particular night, she had spent the night with me and it happened to be her other best friend's B-Day the next day. Well, maybe about two o'clock that day, we went over to her house to ask her dad if we could walk down there. As I was just down the road, her mom was at work by the way. I waited outside when the door slammed open and she was screaming, there's something wrong with my dad. I went in and he just looked like he was sleeping. He had his arms crossed and everything. I'm glad he went peacefully. He was pale and I touched his arm to wake him up and he was cold. At that point, I knew he was gone. We ran to my paps and he came over and called an ambulance. The rest is all just heartache and pain, like that comes with any death. I felt like it was important to tell you all that because it really is relevant to the rest of the story, or at least in my opinion, it has some correlation. Okay. Now on to the creepiest moments. I was spending the night with that same friend and I asked where the mouthwash was and this was probably about three or so months later. She said her dad had some in his dresser so I went into his room. I stood there as she looked and suddenly 
We heard this rhythmic knocking all down the side of her house. It was really fast and complicated. We freaked out and ran to her room. I think he didn't want her going through his stuff. Well, that's all that happened for a very long time. The last experience, her dog is chained up in their fenced in yard and it was in heat and my male dog got in her yard and no one was home. So I rushed over there. They really didn't need any more puppies and opened her gate to get my dog that somehow got in there. And I heard his voice again, very meanly shout, hey. So I freaked out and ran again. The main thing I'm wondering about is that knocking. It's really odd. I think about it sometimes, but I mean it shouldn't bother me anymore, but it does. If you have any ideas as to what this is, please speak up. I live in a small residential neighborhood in Western Kentucky. My family has resided in our home for 37 years. We're the first home to ever be built on this property, as the same with several other homes in the area. Since day one upon moving into the house, we have been plagued with numerous experiences that quite frankly can't be explained. They are loud banging noises that echo from between the halls, strange odors ranging from the distinct smell of death to a light scent of lilies and roses. Strange shapes of a blackish gray smoke clinging to the baseboards. Voices that echo through the entire house, ranging from the intensity of a deafening shriek to the softest of whispers. Shadow people walk the house day and night. Strange bluish green bars of light extend from room to room. Balls of light that chase each other around the ceiling. Full body apparitions, plain as you and I. Things disappearing sometimes returning in different parts of the home, sometimes never reappearing. Cold breaths in your ear, an unmistakable touch that chills you to the bone. Several homes in our neighborhood have also stated similar events. Several of the people that have admitted strange occurrences in their homes have been very religious, God-fearing people, with no reason to lie about their situations. Something is happening here. Upon researching our area, it was discovered that back in the early 1700s, this area was an old Indian burial ground. In the mid 1800s, it was decided to put in a real cemetery. The old graves were destroyed and the remains were disposed of. A new cemetery was started in its place. However, in the 1960s, it was decided to move the cemetery once again due to flooding issues and a new subdivision was to be put in its place. Being a contractor for our city, my father was offered a reasonable deal on one of the first homes to be put on the land, an offer too good to turn down. Our house was finished on June 14th, 1972. We moved in on June 21st, 1972. It wasn't until recently that my father told his children that he worked for the crew who removed the graveyard. Some of the graves are so damaged by water erosion they could not be moved, so they were left, and the homes were built on top of them. Even as recently as 10 years ago, less than 5 miles from my home, a family was putting in a swimming pool. While excavating the backyard, several Indian bones were unearthed. The family sold a home and moved. Mysteriously, when several homeowners started asking for copies of our area's records, the record suddenly vanished without a trace. Here are two instances in which I experienced ghostly activity. They're not very long stories, but I think they're very interesting. So here goes. I really don't know if you keep up with your website, 
But if you do, back in 2004, a couple of buddies and I went to Thompson Creek Trail. We started down the trail. My friend and I were at the front of the group. We had flashlights, and we were flashing them at all the really dark areas of the trail. We had passed an old looking house to our right at the beginning of the trail. Shortly after, there was a curve in the trail, and in the bend of the curve, there was a tree. It was really dark at the trunk of the tree, so I was kind of scared, and I shined my light on it. The image that had projected from my flashlight was of a very tall man and was standing very close to the tree, and a shadow was cast onto the tree trunk. It is a fact that no one was in front of me. My friend had also seen the huge shadow of a man. I've been to a lot of places on your website, and this was the only one where I'd actually seen something, and it scared the living crap out of me. On to my next paranormal experience. For me, I've always believed in the paranormal, though I've never had any experiences of my own until very recently, including the one I just told you about. I met a new friend at school, and he told me his house had spirits in it. He and his family had all something happen to them, i.e. seeing figures, hearing voices, unusual odors, and poltergeists. They even hired a priest to bless the house, and also a psychic. I never thought it would have something happen to me, but me and my mates were watching a movie in his room, and suddenly out of the corner of my eye, I swore to God that I saw a shadowy figure in his mirror, and when I turned my head, it kind of stepped out of view. I thought this was weird, because usually I can tell my eyes were playing tricks on me, but this time it just seemed different. Another experience I had was when I was on the computer alone, and my friend was downstairs. While I was on the computer, I thought I was hearing many voices, like the background noises you hear in a restaurant. I could hear very faintly. Now because of these experiences, I don't like being alone in this house. What I want to do next is to actually try to do ghost hunting in this house. So there you have it, my two experiences. I hope you thought they were interesting, because they scared and terrified me. I just moved back from Long Beach, California, from Vancouver, Washington. A longtime friend named Alan offered me one of his bedrooms, in which I could stay, until I got back on my feet. That night, I felt something sitting on my chest. I remember being too afraid to open my eyes. Whatever it was, it did not move. Then, I opened them and witnessed a flow of whitish looking vapor protruding out of my chest. It went up above the bed towards the ceiling in shape of stretched out rings. It looked similar to smoke from a cigarette. It just hovered over the bed in circles and then began to stretch and exit towards the kitchen, which was next door. I did not dare tell Alan about this experience because he is such a skeptic. I can predict his very words. Ernie, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. You must have dreamed it. He says there's no such thing as spirits, or even a god. The very next morning I told Jim, one of the tenants, what I experienced. I just had to get it out of my system. Will someone please hear me out? He had told me that a man named Ron had been staying in that very room and that, when he discovered that he had some type of incurable hepatitis, he hung himself from the refrigerator door in the kitchen. That really didn't make any sense to me, but he explained that Ron had somehow did this by tying his belt around his neck and then somehow sliding on the floor. According to Jim, Ron received a letter from UCLA about a month later, stating that he was to come to UCLA immediately 
because they now had a treatment for his type of hepatitis. If he'd only waited one more month, Jim told me that he believed Ron had tried to inherit my body when I was sleeping, as in, tried to possess me. This incident, however, never happened again. I do recall one time waking up at 1 a.m. in that house and hearing a repetitious sound coming from the garage. I looked out the window because the garage had a window, but it was dark. The next day Al was in the garage and I asked him what he was doing in the garage at 1 a.m. He said, I wasn't in here. Why do you ask? I told him what I had heard, a repetitious sound from the night before. Then, something made me focus on a small machine that sat on a shelf. I asked Al what it was. He told me that his previous tenant named Ron used to do laboratory work and that the machine was for polishing rocks. There was still rocks in it. It had a handle that turned. When I turned it, I heard the same sound that I had heard in the morning. I told Al, but he said he must have been mistaken. No one was in the garage last night. It was locked at night, and only I have a key. I said no more. After my brother had died in his home, my family gave it to me to live in. It was an older mobile home. One day, while on my PC, which faced the same wall that my door was on. In fact, my desk was next to the door. My desk is huge, and a bigger desktop than most kitchen tables are. So sitting in my desk, I could see part of the hallway while reading, typing, or whatever on my PC. One day, I just happened to look up at the door, and there came a figure of a man. I could only see his shadow on the emergency door and wall outside my bedroom. He was either bald or had some very short hair. I just sat there and stared for what seemed like several minutes, waiting for him to either come into my room or say something. It finally turned and seemed to go into the bathroom, which was on the other side of the wall, or went in the wall towards the kitchen and living room area. They're both open, with no wall dividing them. I was there alone, except for my dog Chewy, who is very large, over 160 pounds. I got up to check it out, because from what I saw as a shadow, it didn't look like anyone I knew. I walked by the bathroom peering in, and he wasn't there, so I kept going. When I got into the kitchen, I saw Chewy on the couch, looking out the window at the kids who had just gotten off of the school bus and were walking home. He would have barked, even if he had known whoever the shadow was. He never made a sound. There was no one there, not even in my son's bedroom. I checked everywhere. If he had gone outside, I would have heard the door open and close. The only time my brother ever had short hair was when he was in the Marines. The only other person who had no hair or short hair was my father before he had died. The chemo and radiation treatments for cancer had done that, and both were dead for about four years, both dying about four months apart. So far, this has been my only encounter with a shadow person or ghost. I never really knew they could or would show up like this. This past year, my daughter who works in a nursing home was telling me they have seen shadow people there too. They seem to be only showing up in this one hall section. I believe she said it was where the patients who weren't doing so well stayed. One patient even complained about being there in that hall. He said they kept bothering him and wouldn't leave him alone. When they moved him to another hall, he quit complaining. He did eventually die several months later. I did see this happen on Ghost Hunters too, where they saw a man's shadow like a figure on a locker. They've mentioned shadow people a few times on there too. Now, I suppose you're wondering if I were scared. 
for some odd reason, I wasn't at all. I just wish I knew who it was. I know dogs have a sixth sense too, and I still wonder why my dog didn't seem to know he was there. Chewie had never met my brother or my father. Even if he knew them, he would have barked at being excited. Someone came to visit. One early morning I had been sitting in my family room, reading the newspaper. It was a very quiet morning, and I was all alone. The sun was coming through a bedroom window off the family room, and shining down the hallway. It was one of those extremely bright sunrises, the kind where you can see dust particles floating through the air. I glanced up as I was turning the newspaper page. I then saw in the sun rays the outline of what looked like a man. It had a light black to gray color. It had no details, just the outline of its body. It was about three feet off the floor and had no legs from around the knees down. I could see the arms. It had no hands either. I just remember telling myself, wow, it's a ghost, and I took it all in. I told myself not to turn my head or blink. The ghost appeared to be looking into the bedroom. It turned its head slightly to the right. At that point, I had to blink. My eyes were drying out. When I did that, it was gone. I then got up and put my hands through the spot where it was. I guess I wanted to see if it would be cooler or something, but it was the same temp. I just stood there in amazement of how cool that was. I also needed to add, it was no one's shadow, and it's hard to describe, but it was not a shadow. I could see the dust particles going through the figure, and the figure was in the middle of the hallway. It was three-dimensional. It actually looked like a hologram. I really love those rare ghost encounters. My parents bought a house in Newborn, North Carolina in 1970. It was a brand new home in a new neighborhood. I lived in this house with my parents and younger sister until I went to college in 1994. The house was a three bedroom two full bath ranch with a carport. Before I was born, my father enclosed the carport and turned it into a large den. The original steps, carport door frame, and window frame remained and led up into our kitchen. It was an interesting layout because you could look through the open window frame from the kitchen and see into the sunken den or vice versa. The bedrooms were on a long hallway at the back of the house. The hallway could be reached by two doorways, the kitchen and living room, actually one big circle. The first bedroom in the hall faced the street. The bathroom was next, another bedroom, and then my parents' bedroom at the end of the hall. The room next to my parents' room was mine, until my little sister was born. I was five years old. I was moved down to the first bedroom. This room gave me the creeps. The closet door would slide open a bit on its own, which my parents said was probably a draft from the heat or air conditioning. However, after someone broke into my bedroom window while I slept and stole a few things from my room, I never stayed in there again, usually sneaking into my little sister's room and sleeping with her or sleeping on my parents' bedroom floor. I constantly slept with the bathroom light on and a bright nightlight or a lamp. I would wake up in the middle of the night and hear odd noises that made me feel paralyzed and cold all over. One would think these irrational fears would subside with age, but they seemed to intensify over the years. One reoccurring incident that still bugs me occurred in the kitchen, den area. Whenever I would be sitting on the couch watching TV, I would see the silhouette of a person walk by the window frame from the old carport. 
I would assume it was my mom or dad, because the shape was tall. What would scare me to death was the fact that no one would appear at the door leading to the steps after I would see the shape walk by. Many times I would call out to my parents, thinking it was one of them, but no one would answer, and then I would walk up the steps and look into the kitchen. There was never anyone there. Most times, this would happen when I was home alone. On numerous occasions, my parents would come home to find me sitting on the front porch steps or sitting in my car with the doors locked. This went on for years, and I was very excited when I moved out to go to college. Years later, I went to visit my little sister and stayed with her in her college dorm room. We were telling ghost stories with some of her friends when I told her my accounts of the shadow. I was in mid-sentence when my sister finished my thought and described the incident in perfect detail. I had never told my sister about this because she was much younger and I didn't want to scare her. Needless to say, we were both shocked and had goosebumps. We compared stories, and it seems we had very similar experiences in that house. My parents eventually built a new house about 10 miles away and sold that house. I wonder to this day if the new owners have ever experienced any of the oddities that my sister and I did. I'm 28 years old now. The paranormal has always interested me, but only recently have I started to research it. I've come to believe now that some things I've experienced as a child were probably more than nightmares. I believe my encounters were that of the paranormal, edited with a touch of child's imagination. Contrary to what you might believe, I think my touch of a child's imagination is what scared me the most. I decided to share with you those experiences that could be considered nightmares for your entertainment, but also those that I truly believe are paranormal. At the age of five to seven, I can't recall for sure. One night, I was lying in my bed, asleep. I felt something moving at the bottom of my bed, and the next thing you know, I felt like I was being dragged out of my bed. My covers had tightly wrapped themselves around my legs, so tight that I couldn't move them. I yelled, my bed is eating me, help, mommy, daddy, help. By the time it stopped and parents got into the room, half my body was hanging off the side of my bed while the other half was hanging on for dear life. You know what my parents' response was? That's what happens when you don't fix your bed every day. Your bed eats you. No, really. I still never fix my bed after that. I disproved that theory fast. It never happened again. I look back now and realize that whatever it was in that house had a weird and somewhat morbid sense of humor. Check it out. Several other times, I would wake up from a rather deep sleep, turn over, and open my eyes as if something told me, wake up Steph. Sure enough, I would open my eyes and one of two things would be sleeping next to me. A. Bo Duke. He was like a hero to me at the time. Or B. An orange mummified witch with a cone-shaped hat and empty eye sockets. Now. You would think waking up next to Bo Duke saying hi Steph would be cool as all heck, but no. I would freak out, jump so high I would fall off my bed, and thump, and run to my mom's room screaming, Bo Duke is in my bed, help. It was way more dramatic when I saw the witch. Now, here is what really makes me think it was actually a spirit playing games with me. As I got older, about 10 years old I would say, the occurrences were not so graphical. 
I would still hear a voice say, wake up, Steph. I would open my eyes and see a pitch black silhouette of a man standing in the far corner of my room, about six feet tall. I would blink my eyes a few times. He was still there. I would pull the cover over my head and then peep out. He was still there. Of course, I then freaked out and ran to mommy's room screaming, the boogeyman is here to get me. Help mommy, the boogeyman is here. This would happen several times a month, for a good year or so it seemed. The last occurrence was years later, when what believed to be the same silhouette mentioned above ran across my room. First, I saw Blur run down the hall to my left and stop at the middle of the wall near the footboard of my bed. It took a moment for it to take shape, but it was definitely the silhouette of a human. I started to dart, and the moment I moved, it darted towards the other wall and vanished. I freaked out and flew to my dad and told him that there was someone in my room. Years later, when I was old enough to understand, my dad told me of the ghost of an old lady that dwelled in the house. She was a nice, but sometimes grumpy old gal. However, that doesn't explain the man that was in my room. I still can't figure out if the Beau Duke, which thing was truly a nightmare, or a spirit messing with my head, using the touch of a child's imagination. I've been to Gibbs Bridge twice, and we have seen something every time. The first time the signs kept changing, there will be a lot of writing on the signs, or not every time we came around. I looked back and thought that someone was messing around with us, and I saw a figure standing alongside of the road, ran by the guardrail, and disappeared. Then. I kept seeing something black out of the corner of my eye. My cousin was with me, and she started to scream, and me and her both heard moaning over her screaming. Then, it was me and my sister and her friend. The sides again kept changing, but only a few, not at all like last time. We took pictures, and got orbs. Then, we saw a figure again by the sign, and disappeared. We went all the way down the street and turned around and saw a big bright light. I told my sister it was probably a car, so flash your lights to let them know that you are coming. She did that, and the light was gone. It kind of looked like a motorcycle light with handlebars. I know the whole story about it. Then we turned around again and saw it again. It was not the street light at all, because we turned around going back to the bridge about 10 to 15 times, and only showed up about 3 times. The weirdest part of that night was we left, and my sister's phone was in the center council. Nobody was touching it. Somebody that we know called us, and wondered why we called. Nobody did it. It was in the center council the whole time. My sister looked down and saw her phone hanging up, and they said we left a message. It was all three of us talking, and it was muffled. Tell me what you think, and go out there some time again. Thanks for reading my story. Back in the early 90s, a wealthy family who lived in Corona owned two homes. One large home they owned was on the south side of Corona, overlooking the 15 freeway. The other home, used later as an office, was the old in-town district on Corona's famous Grand Avenue. As the story goes, before the husband and wife met and got married, the husband lived in the large house on Grand Avenue. The house once been a funeral parlor, and almost nightly, the husband would hear talking and other noise coming from the room next to him. He would check the room, only to find it silent 
and nothing out of place. After he met his wife, they purchased a large house on the south side and turned the Grand Avenue mansion into an office. One of the children of the family went to my school and he claimed that their family had experienced all kinds of strange phenomena in the old mansion. One instance, a soda can was completely knocked off of a nightstand right next to a bed that he was sleeping on and constantly they would hear footsteps upstairs. And the mother once said she was in the bathroom and the door suddenly flew open. All of the windows were closed, eliminating any chance of a drift. Another night, the family drove past a mansion, as they often would, to make sure it was secure. Remember, nobody lived there at this time. It was only used as an office. As they drove past the house, they noticed every single light in the house was turned on. They went in, turned out the lights, and left. They checked with everyone who had a key to the house, and everyone assured them they had not turned on the lights. It is claimed that the atmospheric pressure in the backyard is different from the rest of the area. These stories were all interesting to me, but I still had some skepticism, until one year, the family was going to go on vacation to visit relatives in Texas, and they asked my mother and me if we would watch the mansion for them while they were gone. Keep in mind, neither my mother nor I knew anything about the house, including the strange phenomena. So Monday morning, we got to the house and settled in. My mother, a school teacher at the time, was grading some homework assignments, and I, only about five at the time, was fast asleep on the couch. My mother got thirsty, so she stacked the homework assignments in a pile, went to the kitchen for some water, came back, only to find the paper strewn all over the table and on the floor. I was still fast asleep, and there were no open windows. Later on that day, she was in the kitchen again, and she heard me crying in the other room. She ran in to see what was wrong, but again, I was fast asleep. I did not appear to be restless, as if crying in my sleep. Later on that week, we both occasionally would hear footsteps walking around upstairs. It is a very old house, as you can see from the attached photo, so naturally, the floors are very creaky. These were definitely solid footsteps. We constantly went upstairs after hearing the steps, only to find the place empty. After the family returned from their vacation, my mother had mentioned to them the phenomena we experienced. They laughed and explained to us that it happens all of the time. They described the entity as a friendly ghost who likes to play pranks on people, hence the bathroom door flying open. The family eventually moved to Texas and sold the mansion to somebody else. I never returned to ask the new owners if they have experienced anything. Perhaps somebody around this area might want to. For as long as I can remember, I've been able to see and feel the paranormal. I didn't know what it was at first and was truly terrified by the feelings I would get when someone came near me. I'm at the point where I'm no longer afraid, but I do have my moments when something sneaks up on me. Almost every home I lived in has been haunted, and I'm not sure now if they were the homes themselves, or if I'm being followed. I feel comfort in my newest home, and I'm always sure that there is nothing there, which I am grateful for, because my son senses them too, and I'm not sure if he can still see them, but he used to be able to. He knows his uncle and grandfather, and they both died before he was born. He knew things about them that no one else told him, and as a baby, he would stare past me and start laughing at air. In time, he was able to communicate what he saw. In the truly significant moment, came two days before his papa passed away. 
he went into the room his great-grandfather was resting in and came out and told me that there was a man in the chair and he was there to take Papa home. My son was two at the time and we did not discuss his grandfather's dying to him. We only told him that he wasn't feeling well. I knew for sure then that he was able to see and sense things as well. I've seen my brother-in-law praying beside his parents' bed a few days after he died in a snowmobile accident. He has made a clock in his grandparents' home run when it has no batteries and hasn't worked in many years. Every time someone truly missed him and wanted to know if he was there, they would ask him to make the clock go, and most times it did. I knew in my gut the instant my own father died, no one had to tell me. I had a very uneasy feeling in my stomach the night before he died, and I knew that I needed to go to him, but this feeling stopped me from getting on the plane to go home. The next morning, I knew the instant he died, and I was at my sister's house. The feeling just vanished, and I just knew. I told my sister that I had to go home, and that her dad just died, to which she pretty much told me that I was crazy, but I insisted, and I drove myself home. I don't know how I got home. I don't really remember the drive. I remember getting into my car, and this calm was over me. And I remember pulling into my driveway, and my mother-in-law was standing there waiting for me. I got out and told her that I thought my dad died. She confirmed it, and that is when I lost it. I was five months pregnant with my son at the time, and I believe that somehow I was being pushed to stay home, because I am sure that I would have lost my son if I was with my dad when he died. The stress alone nearly killed me. My dad used to come to visit me. He would turn the lights on and off to let me know that he was there. I could feel him around me. It has been a while since I felt him, but I know he's still around. A duplex I lived in had two spirits. A man, that was not good, and a woman. The woman would unlock doors in the night and turn lights on. The man did not want us there, and I sensed that especially in the basement. A few people saw and felt both but the woman kept him in check. The only time they really made themselves known while anyone was awake was the night that my cousin and I were looking on the internet at pictures of ghosts and demons. All of a sudden, there was a loud crash from upstairs. We raced upstairs, but nothing was out of place. I got a really bad feeling and ran upstairs to my son's room and grabbed him. My husband wasn't home, but I called him to come home. My cousin and I sat in my living room freaking out when I saw the man walk by me, and he was in black with a large brim hat. My cousin saw him too, and he had never previously had an encounter. It was as if he was telling us to stay off those websites because they were not good or something. All I could even remember was the absolute terror in my heart. The orchard I grew up on, was haunted by more than three spirits. Not all of them are good, and they made it known that we were not wanted either. One spirit had befriended our family and would try to protect us from the little girl who wanted us out of there very badly. I believe that she and the little boy were my second cousins killed in a car accident with my great-grandfather, though no one has been able to confirm that. Walking down the stairs to the basement, the same step always seemed to break, and you would trip. It never actually broke, but seven out of ten times, you would trip on that damn stair. I mean, anyone would trip too. Faces would appear in windows. Gunshots would ring out behind our house, and no one was there. My dad even checked for footprints a few times, because the shots were that close. The taps in the kitchen exploded once, and there were the booming noises from within the house, for no reason. I saw the spirit of the cat my dad ran over a few times, and then there were the horses and cows that periodically freaked out over something no one else could see. There was also the drifting odor of the orchard of a dead animal, though it was never in one spot, and there were no dead animals. I used to feel like there was something under the stairs to the basement. It was an old house with old wooden stairs, the kind that had no back, and under the stairs was dirt. 
I always had a bad feeling about that. I would fly down the stairs as fast as I could and run them up two or three at a time. My dad had renovated the house and my brother and I were fortunate to have bedrooms in the basement. I got locked into my room one night and we ended up having to take the hinges off to get me out. No lock on the door. When we were moving, I was sitting on the floor in my room packing when all of a sudden, the mirror on my dresser came crashing down, shards of glass missing me by centimeters. My friend's family rented the house from my dad for a short period of time, and one night, my friend had fallen asleep in the area of the basement by the stairs. The hissing cat woke her up, and she looked to see something clawing out of the dirt. She didn't stick around to find out what it was. A few days later, her brother came bolting into the room she was sleeping in, my old bedroom, and grabbed her arm and demanded to know if she was practicing witchcraft or something. She didn't because he had two perfect bite marks on his wrist. And when they looked at her arm, she had the exact same marks as if they had been bitten by fangs or something. Of course, they left shortly after, but not because of the things they experienced. I didn't find out about any of this until after they moved. An older woman bought the orchard, and when my sister went back to visit a year or so ago, she happened to mention strange things that were happening around the orchard and asked my sister if she knew anything about it. My sister quickly filled her in about the yellow and green orbs seen floating around the house, the strange occurrences, and all the noises. The difference of what she had seen and felt was that she saw a cowboy and we were told there was an Indian on the orchard protecting our family. Apparently, the land that my great-grandparents had settled on was once a battlefield, and our family had been told the Indian warrior died there in battle. The house we moved into after we moved off to Orchard had its own spirit or two as well. My parents didn't believe me until a few years after I moved out, and my mom had been home alone, and the front door unlocked, opened, closed, locked, and she heard footsteps move around the house and up the stairs. And then they stopped. She also heard the kitchen cupboards open and close, and kept calling out to my dad. They lived alone by this time, but no answer. This continued like this for about half an hour. My mom got scared, and refused to leave her bedroom, until my dad actually came home an hour after that. She blamed him, but it couldn't have been him. He was at work. This was a frequent occurrence. But previously, my parents blamed my brother or myself or the other until my brother and I moved out. There was also the time my friend and I thought we would play a trick on my brother and pretend that the house had been broken into. We trashed the house nicely, placing objects around as if they had been thrown or scattered in a rush. We were standing in the kitchen laughing about this whole thing when all of a sudden, a hand reached up the window you would have to be almost seven and a half feet tall to do this. We screamed and ran up the stairs to get the cordless phone. The doorbell started ringing and knocking on all of the windows started. We called the police, thinking that someone was actually trying to break into the house. The police heard the noises and told us to stay upstairs until they got there. My brother and a bunch of his friends walked in at this point and we started to accuse them when there was another noise outside and my brother went out to investigate. I saw him chase someone down the street in a plaid coat and then the person just vanished. My friend and I were hysterical by this time and the police had just arrived. They brought canine dogs and the only scent they picked up was my brother's and that is because he had chased someone out of the yard. The dogs didn't pick up anything else and there were no footprints anywhere except the police and ours. My dad came home, and my brother and his friends swore it wasn't that. When the morning came, we all went out to check under the kitchen window for evidence it was my brother, and there was just no way that anyone could have just reached up that way that hand reached up. There was also the time that I came home, and the upstairs extension picked up while I was on the phone. I thought my friend had someone over, or it was a party line. Small towns used to have this, 
where two different residences shared the same phone line. She thought I was trying to scare her because we could both hear breathing. I snuck to the stairs and saw the shadow of a man. I freaked out, grabbed a knife, and ran out the door. I called my sister down the street to come, and there was no way anyone could have gotten out, but no one was there when it was checked out. There was also the glowing eyes in the bushes of the street. I used to see those frequently at night, and once in a while, I was brave enough to go and check it out, to see if there was a dog in the bushes, peering out. There never was, and the hairs on my neck would stand straight up on end. I wasn't the only person to see this or feel this way about those bushes. Quite a few houses in the area were haunted as well. I would hear a man's voice in the house where I babysat, and so did the girl I babysat. It was detached and floating in the air. You would feel tugs on your shirt when your neck was turned, and lights in the basement would flick on and off. A friend of mine who was completely skeptical lived in the house previously and had confided in me that she thought something weird was going on in the house. She slept upstairs, and every day she would look in the cubby hole in the wall, and there was a sleeping bag unrolled and an imprint of a body on it, and every day she would roll it up and put it away, only to find it there in the morning again, or by the time she got home from school. She showed me this one day, which made me uneasy, talking about the babysitting job there when new people moved in. There is so much more, but honestly, I'm getting tired and drained out. If you want to hear more, let me know. My story is not very complicated. My husband, my son who is now eight, and of course me, moved into our current house a little more than two years ago. Once when my husband and son were spending a weekend at my brother-in-law's, I told my husband I was afraid of being alone in the house, even though I am reclusive by nature. He said to ask my guardian spirits for help. So, not really expecting anything, I said aloud before I went to bed that I would appreciate my guardian spirits for a sign they were present. Later that night, I was awakened by the sound of the doorknob on the bedroom door being turned. I looked over and actually saw it turning. I was terrified. Nothing came in, and there was no way I was going looking for the doorknob turner. At best, it was an intruder. When my husband came home, I told him all about it, and he told me that I asked for a sign, after all. About a year after we moved in, our then two-year-old nephew came to live with us. He was very delayed and could only speak at about a one-year-old level. We made a playroom for the kids in the basement. Josh, our nephew, refused to play down there alone. I didn't blame him. We had to totally run out of clean clothes before I'd go down there to do laundry. It was creepy, not dark at all, but there was always a feeling of being watched or someone standing close behind you. We also heard footsteps down there, and water being turned on. That fall, Josh threw one of his little boots down the stairs, and my husband ordered him into the basement to pick it up. Josh reached the bottom of the stairs, turned to look into the basement, screamed ghost in mortal terror, and ran back up the stairs and shot into my husband's arms. By this time, we had named the presence Alex. Josh said Alex had made a very bad face at him, he refused to go down in the basement at all after that. We also had an incident where our broom was totally missing from our house for almost two weeks. I searched every inch of the house, including the basement. It wasn't in our house. We thought someone had borrowed it. No one had. Finally, I yelled down into the basement, Alex, if you have the broom, we need it back. After a couple of minutes, in another good search of the upstairs, I went down to the basement and found the broom leaning against the wall right by the stairs. I thought I was doing pretty well with the whole having a ghost experience. Sure, I was secretly scared to death, but I kept reminding myself that there are spirits all around us 
and Alex seemed to be rather mild and harmless. He even listened to my husband when Mike ordered him to stop scaring the kids and later to stop coming upstairs. And surely, Alex had as much right to be there as I have. However, I changed my mind after taking a nap in the extra room downstairs. I was awakened with a jolt by the distinct feeling of a hand slapping me in the face. That was it for me. While we were in the car, away from the house, I told my husband Alex had to go, and since he seemed to have some authority, he had to tell Alex to leave. Mike said he'd probably have to talk to a medicine man. Luckily, however, perhaps after overhearing a similar conversation at the house, Alex left on his own. No more noises from the basement, missing household objects, or eerie feelings. In fact, after a while, my husband and I even moved our bedroom downstairs, and we never had a weird experience down there. Josh was more than willing to come downstairs, although he still does talk about Alex occasionally. We did have to move back upstairs, but that only involved a mundane little mouse running around down there. I had a friend in Arlington, Texas whose house had a ghost. Her family called it George, and they laughed about it. There was no malevolence involved. Their house was relatively new, and not particularly outstanding. It was a classic 50s ranch house. Anyway, my friend's room was always chilly. The temperature was about 65 degrees. Her family had ducked people check out the ducks to her room on several occasions. Despite the blazing North Texas summers, where the central heat turned on in the winter, her room maintained this temperature. I had heard all the stories and didn't really know what to think. I spent the night, and that made a believer out of me. First, during dinner, things fell off of shelves in the adjacent den. Her parents laughed and yelled, Stop it, George. Later, when I went into the kitchen for some water, the reflective view in the kitchen window started spinning. I was somewhat entranced, and then realized that the center of the spiraling image was the figure of a man. The figure was getting closer and larger. I ran into the den before I saw any more. As we went to sleep in the sleeper couch in the den, several books in the shelves opposite the couch slowly pulled out from their position on the shelf and almost fell to the floor. George is one of my fondest memories. My friend and I had other strange encounters after that, including many that didn't involve George. I think that some people are more receptive to energies and have more of these events than other people. I've decided to post my other stories now, before I forget to post them later. The first one I would like to share happened when I was 18. My friend was living with me and my family in our house in Northeast Calgary. We were sitting in our room playing cards. There had been a couple strange things happening the last few weeks, like my TV turning on and off by itself, the volume going up and down on my stereo. Since both of us had always been believers, she's always had experiences of her own. We knew it was the work of a ghost. We were never really frightened, at least not until the night I'm about to tell you about. Anyway, like I said, we were playing a game with the deck of cards. You asked the question and then flipped the card. If it was a black card, the answer was no. A red card was a yes. It was called something like Ouija cards. At first it was just a game. We were laughing and joking around at the answers it gave us. Until we noticed a pattern. Every time we got to the bottom of the deck and shuffled them for the next round, the first three cards flipped were 666. The first couple of times we just brushed it off as being coincidental. But by the third, fourth, and fifth times, we were scared. We decided it was time to call it a night and picked up the cards. We made sure to check underneath ourselves and under the pillows on our bed to make sure we didn't miss any cards. We hadn't. But after gabbing for a half an hour, I was going to go downstairs to my room. Sure enough, there was a card sitting right in plain view of both of us. We looked at each other a little funny 
and then she picked up the card. It was the six of spades. I got curious as we went to put the six card back with the others and flip the two cards of the deck. Both of them were sixes. We put the cards in the kitchen and on my way downstairs, I heard the TV go on. I turned to go back upstairs to tell my friend when it turned off again. I went to my room and laid down. A couple minutes later, I noticed the room had gotten brighter. I opened my eyes and saw that six of my candles were glowing brightly, even though no one had been in the room to light up. I blew them out and tried to go to sleep. It happened again, but this time they lit, one by one. I ran from my room, noticing it grow dark once again, and slept the rest of the night with my friend. I've never had an occurrence like that again. My most recent experience happened in January 1999. One of her dogs, CB, short for cat bait, had recently been put down. He had been a big part of the family for 15 years. One night, our other dog, Tia, came downstairs to my room. This was extremely odd since the only time she ever came down was if I had food or if she was with my mom, but she never came down in the dead of night. I was fast asleep when I was awoken by the sound of her barking at the end of my bed. I told her to go away and to shut up, but she persisted. I sat up and found her jumping at the end of the bed. I asked her if she wanted outside, but that's not what she wanted. She wanted me to get out of bed. Irritated, I did just that. We walked out of my room, and she started barking at the corner of the basement. I thought maybe she had found a mouse or something. But, upon turning on all the lights and investigating, I found nothing. She started walking around the basement. If I did not follow her, she would bark. I was getting tired of this game, and just wanted to go back to bed. But she just kept barking until I followed her. Finally, she led me into the laundry room and went over to the pile of blankets laying on the floor and started barking and switched between looking at me and staring at the sheets. It then occurred to me that the pile of blankets were one of CB's favorite spots to sleep. I remembered hearing somewhere that animals, especially cats and dogs, had a sensitivity to spirits and ghosts. I smiled and asked Tia, Is that CB? Immediately. Her tail started wagging, and she went over to the blankets, lay down, gave them one lick, and then went back upstairs. I know it was my little dog who was visiting me that night. I'm just glad that Tia decided to share that visit with me. Since then, Tia shared it with me a couple of times, although I still haven't seen CB's ghost for myself. This story has several parts. It has taken me months to put this together in a way that makes sense and takes all the known facts into account. I awakened suddenly from deep dreaming sleep one night in December or January with the terror that someone was in my room. I've heard that in most people, there is a reflex that literally prevents them from moving when they are in a deep state of sleep and the frozen, unable to move state described by many upon first being awakened, is simply that reflex still working, not fully in sync with sudden consciousness. I'm in a different category. However, I'm a sleepwalker, incapable of vigorous movement, even when not awake. To get on with the story, I felt an intrusion in my dream that had nothing to do with what I was dreaming about. It shocked me awake, and I sat up straight in my bed. I was treated to the sight of an apparition standing near the foot of my bed. It was quite tall, over six feet I would guess. I couldn't tell if it was male or female, but my sense was that it was female. It had short dark hair, parted in the middle and brushed back on either side, and wore flowing white garments. It emitted no light. What I could see of it was illuminated by the yard's light shining in the bedroom window. I apparently surprised it because for a fraction of a second, its right hand was raised to its temple in a gesture that seemed to indicate I was not supposed to have awakened 
or have seen it. Immediately, it was gone, leaving me to wonder if I had really just been dreaming. It all happened so quickly. In January, I visited a psychic who told me that in addition to the spirit of my grandmother, which I knew about, I had the spirit of a young girl strongly attached to me. She was not able to give me any details as to who the girl might be, and I thought about this for a great deal. For months I pondered whom this might be, and got no enlightenment. Finally one day, the face of a child I had used to babysit for many years ago sort of popped into my head, and I knew who my little girl attachment was. She was a tragic little figure, who was a foster child in a home that cared for her, but most certainly did not love her. Even as a teenager, my heart ached for that child, and I told my mother that once the lifeline on her left palm was extremely short, I always felt she would die young. I really didn't know any facts about her since I lost touch with her foster family after I went to college, but I had no doubt that she was my attachment. A few days after this, I went to another psychic who told me that the girl had not been ready to die when it happened. It had surprised her. For that reason, she was unable to find the light that souls are supposed to go to when they pass. He told me that I was the only light she could find and therefore she had attached to me, but that wasn't a good thing. She meant me no harm, but she was draining me some of my energy, and she needed to move on for her own sake as well. He spoke with her briefly, and told me she was 17, and that her stepfather had caused her death, or at least, a great deal of pain while she was alive, which he does correlate with what I knew of the man. Remember, she was in foster care, not living with her mother and stepfather when I knew her, but the man was a convicted child molester. The psychic told me he would go help her to the light, and I presume he was successful. Tonight I was reading some of the articles on the site about why spirits tend to manifest at night, to get a glimpse of someone they loved, perhaps, or to try to communicate, and what the best reaction to an apparition is, and I realized that one, Probably my apparition was my young friend, who I wouldn't have recognized, because I hadn't seen her for about seven years before she passed, and two, sitting straight up in bed was a good way to scare it off, because it disappeared in the blink of an eye. If I had realized who it was, I would have tried to make things easier for her, but for both of our sakes, I hope there is no next time. In 1975, my wife's parents and her sister Mary moved to the eastern shore of Maryland into a hundred-year-old farmhouse. What made them believe there was a ghost was little things disappearing and reappearing in different places, doors locking by themselves, being touched by someone who wasn't there. Things really didn't start getting weird until her other sister Cher and her son David moved in with them. Cher had a little bit of VSP. She could tell when things were going to happen. She would have dreams and funny feelings that would mostly come true. They would hear noises in the attic, footsteps, and things rolling around. Cher would hear someone calling her name at night. She had the bedroom with the attic door in it. Once, my wife felt someone sit on her bed, and Cher felt someone run their fingers through her hair. They were all outside taking photos of each other one time and no one was in the house. But when the photos were developed, someone was looking out the pantry window. They believed the ghost was not harmful. In fact, it was very helpful. Things that they were looking for would appear. When David was a baby, he had stuffed animals in his crib. Years later, he told us that he was afraid of these stuffed animals because he thought that they were alive. Another thing that happened was when both my wife and her sister Mary got married, both of their wedding photos that were taken in the house never turned out. They believed the ghost was sad to leave them there. In the big foyer, there was a room that had been painted black from other occupants, and whenever they would pass the room that was by a staircase, they felt as if someone was watching them go up the stairs. All three sisters felt this presence. I'm now a 48-year-old professional, settled in Canada and doing very well. In Northern England, as a youth, I had many experiences, 
mainly revolving around the house, which my family bought when I was 12 years old. We were told by the neighbors that three families had moved out in the 18 months before we moved in, but the only explanation was that they had marriage problems. Within a year, we heard noises, such as a person banging on the door, or definite and very clear footsteps, which would walk up the stairs if you were upstairs, or down the stairs if you were down. When it first happened, I thought it was my brother, one year younger than myself, banging on the door, disturbing my math homework. But when he went down to complain, my parents insisted that he had not been out of the front room for an hour. The very next incident was I was awakened in the middle of the night by a tremendous racket from the bathroom, and I got up and put my trousers on to see what it was. As I left my room, my mother stood at her door, and we each asked the other if we had heard the sound. We agreed that it came from the bathroom and went to look. All that was there was an empty washing up liquid bottle, made of plastic, squashed and lying on the floor. Another night, my mother and I heard a crash, as if metal ladders had fallen outside downstairs living room, but again, there was no source for the sound when we checked. Over the years from age 12 to 18, I became familiar with these sounds and joke with school friends that we had a ghost called Jack. Some friends were in the house when the footsteps came down the stairs. I heard them, but I said nothing. No one else did. When it happened a second time, I heard it, and so did a young man named Mike, who had never heard of this story. He searched everywhere and would not accept my reassurance that no one was there. When I left to go to university, I told the next door neighbor, a middle-aged woman, that I was glad to leave. She told me that these sounds were the reason why the three families left in such a haste. The neighbors agreed not to tell us because they did not want to put ideas into our minds. A woman who lived there previously was found dead in the bath with her wrist slit. It was thought to be suicide. I had a vague and reoccurring mental image of a man coming down the curved stairway. A friend later suggested that, perhaps, this man was the old woman's son. Perhaps he killed her and made it look like suicide. Who knows? One piece of advice. Never try a Ouija board to communicate with the dead. Leave well enough alone. If experiences happen to you naturally, they are completely harmless and in some cases can be helpful. They might happen for a total of a few seconds in your whole life, but do not try to make them happen because you might frighten yourself. This is my best advice. There are other stories, all true, but they have to wait. This happened while I was holidaying in Florida and a hotel we had stayed at several times. The first time we stayed here, we were in room 12. While in room 12, we would always hear arguments from next door and the occupants would always check out, usually within one or two days never staying longer. My husband loves America, especially Florida. As it happens, I was to have an operation in Florida, and this was a good time to visit. We checked in at the same hotel. My husband wanted the room in which we had stayed in before, room 12. Unfortunately, it was taken, so we had to take the room next door. This motel does not have a room 13, so the room is numbered 14. I did feel uneasy about staying in that room, let's just say a nagging feeling, an intuition which I always trust. By the way, I come from a long line of witches. The reason why I was so uneasy about this was not because of the number, but from remembering the countless couples that came and went from that room. My husband insisted we stay there, since it was next to room 12 and the happy memories of the last holiday we had there. I gave in, and we checked in. We unpacked our things, and from day one, we had an argument the whole entire time we were there. I thought to myself, maybe it was me subconsciously dreading the operation and taking it out on him. We would be at each other like cats and dogs, to the point at which I walked out of that room a couple of times. The atmosphere would be charged and depressing, and as soon as I walked out, the sun would lift my spirits. 
My husband is not superstitious, nor does he believe in ghostly encounters. After having my operation, I would have to be bedridden for a week or so, and heavily under the influence of painkillers. While I lay in bed, I would chase my husband away with my bad mood, post-op blues, so I could be left alone and in peace. The time I had alone in that room would stay with me for a long time. Remember, I had taken some painkillers for my operation. My husband had drawn the curtains so I could sleep. One afternoon, I dozed off and was awakened by the tug of the bed sheets. I thought maybe I kicked it off, so I tried to pull them up. Once I did, I fell asleep again. Again I was awakened by the feeling of sheets being tugged. I thought it was my husband and woke up shouting at him, but there was no one in the room. I felt the temperature in the room was cold. I shivered and had to force myself in great pain to get out of bed and pull the sheets up. Once in bed, I looked around the room. The strange thing was, it seemed like shadows in the corner, yet it was bright as day outside and the curtains were drawn and there were no trees or anything near the window to give off shadows. I stayed awake for hours, waiting for my husband to return. He walked in and got a shock, seeing me all wide-eyed and thought he had left the air conditioner on as it was very cool. He walked over and noticed it was off and blamed that the damn thing was broken. For the whole week while I recuperated in that room by myself during the day, my bed sheets would come off. I would wake up in cold sweats, looking around the room. There was no one there. I felt something brushing my skin and always felt the shadows in the corner. I put it down to painkillers. They were very mild, and my usually happy self became withdrawn and depressed. I noticed that my husband would come back smiling and was trying to cheer me up, but as we stayed longer in that room, it seemed to have an effect on us. He became mean, and sometimes he would jeer at me. I had enough by this time, and wanted to leave. The last night we had stayed there, I had not taken any painkillers, as I wanted to believe I was not hallucinating or seeing things. And believe me, I've seen many things and experienced stranger. I was not sleeping well, and looked over to my husband, who slept soundly. The funny thing was, he seemed to be illuminated by something. I tried to touch him, but my hand could not move. I stretched out to him. We slept in separate beds while I was recuperating. He was only an arm's length away, and yet I couldn't move. I was sweating now with a feeling of dread. My whole body felt like lead, and I could only move my head. I tried so hard to move, yet I couldn't. I could really feel that there was someone or something that was in the room with me, but I couldn't even see them. Someone was there near my bed, but not fully visible yet. I started to say something and tried to call out to my husband. He was dead asleep and did not move. As I turned my head to the foot of my bed, my sheets were being tugged off. I really screamed, but nothing came out. I was forcing myself to say something and nothing came. At the foot of my bed appeared a tall black outline. The figure seemed to be wearing a hooded cloak, but I had a profile view. It had its outstretched arm on my bed. I'm six feet tall, and my feet are slightly stuck out over the bed. I tried to move my feet to kick out, but my limbs were like dead weights. The black garb figure turned to me and began to walk towards me. At this moment, I was desperately repeating the Lord's Prayer. I'm not religious, but it came to mind. Over and over, and as it began to walk to me, I remember the eyes started to glow red. At this stage, I was turning my head to and from the figure to my husband, as well as stretching my arm out, trying to touch him to wake him up. I remember him sleeping soundly like a baby. As the figure approached, and I was sweating buckets, and repeatedly said the Lord's Prayer. I yelled out, Stop! And that I worshipped only God, and that I belonged to Him. That's when the figure was no longer there. 
I blinked a couple of times, thinking it was a nightmare, but I noticed that my arm was still outstretched towards my husband, and he was still in the same position, sleeping soundly. I started crying and busted open a stitch. My husband woke up and said that I just had a very bad nightmare. I said I'm glad that we were leaving that very morning. We still go back to the motel, as my husband loves it, yet I insist that we do not stay in that room. Thanks for reading. I grew up on a farm in Missouri. The house we lived in was built around the turn of the century. It was a big two-story house with a wraparound porch. I shared a bedroom with my brother on the bottom floor. In the summer of 1975, something happened that had a long-term effect on me. It was a clear moonlit night, and you could easily hear crickets and bullfrogs singing in the night. I was sleeping very soundly when something woke me. I had the impression that someone was pushing down several times on the foot of the bed. I looked up and was startled to see the shadow of a short plump figure watching me. Horrified, I immediately went for the light, but there was nothing there. The figure I'd seen had no face, but seemed to have a soft glow. It was definitely trying to get my attention. I never went to sleep the rest of the night, leaving the light on and reading. The next night, about the same time, I was awake and witnessed a small ball of light zipping around the room. This time I left the light off and watched the tiny orb for about 15 seconds when it finally zipped out of the room. I talked to certain family members later and found out that that apparition that I had seen was probably my great grandmother. She had died in the same corner that my bed was sitting. In her later years, she began to lose her mind and instead of putting her in a nursing home, the family decided to take care of her at her home. They hired a male nurse to help her and at night, the night I saw her, my uncle said she was probably looking for her. The incident disturbed me deeply and it was years before I could finally sleep well at night. I'm now married and live in another old house. This one seems to have no past to disturb me. Thank God. In 1999, my husband and I purchased our first home. We had two very small children at the time and soon found out we were expecting our third. We had purchased an old Queen Anne Victorian. It was very large and all the homes around it were large as well. We had looked at many houses before we purchased the old home. In fact, I drove past the home to go to work every day. I would never considered buying it, but always felt drawn to it. Things seemed fine. I was alone in the home when I heard what seemed to be a child laughing. I thought maybe our family had come home early, but no one was there. One other time, I was in the cellar getting clothes out of the dryer and heard a child call mommy. But again, I was alone when this occurred and none of the neighbor's children were outside. I was lying in my bedroom with my eyes closed and could feel something breathe on me. When I opened my eyes, nothing was there. I have a cat who likes to go outside at night and one evening, my husband heard her at the door. He opened the door and let her in, or so he thought. The next morning, he saw our cat waiting on the porch for us to let her in. We searched the entire home looking for the cat he had thought he let in the previous evening, and there was no animal to be found. My daughter, who was three and a half at the time, would come into our bedroom complaining that the little girl would keep her awake and would not stop playing with the curtains. She would also complain about the man who would whisper by her closet. My mother and I were hanging wallpaper in the family room, which was next to the dining room. My mother was facing the door to the dining area. I had the door to my side. As we were hanging a portion of the paper, we both saw a figure move through the dining room area and into the kitchen. 
My mother said, oh, good. Dan is home. He can help us hang. I called to my husband and asked if he had eaten lunch yet. I got no response. Thinking he could not hear, I went to the kitchen to ask again. He was not there. I called thinking he went upstairs and still no answer. My mother and I checked the whole house and looked outside for the car. No one was there but her and I. It was a strange feeling. Sometimes lights would go on for no reason. We would hear someone climbing the steps. It was a little unsettling, but we no longer live in the home. We are now building a brand new house. Story that follows is a true account of an 11 year experience that I will never forget. When I was 6 years old, my family moved into an old Victorian home in Pontiac, Michigan. The house still stands today and has changed owners several times, but is in a state of disrepair. The house had been built in 1892 by a Mr. Newsbrinder for himself, his wife, and children. My parents had purchased the home from Clara, the last living daughter, and higher. I remember moving in that day because even as a young child, I felt a sense of uneasiness. That feeling was soon to be validated. At first, it was more of just an uneasy feeling throughout the whole house. Soon I discovered, though, that the feeling intensified while in my room. It was a large, four-bedroom home. And us three girls all had the luxury of having a bedroom all to ourselves. Mine was in the back of the house, next to my parents' room, and across the upstairs foyer from my other two sisters. When alone in my room, I began to feel as though I was being watched. It is a universal, primitive feeling. I'll be sitting at my desk doing my homework, or just laying across my bed listening to my stereo, and I would feel it. I felt that her presence was emanating from one corner of my room, up at the ceiling. I had not seen or heard anything up until this point, but that was soon to change. As I was alone in my room again, one day after school, I heard a voice call my name. It was a male voice, and I thought it was my father. I went into the foyer to answer his call, but since he was not home for work yet, it could not have been him. I went back into my room and soon heard the voice again. I say that I heard it, but it occurred to me several years after the fact that I only heard it in my mind. A sort of telepathic communication, I think. It wasn't long before this voice became an everyday intrusion into my life. It would call my name repeatedly. It would assure me that it was okay and for me not to be afraid. It also told me to come closer to the corner from where it was coming. I remember now that I would be so drawn to it and would just stand there transfixed, staring at the corner. I never went close to it, call it instinct, fear, whatever, but I somehow knew better. As I was staring at the corner one day, a huge void opened up in the corner. It was the blackest black I'd ever seen. I saw nothing in the gaping hole, but it seemed to go on forever, and I would grow lightheaded and lost blocks of time staring into it. Now, I had told my younger sister all about this, but she never saw or felt anything until we actually moved out of the house, but I will get to that later. I was afraid to tell my parents, and had been warned by the voice that this was our secret, no need for me to tell voice began to torment me. Even at night, as I lay in my bed sleeping, I could feel it there in the dark, beckoning. It invaded my dreams, becoming ever more insistent that I succumb to its wish that I come into the void. It was angry at me, growling insults and obscenities, but I never would give in. Towards the end of the stay in our house, I began arguing back, telling it, that I was stronger than it and would not be overpowered. Strangely enough, over all those years, I'd come to accept its presence as a normal part of life for me. No one ever saw or felt it but me. I'd even confided in my best friend Shirley, 
who would frequently come for sleepovers. I think she slept with one eye in the corner. The day we moved out, I experienced the most intense terror I will ever feel for the rest of my life. I was then 17. I was in my room, packing up the last few items. I felt the familiar goosebumps and tingling of my skin as the hair on my back of my neck and arms stood up. My voice was at a fervent pitch now, threatening and cursing me. I turned around to face my enemy, stared into the blackness, and was mesmerized to see the most evil eyes I had ever seen come out of the darkness. I could see the whites of his eyes, and the center was like black coal. The hole began to turn, and I heard a deafening roaring sound, not unlike that of a huge waterfall, in close proximity. I dropped what I was doing, ran down the steps, and got into the family car. I left the rest of my things in that room, and never looked back. I never heard or saw anything like that again. After we had moved out, my younger sister began having nightmares about something dark and heavy, chasing her in our old house. No coincidence, I think. I still get the chills when I think about this. I assure you, this was real. My family and I lived on a farm in Manistee County for 11 years. It is a log home built sometime in the 1860s. We had numerous experiences, such as the older man talking to my toddler in her bedroom, while knocks on the front door in the middle of a snowy night with no one there and no footprints in the snow. Heavy footsteps could be heard downstairs when we were lying in our bed on the upstairs landing. A back door was totally jammed shut and the only thing my husband thought he could do was cut it open. But on a windless night, it just flew open and there was a strange odor. We had a neighbor across the street tell us that he heard the piano playing when we were gone. I heard my name called often. We had people house it because we only heated with wood. They heard noises, saw curtains move, and wouldn't stay there again. We saw a figure in my daughter's bedroom window when we pulled away from the driveway. I had a sunburn on my back in the shape of the barn. Now there were no trees or possible shadows, and we even showed a friend, and at the time, it didn't make any sense. But then our neighbor came and said he saw the barn swaying in the wind. At closer inspection, the main supports in the barn were almost completely rotted away. Was this someone's way of telling us something was wrong? There are more stories, but these are some of the best. I'm not lying. These actually happened. And if you don't believe me, well, I guess you're on your own then. But these did happen. Thank you for reading. I moved into the neighborhood that I live in at the age of 12. I'm 20 now. Ever since I moved in here, I was told of the woods and the strange things that went on in it. Sounds of drums voices, screams, etc. Needless to say, the woods is creepy, so creepy, that I refuse to go there at night. Let me explain. The woods consist of two sections, the front and the back. It's the back part that scares the bejesus out of me. In 98, a girl was killed in the front part of the woods, where she was raped and left for dead in the cold next to the old tractor. A tractor that had been rotting there for at least 30 years. Well, since the girl was killed, there have been some violent storms that have taken their toll in the trees surrounding the area of the death. My friend and I would go to the spot every now and again, until that night. I had a girlfriend at the time that lived on the road across the woods, so to get to her house, you could take the short way, which was through the woods, past the spot where the girl was killed. I'd walk my girl home, and I was returning through the woods, when I felt a sudden cold draft. Now mind you, this is the end of summer, so there was no logical explanation to see my breath during this time of year. I then turned to look over at the tractor, and I felt an overwhelming sense of depression and sorrow that made me feel sick to my stomach. I started to walk towards the tractor, 
and I could have sworn I heard the crying of a girl's voice say, run away. At this point, I started to pick my feet up and walk a little faster when I noticed a little girl standing from a distance behind the tractor. She didn't look to be more than six years old and looked about as solid and real as anybody I'd ever seen. I froze in sheer terror, knowing that there would be no way that a six-year-old girl would wander off into the woods unsupervised and by herself, especially knowing the history of these woods. As I got closer to the girl, she ran further away and behind some trees where she ultimately disappeared. It was not long after that that I hightailed my butt back to the house as fast as I could. The next day I told my friend about what happened, so from then on, he walked with me each time I dropped my girlfriend off, hoping to hear or see something. It never happened to me again, but months later, I was talking to a friend who still hung out in the woods, and he told me he was sitting on one of the fallen trees, and he heard a girl crying. He said it startled him, so he went to go and leave. Just as he got up, he heard a louder voice say why. He said he felt depressed and ran the rest of the way out of the woods. The woods has had a lot of strange things happen to it, like fires that start and go out by themselves, houses adjacent to the woods that have their backyards vandalized, and the sounds of someone knocking on the back doors. Interestingly enough, I found out that there was a forgotten cemetery somewhere back in the woods that had been neglected for years. I don't know what kind of paranormal energies take place in these woods, but I don't want to discover more of it. My parents still live in the same house I grew up in with my older sister. My experiences with ghosts began at about age 8. One night, I'd just gotten into bed and was waiting for my dad to come tuck me in. The lights were still on and the whole family were upstairs. I wasn't alone or anything. I was wearing a nightgown. Suddenly, I felt two hands run quickly underneath my nightgown, up my legs, and over my body. I screamed bloody murder, and my parents came running in. I don't remember if they believed me, but I never slept in that room again. I traded rooms with my sister. Once she had begun sleeping in that room, she would tell us in the morning that someone would sit on the bed and say her name while they rubbed her head, but she never opened her eyes during these encounters. A few years later, I was getting my dad and I some ice cream in the kitchen. There was a new big bag of candy on the counter in front of me. Suddenly, it flew across the counter. I ran and told everyone. They believed me when they saw the candy on the other counter. Another time stayed homesick from school. I was lying in bed watching TV and I kept hearing what sounded like marbles being dropped in the attic right above my bedroom. I was so scared, I called my mom, and she sent her friend over to stay with me. To this day, the TV in our kitchen turns on and off by itself. My aunt reported hearing music being played in her family room when everyone else was outside. Last weekend, my family gave me a bridal shower at my parents' house. When I got the pictures back, Almost all of the pictures have orbs in them. I could not believe it. Whoever it is, is still there and still trying to be a part of us. It was my first time going to the Gettysburg War site. First, we visited their museum and looked at old clothing and war supplies. Then it was time for the tour of the battle site. It started off regularly the guide showing us all the memorials and explaining this and that. Then it was time to get out of the car and look out over a field where a charge was made. It was a nice view stretching out before us, and behind us was a slope with a grove of trees to the right. While the guide talked, I noticed sounds of what seemed like a great number of people yelling and screaming down the slope, nearer in the grove of the trees. It was quiet at first, but it got louder and quiet again. Even the tour guide stopped for a moment to question what those sounds were, and I even asked the guide if there was a reenactment going on down there. 
He just looked at me confused and said no. Perplexed. I asked if he had ever heard those sounds before while giving tours, and told us that this was the first time he had heard such distinct sounds that sounded like battle cries. There was even a moment where I was standing there, and I could have sworn I saw an extremely faded apparition run across the field for a second, then completely dissolve. Somehow I was the only one who saw this apparition. We then moved on, and as we walked back to the car, I asked my mom later about it. She thinks it was where the Confederate soldiers mustered up their courage by screaming war cries before they went to battle. I've been trying to find stories similar to mine ever since, but I've found none. My name is John, and I've been a Civil War reenactor for about four years now, attending living history events and reenactments throughout the mid-Atlantic states. I'd like to tell you about an experience that my reenacting group had at Antietam National Battlefield, Maryland. My company, Company G, 96 Pennsylvania Volunteers, annually has a living history event at this famed Civil War battlefield. It was here that in September of 1862, one day's casualties amounted to 23,000, more killed, wounded, or missing in one day than the casualties in America's previous wars combined. At one point during the battle, one American was injured with every second ticked by. I'd like to note that this was the ground upon which we were camping on. To continue my story, we traditionally take a walk into the battlefield to a small lane known as the Sunken Road. Here, Confederates hunkered down in a road that had been worn down by years of wagon travel, holding off wave after wave of heroic Union soldiers advancing upon them. Eventually, the Union forces swarmed over the Confederates' right flank and fired into the rebels from down the road, driving them off. This is where we annually took a midnight tour, hoping to catch a glimpse of energy left from 1862. Please note, that even though the park closes around 10 p.m., the rangers often allow us reenactors to walk around. This is because if we found anyone defacing a monument or even shifting a pebble, that person will be praying for a ranger to come by and save him. So this night, about a dozen of us strolled down the sunken road and eventually came upon a monument located in about the center of the lane's length. We sat down along the banks of the road to relax and take in the atmosphere. About 20 minutes passed with silence and a few pictures taken here and there of us around the monument. Soon, four of us, myself included, chose to walk the remaining distance of the road to an observation tower, climb it, take a few snapshots, then head back. So we decided to walk down to the tower, ascend a few flights of stairs, and took a look around. Meanwhile, back at the monument, our captain decided that everyone had better get back to camp, so he sent two men to go retrieve us from the tower. No sooner had those two began to walk down the road, when the remaining few men heard shoes and heel plates, horseshoe-like plates we wear on our leather shoes, on the gravel, and earth down the road. First two pair, then four pair, then six, and so on. Equipment could be heard rustling around on the body, knapsacks, canteens, cartridge boxes. If anyone knows what it sounds like to have men marching on a dirty road with full gear on, it's us. The sounds continually crescendoed until one man sat up, looked down the road, and stirred the other men to listen. Just as they began to sit up and peer into the darkness down the road, the sounds faded away just as quickly as they came in. Another man jumped up went down the road and looked over the fences and banks, only to find weeds and small shrubs. He figured that if this was some sort of ghost regiment, it may have followed those two men who had began to walk down the road to the tower to fetch us. I also had another story I experienced firsthand during a sleepless night in an old gun mill. We also used to have an annual event at Jacobsburg State Park, Pennsylvania. On the land is the Henry Homestead, including a mansion in a house whose basement was the gun mill. The house now is a museum to the Henrys, 
then the mill below it is open to see the machinery and processes of old time gun making. The history of the homestead dates back to the flintlocks. Our event took place very near the homestead, and since it was going to be extremely chilly that night, the caretakers were kind enough to allow us to sleep in the house that night. Little did I know about the death that occurred in the house long ago. A young girl had contracted a contagious disease, one of those terrible, yet common diseases of the old days. She had died, and since it was thought that her illness could be contracted even though she was dead, the viewing of her body was not a traditional one. Her body was placed on a large windowsill inside the house, of a window outlet that protruded onto the front porch. This way, the viewers could stay out on the front porch and peer in through the windows to see her on the windowsill. Of course, nowadays, ghost stories fill the house, so now it's time to go to bed. You could say, more like hit the hardwood floor. Of course, the lucky guy I am. I got a spot directly to the large window and the windowsill. I laid there half the night, listening to each hour tick away on the clock in the next room. Eventually, I had enough, so I moved to a spot further away from the sill. I laid there for some time and then heard something. The noise was coming from. It sounded like the downstairs. The best description I can give is that it sounded like an older lady mourning or crying, possibly over the recent death of her daughter. It was not the house settling or creaking, as it continued for what seemed like years. Okay, well maybe a few minutes. My house also creaks a lot, and it sounded like nothing I had ever heard before. Scared out of my wits, I frantically tapped on the leg of my first sergeant, laying just a few feet away from me. He awoke, and I told him to listen. He heard the sound too, but not even wanting to ponder over it, he nervously said, wonder what that was, and quickly laid back down. The sound soon died off, no pun intended. Sleep was pretty much out of the question now, so I laid there another hour or so, until I heard something else. This one is easy to describe. Imagine being outside, and two other people are far away from you having a conversation. You can make out murmurs, in tones and voice, but not individual words. Almost like being underwater, and someone is talking above surface. That's what I heard. Only it seemed to be between a lady and a child. Probably a young boy. Again, the sounds came from below the floor in the basement. These didn't last as long. Possibly because God answered my prayers for them to stop. That night, I heard every single hour chime by, and every minute crawl past, every second tick by on the clock. Needless to say, the next morning, I wasn't a happy camper. Hope you enjoyed my stories, and yes, they're true. I told them just as I know them. Have a good one. I was in an infantry company in Germany back in 1989 to 1991. We use what is called a Bradley fighting vehicle. It weighs about 51,000 pounds and looks like a tank. We were doing live fire exercises at night and we finished about 2 a.m. I was driving a Bradley in a convoy of about 10 other Bradleys returning to the motor pool. The drivers used the large night vision scopes to see by. It's like watching green TV, and the Bradley commanders use that one that attaches to their helmets. While driving, a commander is to stand on his seat so that half of his body is outside of the vehicle so that he'll have a better view of the surroundings. At about 3 a.m., I saw a man standing by the dirt road we were traveling on. I figured he was one of the German range patrolmen and that he was just waiting for us to pass. Right after the Bradley in front of me passed, this man walked right out into the dust of that Bradley. I hit the brakes to avoid hitting him. At the exact moment, my commander said watch out, but it was already too late. I knew I must have hit him. I didn't even see him come out on either side. My commander then asked me 
if I'd seen a man walk out in front of us too. I said yes, and then he said that he had two. But when he turned around to check for a body, there wasn't one anywhere on the road. This dirt road was about 50 feet across, and when we returned to the motor pool, we took a flashlight and checked the whole front end and found nothing, no blood, no piece of clothing. There was nothing. My name is Heather, and I live in Omaha, Nebraska. I've only seen a few ghosts or spirits in my life. Sometimes I do get the chills though, like someone or something is nearby. The first period I saw was when I was younger, about 13 years. My mother told me to go into our basement to get some candles, which wasn't unusual. We spent a lot of time in the basement, playing slot cars and electric trains, and my dad has a workshop down there for models. As I fetched the candles, I felt watched. I scampered back upstairs, startled and panicked, and told myself not to be so silly. I give mom the candles. I don't remember why she needed them, and felt the nagging, watching feeling again. I opened the basement door, and a round, green-white light was bobbing slowly up the steps, I think about three to four feet off of the ground. I grabbed my jacket and ran outside to my grandma's house down the hill. I never saw it again, whatever it was, and everyone laughed at me for it, but I remember it clearly. It was green and glowing with a soft white light. Mom laughed and said it must have been a glow in the dark Halloween candy bucket from the size and color, but she couldn't explain how it was floating. My house is quite old, about 80 years and nothing like this has ever happened again. We're the third family living there, and nothing violent ever goes on. I still get the odd feeling, but it's never been strong enough to make me panic again. The second spirit I saw really floored me. I was 14, and was riding my bike around town, since it was a nice summer day, and I ended up on 2nd and 22 in Q, about 3 miles from my house. There's nothing there but cheap houses, and it's not a bad neighborhood, but it's not the richest in the world, but it's not a cheap, run-down area. Just relaxed, second-hand. Nothing violent ever happened there before. It's become a run-down area now, and there was no graveyard, or ancient Indian burial ground, or anything that I, or anyone else knows of. I wanted to go to Dairy Queen on 24th and Q and I was behind it. As I came to 22nd, I saw a flat field where I knew there should be houses. It was filled with what I can now describe as short, rectangular tombstones. I saw a woman standing there, dressed all in browns and earth tones. I couldn't even see her face or hands. She had a headscarf on, and her hands were held in front of her, covered by her sleeves. I think she had on brown shoes but I don't really remember her having feet or not. I'm inclined to think not. I asked her what this was, but she didn't answer. I turned back to the graves, which had vanished, and replaced with the things that should have been there. Streets, houses, sidewalks, trees. I turned back to the lady, and she was gone. I had a very chilly, uneasy feeling, and a few dead leaves fluttered by. I rode away, as fast as I could. I once saw a strange figure in the mirror, a girl my age, 13, but with dark brown hair, with thin bangs, and braids past the bottom of the mirror frame. She just startled me, but caused me no harm. The last one I saw left me breathless and thrilled. I was staring out the window to our front window, when I thought I saw something in the clouds. It couldn't have been lightning, because it wasn't fast enough. It resembled very slow lightning. It was white and long, and crooked. I got up and tried to stare out by the light. It was at a bad angle, so I stood up and walked to the front door. As I peered out the glass, I saw a flash of lightning and a giant pair of silverly white eyes, rimmed with blue, which then vanished in a flush. The outside of the window was covered with condensation, like breath, which smelled really sweet, 
like milk. I wiped it away. I've come to the conclusion that the first three were just random encounters, but the last one was a kind spirit, one that was looking in on me. I haven't seen anything so clearly after age 15, but sometimes I see holes in my vision, weird things. After rubbing my eyes and refocusing, they're gone, and sometimes I can hear odd noises and voices no one else can. I don't think I'm psychic or anything, but I do think I'm a little more sensitive than the people around me. I know, you may not believe this, but it happened. It's true. Thank you. When I was around five or six years old, I remember seeing a figure of a woman standing outside of my room. The living room was the next room from mine. I always thought it was just light coming from outside the windows in the living room. But when I went up to the light fixture and tried blocking the light with my hand, nothing would happen. The light would still be there. I wasn't scared because I wasn't aware of ghosts when I was around that age. But as I got older, maybe around 9 or 10 years old, I sometimes would sleep in the living room, on the couch, because my room would get really hot in the summer. Well, as I would lie on the couch, getting ready to fall asleep, I would hear things in the kitchen, like the sound of someone placing a glass on the table. I would sometimes go to see if anyone was there, but nothing would be there. I still hear the sounds in the kitchen sometimes, and when I would be home alone, I would sometimes go into the basement and watch TV or exercise. As I would work out or watch TV, I would sometimes hear footsteps above me, seeing how the TV was right below my room. But what happened to me two months ago terrified me. I'm 17 years old now, and it was raining harshly in the middle of April, and I was working on an art project in the dining room, which was the room after the living room. I was home alone at that time. My mother was picking up my sister from work, and my father was working. As I was working on my art project on the table, the lights went out, and as soon as they went out, in front of me, I saw a woman sitting across from me. I couldn't see her clearly, but she seemed to be smiling. About a second later, the lights turned back on. I was so scared, I ran into the kitchen and stayed there until my mother and sister came back. When they finally returned, I told them about what I saw, and my sister kind of freaked out, because she hates hearing about things like ghosts and other things related to that. My mother told me it was probably just my nerves, and that I've been working too hard on my project. I believe what I saw was real. I don't know what this ghost lady is doing in my house, but she seems to bring attention to me only. This is just one account from over 40 experiences I've recorded in my ghost journal. It was a very unusual day in Chicago, only four days to the new year, and in the middle of winter, it was 63 degrees. Yet the skies were dark, but there were tons of fluffy clouds. My friend Christine and I decided to enjoy this rare day and go walking around the park. We watched as the clouds seemed to spread across the sky and realized the storm was near. Somehow, the conversation switched to cemeteries. She told me of an old German cemetery that was near the park that she had gone to. They have a section of infant graves from the late 1800s to early 1900s. She knows the babies died in groups around the same times. After hearing this, I wanted to go see for myself. She told me where to go. And as I drove into the cemetery, I pointed to a corner and asked her if that was where they were. She said yes. I would never been there before. I don't know how I knew. We parked on the road, got out, and looked around. Some of the graves were old and worn, the names and dates hardly visible. The baby section was so sad to see, and we figured there must have been a plague of some sort in the area. It was beginning to get dark, even though it was about 4 p.m. in the afternoon. The cemetery closed at 5, so we wanted to hurry and see everything before they closed and before the storm came. 
We were walking through the cemetery. When it felt like the temperature had dropped 20 degrees in a few minutes, I stopped in my tracks and noticed a familiar smell. The scent became stronger and I realized it was roses. I asked my friend if she smelled anything. She said yes. I asked her what she smelled and she said roses. I was bending down to smell the flowers on her grave, which were not roses. I wanted to figure out where the smell suddenly came from. Suddenly, my friend told me to look up and in the distance was a flower girl. And you guessed it, she was holding onto roses. Both me and my friend were in disbelief. We couldn't even fathom what we were seeing, but yet here was this flower girl holding onto a rose which had a strong perfume smell. Her attire was in a Victorian style dress. She looked absolutely beautiful, but it was also really scary because it was in the middle of a cemetery and we were really spooked. Even though it felt like forever, she momentarily appeared and then she was gone, just like that. It must have been about 15 seconds, if that, but we both saw her and we're not making this up. We're totally sane individuals who actually go out and try to see these things on purpose. I know that sounds crazy to some of you, but we get such thrills about ghost hunting. Anyway, we're not even done with the story yet, because right after, we heard the most blood-curdling scream I've ever heard in my entire life. It was a scream right after she disappeared, and I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. It sounded like a human trying to imitate a wolf, as in, you know, a human howling, but in a wolf style. I know that sounds ridiculous, and maybe it could have been a real human being trying to play with us. However, we did not stick around long enough to find out, and we bolted all the way home. I guess the moral of the story is, yeah, you can be interested in ghosts and whatnot, but even if you are interested, be very wary, and just remember, ghosts can't hurt you. If that was real, I have no idea what to say, but if it was a human being, I guess you gotta stay clear of the cemeteries. I'll tell you what though, the roses, the girl, and the scream, they were all very real to us. We did not hesitate to leave, because we did not know what to expect if we stayed longer there. Just remember to be very careful. Ghosts are crazy, but humans can be just as crazy. This happened to my fiance about 37 years ago in Carn City, Texas. He was about five years old and was attending a church function with his grandparents at the St. Paul Lutheran Church there. He was running around with two of his slightly younger cousins, having a good time. This function was taking place outdoors. Now, there were actually two church buildings there. A new church had been built and the older wooden structure was still standing close by and being used exclusively for storage. The church had been collecting clothing and had put it in the older building. Anyway, my fiance and his cousins had been told to stay out of the churches, but being little kids and the adults having their attention taken up with visiting, the boys decided to explore the old church. He went into the older building and looked into the large room where the clothing was piled on three tables. My fiance said the first thing he noticed was the clothing on one of the tables agitating violently and he could see a lady who just happened to be transparent sorting through the clothes that were shaking. All that she remembers of her appearance is that she was a motherly or grandmotherly looking figure with a high neck dress and her hair pulled back in a bun. She did not pay any attention to the three little boys, but they ran out of the room as fast as their feet could carry them. He says that he may have been the only one to see the lady. He thinks the other two boys just saw the clothing shaking on the table. My fiance says that he believes that the only reason the clothes were shaking was because of the ghost. The windows were all closed, there were no fans, and of course, no central cooling system in this old building. And remember that the clothes on the other tables were lying still. They went to tell their grandmother about the situation. Naturally, 
They got chewed out for being where they weren't supposed to be, and were told that no one was in that building, but they remember it well. His story is one that may or may not scare you. It's more of a mystery to me and my friends. When I was young, me and my cousin were always together and trying to scare each other. It just so happens that there was an old house which my grandfather had built in the early 1900s, which we thought may be haunted. It should be mentioned that I am from a small town in Virginia, and in the early 1900s, it was a pretty isolated town from the rest of the state. My grandfather was a pastor of the local church. Being that the church was very big, and my grandfather's house was, he would have wakes and funerals in his den. The house was very big, and there was plenty of room for people to attend these funerals. Anyway, my cousin and I used to see things through the windows which we could not explain. The house had not been lived in in many years, when we would see these unexplainable lights. They were blue in color and they seemed to go from window to window when we were looking at them. We finally got the nerve to sneak into the house, which probably wasn't too smart. Anyway, we had to enter through the basement in order for my father not to see us trying to get inside. This was very scary because there was no electricity and we had to try and make it through the dark and up the stairs to the entry of the den. We did this several times and on some occasions, we heard and seen strange things, and sometimes we didn't. On one occasion we lived in the house, and we heard a tapping on the ceiling upstairs, as if someone was hitting it with a cane. This was very odd, because my father lived in the house as a child, and said his uncle lived with them, and he had a cane. When he needed something, he would tap on the floor for someone to come and help him. This scared the living daylights out of us, but my cousin was a little more courageous than I and he persuaded me to go up the stairs. When we got there, he asked whatever it was that we were seeing and hearing to leave us alone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The sound stopped, and we left the house. My father was a little skeptical about the whole thing, but he felt that there may be some truth in it. He himself now saw a ghostly apparition which he can't explain. This is coming from a man who himself is now a preacher and I don't think he doubts seeing this at all. I really feel that there is some connection to the noises and sightings with the funerals that were held in the house. There are other occurrences which have happened, but would take a while to tell them all. I've read in other experiences about blue lights being represented with the supernatural. The story may not be that scary to you, but to me and my cousin, we know that there is something paranormal about that house. Myself and a friend recently moved into a house in Belmont, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston. The place is about 100 years old and retains much of the original woodwork, ceramic doorknobs, etc. I even found an old ceramic liquor and med bottle in there. It's a third floor apartment with an old aluminum speaking tube to the second floor, which leads us to believe this may have been servants' quarters at one time. We never get anything but good vibes from the place. But a few things have happened which make me wonder, and I write asking your opinion. Firstly, the former tenant was an elderly alcoholic who, according to the landlord, used to heat only one room in the house, the dining room, with a space heater. She kept the whole place closed up, according to Miss Richardson, who also tells us the former tenants didn't die, but moved to a nursing home. We aren't sure if we believe her. Well, that room seems to have a door problem. Often when I return from work, all three doors to the room will be slammed shut, even the one which is tied open with a string. These are doors which don't close easily, being old and paint covered and wrapped a bit. While we hang out, sometimes doors slam. It happens in fits and starts. One week it happen every day, but it hasn't happened for a while. Granted there is a breeze in that room, but the manner in which it happens strikes one as odd sometimes. Also, we have both seen a white figure in a long dress, and perhaps a veil, always in the hallway into our place, or in the doorway of the dining room. It is a peripheral vision thing, which leaves one looked at directly. I've seen it standing in the door several times, 
and I saw it seemingly walk down the hall once. It kind of bounced up and down like a person would were they walking. Mike tells me he usually sees it moving past the door, either coming into or exiting the apartment, and he has used the words wedding dress to describe its clothing. I didn't get that detail to look, but I've definitely seen the shape. Visitors have seen a similar shape, but hesitate to call it a ghost. Lastly, and this is not so much an experience as a creepy coincidence, when first repainting the place, we decided to do the kitchen in blue and white. I propose that we paint only the panels and the kitchen doors blue. We haven't done this yet, which both of us thought was a good idea. Later, when exploring the basement for the first time, I found an ancient door of the same style as our other doors, removed from the hinges, and brought downstairs years before. It seems to be the one door from our apartment, which has been taken off the hinges, the kitchen door, and the panels painted years ago, in cracked blue paints. Yesterday, my husband and I toured the Whaley House in San Diego. I think I may have been present to a supernatural occurrence of sorts, but I wanted to ask you about it. Initially, I started out on the first floor, not part of the tour, and I felt a markedly weird sensation in front of the dining area that I can only describe as having a sinking feeling that bordered on nausea. I felt fine walking around Old Town and coming into the house. I hung out in the dining room area for like 10 minutes thinking what I was feeling was so unusual, and it dissipated. I felt fine again, so I looked around the rest of the house and felt okay, until I came to the first upstairs bedroom, directly right of the stairs. I again felt that same feeling, and I stood there, just looking about the room, and that is when I think I saw something in one of the mirrors, the mirror closest to the hall. It looked as though thin white smoke was being reflected into the mirror, as though someone was standing next to the mirror with a lit cigarette. I can only describe what I saw as smoke, because it curled. I also smelled a very faint smell of cologne that reminded me of violet water. I made sure it was not me, since I was the only person in that area, and it wasn't. It seemed to blow in through the saddled wooden partition. I was a little weirded out, because I was in disbelief at what I thought to be witnessing. So I called to my husband downstairs to come up. I didn't want to cause a stir because I was unsure what this was. I even saw the presence of a shadow behind my back in the corner of my eye. I walked back to the area in front of the room and looked back into the mirror to make sure that it wasn't a reflection of something outside, like a passing vehicle, but I no longer saw the smoke. I really didn't want to tell anyone about the incident because I would have winded up scaring everybody, including myself. I've been thinking about it ever since, and been trying to find a logical explanation for it. I've always been very interested in the subjects of ghosts and the paranormal, but never thought I would have a direct experience with them. Although I'm currently part of theater group that is renovating an old theater, and we definitely have some spectral energy in the place, but that's another story. This story is about the first time I had something strange happen to me. I'm originally from a small island off the coast of Italy. The community dates back to 700 BC, so you can imagine they had their fair share of ghost stories. I was 15, and staying at my aunt's house with my sister. Our grandmother had died three years before, and as part of our week-long stay, we went to visit her grave. The experience was unsettling to say the least, and I think I was most affected emotionally by the visit. Trying to remember a woman who I love very much now, reduced to nothing but a picture in writing on marble mausoleum. Although it was a very hot and humid summer day, the cemetery seemed to have an unsettling chill about it, and I couldn't wait to get out of there. However, anyone who is Italian or knows of Italian cemetery visits, is that they are family events that take a long time. Feeling very sentimental and depressed, and somewhat bored, I couldn't help but look around and read more grave sites. With each name and picture that I saw, I thought more about the people behind them, their lives, and who they have been. 
the atmosphere seemed more oppressive, and I started seeing flashes out of the corner of my eyes. Nothing definite, but it was almost as if something had passed in front of me very quickly, and the experience left me somewhat disturbed. We left not long after, much to my relief, but still with this heavy, depressed feeling. Later on that night, I had fallen into a deep sleep, but was awakened at 3 in the morning by a male and female voice arguing. I was very groggy, but I immediately thought the voices were strange because they didn't sound like they were coming from anywhere, in particular at least. They sounded as if they were right in my ears. The room I shared with my sister was directly over a busy main street, and being a summer resort, there is always some activity going on. However, the street this night was totally quiet, with no one in sight. The voices continued to argue in Italian, and though I spoke it, I couldn't make out what they were saying. Also, the intensity of the voices didn't change as I moved around the room. They always seemed to be in my ears, and were continuing to grow in intensity. At this point, I thought it was my cousin and her husband who were arguing from their bedroom. They shared the room with their two small children, and I thought what could be so important to be arguing at this hour of night, and why weren't their children reacting? I decided to investigate. As I slowly opened the door, the voices suddenly stopped. Not a cut off in conversation, or a conclusion, but as if someone had switched off a radio. I walked to the room, and found the whole family sound asleep. I returned to the room dumbfounded, but found the room was very cold. The day had been extremely hot, and the night had not let up, and I was just in the room a minute before. But I knew the temperature had gone down at least 10 degrees. It was then I felt the same heaviness that I experienced at the cemetery, and a large chill moved right through me. Almost immediately, the room returned to its original temperature. During this whole experience, my sister was asleep next to me, and when I asked her about hearing anything during the night, she thought I was crazy. To this day, I'm not sure what I heard and felt that night. However, I spent many nights in that room over the years and never had a similar experience. Did I touch something or someone? And did they follow me back from the cemetery? I don't know. I never shared this story before, but this seems like the right place to do it. When I was born, my parents rented a portion of a three-family house. The house was huge and previously owned by an old German woman. Apparently, the house belonged to the same family since the early 1700s when it was built. After the old German lady died there, there was no one left in the family to take on ownership of the house. Someone new took the house over and rented it out to three other families. As soon as we moved in, my parents had odd things happening on a daily basis. The TV and all of the lights in the house would constantly turn on in the middle of the night. One night, my dad had some friends over to watch a football game, and all of the power in the house kept going on and off. His friends were so freaked out that they left. What bothered my mom the most was that all the rooms in the house stayed warm, except for mine. My room was always like ice, and being a newborn, my mother was concerned. She would turn the heat way up, and still my room stayed cold. One night, she heard a woman's voice coming from my room. As she neared, she could hear an old lady singing a lullaby. When she opened the door, the rocking chair was swaying back and forth, and my room was warm. After this occurrence, my room remained warm. This became an ongoing thing in the house. The rocking chair would constantly rock, no matter where in the house my mom moved it to. And oftentimes, she would hear a soft voice coming from my room. The lights continued to go on frequently in the middle of the night. As I got a little older, into the toddler years, I can still remember certain things happening. My parents found it odd that I am able to remember things so clearly. I can describe my bedroom in distinct detail, as well as the other rooms in the house. I only lived there from newborn to two and a half years. One night, I woke up 
and felt absolutely terrified. I remember climbing out of my crib onto the little table and chair set and stepped onto the floor and dodged from my parents' room. As soon as I climbed into bed with my mom and dad, I heard my aunt, who was asleep on the couch, screaming. My mom woke up and ran into the living room to see what all the fuss was about. My aunt kept crying, I saw her, I saw her, over there by the lamp. Apparently, my aunt says that she saw the old lady standing at the foot of the couch by the lamp. When my mom reached over to turn the lamp on, she disappeared. All of my parents' old friends remember the house, and everyone has a story of something that they experienced there. We know that the old lady died in the house, probably in the section where we lived. At first, I think she was angered that the house no longer belonged to anyone in her family. She was harmless and just wanted to make her presence known. We only lasted there for two and a half years. Sometimes we drive by the house and contemplate stopping in to see how the current owners are making out, but I never had the courage to go back. Here's some spooky experiences that I remember from my childhood. The first one didn't happen to me. It's something that my mother told me about. Her mother died in 1959. A few years later, she remembers waking up in the middle of the night and hearing her mother calling her name. This always gave me the chills, especially if I thought about it at night. When I was maybe six or seven, something happened that scared the living daylights out of me. I can still picture it in my mind. A short time after I went to bed, I was lying there awake, and I looked up at my bedroom door, which was closed. There was a window across the room from the door. The curtains were open, and the moonlight was shining through the window, making a square of light on the door. In the middle of the square of light, I saw the shadow of a hand slowly moving back and forth. I was so scared that all I could do was just stare at it. I was trying to scream but no sound would come out. Finally, I managed to get my voice to work and I yelled as loud as I could, Mom! My mother came running in and I told her what I saw. I don't remember if she saw the shadow too. Probably not. She didn't see anything outside and she shut the curtains. Now, there were no trees right outside my window that were close enough that they would make a shadow. Not to mention, that this did not look like a tree branch. It was definitely the distinct shape of a human hand. Looking back on this as an adult, I realized that this was most likely not anything supernatural at all, but someone actually trying to break into our house, which, quite frankly, is more scarier than a mere ghost. When I started screaming, the person heard me and ran away. Shortly after the previous incident, I asked my parents if I could move into the room across from that one. Gee, I wonder why. My new room had a little trap door in the closet, leading to an attic of sorts. My parents never used it for storage, as it was too hard to go up there through the trap door, and it most likely wasn't even high enough to walk upright in. When I was about 10 or 11, my best friend and I were playing in my room, and we noticed that the trap door was open about an inch or so. We slid it closed. Every once in a while, I'd look up there and find that it was open again. I'd keep sliding it closed, and then a few days later, it would be open. My friend and I naturally assumed that we had a ghost in the attic. I really don't remember if I actually heard anything up there or not. Around the same time, this same friend would occasionally spend a night with me, several times We'd be lying in bed and hear the sound of a newspaper or some sort of paper being crumpled up in the living room when we knew no one else was up. We called this the newspaper ghost. Another time, I think I was about seven, I was riding my bike around in circles in the street. This was in a housing development where there was very little traffic. My aunt, uncle and cousins were visiting and I recall looking at the bathroom window on the side of our house and seeing my aunt's face looking out the window. Later, I mentioned it to my aunt, 
and she said she hadn't been looking out the bathroom window, and neither had anyone else. Now, I realized that this could have easily been a reflection of something in the window, but at the same time, it seemed pretty spooky to me. In the summer of 69, I was about 13. We had some relatives staying at our house for about a week. One evening, after everyone had gone to bed, I was still awake. As a child, it always took me a long time to get to sleep. I was always too wound up, I guess. Anyway, all of a sudden, there was this loud crash that came from my closet, like something metal or aluminum falling on the untiled floor. The thing that came to mind was a metal vacuum cleaner hose. There was no vacuum cleaner or any other large metal object in my closet that could have fallen and made such a noise, and even if there was, what would have made it fall off the shelf? I was too scared to get up and look in my closet or go and ask anyone if they'd heard it. Now, this was a small three-bedroom house in Levittown, Pennsylvania. If anyone is familiar with the houses, if a loud noise occurs in any part of the house, it would be impossible not to hear it all over the house. The next morning, I asked my parents, aunt and uncle and cousins, if they heard a loud crash in the night, and no one else had heard it. And by the way, I looked in my closet in the morning, and nothing was out of place. This has always puzzled me. Here are a few things that have happened in the last few years, in the house I live in now. Nothing blatantly scary, just weird. I thought I'd share them just for the fun of it. One night, I was asleep, and all of a sudden, I screamed and woke myself up. My husband came running in, and I couldn't for the life of me remember what I'd dreamed that had scared me. But I had a vague memory of looking beside the bed, and seeing something in the form of a human being, made up of little points of light. There have been a few occasions where I've woken up in the middle of the night, and heard a kind of electrical humming that sounds like it's coming from our bedroom closet. My husband said he could hear it too. I could never figure out what's causing it. It sounds like it could be the refrigerator running, except that the kitchen is not right next to the bedroom. And if it was the fridge, wouldn't I hear the noise every night, since obviously the fridge runs all the time? I haven't heard it in over a year. Just as well, it gives me the willies. I want to say that I can sympathize with your situation, although other than apparitions, my experience varies greatly from yours. I do want to share what happened to me with you, but I do want to warn you ahead of time. I used to be a reporter, so I can get lengthy. My first experience happened when I was a child. I was seven years old and lived a completely normal life. My parents didn't smoke dope or dabble in the occult so I really had no knowledge of ghosts, other than the traditional Halloween experiences every child encounters. When I turned seven, my family moved from Metro Memphis, Tennessee to rural Independence, Mississippi. We moved into a house that my father renovated. Rather than trying to draw a diagram that may get scrambled and transmit, I'll try to describe the layout of the rooms involved. The way the home was originally laid out you walked in the front door into the living room. To the left was the kitchen, open without walls to the living room. To the right was a bedroom door. Straight ahead was a hallway leading to other bedrooms, laundry room, and bathroom. After my father was finished, the front door was added onto a new wing of the house. The living room was enclosed into a bedroom. The bedroom now directly led out into the hall, which now led to the kitchen also, and had a new doorway to the bedroom that previously opened up to the living room. Is that confusing enough? We moved into the house, and I immediately was terrified of my sister's bedroom, the one that had previously opened up into the old living room. I just felt that something was there, and it was watching me. I felt like it wanted to possess me or something stronger than a mere presence. Also, I never found out why, but hers was the only room with security bars on the window. No other family member noticed anything strange in the house. I ended up in the new bedroom, and sometimes at night, I'd hear noises. Being so small, I don't remember exactly what they were, but frequently, 
I'd see an incandescent, glowing form in the shape of a human, walking across my room. What made me know that it had to be a previous occupant of the home was that it would walk from the bedroom I was so scared of, through my room, into the kitchen, the way the house used to be laid out. Once when my grandmother came to visit, my parents forced me to sleep in my sister's bedroom. I was so terrified, but I finally went to sleep. When I woke up, I saw what appeared to be an ectoplasm swirling above my head. I spent most of my childhood years terrified of sleeping. Being a middle child of an older sister and a younger brother, I'd hide my prized possessions, jewelry, money, whatever I thought I didn't want them to get a hold of. Almost every time I hide something, it would disappear and reappear later in a different location. Thinking my siblings had discovered my hiding place, I'd find a new one, each time to have them disappear and reappear once again. The really strange part came later. We sold the house when I was 13 to another girl's family I went to school with. After she'd move in, I'd asked her one day if she noticed anything weird in the house, and she said no, but her sister refused to go into the bedroom that scared me. Sister's explanation was that someone was watching her, and she was a middle child also. I guess there must have been some connection to middle children. I said something years later about the house being haunted in front of my aunt. She said she'd always had a feeling that something was wrong with the house. I'd appreciate your input as to what you think my experience meant. I had a person tell me one time I was a demon that wanted me, but I'm not even sure. While I lived there, although I was the only family member that had strange experiences inside the house, I wasn't the only one who had strange experiences in the area. In the fall, between the hours of 10 p.m. and 12 a.m., my mother would see balls of light floating in the field and wooded areas across the road from my house. She would always ask me to come look, but I had enough terror inside the house, and as far as I was concerned, the woods were my only safe haven while at home. So I never looked and never witnessed the lights myself, but both my sister and my mom did. When I was 19, I started dating this guy who was friends with a neighbor from that house I'd lived in. Basically, he lived catty corner from me, with their house backing up to the woods mine faced. My new boyfriend asked me if I ever saw anything strange in the woods. I said no. He told me that his neighbor's kid, who was a friend of his, told him that he'd seen balls of lights in the woods. I then told my boyfriend about my mother and sister's experiences. So apparently, it wasn't just restricted to my family. Another experience I had was when I was in my early 20s, when my grandfather passed away. We'd always loved each other very much, but didn't have a close relationship because of my grandmother, whom I didn't get along with. I was present when he passed away and was devastated. Three months passed, enough time to allow me to grieve and get on with my life. I was asleep one night and awoke to find my grandfather sitting on the side of my bed. He told me not to be scared, that he had a message for me. He told me I needed to get my life straight, or I was headed for trouble. I remember he held my hand, and told me that he was going to tell me what heaven is like, but I'm not allowed to remember what he told me. I remember him being present for a while longer, but can't remember a word he said, now that I'm an adult and have some time and distance between me and these experience I had as a child. I'd like to try to discover what these experience meant or why I was chosen to have this one. Do you have any suggestions? Also, even now, I can drive by a place or house and tell that it's haunted. Does that mean that I'm psychic or paranormally gifted? Usually I just get kind of jumpy and frightened, but one night I was out repossessing vehicles something I did part-time for a while, and my partner pulled up to this house. I was so terrified of that house that I told him he better turn around immediately or I was getting out of the vehicle and running. Please help me to understand what is going on with me. I'm finally getting to a point I accept it and want to understand it rather than how I've been so terrified in the past that I didn't even want to talk about it.
In 1983, when I was 18 years old, I was severely ill. I woke up one morning and my face was badly swollen. My mother took me to the emergency room. I was placed in the ICU the next day as I went unconscious. It would take a team of doctors over a week to finally diagnose me. It was a rare disease. There was only two case histories. They both died from it years before. That's why my doctors had no idea what it was. It was from a sinus infection that had backed up behind my brain. From this, I developed a brain abscess. The night before they would make the decision if I needed brain surgery to remove the abscess, I was lying in my hospital bed, praying that the abscess would have shrunk a little. I felt someone standing beside my bed. I was sure it was a nurse, as it was very late, too late for visitors. When I turned to talk, it wasn't a nurse at all. It was my grandfather, who died one year earlier. At that moment, I wasn't afraid. He said to me, you'll be fine. When I asked if you were sure, he then replied, do you doubt me? I replied, no. He then said, everything will be fine. You will be all right. This part has puzzled me ever since he told me. He said, take care of your mother. This was my mother's father. Then he simply turned around and walked out of the room. The nurses came in and I was wondering what happened to my grandfather. They didn't say anybody walked into the room, and they told me to calm down. I swear I knew what I saw. I knew it was my grandfather, but the whole situation was just weird, and it gets weirder. I thought he meant that I would do fine through the surgery, my grandfather. Now here's the kicker. He had brain surgery about seven years before his own death. Even crazier. The next morning I had an x-ray, and they came to tell me that my abscess was completely gone. First of all, I have no idea what happened, even the doctors were confused. They wanted to take even more x-rays, and I obliged, and they confirmed, no abscess whatsoever. As for my grandfather talking about my mother, I had no idea why he was mentioning her. She was pretty healthy at the time, but it makes sense now. Recently, she has been diagnosed with MS, diabetes, and in September, she had heart failure. In November, she almost died and had triple bypass surgery. Through the years, my family has had many encounters with the spirit world, but this was the most wonderful one. In the summer of 1994, my sister and I moved to Hawaii to live with our father. While we were gone, our mother moved into an apartment to save money. Right away, strange things started to happen. Her two cats would never enter the bedroom of the apartment, choosing instead to sleep in the living room. They would claw and bite if you tried to carry them in there and then run quickly away. Mom only spent one night in the room and then opted for the living room as well. She didn't see anything, but felt as if there was someone watching her or that someone was in the room. A few weeks later, she returned home from work to find her disposable razor disassembled on the bathroom counter. Even the twin blades were removed and the whole apparatus was laid out in a straight row. The next night, my cousin, Stacy, and her husband, Mitch, went to stay over at my mom's with her. They were in from out of town, not going over to ease her fears. She wasn't scared yet. The two of them argued with mom over sleeping arrangements, and she assured them that they never slept in the bedroom anyway. That night, my mother woke to hear Stacy and Mitch screaming in terror. Mom ran into the room to find Mitch trying to pull Stacy off the bed. She was screaming to get her off the bed, so mom started pulling too. Once they got her to the floor, Stacy said that it felt like someone was sitting on top of her, and she couldn't breathe. And while it was going on, she said she could see a teenage boy in the corner, laughing uncontrollably. The three of them decided to drive to my grandma's to spend the night. Fast forward to Christmas break, 
when my sister and I came home to visit. Our first afternoon at the apartment, we heard a loud crash from the bathroom. All people and animals in the house were accounted for in the living room, so we went to check it out. Everything from the cabinet under the sink was out on the bathroom floor. It wasn't all tipped over, however. It was lined up in a straight row. After that, Mom told my sister and I about all the strange things that had occurred. My sister and I were thrilled, thought it was really cool. Mom said that we were more than welcome to sleep in the bedroom if we wanted to, so we did. Early the next morning, I woke up and thought I saw someone standing in the walk-in closet. The sun was just starting to come up, and I thought for sure it was my sister playing a trick on me. When I looked over in bed, she wasn't there. Instead, there was a guy, maybe teens or early 20s, with shaggy black hair and no face, in bed with me. He reached out for me, and I literally wet my pants, running into the living room. I woke my mom and sister, who had moved during the night, said she had the creeps, and attempted to tell them what happened. Mom told us to get our stuff, and we left. Later that afternoon, I recited the story to Stacy, and she said the guy I described was the one she saw laughing at her. Mom went to the leasing office a week later and asked to be moved to another apartment. All the leasing agent had to say was that no one had lived in that apartment longer than four months. It started some years ago, and I'm happy to say that it's been over for some time now. I'm confident that I'm no longer being followed by Mage, but I would like to share my experiences with you, and if you can provide any insight or better understanding of what happened to me, I would be most happy. Some years ago, I was sleeping over at a friend's apartment. I went to bed and lay there alone with my thoughts until I think I fell asleep. I was awoken by three sharp knocks, similar to someone knocking on a solid wooden door, and turned my head to the bedroom door, which was three yards away to my right. The door was closed, yet within the door frame was a figure. To my eyes, the figure was shimmering and vivid with colors, without any real human form, yet to my senses, I was certain that it was a woman, that she was extremely tall, and that she was wearing jewelry. I perceived her with the absolute clarity that my eyes were unable to support. I opened my mouth to yell, but could not. It lasted only a few seconds, when the door opened and my friend entered the room. The vision was gone. I said to my friend, with a detached calmness, that I had just seen a ghost, but this of course was met with indifference. I did not press the matter, as I was already beginning with self-doubt. By the end of a mostly sleepless night, I had managed to convince myself that it was a dream, or at least a product of that period between sleep and wakefulness. Within days, the whole episode was forgotten. Some six months later, I was at home with my parents and decided upon an early night. I had a lot on my mind that night and needed some space and some quiet for contemplation. I was lying on my single bed in my small bedroom, lost in thought, when I heard the three knocks again. My heart leapt. From my bed, I could see ahead of me, and to the right, the bedroom door, which was open and the landing is accessible by three ascending steps. Through the door, I can see about three yards of the landing until the angle of the door frame cuts off the view. There, just at that farthest point, was the same vision, the same shimmering colors. She was much clearer this time, and there was no doubt that my eyes were seeing a woman. She was so tall that she had to bend her head to her left until it was almost resting on her shoulder, like a body hanging without the noose. But she was looking at me. Her eyes, although I couldn't actually see them, were fixed upon me, and there was a malice in them. I had no doubt. Then, in an instant, she came along the landing, down the three steps, and right up to my face. 
So quickly and so aggressively, she brought her face to within an inch of mine. I could make out her eyes and nose, but to this day, I cannot be sure if I saw them or experienced them. I could not separate her emotions from her visage, which seemed to be one and the same in my mind. It is difficult to describe, but I saw her face and features, along with her hatred and despite. I opened my mouth to scream, but nothing came. Eventually, she disappeared. I've never been so terrified in all my life. Never has fear removed any capacity to utter or to move a single muscle. And yet this was the case. I lay rigid for some time, at least until the room was light from daybreak. I was absolutely sure that I had not fallen asleep, but yet over time, I managed to convince myself that this was indeed the case. This is how I came to terms with it. Over the next year I saw no more of her, and she was reduced to an entertaining story for friends. Then I married and moved to set up house with my wife. The third, the last, and the unequivocal sighting was during the early days in my new home. It was a bright, warm Sunday afternoon, and I was sitting on a chair to watch a television program, an old episode of Bonanza, as it happens, when I became aware of another presence in the room. I turned to the door behind me, fully expecting my wife to be there, but she was not. As I turned my head back to the TV, to my right was a settee, and sat in the middle was the woman again. This time she was sat on the edge of the settee, with her hand forward, cupping her chin in her hands, and her knees were also together under her chin. She was leaning forward in this position, contemplating me amusingly, or mockingly, I cannot decide. There was so much clarity about her features, and the room was bright, which she seemed to reflect. There, in front of me was a woman, about 25 years old, very sharp features, very tall, and very thin. Her bright colors, her hair and her jewelry, reminded me of a punk rocker, although this was not so. I'm sure she was from a long time ago before that era. I was not afraid, and emboldened by the daylight, I simply and calmly asked her what she wanted. There was no response, no answer. She simply faded away, and I have not seen her to this day. Compressing my research into a short paragraph, I went back to the place of the first sighting and asked my friend some questions. It transpired that she was haunted by a spirit many years previously who would disturb household objects. An expert was brought in who ascertained that they were being haunted by a malevolent spirit, who was called Mage. It was not possible to get rid of her, but to hope that she leaves of her own accord. This happened in my friend's hometown, some 300 miles from where I live. My theory is that Mage came with my friend to my hometown and took a liking to me, thereby following me to both my parents' home and onward to my married home. I don't know who has provided the vehicle for her to leave my house, but I hope that she has been gone for good. When I was in my early 20s, a friend and I decided to rent a house together. We found a lovely old house near the Mississippi River, and I was immediately drawn to it. After we moved in, we both began to notice banging on the walls and lights blowing out constantly. The lights we attributed to bad wiring, and the banging, I truly believed, was my friend, and she truly believed it was me. The layout of the house was one we had never seen before. There was a hallway that led from the front living area to the back bedroom areas that was at an odd, slanting angle. I always felt uncomfortable going down this hallway, and found myself going around by way of the kitchen. After months, my friend and I decided to take in a third roommate to help with expenses. During the next month or so, after this third roommate moved in, we noticed the increase in frequency to the noises, banging, and lights going out. We also began to notice that every month, and this is really weird, right around the time that all three of us began our menstrual cycles, 
a very large stain began to appear in the middle of our living room floor. We tried constant shampooing, but it would always reappear immediately. And then after our cycles were finished, the stain would disappear on its own, only to reappear the next month. Our third roommate then became very withdrawn after only a short time of being in the house. She began to go directly to her bedroom and never came out except to go to work. Her personality has also changed drastically. She went from being very funny and outgoing to a complete loner. She would also say very inappropriate, weird things to us. We had known this girl for some time and her behavior was quite unsettling. She finally told us that she was not comfortable in this house and was moving out and she did so that very day. Shortly after she moved out, the banging noise began in earnest and we started noticing our things being rearranged. We began to laughingly and nervously admit to each other that something was not right in this house. However, neither one of us felt threatened by any kind of the weird happenings and in fact, I personally actually felt almost protected by it. We started to call our ghost George and would talk to him whenever the banging would begin. We were trying to watch something on TV and George would start banging or knocking. We would say, please George, not right now. We're trying to see this. And he would actually stop, at least until the show was over. Unfortunately, no matter how much we begged him to stop putting the stain on the floor every month, that never ended. In fact, it got bigger and darker the longer we lived there. One kind of amusing episode happened to us one memorable evening. I decided to let my boyfriend at the time stay overnight with me, although I usually didn't do this. Just as we were dozing off, a very loud bang sounded coming from the hallway. My boyfriend sat up and asked, what the heck was that? Immediately, a knocking began at the far end of the hall and rushed towards my room very fast, knocking louder and louder the closer it came. My boyfriend said, that has to be your roommate being funny. I just laughed and tried to explain about our ghost and that I thought he might be angry that I had a male friend overnight. He said that was bull and got up to investigate. Just as he came to the hallway, the knocking began again all around him. Needless to say, my brave six foot four inch boyfriend ran straight out the front door and never came back in the house. Anyway, after a few years, my roommate and I decided we were going to move to a cheaper apartment closer to where we worked. As soon as we started packing, the noises, and especially the lights going out, began to get really bad. I was even starting to get a little frightened. One day, as we were finishing up packing, we decided to go check in the basement and see if we had anything left down there. While we were down there, we decided to go in the old fruit cellar since neither one of us had actually looked in it. We found some old fishing equipment. We also found an old shirt box that was sealed with tape and felt kind of heavy. So we brought it upstairs and opened it up. Inside was a bunch of old pictures. Most of the pictures were of a young man of about 25 or 30. In many of the pictures, he was in our house and standing on the porch of the house. There were also some antique glass lines with pictures of him in the military uniforms. We dated the stuff around World War II. We decided to call our landlady, an elderly woman, around 80 years old, to tell her we had found the box. When we called her and told her what we had found, she hung up on us. We called back and her daughter answered and said that they didn't want that stuff anymore and we could have it or throw it away. We thought it was very strange since normally our landlady was a sweet old lady. So we decided that some of the stuff in the box might be worth more money and we would sell some of it. Some wore medals and even an old stock certificate. That night, I put the box on the kitchen table and we went to bed. In the morning, we were going to move the last of everything and as we were preparing to go, I asked my roommate what she had done with a box of stuff. She said she hadn't touched it. We looked everywhere and couldn't find it. Finally, around lunch, we got hungry and decided to cook a frozen pizza. We turned on the oven 
and immediately began to smell something burning. When I opened the oven, there was the box. Okay, I swore my roommate did it, and she swore I did it. So we left the box on the table again, and left to move some things to the new place. When we got back, the box was gone again. This time, we found it immediately in the kitchen pantry, so we kind of laughed it off and put it back on the kitchen table. About 10 minutes later, I walked into the kitchen and it was gone again. I decided the heck with it and decided to just go finish the bedroom closet I had just minutes before been working on. When I stepped up on the chair to wipe off the upper shelves, there was the box. That did it. I said out loud, okay George, we promise not to take your stuff and put the box back in the fruit cellar where we had found it. We left that day and have never been back, but I've always wondered if the next tenants ever heard from George. I've worked for a domestic violence shelter for approximately seven years. While I personally have never seen anything, there are always odd sounds and unusual occurrences. Let me start at the beginning. The house is two-story with an attic in a basement and over a hundred years old. I really don't know much else about its history. The local domestic violence center purchased the building, which had been uninhabited for a number of years, did some renovations, and began operating an anonymous shelter for battled women and their children. Over the years, there have been numerous sightings of a young couple. A woman in a long flowing dress can be seen periodically walking up the long staircase. A man in dark, old-fashioned clothing has been seen in the living room and at the top of the stairs outside the attic door. It is usual for all who went into the attic or the basement to feel uneasy and not alone. Recently, the sightings seem to have increased. A church group came over to the holidays to sing Christmas carols to the residents, and a young boy pointed to the ceiling and said, Look, there's an angel. The only thing seen by the others in the room was a hazy, grayish fog that wasn't in any particular shape. A few months later, one of the employee's daughter was in the living room, alone, working on a school project, and looked up to see a gray, transparent figure looming in the doorway. She screamed, and her mother raced in to see the figure moving slowly upstairs. It was as if the ghost was checking in, and didn't mean to frighten the young girl. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of this haunting is that the couple together Fitting the same descriptions of the man and the woman seen in places of the house have been seen in one bedroom upstairs. To my knowledge, at least three residents in the last year have been awakened at night to see the woman sitting on the edge of the bed with the man standing behind her. The couple has been described as comforting and reassuring to those who have seen them in this manner. And these apparitions have seemed to know when these residents were about to face a particular trying experience. One woman was going to court the next day for an order of protection. One lady was facing a decision about the custody of her new little baby, and one woman was about to embark on the dangerous underground trying to change her identity in order to hide from the husband who tried to kill her. All three of these women felt as though the ghosts were trying to tell them that everything was going to be alright, and, as it turns out, the dire situations facing each of these women worked out in their favor. I personally find their presence reassuring as well. Women and children who came through the shelter are very often depressed, sometimes hopeless, scared, insecure, and anxious. I think that the fact that they are comforted by these spirits is a sign that these are good spirits who seem to approve of the work being done in their house. They've never tried to scare anyone. Sure, lights turn on and off by themselves and the dishwasher is forever turning on by itself. Maybe they are just trying to figure out what these gadgets are. I do not know anything about the history of the house, but I assume these spirits were once residents of this house. Based on their actions, they seem to be good and well-wishing. I hope they continue to watch over the shelter and help the current residents. Hi, my name is Tariq and this is my supernatural experience. It happened to me when I was about five or six years old. 
I seem to remember it was quite a sunny afternoon. Nothing particularly unusual about that day. My mother asked me to go upstairs and wake my father, who often took afternoon naps. I remember feeling quite lazy, and I could not really be bothered going all the way upstairs to attempt to wake my dad sleeping. However, my mom insisted so I did. I was about to walk up the stairs, when I suddenly was overcome with fear, as what I had saw made no sense to me. There, at the top of the stairs, was the biggest dog I had ever seen in my life. It appeared to fill the whole space of the landing and was near the height of the ceiling. The dog appeared to be aggressive and was barking and growling so loud that it could have woken the dead. I was so shaken and scared that I just froze in the spot. I shouted for my mom. I said, Mom, I can't go upstairs, and she told me not to be lazy. I told her no, there was this big dog at the top of the stairs, and it would not let me pass. My mom came out to me, and she said, Tariq, we do not even have a dog. Of course, this is what I already knew. I quickly told my mom to get over here and see what I was seeing, but by the time she arrived and looked up the stairs, it was gone. This perplexed me even more, and being the age I was, I couldn't even understand it. I started to doubt myself, wondering if I ever even saw it at all, and I trusted and believed in my mother. So if she didn't really see it, maybe I was just hallucinating, and it really wasn't there. Obviously the dog disappeared, and after a while, I forgot about it, and never resurfaced again. However, these memories came back when I was about 12 years old and I spoke to my mom about it. Looking back on it, I do believe I saw something paranormal, but any ideas on why my mom or dad could not see it or hear it, and why was the dog being so protective, beats me. I don't know, but it was sure a scary sight. It just sucks that I feel like I was the only one who had saw it, and it makes me crazy. But what can you do? I don't know. I recently had an experience that I can't explain and decided to tell my story here. In June, my boyfriend Ian, our then 15 month old twins, of course me as well, we all went to his family reunion. While we were there, we had a wonderful time meeting his family and getting to know everyone really well. We stayed at his father and stepmother's home with the immediate family. One night, while everyone was asleep, one of the girls started crying, most likely from being in a new place or losing her pacifier. I woke up and still groggy, I sat up in the bed. I looked over to the crib. Next to the crib, there was a little old woman standing there looking into the crib. When I saw her, she didn't scare me, and I thought nothing of it. She looked at me, put her finger up to her mouth, kind of bent down, and whispered, shh. So I laid back down, and fell back to sleep. Brianna slept through the rest of the night. The next morning, I got up, and remembered what I saw. Not sure if I dreamt it or not, I pulled Ian away from the family and asked him if he had a picture of his grandmother. The family had spoken a lot of her the previous day at the reunion, but I had never met her. Ian was very close to her, and was very upset at the time of her death. It would have been almost nine years ago. They found one, and after I saw the picture, I felt this warmth, the only way I can describe it, and it filled my body. It was the lady I saw the night before, I wasn't sure if I should tell anyone, for fear of them thinking I was insane, but I decided to tell Ian. When I told him, he kind of gasped. Like I said, he was very close to his grandmother. I'm glad I told him. Well, later, as we were talking to the family, someone said, oh, it would have been so wonderful for her to be here and see all the family together. Speaking of the grandmother, Ian looked at me 
and asked me to tell everyone what I saw. I'm still new to this family and wouldn't want to be dubbed as the crazy one just yet, so I kept it to myself. Thanks for giving me a place to share this. In 1983, we moved into a home that had suddenly been vacated by the owners. The man had suffered a heart attack at the front door and died. His wife went into serious shock and suffered some emotional distress. After the funeral, her children decided to take her back to Missouri. I'd personally known the couple in 1971 as I had lived in a house on the connecting street. Our backyards were contiguous. Mr. Williams had been the water superintendent for the city for many years. He was an upstanding citizen, a loving family man, and a friend to many people. Shortly after moving in, he got the feeling that Mr. Williams had never really left his home. At night, after everyone had turned in, footsteps could be heard throughout the home. It sounded like heavy footsteps stomping up and down the hall, outside the bedrooms. I would get up and check to see if the children were awake, and would find them sleeping soundly in their beds. Once in a while, doors would open up wide, as if someone was entering a room, and then the door would slam shut. One night, my wife at the time awoke to see the form of a man standing at the end of our bed. He woke up on her side and leaned over a little. She laid there terrified, knowing that I was very hard to wake up and that if this were a burglar, I would not suddenly spring into action against the intruder. She maintained her position and just peered through her eyelids. Suddenly, the figure just faded away. These occurrences persisted for about a month. One morning, at around 2.30 a.m., we were suddenly awakened by the bedroom door slamming open with a violent force. We were very tired of Mr. Williams' nightly tirades, and I was running on my last nerve. I got up and decided to try to talk with this confused soul. I addressed him as Mr. Williams and told him that he had suffered a heart attack and had died. I told him that his wife had gone to Missouri to live with his children. I told him that we were paying rent to his children to live in this house, and we worked hard for our money. I started to get angry with him, and told him that if he wanted to rant and rave and stomp about the house, he needed to do it when we weren't there, as he was disturbing our sleep. If he continued, we would be forced to move, and his children would have to find other renters. I suggested he go to Missouri, because that is where he would find his wife. After that, he never heard from Mr. Williams again. In August of 1997, I was helping a friend deliver some things for a post-funeral reception that was to be held in the officer's quarters number one at Fort Concho in San Angelo, Texas. Fort Concho is the best preserved and reconstructed cavalry fort in America. This is where the Buffalo soldiers were stationed. It was very early in the morning, and we had to get the key to the building from the curator. We drove to the other side of the parade ground and parked the van. We went inside, and I took some things up to the staircase to the second floor, while my buddy worked on the first floor. I walked into the west bedroom upstairs and immediately felt like I had just walked between two people that were standing shoulder to shoulder. I was walking into a tremendous field of static electricity. I had a cold sensation and the hairs on my neck and arms stood straight out. I put the vase down that I was carrying and found myself compelled to say, excuse me. Then I proceeded to the east bedroom. When I entered the room, I saw a little girl out of the corner of my eye, playing on the floor to my left. I placed the vase, and when I turned around, she faded away. A couple of days later, I was again with my friend. We stopped by the house of the lady, 
who was responsible for financing the restoration of officer's quarter number one. My friend mentioned that I had felt a presence and saw a little girl. I told her that I had seen her in the east bedroom, and she told me that a little girl had died in that very room. Maybe it was her parents that I felt in the west bedroom, or just someone else watching over her. A few months later, I had the opportunity to stop by the officer's quarters number one when it was open to the public. I was walking around, and a staff member volunteer came up and asked me what I thought of the building. I told her I thought it was haunted, and repeated the story of the little girl. The lady took me into the dining room and pointed to a portrait on the wall. It was the same little girl I had seen upstairs. I would first like to say, I was not a believer in ghosts or spirits. I was in the Navy at the time, and had been just transferred to Japan. My family and I arrived there in August of 91. I felt very lucky, because the Navy had just opened Hario, a new housing complex about nine miles from the naval base. This meant that my family and I would not have to live off base. My wife and I were taken out to the Hario to pick out a house. Being newly opened, we basically had the pick of the litter. My wife and I chose a nice three-bedroom room townhouse in the center of the housing complex. We moved in within three days and began to settle down. Nothing much happened for the first month or two. Then one night, my daughter, who was three at the time, started waking up at night crying. She would point at the wall and tell me to make the snake lady go away. This happened about once a week. Of course, I thought she was just having bad dreams. We would let her sleep in our bed when this happened. My wife became pregnant at the time and we were allowed to move into a four-bedroom house. I was hoping this move would solve the snake lady problem. As we moved into the new house, I assured her the snake lady was gone forever. Boy, was I wrong. It was about two weeks before our encounters with the snake lady started again. This time my wife and I could actually feel some sort of electrical charge throughout the house. These encounters intensified and my daughter started to see more and more apparitions. She would tell me that the snake lady wanted to take her away. I, being a skeptic, thought the electrical charge was sort of funny, but never gave much thought about my daughter's nightmare being real. Then one night, my wife and I were awakened by my daughter, screaming at the top of her lungs. We rushed into her room to find her pressed against the far wall, her feet approximately one foot off the ground. My wife and I both grabbed her arms, and with one of my feet pressed against the wall, I pulled with all my might. She wouldn't budge. I'm not a small man, five foot ten, 191 pounds, and I worked out all the time. I could not get her off the wall. All the while she was screaming that the snake lady wanted to take her away. Scared to death, I started praying in my head. My daughter started to slide down the wall, and she fell into our arms. I don't know what it was, but I believe there is something out there that we don't know about. The next day I blessed every room in the house with olive oil. This seemed to do the trick, because my daughter never had another experience. My wife is Japanese, and she did some investigating of the area's history. Hario was once an internment camp for the sick and dying Japanese soldiers of World War II. There is a shrine just outside the back gate for the soldiers that died there. And that's what we found out. Thanks for reading. It's funny really, because I've been reading your site for quite some time and have marveled over the experiences people have had, but never ever thought I would be emailing you my story. This experience is mainly my two friends, but I experienced it firsthand last night. They live in Rath, Royal Air Force Quarters, in Middlesex in England. 
and have never really mentioned anything before. A couple weeks ago, Susie and I were chatting about various things when the subjects of ghosts came up. Funny enough, the handprints have come back since Elena was born, said Susie. Handprints? What handprints? I replied. It seems that since they moved in over three years ago, they've had various things happen. So she took me upstairs, and there, clear as day, was a set of huge handprints on the wall, just above their bed. Apparently, she has tried everything to get rid of them, and they disappeared when she was pregnant. As soon as the baby was born, they came back, and when I saw Susie and Jay last night, they casually informed me that the handprints had moved. By now, I was getting quite spooked out. We went outside for a cigarette, with one of the music channels on the TV playing. When we came back in, the channel had changed to some gruesome true murder documentary. The hairs on the back of my neck were standing on edge at this stage, and it took Susie a good five minutes to change the channel back. Also, they both watched a candle that stood on top of the telly, very casually move from the middle, and drop off at the end. Things have been moved around, never hidden, and the TV also turns on and off. Susie and Jay were very relaxed about this, and the ghost obviously means them no harm. Last night, it was Susie, Jay, and me, and they told me what happened last Sunday. Apparently, Susie had gone up to change Elena, and had sat out her pajamas and nappy out in the changing mat in the bedroom. She was bathing Elena, and thought that perhaps she could use one of the smaller nappies instead of the big one that she had pulled out. When she went back into the bedroom, the pajamas and the big nappy had been thrown onto the chair, and in a perfect arc were three of the smaller nappies on the changing mat. Poor Jay got it right in the neck for that, until he explained that he hadn't been upstairs at all. Again, the hairs on my neck were standing on end, and when I had to go upstairs to use their toilet, Susie had to come with me. We then went out for a cigarette, and as we were sitting there, I saw the shadow of someone walking to the kitchen, didn't think anything of it, until I realized that we were all sitting outside. I told them, and Susie said that she sees shadows out of the corner of her eye all the time. We then went back in, and I was sitting on the sofa, next to Susie, talking to Jay, when I noticed that she was staring at something right behind her. I asked what she was looking at, but she said nothing at first, knowing how freaked out I was getting. She then began to tell me that she noticed a transparent man with an axe lodged into his forehead, casually move from the room we were in and into the kitchen, then disappear. She had told me that when she was alone in the living room, another time, that she also saw a man sitting down at the kitchen table, as if he was writing on a piece of paper, then disappear shortly after. Apparently, they are not the only ones to experience things. It seems that quite a few people in the row of houses had strange things happen, and the couple on end have seen a shadowy figure. She asked me to babysit Elena next week. Must admit, not too keen on having the extra company, though. When I was about 10 years old, my family lived with my great-grandmother and me, and my brother had to sleep in the basement. Half was for storage. Half was an extra room. So one night, at like 3, I had to walk to the top floor to take a pee. On my way down, I hear the voice of a little girl say goodbye. Then I noticed that same voice, and it said die. I immediately freaked out and ran back into my room, absolutely terrified. There was another incident with my brother. He was in the basement, and he heard the same voice coming up the stairs from it. It said die as well, and he turned back looked down the stairs, and the apparition of a girl was standing right there, and then materialized 
and disappeared in an instant. When I was 15, we moved out to New Jersey. When I was 16, I heard horribly violent screaming. It sounded like a woman, and it sounded like it was coming from behind me. Three days later, my brother, he was 19. He heard the same screaming coming from our bedroom closet. Nowadays, we don't hear any mysterious voices, but we both know they had to be ghosts. And not only that, they had to be evil. And I don't want to experience that ever again. I'm sure my brother doesn't want to either. Thanks for listening. I first became aware of a presence in our home when I was a child of four years. When I was four, my brother was born, and my parents moved him into the bedroom next to theirs. I was moved into my very own room, upstairs. My older sister occupied the room next to mine. It did not take me long to realize that there was something odd about this new room I was in. I would wake up in the night, chilled, with the overwhelming feeling that someone was watching me. Sometimes, I caught fleeting glimpses of what looked like a shadow on one particular wall. When I mentioned the shadow to Ma, she attributed it to light play from the moon and other rational explanations. I tried very hard to believe her explanations and to make the shadow sightings go away, but I simply couldn't take the vision of a man in an overcoat wearing a fedora. I could never actually see this man, just an outline, a shadow, but I knew he was there. I can't even say I felt threatened by this figure. I just felt watched and not alone. I suppose I should describe our family home. It is a large, Cape Cod style home, built in the 1940s, just after the war. The family that built the home were obviously influenced by World War II, as was the world, I would think. And they built a secret room, which I would imagine was designed to hide the family if war ever broke out on home soil. This room was only accessible via a trap door in the kitchen floor and it led to the secret room in the basement. My dad sealed this room off before I was born, although I know exactly where the trap door is. There is also a secret passageway that leads between the closets of the two upstairs rooms. This passageway has been sealed before my parents bought the home. This house was the second built on the foundation. The first was a farmhouse dating back to the late 1800s which burnt when my mother was a child in the 1930s. The family that originally built the Cape Cod did not live there long, and it became a rest home for the affluent elderly in the community for many years. My parents bought the home in 1954, and I was born 11 years later. There were other strange occurrences in the house in my younger years, such as doors opening and closing by themselves, and doors locking when there were no locks and the piano playing by itself. But I'll fast forward to 1974, when my older sister got married. I took the opportunity to move into her larger room, and that is when the strangeness went into overdrive. I hadn't actually even moved completely into the room when the weirdness began. I'd moved my record player into the room, along with a student desk. I was showing the room to a friend one afternoon, when the door slammed shut behind us. When we turned to look at the door, the shade in the opposite window flew off the hinges and landed at our feet in the middle of this room. We both screamed and ran to the door, only to find it locked, and there wasn't a lock in the door. We managed to finally get it open and run down the stairs. My friend would never even go into the room again, let alone spend the night with me. I didn't let it bother me, however, and moved the bed into the room and took up residence. The room always stayed incredibly cold, even in the heat of an Ohio summer. My dad installed triple the insulation into that room to try to help with the chill, but it remained downright cold. There were countless nights when I would awaken to knocking on the walls. Sometimes I would knock back, 
and it would knock back at me. When I told my parents about the knocking, my dad said it was a tree limb scraping the house. The knocking became so intense that he ended up cutting the tree down, but the knocking continued. My parents installed an intercom system into my room next to my bed, so I could page them when the knocking started. Dad seemed convinced that it was the neighborhood boys throwing rocks at my window. It didn't sound like that though, and the knocking was coming from an inside wall, not an outside one. One afternoon, I was lying on the bed reading, and I got the overwhelming feeling that I was being watched. I sat up on the bed and said out loud, Stop it! There's no such thing as ghosts! And no sooner had I uttered the words, a figurine on a shelf began to wobble and then flew off the shelf and across to the bed, hitting me on the forehead. I slept on the sofa for a month after that. My family was even beginning to notice strange things happening by this time. The television would turn itself on and off, or alternatively increase the top volume without anyone being in the room. Dad said we had a bum set and bought a new one, but it did the same. We had the wiring replaced, but it still happened. My mom declared that if it was a ghost, it certainly wasn't going to run her out of the home she loved. This is true, she still lives there with the ghost. Other things that would happen in the house included radio switching on and off, lights flickering, the washing machine switching on and running a cycle, and of course the shadow wandering around upstairs. It was all beginning to frighten me quite a bit, especially the knocking noises. If the knocking started, I would buzz mom in the intercom, and she would race upstairs, but as soon as she reached the top step, the knocking would stop. I began to think perhaps I was going a bit crazy. I went away to college and something strange happened in my old bedroom about a week after I had left. I still had the same clothes hanging in the closet, and there were a few posters still hanging on the wall, but otherwise, it was empty. My mom heard a funny noise upstairs one afternoon and went up to investigate. She checked the first bedroom and saw nothing amiss and went down the hall to my room. She opened the door and discovered that the mirror tile on one wall had exploded all over the place. There were shards of glass sticking in the opposite wall and had scraped across the ceiling like claw marks. My posters hung in shreds. She noticed my closet door hanging open and shreds of glass sticking in the clothes still hanging inside. She shut the door and waited for dad to get home from work. He decided that it must have been a freak lightning hit although the day was sunny and cloudless, and rang the insurers to come out and investigate. The investigator noted that the point of impact seemed to be the upper corner of the wall, where the mirrored tile met the adjoining wall. Oddly, he also noticed that the broken wood in the corner was pointing outward, as if the lightning had been inside the room and went out, instead of the lightning hitting outside and coming in. The insurance company still paid for the damages, although they could never find the point on the outside of the house where the lightning had come in. When I heard about it, I came home to view it and noticed that the wall in question was the one where I had always heard the knocking. As I said, my mom still lives in the house and strange things still persist. She keeps the washing machine unplugged, but unless the water is cut off, it still fills up. This is the third faulty washer we've had. The TV still plays tricks too. My dad passed away in the house two years ago, and on a night after he died, I was staying with mom, although I wasn't about to go upstairs ever again. And in the middle of the night, we both heard faint music playing upstairs, bluegrass music to be precise, which was dad's favorite and we reckoned that there must have been a party going on to welcome dad to the other side. Mom has since sealed off the upstairs and only lives in the downstairs part of the house. My brother has had plenty of strange things happen to him in the house as well, 
as did my sister. And as a result, none of us want mom to bequeath the house to us. She can't understand why. Every single night in my home, when I was four years old, my parents would come in and put me in bed, mostly my mother, because my father wasn't home much. I never liked to sleep in the dark, and there were no outlets in my room for a lamp, or none that wanted to work at the time. As I laid in bed, almost every night, I'd look out into the hall, and I would be able to see the hall light on. Almost every single night as I lay in bed, a boy would walk past my door several times and then stop. It was a white glowing type thing that I remember perfectly well. It scared me a bit, but I never got an evil aura off of him. A thing about the boy is that he had died a long time ago, before we had moved in. It scared me all the time to recall it though, even though he isn't bad. I've only slept with the door open once. Since then, my parents got the outlets working. I was sleeping in a different room, but it was across the room the boy had died in. I looked outwards from my slumber, my glasses still on my face because I always fall asleep watching TV. I saw the boy and he went into my brother's room. That night, my brother got really sick. I don't know what happened. But the boy had died of a sickness. Another thing that happened. Me and my friends were sitting out on my back porch, and my one friend had brought a Ouija board with her. My other friend suggested that we play. Of course, I didn't want to, because I've had past experiences that turned out bad with those things, with other friends. We sat at the table and put each of our hands on it. Before we started, though, we read something that had said you must finish a question. We thought we would. Beside the porch is a pool. This will fit into what happened as I go. We didn't believe that the board would actually work though. And so we tried. Even with the past experiences, I didn't think it would. So this is what we did. We tapped our fingers while the thing was moving. So that no one could move it themselves. We did get in contact with the spirit, and we, of course, ended up not finishing a question. Then, we noticed from the pool a mist that started to emerge. I kid you not, it was a ghostly apparition floating above the pool. It lasted for about 10 seconds, and then it faded away. I then decided to finish the question. My friend immediately stopped me and asked me what I was doing. You're conjuring up evil, she said to me. It was clear that she didn't want to do this anymore. So we stopped, and we never returned to that Ouija board again. In fact, we went out to the fireplace, and we burned the Ouija board, so that we would never have any bad omens attached to us. Yet another incident occurred. About a year ago, I met up with some different kind of people. Wiccans to mostly say, and I still am Wiccan now. I took it in, because God actually hadn't helped me one slight bit with my life, so I started to believe in gods. I learned some good spells, and some bad. The ones I used most were the exorcism spells for haunted houses around here. My house I knew had quite a lot of ghosts in it, and I decided to get rid of one particular one. One that would scare the entire family as we slept. At night, if you were to turn the light off in the living room, the room would turn a deep dark blood red, and the windows to the place would disappear. When you looked to one corner of the place, you could see a black figure walking out of it. This is the ghost I decided to rid the house of. It never spoke during anything. It would only appear, and nothing more. My sister and her friends hadn't believed me when I told them of what was going on in the room, and they tested it for themselves. As we did it, they saw exactly what I was saying, and screamed for me to turn the light on. I actually sleep in that room still. The ghost is still there, but it doesn't bother us anymore. When I had tried the exorcism, 
The ghost had gotten angry and thrown the lamp at me. If not for me dodging it and then grabbing it before it hit the wall, I would have been in trouble. It glared at me and disappeared. You're probably thinking, this is absolute bull, but I can assure you, it was not. And I tell you this, not because I really want you to believe in some fantasy story, but because this actually happened. I couldn't even believe with my own eyes what was occurring. When I returned to the room that night, and from then on, the ghost never came back, or didn't bother us anyway. There are other ghosts in my house, ones that are in the cellar, but I've only heard them, not actually seen them. Anyway, this last event occurred outside of my house. Anyway, one night I was out with my friends, against my parents' will. We had left when they were asleep. It was around 3 a.m. in the morning, and we wanted to see what was around the area. We went up to the graveyard near, and sat down by some of the older graves, deeper into the graveyard. As we were sitting there, I looked up to see a dark and black figure standing by one of the trees. He wasn't looking at me or my friends, but something else. I had been leaning up against a grave. I didn't have much respect for the dead at the time until after this. I turned around and looked up to see a white figure standing there, looking at the black figure. They then turned their eyes towards me. I tugged on my friend's arm, but she didn't reply. She was asleep, along with the two other people that were there with us. I backed up off the grave as the white one glared at me. When I got completely away, they had turned their eyes back to each other and had vanished. Before our marriage, my husband purchased a home built sometime previous to 1870 in the center of a small town in Michigan. It is a lovely house, we still have it, with high ceilings and wide archways between some of the rooms. When we moved in, we had very modern furniture, which really didn't look right in the house, so our friends would bring us antiques whenever they could find them, very cheaply or for free. One friend bought us a very large round antique mirror that he had found in a house his company was hired to tear down. It was the kind with a gilded wood and molded frame with a medallion at the top, a glass, while it had some dark spots and shadings, was in exceptionally good condition. This was back in the mid to late 70s and we had parties almost every weekend. In the summer when the doors were left open, no one bothered knocking, they just opened the screen and came in. Late one Friday or Saturday evening, shortly after receiving the mirror, I was sitting on a low sofa against the east wall of the living room. Also on this wall was a large archway leading into the dining room, which is where the main entry door that we used was located. There was also a door leading into the living room from the front porch, but no one used this one. The mirror was hung on the north wall, right next to the couch where I was sitting. Everyone else was sitting in the middle, or at the opposite end of the room, large room. I was looking to my right, and noticed in the mirror that a young man was walking through the archway into the living room, and stopped right at the threshold. At first glance, I did not recognize him, so I turned on the couch to look at him directly and there was no one there. I looked over at the mirror again, and there he was. He was not a big guy, about five foot eight or five foot nine, thin built, dark hair, short for the times, and wearing what looked like one of those blue gray work shirts. I looked towards the archway again. No one was there. I shot off the couch and into the dining room to see if anyone was playing a trick on me. There was no one in any part of the house other than the living room. It made me very uneasy and I could never sit in that area again. In fact, I moved that couch a week later 
And even though the mirror still hangs there all these years later, I tried to avoid looking at it. A couple of years after this happened, I joined the local historical society. I met a wonderful tiny old lady in her 90s. She told me that she had been in my home many times during her youth, and I found out from her that during Prohibition, the people who owned a house would have parties with bootleg liquor. There was an argument late one evening and a young man was killed by a blast from the barrels of a shotgun at close range in the area of the front entrance to the dining room. I'm not sure if it was him or not, but for three or four years after that, every night at 3.10 a.m., I would hear slow but steady footsteps on the creaky wood floors walk from the archway through the living room and up to the bedroom door. They always stopped right there, thank God and I tried to make sure they would come no further by hanging a crucifix on a hook inside of the bedroom door. After a few years, it either stopped or we grew so accustomed to it that we didn't notice it anymore. So, do you think my spirit came with the mirror or that the mirror just enabled me to see him? I don't know. I guess we'll find out sooner or later. Early March last year, my husband and I had the most terrifying night of our lives. Avid campers, we had never been scared sleeping out in the middle of nowhere in our tent. We went to a campground called Weldon Springs in Illinois, about 45 miles from our home. We stayed at the backpacking area, which at that time of year is isolated except for a few deer and birds. I felt fear the minute we walked into our spot. We had camped in that spot several times before, with no weird occurrences. I felt like we were being watched. I tried to pass it off as dead trees and grass, and a lack of other people around. By evening, sitting around the fire, I was scared. Our friend came along to stay with us, had a sleeping bag with him, ready to camp. Oddly, he decided not to stay. When we got settled in our tent, hell broke loose. We laid there a minute, and I heard an odd stomping noise in the trail leading to our site. It got louder, like it was getting closer. I asked my husband after we discussed it ourselves, and he said he felt an evil presence there. Even though we were absolutely terrified, I told him to take a peek outside the tent, just so we could ease our minds about the situation and prevent our imagination from running wild. This was a terrible mistake. He told me when he looked out that he saw the ghost of a hunter with red eyes staring right at him and then he floated off into the woods and then disappeared. It didn't last very long but he could still tell that the man was wearing hunting gear from a different era. It definitely didn't look like the attire you would see today. According to him, he told me that the clothes that he wore looked a lot like the people in the Wild West would wear in the 19th century. My husband even said that it looked as if he didn't want to be seen, like he had the look of pure shock on his face. In a way, I wish I had seen it myself, but I know I wouldn't have been able to handle that. We know that there was something strange out there that night, and we'll never forget it. There is this camp that I know of, it's referred to as Camp Connecticut, and it's a run-down camp. It's called the Run Camp because of its deadly history, where a group of men were once gathered, said to be a cult, and eventually the town had exiled them and were forced to stay at this camp outside of town. When abandoned, the caretaker's daughter was found brutally murdered in the camp, and all members of the camp denied any knowledge or participation in the murder. Whenever I go back to the camp, I've always experienced unsettling events that could be tied to the events just described. Experiences included voices. For example, a young girl screaming, which we thought could have been the young murdered girl. We have seen figures pass among the trees while walking through the narrow paths along the woods. In pictures that I have seen, 
There are many orbs near the main gate, and near the large sign within the camp. Examinations show not to be a photo error, or bad development. There was also this insane experience that my brother's best friend and his friends had. He happened to take a trip here, and while walking the main entrance pathway, he came across a man standing there in all white clothing. They called to him, and there was no response, so they turned to go the other way, and when they did, this presence in the white was standing right in front of them, with eyes that were completely black. As they turned and ran, it seemed as if the presence began to run after them. Anyway. As they got close to the main gate, they turned, and there was no one behind them at the time. They stopped again for a second, and turned back to look behind them again. They recall that about five apparitions, all in white, were standing right next to each other, and then they disappeared. It was as if they were letting them know that there were more of these ghosts. They then walked back to the car, and drove away. This place is very freaky to even just look at the main gate. I get scared every time I go. I will send our photos as soon as I get my scanner up and running. Thank you. I've been tempted to write about what happened to my family many times, but it seems far too unreal. We were not allowed to talk about this outside of the house when I was a child, and my mother only told guests about her visitors when they experienced something in our house. Our childhood home was built in 1898. My parents bought the home in 1974, when I was only six months old. The house was very large, and had been converted into a double. My grandmother moved into the upper level. Strange things began to happen shortly after my family moved in. My mother had her first experience one night, after she had sent my older sisters to bed. From her bedroom door, she could look out and see into the kitchen hallway and into the bathroom. My family had only lived in the house less than a month when my mom saw a little blonde haired girl walk into the bathroom. All of my sisters have very dark brown hair and this was clearly a blonde haired child. My mother panicked and yelled to the little girl but the door shut. My mom jumped out of bed. In her mind, she was thinking that this little girl was a neighbor's child that my sister must have snuck in the house. When she opened the door, there was nobody inside the room. My mother nicknamed the little girl Jessie, and I have no idea why. My mother had many experiences in the house, and with the younger children, myself, my younger sister and younger brother, when we were very small, it was as if we were playing with someone else. I don't remember this, but my mom did, but I do remember that in my oldest sister's bedroom in her closet, there was a paneled off section that led under our hallway steps to the second floor. I remember talking to someone that we called the lady under the stairs. I always thought that it was my mom or grandmother, but I later learned that this was not the case. When we told my mom about this, she would not let us play this game anymore. I do not remember being scared at all. My younger sister and I would also go into our hallway and play with the lady on the stairs. I have very little recollection of this at the time. I would have been about four years old and my sister would have been about three. When we described the woman to my mother, she forbade us from being in the hallway alone. I never took the ghost stories to heart and was very carefree as a child. I always felt safe. However, I did finally have a bizarre experience that I could not explain or rationalize away. My grandmother had a stroke when I was 15, and my mother gave my older sister's bedroom to my grandmother since it was on the first level and was safer for her. She had no control over what she was saying and was rapidly deteriorating. My parents didn't lay any crown rules down for us kids that summer as things were in havoc and my brother and I had stayed up all night, watching Nick and Knight in the living room. I could see into my grandmother's room, and we also kept an eye out for her, should she use the bathroom or want something to drink. I was just starting to doze off, 
when I thought I saw someone in my grandmother's room. It was a blonde haired girl who might have been 10 to 12. I have no idea the age. I thought I was seeing things or that I was just really wiped out and my mom's stories were starting to get to me. I walked out into our kitchen and my oldest sister was eating a sandwich and I told her what I saw. She laughed at me and told me I must have been dreaming. I thought maybe she was right because I just never believed what my mom had been saying about the girl she had claimed to have seen on several occasions. Now here's where I realized I wasn't a complete nutcase. I said before that the house was very big. Well, my grandmother started screaming and my sister and I ran into the room. My grandmother was up and headed for the front door. She was screaming about fire and the little girl. We could barely make out what she was talking about, but she kept repeating. The little girl said I was going to hurt the baby and I have to go before I cause a fire. That was the most intelligible sentence that my grandma had said in over a month. My sister kept saying what little girl and my grandmother said clear as day, the little blonde haired girl. My grandmother was 72 years old and short of hearing. She was also three rooms away when I literally whispered this to my sister. We woke my mom up because we did not know what to do. My grandma ran out of the house and refused to come back in. She stood on her porch. My parents took her to the hospital and she was placed in a nursing home because even the mention of her house sent her into hysterics. The baby she was talking about is my younger brother who is the baby in the family. My mom decided to turn the house into a one family home again and had us kids, there were six of us, do the work. We did not mind as we wanted the help and it was a good way for us not to think about my grandmother all the time. My younger sister and I would be the only two sharing a room but that was fine as we were very close and we were excited. Again I was up and could not sleep so I went up to the room that would be ours. It had been my grandmother's and I was scraping wallpaper off the walls with a putty knife. We had started this project the night before and I was bored so I went up to get some more done. I was scraping the walls and had been doing so for about an hour when I heard a funny noise that sounded like the scraping noise I was making with the knife but different. It's hard to explain. I thought someone was playing a trick on me so I began to scrape the wall and very quickly I stopped. However, the sound that I heard continued and it was the sound of scraping but it was coming from across the room. I do not know if whatever was in the room was mocking me or playing a game but the scraping kept going on. Whoever or whatever did not care that I heard them. I screamed. I thought it was one of my older sisters. I ran down the front steps and opened the door and the house was completely quiet. Everyone was sound asleep, snoring. I woke up everyone in the house. I was terrified and I never slept in that room. I will continue to hear things in that house until I was 18 and moved out. As for our house restorations, my mother began working on the kitchen and back hallway that led to our attic. While doing so, she found where the house had burn marks and was scorched. My mother mentioned this to one of our neighbors, a woman who had lived on our street from the day she was born in the early 1920s. Our house had been burnt very badly and had been rebuilt. At that time, it had been converted to a double. A little girl and her parents lost their lives in the fire. My other sisters had things happen to them too. One of my older sisters was looking out the living room windows. Somebody grabbed her shoulder and called her name. One more thing, please don't think I'm nuts, but I've not had this happen in any house or apartment I've lived in since. And one thing I did notice is that whatever was in the house is not frightening to me in my youth, but only became frightening when each of us hit a certain age. I have no idea why. This was also something I thought that was so weird. The little girl was never visible upstairs and the woman was only spotted downstairs once. A neighbor who was alive when the house caught on fire 
remembered that the little girl's name was Jessica. My mom had been calling her that for years and had never known what the little girl's real name was, but I just called her that because it seemed right. Hi, I just thought I'd write to you guys to tell you what happened to me when I was about 12 to 13. I'm from Northwest England in a county called Cheshire. I was staying with my father in a small village called Renberry. He used to live in a large country house that has been around for many years. I think, but I'm not certain, that the house is in Victoria. I was staying for the weekend. The house does look spooky, but I never felt any kind of presence there until Sunday afternoon when my father popped out to the local store. He was only gone for about 15 minutes. It was about 9.30 p.m. and I decided that I needed the toilet. There was a downstairs toilet, but that was full of boxes and tools, so I had to go upstairs. I walked upstairs and went to the toilet. After flushing the loo, as the noise from the loo had gone and I was washing my hands, I heard the sound of a baby crying and screaming. Sound was coming from a nearby bedroom. This scared me a lot because I knew there was nobody in the house and it was not coming from the outside because the house is stuck in the middle of nowhere, just miles of farm fields around. I walked out of the toilet and headed towards the direction of the crying. As I opened the bedroom door, the sound flew past me, but no one was there. It was almost like the sound traveled through me. I was rooted to the spot with complete terror. I then turned to face the sound, which was now sounding like it was coming from one of the other bedrooms across the hall. I don't know why, but I headed to the other room. The crying baby was really, really loud, and I was sure that someone was hurting a baby. Looking back, maybe that's why I went to see. As I opened the door, I saw something I will never forget. There was a baby lying on the floor, but it didn't look right. Half of its body was stuck in the floor. I could see one of its legs pointing out and a half of a face. It was wearing old looking clothes. The sound of the baby was almost deafening and it looked like someone was hurting it, but no one was there. This was all too much for me and I ran downstairs and outside into the dark and just waited for my father to return. I never told my dad anything. This is the first time I've ever told anyone. I thought I was going crazy because I've never believed in ghosts before. My father no longer lives there now, but I did go back once when he was visiting an old friend that now lives there, but I never went up their stairs on my own again. Well, I just thought that maybe you would find that interesting. Nail me back if you wish. Hope you don't think I'm lying, because it was all very real to me. I'm 20 years old now, and I have access to the internet. I spend my time looking for other people who've had similar things happen to them. Thank you for reading. Many years ago, my family and I lived in a lovely Queen Anne style home. We lived in it for 13 years, 11 of which we experienced paranormal phenomena. Two years after we moved in, we had a first of many odd occurrences. My daughter was in the kitchen and I was upstairs when I heard her call out that the upstairs toilet must have overflowed because water was running down the outside of the staircase. I ran to the top of the stairs in bare feet only to feel water on the surface of the carpeting. I looked over the top of the railing to assure her that the toilet hadn't overflowed and that was when I felt the wetness on my feet, but there were no water pipes in that part of the house. When I got down the stairs, I found the water running in rivulets down the wooden molding. My daughter reached up to turn on the light under the stairway alcove and as soon as she did, the water stopped. We had to wipe the tram down and we never found any reason for that activity. Months later, while preparing for bed one night, I heard footsteps running down the attic stairs. 
The door crashed against the opposite wall, and then nothing. I was terrified, thinking that someone was there. They would have to pass my room to get downstairs, but nothing happened. When we finally went to look, the door was against the wall. We even thought that maybe a ball had bounced down the stairs, sounded like footsteps, but there was nothing. Strangely, when we started to think our house had unseen guests, we were no longer frightened. As time passed, we had many more experiences. I heard a woman crying softly, but pitifully. Two of my daughters saw images of old-fashioned children dressed in long white nightgowns and mob caps. A visitor to my house saw the same thing and asked me who the little girl was. On another occasion, my nephew was spending the night and thought he saw someone standing at the top of the stairs in a long white old-fashioned nightgown. My nephew was 16 at the time and we hadn't told him about the house. My husband thought we were all crazy because he didn't believe in this sort of thing. My daughter came home late one night and was just lying in bed, going over her evening, and looked up to see a male figure suspended over the bed. She watched the image dissolve from the top as if it were sand falling. There were other things that happened there, although nothing dangerous, and finally, we sold the house and moved down. It was several years after we moved on from the house that we met a family that had lived there years before we did and had very similar things happen to them when they said their experiences were very frightening and mean-spirited. I sometimes think our guests moved with us because from time to time we still get very strange sensations in our present Victorian home. I've had quite a few ghostly experiences over my life, all of which have been rather benevolent except for one that happened a few years back. I was 24, living with my mother, my sister, and my two-year-old niece. One night, I woke up and looked up into the darkness. This thing flew down from the ceiling, straight at me with its arms out. I can still see it. It looked like a cross between a gargoyle and an alien. It looked so evil. It sounds silly, but I was so terrified that I ran out of my room screaming into the living room to be with my mother. I was shaking uncontrollably, and I sat with her for quite a while before I could convince myself that it was just a dream, and I went back to bed with no further problems. Well, a few months down the road, my sister was at home with her friend, Kelly who seems to have some sort of connection with the paranormal, like her mother, and she sent her down the hall to get a towel for my niece. The linen closet is down the hall in my mother's room. Kelly came back a couple minutes later, white as a sheet. Now, my sister and Kelly are always talking about stuff like this, but this is what really freaked me out. She said that there was something in my mother's room, and it was a threatening presence. She then went on to describe it. About three foot tall, gray, kind of a cross between a gargoyle and something. I had never mentioned anything to my sister, and the only thing I had told my mother is that something scared me. I had never described what I saw to anyone in another related incident prior to my sighting. My mother was trying to sleep one night in her room, and as she is about to fall asleep, Something breathed nearer, kind of like a sharp exhale, right into her ear. She woke up the next morning with scratches in the middle of her back. And the freaky thing is, she slept alone. And there were only three, long, about six inches thin, scratches on her back. Needless to say, I'm very happy to be out of the house. I'm not sure if this qualifies as a ghost story, but it was more than an ordinary dream. My cat Johnny, my sweet silver bad boy for 10 years, died at home of aggressive cancer in March. During the month between his diagnosis and his death, I showered him with even more attention than usual, 
So by the time he passed away, we were closer than ever. On several occasions, including at his grave just before burying him, I invited him to come back and let me know he was okay. A few nights after his death, I was aroused by a dream by the sound of Johnny's meow coming from the direction of his special spot at the foot of my bed. Coincidentally, his grave is about 30 feet further in the same direction. I waited with a mixture of hope and anxiety to film walking up my body to my face, but it didn't happen. Instead, I became aware of something tickling my left ear and tried to reach over the pedo, only to find that I was paralyzed. That's when I panicked, remembering all the scary ghost stories involving a period of paralysis. That was the moment where I woke up, and I suddenly saw something in the corner of the room. It was a dark, small figure, but I couldn't really make it out. It was a dark shadow, even though it was a very dark outline of something. I'm assuming it was a kid or something. It was very terrifying. I couldn't even believe what I was seeing. And then all of a sudden, it seemed like two grim reapers were standing right behind him. So this humanoid ghost, this figure, this creature, this child, was hunched over and was absolutely mortified himself. And these grim reaper type ghosts came to take him away. And just like that, within seconds, they were all gone. I guess you can say that my cat didn't return. In fact, I think a demon actually returned, but I guess that's up for debate. Thanks for listening. After you read this experience, you might think I'm crazy or something, but believe me, it was the most terrifying night in my life, and it has taken me a lot of time to get over it. Before I moved out, about a year ago, I lived in a hundred year old house. It had two floors, and my family only lived on the top floor. We barely ever went into the basement, because the floors were all rock and there were no lights down there. One day, when I was about 15, I had a friend sleep over, and we thought it would be cool if we slept in the basement and told ghost stories. We gathered up our sleeping bags and our candles and went down to the basement. As soon as I entered the room we were going to sleep in, I immediately felt as if we were being watched, and I told my friend that I thought we should maybe sleep upstairs. She just told me to quit being a wimp and to set up my sleeping bag. As soon as we stayed up and talked and laughed, we never did tell ghost stories. I felt more comfortable and fell asleep easily. In the middle of the night, I remember this so clearly because this scared the crap out of me so bad and I'm absolutely positive I wasn't dreaming. I woke up to knocking coming from one side of the house and slowly getting louder and closer. And right when it was so near that it was shaking the ground, there was a big crash, and it went away. I sat up straight in my sleeping bag, and my whole body was trembling. After I calmed down a bit, a figure appeared at the foot of my sleeping bag, and I froze. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I couldn't do anything. The figure was of a man dressed in rags that were covered in coal. He stared at me as if he recognized me from somewhere, and then his eyes widened, and he exclaimed with a gasp, Mary Beth, Mary Beth, help me. He then disappeared with a flash of light. Apparently, my friend had woken up right when he disappeared and saw the flash of light. The next day I told my parents, and they said that they had felt a presence down in the basement earlier. I read up on the history of our house, and found out that the mistress of the house was named Mary Beth, and her picture resembled myself. One of her servants had been trapped in the basement, and tried to climb out of the coal chute without succeeding, and after being trapped for about three days, he died in an unexplained fire accident while in the basement. 
thank you for taking your time to read this. Hello, I have another ghost experience for you. In March of 1994, my husband, my oldest daughter and I, we visited Venice. We booked a room at the ancient Palacio. We were assigned a room on the second floor, overlooking a canal. The view was accessed by opening the heavy wooden shutters, which opened into the room. These had a metal rod, which fit into a U-shaped hook on the other window. Opening out were double windows, also heavy, with numerous panes of glass. This room had double beds, with a narrow walkway between them. About three times during our two days there, we would hear footsteps start from approximately the middle of the room and march smartly over to the windows, at which point the wooden shutters would fly open. We would track this phenomenon with our eyes, but saw nothing and felt no fear. The first time we rushed over to the windows to check them, these shutters were so heavy that it felt doubtful that a gust of wind was blowing them open. What's more interesting? is that the glass pane windows remained shut and seemed pretty airtight. The catch was not all that easy to work, either. My daughter, then 14, remembers having to struggle with it to open it. Even my oh-so-logical and mechanical husband looked over the shutters and could come up with no good explanation. The last night we were there, we retired for the night with my husband and I in one bed and my daughter in the other. She and I could hold hands in the space between the beds. They were so close together. Right after lights out, we heard the footsteps, this time walking out between the beds to where our heads were. We could hear breathing. We were both too scared to do anything, but we certainly compared notes the next morning. I wanted to ask as we were checking out if the place was haunted. But the only folks on duty that morning didn't speak English, and we don't speak Italian, but we'll never forget the place. About 10 years ago, when I still lived in Pennsylvania, a group of friends and I took a joyride out to the Quaker Cemetery just for a good night scare. It was a chilly, full moonlit November night, and there were six of us there. Five guys, and me, the only girl. It was the perfect setting for a ghost. Now, I don't know how many of your readers have ever been to this cemetery, but to describe the first time I saw the place, I screamed and just about curdled my boyfriend's blood. The crematorium scared me the most. I don't know, something about the way it looks and what it was used for. Anyway, Back to that night, two of the guys were acting like morons and jumping all over the place and around the markers inside the cemetery. I was angry at their pure disrespect for this old place, and so I tried telling them to stop, but of course, as excited as they were getting, they wouldn't listen. Me and this other guy were too chicken to go along with them, especially because of the way they were acting. They were bound to disturb and peace in the cemetery, so we stayed by the car. We kept hearing a fake bird call coming from the trees along the opposite side of the road, and then I started smelling the liliacs. The liliac scent somehow wasn't disturbing, even though it was November and none were blooming, and also, there weren't any fresh flowers placed on any of the very old graves. The fake bird call almost scared the life out of us because it just sounded so unnatural, and with each chirp, sounded closer and closer. We decided that we really needed to get out of there, so we both sat inside the car, waiting for the others. I got myself in such a worked up state, that when I found a quarter on the ground, I swore, in blood we trust, was written on it, rather than the usual in God we trust. My friend just laughed at me. The story that I'm about to relate to you took place when I was about 11 years old. I'm 17 now, and most people whom I've conversed with about this matter 
shrug it off as the hallucinations of a child. It was the fall of about 92 or 93, maybe before, maybe after, I do not honestly remember. I was living with my father here in Texas at the time, because my mother had hauled off to Arizona to take care of her father, who had succumbed to a stroke. My father and I had gone to my grandmother's house for dinner. My grandfather was out of town visiting relatives in another part of the state. My father, my grandmother, and myself were in the kitchen conversing about things that I can no longer recall. Because my memories of this occasion are starting to fade and jostle in my mind. My father told me to go wash my hand in the restroom as my grandmother had just finished making dinner and we are about to sit and eat. I walked out of the kitchen and into the dining room. As I looked in the general direction of the restroom, which was about 15 feet from where I was standing, I noticed two things immediately. The toilet was making strange noises, which isn't uncommon in houses, and there was what appeared to be a man in a shroud, standing in the restroom, with his hands under the faucet, staring at me. I don't remember exactly what my feeling was at the time, except for a bit of fear and a bit of awe at the supernatural. I'm a big reader, and around that time in my life, I was getting into ghost stories and other paranormal phenomena. I then walked back into the kitchen, and my father asked me if I'd washed my hands. Of course, being as frightened as I suppose I was, I told him that I had, and then I proceeded to eat my dinner. But the events of that night have never entirely left me. I had seen the man in the cloak on at least two other occasions since, but those stories are for a later time. Thanks for reading, and good night. This story was told to me by an ex-boyfriend, Mike, when we first started dating. We were still getting to know each other, so when he told me he was very afraid of spirits, I believed him because it's not the type of thing you'd say if you were trying to impress a girl. I asked him why, and this is what he told me. Mike's first encounter with ghosts was about 10 to 12 years ago, when he and his family, mom, dad, little brother George and Mike, were living in a house in the northwest side of Chicago. This particular house had an attic, which was used to store the items that came with the house when before Mike's family bought it. Nothing too unusual, mostly furniture and such. At this time, Mike was probably 15 years old, and his brother George was probably 9 years old. They were up in the attic one afternoon, goofing around, pretending to be acrobats and wrestlers. Eventually, they got tired, and George collapsed on the floor, while Mike sat in the old recliner that came with the house. The brothers continued talking, until their mother called from downstairs, announcing that dinner was ready. The boys had worked up an appetite, so they bolted out of the attic. Mike was the last one out, and as soon as he shut the door behind him, he remembered that he left the light on. Knowing his mother would be mad if he didn't turn it off, Mike opened the door to the attic, took one step in, and froze. The recliner that Mike had been sitting in was slowly turning towards him. Mike tried to command his body to run, but he was so scared he seemed rooted to the floor. The recliner turned enough so that Mike could see the form of a knee, and it was at that point that Mike got the strength to bolt out of the room and down to the kitchen. He told his parents what he saw, and of course they didn't believe him, but Mike refused to stay in the house any longer. He was so upset that his parents made arrangements for him to sleep at his aunt and uncle's house that night. Furthermore, this was the last time Mike ever stepped foot into the house. He stayed with his aunt and uncle until his family sold the house a few months later. Of course, his parents objected to his imposing on his relatives' hospitality, but they were too afraid to force him to come back, fearing he would have some sort of breakdown. The next house Mike's family moved into was still in Chicago, and not too far from the old house. 
Everything was going fine until one night, when Mike's family had friends over for dinner. After dinner, the adults and Mike sat around the island in the kitchen, having coffee and talking, while year old George played outside in the backyard with the guest's little boy, Sam. At one point, George opened the kitchen door and ran through the kitchen, past all the adults, and straight into an adjoining bathroom. Nobody thought anything of this until about 10 minutes later, when Mike's dad questioned why George was taking so long in the bathroom. Mike's dad knocked on the bathroom door, asking George if everything was all right. No answer. Mike's dad tried to open the door, but it was locked from the inside. Everyone started getting concerned until the kitchen door opened again and in came George and Sam. Mike's father asked George how he snuck back out of the bathroom without anyone seeing him. You see, there is no other way out of the bathroom. If George came out or even opened the door, he would have been seen. In order to get back outside, he would have had to go through the kitchen again. George swore up and down that he had not been to the bathroom at all. He was outside playing with Sam the whole entire time. Mike's father asked him again to explain about the locked bathroom door, but when they checked it again, it was not locked. There were other strange incidents that happened in the house, mostly to Mike, more than anyone else in the family. The last incident Mike told me about was something that happened to him a few months before we met, when he was about 22 years old. One night, as Mike was laying in bed, he woke up with an uneasy feeling. He was lying on his side facing the wall, and he felt as if someone was staring at him. It was the middle of the night, and pitch black in the room. Mike turned over and opened his eyes and saw a black figure standing next to his bed, staring down at him. Mike shut his eyes and screamed for his mother repeatedly. When she came storming in the room, Mike told her what had happened. It seemed as if such occurrence happened sporadically. Strangely enough, when Mike was getting to the point of forgetting them, seems as if the spooks recognize this and remind them of their presence every now and again. I was kind of skeptical when Mike told me the story, mainly because I was just getting to know him. I couldn't tell if he was a habitual liar or something. But the way he acted, and the way he told me the stories, was enough to make me wonder if he was a spook magnet. We only dated a couple of months, and maybe that was for the best. I might be younger than some of you, but I've had a lot of experiences. I'm 18 years old. About a week after my 10th birthday, my uncle had taken his own life inside my grandparents' house the one I'm currently living in now. After his death, I would refuse to go down into the basement where it happened. I would always hear unsettling noises, to the point in which I would feel so uncomfortable being in that home. The odd part is, it would only happen when everyone was in bed and I was home alone. As creepy as it was, I still had somewhat of morbid curiosity to go down there. Though of course, I could never bring myself to do it. There would be times I would hear very faint snarling and growling sounds. Other times, I would hear weeping. It was very disturbing. Then about six months after my uncle's death, my 17 year old cousin had died in a car wreck. One night, I was so upset over the deaths that I had stumbled down there without thinking about where I had went. I was so overcome with grief of emotions that I was bawling my eyes out. It got to the point where it was too much for me. I was sitting on the couch thinking about ending it all so I could be with them. Just when I was about to, I felt a hand on my shoulder and I knew instantly that it was my uncle. That moment made me realize that it was okay to continue on. That may have been a positive experience, but I assure you, it didn't get better in that basement, in that house moving forward. One evening, 
I was up in my bedroom. My parents were again fast asleep when I heard the disturbing wailing again coming from the basement. I have a vent in my room and it connects directly down to the basement. I could hear these cries coming from the vent. I listened closer through the vent and I could have sworn I heard my name being whispered. Like an idiot, I thought maybe my uncle had returned and wasn't feeling well. So I swallowed my pride and went down into the basement so I could at least tell him that everything would be okay. As I opened the basement door and looked down the steps, at the end of these steps, I saw a figure for a moment's time. It wasn't my uncle. In fact, it was a black misty shadow and it slowly evaporated. It seemed to be there for a few seconds, then it was gone within a blink of an eye. I then turned around, heard a distinct growl, then ran back up the rest of the steps and back into my room. Sometimes when I walk around the house, I can feel something watching and even following me. It's not always my uncle, but it definitely feels like something evil. It wasn't too long ago that me and my 21 year old cousin went to go see her dad. Now, this is the cousin that was in the wreck with the one that passed away. Jean, the 21 year old cousin, had told me that she had felt her sister's spirit with her before. While we were up late at night talking about her, we suddenly felt her presence with us. It was like she was sitting there and listening to us. Then, not too long ago, I was over at a friend's and was going to stay the night. We were in her room, talking about how she thought that maybe she had a ghost living in her house. Of course, I'm sitting there nodding my head. Then I felt something grab my necklace that I was wearing. So we got freaked out and ran to the living room and checked out my neck. Whatever had touched me left a great big red check mark on my neck. Then about 5 to 10 minutes later, it felt like something was grabbing my legs. I pulled up my pant legs and it had red marks all over my legs. So me and my friend decided to get out of the house and go bowling. Over at the bowling alley, the marks had turned white and disappeared. Well anyway, when we got back to our house, the marks returned and I kept feeling things grabbing me and following us occasionally. But the weird thing is, nothing was happening to her and she told me that nothing like this has ever happened to one of her friends before. I was beginning to think that this bad presence at my home was starting to attach itself to me. So we decided to go to bed. While we were laying there, it felt like someone had come up and sat down on the bed between us. So I looked over and no one was there. I haven't been over to my friends ever since. A friend sent me this and suggested that I tell my stories. So here's one of them that I hope you enjoy. I have more if you'd like to hear. I live in Clinton, Illinois, which is a small town. We have a lake and that's pretty much about it. One night, I was out joyriding in the cemetery with a friend, as I like to do from time to time, and I had to go to the restroom. So, I went to this access to area that is out in the country. I went to the restroom and then walked through the pavilion to look at the lake. I then came back to my car and then crawled into the driver's seat. I looked up and there was this little boy ducking behind a garbage can. He had red eyes that glowed like a demon's and teeth that were jagged and white. A black figure that looked like a medium sized dog was beside him and it was black. All that you could see was its red eyes. They both stared at us in the car and I felt fear overwhelm me. I quickly started the car and left. The next day I told my mom about it. She grew up in the area 
and she said that they often had Satan worshippers out there, and that rumors were that a little boy was drowned and used as a sacrifice many years ago. My aunt, she says that the little boy was evil and therefore was put to death in that spot. I've tried to research this, but there are no records of any murder of a child taking place in this area, but I will never go there again, night or day. This is just one of the countless stories that I have. I have some photos too. I don't know if you can use this, but if you can, feel free to. You may also edit if needed. Have you ever stayed at the Holiday Inn? You should, because this story is outrageous. In early of July 1999, I spent a work week there for a regional curriculum camp. I had originally been slated to share a room with other teachers on the first floor. However, the room was a smoking room, and the odor was causing my asthma to flare up, so I was transferred to a room on the fourth floor. Buggered if I can remember the room number. When I retired on Monday night, I had not heard yet of the ghost or any legends. I was awoken three times during the night by the phone ringing. I was really ticked because no one was ever there. I vowed to speak with someone at the front desk about it. In the morning I learned about Tanya, the ghost. We all laughed at the story thinking it was something to amuse tourists. Being WNY natives, we weren't going to be suckered by any such nonsense. I forgot to talk to anyone about the phone and decided not to bother. I fell asleep very quickly that night. I was awakened that night by the sensation that someone was staring at me from the left side of the bed. I have small children. My son often wakes me using the stare method. Now, I might have thought the ghost story was crap, but I wasn't going to test the theory by looking to see what was next to me. I said go away, I'm not going to look at you, I need my sleep. The sensation immediately left me, and I slept the rest of the night, quite peacefully. I awoke and went to my morning sessions without anything remarkable happening. However, I had to return to my room mid-morning to fetch some papers I needed for the next session. The curtains were open on the doors leading out to my balcony, which was not unusual. Housekeeping always opened the doors after cleaning. What was unusual was the number of small, sticky handprints all over the outside of the doors. These were no higher than my waist. I shook my head at the poor cleaning job. I was sure that the previous guests must have children with them and that the maid had failed to clean the prints off the glass. I wonder how hard it was to open the doors and give the glass a good cleaning and then I hustled off to make my session. As the day progressed, I heard more tales of Tanya, like how she throws the poolside chairs into the pool during the night, etc. We giggled amongst ourselves, like good campers should when hearing ghost stories. None of us was going to admit we believed any of it, especially when our principals were listening. So, I was half joking while I was in my room, getting ready for bed, and said out loud, Listen Tanya, I don't know how old you are, but I think you'll enjoy the books in the falls room. If you can read, you'll really like them, even if you can't. Lots of them are full of beautiful pictures that I bet you'll like to look at. Go there instead of bugging me. I slept like a log without any interruptions that night. When I went to breakfast the next morning, I told a colleague about my chat with Tanya. I mentioned that it must have worked because I had slept so well. I stopped talking when I saw my colleague's jaw drop and her face go white. I asked her what the matter was, and she took me over to the professor who was leading the sessions in the falls room. My colleague said to the professor, tell us what you found in the room this morning. I listened in stunned silence 
As the professor described what a mess the room was, books were thrown all over the place, the display table was in shambles, and her boxes of supplies had been unpacked and poorly repacked. In her own words, she said it looks like a kid went through everything and tried to put things back together, but couldn't manage. The professor had questioned the hotel staff about who had access to the room, and all swore that no one had been in the room after we had left, and that the door had been locked until the staff left the professor in the morning. I apologized when she finished and explained that it had probably caused the mess by inviting Tanya to go there. We all laughed uneasily at that. Some other teachers on the fourth floor admitted the strange things, like the ringing phone, no caller, and the sensation of being watched. Suddenly, we weren't so sure that the story was something just to amuse the tourists. Were the phone calls, staring sensations, sticky fingerprints, and trash conference room related? There could be logical explanations, like incorrectly routed calls, poor cleaning, and staff mischief. Maybe Tanya was drawn to all of us warm, female, motherly-like type teachers. No male teachers that I know of on that floor. And yes, all of us are moms too. One thing is for sure, I'm far less skeptical of the paranormal than I was before, and I will admit, even to my principal, that something odd happened in that hotel. If you really want to check out the paranormal, then you have to go to the Grand Island Holiday Inn. You can pretend you came here to see Niagara Falls. I've had many experiences with ghosts and hauntings, all beginning around age 3. I'm now 28, and my connection to ghosts and spirits has only grown stronger with time. I suppose I should start with my earliest haunting. I was around 10 years of age, my parents had just divorced, and I was feeling alone and angry. I don't like to sleep with my bedroom door open. When I did, I felt I was being watched. One summer night, the air was hot and humid, and I had no choice but to sleep with my door open to get a cool cross breeze. I remember waking up sometime around midnight or shortly thereafter feeling I was being watched. When I looked out my bedroom door, I saw a frightening sight. A figure with pure black skin, bright yellow eyes, and a cloak of red, white, and black hurricane-like design was staring at me, its hands on the door jamb, about to enter the threshold of my room. I screamed, saw its eyes widen in shock, possibly and flee down the hall adjacent to my room. I even saw its robes fluttering after it, as it fled. My scream woke my family, who searched the room for the thing, lack of a better word, but found nothing. All the doors were locked, no windows were broken. I shut my door, put up with the heat, and it hasn't returned since. I've been told that the creature was a demon. I also found out that I was depressed at the time, and that may have been drawing it to me. I can still feel its presence when I think about it. I feel very frightened just remembering the experience. Thank you for letting me share my experience here. I wanted to share my own personal experience with you regarding my beloved Nana. She passed away in 1984. I took her death very hard and would go to visit her grave often. After my now ex-husband and I married in 1998, I became pregnant within the year. Since I knew that my ex and I would not stay together for the long term, and since our marriage was so troubled, I found myself up at Nana's grave many times, sometimes just to talk to her and ask her to guide me and to watch over myself and the baby. The first time I went to see her grave, I hadn't been there for nearly two years at the time. I was pretty certain of what row her stone was in, but not completely sure. I asked her out loud to help me find her, and so help me God if I'm lying. I ended up parking directly in front of her row. 
I thanked her and walked over to her grave, placing a single rose on it and crying. I was about six months pregnant with my daughter at the time, and I was very certain that her love for us would get us through the rough months ahead. Shortly after our daughter was born, my ex-husband and I were having major problems, major fights. It was obvious to the both of us that we would eventually split up permanently. We separated when my daughter was three months old, and I moved into an apartment with my infant. Shortly after, I could feel my Nana's presence. I never saw anything. I always asked her not to appear to me, as she knew I would be afraid. But her presence was unmistakable, especially in my daughter's nursery. It never frightened me conversely. I felt very comforted and protected. As a new mother, I took many photos of my infant those first few months. I never noticed until a friend pointed it out to me that in one of them, which was a picture of the nursery, there is a vortex on the right, like a solid bar of white light, and to the left of that, an arch mist that almost looks like the shape of a rainbow, but you can see the wall right through it. Also, the picture of the room came out as if I had taken it from on the floor, or close to the floor, and pointed the camera up. I would have never taken a picture from that angle, and I know I didn't. I cried when I realized that the vortex and the light are my Nana watching over her great great granddaughter and me. I don't think it's a coincidence either that the photo is focused on the rocking chair and the mist is right across it. I should also mention that shortly after my Nana passed away in the 80s and my brother and I still lived at the home with my parents, that one night I was up reading in bed and walked out into the kitchen. My brother was sitting at the kitchen table, shaken and white as a sheet, almost crying. A second later, my mother walked out of her bedroom and she was crying. They both professed, at exactly the same moment, that they had seen Nana appear to them and tell them not to worry and that she was alright. I might add that their bedroom were on opposite sides of the house. My mother also had a separate incident where she saw my Nana at the end of her bed. She wasn't at all afraid, she was comforted. I still visit my Nana just to say hello and it comforts me to know that someday I'll meet her again. Until then, I guess I'll just be comforted by her presence and know that her ghost is still looming around. And no matter what, I'm always a fan of Nana. How can you not like Nana? She's amazing. I miss you, Nana, but I'll see you again. This incident occurred about 20 years ago in Michikawa, Indiana, when I was only nine. Our house was built in 1904, so I had the huge solid oak doors in trim. The living room was very long, with ceilings which are 12 feet high. I hope you got the idea of the architecture of this house. The basement was a full one, divided into two rooms, and this is where most of the presents seemed to be. I'll get to that later. Back to the house though. The master bedroom was downstairs, with this entrance being oak sliding doors. All of the fixtures were of the early 1900s also, so the living lights were hanging chandeliers, one at each end of the living room. The upstairs had three bedrooms, with a landing at the top with a banister guarding the stairs. The stairs were enclosed and curved, and this will be important in a minute. The house upstairs was not insulated well, so in the winter it was cold and in the summer hot. As a consequence, my two brothers and I slept on the pull-out couch downstairs. One night, my younger brother and I went upstairs to get ready for bed. And as we were going down the stairs, I looked back up due to the feeling something was there, and I saw an apparition coming towards us. I screamed and told my brother to look up. He did and saw the same, so we flew down the rest of the stairs and yelled at our parents to go look for the man. They did, and of course, nothing was there. Now, let me describe the ghost. 
She was not opaque. She was complete in his form. And he was dressed in Catholic's priest clothes. I noticed this because we are not Catholic. But my friend next door was. And I visited her church just down the road. I thought this was very peculiar. But what I thought was even more peculiar was the fact he was holding a gun and he pointed it directly at us, or so what I thought was a gun. Of course, my parents told us we were young and had very vivid imaginations, and it was nothing. Years later, however, my mother confessed that she knew the house was haunted, and also because when she was the only one home, she would hear something walking up the stairs and on the stairs. We always had German shepherds, and her dog would growl at the ceiling, it would never go in the basement. Now, on to the basement. I knew there was a presence here in the back room where the water heater was, because it was much colder, and felt wrong. It felt evil and bad, and didn't want anyone there, because it felt you, and you just had to leave immediately. I want to say that the upstairs didn't have this feeling to it, even though this is where we saw the man. I'm not sure of the history of this house, and soon after this incident, we moved to Florida on my dad's company transfer. I just want to give my opinion on this. After researching different types of hauntings, I feel that this was a replay of some kind, and I was a witness to it. I do feel that there might have been more than one presence, because the evil in the basement was different than the other, and the one in the basement didn't want anyone there. He did other things to give us this feeling. Mostly, the noises were harmless and no bother to us, but it was the basement that we avoided for whatever reason. I would love to hear what you all think of this and the type of haunting you feel it is. I used to spend a lot of nights driving around in my youth. I was young and reckless and had no clear direction in life so I'd often find myself aimlessly driving, late at night. I'd spent a majority of my adolescent years dependent on drugs, and unfortunately, almost succumbed to an overdose. I was harming others, but most importantly, I was on a path to self-destruction. The night before my overdose, I had a creepy paranormal experience that, fortunately for me and those around me, changed my entire life for the better. It was another one of those late night drives. I'd gotten into a verbal altercation with my parents. Words that weren't meant to be said were exchanged, and I ended up running away from home. I took the keys and headed out driving for hours until I ended up in an unfamiliar town. I was starting to get a little exhausted, was six hours away from home, and was running low on gas. What happened next will always be embedded into my subconscious for the rest of my life. I pulled up to a gas station in the middle of nowhere. Now, like I said, this area was completely isolated from the rest of the world. It had a last house on the left kind of feel. Until I ended up at the gas station, I'd driven past miles and miles of just cornfields and farmland, woods all around, nobody in sight. I ended up walking to the gas station and bought myself a pack of cigarettes from the station attendant. He noticed I looked a little confused and asked if I was lost. I said yeah, I was. This was before GPS and cell phones and I didn't have a map with me. He told me there was a bridge in the distance that was visible from the gas station less than a mile or so away, but said if I crossed it, I could pass another town nearby and find a highway that could take me back home. I thanked him, pulled my gas, and went driving towards the bridge. As I started to make my way through this road, and on my way through the bridge, rain started to pour down, and I could barely see through my windshield. It had rained so much that it almost obscured my vision, and there was no source of light anywhere along the dirt road I was traveling on, except for my headlights. A guy at the gas station told me the bridge was very close by. And even though I could see it in the distance before it started raining hard, it felt like it had been forever before I could see it. Just then, I finally came across the bridge, despite the downpour. 
This is the part that really startled me. I was driving across the bridge, absolutely nobody in sight, no other cars. It was late at night, 3 a.m., and nothing but trees and bushes scattered around the bridge. I kept driving across this long bridge, and that's when my headlights shined onto this small child who suddenly appeared within my field of vision. All I could remember was that his eyes were glowing, almost like an animal in the night. I was unable to stop in time, and I thought I had hit him. I immediately panicked, stopped the car in the pouring rain, got out to check to see if he was okay, and the kid was nowhere to be found. It confused the hell out of me, because again, what kid would be playing around in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, and in the pouring rain? I didn't even hear a thud, or any noise besides the sound of the rain falling down on my car. At the moment of impact, I looked under the car. It was as if this child didn't even exist. I remember distinctly that the boy was wearing overalls and a hat. It looked like a completely real boy. There was no mistaking that this was a human. Now, I mentioned my recklessness and drug abuse because this incident caused me to turn my life completely around. I was so worried that I accidentally hit a child and it may have ran off into the woods that it made me swear to always be alert and never fight with my parents again. This happened when my brother was around 5 years old. It was around 2 a.m. and he went into my parents' room to get in bed with my mom. My mom's bed was right by one of the bathroom doors. The door on the other end of the bathroom led to where the back door was and the stairs to the basement. He got in bed and was facing the bathroom. He got scared and woke up my mom and asked who the little girl in the bathroom was. He said he had never seen her before. He told my mom that she was just standing there, staring at him. My mom said the way he was talking, like there was really someone there, it really scared her. She said she just rolled over and shut her eyes. She was too scared to even look. I don't think a five year old imagines things like that. While we were in the same house, my mom's cousin was hunting in the mountains and accidentally fell on his gun and killed himself. The family thinks he came back to say bye because it was such a sudden death. A few days after he died, when we were all in bed, a light in the hallway bathroom would click on and off. It was an older house, so the switch made a really loud click when he turned it on and off. My mom would be sitting on the couch late at night, with her back facing the hallway. You can sometimes feel when someone is behind you, and she said she heard me breathing hard and walking up the hallway. She called my name and turned around, and no one was there. At the same time, at her cousin's parents' and sister's house, similar things were happening. His old toys from when he was younger were stored in the basement of his parents' house. One night his electric train turned on, and was going around the track. No one knew this was happening to other family members, until my mom called his parents and told them what was happening to her. The next day they went somewhere and tried to contact them. They all said they loved him and it was time for him to move on. They think he was trying to contact the family because he died suddenly. After they talked to him, everything stopped. The following happened back in July 1995. Me and a friend traveled around the UK by train. It was about 4 p.m., then we checked in at a bed and breakfast in Manchester. All double room was occupied, so we got the two single rooms, which was located next to each other. We were quite tired after a long day trip by train, so we rest for a moment. Later we went out to eat something, had a beer in the hotel bar, and then headed up to the rooms for sleeping. The time was about 11 p.m. I closed the Venican blind, turned off the light, and almost immediately fell asleep. The room was pitch dark. Then, after about two hours I woke up 
and found the room bathed in light. The light almost blinded me. I had a strong emotion to walk towards the window, just like I was enforced to do so, and then I went up. I heard voices and music, like old folklore or something. The voices was only like a murmur, so I actually couldn't hear what it says. It was like being in a full up restaurant or a pub or something. I was not actually scared, but it was an easy and confusing experience. Huh. I reached the window and opened the Venetian blind. Everything turned to normal again, quiet and pitch dark. I went back to bed again, and to my surprise, I fell asleep after only about 10 minutes. The morning after, we met up and headed down the stairs for breakfast. Afraid of being regarded as a fool or jackass, I told him it was only a dream. Then. I almost dropped my coffee pot when he told me that the exact same thing happened to him. He has always been quite skeptical to the paranormal things, but I think this experience has changed his mind a bit. I would be very glad if you could give me your opinion. I have apprehension about what really happened that night. I know I was fully awakened, and it can't be my imagination, because the same thing happened to him. As I said in a previous mail, I'm not so good with English, so I hope you understand me. You may publish my story if you want, but you better circumscribe it before. Hi there, my name's Joe. My friend Colin probably wrote you recently about some recent activity. For the past I don't know how many years, I've been able to feel, and to an extent see ghosts. I can sense what they are feeling and what their intentions are. However, for about three years, my friend Colin started having sleeping problems. I already knew his house was haunted, but what was haunting it was the spirit of what I think is a five-year-old child. For Christmas the year before, a friend of ours that lived in Thailand sent us all gifts. However. Colin was the one that received a house that she would leave tokens and gifts in to help ward off evil spirits. Over time, it stopped doing that. Trapped in the house was some kind of creature, like a demon. It was huge, dark, and very menacing. I still don't know how to use all of my abilities very well, but at the time, I sure as hell didn't, but I attempted this anyway. We attempted to destroy the house and everything in it. It took 45 minutes just to get it to catch fire. During this 45 minutes, I was attempting to immobilize the creature inside the house. After 45 minutes, I was able to trap it by pure luck. After I trapped it, I was able to see what was being stored in the house. It was a large field, fire everywhere, dead bodies on fire blood everywhere. It reminded me of what hell would look like when described to you as a child. After that I was drained. I couldn't do much of anything. I thought I lost all my abilities, but after two months they started coming back, very slowly. I knew this only because I was able to see the ghost in Colin's house again. While I was living in Korea, I encountered a few spirits, but they were by chance and left over from the war. That was when I knew my abilities were back to full, but I wanted to learn how to better use them, and I'm not having any luck. Well, to end the story on a bad note, last week my friend Jess asked about any ghost encounter any of us have had, so Colin and I talked about this one. So Jess got curious, and wanted to see where it happened. Reluctantly, we took him there. Surprisingly enough, Development has been going on in the area for the last five years, but at the spot where we destroyed the house, nothing is built. We went to the spot, and I was able to feel it out from residue from when we first destroyed it, but after a few minutes, it wasn't just that. The feeling I was getting became stronger until it made me sick. I almost passed out, and I doubled over dry heaving. It turns out it was still trapped there until that night, somehow, it got loose. 
I don't know how or why, but now I have to get rid of it for good, and I don't know how. In 1989, I moved into a government apartment in a small town containing seven units. The last apartment was occupied by a single mom with a small child and her boyfriend. The previous year, they, man and woman, were murdered and shot to death in their bed, in their first bedroom by the woman's estranged ex. No one wanted to move into the apartment because of the history surrounding the apartment. I was a young mother and had two children and needed a place to live and thought nothing of this. In time, I was told of the strange happenings of the place and chalked it up to superstition or small-minded people with too much time on their hands. Things were pretty quiet for me and my little ones for the first few months. Then small things started to occur. Light over the sink area in my kitchen will mysteriously come on in the middle of the night. Being the only adult in the house, and the only person who would actually reach the switch, this had me worried that I had electrical short or something and promptly had it checked out. Nothing. Perfectly normal. Kitchen cabinet doors would be halfway open in the mornings when I awoke. I scolded my oldest daughter, seven years at the time for climbing the counters and getting snacks out and she told me that she was asleep and she didn't do it. My youngest daughter, two years old at the time, was starting to make a habit of getting up in the middle of the night and getting into bed with me. Very unusual for her, she's a hard sleeper. At one point, I was having trouble sleeping, so much so to the point I went to a doctor and got sleeping medication, all to no avail. I always woke up at 3 a.m. and had a difficult time getting back to sleep. Nothing worked until I rearranged my bedroom furniture and moved my bed from one end of the room to the other. Once while my oldest daughter was visiting her grandmother overnight, myself and my youngest daughter decided to take a bubble bath together in the late evening. While we are in the tub, I heard jingle bells rattling around in the cup on a shelf not five feet from me. All of my windows were closed and no one else was in the house. Couldn't explain it at the time. After three years, I chose to move in with a man to a better neighborhood. My landlord chose that time to tell me the complete history of my apartment. He showed me the newspaper articles on what happened and after reading all of them, I understood all. The ex climbed through the bathroom window and shot them both dead at 3 a.m. and took the child, which was sleeping between the two. Her bed was in the exact position as I had my bed when I couldn't sleep. The mom was a stay-at-home mom and was always in the kitchen fixing stuff for her little child, making homemade cookies, snacks, and such. She always left the kitchen sink light on for her boyfriend when he came in late at night. My daughter always getting into my bed late at night was quickly understood by me. The other bedroom was never used by the child. She always slept with her mother and the boyfriend. No other tenants have reported any activity in this unit. Of course, they didn't have a smaller female children either. Time will tell if this ghost will ever find peace or her final rest. Before moving out, Last night there, I made my peace with her and told her I understood why she did the things she did. I understand she wasn't trying to scare me or my little girls, and I wished her peace. One afternoon of 1995 or 96, I was dusting our bedroom, the master bedroom, in our apartment. Right beside our bedroom was a small hallway leading up to the bathroom into the other bedroom. I remember being in a very good mood. I'd been doing a few changes in the decoration of the bedroom and was now dusting. I was happy with the results and as I was dusting, I was talking about the changes with my husband or what I thought was my husband standing in the hallway, all smiling 
and happy. I started to tell him, or what I thought was him. Hey Frankie, look at what I've just done. Isn't that nice? I advanced in the hallway to bring him in the bedroom, and as I neared him, he disappeared. I nearly jumped. Now, as I was dusting, I happened to turn my head towards the hallway, which was on my right, and there stood a man who very much looked like my husband and who was dressed in modern clothes, a short and a t-shirt. When I saw him, I was sure he was my husband. That is when I started talking to him, and as I was cheerily and happily explaining the changes to him, he had this most beautiful smile of encouragement. He seemed to be happy for me. What a surprise when I realized that I had been speaking to someone or something else than my husband, and when I saw it, it disappeared. It is when this being disappeared that I realized that my husband was lying on the couch and watching TV. He was very surprised when I told him what happened. I live in Australia, and I've been seeing spirits ever since I was about two years old. My first experience was just after my grandmother's death. I was visiting her grave for the first time, and then all of a sudden, I started hearing voices. They were telling me to leave, that it was too dangerous for them and me if I stayed that I had to run and never turn around. It is weird that I remember it, although my memory is not as clear as my mother's, but I remember most of the details. I know that this is pretty hard to believe, but I give you my word it is true. Although I think about it now and realize that I wasn't scared, at the time I knew that I had to leave, so I told my mom and dad, and we left. My dad didn't believe me, but my mom did. Since then, I've had many experiences with spirits, all of which have been good, except for one. This happened when I was 15. I had been roped into a swimming carnival, and I can't swim too good, so I was practicing in my pool. The pool is down the very back, and you can't see the house from the pool, as it is behind a shed. I've often seen spirits down the back, but it has never worried me. It was getting late, and I've been swimming for a while, so stop for a break. Whilst I was standing in the middle of the pool, I seen a baby sitting on the fence that surrounds the pool. I tried to look away, but I was in a trance. I finally stopped looking at it, but it was good, as I was suddenly dragged under the water. I struggled for about two minutes before it would let go. When it finally did, I ran inside. I told my mom, and she never believed me, but I've never been down there on my own ever since. My name is Evan, and my friend's name is Scott. We're making a trip to North Carolina for a concert in August of 1996. After the concert, we drove for a long while finally making it to South Carolina, and were in need of a place to camp, as it was getting pretty late. We found the King's Mountain State Park entrance, but being almost 2 a.m., the gates was locked. We both got out of the VW camper to see if we could get the gate open. The road was completely deserted, and being at the entrance, we were not even close to any campsite. With the headlights of the camper as our only source of light, a woman appeared out of nowhere. She had dark hair, thin white dress, and was barefoot. She asked us if we were with the wedding party, and we replied that we were not. As quickly as she appeared, she was gone. Scott and I thought it was kind of weird. No evidence of another car on the road, and the fact that she was barefoot in the middle of nowhere at 2 a.m. in the morning. Entertaining the thought that we may have had an encounter with a ghost, we forgot about it. Recently, I was reminded of the incident and thought I'd surf the web to see if there was documentation of some similar experience when I found your site. I was blown away when I found an entry for Kings Mountain State Park. 
and the woman in the white dress. The entry said that she was murdered by the clan for marrying a black man. I wonder if they were married right before the murder, and that's why she asked us if we were the wedding party. When I was nine years old, we moved to a house in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. My mom had just gotten remarried, so I now had a stepfather, whom I absolutely despised. About a year or so later, my dad started renovations on the house. We added almost half a house on. There was a three season porch, a mudroom, a bathroom, and two basement bedrooms. My sister moved out of her bedroom to the new one in the basement. A few days later, I was in my bed. My bed faced the wall by the door, but I couldn't look out down the hall. I had only been in bed for a few minutes. I looked up because it felt as someone was in the room with me. That's when I thought there was my stepfather standing at the foot of my bed. He was wearing what appeared to be a hooded trench coat and appeared as a dark silhouette. Looking back, it didn't really initially terrify me because I just thought it was my stepfather playing tricks on me as I said. Boy, was I terrified. I yelled, Ken, get out of here. Suddenly, my mom, who was in her bed at the end of the hall, yelled back at me that he was asleep in the bed next to her. Suddenly, the figure disappeared. I ran as fast as possible into her bedroom. There was my stepdad, sound asleep and snoring right next to her. I told her what I saw and she just told me to go back to bed. The next morning, at the breakfast table, I started telling everyone. My oldest brother described the man in the hood. He also said he'd seen the man in his bedroom at the foot of his bed. His bedroom was in the basement, located right under my parents' room. He also thought it was our stepdad, until it vanished. He just thought he was hallucinating or something. It didn't tell anyone. Honestly, now, I really wish it was my dad. Hi, I'm a 21 year old student in Chicago, Illinois. I'd like to tell you my story and if possible, ask for your professional opinion about a few things. I've experienced spiritual and ghostly activity for about 11 years now. I used to be frightened by these experiences, but now I'm quite intrigued. However, one incident stands out in my mind and still bothers me to this day. This is the story that I would like to tell you about. About five years ago, I lived in an apartment on the second floor. It was an unusually warm summer's night, so I decided to sleep on the couch with the sliding door open to let in the breeze. I woke at about 2.30 a.m. to a horrid stench and a strange coolness. Confused, I looked around the living room. I looked then, and directly in front of myself, and I was lying on my right side with my right arm tucked under my head as a pillow, and I saw a figure. I was frozen with fright as my eyes began to adjust to the darkness, and I saw the figure's face. At this point, I was thinking that someone broke into the apartment. However, this was no person. This ghost had a human-shaped face, but it was a grayish-white color. Its eyes were darkened, and what I remember the most was the huge prominent cheekbones. Furthermore, this thing only had a torso and a head, nothing else. Suddenly, with great quickness, its head descended, positioned its face directly in front of mine, stared at me for a moment, and as quickly as it descended, it pulled its head back to the original position. I began crying at this moment, and that's when I felt a sort of punch on my chest. It then seemed to kind of run off into the kitchen. And then I heard the door slam. 
I jump from off the couch, turn the lights on, and check the door out. The door was locked from the inside, so there was no possible way that someone had broken into the apartment and left through the kitchen door. To say the least, I was badly shaken. I took a moment to collect myself. When I realized my chest hurt, I went to the bathroom and pulled down my pajama top slightly, which revealed a large red mark as if someone had punched me. This mark eventually developed into slight bruising as the morning came. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. Since this event, several other experiences have occurred, none as frightening as this, thank goodness. However, a cluster of events did occur directly after this experience. For what reason, I'm not sure. I did go to the library and search for possible causes for such an occurrence. The closest I got to a logical answer was something called a night terror, which I'm sure you are familiar with. But I've excluded this as a possible explanation for many reasons. The only thing I can think of is that I had seen a ghostly entity as to why there was a stench or a cold chill associated with the experience, I can only guess. Also, I've always been under the impression that spirits cannot harm the living, but I simply cannot believe this to be true anymore. And this is an experience that I had when I was younger. It's a little short, it remains my creepiest ghost story I've ever had. I had to have been 8 or 9 years old when it happened, and yes, it sounds a little corny, but it was truly an unforgettable and authentic experience. It happened to be dark and dreary on this night, it had been raining really hard, and I had no choice but to walk through the rain. The rain just kept pouring down, and all I could think about was how miserable I was from the rain, and just wanted to get to my friend's house faster. I think it was around 10 p.m. and I was walking through the neighborhood park to my friend's house on the other side when all of a sudden I saw my dead grandmother appear from out of nowhere. Oddly enough, it was a year to the day of her death from cancer. She just looked as she did before she got sick though. She looked wonderful. Of course, I wasn't sure if it was really her, so I walked up to her and called out her name. The wind became harsher and the rain fell harder and as she reached out to me, I could see she was in pain. It was at that very moment that her face changed and she became scared and looked as though she needed my help and it was then that she disappeared. I had to have been three to five feet away. Needless to say, I ran as fast as I could to my friend's house and didn't say another word that very night. I was sent to live with my grandparents when I was three years old. I loved my grandpa with all my heart, and he and I became very close because he could not work due to a serious heart condition. We took wonderful care of each other. Even at the age of five, I've always been very responsible due to my grandfather's ill health. One day, when I was nine, my grandma kept me home from school to look after grandpa because he was not feeling well. About 9.30 that morning, he went to lay down because he said he did not feel well. I went in about 10.30 to take his temperature and discover his fever to be 103.4. I rushed and called my grandma and mother immediately. In turn, my mother said she was going to call an ambulance so I was to get grandpa ready and wait for them. As I did this, my grandpa called me into his room and told me, Pumpkin, I love you very much and you know this. Even though you are young and in time will forget different things about me, just always remember my love and the way you feel. I promise you this, I'll always be there with you and you'll always be in my heart. I will always remember him saying this because that was the last conversation he ever had. I never got to say goodbye because he fell into a deep coma and they wouldn't allow me into ICU to say goodbye. 
She then died on May 26, 1983, at 5.36 a.m. I know this for a fact, because he had given me his watch to hold on to while he was in the hospital, and it stopped at that very second that they pronounced his death. Now, while that is odd enough, the best part is yet to come. Three weeks after my grandpa had passed away, my grandmother became very ill and was put into the hospital, so my sister, brother-in-law and myself stayed out at my grandma's house. My sister had a cat that whenever someone came down the stairs, it would run to the basement door and cling to the screen to be let out, while one night, at about 11.30pm, the cat was sleeping with me on the couch in the basement when it jumped down and ran to the door to cling onto the screen. When all of a sudden, we heard footsteps. Now, the house is locked, my grandmother is in the hospital, and we are all in bed, downstairs. My brother-in-law grabs his baseball bat and tells us to call 911. At first I was very scared and was crying. And then they went upstairs, the footsteps stopped, and all of a sudden, my grandpa was standing in front of me holding the note I had put in his pocket the day of the funeral. He had a tear in his eye and told me not audibly, but I could see his lips move, that he loved me and would always be there with me. Ever since then, any major life event, graduation, marriage, the birth of my two children, anything, I felt this love at one time or another and have felt a huge sense of calmness. I guess this would be a second account of a previously encountered ghost story. I had the same thing happen to me as in the story below on Denton Road, Ypsilanti, Denton Road Bridge. The story goes that a group of kids were playing chicken near Denton Road Bridge and one of them proved to be chicken. His car swerved off the road when they reached the bridge and they crashed into the river below. Many people claim to see a light come out of the river and chase their vehicle to the end of the road if they stop at the center of the bridge at night. I'm a racer and have a very fast, very built up 1969 Dodge. One stopped on this bridge simply because we were lost and a pair of headlights came up the embankment and behind me and started coming up on me very fast. I thought some drunken redneck was out four wheeling was going to rear end me. The car was in gear and running, so I simply stepped on the gas and the headlights behind me pulled up within a few feet of my rear bumper. I floored it and the lights stayed right on my bumper. Couldn't see a thing behind me because the brights were on the car following me and they were far brighter than any car I'd ever seen. I had the speedometer buried past 120 miles per hour and they were two feet off my bumper. I remember the red glare of the brake lights lighting up the road behind me some, and the moon was very bright that night, so I could see the way to the bridge practically, and there was not a car on the road. I was a little stunned, and almost lost the car at the turn. We went back to make sure that no one behind us had got into the ditch, when there was nothing. And then I got freaked, and made it back to Windsor in record time. I don't know how to start this, other than saying several years ago, when my children were small, we moved down to the country on the Washington side and lived in a home that I feel has some strange paranormal or ghostly things going on in it. I would have to say that during that time, there was something in there causing all havoc in our home. To make it short, I used to on a regular basis have something come to me, and I'm not sure what, but let me explain what it looked like. I would wake up from a sleep most of the time, but sometimes I was fully awake in bed when it would happen, but for the most part, I would wake up from a sound sleep and notice this lavender colored smoke, or whatever you want to call it, coming from the corner where my closet was, and it would do different things at different times. It would wrap around my perimeter of my room, and then go to the end of my bed, and separate into five different lines, and then dart at me 
and then would go away. Sometimes it would wrap around the room, and then come down from above, into five different lines. The first few times that this happened to me, I was very frightened, and would wake my husband up, and of course by the time I could wake him up, there was nothing there. He slept very hard. This went on for a whole seven years that we lived in this home. During that time, my husband also became very mean and violent. Also, in the room adjoining where my closet and my son's closet connect, my son was having these horrific nightmares that we could not wake him up from. We would sit there for sometimes 20 to 30 minutes, trying to wake him up, and he would be begging for his mother or his father, and crying out, asking them to go away and leave him alone. He would describe them as ugly and short, very ugly and mean looking in the face, and they would torment him and scare him and try to hurt him. This was heart wrenching for me to see him go through this and not be able to wake him up. I would cry right alongside of him when I was holding him, rocking him, trying to wake him up from these nightmares. All of my children used to tell me that in the house, they would see a ball of light sometimes that would move quickly through the home. I saw that occasionally as well. Our television was something quite interesting as well. It would turn off by itself while we were watching it, and then it would turn back on with the remote, and then it would turn back off again. We could play this game for a few minutes, and then it would stop. This only happened a couple of times through the TV. I do feel that there was something evil in that home, because many things went on in that home. What the lavender colored smoke was, or the ball of light, or even my son's terrifying dreams were, I have no clue. I don't have a great deal about that kind of stuff. I do feel that I have many experiences though, and had some in other homes as well. Who knows, maybe they follow me, but the home in Washington was not a good ghost, if that is what it was. Her family went through some of our hardest times in that home. Can you tell me what the lavender smoke was, or what the ball of light was? I would be very interested in knowing. You could respond to me. Thanks so much. I'm from the Southern California area, so here's how it goes. I was born in the Los Angeles area, but my parents bought a brand new home in the Orange County area. The city of La Palma, to be exact. The house was located on some ranch of some sort because our backyard faced a very large open but fenced field with some cattle roaming around in it. Mind you, these are track homes as we know it today, and at the time, it seemed like we were living in the boondocks. I mean, looking back at it now, it was a rather very lonely area, but it all had these new track homes. You know, one supermarket, one library, one hospital, fire station, and police station. You get the idea, what the funny thing was, we were only four blocks west of Knott's Berry Farm. That is, if you stand at the main entrance, as you get closer to the park. Anyway, the house was well built, new carpet, plumbing, the whole works with upgrades, but on some occasions, I was very scared downstairs in the family room. I was even scared in my own bedroom. I mean, my room looked like a toy room display so there was no reason for me to get scared just out of the blue. I mean I was playing in my room and it seemed as if evil walked in the room. I got this incredible feeling of hate towards me as if I shouldn't have been there. It was happened to me several times in the house and at seven years of age I didn't know anything about the supernatural or paranormal activity. Another occasion was during a Saturday afternoon. My mother and I were upstairs and suddenly, we heard this slamming and crashing noise, and as we came down the stairs, we saw in the living room, my mom's favorite painting, smashed on the floor. It looked as if someone broke it in anger. I mean, the frame was just trashed, and the small pictures around the one that got smashed were perfectly hanging straight. The ghost made itself seen again in the late afternoon. This time, my mom was doing some house cleaning, and as she turned to one side, 
she looked up towards the stairs and she saw a man wearing a white cream colored suit in pristine condition, except he didn't have a head. No Hollywood genre or anything like that. I saw the same thing myself. This time, I saw him at night, at the end of the hallway. This was very real, and very scary. Another time, as I would sleep at night, the beds were occasionally kicked very hard. Also in the master bedroom, the sliding glass mirror doors were slamming back and forth, and the dresser drawers were also slamming in and out as well. All these things would happen separately from each other on different occasions. The main boulevard is La Palma Avenue, and the street of the house is Comstock Circle. We lived there from 1970 to 1975, my parents and I. And that is the most scary and terrifying ghost story I have. Thanks for listening. I had recently sent a story about my grandfather visiting me about a week after his death. Well, that was one of the more comforting things that has happened to me. The next story I'm about to submit actually happened as a dream, but to this day, I feel a very strong connection with it. It all happened about six years ago. A 10 year old girl mysteriously vanished from a sleepover at her friend's house. I never met this girl, and although we only shared the same first name, I had several odd dreams about her after her disappearance. One day, about one week after the child turned up missing, I woke up early one morning to go to work. It wasn't like any day though. I woke up feeling very sad and upset. I didn't have any idea why I was feeling like this, but something just wasn't right. So I continued to get ready for work. When I got there, I still had this bizarre feeling that something big was about to unfold. About an hour into my long work day, I forgot about the feeling and went on with my day. A woman I work with came into work about an hour later and then asked me, did you hear they found the missing girl? All of a sudden this feeling came back. I said yes. They found her in a dumpster wearing her blue nightgown. She replied. Then did you hear? I then started to cry uncontrollably and said no. She, the young girl, came to me in my dreams and showed me where she was and told me that I no longer had to play with her because it was time to move on and now she could rest in peace. The woman just looked at me in disbelief and really didn't know what to say, and neither did I. I then realized this poor young soul felt compelled to have someone to be with her. Why she chose me, I will never know. Again, we did share the same first name, but other than that, I cannot explain what happened. Most people I tell this story to have a tendency of just looking at me with an odd expression on their face, but I too believe that it was all just more than a dream. I've never seen any ghosts or had any sort of experiences with the supernatural, but my friend Amber has. She was friends with this guy named Seth, whose mother was my high school coach. She was telling me about this house Seth's parents bought in Monticello, Florida, about 45 minutes away from where we live. It was a real old house with lots of land around it. This house is a weekend house for Seth's family. One day, Amber was invited to spend the weekend with them. She told me that on the way up there, they tried to warn her not to get scared because there were ghosts there. She thought they were pulling her leg and was laughing and playing along. When they got there, Amber was impressed with a two-story wooden house. It was built in some old style from the 1800s, apparently. She walked upstairs to a room for the weekend and was given a tour of the house. Upon entering one room, she smelled something sour and bitter. It was right beneath the attic. She couldn't describe it to me but let me know it wasn't pleasant. Then, she was led to the attic 
supposedly the most haunted room. There were old rusted chains and shackles attached to the walls. A long time ago, a slave owner owned this home. The slaves would be punished by whipping and being shackled in the attic with no food and water for several days. Amber said she had no eerie feeling and didn't see anything out of ordinary. Later on that night, Seth and Amber were staying up late and playing games. They dared each other to go up to the attic, knowing the stories behind the deaths of slaves in the attics. When they went up the stairs and turned on the lights, they smelled that sour and metallic smell and saw dark stains on the floor that wasn't there previously. Amber said she had never been so scared in her entire life. She thought her heart was going to stop beating because it was beating so fast and hard. She and Seth went downstairs, wasting no time at all. Amber couldn't sleep at night because she was certain she could hear the groans and cracking. The next day, Amber came straight home and refused to come back to the house again. I talked later on with Seth's mother, my high school coach, and she said it was true. She gave more stories about how she'd find things moving or missing, how she smelled cigar smoke when no one smoked. She told me how she would come home at night and all the lights would be on in the house. She told me she had not seen any ghosts or even felt threatened. She actually thought of them as her friends because they would turn on the lights for her at night when she came home. I wouldn't be able to stand it. Weird, huh? It makes me leery of my own house, even though my parents originally built it. I have a few experiences. In 1976, I was living in an old building, and every night, I would hear footsteps, heavy ones, walking on the floor above me. I then asked the apartment manager, who lived upstairs, and learned that no one did, and there was a crawl space. He checked it, and no one was there. So on a weekend when I knew no one was in the building except myself, I decided that if I heard the footsteps again, I would not be scared. Then the footsteps began pacing all night. I kept my wits and made plans to leave. I left the building. Second experience, about 1985. I was at work early one day, 9th and Market, and was going into the bathroom. A woman went in before me, not less than one foot in front of me. And so when I walked into the bathroom, no one was there, and I looked under all the stalls, and still, no one. Yet there was one way into the bathroom, and the same way out. The woman just looked like a solid body. The same thing happened once again late one evening, when I was going into the bathroom, and I just rushed in just behind her, to see her, and when I got in two seconds later, no one, not even in any of the stalls. Later I learned that the cleaning staff in the building saw the same thing. They saw the woman enter the bathroom and they waited for the woman to leave the bathroom, but no one left and when they went in to find her, she was not there. In 1977, a friend committed suicide. All that weekend that she had died, I was depressed and could not shake the feeling. Then on Monday, I went to my university library, and as I sat there trying to read late in the morning, I hear that someone yelled in my ear, except it penetrated my body, that Holly committed suicide. I jumped and looked around, but people were quiet, and no one was saying anything, and I thought, where did I hear that, and I must be thinking negatively. I became uncomfortable and left the library to shop. When I returned at about 6 p.m. to read, a woman came up to me and said, We're looking for you this morning. We're talking about you and wanted to tell you that Holly committed suicide. I said, So this is true what I heard. I was told to call Holly's husband and he verified it and said he searched for me the whole entire weekend. The next day, a strange thing happened. In my grief, I meandered my way to work in a different direction, passing a funeral home where I noticed a coffin in a hearse 
and my heart and love went out to it. Then, after I got to work, I checked the obituaries for the funeral home where Holly was. It was the same place I passed that very morning, and so I invited a friend to come with me to pay my last respects to Holly at noon. I met my friend at the funeral home, and we were told that Holly had been sent out that morning for cremation. She had been the only one sent out, and she was in that coffin in the morning in the hearse that I passed on my way to work earlier. In 1982, when my father died, I woke earlier in the morning and was calm. Then my mother called to tell me he died. Everyone in my family woke up, and my mother got out of bed, sat by the phone, then it rang and she got the word. At this time, I could hear people cry. Only the sound came from their body and not their mouth. My brother was in a deep grief and not crying out loud, but I could hear his spirit cry and he just had a sad look. In 1992, my mother was very ill and in a rehab center. I did not like staying in her house because they thought it was haunted. On this particular morning, it was 5 a.m., and I was typing and printing a letter on the computer. I typed most of the letter, got up and stuck a mug of water in the microwave, and set it for one minute. Also, I prepared a plastic cone with filter and coffee in it, then I rushed back to the computer to print the letter. I added a few lines to the letter, and then began to hear the microwave beep and beep. I ignored it, then the beeping stopped. I got this creepy feeling, but I ignored it, and then I thought the microwave had a timer, and so the beeping stopped because of the timing, not because anyone opened the microwave door. I printed the letter, ran to the kitchen to get the mug of water out of the microwave, and poured in the cone. I found instead that the mug had been taken out of the microwave, and the coffee was made, waiting for me on the ledge of the kitchen counter. Yet I know I did not get up from the computer to make it, because I made a conscious decision to ignore the microwave and finish my letter. My mind worked over time to figure it out. I grabbed the letter and left the house that morning and told whatever did that it was taking the coffee I didn't really appreciate it. Other things happened, like the rustling of papers when I was trying to sleep, etc., and I had to leave the house. Sometimes, I've heard other people think that they were not directing their thoughts to me, as what happens with schizophrenics. Enough for now. And this isn't my story, or even the story of the person who told me, but I thought I'd share it anyway. This was told to me by the music teacher at my high school. The college he attended, which I won't mention the name, is up north. I'm not sure when it was built, but the main building of the college was a Catholic monastery. There have always been stories around the college that a monk went crazy and killed himself in the monastery. People in the college have reported strange happenings and sightings of what appeared to be a monk. The story that I know comes from a janitor who works at the college. On the weekends, one of the custodian's jobs is to break down the classrooms. This means that they have to stack up all the desks and chairs up against one wall. The janitor had just finished doing this and walked out the door and locked it from the outside. There is only one door into the classroom and it is the one he had just locked. The windows in the room can only be opened from the inside and the janitor was the only one in the room. As he turned to walk away from the door, he hears loud crashing and banging coming from inside the room. He immediately unlocks the door and steps inside. What he finds is that all the desks and chairs have been thrown all around the room. Drawers from the teacher's desk are ripped out and papers thrown across the room. There is no way any possible human could have been in that room and done that damage in a matter of seconds, then run out without the janitor noticing. As I was reading your website, I was recalling my own happenings. 
none were ever harmful to me, but I do sleep with the light on most of the time. I believe I have a following, whether it be the same ghost or if I have some attraction for them. It started when I was about four years old. I have this imaginary friend. I named him Jingles. From what I am told, I do not recall any part of Jingles other than what I was told by my family. I made my friend Jingle so believable that everyone in my family actually started to believe there really was someone named Jingles. I would talk to him, play with him, and of course, if anything was broken or stolen, Jingles did it. If I was good and got a treat, Jingles had to get one too. Jingles remained my friend until I reached first grade and moved to a new home. While in the kitchen with my sisters and mother, a man's voice from the woods called my name. I was about eight years old then. We all froze with our mouths dropped to the floor and our hearts racing. All four of us could not have imagined that someone called our name. I was young, so my mother made a joke about it and it was forgotten. Throughout my childhood, strange things happened in this house. Images were seen out of the corner of my eye, in my family's eyes, but we would just chalk it up to our imaginations. Certain toys would flip in the air, stuff like that. I was scared for the moment, but never afraid to be in the house. Over the years, we have found what I believe to be cow skulls in the backyard. Two were found, but no one in the street has any cows. We don't know where they came from. This house that I lived in as a child eventually became my home. My sister lived in the in-law apartment below me. She would always ask me what I was doing up there because she would always, even when I wasn't home, hear jumping and walking around. What makes this so strange is that once I moved out of the house, the noises stopped. After moving out of my parents' house and into my own home about nine months ago, there seems to be extra guests. I hear voices, but can't make out what they are saying. I often hear a muzzled radio sound. I hear running water. The house is always making house noises, but around 4 to 5 a.m., the noises stop and the house is dead silent. Often a cool breeze would find me, even when there is no wind. I can't explain the feeling that I'm not alone. My children, nine years old and eight years old, keep saying that they want to move because they think the house is haunted. I don't think moving is going to solve that problem. A little background on the house I own. It is 30 years old in a waterfront property. I found out that the owner of the home died of cancer, not in the house, but has died. There have been 11 deaths around the lake and they've all died of the same cancer. When I was nine, my grandfather died in the dining room of his house. It was not unexpected. He had been very ill and was bedridden. Shortly after his death, we moved in with my grandmother due to the fact that she was also ill. She was a very unhappy and hateful person. She blamed all life's injustices on my late grandfather and hated him for dying. After we had moved in with her, we realized how serious her illness was and took her to the doctor. She had Alzheimer's. As her illness progressed, my parents could no longer take care of her, so they placed her in a nursing home. Big mistake. She transferred all of her anger from my late grandfather onto my father. During the last stages of her illness, she would repeatedly tell us that she did not want to be buried near my grandfather that she had spent all of her living years with him, and she did not want to spend eternity next to him. Well, as fate would have it, my grandmother passed away. Funds were tight, and we not only had to bury with my grandfather, but her casket was placed on top of his. We had no other choice, because all of the extra money we had for her funeral was used to care for her in the home. Anyway, on with the story. After my grandmother's death, 
strange things began to happen. During dinner, the back door would just fly open, or at night, the sheet would be tucked around my body while I slept. We always made jokes that say that grandfather was home, or he was looking in on us. Then, things took a turn for the worse. One night, my father awoke to the sensation of his legs being pressed into the waterbed mattress. Once he was fully awake, he realized he could not move, and whatever was pressing him into the mattress was continuing up his body. He glanced over to get my mother's attention, but could not speak. This entity was now cutting off his breathing. Finally, he thought, Mom, I am sorry. I had nowhere else to put you. And then it all stopped, as fast as it started. The next morning at breakfast was when Dad told us about his experience. The next night I had a similar experience, but chalked it up to dreaming. I figured that I heard my dad telling us about his experience, and that I was just dreaming based on that. Now, let's jump ahead nine years. I'm married, and have just given birth to my first son. It was morning time and my husband already left for work. I thought I would just take a short nap and rest while that baby was not fussing. So I doze off to that place between sleep and wakefulness where you're not fully totally asleep, but resting. The next thing that happens is something that I'll never forget. I begin to feel my body being pressed down into my waterbed mattress. I could not open my eyes, but I knew I was awake I could hear the television and my son cooing. I could not move, and then I began to hear this voice, a horrible evil voice that not even a word can describe, saying, you know I love you. This went on for what seemed like an eternity, but was only probably about two minutes. Then, in my mind, I thought, dear God, what is my baby seeing, and just as quickly as it started. It stopped. I've not had many experiences since then, and that was just two years ago. My question is, was it my anger grandmother or something else? If anyone has any suggestions, please email me. I'm on your website because my boyfriend runs a theater in downtown New York City and has otherworldly occupants. The building has been around since 1897 and was a school until 1978 where a fire killed a little girl. Now, it's an arts community with theaters and artists that occupy the studios and occupy the whole of the building. My boyfriend and a couple other people who run the theater have seen and heard things. I myself have felt the cold associated with presence in a particular room. All my hair stood up on end, and in my gut, I felt we needed to leave the room. These are two particular events which solidify my suspicions. I got a call from my boyfriend one night to tell me it was coming home early. In the background, I heard male laughter, like someone was playing a joke on him and really enjoying it. I thought nothing of it. He works with a couple guys down at the theater. When he came home, he told me he had been dumping the evening's garbage. The dumpster is at the bottom of the stairs, on the north side of the school. As he was going down the stairs, he saw a figure cut across the room, at the bottom of the stairs. He called out, thinking it was the building's handyman. No answer. He reached the bottom of the stairs, and deposited the garbage bag and headed back up the stairs to get the other bag of garbage. At that moment is when he heard what sounded like someone dragging the bag he had just deposited. He stopped, turned and called out. The noise stopped. He dismissed it and brought the other bag down. He headed back up and the same thing happened. This time he did not go back down, but instead called to tell me he was on his way uptown. Later that night, in bed, he told me what had happened. I asked him who was with him when he called me, and he said he was alone. 
All my hair stood on end. Who was that laughing then? I asked. He said he was alone when he called. I think he thought it was my imagination or a bad connection, but now I know what I heard. Now last night, I was at the theater, some fashion show going on there. My boyfriend tells me what happened the night before. He had spent the night at the theater in a pull-out mattress. The guys kept there for late night work. It was around midnight, and he was not asleep. He was staring up at the ceiling, rethinking his day. He heard his name called out. Then the door to the office slowly closed, as if someone was closing it from behind. He responded and peeked out to his desk, See if somehow a cat had found its way into the building, which is ludicrous. One doesn't see cats around there. And of course, he found nothing. All the windows were closed, so no breeze blew in. He said he then heard what sounded like whispering outside the office door. Lots of whispering, stage whisper, of gibberish with some strong hissing sounds, almost like a snake. He called out again and banged on the door. He went back into the adjoining office and went towards the door. He then felt a cold coming in from under the door. He placed his hand in the crack at the bottom of the door and felt no breeze. Then a scratching sound, fast repetitions, like a dog scratching to get in, started. This was too much for him. He packed up and calmly walked out. He said he was a little afraid to walk back once he left the theater office, afraid of what he might see. I think being a theater and many actors who love the space left parts of them when they died. The founder died of leukemia and loved and lived for this theater company. The little girl who died in the fire also stands my hair on end. Last night, I also found out the other guy who hears and sees things, that he hears that same playful laughter in the theater, just like I heard on the phone that night. Also seen, figures sitting at the bar, footsteps heard. And that's my story. Thank you. Hello. I'm writing about a few experiences I had at my home. The home is called Edgefield Manor. First, I want you to know that this may sound like the classic haunting in a big old mansion. Well, believe me, what lives in this house is no Casper. I moved in the fall of 86. The estate is huge, gardens and rooms upon rooms. It was originally going to be condemned. Well, anyway, here's a couple of my experiences. One day, I was in one of the parlors. I got up to turn the light on, and as soon as I did that and turned around, I saw a whitish figure glide across the other hallway. Another thing there is is poltergeist activity. Explain this to me. The home is a ballroom. I went inside like usual. The grand piano was in the same place as it has been when I moved in. I walked out for five minutes and then came back inside. The grand piano was moved across the floor, pushed to the other side of the room. No indication of any noise. It was just moved. There are many others and I have pictures. If you want more stories or pictures, just email me. I know this is kind of short, but it's always terrifying. Hi, my story begins in Maine. Our family owns a cottage in Castine. We go there every year. We're going next week, actually. The house belongs to my great-grandfather. The house dates back to the Revolutionary War times. People have died on the front lawn. The house is a three-floor tower. 
This is a story about a crazy lady who used to live in that house. She used to scream out of the tower at people. Well, I think I saw her in the tower one night. When my great-grandfather lived in the house, he claimed that he saw it a few times when he would read on his rocking chair in the living room. He said it would walk in front of him. Three other people in my family saw the same thing. I never heard the story about the crazy lady until I brought up my experience to my parents after we got back from vacation. The funny thing was, this ghost, it was wearing a maiden's outfit. When my dad told my grandfather, he said that I experienced it exactly as he saw it. I've never heard the story until I saw it. I am no liar. I was really never told to believe in ghosts, if they were real or not. This started when I moved to Missouri with my family in 1995. The first home we rented when we arrived, something was very uneasy about it. I not only felt it, but my eldest son did also. One evening, when the three sons were in bed and my husband was working late, I was up watching TV late. When I decided to go to bed, I left a low light on in my bedroom. As I was walking down the hallway, past my son's room, there was a blur. I thought it was because my eyes were tired, and there was a mirror on the back wall of the hallway. But as I continued walking, my left eye got real blurry, and I felt a cold chill go through me. There is a basement to this house. I had my washer and dryer down there. I also had my kid's Sega game there. I felt very uneasy every time I went down there. My eldest son heard something pounding on the Sega controllers. He said at one time, he saw some kind of figure down there. The figure was bent over, blurry blackish gray, and it had no real face or features. He said it stood there and it was shaking its head. He would be downstairs playing, and hear someone coming down the stairs, and no one would be there. My son was very uncomfortable when he first walked in. He said he felt sick to his stomach. When he saw the figure, he felt sick also. We have since moved, same town. We have moved into another house that has been lived in by many people but not for long periods of time. Someone told me that the reason nobody stays in this house very long is because it is haunted. Again, me and my eldest son have been the ones noticing everything that has been happening here. I hear feet scooting across the floor at night, but no one is there. My son has seen a bright light flashing in the corner of his room. It is in the upper corner of his room where no lights shine on the wall. I've also seen this myself. He has also seen three lights, spinning lights, beside his bed. There was also a time that he felt his bed shake. My son has cancer, and he had been going through a time that he could not sleep. It was right around the time that he felt his bed shake. We do not have an uneasy feeling about these experiences. They are quite comforting. I had an uncle. He was killed on a head-on accident when he was riding a motorcycle and he was hit by a drunk driver. This was around maybe 20 years ago. I think of him very often. I was just wondering if it was him that was there with my eldest son and me during this time that he, my son, is going through this cancer. We aren't scared of his cancer, even though it's rare. My uncle was a very spiritual man. I feel that this is his way of letting us know that my son is going to be alright. We will get through this year, and his cancer will be done. I have two other sons, and they have not experienced anything. Neither has my husband. I told him, and felt foolish. I felt he thought I was crazy. my story, I've had these experiences 
for a good part of my life. It started long before I was born, in a house that has been in my family for almost a century. My oldest brother Mike, he was around three, when he saw the presence of my great grandmother in a corner in the attic during a visit to see our grandmother. This house is an old two family home with a basement and an old apartment attic that had been dismantled in the 50s. My family moved into the house in the late 80s. Since the house has been in my family for almost a hundred years, the house has seen many losses and a lot has occurred inside the home. The attic had a very high spooky factor to it, I guess you would say. The house had a very spooky feeling to it all over. A lot of two family houses built in the 1900s in the New England area. I've been told that a door that led into the living room. The door was for coffins to be wheeled into the living room so the wakes could be done in the home. Knowing this always freaked me out. The doorway had been covered decades before my family moved in, but the eerie outline was still there on the living room wall. Now that I give you a feel of my old home, I'll explain my happenings. I lived in the house for 10 years. I have three older brothers. My oldest brother, Mike, heard and saw a lot happen in the house. He didn't always tell the rest of us for I guess reasons of his own. I started having things happen seven years after we moved in. When I was younger, I thought they were just nightmares. June of 96 for my birthday, I received a dog. August of that summer, my parents were staying in our summer home and my brothers and I were home. My oldest brother Mike and I were lying on my mother's bed when all of a sudden my dog went wild. She went from a dog that never barked or growled into an attack dog. She started barking and growling at the wall, and when we pushed her towards the wall, she cried and whimpered and shifted herself back towards us. I, being brave, stood in front of the wall and tried to beckon her towards me. She just barked and kept at her growling. My brother Mike and I were convinced we weren't the only two watching TV and left the room. My brother and I kept what happened to ourselves, and later that night, my brother Joe came home and slept in my mother's room. I slept in the living room, and my brother Tom was watching TV in the room with me. At 4 a.m., Joe and I heard my mother's sliding bedroom door open and shut three or four times. The dog started going nuts again, and Tom jumped up and ran to see what was going on. Joe sat straight up in bed, terrified by what he had seen. That night, the three of us slept in the living room. Mike and Joe and I have heard voices of two men talking to one another. I've heard the doors open and shut, and when I went to see who it was, no one was there. Mike, he once saw what he thought was Joe. Joe looks just like my uncle, who had died in the house. Mike said hello to the figure and went to his room. When he came out of the room to talk to what he thought was Joe, the figure was gone. And when he finally saw Joe again, Joe told him that he was just getting home from work and hadn't been home since that morning. Mike had slept on the bottom bunk of a bunk bed he had in his room. Joe used to sleep on top, but long since then, slept on the couch in the living room. Mike swears he could hear someone shifting on the top bunk, even when none of us were sleeping on top. Mike would hear two men conversating on the top bunk, but he could never understand what they were saying. These are just a few of the experiences we've had. My mother, father, Tom and I, we all moved out of the house in 97. Joe and Mike still live there. They still experience things happening at the house. I lived with them from November 98 till July 99, and I had no experiences. I visited them two weeks ago and stayed overnight. I slept by my grandmother's on her pullout, and something almost jumped at me. 
I can't even explain what happened. It was pitch black in the room, and my mother was next to me. I turned my body and opened my eyes, and in almost a flash of light, but with a dark figure behind it, leaped at my face and disappeared. I got so startled, I started crying. I think that whatever was in that house has followed me, or something is new in my home. When I leave my room sometimes, or even when I'm sitting in my room, my stereo would turn on, and my jewel CD will come on. Last time I came in the room, the song Adrian was on. If you know Jewel, it's a song about a young girl who has a child who becomes disabled. I have no pictures or sound bits to share, just what me and my brothers have experienced. I know it's long, and some of my things may seem a little wild, but what I'm typing is nothing but the truth. I don't really know where to begin with my story. I've told very few people about it, for the fear they might think I'm crazy. I'm glad to have found a place where I can talk about it freely. I'm 26 now, and have not experienced anything like this since I was a small child, but it changed my life forever. When I was around the age of three, I was still sleeping with my mom and dad. There were several things that happened around this time. I will start with the worst first. One morning, I'd just woken up, and I turned over like I always did. But this morning, I saw the most horrifying sight that no three-year-old should have seen. Laying next to me was this terrifying demon. I know it was a demon because of its eyes. It had a human form of a woman, and was nude. It was about ten feet tall had thin bony fingers and the darkest eyes. It was like you could almost see through them. You could just feel the pure evil. It had the most wicked smile on its face, like it was taunting me. I stared at it for a few seconds and then turned back, hoping I was dreaming. Then, I felt the bony finger poking me in the back, as if to say, hey you. I turned back over, and it was still there, grinning that sickening grin. I watched it get up to go to the window, which was closed and about 20 feet off the ground. It turned and gave me one last grin and went out the window. It was also around this time that I awoke one night to see three demons. They seemed to be like children. They were standing in the doorway laughing the kind of laughter like I've never heard before. This was the same room where I'd seen the other one. At the age of about seven, I awoke one night to see a grim reaper standing by my bed. Needless to say, these things have disturbed me all my life. I also saw my grandfather and his past child after he had died, but that was a peaceful sight. I have not had any other experiences since I was a child. Oh, they've always been noises that I could not explain, but nothing like before. It was like the experience did something to me. I've never had normal dreams, not as a child or as an adult. Always strange dreams and nightmares. Like I have some way of knowing when a spirit is near or a house is haunted. Some people call it a gift but I just wish I could understand it and what happened to me as a child. Thank you for letting me share my story. And this is a true story. This happened to me when I was eight years old. I'm now 28 with three kids of my own. It happened in my hometown of Soak Village, Illinois, which is known to be a place that Indians pass through using South Trail to get to other destinations. At least, that's what the official story is. There are others, like myself, who believe more. We believe that Indians actually settled there, if only for brief periods of time. There's always been talk of bones being found 
when a pool was dug up or a garden was put in, but most say it's just that. Talk, not me. I believe it. I also not only believe, but know that the ground the Silk Village is residing on is sour, cursed, beyond anybody's wildest dreams. And I have many stories to support that belief. But for now, I will start with my first story of proof. It was a cold normal night in the season of autumn, cold enough to keep you inside your house and snuggled under a blanket. I was doing exactly that. An eight-year-old can only do so much during these times, and I chose to do my homework so I could read later. I'd been listening to a Rick Springfield album on 8-track. I was playing it on my 2XL robot toy. This was a toy that you could put 8-track cartridges in that was made by the company to be a sort of trivia game. You'd play the cartridge and it would ask you questions and tell you jokes. It had two big red robot eyes that flashed red when you were correct. It had three buttons you could push to answer your questions. 2XL could also play normal 8-track music and of course its red robot eyes flashed in time with the music. So I was doing exactly just that on that cold autumn night, flashing its eyes to Rick Springfield, and I was quite contented. My bedroom was on the second floor of my house and faced north, along with my bed. I had a window north of me and east of me. Of course, it was dark outside, but it was so warm inside and so very comforting. Every now and again, I'd look up for my homework and just look out into the darkness. No reason. It was just something I did. Well, this was the last time I ever did that again in that house. As I was sitting there, all of a sudden, I felt instantly cold and every single hair in my body was raised. My blood felt like it had ran cold and decided to just stop pumping through my body. My heart was racing. I was perfectly terrified, and I didn't even know why. Yet, my 2XL was suddenly stuck, and it kept playing the same verse from Rick over and over, hole in my heart, and its eyes weren't flashing anymore. No, they were just burning bright red, blood red. Then I felt this magnetic pull, like something was pulling me to my right. I turned my right head and looked out the east window and saw something that haunted me for the rest of my life. Sitting just barely outside my window, levitating, was the most horrifying image I'll ever see in my life. A creature, about two feet tall, but sitting Indian style. His skin was snowy white, and you could see the outlines of his bones because he was that skinny. He wore some sort of white cloth draped sideways on his body. This is why I later named him Gandhi Monster. My young mind thought his skinny body and his white cloth looked like the real Gandhis did. This creature's head was too big for his body. His two horrible, big dark eyes were piercing my soul as he stared at me. He opened his mouth and grinned a grin at me that haunted my dreams for years. His mouth was full of long, snarly, razor sharp looking teeth, dripping with blood. I don't know how a mouth could fit so many nasty teeth into it, but it did. I watched as the blood dripped from his teeth and slid down his chin and onto his white cloth diaper shorts. He raised his hands and reached for me. The fingernails were at least four inches long, gnarled looking, and sharpened to points, also dripping with blood. I wanted to scream. I wanted to run. But I was locked into place by his piercing eyes. I couldn't breathe. I felt as if my brain was being scrambled and my soul was being raped. His grin became larger 
and he opened his mouth wider. He kept looking at me, as if he knew me, as if he had been waiting for me. He started to lift his arms, and it looked as if in seconds he would actually be inside my room and not just outside my window. All traces of reason disappeared, and my mind snapped. I still don't know how I did it, but I managed to tear my gaze away and leap off the bed and out my bedroom door, screaming with every inch of my soul, all in like two seconds. I could feel him pulling me. I could feel that horrible stare penetrating my back as I screamed down the hallway to my mother. Of course, when her and my father and younger brother came back, it was gone. But they knew I saw something, and they did not try to tell me it was my imagination. They comforted me and taped up all the windows in my room. They actually had to pull down all the shades and seal all sides with duct tape. I couldn't even sleep in that room for almost a year. My brother even remembers coming into the room with my parents afterwards. The Gandhi monster was a story we didn't often tell, but it always brought fear to speak of it to us and to others. My parents never spoke of it again either. As I grew up, I tried to face my fear and sleep in that room, but never did I sleep with my back to a window, never. 18 years later, I moved to Florida with my own little family and have found peace within myself, but I'll never manage to forget that creature, and I'll never sleep or sit with my back to a window, and I will never forget the one thing I heard it say to me in my mind as I was running out of my bedroom door. Someday, I'm coming back. Hey, I'm in my mid-teens, and I've experienced ghostly encounters. The one that really freaked me out was when me and my family moved to Scotland. For a few months, we lived in Chalets. Me and my older sister shared one on our own. A few weeks after we moved in, we began to feel uncomfortable and felt as if we were being watched there, and there was also a threatening atmosphere. We told our parents, and they said it was just because we were next to the graveyard. A few weeks later, I was lying in my bed with the door open, when a tall dark figure stood, leaning over me. I didn't think at that particular moment. But it wasn't until my sister asked me if I felt somebody was in my room the previous night. We started to talk, and she too felt as if somebody tall was leaning over her. I then started to sleep in my sister's room, and the figure didn't return, so I moved back into my own room. But then again, the figure returned this time. It was kneeling beside me. The next morning I told my sister, and again, she felt the presence of a tall man. Our dad told us that the large house next to us was where the Vikers used to stay until the house was sold. One night, my mom came in, and she was holding two necklaces with crosses on it. Me and my sister aren't religious, so our mom thought it had something to do with that. So we went to bed, holding the crosses. That night, it was very uncomfortable in both rooms. After that, we haven't felt the presence of the tall man. The figure that visited did so on a few occasions. Each time, it felt as though it was getting closer and more angry. When the crosses were given to us that night, the figure seemed very angry. Its face was literally pressed into mine, and it felt as if he was gritting his teeth at me. My sister also had this very uncomfortable, menacing figure who was pressed into her face. All you could do was hide under the guilt, closing your eyes really tight, and hope you'd fall asleep quick. Since that last visit, nothing has returned, and we've since moved then, and nothing. We don't even use the crosses anymore. 
Other things that we didn't think of as being connected at the time now do seem connected, such as the chalet that mom and dad were in, although the same, was different in feeling. Because mom and dad's chalets always had a comfy feeling, yet ours didn't. Whether it was because there was just me and my sister alone in there, and it was our imaginations or not, we don't know. Although in mom's and dad's chalet, there was only one more person over there. From the moment we stepped into the chalet, it was always cold, even with the heaters on. Plus, there was often a bad smell wafting around, a lot like fish, rotten. This was only in my bedroom, possibly me, my sister says. Also in my room, there was a strange noise of scratching, as if someone was sketching or writing. This noise accompanied the presence of another figure, smaller in stature and of the female sex. My sister also felt the smaller presence, but not the noise. She only came once, very different, not menacing, quiet in nature, and much older. She was almost a comfort, but it's still not nice to be watched over at night by ghostly figures. It's strange, because we didn't actually see anything, yet you get so much from these feelings, the sex, age, angry, happy, etc. Plus, we get almost exactly the same feelings. But is it just our imagination? Are we certifiably insane? Are we demented? No, we definitely feel we had a visitor. Previous to this experience, my sister had not really believed in it, ghostly visits and such. But now, I think she has had a change of mind. Me, myself, I've always believed. My mom's granddad often visits, a kind presence, bringing good luck, such as when she was having problems. He visits to let us know everything will be okay. He often visited when we were babies, watching over our cots. Our dad also saw what appeared to be him. Whenever he visits, we know him by the distinct smell of putty. He used to repair windows. So really, we are used to the visits, although my sister had never experienced any until now. Unfortunately, it wasn't a happy experience, one not to forget. Happened to surf onto your website, and I just wanted to let you know that I saw Resurrection Mary in Justice, Illinois, back in October of 92. After getting off of work at 3 a.m. from a chemical plant, Witzko Corporation, near 51st and Central in Chicago, I was driving by that particular cemetery at about 3.30 a.m. on my way home from work. Driving by, but initially not thinking much of the site, as there was a nightclub with women of ill repute nearby. I saw a woman in a light blue or white palm dress standing by the trunk of what looked like a Black Park limousine at the front SW Cemetery driveway off Archer Avenue to the cemetery. I slowed down quite a bit to get a better look at the odd sight, but then drove off. I thought it was probably a prostitute with her John. However, looking back at my mirror, maybe a second later, the woman in the limo were gone. Let me reassure you that there was no way that I would have missed the limo driving off in that second that it took me to look back in the mirror. They weren't on the road or in the cemetery because I looked for taillights. The cemetery gates are pretty large and it would have taken a great effort and time to open both of the cemetery gates for the car to get through. I did not think much of the incident until a few days later. I was talking with some of my employees that lived in the area near the cemetery. Two of my employees mentioned that I'd probably seen the ghost called Resurrection Mary. I didn't much believe in ghosts until that incident, and I'm still somewhat skeptical, but I cannot fully explain what I saw that night. That incident is still vivid in my memory, and kind of creepy to think about it, to this day. Happened to 
Ever since I could remember, I've always had an interest in ghost stories. That is why I'm writing you this letter. No, I don't have a ghost in my house. A friend of mine told me about this place at least 10 months ago. I was so amazed at this story, I asked if you would take me to this place. No one really ever goes there. I guess because it's so creepy and dark looking at night, but during the day, it is okay. Nothing strange happens. Well first, before I tell you more about this place, let me tell you the story of why it is so unusual. The city is called Lake Forest, California, and they call it Canyon Creek, I guess, because it is nothing but canyon and wide open spaces of nothing but rocks and wildlife. The story goes back 30 years ago of a lady who was in her 40s. Nobody knew what her name was. She lived alone with her two great dating dogs. She was very rich and owned all of the canyon, which is like miles and miles of land. This lady never married and had no children. It was just her dogs and herself. She lived in this trailer park home and it was not a pretty house by any stretch of the imagination. Well, about six years later, the story goes that a police officer got a call about the lady and her dogs. The officer went to the lady's home and knocked at the door and no one answered. The officer ended up breaking down the door and what he found next was horrifying. It is said that the officer found the lady dead. Nothing was left but her decaying body and her bones were visible. Worst of all, laying right next to her were her dogs. They had both died as well. Now, on to the paranormal part. People who have never been to this place don't know what to expect if they come into this place. It's unpredictable. Sometimes, when you go back to the area where she passed, you'll notice paranormal phenomena. Other times, you won't. A man was driving alone on the canyon by himself one night. And the story goes that he saw the presence of the lady standing at the side of the road with her two dogs. The man did not stop at all to give the lady a ride. He just kept going. And this other story was told by my friend. My friend told me that his ex-girlfriend and her boyfriend went up there one night to check it out. They stopped where the lady's house was. They were only there about 15 minutes away when they were just talking and listening to music. Then, all of a sudden, they heard a knock on the side door of the driver's seat. They both turned to look, and they saw the lady standing there, knocking on the window. She was dressed in all white and covered in blood. They also saw the dogs nearby as well, far off into the distance, appearing as silhouettes. They sat there in shock for three minutes, horrified by what they just saw. For some reason, the lady was still knocking at the driver's side of the window, but in reality, it was really not that long. They both said that she must have been there about 40 seconds. After that, my friend said they never returned back there. That was not the only story that happened to anyone. There are far more. What I would like to know is who is this lady and why is she doing this? There is something more to why she has to haunt people who have done nothing to her. Maybe it is because she does not want anyone on her land that she loves so much. What could it be? Here is my email address. If you have any questions, please feel free to get a hold of me. I would like at least some kind of feedback on this story. Please, I beg you. I'm so confused and I'm scared. Please let me know what is going on. I find this intriguing. My name is Julie and I'm 32. Mother of a wonderful four year old son, which I would give my life for, married to a wonderful, incredible man. We live in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. When I was about eight, I believe. I had my first terrifying experience with the dead. 
My great grandma had passed away a few days earlier, although I can't really recall the event all that well. One night, a few days after her death, I woke up in the middle of the night needing to go to the bathroom. The bathroom was just in front of my bedroom, separated by a long hallway that went basically across the part of the first and only floor. Beside my bedroom was my parents' bedroom. My bedroom to the bathroom was only like three feet to walk across the hallway. As I walked towards the bathroom, for some reason, I looked into my parents' bedroom. What I saw terrified me. Across my parents' bed, I saw my great-grandma lying on her side, holding her head with her left arm looking at me with these black, see-through eyes. I will never forget. Very young and innocent, I didn't really ever think that ghosts really existed. That made me aware of another world that we were not taught about in our upbringing. When I got a little older, we had bought a house in Hawkesbury, Ontario, that we stayed into for I would say five to six years. I was about 16 at the time. We had just purchased the house, and while my father was renovating the upstairs, the whole family would be sleeping in the basement. One night, as we were spending a little time together, we heard this funny noise upstairs. We thought someone, for some reason, had entered our home, so my father went up to see what was going on. To all of our surprise, all four rings of her ceiling light had just fallen on the floor, not one at a time, but all four. We could hear footsteps in the house, and when I was alone, the front door knob would turn, and nobody was even there. I was so terrified. I did not know what to make of these events. At night, I would hear someone open the fridge door and close, open pantry doors and close loud. I would constantly feel a presence. I would barely have any sleep in the house. Sometimes, I would go and sleep with my brother. It is a terrible feeling as a child to be afraid like this. It's not okay. I don't think in any way that this is a funny thing. When you're a child, you get confused and don't understand the logic of these things. Actually, because there is no logic. When I got older in my early 20s, my grandmother passed away. God, I adored her. She was my best friend. And to this day, I miss her like crazy. Not long after she had died, maybe a few nights after, she appeared to me while sitting on the side of my bed late one night. She appeared right next to me. She had her arm around my neck. And she looked at me saying, Julie, don't be sad. You know that I'm not really gone. And she disappeared into thin air. I felt such a relief that she felt my sadness and that she loved me enough to come and comfort me. I will never forget that precious moment. For you, Grandma, I love you. Julie. To start my story, my father and I pretty much had a decent relationship most of my life. Of course, when I was a teenager, I did the usual teenage crap and rebelled and we grew apart. I had moved out and ended up with an abusive boyfriend. I ended up moving back home and dad and I renewed our relationship. Those nine months before my dad's death were great. We actually got a chance to really talk and I think my dad knew his time was short. He kept telling me that I would find the right guy eventually, and I would make a good mom someday. On February 11th, 1997, Dad passed away after a long illness that we would discover later was periodontis. Things didn't start happening right away. It started after I met the man who would be my husband later, and I became pregnant with our son. About four months into my pregnancy, we started noticing little things around the house mostly having to do with noises and objects that had belonged to my father. After my son was born, and he was about a month old, my husband and I were watching television in the living room, and the baby was asleep. My mother's room. We were staying with her, due to after dad died, she couldn't pay the bills on her own, was right off the living room. She had went to bed, and after about a half hour, she said she had seen a white orb about the size of a softball, traveling between the bedroom door and her vanity mirror. No light source constant. Her room was pitch black because she kept tinfoil and trash bags over her windows to keep the light out. Then, 
when we were getting things ready for the wedding. It seemed like all hell broke loose. Objects being thrown, kitchen drawers opening and shutting by themselves, strange noises, you name it, we had it. Then, the wedding day came. I wasn't nervous, cause I knew dad was there. I wore his turquoise ring I gave him for our Father's Day present, for something blue. Everyone at the wedding and the reception said they could feel him. Even some of the pictures taken at the reception were questionable. A couple have what appears to have a mist in them. My son is in most of those photographs. Then we didn't really have anything happen for a while, until my son started getting old enough to talk. Then in the evening, when only me and my son were at home, watching TV most times, he would get all excited as if someone had just come home. He would run up to the baby gate, wave, and yell hi, and I would go up to the gate and look down the hall to see no one there, and I would ask him, who are you talking to? And he will look up at me and smile and say, Grandpa Mama, he never met my father. My son was born on 2100, and Dad died on 211, 97. After he did this for a couple of weeks, I invested in an EMF detector. After running a few test runs to get readings from the hallway on basic electrical outlets and whatnot, I waited for my son to say hi to Dad again. Sure enough, about a week later, it happened again. This time I ran into the hallway to see if I could get a reading. I did. A perfect circle about two feet in diameter, smack dab in the middle of the hallway. I knew it was Dad. We have since moved, but my son still says hi on occasion to Grandpa, and my sister and I can still sense his presence. I'm 19 now and most of my experiences have happened recently. Although I remember a few from when I was a child, I'm a student at a Big Ten university and stayed in the dorms my first year here. My roommate and I were soon to find out we had another roommate. One night, I was dreaming that I was lying in a bed across from another bed and a girl was pacing in between. Well, my dream soon faded to reality when I noticed myself blinking we had lost, so the floor that was in my dream was now gone, but the girl was still pacing, about five feet in the air. I don't know what came over me, and I didn't mean to say anything, but I blurted out, what are you looking for? The girl stopped and looked at me. Her eyes were just dark holes, and then faded away. I wasn't scared of her. I just went back to sleep. During other nights, I would be startled awake, what sounded like heavy books being thrown to the floor and in the morning, nothing would be out of place. Things would go missing, only to end up in the middle of the floor, days later. My first touching experience took place there also. I was taking a nap on the futon with my boyfriend, when I felt what I thought was my boyfriend's scruffy chin rub on my forehead. It woke me, but I didn't open my eyes. It happened again, and so I thought he was trying to get my attention. I looked up expecting to see his face, and there was nothing there. He was about two feet away from me, with his back towards me, fast asleep. My roommate, however, had the creepiest experience. She rarely had any, but hers, I think, didn't happen to me. She came in the room from the shower, down the hall, and went to her mirror, when she noticed she had a drop of blood on the tip of her nose. She wiped it off onto her finger, expecting to see a pop zit or something, but her nose was clear. She showed me the blood on her finger and told me what happened. So we checked her arms and legs everywhere to see if she had cut herself shaving. We checked her towel, robe, slippers, everything, and there was no blood anywhere else. We still do not know where it came from. Last night was my most recent experience, which made me want to read about stories online. It was at my parents' home which we all think is haunted by some man. I was ready to fall asleep when I was startled awake by a loud pop in front of my face. Minutes later, I heard dripping water. That ghost mostly bothers my brother, whose bedroom is in the basement where most of the activity takes place. I would like to share my experiences with someone who doesn't think I'm crazy. When I was five years old, my mom 
Dad and I moved to a house in Crownsville. It was about seven years old and had originally been built as a summer home only. My dad did a lot to the house over the years to renovate it. When I was about 10 years old, he finished the new bedroom on the front of the house and he and my mother moved in. I got their old bedroom at the back of the house. I'm not sure if this bedroom was on the house originally because it was built on a concrete slab and the rest of the house was over a basement. My mother claimed to see a ghost materialize from the heating vent into the room. We all laughed it off. Later on, I didn't think it was so funny anymore. My parents were very strict and didn't leave me alone in the house until I was 13. After they left, I was really creeped out by the feeling in the house. I felt as though I was being watched. I wandered into the kitchen and heard a really weird sound. Then I noticed that the cupboard doors were moving. It looked like they were vibrating. I recognized the noise as the glasses in the cabinets all vibrating against one another. I ran back to my room and stayed there till my parents got back. One time, I got this brilliant idea to bring a Ouija board into the house. My grandmother had lots of junk in her backyard, and as I dug around, I had found the board wedged between two small buildings. If I'd been a bit older and a bit smarter, I would have left the damn thing there. I shoved it into the back floorboard of my mother's car, underneath my jacket. Somehow, I snuck it inside later on without being seen. It was just the board in the planches, the Parker Brothers kind. I put it in my underwear drawer, all the way at the bottom, hoping to play with it later. I had failed school that year, so I had to go to summer school. I knew I would have to get up early, so I went to bed early. I was weakened some time later, after my parents went to bed. I thought I heard a rattling. I listened for several minutes, heard nothing and went back to sleep. I woke up again a little while later. Again, I thought I heard rattling, and this time, I thought I had come from my dresser. I was slightly freaked out, but I heard nothing after a few intense minutes of listening, so I rolled over and went back to sleep. I woke up a third time. This time, I was angry. I still heard it when I woke all the way up, so I hurried and turned my light on. I saw the dresser drawer move for a few seconds, then it stopped. There was no more sleep for me to be had that night. The light stayed on, and I stayed sitting up in my bed, till dawn. Then I got into the dresser, snapped the board in pieces, and threw it out my back window. The last thing that happened while I lived in the house occurred when my best friend stayed the night. We were supposed to be sleeping in my bed, but being kids, we were up talking. We both shut up at once and looked out my bedroom door. It was the kind of house where all the doors line up. I could look out of my door and see clear to my parents' bedroom door, in between were my old room, the kitchen, and the living room. We both saw glowing orbs floating around in the living room. There were about five of them, and they were way brighter than any of the lamps we had. She and I stared in awe for a few minutes, and then they faded away. She and I are still friends. We never have talked about the glowing balls floating around my living room. Thanks for listening. I have been able to explain what happened the night of the Ouija board rattlings. For all I know, it could be the workings of an overactive imagination, but it sure seemed to be real to me. The terror of that night never has faded. Hi. I've owned this large, three-story, late 1800s building for the past 25 years or so. The first floor is two storefronts, and the second and third originally had three apartments per floor. I converted two of the second floor apartments into one large apartment for myself. When I first bought the building, I had a great deal of work to do on it. My mother would occasionally visit, and she would ask me who was in the back room of the main store. There was no one there, but she would insist. I never thought much about this until later in life, and she now sees non-existent people nearly everywhere. Sometime after gutting the building and making it partly usable, I was working on the first floor and saw a young boy running through the store. Since the place was locked up tight and there were seven alarm systems and only one was off, it was impossible for the child to hide from me. 
and no child was to be found. Over the years, I and many others have seen a child running through the store. I've seen the occasional person while looking in a mirror, although this doesn't happen often. Many years ago, my friend Scott shared the apartment and had a rear bedroom of his own. One evening, he came out to see me when I got home and complained that something had sexually assaulted him. He found the event very painful. I somewhat dismissed this as folly on his part, but never forgot it. A few years later, I rented that same room to another fellow, and he had a similar experience. He moved out the next day. I rented a room to a fellow who was gay. He never had problems until his friend came over to visit. They were alone in the bed at the time. They were in the bedroom when the bed lifted a few inches off the floor and fell down. Then the bed moved a couple of feet from its location. Finally, the tenant had a set of barbells sitting on the floor. They were tossed up in the air several times, hitting the floor with a bang. After this happened, I began to read up on getting rid of spirits in the building. I placed a pentagram with proper symbols in the room above the tenant's room and went through the ceremony. From that day forward, nothing else happened in the building. That is, until the roof leaked above the room and I bought up a tarp and bucket to catch the leak. The tarp covered the pentagram. Since then, people, including myself, see things in the building, mostly visions of people. Some people leave the building immediately when this happens. Over the years, nothing has ever happened to me physically and my sightings of spirits are rare. I'd like to mention another place in Buffalo. It is on West Avenue, near Fury. The location was originally Buffalo's hanging grounds, and now there are houses on it. My friend Paul owns the house. Occasionally, when no one is in the house, there will be loud screams coming from inside the house. Police have been summoned by neighbors on several occasions, but couldn't find anything out. Thanks for reading. I had a couple of strange experiences at a cemetery in Vancouver as a teenager about 15 years ago or so. Everyone I've told the story to over the years seems to get a chill run down their necks from hearing it, so I thought it would make a good addition to your website, which I enjoy reading through on occasion as I'm interested in hearing about other people's experiences with the unexplained. Back in the late 80s, I hung around with a group of friends who I'd hang around with and mostly get into trouble with. I guess looking back, we didn't really have any beliefs or interest in the supernatural or spirituality, and I suppose we were kind of like teenage nihilists in a way, getting into trouble with the police and partying a lot, not conscientious about school or the future. So what would happen at the cemetery would all seem the more strange. Well anyways, one school night, we were out looking for something to do at around 10 or 11 at night, and we couldn't really think of anything as it was midweek, and most people our age only went out on the weekends. We ended up just driving around with no destination in mind, and at one point, someone suggested we go to a local cemetery just because we had nowhere else to go. This cemetery is cut into the forest on the side of a mountain, and is basically just a giant field surrounded by trees, and all the headstones are just flat plates on the ground, so that if you didn't know it was a cemetery, it would just appear as a big empty field upon entering it. The point is, is that there's absolutely nothing to obstruct your view or cast strange shadows in the cemetery. To get into the cemetery, you have to drive through a 40 meter winding road that runs through trees and bushes, etc. And this road eventually branches out so that cars can access different parts of the cemetery. There were three of us in the car, with myself driving, a friend in the front seats and one in the back. As I pulled the car into the small entrance road, I slowed the car right down and put on the high beams and drove the car at a snail's pace towards the cemetery. As we made the last little bend in the road and entered the cemetery, the high beam suddenly illuminated the entire field and it was at this point that I suddenly and finally jammed my foot on the brakes because about 15 meters in front of us stood a group of about 30 to 40 people. I think I recall my friend sitting next to me saying something to the effect of, what the hell is going on here? I don't know. 
I answered maybe some kind of midnight burial or something, and then cracking some joke that maybe they were druids. I remember my friends in the back seat suggesting that we back the car the way we came in so as not to disturb whatever was going on, which I declined to do in saying it would be a better idea to make the first turn and come around as it's a narrow road. At this time, probably about 20 to 30 seconds might have passed, and I took my foot off the brake and we proceeded forward. After the car had moved forward, maybe 15 feet, and I was staring intently at the group of the people the whole time, there strangely now seemed to be less of them, which confused me. Although I remember slight movement within the group, they didn't seem to be bothered by the headlights, and I don't recall any of them looking directly at us. Well, by the time the car had reached about half the distance to where they were standing, and this is the odd part, there was no one left standing there, just an empty field, and it was at this point when I hit the brakes again, I can remember the intense feeling of my scalp feeling like it was covered in goosebumps and shrinking, because it was only at this point that it clicked into my mind that something ghostly and unnatural had occurred. I drove the car up to a spot alongside where the group was standing and rolled down the window to have a closer look, but there was no explanation for what we had seen. At this point, someone suggested that we get the heck out of there, and we did, quickly. I can think of no possible explanation for what happened, and even went up there a couple weeks later with the same car, but a different friend, to see if maybe we could duplicate the feet and try to come up with some explanation, but we were unsuccessful. Strange thing was that all three of us saw the same thing from different vantage points and there was nothing that the headlights could have refracted off to cause an illusion against the windshield. And anyways, the groups were clearly standing at a distance of 50 or so meters in three dimensional space so there's no way it could have been a reflection. When I tried to duplicate the experience in the same car, nothing happened. I suppose it was this experience that has caused me to have a belief in a greater reality than we see in our everyday lives. Something else happened at that cemetery months later, not quite as strange, but strange nonetheless. But this email has turned out longer than I intended it to, so perhaps I'll submit it another time. I've had a family member who was buried at that cemetery since that time, and the experience has helped me to believe that perhaps some of them is still with us in some way. I would like to share the experience we've had, my husband and I, with the ghost of a dead boy. We had some pretty scary moments. A few years ago, we moved into our new home. An old lady had lived there for years and had passed away two years before shortly after she moved into an old people's home. The house had been left empty since she moved out. We were the first ones to move in. It was the beginning of springtime, so it was a little cold inside. As we turned on the central heating system, we heard a noise as if a kettle was whistling. We thought it was just a little dry, as it had not been used in the last two years. This was just the beginning. When you entered our house, you would see a hallway surrounded by the living room, bathroom, bedrooms, and closet with the central heating system inside. As time passed away, we did not take any notice of the heating system making noise. I must say, I felt kind of awkward when I passed the particular closet. Next thing happened was on our clock. The pendulum would stop at different times. I would give it a swing, and it would keep going for days. It happened many times, and looking back on it, our cats were always looking at things we weren't able to see, especially into the direction of the clock. Then our candles. We used to burn them every night at two places in our living room. We never had any problems with drafts, but suddenly, we noticed our candles were burning unsteadily. All these things happened in our living room, and we never thought anything of it, until one evening, the pendulum stopped, the candles started flickering, and a cold chill went through the room. The temperature dropped instantly, and suddenly, the noise from the central heating system didn't sound like a whistling kettle anymore, but like a stream drain running right through our living room. We looked at the TV, and suddenly, we saw the display changing numbers, and the screen turned to snow. It looked like it was trying to find a channel to display something we did not want to see. 
my husband rushed to the thermostat to turn it down so the central heating would stop making noise. The TV went back to the channel we had been watching before, and everything went back to normal. Except for the two of us, we were scared to death, and we realized that something was haunting us. As we thought back at all the times the pendulum stopped, the noises from the central heating, the uncomfortable feeling we got from that closet and the candles, something or someone was trying to scare us out of our home. I told my husband, that it was time to take some action, or things could get worse. As we decided to go to bed, the central heating started whistling again, and as I passed the closet, I yelled at it, stop it, and shut up. Believe it or not, it did stop. Believed as I was, I rushed into the bedroom to find a halogen lamp flickering heavily, and the whistling started again. I decided to take a run through the hallway, back into the living room, to turn the thermostat off, so the noise would stop. My husband was too scared to get out of bed, and I'll tell you, I wasn't happy either, but I managed to do so, and I was glad to return to bed, hiding under the sheets. The next day, I decided to call a psychic called Jan, who's well known for leading ghosts into another dimension, with the help of his guide, Layla. Through Layla, he was told that a young man in his early 20s had been living here before we moved in. He had died, jumping or falling off a bridge in Rotterdam. We were never told his name, so we could not do any research on this guy. Layla led him into the lights, and all went quiet and peaceful. We moved out of the house a few years later, and we were glad we never encountered anything like this again. It still gives me the creeps just thinking about it. Kind regards, and good luck with your website. I'm not sure if you'll understand my English, since it's been a while since I studied it, so if you have any questions, let me know. It happened when I was in my early teens. I think first, I should describe my room to you. It's the very smallest room in the whole apartment. The bed was placed, facing the door, and the piano was on the left side of the door. That day, my sister was sleeping in the room, on the floor. I don't know exactly what time this incident happened. All I know is that it was scary. So, I woke up in the middle of the night, opened my eyes to see a grim reaper with a scythe just standing there. His face was hidden under the hood, but the face under the hood was glaring with a very weird greenish light. My body was paralyzed. The only parts of my body I still had control over were my eyes. Suddenly, he started laughing, but it was a silent laugh. The most unusual thing about this, though, was that I could still hear him laughing, even though it was silent. His laugh would be best described as something evil and demonic. It was just cruel. I closed my eyes, because I couldn't look at it any longer, and if I did, my heart would have jumped out of my mouth. When I opened my eyes, he was gone, but I could still hear his laugh. It's weird that I fell asleep after that. After this incident, strange things started happening to me. I'd wake up in the middle of the night with my body stiff and be afraid of nothing, even if I was alone in the room. Or, I'd feel like something's trying to touch me. Having dreams about people I don't know, and they always tell me that they're dead. This happened some seven years ago, in 1996. The office building where I worked then used to be a hotel. I was told there were two ghosts in the building. One, on the seventh floor, was supposed to be the ghost of a murdered hotel maid, but no one could tell where or what the second one was supposed to be. I shared an office on the corner of the third floor, and my colleague and I would often look up from our work, expecting to see someone, but there was never anyone there. We both felt that someone had walked through the office door, which we kept open for ventilation. An old office building such as this one did not have air conditioning. We talked about this and discovered that we each had this experience on several occasions. Sometimes we were alone, sometimes we were both in the office. We eventually decided that we must be hearing someone walk along the corridor past the office. And after this, 
Our imaginary visitor did not make their presence felt nearly so often. Then one morning, as I came back from the small area known as the tea bay, after making myself a coffee, I distinctly saw a man enter our office doorway. When I found a few seconds later, there was only my colleague there. He insisted that no one had come through the door, and he said I must have been seeing someone going around the corner. I maintained that I had distinctly seen someone in the light coming from our doorway, and that the corridor beyond our office was dark at that time because the lighting was being replaced. A few weeks later, I saw the same man going into the tea bay, which is no more than an alcove with a water heater, refrigerator, and cleaning facilities. And when I got there, it was empty. There was no way he could have come out again without passing me. There was no other exit. I told my colleagues, and they said, I must have seen someone going into either the men's or the women's toilets, which are on either side of the tea bay. I maintain that I saw someone going into the tea bay. If they had gone into the toilets, I would have heard the doors closing. There are none on the tea bay. Hello there. I've never thought of myself as being sensitive to paranormal things, but I've had too many experiences that I cannot explain easily. I would like to take this time and share two memorable experiences with you. Mind you, most of my experiences were feelings of not being alone, hairs on my neck rising, feelings of being watched, getting overwhelmed with sadness, hatred, and anger suddenly. I'm going to start off with my brush with the Martin House listed in the Haunted Places Index under Panama City, Florida, at the age of eight years. In 1978, it was owned by the paper mill company that was located across the street from the house. The Martin House sat on a huge amount of land and was surrounded by trees with moss hanging from them. There was a waterway running past the right of the house, looking at the front porch. The paper mill would rent this house out to various groups for parties. At the time, my father was in the Air Force, and his maintenance group rented out the house several times. I kind of felt safe on the lower floor and around the house grounds. I always made sure that my sister, seven years old and I, stayed with a group of people at all times. For the most part, kids were running all over the lower section of the house, and we had plenty of places to explore. We were told from the beginning not to go upstairs because it was not safe. A group of us, me included, decided to explore the upstairs area after we ate some food. I led the way up after the first five steps and stopped. I was looking at the top of the stairs and had the feeling of being watched by someone very bad. I let the boy behind me go first. We all started up the stairs and I stopped again, feeling very uneasy, couldn't seem to catch my breath. I was pushed out of the way by the other kids who went up the stairs. I went back down a ways until I was in the light that was shining from below and waited there still uneasy. Then the kids started the scream and came running down the stairs with me in front and told their parents that a very scary man was staring at them. Our parents went up to look around and could not find anyone. We all got punished. Each time we went to find that house, I was always looking up at one set of windows overlooking the waterway. I felt like I was being watched by something. Last, the ankle grabber. I was 23 years old and visiting my sister in Marietta, Georgia. She lived in a two bedroom apartment. The two bedrooms were located on the left side of the hallway with the bathroom right across the room. I would be staying in with my mom. This room had a faint nasty odor that got stronger towards the closet. My first two nights there in the room, I felt uneasy like I was being watched and fell asleep watching the closet door. I had a restless sleep and I always woke up looking at the closet door. The third day, I helped my sister get some extra boxes put away in the closet. It smelled like rotting flesh. It was extremely cold and unpleasant being in there. My sister said that she had tried everything to get the smell out, but nothing worked. That night, my mom decided to sleep out in the living room. I fell asleep the same way, eyes on the closet. I suddenly woke up to the feeling of someone rubbing their thumb down the length of my right foot very hard. It then went into spasms. 
I looked around the bed, thinking it might have been my sister. Nothing. But that closet door was slightly opened, and it was not how I left it before I went to bed. I wasn't able to go to bed the rest of the night, and my daughter slept soundly. The next day was uneventful, except when my daughter was taking a nap. Strange sounds were coming from her baby monitor. I went down the hallway with a feeling of dread, and went into the room to look around. Nothing was out of place, and I even checked my daughter for marks. There were none, but I did take her out of the room to finish her nap in the living room. That night, I was hot and decided to sleep on top of the covers. Again, my mom slept in the living room. I placed my daughter's playpen in a safer part of the room. I slept in the middle of the bed, with my right hand on the middle of the pillow. I woke up in terror when my ankle was grabbed and I was jerked six inches off of my pillow. My right leg was hanging off the end of the bed and my left leg was bent. I got up, picked up my daughter, and went to sleep in the living room. In the morning, I asked my mom about any unusual experiences in that room. She said she didn't have anything funny happen to her. Just then, my sister let me know that her former roommate had complained of hearing footsteps in the room when no one else was in there. The room, by the way, was carpeted, unusual sounds, bad smells, and being watched. I asked my sister to move out of her apartment. My daughter and I spent the rest of the visit sleeping in the living room. On the last day, I went into the room, threatened if it ever hurt my family members, I would be its worst nightmare when I died, and called it every dirty name in the book. I figured I'd take my chances and say it anyway, even if I sound ridiculous and yell at nothing. I would like to thank you for your time, and thank you most of all for allowing me to share my experiences with you. I know the paranormal can bring a lot of skepticism into this world, but I also know there are things you just can't explain. I believe in the paranormal. I believe in the things that go bump in the night. And I certainly won't dismiss something just because someone thinks it's something crazy that may not be existing. Keep an open mind. Don't be so dismissive because you never know when something may lurk on you. And you never know when you're being watched. Here's kind of a creepy story. I go to school at Lalu, and my school, mind you, it is a private school. There have been a few suicides and drownings, we are on a lake, and other things such like that. Well, many students here have seen the Lalu ghost, and apparently, we have more than one haunting. One of my friend's sisters was being followed around by it, and one part of the school, there are wooden steps which makes lots of noise when you walk down them. She started to walk down them, and she heard loud footsteps behind her. She stopped. It stopped. She looked around. No one was there. So, she kept going, and the footstep kept going. That, from what I heard, was the last time I know that the ghosts have been sighted, until two weeks ago. It was a late Thursday afternoon, when my friends Kai, Clover and Jess walked down to the pine room, which is basically our storage room and lost and found, to get a binder or something. When they went down there, Clover had stirred the feel of presence. Kai saw a flicker of light, and Jess saw the entire figure of what she could only explain as a ball of white light. All three of them just got what they needed and left, talking about this ghost. This is how I found out. I overheard them talking, and so did my friend, Jake. Jake is the most skeptical person I've ever met in my entire life. He doesn't even believe in luck. I had told Jake about this, and he basically laughed, and we went to go see Kai, who seems to be the resident expert on the occult here at Lalu, and find out what happened. Dave, who is also a skeptic, was laughing at her for saying this, and wanted to see it himself. Kai told all three of us not to go down there. It will just make him mad, and I trusted her, mainly because I believe in ghosts and the supernatural, and everything like that, and I stayed. Where Jake and Dave went down to the pine room to try to see it, they came back empty-handed and laughing. We talked a little bit more about the ghost, 
and what it could potentially do to you if it was mad enough. Then, Jake and Adder decided to try again. By this time, about 10 other people found out and wanted to see it too. Everyone went down and everyone heard a loud bang, but nothing else. Then everyone went back up, but for some reason, Jake was called back downstairs. He was just inside of the door when he saw this ball of light light pass in front of him to the adjacent corner. Scared, he ran as fast as he could back up to where me and Kai were waiting. He told us of this story, and David overheard as well. So, being the idiot that he is, Dave went back down there and, yet again, didn't see anyone or anything. Dave then went to go see Clover, who was waiting in the stairwell down the hall to where we were at. We started to follow, slower than him, and about a halfway, we all had the same feeling as Dave Giuliano did in his story. The hairs on her arms sticking up and an uncomfortable constant shiver. At that time, in unison, we all asked, did you feel that? Then, the creepiest thing happened to me. A feeling of soft, very, very soft hands, almost like wind, only solid, ran across my arm. And later, I found out that every time that Jake had walked by that spot and that feeling happened, his legs started cramping up. We went to the stairwell and we talked with the two. Kai was shouting at Dave because it was challenging the ghost to its face. And then she moved over a little and both me and Jake saw it. We didn't see anything, really, but we knew it was there in its exact movements. Move over from the exact spot she was standing, right over to where Dave was squatting and after David challenged the ghost again, we left. After all this, I found out from Kai that it was a different ghost and that when Dave challenged it, she had saw it laughing. Within two days of this sighting, my friends Ben and Jamie were playing with the camera to use up the film, which only had three pictures left and it was disposable. Ben's had looked through the viewfinder and saw a ball light behind Jamie and took the picture. They developed the film and it was caught on film. Hi, I'm from Ireland and I haven't seen many stories from here. Well, my experience started in 1997. I was 15 when we moved to the house. We moved to a little village in Wexford. Our new house is over 150 years old, but has been done up and looks modern. Anyway, about two weeks after moving into our new house, I was trying to go to sleep one night when I heard someone calling the name Martin. I shared a room with my younger sister at the time, and she was fast asleep. I was wide awake, and whoever was calling a name called it about five or six times. The next day, when I woke up, I went down to my parents and asked who lived in the house before us. They told me don't be stupid, and that I know. Then, I asked who lived in the house before the people we bought the house off of, and I was told a man's name called Jimmy Martin and his wife. At first I thought this was a coincidence and I never said what happened the night before. I soon started to feel someone was watching me all the time, especially in the sitting room. It is hard to explain, but even though I could not see anything, I could tell you there was an old lady standing in front of the sitting room door and this is where she always stands. I was afraid to go to sleep some nights as one night when I was laying in my bed Something kept hitting me on the back of my head, as if to try and wake me up. Well, I was wide awake, but I was too scared to look, as I was afraid of what I could see. Another night, I was just dozing off, when someone decided to sit on the edge of my bed. This frightened the life out of me. I had kept all these experiences to myself, as I thought if I told anyone, they would think I was mad. I had an ensuite in my room. And one night, the toilet handle started going up and down by itself. Everything was getting to me, so after three years of keeping it all to myself, I started telling some of my friends what was happening to me. They thought it was scary and asked me what my parents thought. They couldn't understand why I wouldn't tell them, but I just said they would think I'm mad. 
Anyway, more stuff started happening, but nothing serious. I went out for a few drinks with my mom and one of their friends, and when the night was over, we all came back to my house and had a cup of tea and a chat. They got into the subjects of spirits and started talking about past experiences they had. I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to tell them about mine. I started with my sentence with, you're going to think I'm mad, but, and then I started to cry. I told them everything that was happening to me, and to my surprise, they had their own experiences. My dad was sitting in the sitting room one night, reading the newspaper, when a woman started whispering his name and started running her fingers down through his hair. My mom has heard them walk around upstairs, and she could hear them call her name sometimes, and when she was in bed one night, it was like someone was blowing cold air into her ear. My brother woke me up one night because there was an argument going on in his room, and to his surprise, there was five spirits in his room, bickering at each other. His room is across from mine. My mom and dad were annoyed with me because I never told them what was happening to me. We have two bedrooms upstairs and two downstairs. Me and my sister used to share a room upstairs, but she has now moved out. And my brother, who has also slept upstairs, has moved out now. So I'm up there by myself. And some nights, I can feel there's someone there. And it would take me half the night to go to sleep, as I would be terrified lying in my bed. I'm 21 and the eldest of four children. Now that my brother and one of my sisters have moved out, my little sister, 13, looks up to me and likes to do stuff together. She's often asked me about my experiences, which are still happening today, but I won't tell her too much as it would frighten her. To end my story, I will tell you about a reading we held in our house. A man came to our house who can see spirits and he gave about 10 of us our readings. I was first to get mine done, and as I sat down, the kitchen door opened. As I got up to shut it, the man told me to wait a minute. He then told me that he is now, and that I should shut the door. This sent a shiver down my spine. He told my mother how I can sense spirits, and how a bad spirit entered the room with me. He said that he got rid of them, but there is a spirit that follows me around. But it's a good spirit, and this is the one that I can sense around me, all the time. He said that there are a few spirits in my house, but they're good, well except the bad one he got rid of. Well, that's my story, and it's going on today. The good news is, I've just learned to live with it, in the sleepless nights at times. Hopefully I'll be the next to move, because the terror drives me mad sometimes. Thank you. First off, I'm 19 and have believed in ghosts my entire life. Now, I don't have a sixth sense, but I find it fun to discuss ghosts and all sorts of unexplained occurrences. I'm a pretty athletic guy and played football through high school and am pretty strong too. I can bench 280. I'm not saying this to sound like I'm bragging, just to say I'm not afraid of that much, but what happened to me two summers ago left me pretty shaken. I was about 17 at the time and found out about a haunted church through my mother. She had gone when she was younger. Nothing happened, except she had a really weird feeling the whole time she was there. Well, finding ghosts fascinating, I wanted to go, but didn't want to go by myself, so I told my brother about it. We decided to go on a Saturday night. Maybe we'd have a story to tell at the parties. My brother at the time was 15 and he wanted to bring some friends along, so I agreed. Altogether, there were the five of us, me, my brother, my brother's friend, and two girls they wanted to impress. The layout of the church goes like this. The church is in the middle of a field, surrounded by woods. All around the church in sort of a U pattern are graves. The graves start a little ahead of the church and meet in back, forming the U. There is no space between the graves and church, for a few people to walk. In front of the church is a stone wall about three feet high and two sensor trigger lights on each side of the stone wall. We parked in a little dirt parking lot right in front of the church and got out. Me, being the oldest and assumed the bravest, went over the wall first. As soon as my feet hit the ground, 
on the other side of the fence. I got a really bad feeling, and my hair stood on end. The first thing we did was go up to the front steps and hang out for the first couple of minutes. The thing that struck me was that there was no noise at all inside the wall, no crickets or anything, which is strange because it's surrounded by woods. Once we got bored of sitting around, we decided to go around back. That's when the really weird stuff started to happen. We were walking in a straight line because none of the younger kids wanted to be last. It was me, my brother's friend, the two girls, and my brother. That was the order from left to right. We were walking so that I was closest to the grave, and my brother was closest to the church. About halfway down the length of the church, we all heard a whooshing sound. My brother's friend and I to the left, and my brother and the two girls to the right, like we were being surrounded. Everyone asked each other if they heard the sound, and we all answered yes. After that noise, Mike, my brother's friend, and the two girls wanted to leave, but my brother and I convinced them to stay. Not that I wasn't scared, I just wanted to see more. I forgot to mention that me and my brother both had flashlights, which gets important. As we made our way to the back of the church, we all heard a loud hum, kind of like electric wires, but no one were around. This sound kept getting louder. Also, this went on through the whole entire time we were there, and probably would have scared us enough, if not for what happened next. At about the same time, I heard a noise. I saw a black ink blot, like shape move from a grave to behind a bush. I tried to follow it with a flashlight, but it was too fast. However, Mike saw it move from that same bush to behind another tree. From that point, we would hear sounds and directions all around us, and when my flashlight or my brother's was aimed at the spot we heard the sound, we would just get a glimpse of a shape going back the way the light came to, too fast for us to follow it. Now, there had to be more than one of whatever they were, because as me and Mike were going through this on one side, my brother and the two girls were doing the same on the other side. All of a sudden, I heard my brother and the two girls scream. My brother is a pretty tough kid himself, and I never heard him scream like that in my entire life. Never mind the girls. When I turned to see what was wrong, the three were sprinting out of there at a very fast pace. When I heard them scream, I almost panicked, but got my nerves under control. Mike, however, took off like a world-class sprinter, leaving me by myself. Not wanting to be the only one there, I backpedaled as fast as I could, so I could see whatever it was, if it was coming after us. At this point, the humming was almost deafening, and that's when I got the impression that whatever was making the sound was coming closer at every very fast pace. At that same moment, my flashlight went dead, and then I did panic. I turned and ran faster than ever before in my life. When I reached the stone wall, I saw everyone else in the car waiting for me. I just jumped the stone wall. As soon as my feet landed, the flashlight went back on. The humming stopped, and I heard guess what? Crickets chirping. Also, all the feelings of fear I had disappeared, and everything was calm. I got in the car and asked what my brother and the girls had seen. They said it was the body of a little girl floating inside the second story window. At that time, the sensor lights went on, meaning something was coming towards the gate. Remembering the humming sound, I took off as fast as possible. There have been other stories about how people have seen the little girl or heard her playing the flute, but none to the extent of ours. After this happened, I did a little research, and this is what I found. In the 70s, a man raped and murdered five young women and buried them in the back of the graveyard behind the church. I don't know where the little girl comes into the picture, but that is what everyone sees. Later, when I asked my brother why a little girl scared them so much, he said the face looked mad like it wanted us out, and he just got a bad feeling when he saw it. This is the only ghostly experience, and hopefully the only bad one, I'll ever have, and this story is 100% true. Hi, not sure if you are interested, but here's a couple of stories from the place I live in, in Tasmania, Australia. 
My boyfriend and I live in Daisy Cottage, an 1832 brick and stone house in Markey Street, South Hobart, Tasmania, Australia. Daisy Cottage was originally built as a nine-room hotel by an Irish stonemason. He built an almost identical house right next door for himself, which has been empty the entire time we have lived in Daisy Cottage. Legend has it that he witnessed the stabbing murder of the local policeman and testified against the killer in court. The killer was sentenced to lashings, followed by hanging death, and apparently it is he who haunts the house. Strange things have happened, but only one of us is in the house. The first thing happened to Chris, my boyfriend. He arrived home from work one day and checked the mailbox for an important letter that he was expecting. He took it out of the mailbox, opened the front door, and headed upstairs to the bedroom to get changed. On the way, he started to open the letter. Once upstairs, he realized it was raining, so he put the partially open letter on the bed and went downstairs and out into the back courtyard to take the washing off the clothesline. Once he got back inside, he went back to open and read the letter, and it was not there. After about 30 minutes of searching, he called me out, out of frustration. I arrived home and helped him look for the letter, turning the house upside down. Eventually, I said, are you sure you took it out of the letterbox? Maybe you should check. Sure enough, there it was, sitting in the letterbox, partially opened. Second strange thing happened two days ago. I was alone in the house, doing some painting. It was getting dark, so I turned on the hall, bathroom, dining room, and kitchen lights, and had not ventured upstairs at all. I finished, cleaned up, and started turning off all the lights, getting ready to leave, as we currently aren't staying there during the renovations. I got to the front door and realized that there were lights still on in the house. Every single light upstairs had been turned on. As I left, I noticed that there was a light on in the upstairs of the empty house next door. The one thing that really got me though, as I was looking towards that house, I noticed some kind of print, like a handprint there. When I say handprint, I mean a floating hand. It was very faded, and then it just disappeared. Well, I guess he needed some light in the house. Thanks for reading. From 2001 to 2003, my grandma and I lived in a house in Booneville, Missouri. The house was my uncle's, but it used to be a duplex, so my grandma had one side, he had the other, and I had the upstairs that went from his side up. First I have to say that the house always felt weird. It used to be a vet's office, and between the two halves of the house, there is a little hallway about three and a half feet long with a door on her side, a door on his side, and a door to the basement. The doors in the house stuck at some times of the year, and wouldn't stay shut the other part of the year. This was the part of the year that they wouldn't stay shut, they just swung all the way open. I went downstairs to go talk to my grandma, and when I went into the hall, both doors slammed shut. The basement door, which always latched very well and stayed latched started the swing open and stopped at about an inch. I know it was about an inch because my hand was on the door. There was a really cold draft coming from the crack in the door and our basin wasn't that cold around that time of year. I screamed and started banging and pushing on all three doors. It was pitch black in there. There wasn't a light. And finally, the basement door shut quickly and both doors just swung open. I went in and told my grandma, and she said she heard the door shut and thought it was weird, but didn't hear me screaming. Another time, we had been gone all day, and so had my uncle. We didn't have a big ladder, and no one around there had seen anyone on our roof. I went upstairs and walked into the bathroom, which was right across from a window. I paused for a couple seconds, then turned around. The window frame and all, were lying on the floor. There were a couple marks on the wall where the corners hit as if it was falling down, 
and there were linters of wood all over the floor. We checked, and there weren't any pry marks, and no marks outside, and no handprints on the window like someone had pushed it. My uncle still thinks I somehow pried it off the wall. That is the window he kept telling me to keep shut. I tried, but it was one of those windows that opens from the top and leans in. Every time I shut it and locked it, it would come open. He slammed it shut, and the next time it was open was when the window fell off the wall, as we put it. There were other things that happened in that home. Almost all of it happened upstairs. The locked doors would pop unlocked, open, shut, then relock themselves. If I put too many things on top of the filing cabinet in the corner of my bedroom, it would shake violently until some stuff fell off. When anyone went up or down the stairs, something grabbed your ankles about halfway and even tripped you. I had a particularly nasty fall down the stairs one time. The closet doors in the hallway would open and close slowly sometimes. The stairs came up in the middle of the hallway, and there was a walkway all the way around. The side that no one ever walked on had really, really cold spots. A couple of things that happened that were not upstairs one time. I had my door open and was just laying there thinking, and I saw something come from my upstairs living room and walk down the stairs ever so slowly. I followed it down the stairs on my rear end so I didn't get tripped and threw to my grandma's side of the house. My grandma started talking when it was still in the shadows. She thought she was still talking to me and I was still in her kitchen. When I ran in there, she stopped and asked if I was standing there. Who was in the shadows? I told her. That was her first experience with a ghost. Also, all of the time, it seemed that the house was listening and watching everything, even from the outside. All in all, that was a very active house, and I'm glad I don't live there anymore. We moved into our house in August of 2001. We first realized we had a ghost when I was sitting on the toilet, and the toilet paper in front of me suddenly and very quickly began to unroll into a perfect pile on the floor. This happened once to my husband also. Soon it began. Here are some of the things we have experienced with our ghost. We have a woman who died in her son's room. Her name is Della. We know this from buying the house from her nephew. And we have a male ghost, but we do not know who he is. Her son will sit in the game room and turn his stereo on. It will turn off. He will get up and turn it back on. It will turn off again. He finally after a while gets frustrated and just leaves it off afterwards. Once my husband was plugging in the television in the game room and he felt a breath on his neck and heard a female voice say, too hot. We do not know what she meant by that. Her son was sitting in the upstairs TV room one day. We have a bookshelf in this room. On the top shelf were two tall candles and plants. The candle came up over the plants across the middle of the floor and hit him on his knee. One evening, my husband and I were the only ones home and we had heard a crash in the kitchen. One of our glasses had come out of the top cabinet and smashed into the middle of the kitchen floor. One morning we woke up and the kitchen stool, which had been under the table at the end of the kitchen, was in front of the stove as if Della had been sitting there watching something cook. We had several people over and videotaped the comforter on her bed being straightened by invisible hands. Also, at this time we asked, what are you doing here? A male voice whispered, watching. That is when we realized we had not only had Della in this house, but a male ghost as well. We have had on numerous occasions the smell of baking bread and no one was baking bread. According to her nephew, she died in her son's bedroom in the month of June. The first June that we were there, we had approximately seven times that the police would call and say that they just received a hung up 911 call. After a while, we figured out who was doing it and removed the telephone from that room. It never happened again. 
One summer evening, my husband was in the backyard. When I walked out, he asked, where's my beer? I did not know what he was talking about. He said he thought it was me walking through the kitchen, and he had yelled up for me to bring a beer. I had not been upstairs. I was down in the laundry room. Her son took a picture with his camera cell phone of a dark figure of a man sitting at her desk in front of the computer. We have things like our shoes being upstairs and ending up downstairs, just small things like that being moved. And finally, we can hear someone walking around upstairs when we are downstairs in the game room. It has just become our way of life. They are like part of the family. We don't even consciously notice half of the stuff happening anymore. One of the most horrifying incidents, though, occurred one night while sound asleep. My husband had been sleeping in another room at the time, when I could have sworn I heard faint screams coming from the room he was sleeping in. Although the screams sounded faded and far away, the tone still sounded as if people were being buried alive. Naturally, I rushed to my husband's assistance in the event that he may be in trouble. Fortunately, he was completely fine. But before I could turn back completely and head back into the hallway and into my room, I saw a shadow figure zip past me from the corner of my eye. I decided, at that point, that I was going to stay with my husband until the morning arrived. I was too scared to go back to the other room to go back to bed. Hey, my name is Kelly. And I know that this experience is a bit short, but it's also a life-changing story that I'll always remember for the rest of my life. I used to frequently visit this young girl who I became a babysitter for. Her parents' house was a typical American dream type home, nestled inside a friendly subdivision of similar looking homes with white picket fences, perfectly manicured lawns, etc. One specific occasion, I was watching that girl play around in the front yard. It was late night, and I know it wasn't the smartest thing to do to let her child play around outside in the yard, but I was watching her, and the neighborhood was always very safe. I think it was about 11.30 p.m. at night when this whole event occurred. The streets had been empty. Absolutely nobody was out there but me and this little girl. That was when I noticed a man aimlessly wandering down the street just in front of the house. Since I was so focused on paying attention to the little girl, I didn't really notice him pop into my field of vision until he passed us by. This was an older middle-aged man with tattered clothing looking completely out of place in a neighborhood that wouldn't even have these types of people wandering on the streets. He looked delirious and was walking slowly. He didn't seem to turn to us or even recognize that we were on the lawn he just kept walking. Immediately, I grabbed the girl and ran back into the house and locked the door. I decided to look through the drapes when I noticed the man had disappeared on the street. It didn't make much sense to me because the man was walking so slowly and I'd just seen him the second before. I asked the little girl if she'd seen the man I'd seen and before I could even finish my sentence, I heard a soft knock at my door. My heart pounded. I was too scared to even look through the hole to see if it was that man, but I did anyway. Oddly enough, there was nobody there. I ended up telling the family of the girl, and of course called the cops. They came over and told me to be careful, and that they would do their best to patrol the area in case they see a suspicious man outside. Later on, I thought that it could be possibly a ghost, though I'm not sure, but it does certainly seem like it. Another night I was out playing with this little girl, when it started the storm shortly after. Her parents were home this time, but I liked the bond with the kid. My mom called me and told me she wanted me to come home so I wouldn't be out in the middle of the storm. The drive is probably about 10 minutes at the most back to my house. As a side note, a friend of mine's house that was killed in a car accident is on my way home. As I was driving past, I got this urge to look at the house, and in the yard of this house, there was this fog presence. It wasn't just a light mist either, 
It was a completely darkened cloud. What completely shocked me, though, was that I swear I had some sort of definition or defined shape. I had a build of a person, but as I said, it was still a dark cloud. I saw it for about five seconds, then it disappeared. It scared the crap out of me, because nowhere else around had any kind of fog. It definitely seems that this area has a lot of supernatural energy, and I'm not sure why. Thanks for reading, though. I wanted to share a story that proves that love continues even after death. My son and his wife, who live in another state, were expecting their first baby in the first part of December. My 80 year old mother couldn't wait for the baby to be born. She was so excited. Every time I talked to her, everything would be about the baby. In mid October, mom suddenly fell ill and was hospitalized. My son and his wife came down and spent a lot of time with mom in the hospital, making plans for the baby, etc. On November 5th, mom died. My beautiful granddaughter was born December 1st and was named after her great granny. It was very bittersweet, as we loved the baby more than anything and so glad she was healthy, but it was very sad knowing how much mom wanted to see her. Well. Death did not keep mom from seeing her first great grandchild. While in the hospital, my daughter in law was alone in the room with the baby, kind of dozing in and out. Suddenly, she felt something nudge the end of her bed. She looked up and saw mom at the foot of her bed, smiling at her. About this time, the baby started to fuss. My daughter in law watched in awe as mom glided across the room to the baby and started rubbing her back. The baby immediately quieted down, and mom slowly faded away. The baby is now a month old, and my daughter-in-law says that now that they are home, the house will start to feel different, and the baby acts like someone is playing with her. I think we know who her guardian angel is. As a side note, yes, the story is a thousand percent authentic. I know maybe people might not believe it, but obviously it happened, and I have the proof to back it up, at least in my heart. It's not the scientific proof that everybody wants, but it did happen. I believe in ghosts. I'm certain of it. I had an experience at this location, similar to the gentleman who shared his story, so I'd like to share mine as well. One evening, out of the blue, my friend told me about this haunted track just outside that small Saskatchewan town located in Canada. We decided to take the several hour trip just for fun, just to see it. My friend, who knew about it, had already been there several times and told us exciting but scary stories about it. Two carloads of us made that trip that wintry night. We drove our vehicles down the track Passed some no trespassing barricades and parked. We got out to look. So to speak, we saw the light. This bright light, similar to a single headlight, slowly moving towards us. We then noticed it would split in two, move fast, slow down, merge back into one, and repeat at fast rates. Freaked out, we ran back into the cars to leave to notice the one larger car got stuck in the snow. We tried to get out. The longer and harder we tried, the brighter the light got. We couldn't move the vehicle away from the light because of the snow, but the guys figured we could move it forward, towards the light, unfortunately. Myself and another girl slowly walked towards the light to see if there was a clearing so we could turn around. When we did this, the light seemed to fade away. We walked quite a ways down, then decided to go back to the cars. We turned our backs to the light, which was at this time quite a ways away. You just have to look back, and after a few steps, we did. The light instantly grew in intensity, and jumped what was like 50 to 70 feet towards us, and was right behind us. We ran to the cars, it followed just as fast, something 
It wasn't the snow. It kept making me trip over and over again, hurting my foot even more each time. I was on the verge of tears. Eventually, somehow, we got back into the cars, managed to get turned around, and started heading back. Then the car in front of us got stuck. The light moved up the road with us. By this time, maintain a bit of a distance. We got this car unstuck with less trouble than the first, and proceeded a few meters more when we came back to the barricade. I don't know how we got past it at first. It seemed impossible to get back. Big pieces of metal in the middle of the path, ditched with trees on the side. Maybe just enough to get a car through, if there was light. One of the girls got on top of the pile with a flashlight to show where the edge of that was. I got in the ditch to show where the edge of it was, turned on the headlights, and the most absurd thing happened. The spotlight went crazy, fast, unpredictable movements, sudden duplications, merges, etc. Then little red lights surrounded it as it turned into one huge glowing white light. Then the huge light went out, gone, instantly. The red lights remained and they flew towards us at high speeds. I tried to get myself out of the ditch and run to the car, but my foot felt as if it was being pulled back by someone. I yelled at the top of my lungs for help, but everyone else was spooked by the red lights and they were running. More resistance was felt to my ankle and I looked back at it and noticed the red little lights now about a meter from me. I yelled at them to leave me alone and for my friends to help. All of a sudden, I was released from its stranglehold. I then proceeded to leap from the ditch and ran as fast as I could. I got up and ran as fast as I could to jump in the car. We left and got away from those tracks. I know I yelled. The scary thing was, I asked my friends why they didn't help me get out of the ditch. They said they didn't hear me yell at all for anything. I know I did. Did the ghost take away my voice then and there? Discussing this event afterwards with the group, we concluded I had the scariest experience of the eight or so of us who took the trip. Why? They aren't sure, but I think I know. I was the one who didn't believe any of it would happen. The ghost had to prove me wrong. They did. Trust me. Believe. They are out there and you don't want them to have to prove it to you. Every time I tell this story to anyone, even typing it, my body stiffens up like I did that night. I feel a cold sweat, and every shadow scares me. It scared me to tears that night. I returned another time with other friends. They all believed at first, so they ventured out down the path, ran back within seconds, scared out of their wits. I got as far as five steps from the car when I jumped back in and locked the doors. Something felt wrong, like I wasn't supposed to be there. I couldn't even look down the path. I traveled four hours, didn't even look again just to travel another four hours back home. Over 35 years ago, in our farm neighborhood, there was a farm where an old woman lived alone. It was said around the neighborhood that the old lady was a witch. I don't know if she actually was a witch, but she was pretty scary looking. She wore long dresses and always had a scarf tied over her head. She walked with a cane and was kind of stooped over looking. She didn't own a car and we would see her walking up and down the roads, picking up cans and bottles, which I guess she sold. We would pass her in the mornings on the school bus, and whenever the bus went by her, all the kids would quiet down and sit silently in their seats. We won in a minute, but we were scared of her. As I said, she lived on a farm. She did not farm the land, but rather cash rented her ground to another farmer. Land was a mix of rich land and rich bottom ground, prime farmland. There was a nice large woods which held an abundance of wildlife. Farmstead itself consisted of a large, 
two-story farmhouse, two barns, and a spring house. Large old pines surrounded the house. It actually was kind of a pretty farm. In 1963, the old lady died alone, and her land was bought by a neighbor in a share of sale. The neighbor was never successful in finding a tenant for the house. It seemed that nobody would live there very long. Then, in 1966, the house and all the outbuildings burned to the ground. The ensuing investigation did never turn up much, but to this day, the rubble of the fires is still there, and the site is slowly going back to nature. Just the large pines still mark where the farm stood. Along came 1967, and for me, life changed. Graduation, the Marines, and Vietnam, thoughts of witchy looking old ladies were the furthest from my mind. Presently after two tours, I returned to the good old USA, and for a while, traveled around seeing the country. Soon, I became homesick and moved back home to Indiana. Having lived in the bush for a couple of years, I guess I had a hard time adjusting to life among people, so I would spend a lot of time in the woods hunting or just sitting alone in the quiet. Upon my return home, I asked the owner of the old witch farm if I could hunt on the ground he owned. He responded affirmative, as the ground was no longer good for farming. It seemed that after a couple of years after the old woman died, springs burst forth out of the hillsides in the farm and saturated the bottom ground, ultimately turning the farm into a marsh. Today, you can slog through the marsh and find the tops of fence posts sticking out of the ground for about 10 to 12 inches. Fence wire is still attached to the post, disappearing into the ground. Now, I started hunting on this ground, but I was always uncomfortable while I was there. I constantly felt as if I were being watched. It was kind of creepy. You could just feel something unnatural was there with you. However, having survived the NVA, I was not afraid of any creepy Indiana woodland. One rainy night, in the late 1970s, I decided to go fox hunting. I left my uncle's home and ventured out in the woods with a light, a fox call, and a shotgun. I knew the best hunting would come in the field behind the old witch's woman's farm stand, so I crossed the creek and went up the ridge to the old farm. I set up and began to use my fox call. I was not afraid. I'd learned long ago not to let my mind get the better of me. After a while, I called in a gray fox, but I was not able to get a good shot at him, so I held my fire. It was very quiet, just the sound of the rain falling. Now, I need to explain that when fox hunting, a call is used to call in the fox, and a powerful light with a red or amber lens cover is used to shine or reflect the fox's eyes revealing the animal's position. This is a common method used by hunters everywhere. After I was convinced that the first fox I called in was not going to present a shot, I resumed calling. After several minutes, it seemed that I was hearing a noise coming from the old farmstead area. I shined my light in the direction of the pile of rubble that had once been the farm buildings, and suddenly, I realized that the light was reflecting back a pair of eyes that seemed to be 8 to 10 feet off the ground. Okay, no need to panic. Probably a raccoon up in a small tree, trying to get a better view of an animal that was in distress. The noise my call makes. Regardless of what it was, this incident spooked me, and I decided to leave. I blew my cover, and removed the red lens cover from the hunting light, and turned it into the direction of the elevated eyes. Now, an animal's eyes will reflect red in light, but normally reflect with a greenish tint in white light. However, the eyes of a possum will still reflect with a reddish tint. The eyes that were being reflected in my light stayed red. No big deal, just a possum. I gathered my gear and started across the field for the wooded slope to go home. Turning my light in the direction of the red reflecting eyes, they were still there, unmoving but closer. Now, any animal whose eyes are being reflected in light will eventually move their head 
causing a momentary break in the reflection. These eyes were unblinking, unmoving, except they appeared to be following me towards the woods. The scariest thing was the fact that the eyes were still about 10 feet off the ground. It was then I realized that there were no trees in the field for an animal to be in, and no Indiana owls can hover like a harrier jet. Suddenly, this battle-tested marine panicked and started double-timing towards the woods. I found the footpath that went down to the creek crossing and started down it. After going about 40 meters into the woods, I stopped dead in my tracks. I was suddenly paralyzed with fear. I knew if I turned around that the pursuing Aishan would be behind me. Mustering my courage, I slowly turned, shotgun at the ready, and as sure as hell, the reflection was there at the tree line, still about 10 feet off the ground. In the powerful beam of my hunting light, I should be able to see the body of whatever was following me, but all I could see were the eyes, staring, almost seeming to glow red. I was toying with the idea of shooting at what I was now sure was an apparition, but a low guttural sound, which came from the same location of the eyes, convinced me that this was not a good idea. I was overwhelmed with the feeling of get the hell out of here, so finding the feeling in my legs, I broke and ran like I never had before. I did not even use the stepping stones at the creek crossing, I just splashed through the water. I continued my pace through the scrub timber until I finally found safety in my uncle's farmyard. At this time, I heard a cry coming from the timber that I cannot duplicate or describe accurately, but it had a mocking quality to it. What did I see in those woods that night? I don't know. It wasn't anything indigenous to the Indiana woods. It was something that scared the hell out of me more than an NVA B-40 rocket ever did. I know that I will never go into the woods again at night. This incident happened over 20 years ago, but I can't shake the image from my mind. I was reading the many accounts of ghost hauntings and appearances, and I thought I should share mine. My senior year, my sister, my friend Mindy, George, Joey, and myself decided to go and search for ghosts in a place that is known for many ghost hauntings. I'm from San Antonio, and some of you may be familiar with the tracks, school bus crash that killed several children and bus driver in the surrounding Espada Park. On the way to the tracks, there is a cemetery about a couple of blocks off the main street that leads you to the tracks. It was about 11.30 at night, and we heard about the statue of the Virgin Mary, that if you stare at her long enough, she starts to rock back and forth. This whole area is known for many ghost sightings because it is also a battlefield. The statue is located in the cemetery near the small road that leads into the cemetery. The cemetery has a gate surrounding it and a chained entrance. Well anyway, we parked outside the fence and sat in silence to see if this was true. Sure enough, slowly at first, the statue started rocking. She sits with her head bowed and is holding her arms as if she is carrying a baby. To our surprise, the statue started throwing her head back. We started freaking out, but weren't too scared, because we had seen a ghost about 15 minutes ago, but that's another story. We sat there, and my friend noticed that the gate was completely open. I don't know how we would have missed an observation like that, since we have to pass the entrance to get to the park outside the gate to see the statue. We all decide to go in and get a better look. We were being stupid and just weren't scared enough, I guess. Slowly, George began driving, and as we kept getting closer to the statue, the harder she would rock. When we got to where we were aligned with the statue, about 10 feet, the most horrifying thing happened. The statue lifted her head and stared at us, but with no eyes and no face. It was completely black and what made everything worse was that as soon as she looked at us, the car shut off entirely. We were in hysterics, screaming as if we were being murdered. Even George and Joey, two 18-year-old men, were screaming like girls. 
The car was a year old and had no problems with it. George continuously tried restarting the car and it just would not turn on. The rest of us are looking away from the statue and I was praying to God to start the car. Finally, what felt like an eternity, it started and we hauled ass out of the cemetery and took a right out of the entrance which leads us further away from the main road towards the tracks. We were in shock and decided to skip going to the tracks and go home and pray. When we got home, I noticed the TV was on and the news was blaring. It was announced that an earthquake had just hit the San Antonio area. I guess that explains what happened at the cemetery. Even though I swear it was paranormal, I'm not even entirely sure what happened that night exactly, but I know it terrified me. But how do you explain the black eyes? How do you explain everything else? Maybe it was a paranormal earthquake, if that even makes sense. You know how I was talking about the ghost from earlier that I said I wouldn't mention? Well, I guess I should mention it now. A few minutes before we were heading up to the cemetery to see the statue, we saw this old guy out in the fields, just digging. As we drove by with our headlights on, we flashed towards the guy. He looked up at us and looked absolutely frightened. Either that or angry. It was hard to tell. But as he was looking up, his eyes were black. Not only that, but his eyes were so black that they were reflecting off of the car. I'm not even sure if that makes sense, but that's what we saw. We ended up driving past that area, and that's when we went into the cemetery. Now, you may dispute this and may be skeptical about what happened, but I'm telling you, honest to God, it really did happen. I know a lot of people say that, but I swear on my life that it did. Every time I pass by that cemetery, I can't help but think of what happened that night. I don't know if I'm ready to see that thing again once it decides to appear, but I'll tell you what, whenever someone tells me a ghost story, I'll listen and believe. We moved into a house that was about 100 years old and had not been lived in for about 20. The rumor around town was that it was haunted. I did not believe this, even though I had grown up with people that had spent nights in the house and said that they experienced it firsthand. So we moved into the house when my children were ages 5 and 8 years old. The first night in the house, I was very nervous. I could not go to sleep. When I did almost fall asleep, I heard a man's voice in my head. I know this sounds very strange, but it was like someone else's thought was in my head and it said a man's name. I can't remember the name, only that it started with a B. We finally settled in, the girls complained of doors locking them in rooms. We had gone out of town for the weekend. My youngest daughter got a virus. When we got home, she went to bed. About 5.30 a.m., I heard what I thought was one of my children calling out for me. When I checked in on them, they were sound asleep, not even stirring. I went from my youngest daughter's room into the hall to go to my room, and I saw what I thought were car lights reflecting in my window on the stair landing. But as I watched, the lights were bobbing up and down, independent of each other. They went down the steps turned at the landing and continued down the steps until they disappeared through a door. Another time, at about 5.30 a.m. again, I was awakened by someone touching my leg. I thought it was one of my children, but nobody was there. I also experienced the man's voice in my head one more time. Near Halloween of the same year, I was in the car with my children when my five-year-old complained that she always felt that someone was watching her when she was in bed. This scared me. It was time to get out. We bought a brand new house and moved out. When we had moved into the old house, I had two cats. They were so scared in the old house that they didn't come out from under the couch for a week. I thought this was a reaction from moving. When we moved into the new house, they were at home right away. I feel that they sensed something. After we moved out, my mother-in-law confided 
that she had an experience in the house while getting my children off to school. It was a foggy morning and not yet light out. She heard someone come in the house. She walked into the dining room and could see someone in what was called the parlor. She thought it was my mother who liked to get up early and walk every morning for exercise. When she spoke my mother's name, the presence went up the steps. She thought my mother had gone up to check on the children, but when she never came down, my mother-in-law went up looking for her and no one was there. She became concerned and called my mother to make sure she was alright. My mother confirmed her calling. She said she wondered why she called so early for no apparent reason. My husband also experienced hearing what he thought was the children calling out for him and they were asleep. For about six months after this, I had nightmares about the house. I hope I never experience this again. Some people think that we are crazy, but I believe that you believe that it is real. In 1972, my parents purchased a house and we moved in. I was five at that time. During the five years that we lived there, so many strange and terrible things happened. Right after moving in, we had a sense that we were not alone. Late at night, my sister and I would see a man standing over us while in our beds. I got accustomed to sleeping under the bed for years. We would lock our door and he would unlock it. We would put things away and he would take them back out. He was always taking things and placing them in the exact same spot a week later. We asked neighbors about the house shortly after moving in when we arrived home from shopping and it sounded like there was a party going on inside. When the door was opened, there was nothing just silence. That was when we started asking questions about the property. One neighbor, who lived next door for over 50 years, told us a heart-wrenching story. It seems that a family of four had lived in the house in the late 1960s to the early 1970s. Man, wife, and two sons. In 1969, one of the boys was crossing the street and was hit and killed by a speeding car. The other child was also killed in the same spot, same time, same way, one year to the date. The mother was so upset that a few days later, she hung herself in the living room. The father came home to find his wife, and he shot himself in the kitchen. This was two years before we purchased the house, and had been on the market since the tragedies. I cannot say as to whether the spirit was content with us or not. For instance, at the age of 8 and my sister 11, she got sick and was admitted into the hospital as dead on arrival. Thank God the doctors did not give up. They saved her life and gave her back to us. She was diagnosed with encephalitis, a deadly disease during that time and still is. She was in the bathroom when I found her that night, and in the mirror appeared a shadow of a man's head. We have since destroyed that mirror, but the shadow was never there before her sickness. Second instance, we moved and rented the house out to my aunt. One evening my uncle had went to retrieve some items he had in the garage. Two of the items were antique shotguns. We have never been able to find shells for these two guns and they're in shadow boxes now. As my uncle picked up one of the guns, the other slipped and went off. He was shot in the neck and shoulder and almost died from the injuries. Thing is, there was no proof either gun had been fired. Police could not find any powder residue anywhere, but they concluded that the shot came from that caliber of gun. Third instance, I moved back into the house in 1986 shortly after the birth of my son. After being there a week, it was extremely hot that summer. I had a feeling something was wrong with the baby. I went into the room and noticed that it was blue and ice cold. As I rushed him to the hospital, he was coming around. At the hospital, they said nothing was wrong with him, and he sent me home. I moved that night. 
I only go into the house if a renter moves out. Nobody ever lives there long. I still get locked into the rooms. I feel his presence all around me, and the hair stands up on my arms. We have never been able to get a minister to go in the house. We always get told that evil lurks there. There are many other instances, but these are the ones that really bother me the most. I'm 60 years old at the present time, but when I was in my early 20s, I married a very loving, handsome man, and we moved into our first home, which was a big red brick house in a small town. The house was separated into two halves, an upstairs and a downstairs. We lived in the bottom half. Soon after moving into the house, we gave birth to a beautiful daughter. Our life was fulfilled. Back then, I was still very much in love with my husband, and even today I am. And he was ever so proud of his little Joy Lynn, her daughter. Our life couldn't be better at this point. Until one day, during a hot summer, the family above us had to move due to work, and I was asked if I could clean and paint the upper half and try to find a new family to move in. I cleaned a little one day, and then decided to start again early morning when the sun wasn't beating through the windows. And so I did. I started at 5 a.m. and decided to take a break and do one of my own chores that needed tending to. I left the door open that led to the upper half of the home and began to wash some clothes. When I went out in the yard to hang them, I thought nothing about my very curious five-year-old daughter being alone in the house. I was only right outside the door. I went back in the house to make lunch for her before I began to clean again and called for her and got no answer. I began searching for her and she was nowhere to be found. After searching the streets, I called my husband home and then contacted the authorities. They found her daughter. She had explored through the door that was to the upper half of the house and climbed up into the attic and when they had found her, she was dead. I was in shock. I was only outside for a short time, and she had no marks on her body to show cause, and the medical people couldn't even explain what the cause of death was. This was the hardest thing I even had to endure. One night, while lying in bed, trying to reenact the day out of my head and figure out what could have happened, my husband made a strange noise and yelled, did you see her? I sat up and asked what he was seeing, and he swore my daughter had entered the room. I assured him no one was there, and that his mind was playing tricks on him because he missed her so much. That was one of my many long, tearful nights, and it happened several times a week, until exactly eight months to the day that our daughter died, when I was leaving to go to the mill. I found my husband's lifeless body lying on the basement stairs, that led to the outside, and in his hands, tightly clutched, was the doll my daughter lost the day before she died. The doctors say it was a heart attack, but at the young age of 30, I think he had too much strain on his heart over the loss of his daughter. I began to blame the house, and it took my only happiness from me. I moved out shortly after, but rumors have it that the families that lived there soon after swore to see a man and a little girl walking the house in search of each other. This is my true but sad story, and someday we will be together again. As for the house, it still stands, and every so often I drive to see if I can get a glimpse of my family it took from me. Sunday, September 16th. 2001, very early in the morning, around 6.45 a.m., I witnessed what I would speculate is my first ghost experience. Before I go and tell you what I saw, or what I think I saw, I think I should mention all the details from the night before. I live in Pennsylvania, and my fiancé lives on the border of New York and New Jersey. We were driving home from his house that night at about 12 midnight, which was about a two-hour drive from a funeral we had attended earlier that day 
for his grandmother. As we were driving home, we got to telling each other about different ghost stories and urban legends. At first I was scared, getting creeped out by each story. However, after about an hour and a half of stories, I started to relax and enjoyed listening to them. When we got to my house, we decided to look for ghost stories on the internet. We got into reading in-depth stories and looking at pictures. At about 4 a.m., I put them to bed in my guest room. I still live at home with my parents, and they're very uptight about him and I sleeping together. The guest room is filled with porcelain dolls, many put in the closet due to being too freaky looking for him at night. He went to bed with the light on, again being afraid of the dolls in the empty room. I went back to my room and stayed up for another two and a half hours, being afraid myself. I wasn't afraid of dolls, but instead my room. My house is about 12 years old. I've been living in this house ever since I was six. We moved in right after my sixth birthday in October. The area is new, and we were the first people to ever live there. The area before this was a dense forest, and it wasn't torn down until a year before the house was built. The area wasn't a graveyard, nor was it ever. When I was younger, I used to think the area was, so I went and did research directly where my house was located. As a child, I was sent to school in St. Anne's, a Catholic school in the area. I went to church either Saturday night or Sunday morning for years and years of my life. When I got to about fifth grade, I started to not believe in God. Around the same time, my parents were asking priests to come over and bless our house. I asked my parents nicely to keep the priests out of my room, not wanting it to be blessed. At first, my parents thought I was into the devil, but I explained that me not believing in God meant no devil either. When I reached ninth grade, I dropped Catholic school and my parents no longer started to attend church. I know I've been going off subject, but I guess I should give you the background information before the details. I didn't want to go to bed at all, but I knew I should. So I waited until the sun came up and crawled into bed. My room is the hottest room in the entire house. It is so small. By the time I had gone to bed, I had gotten so cold that I had to sleep fully dressed with a sweatshirt on. I never even did this in the winter. When I was under the covers, I looked up at the ceiling. Maybe it was my imagination, due to all the fright I've been going through, but it looked like something was above me. I started to doze off for a second and looked straight up at the ceiling. What I noticed was absolutely terrifying. I noticed a spider only had a human face. It was translucent, and it looked at me with piercing eyes. The eyes were even red. I closed my eyes yet again, and when I reopened them, everything seemed fine, and there was nothing on the ceiling. I've never in my life been this scared, and I've never in my life imagined things. Even when I was scared, I closed my eyes and refused to open them. I fell asleep, from what I recall, a few minutes after. Later the next day, at around 8 p.m., Derek and I had been talking about what happened the previous night. We were both hungry, so I decided to go downstairs and go find something for him and I to snack on. When I came back up, we started eating, and he casually drops the line. He told me that while that was happening, last night he saw a person in the distance while the door was open in the hallway. He said he knew it was a ghost because it was transparent, but not transparent enough to notice the spiders crawling all over this person. He noticed it for about 10 seconds and then it faded away. He was absolutely terrified, even though he seemed really nonchalant telling me the story. I could see it in his eyes. A split second later, he felt a cold draft enter the room, although there was no windows open at the moment. Before this, I never really believed in ghosts the way I do now. However, maybe we were both scared and imagined this. And one day though, 
Everything that was told in this email is true and exact. Nothing was exaggerated. I would really like some help and hope maybe someone could answer my questions. Please tell me if you think we are both seeing things or if maybe our willingness to believe has brought out a spirit. Whatever the case, it was horrifying and I do not want to experience the spider ever again. I'm an agnostic, or truth seeker. My wife is not, but both of us are open-minded people. We also believe that spirits exist, as well as ghosts, and my wife considers it creepy, while I simply remain fascinated with them. We moved into an apartment just after we were married, in 1999. I believe that there are ghosts and residual energies in various places in our apartment. The place is the standard apartment layout, and every once in a while, night or day, it doesn't matter what time, she and I, or both, would hear the sounds of footsteps on carpet going down a short hallway. These were not boots in the hardwood footsteps, but more like bare feet on plush carpet. We felt that the ghost was female and very sweet. She would just walk down the hallway towards the bedrooms. If I were in one of the bedrooms, I would always have a small feeling of happiness go through me after I heard her coming. The way you would feel if someone smiled at you. Occasionally, we would feel her watching us from the front room or back bedroom. Evidently, the hallway was where our domain was. There were never cold spots, but my wife would occasionally feel the lady next to her when she walked from the bedrooms to the front room. A lady made my wife feel rather creeped out. However, she startled me once when she came running into the bedroom, eyes wide, and told me that the lady moaned in her ear, as if trying to say something to her. So for the sake of my wife, we stood in the hallway and asked the lady nicely, but firmly, that she could remain, but to not make her presence known to us. We also informed her about the light and how she could enter into it. Since we had no more occurrences with her, in the small bedroom, there is either residual energy or a passive ghost. I feel watch when I'm in there, and it's usually 10 to 15 degrees cooler, even with the afternoon sun spilling in. I don't think my wife feels it, and no one else does either, but I felt it so strongly, so I placed a micro cassette recorder in there with a sensitive mic and recorded for the duration of the 30 minute tape. The only odd things I've heard on the tape were an occasional whistle that changes in octave. The second only lasts for a half a second, but it's an audible, breathy whistle that goes up an octave, like first part of a wolf whistle. That was interesting, and I'd dismiss it if it weren't for some of our possessions being misplaced that suddenly appear in odd places. Our truck key suddenly disappeared this morning without a trace anywhere. The truck was searched over twice, and the apartment was searched, so I made duplicates at Home Depot and gave them to my wife, who used them to drive to the doctor's appointment. When the appointment was over, we walked back out to the truck and opened the door with a duplicate key. There on the driver's side seat was the original set of keys that were missing. She would have felt them under her bunk if they had been there before. She called me at work in hysteria, telling me all about it. I don't mind ghosts being around. I consider them friends, or at least I try to make friends with them. They are, in fact, just spirits without bodies. Some are angry, some are nice, and even some are jokers. When you come across one, you should respect him or her just like you would a complete stranger. Make friends with it, or ask it to leave, if you wish. But don't disrespect ghosts because of childhood, Halloween stories. They are intelligent humans who are a bit confused about where they are. If you happen to have one around you, simply ask it to walk into the light where friends and loved ones await them. This experience is not that exciting to hear about. I do not wish to embellish it with creepy anecdotes or a mysterious plot. But nevertheless, this is how it went. 
I attended Hangrove Military Academy in Chanton, Virginia, a town that in itself is stuck in time. It is the home of racists, bigots, and sadists who have inherited land from their ancestors. It is not a place in which I would suggest visiting. Having said that, I used to make a trip with some of my classmates in a beer store, 57s, which was an hour-long walk through pasture and woods from the campus. We never left with the intent to be caught by school officials, one of which, Captain Stout, a double Medal of Honor veteran who is as sneaky and stealthy as anyone on the planet. The penalty of being caught was very high. We did not mention this experience to anyone who was not present. It surely would have spread. We were on our way back from 57s at about 1 o'clock in the morning. A little buzz from cheap beer with the intent to distribute alcohol to other students. When the three of us, mainly my roommate and best friend, stopped dead in our tracks for no reason. I'll remember the next sequence of events until the day I die. We heard the unmistakable war cries of rebel soldiers on the charge. It is a sound somewhat akin to imprisoned tribesmen intent on killing you. From atop a hill, directly in front of us, through the trees, came 30 to 40 purely solid figures charging, apparently unconcerned with us. We hit the forest floor and did not make a sound as we witnessed the battle, first 10 or 12 volleys of gunfire, and finally hand-to-hand -hand combat, and then retreat. It is pointless for me to explain every troop movement I witnessed. Just use your imagination, and you should understand. The whole incident lasted no longer than two to three minutes, but the cries of those men will haunt me forever. I live in the town of Anaconda, Montana and I used to work at the Copper Bowl. We all used to joke around about Wilbur, the previous owner who haunted the place. At first it was just little things that would happen. Casino machines would all of a sudden have credits on them when no one was there, which could be a mechanical malfunction. Things would move from one place to another, but nothing was as horrifying as what happened one Saturday morning. It was earlier in the morning and it was just the cook and I. He was telling me about the reflection of a woman he had seen a few nights before in one of the windows. But when the spot where she was supposed to be was investigated, no one was there. These kind of scarier stories were becoming more and more commonplace, and we knew that Wilbur wasn't alone. That morning, we had gone over to the bowling alley, which is next door. It was always dark in there until the owners came and always cold. In the dark, you could hear someone walking across the boards, which makes a very distinct sound. Now what I mean by walking across the boards is that someone is walking in the gutters or on the lanes themselves. You could hear the footsteps coming towards us, but there was no one there. You could also hear the jingling of keys. A little while later, we were alone in the restaurant and you could hear things next door getting louder. Not just footsteps this time, but other noises that we just couldn't explain. The cook had to go over to the bowling alley to get ice and was gone for what seemed like a very long time, so I went over to find him. As I walked through the door, there was a really intense feeling, one that I've only had a few times in my life, and it was the feeling of get the heck out of there, but I had to find my coworker. When I called his name the first time, I got no answer, so I walked up towards the bar. As I walked up the stairs, I heard what sounded like a gurgling noise that comes from deep inside the back of the throat, and I got the chills. I called his name again, and this time, he answered me, but it sounded very faint. Again, I called his name, and it seemed to be as loud as it should be, considering it was only four feet from me. A little while later, we went over there again to have our cigarettes, and I saw a black figure at the other end of the alley walk across. My coworker saw the panic in my face and turned around. He then turned to me and told me we had to get the hell out of there. I found out that Wilbur had died when he drowned on a fishing trip. Needless to say, I quit 
not long after that. My better half and I were looking for a larger apartment to rent. Because he works mornings, and I work afternoons, I ended up doing a lot of our house hunting alone. I went to look at around five different houses and apartments one day. They were all far too generic. Little boxes in apartment complexes. Until the last one. This last house was an old mill house, made into a duplex. It was huge. The ceilings were 15 feet. The rooms were massive. It was a great house, about nine years old, and also cool. My boyfriend came to look at it the next day, and also liked it, so we moved in. It was little things at first, an odd pounding on the wall that we attributed to our rambunctious neighbor, cold winds that we thought were just the usual drafts of an old house, but the cat, we couldn't explain the cat. Our kitty is a smart little beastie more so than the average feline. He wouldn't go upstairs without one of us. If he was asleep on the bed and he left the room, he would go streaking past you down the stairs. He would sit and stare at something in the corner. He would leap up from a nap and chase his tail like someone had pulled it. We didn't even really think about it. We figured the cat was weirded out by the move. Then more concrete odd things began to happen. I would see little figures out of the corner of my eye, quick shadows that were gone before I could turn my head, or I would hear laughter, but it would vanish just as quickly. Sometimes I would hear crying as I walked up the stairs, but these things were always short and soft enough that I would think it was a trick of my mind. My boyfriend and I were watching a movie one night when something happened that convinced me I wasn't insane or overly imaginative. My boyfriend, who does not believe at all and is incredibly pragmatic, suddenly stopped the movie. He asked me if I heard that. What? I replied. He looked at me and said, children screaming. I hadn't heard it. I could see how upset he was. And more odd things have happened since then. My boyfriend and I love kids. Especially me. It's a running joke that I'm a baby magnet. Kids love me. We have several friends who bring their young children over the visit or for me to babysit. So I have toys all over the house. Our kitchen and living room are connected by a doorway with no door so you can see straight through. I was making a tuna fish sandwich a couple of days ago and happened to glance into the living room. A small, brightly colored ball rolled across the floor. At first, I thought the cat must be playing with it, and then I realized the cat was sitting next to me, hoping to catch some floor-bound tuna. I was the only one home. My boyfriend swears that he saw a blonde-haired kid in our kitchen, hiding under the table. I was babysitting our friend's toddler that day, and he figured it was Mickey. So he snuck over, planning to lift up the tablecloth and play peekaboo. But when he lifted the tablecloth, no one was there. Mikey and I were two blocks away at the park. I know I've gone through all this setup, and nothing really freaky's happened, so here's the clincher. It happened this morning. That's why I'm writing this now. I woke up late. My boyfriend had gone to work, and I was planning to laser on the house and maybe do some yard work. I laid down on our couch and decided to watch a movie, and I apparently dozed off. I woke up because someone was crawling onto the couch. Seriously, to anyone who has kids or spends a lot of time with them, you know what this is like. You're napping and feel tiny hands on the couch. Then a little body crawls up and snuggles down next to you. This has happened so many times that at first it didn't even phase me. Then I realized that none of the munchkins I'd take care of were in the house. No one was in the house. And when I sat up, the weight was gone and no one was there. None of this scares me. I rented this house because I told my better half that it felt happy, like a home. The only thing I can come up with 
is that the children of whatever mill worker lived in this house are still around, and that's okay. I hope they like us in our home. I'd rather have happy little ghosts than not so nice other ones. I'm so glad this site is here and I can tell someone about these events. Our friends just laugh. Great work. I've had a few ghostly occurrences happen to me, but two really stand out. I call it Lady with the Long Black Hair. When I was a little girl, growing up in Somerville, Massachusetts, I was around three, I think. I will wake up every night because of a bad dream. I will then make my way to my parents' room to sleep for the remainder of the night. I would have to pass through the kitchen to get there. The lights were out, but there was some light coming in the windows from the street lights. I would see her sitting on the kitchen counter, up against the wall, by one of the windows, a lady with the long black hair, which is how I always referred to her. She was dressed in a long black dress, pale face but shadowy, with illuminated green eyes. She would just be sitting there and looking right at me. It always took my breath away. I was so afraid of her. I would inch my way towards my mother's room with my back against the wall, never taking my eyes off her. Her eyes followed my progress across the room. I always thought she's going to jump off the counter and get me, but that never happened. Years later, my mom told me she had strange things happen to her in that house too, but that's another story. In another story, my Nana came to visit me. Years later, living as an adult in Hampton, Virginia. One night, I was awakened by something. When I opened my eyes and looked around, I was startled to see my Nana sitting in bed with me. Nana had died six months earlier. It was kind of scary because she was gray and just slightly transparent. Also, she had a shocked look on her face, almost like she was the scared one. Then in my head, I heard her voice saying, shh, go back to sleep, which I did. The next day, I remembered it all quite clearly, and thinking on it, I feel like she had been surprised that I had woken up and was looking right at her. I don't think she bargained on that when she come to visit me. Hey, my name is Tyler, and this is the story of my sightings of the ghost in my uncle's house. I moved to Bend, Oregon to live and work with my uncle and I slept upstairs, where nothing happened at all, for the first three months. Then my dad and two brothers moved in also, so I had to move downstairs. Well, downstairs had like its own living room, a bathroom in the bedroom, with its door next to the stairs. Well, we used to hear two sets of footsteps upstairs, walking around, when there was no one up there. Sometimes, we would think it was my brother and his friends. But when my little brother went up to check the door, it was locked and they were still out. One night, my brother fell asleep on the couch and when he woke up, he heard a very loud scream like a woman being killed downstairs. When the scream happened, our cat ran up the stairs, hit the hardwood floors and ran right into the room, under the bed also, right up the stairs. Our fridge faced the window with the oven right in front of the fridge door. There was a magnet calendar on the freezer door, and one night, while watching television, me and my brother and my dad were scared when we heard a loud bang in the kitchen, and then the calendar was thrown hard down the stairs and hit the door downstairs. The thing about it is, is that there is no way that the calendar could have went downstairs at the angle it was. The thing that made me really believe in ghosts, though, was this one night. After my dad went to bed, I watched some TV, and it was summertime out, so it was hot, and I decided to sleep on the floor. When I was about to fall into sleep, I heard a light chuckle behind me, which I thought was my dad, but when I looked behind me, there was absolutely no one. I tried to go to sleep again, and the same thing happened, and I got a little angry. Well, again, 
I was about to fall asleep when I had the feeling that someone was looking at me. When I opened my eyes, there was a gray male figure about six feet long and a dark figure about five foot ten standing right next to me. And when I looked at them both, they both looked back at me. I got so scared that I closed my eyes and prayed that they would leave. And when I opened my eyes again, they were both walking. Again, I closed my eyes. And when I opened them again, they turned the corner and went up the stairs. I picked up my pillow and ran into my dad's room. He woke up right when I got into his room. And when he asked what happened, I told him in a very shaken voice that I saw a ghost. Right when that happened, we both heard two sets of footsteps right above our heads and the door opened and closed with a lot of force. After that night, I believed in ghosts and there's nothing in the future that will ever change my mind. Hi, my story happened a long time ago. I was 17 and it was the evening of the 1989 earthquake here in Northern California. I was staying at a family friend's house for the night. I had known them for several years and they'd always told ghost stories while we would camp. The husband's brother had just died when he was five years old. He got hit by a car. He said he thinks that his brother was still around. They still lived on the same property that he grew up on. Anyway, to get to the story, that evening, we all went to bed. They had a small house and had me sleep in the kids' room and the kids slept in the living room. Everyone was turned in for the night. All of a sudden, the lights started flickering. The dad yelled for the kids to stop messing around. It wasn't that. We all ended up getting out of bed. The lights continued to flicker and then turn off completely. We turned the light switches on and nothing. We looked outside and other people's homes were still lit up, so it wasn't a power outage. I just figured with the earthquake and all who knows, I wasn't scared at the time. We all went back to bed and giggled a little and made a few jokes about the ghost. I laid back down and before long, the lights started up again and then the drawers in the bathroom started opening and closing, slamming hard. At this point, I was scared. I ran into the master bedroom and told them I wasn't sleeping by myself. I thought I would sleep on the floor at the foot of the bed. We we're all a little scared. All of a sudden, the most horrible, inhuman sound came. Like I said, it was a small house. It sounded like the home had surround sound. It came from every corner of the house. This loud, guttural scream or moan. It was a long moment, and then it all stopped. I sat there and cried. I didn't sleep a wink that night. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I told them in the morning that I'll never be back to their home. I felt that whatever it was didn't like an outsider in the house. I look back at that night and wonder about it. I lost contact with the family. It has been close to 20 years now. At the time, it made me a firm believer in the paranormal. Now as I get older and am more skeptical, I can't help but wonder if it's some kind of joke. I don't see how. At the time, I don't even think there was such thing as a surround sound. And that is the only way that sound could have come from the house. It was as if the house itself was screaming. That is the only paranormal experience that I have ever had. Just thought I would share it. Thanks. My friend Helen and I had been in our local pub for most of the evening. We had been drinking cola all night but decided to walk down to another one close by as there was a band that we liked that was playing there. The town that we lived in is quiet and unassuming, so we thought nothing of walking through the cemetery that was on the way to the other pub. You're probably thinking, oh, here we go, another cemetery story. It was right in the middle of the two pubs, so it was the usual quick walk. It was around 9.30 p.m., on a Sunday night in October 1998, so it was pretty dark. We chatted and walked down the path and into the cemetery, 
not giving it a second thought. All of a sudden, Helen grabbed my arm and froze on the spot. What the heck is that? She gasped. Thinking she was trying to scare me, I just laughed and looked over to where she was pointing. I could feel her shaking as she held on to me. To help you picture the scene, the path runs directly through the middle of the cemetery with graves on both sides, the church to the left, and a row of cottages just the other side of the graves and a little hedge to the right. To my horror, there was something very large, tall and black, making its way along the small road which runs along the side of the cottages. We're only about 15 yards away, but there was absolute silence, no footsteps, breathing, or noise of any kind. The thing was sort of gliding along at a steady pace, as we couldn't see the bottom of it because of the graves in a small hedge. We couldn't see any legs or anything, but the way it moved looked like it was on a bike. We both stood, rooted to the spot, and watched it for around 30 seconds. It moved around the row of cottages and down a small alley that runs along the side of the library. The odd thing was, was that it was huge, much taller than the downstairs windows of the cottages, and it was a sort of square shape. It's very hard to describe, but it was definitely not a person. It made absolutely no noise, and moved very softly and smoothly. We were terrified. When it had gone, we just looked at each other and ran back to the pub, we told a couple of our friends, but they just laughed at us and said that we were seeing things. But we knew what we'd seen, and it really frightened us. We're not the kind of girls that scare easily and are very level-headed. On occasions, we still mention it. We even went along there in daylight to try and find a plausible explanation, even trying to work out how tall it must have been. But we never came up with anything. I've seen and heard ghosts for many years, ever since I was a small child. These are a series of ghost stories that you probably haven't heard. Forgive me, the formatting is a little different, and it's scattered, and the writing isn't very good, but I think you'll get the gist of it. This one occurred in Elong Road, Croydon, Surrey. That's England. My mother saw and heard a little boy walking up the road and singing. He then walked up a pile of sand and disappeared through a wall in a different city in Surrey. I saw two ghosts there next to the chalk pits. The first appeared and disappeared and was an old man in brown. The second was younger and he appeared and disappeared twice before my eyes. Two people walking towards me walked right through him and didn't see him at all. It was very eerie. My sister and I saw the apparition of a man in dark clothes and wearing a hat standing in our bedroom. The room was cold and eerie. We were both very frightened. Several months later, my sister saw a girl with a Scotty dog come in the front door and walk up the stairs. There was nobody there when she went to investigate. In this next small tale, this event occurred in Eversfield's old people's home. It's in Surrey. In the caretaker's house, and in the house next door, there were noises heard when nobody was around. Blood dripping through the ceiling onto mirrors, which could never be cleaned. They also heard the sounds of coat hangers being rattled about next door when nobody was in the house. Doors would open and shut violently. A bed moved away from the wall, silently, while the room was full of people. You could also hear the sounds of women's voices downstairs, of laughter and chatter. When you open the door to listen, it then goes silent. The lights swing violently as though there is a strong wind, but there is no wind to be seen or felt for that matter. At the Rygate Parish School, now converted into houses and flats, the sounds of children playing and talking can be heard. 
I don't mean the voices of the children while they're still in school. By the time they leave, after hours, you could hear the voices of children still ringing. People have also reported piano playing as well, as well as a tambourine. When they go to open the door, the playing stops, but the piano is reverberating. On the road of Wallfield Annex, or I get thrown, there is an extremely haunted house now, also converted to flats. The ghost of a man in period costume stands at the window on a full moon. I've had the privilege of staying the night at these flats before, and let me tell you, the ghost is a real thing. He's aware that you are watching him, and each night he gets closer to your bed. One night, he was peering into my face and he winked at me before disappearing. Apparently, the house was owned by artists who liked to paint by the light of the moon, which may explain the haunting. There were times where my daughter had certain experiences as well. My daughter told me that she had a friend, a child, who visited her at night and stood at the end of the bed. Obviously, she's referring to a ghost. This house is a Gregorian mansion, and you can feel its history. It's a very spiritual house. I often dream of this house. Perhaps my spirit is there, even in life. Anyway, that's all my stories that I have to share. I work really early in the morning, so by the time I get off work and head home, I'm really tired. I was sneaking in a nap before my husband came home. I've seen some unexplained things when I was younger, but I've never had this happen to me. This was in my parents' basement because at that time, my husband and I were building a home. When I think about it, the dogs never came down in the room. They hated it down there. Anyways, like I said, I was taking a nap. I remember waking up in complete horror. I was being attacked. By this I mean, this shadow figure was trying to get at me while I was asleep. It started at the foot of my bed, and I was kicking my feet at it to get away from me. It then moved up right next to me. I could feel it trying to touch me, and that horrified me. Something about this thing was not right. I was still kicking my legs at it. I remember thinking in my head, no, no. I then sat up straight in bed and looked around. Nothing was there. My heart was pounding and I was sweating. I didn't know what to think. I still don't. I wasn't fully awake during this fight to keep the shadow away from me. I guess I could have been dreaming. But it felt so real. Living with a ghost is not all that bad, as my family and I have found out. We moved to our home in the Skyland Estates in 1991. At the time, we had our three and one year old boys living at home. We started to get clues that something unruly was living with us. When my wife and I started to hear a three-year-old talking to someone in his bedroom, he told us that it was an older lady that came to talk to him. He stayed in that room for three years until he moved him to another room and put his younger brother in that room. The same thing started happening with the other brother. We have two younger kids who also stayed in that room once and they all reported that an old lady had visited them. Oftentimes, the lady would speak to them. The kids would call her Miss G. Miss G would also make herself known to my wife and I. She was very active any time we made improvements to our home. She would come and watch us, often from the closet, as we would consistently hear and see the closet door open. One time, my wife even swore that she saw a floating face there 
as she was cleaning. When we were working on the house, we would also feel as though a hand was placed in our bodies. At this moment, we'd also feel a draft of cold come in. When I was working alone, I'd feel the hand again, thinking that this time it was my wife. I would stop to say something, look over my shoulder, and there would be nobody there. This happens to my wife too. She would think I was touching her as well. I saw Miss G once in 1993. I was sitting in the living room late at night. I remember I had the doors leading to the living room closed. A short moment later, I heard what I thought was the sound of my wife walking behind the door. I turned to look back and saw the silhouette of a figure walk by. I immediately went to open the door and look for my wife. When I saw a figure move quickly from the hallway into the kitchen, then turned the corner. It happened so fast and it spooked me. That's when my wife walked through the front door. She had been shopping. That's when I suddenly realized that this was the presence of Ms. G that was making herself known to me. Even though it spooked me, I don't think she meant any harm by it. As if to say sorry, I'm just passing through here. My wife has had many interactions with her in the kitchen while cooking. She would set the table and ask her to move a plate. The plate would move slightly forward on its own, not a big movement, but enough to let her know she was there. After these encounters, we did some research about who our ghostly ghost truly really was. We found out that an older lady had the house built as her dream home to retire in. Unfortunately, she passed away only a day after she moved in. There was another homeowner who bought the house before us. They only lived there for a month before moving out to live with their kids. I really don't think Miss G is a threat to us, but I believe when we do eventually move from this house, we will miss her presence even if it's a bit scary at times. My name is Stacy, and I reside in Brownsville, Texas, approximately two minutes from the International Bridge into Mexico. What I'm about to tell you is something that happened to me when I was in the third grade, and I haven't been able to forget since then. I'm now 25. I remember very distinctly that it was Halloween night, and my brother, father, and I had just returned from a night of trick-or-treating. It was almost midnight when my parents sent us to bed, worried we wouldn't wake up in time for school the next day. At this time, being so young and so close to the border, I shared a room with my nanny. We slept on two twin beds. Mine was situated right under a window to my left, and my feet pointed towards an adjoining room we called the laundry room that also doubled as a closet. There was a window in there as well, which illuminated to little room with light from the moon in conjunction with the street lamps. At this time, our house didn't have central air, so we slept with the windows open and a floor oscillating fan. I'd been asleep for a while, and I woke up because I felt hot and looked at the fan as the blades had a tendency to jam. As I had suspected, the fan wasn't working, and I stared at the ceiling, contemplating going to the kitchen for a glass of water. While doing so, I happened to glance into the closet, and standing in front of the washer was the figure of a man dressed all in black and wearing some type of hat, a fedora maybe. Also, his face was not visible to me at all, and all I could see was the black underneath his hat. He was chuckling, but at the same time, I thought it was the most horrifying noise in the world. He started to talk, very casually, about how he was going to get me and my family. I snapped, 
And finally I realized that this wasn't supposed to be happening. He wasn't supposed to be there. Where was his face? I jumped up from the bed and sprinted to the door, hoping at the same time, not wanting anything to be able to reach out and grab me. I could still hear him laughing, and I felt him getting closer. By the way, when he said all those things to me, it was like a telepathic thing. I don't know if you understand that, but that's the best way I can describe it. I then noticed a faint banging that kept getting louder as I got closer to the door. I then realized it was my brother banging on his wall. That was when I realized that I was screaming at the top of my lungs. I reached the door and no matter how hard I pulled on it, it wouldn't open. I also tried turning on the lights. I had a dimmer and I kept turning the knob but it wouldn't turn on. Suddenly, my nanny woke up and yelled at me to stop screaming and asking me what was wrong. Was I crazy? Then, just as suddenly as it had began, the laughing and the whispering and everything else stopped. The door opened and the light turned on. My parents had no idea what was going on because their room was at the other side of the house. My nanny still tells me that I was white as a ghost, and as soon as she touched me, I fainted. Needless to say, I was not able to go to school the next day. When I was about seven years old, I can remember this very strange house in West Virginia I used to live in. First, it started with my brothers and sisters and I. We all had one bedroom upstairs we slept in, and one night, waking up, I saw a strange figure of a little child by our bed. I recall turning the opposite way and holding on to my older sister. Being that age, I never thought nothing of it until about eight years later my family and I moved out, and we were talking about how nice it was to live there, and my mother and father were telling us if we only knew the strange things that they had seen and heard. My father said he woke up one night seeing a little child and thinking it was one of us, and he said go back to bed. The figure never moved, so we sat up from the bed realizing it was a shadow figure and not one of us. And when we went to wake my mother up, it was gone. And other times, he or my mother would get up in the middle of the night and see that figure all the time, thinking it was okay, nothing bad was really happening. A few months after that, he heard loud noises, like a baby crying. He said it sounded like it was coming from the wall. My father would really have loved to know about the spirits, but my mother really wanted to move. It's funny when you are little, you really don't know what's going on. When I was little, I used to play outside a lot. In my country, the weather is really, really hot. So hot that if you stay under the sun for five minutes and then go back inside, your head hurts and you will see lights everywhere, for a while anyway. I always used to see figures that those lights would make, but I wasn't scared at all because I knew that the sun was making them. One day, I was outside playing with my brother, but it wasn't as hot to make your head hurt or see figures and lights. I saw a shape of a black dog walking or going somewhere, and then it disappeared. Well, the dog wasn't walking, he was just going somewhere. The figure was not perfectly clear to say that it was definitely a dog, but it really looked like one, and once I saw it, I didn't say anything because I was used to seeing things because of the strong sun. But as soon as I saw it, it disappeared. My brother said, hey, did you see that figure of that black dog that went by and disappeared? I was shocked because I thought I was the only one that saw that thing. It was crazy. So that was a very strange experience. 
We both asked each other what the heck that was. We were very confused. I'm sure that the figure we saw was a ghost. When I was a small child, around 7 or 8 in the late 1950s, my parents took our family consisting of my sister and two families of cousins, and all their parents, plus one grandmother, to the UP in Michigan. The reason being for this was, there weren't enough bedrooms downstairs in the rented cabin, circa 1920s. That's where all the adults slept, and all of us kids were put in the sleeping bags up in the loft. Not too much time after going to bed, I felt a heavy presence, and looked around to see if any of the cousins were feeling this, whatever it was. Alas, they were all sleeping soundly, except for me. After a while, I became very afraid, and a man's face appeared right above my sleeping bag, glowing like it was daytime. It was well after midnight. I remember seeing this face for a moment or two, before the face vanished entirely. I was so scared, I screamed in terror to leave me alone, waking up my family in the process. They asked me what the matter was and I told them that I saw a face. They both tried to confront whatever it was, and told me that it was just my imagination, and that there was nobody there to scare me. All night long, I laid there frozen in my sleeping bag, unable to move. Years later, I returned to the same cabin. I was 18 years old now, and I was with a couple of friends. At this point, I'd become so fascinated with ghosts and the paranormal that I wanted to do some spirit sessions in the process. We ended up using a Ouija board to contact the spirits that I thought appeared to me years before as a kid. So, me and my friends began the Ouija board session. We began to ask it all sorts of questions and requested it do things for us. Things such as turning the lights on and off knocking on the walls of the cabin, anything to get that extra confirmation. It wasn't until my friend James told me that he was getting bored of this because we weren't getting any answers and the Ouija board wasn't even moving the planchet. It almost seemed as if the spirit had completely left until late that night when we went to bed. There was a rocking chair in the cabin that had been left there for years. What my friend James saw next swears it was true. I'd fallen asleep, and James had woken up to take a smoke break out on the front porch. The rocking chair was on the front porch. As James was smoking, he suddenly turns to face the rocking chair, and the chair literally rocked back and forth, as if someone was sitting there. This wouldn't stop for about 30 seconds, then it suddenly stopped. He called me over, and by the time I had a chance to witness it, the chair stopped. This was in the middle of the summer, and there was absolutely no wind. I believed James, because he had no reason to make up any stories about the rocking chair. I mean, to be honest, it wasn't like it was the most unbelievable thing that could happen to someone. Definitely creepy considering what we were asking for hours before. I don't exactly remember when in our friendship James said this, but we made an agreement that one day, that if either of us passes on before the other, we would give each other another sign to yet again prove that ghosts in the afterlife is a real thing. Fast forward another 12 years, James unfortunately died in a car accident the year before, it was so devastating because he had just gotten married a month prior and had a baby on the way. I was very close to his family and we remained good buddies throughout his life. Horribly enough, I had a dream that I was in the same cabin and was again playing the Ouija board with James. I then remember the Ouija board suddenly disappearing, then we were sitting on the couch together drinking beers, and just hanging out. James looked at me and said, if you only knew. 
I asked what he meant. He then remarked, I wish I wasn't dead. I miss you guys so much. The dream ends, and I wake up with tears in my eyes. I've never had a dream about him after that. You may say that this was just my imaginative mind making up a dream of us together because I was mourning. However, I took it as a sign that maybe James was telling me he was still around. This was the only sign I had gotten from him, as in the waking world, I've never had any. I've also been back to that same cabin for many years after it, and I never saw the rocking chair move or that face ever again. Weird. I will start by telling a story that happened to me when I was about 13. It was very early in the morning, dark as a matter of fact. I was half asleep on the couch in my living room, just about to wake up. In the hallway from the kitchen, I heard a growl, then a scratching sound. This scratching turned into a tapping, like how a dog runs on a hard floor. This sound seemed to rush from the hallway closer to me, when all of a sudden, I feel something hit me as I try to wake up. What happened next can be explained as sleep paralysis, but instead of just the feeling of being pushed down, I felt as if my chest was being torn open and my sides were ripped apart. The growling was still present, along with my whimpered voice trying to let out a scream. After I tried to put up a fight with whatever it was, a hallucination or some other being, I jumped back awake with tears dripping. My chest felt that pain for that entire day. The reason why I told this story, even though I'm not sure if it was a hallucination or not, is that it closely relates to another experience that happened not too long ago, almost a week actually. I was again half asleep in my bed, the same room where I've mentioned seeing a ghost lady at the foot of my bed and another experience I've emailed, where I was practically having a nightmare. It was a strange nightmare where there were faceless beings surrounding me, ripping my body apart. It's a dream, so it's very hard to explain in words. Well, usually in nightmares, you widely awaken in fear before you go back to sleep. The most disturbing thing about this is, after I became widely awake, these same apparitions were still in my room, surrounding me, muttering and growling. I then closed my eyes, fell back on my pillow, and I let out a cry. I woke my mom up. She rushed in to see what was wrong, and she saw me laying there with my eyes wide open on my pale face. I felt sick for a week since that day. I thought hard about this occurrence when I realized that the sounds and feelings I've sensed from the first story were present in what happened in the second one. It's a rough connection, but I felt the very same emotions and I feel like there must be a connection. They both happened in my waking stage of sleep. The spirits, as I think they are, rush and attack towards the inside of the chest and are disturbingly similar. In any case, it's something I really want to look into. I've had plenty of people spend the night here, in the living room mostly, and hear strange noises coming from that branch of the house. My room, the hallway and the kitchen are all in the same branch of the house, which is the newer addition to the old schoolhouse building. Some of my friends who have been here late at night have felt a strange presence from that hallway too. I know I felt it as a child. I remember trying to avoid that hallway for my life. I remember when I was a little girl. My grandparents own a colonial farmhouse that had been standing for at least 150 years. My grandmother thought the house may have been used for the Underground Railroad because it had a few little doors and rooms off some of the closets in the bedrooms and in the basement. I wasn't allowed to go into them because they didn't have electricity 
and my grandmother was afraid that I would hurt myself. Members of my family said that I wouldn't want to go in them anyway, because there were ghosts in there. Of course, I didn't believe them. I thought they were just telling me this to scare me, as any seven-year-old would. But that was all going to change one night, when I spent the night there one night. I was staying in their guest room which had one of those little rooms off the closet. The little room was probably for extra storage, or maybe a staircase, because the back was all boarded up. And late that night, I woke up because I thought I was being watched. I looked up and noticed that the closet door was open and a small figure was standing there, glowing bluish. I screamed and ran into my grandmother's room and wouldn't go back into that room. I never saw that figure again, but I did see another ghost of an elderly farmer on the property. I was nine this time, and playing in the barn. I was upstairs in the hayloft, burrowing around in the hay, again, like I wasn't supposed to be. Again, I had that same feeling of being watched. I sat up and looked around, and in the corner, an elderly farmer was standing and watching me. At first I thought it was my grandfather, but then I realized that his feet weren't touching the floor. As soon as I noticed this, I screamed and ran out of the barn. There have been many sightings of him since then, including one of my brothers seeing him floating outside of a second story window. This is an experience I've had repeatedly over the course of several years when I'm in bed for the night, just falling asleep. Still, to this day, it tries to return, but I've found ways to avoid it or fight it because it scares the heck out of me. It's almost as if it were a dream, but I'm not actually asleep when it happens. I feel as if it is when I'm on the verge of sleep but still almost awake, like just before your mind actually lets go and sleeps. There's a place in between, and it only lasts a second, but that's when this thing happens to me. I can only speak for myself. I don't know of anyone else who has experienced this, but I've heard stories. Also, whenever I remember this, it is always in slow motion. I feel as if it is something coming at me, from behind always, always towards my back. It's like a shadow, and it tries to suck me deeper into sleep, and if I don't fight it with all my might, I truly believe I'll never wake up again. While this is happening, I'm frozen and cannot move, yet I'm aware of my room. I'm aware of things around me and what is happening. I can even hear my TV. I can scream in my mind and barely hear it all come out of my own mouth. It takes all my might and effort to open my eyes. But once I get my eyes open, I can focus on things in my room, like my dresser or door, anything, and come out of it. But it is so strong, I sometimes feel I cannot make it, and that is why I believe I will never wake up. The entire time this is happening, I'm frozen to my bed and cannot move. Please note, it's hard to explain. It doesn't feel as if it is pulling my body. It is pulling me deeper into sleep. One time, it was pulling me so strongly that when I did get my eyes open, I actually could see my room, but it was as if looking through water or fog. It still had me even though I was opening up my eyes. This is a true experience. Believe this, I'm not joking. I would not type this much otherwise. If I were to compare it to anything, I would say it resembles the dark figures or shadows in the movie Ghost with Whoopi Goldberg that come and take someone away right after they have died. Please note, I cannot physically see whatever this is. I'm saying that this is my guess of what it would look like. To this day, I still cannot sleep without the TV. This has happened to me repeatedly, countless times within a span of several years. 
When this began, I lived in an apartment near the Piedmont Hills in the Bay Area, California. I was always uncomfortable and felt as if I was being watched there. I started sleeping in the front room with the TV on because I started having really evil dreams and was so scared to be alone at this point. I would desperately beg my boyfriend to please stay home with me, but he couldn't take any more time off because he wasn't able to use any more sick days. Sometimes I'm just too scared to be there alone, especially at night. I never used to be that way, and I'm not faint of heart. I'm actually 4'11 and 90 pounds soaking wet, but I forget I'm not 10 feet tall and bulletproof sometimes. Still, when this began, I became scared. Whatever it is that followed me when I moved, and to this day I still feel it, although it has been a while since I have struggled with it, when I go to sleep, I must have my boyfriend hold me with my back at his chest, spoon fashion, and this works, and when he rolls over, I can make sure my back is touching his, and I feel comfortable this way. As long as my back or behind me isn't opened or exposed, for some reason, it isn't as bad as when I feel my back is protected and I'm not as vulnerable when I'm facing it. I know this all sounds strange, but it is true. I work in a nursing home, third shift. For the last year, I've been transferred to the first floor. I, among others, have seen some pretty weird stuff. It starts like this. About six months ago, I started seeing off the wall things while well, all of us were at the nursing station. There are only four employees on third shift first floor. People coming out of the dining room, not in wheelchairs, but walking upright and pretty darn fast. A person down one hall walking out of one room and into the next on the same side of the hall. Both rooms have non-ambulatory residents. Water turning on in one's room's bathroom. One resident that passed away about four months ago can still be heard laughing. I've never heard this personally, but others have. An entity that always runs in the same direction at lightning speed with arms flailing. I'm talking 28 days later style. Only two of us have seen this. I see it sometimes up to five times a night, but only when I'm down one certain hall. I call it the track runner. These are some of the real common things that happen. Now, for the ghost stories. About three months ago, I had a resident that is mentally with it ask me to get that man out of her room. It literally gave me goosebumps. When I asked her where he was, she sat there by the mirror. Needless to say, I saw no one. So later on, I asked a coworker if she had seen anything that was different or odd. She told me to stop and went pale. About 10 minutes later, she came to me again and started talking, mainly about the things I posted above. We ended up at the nursing station in a pretty good discussion, and all of us had pretty much the same story. Fast forward to Thursday, October 14th to 15th third shift. The same resident that had asked me a few months ago to remove the man by the mirror from her room rings me her call bell. I go down and ask what I can do. She tells me to get him out of here. I ask who, the person by the dresser, she replies. Now I'm thinking too cool. I step out in the hall and get another coworker and have her wait outside the door out of sight. As I return to the room, she's now asking me, why is my husband with that stranger? My husband is dead, and I don't know that other person. I ask her where they are, and she tells me, don't act that way with me. I'm not crazy. I know what I see. Then proceeds to get verbally abusive with me. The other coworker comes in at this point after hearing what went on and the resident goes through the same routine about her husband and the stranger with him. So we get the change nurse, same routine. Three, 
About an hour later, another resident rings her call bell. At this point, two of us go down together, different hall. This resident is bugging us to get her out of bed. Her words, I don't want to be in bed with them. He's not my husband, and I don't know him. She was definitely shook up, so we transferred her to her chair and brought her out to the nursing station with us. While we were getting her some coffee and graham crackers, another bell rings. Again, different hall. The charge nurse got that one. She comes back out and stated that the residents that the man by her TV told her she wasn't going to be here much longer and she insisted that he was still there, although the charge nurse couldn't see him, even after turning the lights on. Number 5. The first lady that saw her husband and stranger rings again. So three of us went down and left one aide to watch the halls answer and answer call lights. This time, two of us stay in the hall, and only the charge nurse went in. The residents started talking about possession and demons, very detailed and very scary, to say the least. I figured with all the weird stuff happening at work and all, I would share what I've been experiencing with my coworkers as of late. I've had other uncanny things in my life at other places, but nothing with this much activity. There's so many other people that either agree with me or describe what I seen to me first without me asking. I have a confession to make. I'm not an ordinary person. I don't mean that I've exhibited quirky behavior in the past and I'm simply unorthodox, but I have this uncanny ability to sense things. Whether these energies that I've learned to embrace are malevolent or benevolent, I can't say, as I'm unable to clearly make the distinction. But I tend to attract unusual energies, which permeate all around me. If you happen to come in close contact with me, you may be susceptible to these energies as well. I could say that there's a supernatural component to this. But because my mind has relentlessly wreaked havoc on me, I can't say for certain what is going on. Sometimes I see things, shadows, hearing strange noises, knocks on the walls, a faint whisper in my ear, reinforcing the idea that something otherworldly resides inside these walls. All the while, while I'm sitting in the kitchen of my old Victorian home, and I'm the only one who lives here. I can honestly say that I don't know what is happening, but I have nowhere else to turn to. There's the cellar that I'm terrified to go into. I've literally haven't stepped foot down there since I moved in, but it's like I can telepathically hear the growls and moans coming from that dark space that I refuse to enter. I've always wanted to know if the source of all these energies came from that cellar. The thing is, I have no pets, no estranged relationships, nobody ever sits foot in my home. I had a wife once, but she's been gone for what seems like a millennium. I don't remember what it's like to interact with anybody. I'm virtually imprisoned. I work from home. So, I became a recluse. I don't go out much these days, for fear of inadvertently transferring these energies to those who come in contact with me. Isolation is unconscionable. The fear of going insane inside my mind constantly lingers in the foreground. The helplessness of not being able to do anything about it still traps me internally. I'm mentally paralyzed. And then I have these unusual nightmares. My doctor tells me they are night terrors. So I'm laying in my bed, and the shadow opens the door. It doesn't do anything, but simply stands in the doorframe. 
I don't know what it wants, but I can only make out its eyes, glowing brighter than the sun. The rest the outline, a silhouette. I sweat, my body temperature drops, and I feel a cold breath on the right side of my shoulder. I look over, temporarily taking my eyes off the shadow figure. And yet there's nothing there, but a mist that looks as if someone is breathing in the cold air. I look back at the doorframe, and the shadow is gone. I then lay down, staring at the ceiling. I simply just can't ignore what's going on. I want to, but even the pills don't do enough. I still see these things hear these things, and most importantly, feel these things. I'm so scared. I don't want to be a prisoner anymore. I want a release. I want it all to end. I'm sick and tired of the suffering. My mind just won't heal. I don't want to feel. It's almost better if I don't. But I can't turn it off. Still, these images persist. In another moment, I can clearly see this elderly woman silently screaming at me. I can feel the terrible darkness emitting from her. And when she opens her mouth, there is nothing but darkness. Almost as if it is a black hole. No sound just a mouth opening. The woman with her old tattered clothing, not from this time period, definitely not present, Victorian times, with a black dress from that era, long black hair, matted and uncombed. This being was just standing there. I ask it what it wants from me, but I remain silently screaming for a few seconds. I blink my eyes as hard as anybody could. The figure simply won't disappear. I see a single cockroach move out of her mouth. I had to have dreamt this. This night terror felt so real. It consumes me. I can't get it out of my head. I go back and forth thinking this has got to just be a hallucination, but the more I think about these events, the way they truly never disappear, it makes me believe there is an entity in this house that I can't ignore. They are communicating to me through my dreams, and through some of my hallucinations that I've had as well. The therapists, the doctors, they all tell me that I've got some psychosis. Trauma from my youth remains unsolved. But these walls inside this old home has so much history engraved into it. Tell me that spirits don't exist, and I can't prove it to you. I can only tell you about my experiences and how sensitive I am to the other side. That. I think to myself, why are we so arrogant about this other side? Why do we dismiss what we do not understand? Maybe I'm just crazy. Or maybe the world wants to shield us from the fact that these beings live among us. If you truly open up your eyes and begin to understand that there is nothing that the world can't see, and you can believe. Several years ago, I was planning on moving from the USA to Australia to be with my partner, Craig. My partner and I would talk for hours on the web. What else can you do when you're 9,000 miles apart? My daughter, Catherine, who was seven at the time, would often get in on it too. Her and Greg developed a very loving father-daughter relationship even though he is her stepdad. One day, 
no different than any other. Greg and I were chatting. He wanted to talk to Catherine. I yelled for her. She was in another room, and I couldn't see the monitor. She came running and stopped dead inside the doorway. She could not see the monitor and started wigging out, demanding that Greg shut his bedroom door, which was clearly visible behind him. She wouldn't move from where she was. We tried to coax her, but she wasn't having any of it. Greg got up and closed the bedroom door. Catherine ran into my lap and buried her face into my shoulder, away from the monitor. She wouldn't even look at the monitor. I asked her what was wrong, and she said, he's mean, and I don't want to see him. Completely caught off guard, I asked her who was mean. She answered, the mean guy in the doorway. I asked her to describe him. She said he was tall, had red hair, blue eyes, and wore a dressy shirt. Deeper voice than Greg's. Oh, and by the way, Greg's voice is already pretty deep enough as it is. I tried to get more information out of her. That was all she had, or what she wanted to tell me anyway. I relayed what she had told me to Greg, and he just didn't get it. Catherine left my lap as fast as she had flown into it, yelled goodbye Greg from the other room. I wondered if she had seen something. I had episodes like that when I was her age, and they've continued. I asked Greg if she had described anyone he might know. He looked shocked for a second, and then asked me to wait. He went into the bedroom and came out a few minutes later with a pick in his hand. He looked at me, held up the pick, and said, wonder if this is who she saw. I asked who it was, and he said it was his grandfather Bill, who passed away in 92. It was 2007. Now get this. The pick was exactly the description Catherine had given. He was tall, red-haired, blue-eyed, had a dressy shirt in the pick. I asked Craig how he talked, and he said that Bill was old school Aussie. His voice was deeper than most, and with the accent, it was even harder for Greg to understand him. I excused myself, and went and told Catherine who we thought it was. As soon as I said the name Bill, she smiled. She said, I thought that was his name. That was the only thing I could almost understand. She seemed more at ease after learning it was his name. Greg, on the other hand, didn't know what to make of it. Apparently, her and Bill made peace and became friends. When I was leaving for Australia, she told me that she didn't need Bill anymore and wanted him to come over and watch over me and Greg till she got there. Gotta love kids. Fast forward a few years, since my arrival here in Oz, I've heard a man's voice. Sometimes I can understand him, other times it's too deep and garbled for me to get. I ask him to repeat slower, and it gets him a little pissy. He has never told me his name, but I know it is Bill. I have that feeling, but lately, over the last year or so, I've been hearing a lot more voices. It's like being in a crowd where everyone is talking at once. I ask someone to step forward and talk only to me, but it just stays garbled. This is a weekly thing. It has gotten to the point where, when it starts, I simply say, if you're all going to talk to me at once, then I won't be able to understand any of it. What I was wondering as if anyone else has ever heard this, and if so, what did they do? Might this be more family members who saw that Bill was able to talk to us and want to try themselves? Or might it be something bad? Sometimes, not very often, I get a bad feeling when they start talking. 
Bill is still with me. I asked him, but he's given me nothing. I lived in Chicago up until I was 18 and had graduated high school. My grandfather lived in the house, and we lived on the first floor in the third flat apartment building we owned next door. We had the basement that was connected to the first floor apartment as well. The basement had three main rooms. The front room that led outside held a half bath, a washer, dryer, and two storage closets. This is where we kept our bikes and skates and stuff. The center room had four storage closets, the water heater, and the furnace. This was the room that held all my dad's and grandpa's tools. The back room that led to our upstairs apartment was where we had the deep freezer, old clothes, camping gears, old toys, etc. The center room was awful. Just looking at it, you felt like you were being stared down. Something was sending very angry energy out from that room. If you were in that room, it was just overwhelming and overpowering. It felt as if something was going to grab you and actually hurt you. None of us were hurt, but it always felt like it could happen at any time. My sister believed it to be female. I believed it to be male. This makes me think that it could have been a demon and was just appearing female to her and male to me. The stairs from the basement led to my brother's room. The stairs and the door were extremely creepy. We always kept it locked and bolted, but that didn't do much. It always seemed like someone was going to come bursting through the doors at any time. In the bedroom I shared with my sister, we have both seen strange things. I've seen a man a few times. He would start at the head of my bed, which happened to be by the door to the bedroom, and walk towards my closet. My closet and my parents' closet shared a wall. From there, he would kind of nod his head and then disappear. I could tell he was wearing overalls work boots and had gloves in his back pocket. He was tall, about six feet, dark hair, dark eyes. I could see all of this, but I could also see the other side of my room through him. He was kind of a misty gray color. I saw him first when I was five, then again when I was eight, and the last time when I was fourteen. When I was twelve, I felt a pulling on my blanket. At this time, we didn't have any pets that would roam loose, and there was no way for them to get out or even reach my blanket. I feel my blanket being pulled. I kind of grumble and try to pull it back up, but I can't. So I look at the foot of my bed, and there was a boy sitting there, grinning at me, gripping my blanket. I tell him, you let go. I'm not scared of you. Go away. And he disappears. I pull my blanket back up and go to sleep. Then we just had weird things happen. Bread would slide across the counter. Things would be moved from one end of the bar to the other. Things would go missing for a few days. These types of things not only happen in our apartment, but in the upper two levels that we rented out. I was in Arizona a few years back. I was at the Snorn Desert Museum outside of Tucson. It is more like a zoo than a museum. It was summer, very few people there, and a pretty warm morning. I was in the very back of the property all by myself, taking photos of the native cactus. I was completely alone and enjoying the beautiful outdoors. I suddenly felt a terrible sense of dread behind me. I turned and looked, and there was an elderly Native American man standing there. He was dressed in all black, long sleeved black shirt in the middle of the summer, 
His hair was snow white, and his face was wrinkled. When we made eye contact, I felt like someone tweaked my soul. I started to walk fast. I wanted to get back to the front of the zoo and be where people were. I was really moving, and every time I looked back, the man was about six feet behind me. He never seemed to increase his pace, but kept up with me no matter how fast I walked. He casually started straight ahead and kept walking. I made it up to the front and walked into the gift shop. He stayed with me the whole time. I decided to get the heck out of there. I hurried to the parking lot. All I wanted was to get into the car and get away. He was still behind me. When I reached my car, a coyote was standing by the trunk. I made eye contact with that animal. I can't describe it. It sounds nuts. But that coyote gestured towards the exit with his head. Of course, he didn't speak to me, nor did I hear a voice. But I just knew that the coyote would watch over me while I drove away. As I was about to get into the car, I turned back to look, and the coyote and the man were gone. I never went back. Every time I think of this, I feel as if I escaped something terrible. It's so strange, but it's like the coyote knew me, and I knew him. Thoughts, anyone? I don't take drugs. Wasn't drinking or overheated. I swear this happened. I know it sounds unbelievable, but it did. This happened in the summer, and at the time, my horse was living on an old farm not far from the sea. The farm was from 1925, with the original stables and barn. Anyway, on this day, it was only me and my horse there, and I had him standing outside while I was tacking up since the weather was nice. Where he stood, he had the back entrance to the stables on the right side, and straight in front was the door to the barn. You had to go through the barn to get out. Everything was fine at first. Then, I got this feeling like I was being watched from inside the stable. I looked inside, thinking that maybe one of the other girls who had their horses there had come. But it was empty. I shrugged it off and continued grooming. Then, I noticed my horse had his attention towards the stables. I walked up to the door and looked inside, but again, there was no one. I got my saddle and stuff and started tacking up, and then my horse suddenly tensed up. He stood completely still, his ears forward and all his attention on the entrance to the barn. I looked over, thinking it was a cat or something, but what I saw made the hairs on my neck stand up. In the barn stood a tractor. Behind this, I could see a dark figure. It didn't really look like a man. It was more, I don't know, liquid sort of. It stood on the one side of the tractor, hardly hidden and I could swear that it was staring back at us. It moved backward towards the back of the tractor and just vanished. Well, I hurried up with my Sadie, grabbed my helmet, and though I really didn't want to, I walked my horse towards the barn. Let me tell you, it was no easy task getting him to go inside, and when I got him inside, he refused to go anywhere near the tractor and almost ran out the other side pulling me alongside with him. I'm having some problems with the spirit in my fiance's house again. For the past few months, the house has been dormant, and so we didn't worry much about what was going on in the home. We had one of my fiance's friends move in, and things were fairly calm and peaceful. Her friend, though, began to never stay at the house, and due to some issues, emotions got rather heated between the three of us. Two days ago, 
Her friend moved back after a fight, and activity has escalated in the home since then. Yesterday, I got an overwhelming sense of fear and dread while at the house, and I had an overwhelming headache come over myself. I began packing up my things and told my fiance to pack her things because we needed to stay a few days at my house. He became overwhelmingly tired and had a headache much like mine and passed out. When she woke up, she wasn't herself but quickly came back out of it. Then I went to the bathroom and when I looked into the mirrors from the corner of my eye, I saw something I couldn't explain. The thing was though, it looked inhuman and comprised of only bones I think, and it seemed to be wanting out of the mirror. I ran back and my fiance was packing and taking her time out, humming to the tune of old music box that used to be in her friend's room. She started to have a play fight with me and threw a shirt at me, then casually kicked the door shut. The next thing I know, she screams and I kick the door open. She said I'd been standing in the mirror after I'd left the room. She seemed fine at the moment, and so I just watched over her as she kept packing. She began stalling again though, and I told her we needed to get going or we'd be late for dinner. She then told me that she didn't want to. She liked the house and wanted to stay there. I began to hear voices as well, other than hers in the house, and got drowsy but kept my head about me. She finally was packed, and I got her to go outside for a brief moment to see if being out of the house would snap her out of the trance. She got rather defensive and ran off and ran under a doorway where there was a crucifix standing above the doorway. When she ran through it, she collapsed and then woke up again, perfectly fine and not remembering about the past 45 minutes except for bits and pieces like she had been dreaming. I had been having concerns that she may be channeling spirits by accident in her sleep and such, and this incident definitely confirms my suspicions. I'm psychologically drained from the mental strength it took the two of us to get out of the home. We're going back to the house in about four or five days and figure it should be fine. Whatever this entity is, it fed strongly off the negative emotions that had built up in this house. I know at the strength it was yesterday, it would be much hard for me to face it and cleanse the house on my own, so we are leaving the house to settle and calm back down. By then, I feel this entity will have lost most of its power and it would be the best time to cleanse the home and seal any portals that may have been opened in the home. I'm still a little bit apprehensive though, and if anyone could offer up some help, it would greatly be appreciated. If my fiance is the target of any danger, I can pull through any fight normally and keep her safe, but I've been so drained and I don't know if I can handle the cleansing of the home by myself. If anyone could please help, either physically or through even psychological support, it would greatly be appreciated. Hey there, I live in Akron, Ohio. About a year ago, I moved into my ex's house since it was nice, and well, we were in love. I lived there for about six months before she broke it off and decided to live in Ireland. I've been heartbroken for a long time, but I do remember some extra stuff that happened in that home. It's on Spicer Street in Akron, Ohio. About a month after I moved in, the first thing I noticed was waking up with her and every single clock in the house, including the computer clock, wristwatches, etc. would be turned around 40 minutes ahead than what they were supposed to be. This only happened once, and after I arrived at class, she called me to explain how each clock had changed overnight. Later. She told me that the previous tenants believed the house was haunted and refused to move back in. They were both girls, I was told. We began to notice other things too, 
Such as their stuff would get moved if we left the kitchen. The television would turn on and off. Lights would turn on and off if we left the home. Fan would move and not move. TV would turn channels with the remote being on the TV. And certain spots in the house would be unusually cold. She was scared at times, but I typically wasn't. I just thought of it as having a little kid in the home. I wasn't really worried, and I was confident that I'd be able to protect her from that kind of stuff. If you read some of my earlier posts, I see specs a lot, and I guess it gives me some sort of confidence, even if I don't understand them. My thoughts were confirmed, I believe, when I was sitting in the living room with her and thought I spotted a blonde-haired boy's face under her table. It looked a lot like a German kid, but naturally, I blinked, and it was gone. There were two spots in the house that seemed really weird. The basement was odd, but not too odd, since students in the past used this place for studying. The oddest part in her house was her bedroom closet. I would step at the door and not go in, she refused to even sleep close to it. I was the one who slept closest to it while she slept between me and the wall. I didn't really see anything from it, but it did feel really weird, and it didn't feel like the kid. It was something else. Also, that closet was connected to the attic, which neither of us ventured into. After I saw the kid, I felt some sort of attachment to it. I remember she used to complain that sometimes my eyes would go completely black in the house. I'd usually counter it with me complaining about staring at me, as she slept as if I woke up around 5 in the morning, but we wouldn't argue about it. It was just weird. When we broke up, or rather, when she broke up with me, I'll admit it. Way messages often wrote how she was scared and didn't want to hear any noises. So I guess the activity in the home increased when I left. Again, not sure why. So, I want to find out more about the home, but I don't know where to start. I've been lurking on here for about two years now, and well, I decided to finally post about my experiences with ghosts. Really only one ghost. It happened to be here in my house for a number of years throughout the 70s. The house had been built in 1970 on an old lot where an old man had lived on a shack and had died. Now, the spirit that had stayed on the property was one of a child though. Maybe the old man had a kid and it died, who knows. Anyway, all sorts of stuff that one would imagine a child would do happened. You know, things would get lost, stuff would move from one place to another, vases and sculptures would be on their place on tables, and when the family would come back, the sad items would be in pieces, smashed against a wall about three or four feet away. Sometimes, of course, you couldn't get into the house because the screen door would be locked and nobody was in the house at the time. Just imagine the door with the simple hook going into the circle slot. Now, over the years, I've tried to get that hook to slip over into the lock, you know, to see if it could happen by accident. It could never be an accident. If one wants to lock that screen door, you intentionally do it. Feelings of being watched and feeling the weight of someone or something next to you in the bed. My grandma would tell me that I would go off in the house in my walker circa 1981 or 82, and I would travel all the way from the kitchen to the living room to the hallway. Now, when one enters the hallway, even in the daytime, if all the doors to the room are shut, it is pitch black. She claimed that I would be in the hallway for a couple of minutes, and that I would come shooting out from the hallway as if my walker was pushed or shoved by something. All the way back to the kitchen, 
and crash into the wall. Now, it would take me a couple of minutes to get all the way to the hallway since I was a toddler. Yet, it wouldn't even take me a minute to come crashing into the wall of the kitchen. Now, I remember seeing some sort of whitish gray ball floating when I was laying down on the rug one day. This must have been 1982 or 83. I can still see that image in my brain to this day. My grandmother noticed me getting up and looking under the dining room table and I started to shout, get out, or in my way of talking back then, get you out. My grandma started yelling, what's wrong? What's the matter? I kept on shouting and punching and kicking at nothing all the way towards the front doorway and when I got to the door I kept kicking the door and then I stopped. By this time my grandmother who was rather slow due to wait had gotten to the hallway that led to the front door and was asking me what was wrong. She told me that I had said that I didn't want it here and I told it to get out. I think I had some sort of hold over it, as I was the only child born in the house. My uncle, who was only 12 at the time, had been born in an older house. I think the spirit was attracted by the fresh new life that was now in the home, much like the spirits in Poltergeist were attracted to the little girl. You know, they wanted some sort of that life force. I think that was the case with this. I got rid of it before it got too powerful, much later on. What do you think? I've lived in this house for the past 27 years. Nothing out of the ordinary has happened since those early years. I have seen many paranormal entities during my life. Here's my first quite shocking meeting with a ghost. I was 7 years old then. I was in my grandparents' house with my mother. The house is about 80 years old. I was relaxing downstairs when the phone suddenly rang from upstairs. My mother proceeded to go upstairs to answer the phone, and I followed her. After climbing about halfway up the old staircase, I felt that somebody or something was behind me. I quickly turned my head. And that's when I saw a middle-aged lady climbing the stairs, holding out her hands as if to grab me. She was wearing a bathrobe, and her hair looked mangled. I freaked out and ran upstairs as quickly as I was able to. She surely was a ghost, because she wasn't a family member or a friend. I had never seen her before, and my mother didn't even notice her. She disappeared as fast as I'd seen her. Unfortunately, that wasn't the only ghost experience I had in that house. I was about 10 years old when the second meeting happened. It happened in the same old staircase in my grandparents' house. It was late night, and I was going upstairs to get some sleep. That's when I quickly discovered that my route was blocked. At the end of the corridor where you turn right to get to the staircase was a man, a very unusual man standing there. He was wearing a gas mask, so I wasn't able to see his face. He didn't speak, nor did he move at all. He just stood still, and I was too afraid to go past him. So I then got my grandmother and went back to the corridor with her. The gas man was nowhere to be found. Understandably, I was too afraid to sleep, so my grandmother stayed the night with me. I'm pretty sure that my grandparents' house is haunted, and my friend has witnessed that too, as the next experience tells. I was 11 years old, and my friend was 12 when this happened. We were playing in the basement of my grandparents' house. It's no surprise that the basement is also quite unsettling just as much as the rest of the house is. We were in the big room just under the staircase that leads to the middle floor. We were having fun. 
until both of us felt a strange feeling that made it obvious that we were not alone in the basement. We felt that there were other beings present, entities that couldn't be seen with the naked eye. We are also sure it wasn't our grandparents, because both of my grandparents were upstairs. That feeling also told us to leave the basement. It felt like we were surrounded by invisible people, and that we really needed to leave the basement immediately. After a few minutes, in a panic, we fled back up fast. Even at this stage of my life, it is still frightening for me to walk that staircase or be in the basement. I often feel the same feeling in these places that I felt 10 years ago. My friend also feels the same energy as well. Luckily, I haven't seen any ghosts since then. Regardless, one thing is certain. There's a lot of paranormal activity going on in that house. And I'm the person the spirits need to target, for whatever reason or another. My story starts back in 1991, when I first hooked up with my then boyfriend, now husband. My boyfriend lived on the bottom floor of a house that his aunt owned. His aunt and her family lived on the second floor. His cousin was my best friend, and so I was always at the house. We had a small close-knit group of friends that were over our house one time playing truth or dare. I remember it as being late at night, and we were sitting on Holly's bed playing this game. When one of the girls asked her if the house was haunted, Holly said that it was, and that it was her maternal grandmother. She then went on to tell us certain things that would happen, and most situations would take place right next to the father's recliner chair. About 15 minutes after we finished playing the game, I had to use her bathroom. Though I was so totally afraid to go alone, I didn't want to seem chicken, so I went on my own to the bathroom. Just as I was passing by the recliner, I noticed I suddenly got cold. It was a warm summer night when this happened. Okay, I chalked it up to being my imagination, seeing as we had just been talking about it. Then, years later, I had this woman I was working for, and we got along really well. So, one day she had invited me to her house. Well, as we were at her house, we were talking about ghost stories and the like. She excitedly pulled out her digital camera and led me upstairs to their master bedroom. We stood just outside the bedroom doorway and she told me to take the camera and just scan around the room, starting in one corner and going to the next. Just see if you see anything, she said. I took the camera, still not knowing if I was truly a believer, and scanned the room. Suddenly. I moved back to the corner I just scanned over. She said, you see something, don't you? I did. I saw a greenish male figure standing in the corner, looking out the window. I was scared to death. But even when I scanned the corner again, the figure was there. We returned to the first floor of the house when she started to tell me all about it. They had bought the house just about a year prior. The first week they lived in the house, their children, very young children, would awake in the middle of the night, screaming and crying. Finally, one night, my boss's husband got so furious, he yelled, I don't care that you're here. I don't care if you just stay. Just leave my children alone. The children never woke up crying again. Then about a week later was when my boss had noticed the image through her camera. She had been going through various parts of the home, taking photos of the center relatives that lived out of state. When she was scanning the master bedroom, looking for a good view of the room, and found the exact image I found. She yelled for her husband who saw the same thing. 
but it could only be seen through the screen on our digital camera. After I saw it, I was a believer. There was no way I would have seen it if it weren't there. A couple of days after she saw the first image herself, she was cleaning in the basement when she found a hidden room. She went into the hidden room and found a box of papers. They started investigating the roots of the home. She found out that the old police chief of Renister, the town she had lived in, had built the house a very long time ago. The only thing she could figure is that the greenish male figure is the police chief looking out the window and watching over his town. They still live in that same home and they still live with their chief, all of them living peacefully together. Since I was little, I've been sensitive to ghosts. Sometimes I had dreams that would later turn out to be true. Also could tell which song was on next on the radio. Knew who the phone call was next, etc. My experiences tend to happen at times when I'm either feeling low or just open towards the other side. My stories. As a little girl, I didn't like being in my room after it got dark or darker when it was summertime. I remember feeling watched and something wasn't right. A lot of times, I was so afraid of the door leading to the back of our house and the stables. I felt like something was looking at me and wanted to hurt me. This went on from when I was around 8 and stopped when I was 12. At times, they would show up only once. Once I was in bed and was close to falling asleep. Suddenly, I heard a voice calling my name. I woke up completely and looked into the corner of my room and there was an old woman there. I couldn't see her clearly because she was kind of blurry, but she had a friendly feeling about her. She then disappeared and I never saw her again. When I was 17, my dog died and I was devastated. A few weeks later, I heard him coming up to my room from the kitchen and saw him enter my room. He then jumped up on my bed, walked around three times before sighing, and got down. I could feel him on my bed and against my leg. When I tried to touch him, he disappeared. My parents' farm, where most of the events happened, is old. It burnt down once there and there seems to be quite a lot of ghostly activity. In the barn, my parents got their car. Since I was little, I was afraid being alone there. I felt something was wrong and that something was hanging in the dark. I always felt uneasy there until a few years ago when my mom told me that someone had off themselves there. My worst experience I've had was when I was around 15 to 17 years old. My room was connected to the kitchen by a little hallway. From the kitchen, you can go directly to the two living rooms. The last one I've never felt easy in was always feeling unnaturally cold and just weird. One night, I woke up and my room was ice cold. I heard someone open the door from the hall to the kitchen. It was a man, and he was going directly to the last of the living room. Somehow I was there when he went there. I saw him take his rifle and then off himself. It was feelings more than actually seeing him do it. I then was back in my body, but heard him fall down to the floor, moved a bit, and moaned before he died. The second that happened, the coldness disappeared and I could breathe again. I told my friend at the time about it, but I was too afraid to ask my parents. One day, I sort of jokingly asked if anyone had off themselves in that room. My dad turned around and looked at me with a strange look. Yes, your godmother's father offed himself there. They hadn't told me because my godmother didn't like me to know. 
I found his grave, and it happened the exact day he had offed himself. I've had nice experiences though. A friend of my parents and their friend had offed herself. My friend was really devastated about it and couldn't get over it. One day we were in the kitchen when I saw a sort of fog that turned into a ghostly hand. It may have looked ridiculous, but I'm telling you, I know with my own eyes what I saw. It was right on my friend's shoulder, almost as if to soothe her. After it disappeared, I immediately alerted my friend and she said that her shoulder felt really cold. My friend then told me that she felt a lot of peace. To the both of us, it really meant a lot. The latest year, the happenings happened without any real pattern. Last year, when I was at my parents and sleeping in my old rooms, I didn't get any sleep for the last four days I was there. There was a presence in the room, and it was not a pleasant one. It just radiated hatred and it was pointed at me for some reason. The next time I got home, it wasn't in there, but then I had to sleep in my mom's bedroom. I was woken up by someone slamming their hands into the bed very hard. I looked at the end of the bed, and I saw a shadow standing there, and then disappeared. Since then, I haven't felt it. For some reason, I knew it was male. I didn't know why he felt so badly about me. When I'm home at my parents now, there's a young girl there, something I can't feel what it is, and a man. None of these are evil, but just looking out for me. I've seen the girl from the corner of my eyes, and seen her reflected in the mirror. I think they are protecting me, and just looking out for me. At times I can enter a house and know that there's more than just what the eyes see. I felt the presence of family or just passerbyers. I do believe that at my parents' house, there's some kind of field of energy where these spirits can enter. Some stay, but others don't. I got one in my room where I live now. Just a little prankster really, turns on my computer or opens all the cupboards. I did have an old man though, who loved to watch me shower. I told him that it was rude, and I didn't like it. Since then, he hadn't been there. At the same time, there's a girl running every night on the upper floor. My brother is sensitive too, but apparently never experienced the same as I have at my parents' house. Seems I'm the only one they get attracted to also felt being pushed, but that happened in my parents' house as well. I don't mind having this ability, but I know I have to learn to control it. It can get to be too much at times. I've been doing some research about black spirits and ghosts. I had an experience in January 2000 when I lived in an old house in Portland, Maine. It was late in the evening, about 10 p.m. or so, when I felt something peering at me from a closet in my basement apartment. I thought nothing of it, but when I looked again, a materialistic, three-dimensional human-shaped figure with no facial features darted from the closet and stood behind me. It was suspended above the floor, about a foot or so. Before I knew it, two more had come out of nowhere. It happened so fast, and they moved so quickly, that I didn't even know what to make of this incident. I was a skeptic at the time, and had been all my life on ghosts, supernatural, etc. I was 36 years old at the time. There were multiple instances where I seriously felt like the house was shaking. Doors being slammed, open and shut, cabinets being open and shut as well. Pots being moved around. It was seriously like a horror movie. I remember one time this happened, and it scared me half to death, almost literally. I ended up having a mild heart attack, and I ended up waking up in a hospital. All I remember was feeling the energy of what was happening that day. 
and then I lost consciousness. And that's when I was in the hospital bed. The doctor told me that the neighbor noticed something was wrong in that house and noticed me lying on the floor. So she went and called the cops for me and the ambulance arrived. They even told me that my heart stopped for a moment and they had to use a defibrillator to bring me back to life. I was clinically dead, even though they only classified it as a mild heart attack. Anyway, I know this all sounds absurd, but I'm telling you, it definitely did happen. I'm just glad that I don't have to deal with it anymore. I don't live in the same place I do now. It was not worth it in the end. And after the heart attack, I don't think it'll ever be worth it. Scary stuff, poltergeists, and black beings on the walls. Definitely not something I want to deal with. One night, me and two guy friends were driving into Howard City, Michigan. We were driving down the road, and on each side, there's cornfields, and we saw two girls, one standing at the opposite side of the road, and another walking directly into our path. The girl walking into our path was wearing a gray sweatshirt, blue jeans, had blonde hair, and white eyes. The girl that was standing on the other side of the road was wearing a red sweatshirt, had brown hair, and wore blue jeans. As we're driving towards them, I tried as hard as I could to tell my friend's boyfriend to look out for her, but I couldn't. I couldn't say a word. I tried, and nothing came out because I was so terrified of what I thought I saw. The girls had completely vanished. After we got to the stop sign, I said to my friend's boyfriend, did you see that? He said yes, and the other guy that was in the truck with us asked me what, so I told him, and he said, we have to go back and check it out. So we turned back around and went back down the road and found no signs of them. This is a remarkable story of ghosts from my experience. This happened when I was studying at my university. At that time, I was far away from home and stayed in a hostel near my university with my friends. Before I moved into the hostel, my friend who lived in the hostel told me that it was haunted. Actually, it was a house whose owner intentionally left this world. That's why many people have said that the hostel was haunted. They said that the spirit of the owner appears near the kitchen at night. Another said that sometimes you could hear the crying voices from the woman who owned the now hostel. At that time, there was only one last room available for me to sleep in on the second floor. So I had to stay in that room. My room was in the last row. Many people have said that my room was terrifying because the surroundings around my room were quite dark and sunshine couldn't enter my room. There were multiple nights in which I kept waking up around 2.30 a.m. One night, I was terribly tired and went to bed earlier than usual. When I woke up, it felt as if somebody was pulling on my blanket from my feet and so I pulled it back up again. However, when I went to pull the blanket back up, I still felt a resistance in my blanket. It definitely felt as if somebody was pulling it down again. I then felt annoyed and wanted to sleep. So I just said, stop it, don't disturb me. I really want to sleep. Surprisingly, it actually stopped and I was able to sleep the rest of the night. In fact, nobody ever pulled my blanket again. In the morning when I woke up, I remember what happened last night and I started shaking. After that experience, it was pretty obvious why I always felt on edge whenever I slept in that room. Ghosts are pretty freaky. I was sleeping over my best friend Jasmine's house, 
and the night before, her mother promised us BLTs for breakfast. So that night, after setting me up an air mattress for the room, we had gone to bed. That night was peaceful, but I'll forever remember that horrific morning. I woke up and looked up to where a person was just standing in front of the closed door from afar and simply staring at me. She was young, around my age at the time, with features almost identical to my friend. I was still half asleep and just figured it was my friend anyway. I began to ask her when we were going downstairs for the BLTs, and she just stared at me without saying a word. I closed my eyes for a little bit, then reopened them, and that girl was gone. I never heard the door open in her room, and somehow the girl was gone. I looked at my clock, and only ten minutes had passed since I closed my eyes to lay down. I had screamed loud and ran down the stairs to find Jasmine and her mother sitting in the kitchen. They looked very concerned and asked me why I screamed. I told them that just 10 minutes ago, I saw Jasmine, but she didn't say a word. Her mother looked at me and told me that Jasmine was downstairs for over an hour and had never once went back upstairs in the time in which I saw this girl. It was then when I realized that it was a spirit. Ever since, I've only seen the girl twice. On my friend's birthday, I was downstairs getting cake for some of the other girls, and I saw her standing in the pantry watching me. And the other time, I was in the basement with Jasmine. We were getting some laundry done when we all saw the girl run across the basement living room to a storage room. I haven't been back since, but the last experience helped my friends not think I was crazy. I've been enjoying your site, and I wanted to share some of my experiences. Well, I went to Mercyhurst College in Erie, Pennsylvania in 1995-96, and I left in the fall when my father died. Anyway, I lived in Egan Hall, which is connected to Old Main and the chapel, and I saw the nun and her antics almost daily in the fall of 96. I saw a reflection in the bathroom windows at night. She often opened and closed the windows and doors, turned faucets and radios on, and flushed the toilets for hours on end. I was absolutely frightened at first. My roommate, a very down-to-earth and logical girl, told me a friend of hers who lived on the boys' floor saw the sister every morning. Around 4 a.m. when he got up for crew practice, he would end up seeing her, but she was only there supposedly to look out for us. It turns out that the heartbroken nun story is just a fun, creepy story, and the truth is that the nun died peacefully of old age and stuck around to keep an eye on all the students. I also used to see a blue orb floating from the chapel through Old Main when I was coming back from the computer lab late at night. Other students had seen the orb originate from a small statue in the chapel, and a figure had been seen in the organ loft as well. I have heard that the path between campus and the New Covenant is haunted, but I can't verify that. In Springboro, Pennsylvania, there is a large Victorian house which had been used as a stop in the Underground Railroad. There had been a tunnel between the basement and the barn, but the tunnel was filled in the late 70s to early 80s for safety reasons, and the barn was moved to Conneville at some point. There are cold spots throughout the house, and a feeling of being watched, sometimes. You can see strange reflections in the windows and lights or figures just at the edge of your field of vision. The basement is very frightening. There is a feeling of pressure and a very dark and menacing feeling. I mean, I feel very threatened if I go down there, no matter the time of day. When I'm alone in the living room without the TV on, 
I could hear muffled voices from the basement. I have always felt very negatively in this house. Now, about four years ago, I lived at Country Hills apartment in Las Vegas, Nevada. My family and I had some weird encounters there. Well, first, it started with this. My sister and I went to my grandparents while my parents stayed home. We were all the way in Cali from Las Vegas, Nevada for a weekend. My dad woke up at night, the night we left, claiming he heard a little girl singing in mine in my sister's room. He goes in there and sees my sister's rocking chair moving. Our second encounter was when my mom was going to take me to school one morning. And right when we open the door, the DVD player goes on. The radio on the DVD player. My mom and I were so tripped out, we were telling each other to turn it on until eventually my mom does it. Now how freaky and unexpected is that? Our third encounter was when the blinds for the sliding door that leads to the porch just started moving. It was strange, really strange. My uncle had moved in with us a little bit before the second encounter, but the only encounter that he shared with us is when he invited a friend over and the blinds were closed. Then he noticed that all of a sudden they were open. He told us and we got tripped out. I was right next to the blinds too. That was my story and thank you for reading. I work at a cemetery in California. I used to work the graveyard shift. As I was in the office doing paperwork, I suddenly heard a noise that startled me a bit. It almost sounded like faint singing from a distance. I got up, turned to face where I heard the mysterious singing. By the way, there were only four of us in the office. Everybody else was in the other room. And in that direction, I noticed a lady looking at me. She freaked me out so badly because she didn't even look real, translucent. All I could remember was that she had a smirk on her face and disappeared within seconds. It happened so fast, but I knew there was a lady there. She was just nowhere to be found. I walked around looking for this lady. I asked the other employees about it and they all looked at me like I was crazy. So I forgot about it, went back and finished my paperwork. Well, the next night, we got four bodies in. I started to do paperwork on this one lady. As I started typing in the information, I went to check the tab on her toe and took the sheet off to see her face. And it was the lady from the night before. It freaked me out, and after that experience, I never doubted ghosts again. I was at the job for only one week at the time. It's now been 10 years. I believe we walk and live with ghosts and spirits every day. They don't know they have passed on. I say that because I've experienced a few ghost sightings, and I heard things. It is so fascinating. In September of 2002, I was in Geneva, Switzerland on a business trip, and I was due to return home the day of my girlfriend's birthday. For her birthday, I purchased a violin, and I planned on giving it to her after she picked me up from the airport. The violin was at my house. The night before I was scheduled to return home, I called my girlfriend, but she was not home. So I left a message. After I hung up the phone, the phone rang back in my room in Switzerland. I picked the phone up, but I didn't hear anything. After saying hello a couple of times, I hung the phone up. Later that night, I again tried to call my girlfriend, and this time she was home. 
as we spoke, she told me that she received both my messages. Having only called once before, I was very perplexed. I asked her what was said on the messages, and she described the first message that left to a T, but she thought that I was teasing her with the second message, since she thought that I might be giving her a violin for her birthday. After some prompting, she told me that she heard scratchy violin music, like a beginner tuning their instrument, followed by me saying hello, hello. I thought she was joking, but when I could tell that she was serious, I asked her if it sounded like the music, static or some other background noise. She had the voice messages still on her answering machine, and she played both messages back to me. On the first message, I could clearly hear my voice saying that I just called to say hi, and that I would see her tomorrow. The second message starts with about four seconds of clear but scratchy violin music, and then I could very clearly hear my voice saying hello, hello. My girlfriend said that both the messages had my phone number and the caller ID. By this time, I had convinced her that I did not leave the violin music on her machine, nor were there any TVs or radios turned on in my room during the call. All I could think of was that I may have been hearing some future event when my girlfriend would be tuning her violin, that I would not be around to hear it. So I changed my plane reservations to take a different flight home. Nothing happened to the plane that I would have been on but I cannot help to think that the violin music was meant to be some type of warning. Maybe I would have had a car accident if I took the other flight, or I would have been hit crossing the road. Regardless, an omen like that is hard to ignore. I've kept the message recording as a reminder of this very strange experience. In May 2006, it happened again. After over three and a half years, I received another ghostly phone call. Last night, we were sitting at home when my wife's, my girlfriend in 2002, cell phone rang. She answered it, and at first, did not hear anything. Then, the sound of the same scratchy violin music became slowly more pronounced. She said hello several times but had no response, except the music. She handed the cell phone to me, and I also heard the violin. Then, the sound just stopped. I did not hear a phone hang up. It just stopped. I closed the cell phone lid, and then checked the call log. There was no record of a call, incoming or outgoing, to the cell phone at that time. I'm scheduled for another flight to Atlanta on Thursday. I sure wish I could get out of it. In the Chinese calendar, people believe that the month of July is the time where all the ghosts come to Earth from Hell. We call it the Ghost Festival. This is why Chinese people are very used to buying incenses in order to pray for these ghosts. During last year's ghost festival, something strange happened onto my family. It was the time where all my aunts and uncles and other relatives came back to my nanny's house. The entire family of mine sat in the living room, watching TV and chit-chatting. Suddenly, one of my aunts started yelling very loudly, I'm cold, I'm bleeding, I'm in pain. She then ran upstairs and started throwing everything she saw. She acted insane, and her face turned pale. Every one of us in the family was shocked by her actions. We were panicked and did not have any idea of what had happened. My nanny was the only person who remained calm. Immediately she called the ritual witch, whom we called her as Boombo, to the house. As soon as the Boombo arrived, my aunt ran to her and wanted to choke her to death. She yelled, I'm dead, and now it's your turn. My cousins immediately captured her and pulled her away from the Boombo. 
The witch then murmured as if to cast spells on my aunt. About half an hour later, my aunt was awake. She said she felt exhausted and asked everyone what had just happened now. At the moment we told her the truth, my aunt was frightened and couldn't believe that. The witch told us that she was possessed by a ghost who was killed in an accident years ago. I have always been an avid believer in ghosts. I've never seen one physically manifest itself in human form, and I don't think I could cope if I did. I have an intense fear of ghosts, and at the same time, a morbid fascination with them. My first experience happened when I was 14 years old. I was going to stay with a friend of mine in a seaside village in Cornwall, England. I think it's called Portscaith. My dad had a friend who drove me down to the meeting point where my friend, whose family were already staying there, would pick me up. This guy's name was Mike, and he was the nicest guy you could ever imagine. We joked all the way down in the car, and he wound me up with stories of the Beast of Bodeman, a supposed large cat that lives in the moors in Dortmer, the county before Cornwall. We had a good laugh. By the time we reached the meeting point, it had gotten dark. My friend was unable to pick me up. Mike took me back to his house where I met his wife, Jenny. Jenny was as nice as Mike, but she was a little kooky. Looking at things that weren't there and drawing really childlike pictures with crayons. I didn't really think much of it because I was tired from the journey. I was more fascinated with their house. Their house was so large that it had been divided into four apartments, each one with winding stairs, large rooms, and old-fashioned structures. The house itself dates back to the 1700s. After a while, I went upstairs to sleep in their son's room. He was away at the time and set about rifling through his music collection to pass the time. His CDs were in one corner of the room, and every time I was looking through them, I felt like I was being watched from another corner of the room. I looked over to where I felt this presence emanating from, and saw nothing except a barred window. It was only a small window with a few bars across it, and very high up, there was nothing there that should have made me feel so watched. I felt sleepy. So we turned the lights out and got into bed. As I was drifting off, I felt that same feeling of being watched. I snapped my eyes open and felt as if something retreated. Ignoring this irrational feeling, I turned over to sleep on my side with my back to the wall. At that moment, the door, which was one of the old barn-like doors with a latch, made a noise. I heard the latch lift up and the door slowly creak open. Next, the light snapped on and I was blinking in shock, trying to see what happened. Next thing I heard was a scaffolding as something retreated down the slope accompanied by a horrific crackling under the breath laughter that scared the heck out of me. I tried to see what happened, but the door opened towards me and the light switch was beyond that so I had no way of seeing who had turned the light on from my bed. I tried to call out Mike, Jenny, but the words were really hard to say. I was so scared that any noise might bring the something back. I couldn't sleep with the light on, so I scuffled out of bed, switched it off, and practically jumped back into bed and under the covers where I felt safe. I finally fell asleep and thought nothing of it. I didn't really think about it again until a few months later when, out of the blue, my dad mentioned he was thinking of taking me to Cornwall to stay at that house. I told him my story, and he told me that the house was haunted and that Jenny was one of those people who could see ghosts and communicate with them. He told me that the ghost that did that was probably Harry, a mischievous ghost. He also said that the house was full of them. A lot of children could be heard playing on the steps 
and a Chinese washerwoman was always communicating with Jenny while she cleaned the kitchen. This at least explains some of Jenny's unusual behavior. She could sense lightnings and everything. Being terrified of ghosts, I totally freaked upon hearing this, especially as Dad told me we were going to stay there. A few months later, after my exams, he took me there as a treat. Knowing what I know now, it felt a little unsavory. I was absolutely terrified of walking into that house, especially as Mike and Jenny were away. I felt watched everywhere I went, and on the first night, I didn't sleep a wink or turn off the lights. The rest of the holiday, I actually spent sleeping in the same bed as my dad, a little unorthodox for a girl of 15, but it was a choice between my dad and the ghost, and I'd choose my dad any day. The last thing that happened which really scared me was that Jenny popped back for a short while and whilst there was cleaning the kitchen. As she did, I repeatedly saw her brush off something that wasn't there and say, with a giggle, get off, in the calm and patient way a mother does to a child that's pestering her for cookies. The next thing I saw was an invisible force actually pinch her clothing and pull it from her. I actually saw the shirt she was wearing become pinched and pulled away by nothing. She looked at me and said, oh, don't worry, that's just Hong Lee, the washerwoman. She thinks I'm not doing a good job of these surfaces. We didn't stay much longer. I've had several paranormal experiences during my life, hearing my mother's voice after she had died, and feeling my mother-in-law's presence after she had also died. But in February 2002, an angel guided me from certain death. I awoke on a Saturday morning because I heard our dog whine, and that is when I realized our house was on fire. Our bedroom was off the living room which was totally in flames. I yelled to wake my husband, who jumped out of bed and ran right through the fire and out the front door. I started to follow him, but a hand touched my right shoulder and turned me to the right. At the same time, I heard a voice in my right ear saying, the window. I ran around the bed, opened the window and screen, and rolled out to the ground. It was a one-story house. I escaped with just a few burns in my back and left shoulder. My husband, on the other hand, was in intensive care for almost a month with acute smoke inhalation and second degree burns over half his body. I am certain that if I had followed him through that burning living room, I would have died. When I was in grade three of primary school, about 10 years old, I lived with my grandparents. Before my great-grandmother also lived with us, but she had also passed away for approximately five years. I remember that that night, it was Chinese New Year Eve. My family members all came back to my grandparents' house. After dinner, nearly eight o'clock, my parents and other uncles and aunts went to play Manjong games. When I was watching TV with my cousins, I felt thirsty, so I went to the kitchen to find some water. But something happened that I couldn't believe when I saw. It was a lady in the kitchen, a transparent figure. She was standing in front of the stove. However, the lady did not have any legs. She was just hovering above the kitchen. I was so scared to death that I ran out of the kitchen as fast as I could and ran into my uncle's and aunt's arms. Three years ago, I was taking university classes at St. Peter's College in Saskatchewan, about an hour and a half drive east of Saskatoon. The college was originally built as a monastery for monks who came up from Minnesota to found a colony around 1900. Since then, it had been expanded from a boys-only school 
to a fully integrated co-ed college. There are several ghosts on the property. One is supposedly the ghost of the first bishop of the area who apparently died before the building's construction was completed. He can be seen occasionally walking the grounds. The other is a ghost of a small boy who had left this earth intentionally, or died from an accident, by falling out an upper story window. The year before I came to the college, the fourth floor was used for the drama and art classes, and also had a small room where the staff could go for coffee breaks. One day, one of the women went upstairs to make some coffee. She was standing with her back to the door, loading the coffee maker, when she felt a presence behind her. Turning around, she saw a small boy standing there, then vanished right in front of her. The first year that I attended school, I took part in amateur night one Friday. I was invited back to the girls' residence by some friends for tea. The place had originally been a housing for a small group of nuns that had lived at the colony and was only a few feet from the main buildings. It was after midnight when I finally said goodnight and headed out. I had taken no more than three steps when I had the most unshakable feeling that something didn't want me on the grounds. There was the sensation that I was being chased that I just couldn't stand and I ran to my car. The feeling didn't stop until I crossed the railroad tracks, which I found out later was the marker of the boundaries of the college grounds. I told some friends about this, and we all agreed that we should stay some time after midnight and try to see some ghosts. Well, we tried, but that is as far as it went. None of us had the nerve to stay past midnight. Strange feelings and weird noises always promoted us to leave just before the midnight hour. I've been privileged enough to have the luxury of traveling on many cruises over the years. Being born its wealth, it's something that you get accustomed to. With that being said, all these experiences are not without their ghost stories. There were times in which I had terrifying encounters with spirits while alone in my cabin. I'm not just talking the stereotypical hauntings, knocks on the walls, objects being moved around, and other supernatural phenomena, but legitimate full-body apparitions and dark shadows looming the halls of the cabin, as well as seeing the presence of ghost sailors. One of my earliest paranormal experiences on a ship was when I was roughly 12 years old. My parents were wealthy enough to purchase a gigantic yacht for me and my family. However, we were able to buy it off the previous owner, who ended up being a great family friend. His name was Joe. Joe suffered from a multitude of health problems, suffered mild heart attacks, had high blood pressure, I really became somewhat of a father figure for me in my youth. Every time he'd see me, he'd run up to me and give me a giant bear hug and yell, My little Sadie. He was such a great guy. However, being a 58-year-old male with all these medical health issues, I kind of felt like our days with him would be numbered. He suffered one last heart attack, and it would be the last of his life. That's because, unfortunately, this heart attack was the one which would take his life. So let me backtrack a little. Joe had been with us, me and my parents on the yacht, for the entire day. The morning before he died, Joe and I had a heart-to-heart. -heart. We were on lawn chairs on the deck, and he warned me about the dangers of excess to not get so absorbed in these riches. Joe was a successful man, but he always reminded me that all of these riches don't mean a thing if you're not a good person at heart. I'll never forget his words. Sadie, you can't bring anything with you when you're gone. These are the moments we live for. It's not about this yacht or the things you own in life. 
It's about the bonds we share with the people we love. I remember he urged me and said, do not waste this life. You can't get back this life, kiddo. I remember I just sort of smiled at him and nodded my head. Being 12, of course, I didn't really fully understand the magnitude of his words. So the day went on. We all had dinner together on that yacht. And later that night, that's when Joe decided to go back to his cabin to rest. He told us that he was very exhausted and just wanted a good night's rest. The morning after, I knocked on Joe's door in the cabin in his room. We had three separate rooms, and he wouldn't answer. I called for my parents. They opened the door, and that's when they found him dead. I was devastated and cried for days. About a month or so after his death, my parents were again on our yacht. All of our moments on our yacht were a little more somber after the death of our great friend Joe. Anyway, it was starting to get dark when my parents told me to get back into the cabin to go back to sleep. I yelled back that I wanted a few more minutes and they eventually relented. Our yacht is pretty long, so there is a lot of space to get around. The next few events are unexplainable and lead me to believe that our ship was in fact haunted. So, I'm standing right in the spot that me and Joe used to with our lawn chairs and I'm just taking in the scenery of the blue waters and breathing in the fresh air delicately touching my face. As I began to think of Joe, my eyes began to water. For some reason, I had an urge to look right behind me Right behind me was where I could see the control room for where you could drive the yacht. As I stared into the window of the control room, I recognized the face for a few seconds. I knew it was in my imagination, but I wasn't able to figure out whose face it was. I got kind of spooked and ran into the cabin. My parents were both still there, so I had to rule them out. I didn't even mention what I saw to my parents because I'm sure they would have dismissed me. Anyway, it's getting super late at night and my parents are sleeping soundly. I had trouble sleeping because of what I saw as well as the fact that I was profoundly missing Joe. I remember I went to the bathroom to splash water on my face and try to calm myself down a bit. However, once again, Something insane happened. As I looked into the mirror, I saw the face of a man right behind my shoulder. Again, the face wasn't obvious, so I couldn't make it out. But it was enough to recognize that there was someone in the mirror. It's hard to explain, but it almost looked like a poorly rendered image from a video or something. Either way, I hopped back into bed terrified. It wasn't until days later, when I really thought about it, that I realized it could have been Joe's face in the control room and mirror. Knowing this possibility, it allowed me to become less frightened and more comforted. If I were Joe, I don't think his intentions were to scare me. I think he just wanted to let me know that he was okay, that he was watching over me. Years later, when I was 19, I was on the road and I got into a terrible car wreck. I crashed into a tree. Luckily for me, I was able to escape unscathed and my parents drove me home. My parents were furious because I told them I had been texting and driving. Later that night, I had a dream. In the dream, Joe appeared in it. He looked very disappointed in me and literally said to me, you have learned nothing. A phone is an object. Whatever you think is important can wait. All I could say to Joe was that I'm sorry I upset him. And he said, worry about yourself. The dream ended. I remember waking up in a cold sweat and crying. That's all I have for now. I'm 35 now. 
and to reiterate, the events in this story are 100% real and factual. I noticed that many stories on the site are lacking a bit of variety, and just wanted to share something different than the typical stories I read. I don't have that same yacht anymore, and I've since become a mother with a family of my own. I'm a 20-year-old English writing professional major, attending Slippery Rock University, Pennsylvania, and I've never believed in ghosts until this happened to me. Early last fall, my good friend told me about Snyder Cemetery in Butler County, Pennsylvania, and its alleged hauntedness. He, our other mutual friend and I, decided to visit it one Friday night. We drove up to the entrance, parked his truck, and bought a few lighters and a scented candle. The only things we had in the car that would emit light and ventured in. We as a group initially found nothing out of the ordinary in the way of activity. I, however, started hearing on human moaning coming out of the surrounding trees. My two other friends didn't hear them. However, when I asked them if they heard it, even as it was going on, still skeptical, it surely was some kind of animal I told myself. I ventured around to the rusted iron gate in the back. As soon as I opened the gate, I felt as if I had walked into a wall. I've been in a life and death situation before. My arm was severed by a large piece of glass when I was young, and I know what it's like feeling and knowing that I may die. I had the same exact feelings I walked through the entrance. I physically, for the first time that night, was scared, beyond scared, petrified even. It was now dark. I creeped forward and lit my lighter to read a gravestone. I couldn't read it because of my actual shaking and fear. After about 15 seconds in the enclosed graveyard, I quickly exited. Then the real problem started. As I went back to my friends who were standing at the entrance, they both decided it was best to leave. Apparently they were bored. We walked out through the entrance and got into his truck, a late 90s GMC pickup. The truck wouldn't start for about five turns of the key. Eventually, it did start. Then the truck's headlights started flickering extremely rapidly, or randomly, from high to low beam, as if being controlled by a person. We started barreling down the gravel road, in fear of whatever it was doing this. Immediately, we noticed that a dense, zero-visibility fog had come around our truck. We could only see about three inches past the headlights, and only the outline of the road. Burton Road extends for probably about two miles either direction out of the cemetery. For that entire stretch, we had no visibility due to the fog, and the truck's lights were behaving erratically, as previously stated. As soon as Burton ended, and we were on the main road, the fog disappeared, and the headlights were fine and have been ever since. No areas that we drove through to get home had fog, and the lights haven't acted that way since. These are the things we have experienced. Cell phones go out as soon as you get onto Burton Road. No service from four different providers, including Virgin, Nokia, Verizon, and Trackphone. Drums. This is sometimes listed on other sites but not on yours. Odd, bassy but wooden sounding drums are heard. Not like a bass kick drum, a more of a war drum sound, playing simple war beats. Sounds of heavy creatures, peoples, or whatever entities in the woods, snapping sticks, walking in trees, etc. When pulling out, a feeling of tugging or extra weight in the car, as if we were riding the brakes, or we had about 500 pounds in the trunk. I hope all of this will be helpful in your listings on your hauntings. One last thing, Butler County, Marine State Park, Burton Road, Snyder Cemetery, 
red eyes will chase you out. Also, something else will chase you out as well. It is Conrad Snyder who is haunting the family's resting place. I've been reading the stories on the site for a while, and I would like to share one of the many experiences I've had. This was without a doubt one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. Now as a little bit of a backstory, I've been aware of the other realm and its inhabitants all my life. Also my mother, her mother, my nana, and her mother, my great nana, have as well. I've been in tune with the entities that are among us my entire life. So, to say that this particular event scared the heck out of me is saying a lot. But I think the only reason why it scared me so much is just because it happened to someone I love and it hit so very close to home. I want to make it very clear that I am absolutely no way being dishonest. Here is my story. My boyfriend and I had just recently gotten together and had only been dating a few months. We were house sitting his parents house while his parents were out of town and we were sleeping in his parents room. Also, we had just gotten our dog, that was a puppy at the time, a week before. This is all relevant to the story. It was a Sunday and things had felt very different that day, not normal and I had taken a nap during the day, which for me is just simply not something I do, but it was a good thing that I did, and I found out why later. As the day turned to night, around 11 p.m., I tried to get my boyfriend to come to bed with me. He was acting weird, and said that he would be coming to bed really soon. Now, like I said, it was around 11, and anyway, I went to bed, and I ended up jolting awake at 10 minutes till 5 in the morning. I remember because I looked at the clock. Anyway, my boyfriend had not come to bed yet and all the lights were still on in the house, but I disregarded it and I laid back down. Then I heard him coming down the hall and got into bed. When he laid down, he obviously sounded very tired and he said, in almost a day's voice, that there was a man outside the front window of the house that he and the dog both saw, and they didn't like the way the guy looked. He also said that he had just taken a sleeping pill. Now, my boyfriend kept telling me to look out the window. At this point, I was getting freaked out, because my boyfriend says there is a weird looking guy outside, and he just took a sleeping pill. So I told my boyfriend I was going to call one of my friends that is expertly versed in the ways of the supernatural. And when he told him that, he started saying no, don't call her. And at that point, I immediately called her. Now while I was on the phone with her, my boyfriend shot upright in bed and started repeating the phrase, when all the lights go out. He just kept repeating it. And then, as he was halfway through the saying, his voice changed into the most demonic sounding voice I've ever heard in my life. I have never moved so fast in my life. I turned on all the lights and went to the living room. I was just watching the hall to see if my boyfriend came after me. I was trying to decide if I should go to my car, but I was under the impression that someone was out there, so I felt trapped. But. I finally got enough courage to get to my car, and I never saw anyone outside, and to this day, I still firmly believe the man who my boyfriend saw was the demon. As I sat out there trying to call one of my friends to come to the house so that I wasn't alone, my boyfriend kept calling me from the house. Now, he kept saying on the phone that he couldn't move, yet he was able to call me. Our dog was very small and in a big deep box at the time. He kept telling me that our dog was in the hall and bleeding, that he was scared and he needed me. I knew things still weren't right and then before I knew it, he was speaking and laughing in that demonic voice again. Finally around 6am, my friend showed up and he escorted me into the home. 
When I got back to the bedroom, my boyfriend was passed out, and I went up to him with my blessed cross, and remember, he's passed out, and every time I got the cross two inches from his hand, he would close his hand. My friend saw that his eyes did not move, and were closed, and he was not awake. If I had not had a witness there, I wouldn't believe it myself. Then, as I turned my back and started to walk away, he started laughing in that voice again and telling me to get out. Then, I told the demon that I was aware of what it was trying to do. Then, my boyfriend passed out again. So my friend and I left the home because I had to go to work. Well, later that day, my boyfriend called me, asking why her dog was in its box in the bathtub with the water running. I had not done that, and he obviously didn't do it either. When I started talking about the events that night, he didn't remember any of it. But he did talk to his mom, and she said that the same thing had happened to his dad many years before. I knew that there was something in that house, but what had visited that night was not it. I grew up on a farm and I had stepbrothers and sisters. We lived in this old farmhouse that had four bedrooms upstairs, and I shared a room with my stepbrother who was about two years younger than me. It was 1986, and I was 17 when this happened. Our room was a small one, we had two beds in there, and the way I had my bed was that the end of my bed was towards the bedroom door, and then my head was about two feet from the wall because I had a couple rifles, a 22, and my 32 Winchester Special. The night this happened, I was sleeping on my belly with my arms under my pillow, and something woke me up. It wasn't a noise or a light. Maybe it was a dream, but I woke up and kind of pushed myself up a little bit with my arms to look at the door. When I looked, there was this figure, a dark shadow, or better yet, like a silhouette, and for some reason, almost telepathically I learned that it's just one of my sisters. Their room was straight across from mine on the other side, just bringing in one of the cats to sleep with me because the cat was keeping them up. We had a lot of barn cats that weren't allowed in the house. So I turned back around the way I was before I woke up and laid my head back down and I expected the cat to be put on my bed. And the feeling that I got was a very comfortable feeling, like everything is okay. A few seconds later, I felt the weight of the cat snuggled up to my side, like it was half on my bed and head and paws on my kidney area of me. I woke up a couple more times feeling this kitty cat still next to me. I was going to reach around and pet it, but I didn't want to wake her up. After a good night of sleep, I woke up and I couldn't believe that the cat was still in my bed and partially on my side, and I did not find a cat on bed with me. I found my 22 rifle laying across my back. I was totally confused by this. I wanted to confirm that it was not me who put my rifle across my back, so I put it back to where I had it before I went to sleep, and to be able to get at it, I would have to have gotten on my knees and reached way over to the corner, and with one arm grabbing it, and I couldn't lift it up at that angle. Of course, nobody had believed in me. So I just never tell the story, except for now. For my next story, I'm going to say something first as it relates to my story. I have what is now known by some as sleep paralysis. I'm sure a lot of you know what this is. When you wake up and you are mutually awake, but you cannot move. This is a very terrifying experience. I have heard many theories on this. And the one that makes the most sense to me is by Sylvia Brown. She says that while you sleep, your soul leaves its vehicle, your body, and goes wandering around to various places. 
as a result, your body wakes up, but you can't do anything about it because your soul isn't back from its journey to whatever. On with the second story. After we had sold the farm, my family moved into this town called Ashland, Wisconsin. I decided that if I wanted to make it in life, I had to go to college. So I stayed in this house my parents bought, which was very old. Not sure what year was built, but it was one of the first ones built when the town started. My room was a very small room, about the size of a large bathroom, but it worked. The year was 1993, and I stayed there throughout my college years till I graduated. One night, again I was sleeping on my belly, and I was in a very deep sleep. Something woke me up, not a noise or light. Everything was as dark as it could get. It woke me up enough where I sat up and I was staring towards my door. I couldn't see my door. It was so dark. I was wide awake and I kept looking at it, almost as if I was in a trance of some sort. All of a sudden, I got this telepathic-like communication that told me that everything is okay. You don't have to worry. This feeling is the most bizarre feeling, as if someone's mind is with my mind, talking to each other. So then I was told to lay down, and don't be scared. Then I got this extremely comforting feeling, so I laid back down, except this time I laid down on my left side. Then I felt someone or something's hand around my neck, and it started the squeeze, and then it cocked my head over to the side of my bed, by my neck. Meanwhile, I tried my hardest to yell or scream to wake someone up, but all that could come out of my mouth was a little gargling sound that no one could hear, except for myself. This was extremely terrifying. Then I had the feeling of high voltage electricity that make this humming sound and buzzing sound and feeling this throughout my entire body. I then woke up in the morning in that exact same position that it left me in. So, those are somewhat short versions of my two stories. I have many more like them. Thank you for taking the time to listen. During my college years, my brother and I lived in an old brownstone in South Minneapolis. The apartment itself was large and sublevel with two bedrooms. From the moment we moved in, we knew there was something wrong. On numerous occasions, I saw someone in my hallway moving across the rooms out of the corner of my eye. I always felt that it was my eyes playing tricks on me initially, but then stranger things began to occur. We began to have our television turn itself on at night. The stereo would do the same. I would be sleeping at night, and it would just start blaring. My bedroom was the worst. It was uncomfortable. I became afraid to sleep in there. I could not describe the feeling. I began sleeping out in the living room, or on the futon. Finally, I told myself to stop with the silliness and resign myself to sleep back in the bedroom again. I did so uncomfortably for a few nights, only to be awakened one night by a man's disembodied head hovering above me and smiling. I still very clearly remember it. I screamed as loud as I could and took off out of that room, and never slept in it again. We moved out after six months of living there. There was a large home in Martin that I lived in for 20 years. It used to be a carriage stop. The first day I was moving in, there was a woman in a black high-colored dress peering out at me, and my mother. The curtain was being held back and she was fiddling with the brooch and the collar of her dress. Once inside the house, it appeared to be a bundle of gray dusty rags 
floating in the air, close to the ceiling. It swooped down under a doorway and went out through the window. It has been seen many times in the road in front of the house. A man in a black coat with a high collar holding a lantern and swing it back and forth as if to lead the way for persons passing through. Sleeping on the couch one afternoon, a little girl in a blue dress was standing in front of me. I couldn't see her face, but she seemed so real. Lying in bed at night, and sometimes in the morning, footsteps could be heard walking up the stairs. You can't move. You feel a weight that holds you still. All you can see is the boots of a large man. He looks into every bedroom and then goes back downstairs. You can then move. In the parlor, you could hear a party going on, and while that is going on, you hear a baby crying. When my mom and I were sitting in the dining room, we both saw objects being thrown across the laundry room. You feel cold and get goosebumps throughout the house. A while ago, me and my friend were doing a project for school, and we got to choose what we did. So we did ghosts and hauntings, and we used the site, and it helped us loads. But anyway, while we were working, our substitute came over and saw what we were doing, and he asked us if we ever had seen a ghost. I think I've heard a ghost crying, but I wasn't too sure, and my friend hasn't seen anything. But my sub said that he had seen one. He said that he went to look after his nephew once, and he saw something. He said that he went around to his brother's house, and while his brother and his wife were getting ready, his nephew came downstairs and told his dad that he had seen the man with the big hat and the funny glasses right upstairs. My teacher asked his brother what he was on about, and his brother said that he had seen the ghost again. My teacher didn't believe him, but his brother said he'd seen it upstairs. Then when his brother and his bro's wife had gone, his nephew, who was only five, wanted to play football in the garden. So as they were going through the kitchen, his nephew said that the man with the big hat and funny glasses was behind my teacher. He freaked out and was scared to death. He said he just wanted to get out of the house, but made himself turn around. He said that he saw a gas-like form that had a pilot's hat on, an old one, not a helmet like nowadays, and that the thing was wearing big goggles. He later found out that his brother's house was built in an old airfield. The story freaked us out. I've been to Reader Road many times and actually know a different story of the road. The ones I saw on your site are new to me. My parents told me the story long ago, and although I've not experienced it for myself, I know others who claim to have. This may be more of a local story, but who knows? It's still something I'd like to share. Back in the 1950s, the road was often used by teens and young adults as a private makeout place. The story goes that a young lady and her boyfriend made a stop at the road. While they were parked, they heard a thumping on top of the car. They ignored it for a bit, but the girl started to become creeped out as the noise grew louder. The boyfriend decided he would get out and investigate. When he got out, the thumping stopped. After several minutes, the boyfriend had not returned, and the thumping started again. The girl panicked and got out of the car. She found her boyfriend bloodied and hung from a tree, and the thumping she was hearing was the sound of her boyfriend's feet hitting the top of the car as he hung there dead. Supposedly on warm summer nights, if you pull off into the road and park for a bit, you will hear the thumping. And if you get out to investigate, the thumping will stop and you will find a letterman's jacket hanging from the tree above you. There is also an abandoned school out in Cedar Lake where Hammond Baptist used to attend. 
the story goes, the pastor went crazy and removed some of the little ones from this world, if you know what I mean. I have personally have experienced strange happenings in the school, such as children's voices, windows that were shut on the way in open as we walked back out. Supposedly, it's supposed to be the little ones trying to escape. From what I understand a few years ago, part of the building caught fire inexplicably. I haven't been there in about five years. However, if you would like some directions to the place, it's a little tricky to get to, and I would be happy to share them with you if you are interested. Like I said, this is a story passed on to me by my parents, and others I know also know the story and claim to have witnessed it. I'm also aware of the satanic gatherings in the field, down the trail in the woods, usually occurring during the two equinoxes every year. This may explain some of the animal parts we found. Also, in this field, I've seen glowing orbs here and there, but never thought much of them since they were out far in the field. But you may be able to look into this more than I can. Oh, and the girl that jumped into the river and drowned, she is also part of this story. And Hammond, of course. She can be seen on Halloween night on Klein Avenue hitchhiking to get to her wedding. Supposedly, if you pick her up, she thanks you for the ride and then disappears into the night. My name is Gemma. I went to a primary school in a small village where I lived for a year or two. Then we had to move into a town nearby. It wasn't too far away from my friends so sometimes I would catch the bus there. One day, I went up to see my friend Holly. She told me that my old deputy head teacher had just died. I don't know how old he was, but apparently he got murdered. That night, Holly asked me to stay at her house for the night, so I did. We were only about 10 at the time. Her parents were downstairs, and her two little brothers were both asleep. We were the only people awake upstairs. Holly went downstairs to get something to eat for me and her, and left me alone. I decided to play a trick on her. I turned all the lights off, and hid under her bed in her room. I looked around. I was really scared, so I looked up and saw two eyes looking at me. They were glowing. At that point, I closed my eyes, thinking it was just my imagination. When I opened my eyes, they were still there. I stayed under the bed because I didn't want to move. Then, I heard Holly coming up the stairs. The eyes backed away into the darkness, and I backed away and hid again. When Holly came into the room, I jumped out and scared her. I told her about the eyes, and she believed me. Then she said, let's take a look inside the wardrobe. So we both opened it slowly and took a look inside. Funny enough, nothing was in there except for her clothes and stuff. So we both decided that it was me seeing things because it was dark. Later that night, Holly turned the lights off, and we both went to sleep. I couldn't get to sleep, and I kept on looking over at the wardrobe. I laid there with my eyes open, when suddenly, I saw the eyes again, looking over at me. I slid under my covers. When I looked out, they had gone, but I could feel something in the room. I knew something was there. Suddenly, a black figure appeared in front of me. It laid down, and then I saw the eyes. It was staring right at me. I screamed, which woke Holly up, and she suddenly backed away against the wall. We could both see the black figure on the floor. 
Then it seemed to sink into the ground and disappear. We both went downstairs and stayed there for a couple of hours. We talked about the figure for ages. Then I said it reminded me of something. Holly said that as well. If we both realized that it looked like Mr. Baker. Why would he haunt us though? We'll never know. When I was younger, I had quite a few paranormal experiences, as did my mom. The most direct contact either of us had with spirits was with her father. He died at home and lived with us when I was about four. My mom was very close to him, and I was pretty close to him too for being so young. After he died, my mom would often be house cleaning and walk into his room where his old recliner sat and smell his unique scent, cigarette smoke mixed with cologne and whatnot. She never saw or heard him, but she would know he was there and would talk to him for a while. When I was six, we moved out of the house he died in and into the house where my mom still lives. I never had the type of encounters my mom had with them. But I was lucky enough to see him once. First, I need to explain the setup of our house. The front and back doors are directly parallel to each other, and both have glass panes in them. The front door opens into the dining room, and he can walk straight through to the kitchen, and then to the back door. You can look from the front porch all the way into the backyard through the glass in these doors. When I was about seven, I was standing in the kitchen, looking out the window of the back door, and I could see the reflection of the front door in the glass. Suddenly, I saw my grandfather walk by the front door in the reflection, as though he was walking across the front porch. He smiled and waved at me. The whole thing only lasted a split second but he was very deliberately contacting me. I believe he chose to do it in such an indirect way so as to not frighten me. Maybe he was saying goodbye since I was too young to understand when he actually died. What's really strange though is that I described him to my mom as looking younger than he did when he died. And when she showed me some pictures of him in his 40s, I told her that that's exactly how he appeared to me. She thinks he must have been happiest during that time of his life, and so chose to appear that way. I think it was a couple years after that when my mom had her final encounter with him. She was house cleaning again, when she smelled his familiar odor. She was in a hurry, and she told him I'm sorry, Dad. I can't really talk right now and left the room. When she came back in, the scent was gone, and she just knew that was the last time she would hear from him. She feels guilty that she didn't stop to talk to him, but I think she just realized that she was ready to move on, and that's why he didn't contact her again. We do believe that he stuck around for a while after that, because he would often lose a piece of jewelry or something small only to have it turn up right under our noses a few days later. I've had other experiences unrelated to my grandfather, but his was the only human spirit I ever actually saw. Not long after we moved into the new home, I had several experiences with feline spirits. I once saw the hind legs and tail of a cat disappearing into, not up, the top of the stairs from the landing. I know it could have been our own cat because it was pure white and our two cats were black. Another time, I was sitting at the kitchen table when I felt a cat rubbing against my legs. I reached down to pet it, but nothing was there. And when I looked under the table, there was no cat to be found. There were also a few incidents in my mom's house where electronics would do seemingly things on their own. 
The TV turned itself off at least twice that I can remember. But perhaps the weirdest instance was when I was in my bedroom listening to my stereo. It has one of those LED screens that flashes at things as music plays. And when you turn the volume knob, these bars show up on the screen that move up or down as you change the volume. I was listening to music one day. I had my back to the stereo. When I realized the volume was getting lower, I turned around and the volume display came up on the screen and the bars were going down like the knob was being turned. I turned the volume back up and nothing else happened after that. This has gotten long, but I only have one more experience to share. At another sleepover with my best friend, we decided to leave a tape recorder with a blank tape in an empty room while we hung out in the living room and record whatever there was to hear. No one went in the room while I was recording and the door was shut. When we played it back, we could very faintly hear ourselves in the living room for most of the tape and nothing else. But there was one spot on the tape where a high-pitched voice spoke in a loud, raspy whisper. It was obviously neither of us, because you could hear us in the background very softly behind it. We weren't sure what it said, but it sounded like shine the light. It didn't make any sense, but it did creep us out. That was the only unexplained voice on the tape, which unfortunately, I no longer have. That was the last experience I had that I'm certain had no physical explanation. This is a story about ghosts that I think is worth sharing. It's a little bizarre and not very detailed, but I think it would capture your interest. When I was young, I always heard ghost stories revolving around these red coat ghosts. These were entities that would often appear in our house. The home I lived in used to house British soldiers from Napoleon's time, so essentially the late 1700s. I remember one particular incident. It was late at night, and that's when I started to hear strange noises in my room. At first, I brushed them off, not thinking anything of it, because you can always explain these incidents away as nothing more than just normal noises. Then, I started to hear noises which were very peculiar. I would hear faded whispers, like a group of people whispering when I would open my door to investigate the sound. It wasn't anything loud, and didn't last for too long. Of course, I ended up going down that staircase to find a root cause of these whispers. What I saw next was actually quite interesting to me. Not scary, although a bit unbelievable. After going downstairs and into the living room, I saw two red coat soldiers for a second, just standing side by side as they quickly faded from the living room. They also had a foggy and faded quality to them to begin with, where you could barely tell a figure was there with the red colors. I'll never forget the moment the rest of my life. Growing up in Lakeland, Florida, my parents purchased a repossessed mobile home. One of the bedroom doors had a deadbolt lock but face so the child in the room could not get out. My elder sister had this room and reported a small girl about the age of five or six that would appear in a white nightgown carrying a teddy bear. She would sit at the end of my sister's bed and just cry. In the closet of the bedroom in the same home, there were stickers and drawings in the wall where it appeared someone was punished and made to sit in the closet. There were also fingernail scratches on the wall in the same closet. 
in the third children's room of the same home. There was brown carpeting with a lime green shape on the floor that was the same shape of a closed iron. If an iron fell onto carpeting while it was hot, doesn't it make sense it would just burn the carpet here instead of change the color to green? My aunt even had to come remove a spirit once that was following my little sister all the way to school and hiding behind things when she'd turn around to see who was following her. My little sister said it resembled a grim reaper type of shadow. In the same home, items would mysteriously be moved to another area. Things would then come up missing, then all of a sudden reappear one day. I truly believe that we are not living alone on this earth, and that spirits live among us. There are a lot of theories as to why this is, but to me, I believe that ghosts and spirits are almost other living forms trapped in another dimension. Even if we have loved ones who have passed and appeared to us, to me, it's like they are leaving this realm of existence to enter another one, and they behave much like we all do, often unaware of the world they just left. I believe that the ones that chose to bridge the gap between our world and theirs are messengers chosen by God to give us confirmation that we as human beings will not lose purpose once we have left this earth, and that our souls do live on. Even if you aren't a religious type, I do believe that if ghosts exist, then God must exist in some form. Otherwise, how do these souls still live on? And what power is allowing them to exist in the other universe? Anyway, my ghost experience comes at the time I was staying at my grandmother's. It was night, and I was 11 years old. I was watching TV in the living room when I heard what sounded like my grandfather, who was a heavy set man, a tall, make his way through the home. Noticeable footsteps, as if he were wearing boots, and they were walking across the hardwood floor. At the time, I immediately recognized it was probably my deceased grandpa, so I yelled out to Grandpa Bunky, please stop scaring me. I was hoping I would get confirmation of him leaving me alone, because I'm a very anxious person, and even though I'm in tune with spirits, sometimes I just don't want to deal with it. I don't think my grandpa honestly meant any harm by it. But I think he felt that he wasn't getting enough attention, if that makes sense, and wanted his presence to really be known that day. He was always known as a loud, boisterous person in life, the kind of man that had to be the center of attention. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I could have swear I saw the shadow of my grandfather materialize. As soon as I got up to turn directly to where he was, he was gone and faded. So I rushed downstairs to where my grandma was. I really wanted to make sure that nobody else was upstairs. So I just asked grandma if she was just up the stairs in the hall. She emphatically said no and asked me why I was so concerned. I told her that I saw Grandpa, and she said that Grandpa is gone, and that while you may miss him, we have to accept this. She didn't believe in the afterlife. Funny thing was, about a year before this all happened, my great uncle died of a disease in his lungs and kidneys. This was the exact same disease that my Grandpa had died from. While that's not unusual, my older sister told me she witnessed the exact same thing that happened to me. One night, when I was at a friend's house sleeping over, she was about 17 at the time. So, I'm not entirely sure if it was my grandpa or great uncle exactly, but I still think my grandpa was the one to visit 
because he knew me better than my great uncle did. I also think that it had to be my grandpa, because maybe he wanted my grandma to believe, but since she is closed off to this world because of her views, he was frustrated. Maybe he gave her signs, and she ignored them. Are frustrated ghosts a thing? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed my story. I have a crazy story to tell. I live in New Orleans. That's of course located in Louisiana, the deep south. One night, me and my girlfriend were at home, and I'm guessing it was around 5.30 in the morning. I'm assuming because that's when I got up to go to work, and I always sit by the window and wait for my ride. This morning was a bit unusual and different. I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, I felt this overwhelming chill brush past me, like an undeniable cold air. I asked my girlfriend if she was cold, and she said no. I don't know what it was, but something told me to tell her to sit in my chair to see if she felt what I was describing. It was a lingering cold that didn't go away and told me she could feel the cold chill as well. It gave us both goosebumps and within a few moments, the coldness quickly disappeared. The crazy part is, I think the chair is haunted. It was given to me as a present from generations in the family. I'm talking an early 1900s style rocking chair. I remember one of my uncles wanted to just sell it off eBay to get rid of it. Because he didn't want anything to do with it. So I ended up taking it off his hands because of the family history. The most interesting part of this chair is... A lot of my family members have claimed to see a black figure in that chair rocking back and forth on numerous occasions. At times, it would be seen rocking on its own without anything being seen. I still have yet to witness anything like this, but ironically, a friend staying over our house actually did. It was later that night, and my girlfriend and I were in a separate room. Suddenly, my friend screams for us to come in because he just saw the rocking chair move on its own without any force. He didn't even know about the history of that chair and our family, so that made it even more terrifying, but intriguing in a way. My dad had stayed in our house once, and he said looking out the window, there was a tree outside our home, and late at night, he saw a faded man in overalls walk behind the tree and suddenly disappear. Again, none of these things have personally happened to me, but they seem to be happening to my family and friends. None of them are capable of lying. I don't see why anyone would anyway, since we're all older, mature adults, and we have no business lying for attention or any purpose, really. Now, just because I said I didn't experience anything, Besides the coldness in the chair, it doesn't mean my girlfriend has it. She told me one day when she was out on the front porch, where you could see the tree. It was evening. It was getting pretty dark, but not so dark. You couldn't see anything. She too thought she saw a very dark shadow move around the tree and then disappear. She said it was the weirdest thing because it was like a fog and you could easily see the contrast between the tree and this mysterious fog. I don't know if you've seen these type of videos before on YouTube where they show this type of stuff, but she said it was very similar to that. She's also seen the blinds from the window where the chair is positioned move from time to time without any explanation. Knocks on the walls and sometimes her name is whispered into her ear. Again, these are her experiences, so I can't tell you if it's real based on what she said. But again, my girlfriend wouldn't lie to me for no reason. 
As you know, New Orleans is a city with lots of history dating back hundreds of years. And with our old home, there's bound to be some entity, especially with the haunted chair. Do you believe in this? Because honestly, as crazy it may seem, I do, even without having these experiences for my own to share. As an open-minded person, I'm not just going to hate on someone just because they have a ghost story to tell. I'll be open-minded. I'll consider their credibility and other things. If all those aspects of their personality check out, then yes, I'll have to believe them. This world is fascinating. It has a lot of mystery. I will not just ignore the spirit world. I just wish that I could experience it too. Just once. What everyone else has as well. I used to live in the Theta Chi fraternity house. As a brother. There were stories talking about the house had a fire in the attic and whole sorts of supernatural and paranormal happenings. I can confirm the fire in the attic was true, and strange things did happen too. Some even reported glowing eyes in the dark of the attic. However, one of the most common had to do with the lights. We had sensors installed to cut back on the brothers leaving the lights on. These sensors only react to the movement. These lights would go on and off all the time when nobody would be in the room. We would be several rooms away, far enough from the sensors that we wouldn't set them off, and they would suddenly go on and off. Also, there were times when we would be sleeping, and we would wake up to what sounded like a large social gathering downstairs. Several of us would go down there, thinking it was a group of brothers coming home from the bar, only to find the entire house empty and no one would be around. Also, I used to work at Have a Nice Day Cafe, and the upstairs was indeed haunted. I would have to go up there every night to take down a banner that was thrown over the exterior of the building. To do this, I would have to go to the roof via the upstairs. It is full of rooms, completely empty. There was this long hallway that stretched the length of the building. There was only one light that sat at the end of the hallway. As you walked down the hall, you would get the feeling that you were being watched. Several bouncers have claimed to see a man up there. Apparently, before it was half a nice day cafe, it was called industry, and one night, a barback intentionally left the world upstairs, using a broken beer bottle, and when the bouncers would make their rounds before closing, they would have to go up there to make sure no one snuck up there. When they would flash their flashlights into the room in which the sad incident took place, the man ghost was seen crying and bleeding. He would get up and run towards you, as if asking for help. Many bouncers quit after they experienced it. I guess you could say they bounced after they saw that ghost. This is a true story of our family's experience at Theodorus' Bridge in Wichita, Kansas. I grew up in Sigwich, Kansas, a small town just north of the bridge's location. Since my family is American Indian, we always respected the legend and tales of the bridge. On May 12, 1983, my own mother was killed in a car wreck within feet of the old bridge. The police couldn't explain what caused her to swerve sharply to the left. However, they agree that something must have been in the road right in front of her. What's odd? is that no animal tracks were ever found, and it wasn't another car. I was young at the time, and awoke around midnight with a horrible dream. It had to do with being grossly removed from this life. Someone had chopped my head off with an axe. Later that morning, around 4.45 a.m., 
I was awakened again by someone pounding on my door. It was the police looking for me. Turns out, they found my driver's license in my mom's car. Thinking it was me who died, they came to inform my parents only to find me standing in the doorway. Several years later, I was helping my dad go through some papers and found my mom's death certificate. Only then did I find out that mom was thrown through the windshield with her head coming right off. Throughout the years, as family members and friends have drove by, the sight strange things have happened to them. Their cars would quit working for just a few moments when they see things, like my mom standing there, looking at them, and smiling. If anyone would like to email me, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about all the strange things I've occasionally seen. My name is Catherine. After the experiences me and my family have had, I know we have a ghost. It all started when I was seven. I couldn't get to sleep. I looked down from my bunk bed for a moment or two and saw in my bedroom closet which had no door, what seemed to be a little girl, sitting in there, staring at me. She wore a white dress and was underneath either a white blanket or a duvet cover. Once me, my mom and my sister were watching a film in the dark, and suddenly, on the shelf, my picture was slammed down. One time my sister had said that she had seen the ghost, one night when we had our normal beds. She saw her walk from the closet to the end of the bed and just staring at her. Then she flew through the wall. The second time I saw her was when I was out in the kitchen. I saw her out the window, in the shadow window, smiling. But there would be two faces beside her this time. The scariest experience I've ever encountered was when I was watching TV. I was sitting down on one of the seats when I heard footsteps coming down the stairs. I got scared and turned off the TV to ask who was there. Then the door creaked open. Then there was a noise in the other seat, like someone was sitting down on it. I was so scared that I couldn't even move. Nothing else happened since then, but I know her house is haunted for sure. The girl just won't go away. Hi, my name is Kim, I'm 18 years old, and I have a few experiences I would like to share with you. Every summer, I used to go to my Nana's farm and help out. The last time I went was a few years ago. That was when I was 14, and something creepy happened that I've since tried to forget. I think it's about time I shared it with you all. It was a boiling hot July afternoon, and I was helping to clean out one of the barns. My Nana went on and on for about an hour, complaining that it was too hot for her liking, but I decided to stay to try and finish. About ten minutes after my Nana left, I began to hear tiny pitter-patter of the feet in the hayloft, thinking that it was just mice or something. I got on with my work. I began sweeping when I heard laughter and two voices, one of a boy and the other of a girl, talking in hushed whispers. I peered up the stairs, feeling slightly scared, and called again, but nobody replied. As I turned to get back to my work, the voice of the girl called up, up here. I was quite spooked. Nobody should be up here. But yet, there I was, hearing a voice. Sometimes, though, the other kids in the village muck around, so maybe I thought it was one of them. Hey, you're not allowed up there, I shouted as I walked up the stairs. As I got up to the hayloft, I looked up to see two black shadows with hooks through their necks, almost hanging for a split second. This faded quickly. I completely freaked out and ran screaming to my Nana's house. 
My Nana later told me that two little people had died in that barn when they were playing around. My mom came to pick me up the next day, and as we drove away, I looked back at the barn and saw two little faces staring right back at me from the hayloft window. Needless to say, I never went back. In 1998, I had a ghost experience, my first and I hope my last. I was living in the second floor of a college dormitory. My colleague that lived directly under me would ask me on occasion if I was moving furniture late in the night and early morning between 12 midnight and 2 a.m. Absolutely not. I can recall that I moved my bed once in the middle of the day when I first moved in, at the beginning of the semester, I thought maybe it was a ghost because it was common knowledge that our dormitory was an old TB hospital. The entire campus was located on an old military hospital site. Her cafeteria was where the morgue was, back in the Great First Conflict or the Great Second Conflict. I never heard anything in my room. Then. Early one Saturday morning, I got up and made myself coffee and left the dormitory on the second floor and headed down the old iron stairs. I made my way across the tennis courts to make a phone call. I could see my dormitory from where I stood. I dialed the number and was talking to a friend steadily watching the stairs to my dorm. That is, when I saw a smoky black figure flailing its arms around and staring straight at me. Then it went back into the locked closed doors of the second floor dorm. They lock behind each person that leaves, so I reported it to staff. That is when I started to hear many ghost stories from the night's guardsmen that patrolled the cafeteria and hallways. There are many dorm buildings on campus. Anyhow, I put it behind me and continued my life. Shortly after my brother died, due to a long illness, I returned to college, but got my own apartment and shared it with a friend. It would get so cold in there, he turned on all the way up and the fireplace on, yet it was 70 degrees outside. I was still grieving, so I withdrew from college and took my truck on a long drive across the country in Nebraska while at a rest stop, my entire truck swarmed with flies. I'm very clean, and so was in my truck. I was eating, but still swarms of flies. I threw my food away and drove and drove crying and screaming, trying to get them out of my truck. I stopped to wash my truck, then got a motel and shower. I returned six months later to my old apartment to ask around to see if the new renters had any problem. The lady that opened the door was really nice and said that she had to hire someone from another state to come and clear the ghost. She said that it was so bad that the person they hired had to have a partner come and help. She mentioned the freezing cold room temperatures, the feelings that someone was following her up the stairs like I had. They said they do a certain ceremony and burn certain herbs to clear away the spirit because she did minor ghost clearing work, but it was too much for her. She said that the people she hired said that the bowl they used to burn herbs caught fire. The flames reached the ceiling. It was the worst ghost cleansing they had to do in a long time. Then the lady did a ceremony over me and the feeling that something hanging on my back just went away. Actually. I felt whatever it was kind of crawl up and out of me and move my spine involuntarily. I've never had a problem since. Mabel Castle, located in Asherville, Scotland, was built many hundreds of years ago and is reputed to have its fair share of ghosts. There have been many sightings over the years one of which may be the young lady Jane, 
who had been imprisoned in the turret for falling in love with a gypsy. I recently have been invited to participate in a sponsored ghost watch at the castle, but chicken out at the last minute due to a recent visit by a ghost expert who reported the presence of at least three ghosts, one of which was a crying child who had been tortured and tied in the basement. There is regular paranormal activity reported as the castle is still being used as offices. Anyway, I'm sort of of two minds about losing my nerve as the ghost watch had proved eventful. Crying had been heard from the basement. When the team left at 4 a.m., they made sure all the lights had been turned off. But in the car park, they looked back, and all the lights had been turned back on. When the cleaner came in the morning, the energy conscious ghost had turned them off again. Of course, such paranormal happenings are not rare in Scotland. I can quote hundreds from friends and family. These are just a few. My sister and husband walked into a bookshop housed in a very old building with a bookshop straight off of one shelf, one after the other. My youngest sister lived for years in a haunted house, possibly the spirit of a young child. There were occasional temper tantrums. This is a tragic but true tale. My youngest sister and her then-boyfriend, George, had friends over for the evening. Of course, the talk turned to ghost stories in general, when suddenly, the door of the sitting room flew open with such force, it crashed against the arm of the sofa and slammed shut again. George jumped up and pulled open the door, but nobody was there. Everyone was shaken by the violence of the event. Later, it was learned that at that precise moment in time, George's cousin and his friend had drowned in the River Irvin after a night of drinking and hijinks that went badly wrong. I remember reading about the drowning of these men in the local paper at the time, but did not learn of the connection to my sister's boyfriend until later. A friend heard the voice via baby monitor, which urged the baby to come. It was hard to be distinguished from the low guttural tone whether it was male or female. When they went to investigate, no one was in the room besides the baby. My name is Trisha, and I'm writing about one of the many few ghost experiences I've had in my life. I'm fortunate to have found the site to talk to many of those who have experiences with the supernatural. I moved to Bemis Point, New York from Woodbridge, Virginia on May 1st, 2004 into a house which as to this date, I still call my dream home because all my life, I always wanted to live in a home so big and so beautiful. This house had five bedrooms, one bath, a basement, in a beautiful yard. I want to explain why I've chosen to talk about this particular experience in this home in Bemis Point, New York. Of course, I wasn't the only person living in a five bedroom home. It was me, my fiance, and my four year old son. My fiance's brother and father are going to live with us. However, that didn't really work out. So it was just the three of us for a while. Before we all actually moved into the home, my fiance and my father went to the house to drop off some belongings of ours. My fiance had videotaped every room of the home. The home was just so extraordinary to us, like something we had never seen before. As of this date, we still hold in possession the tape which had been recorded of that home. One of the bedrooms had been painted with artwork from a very artistic person. That artwork is believed to have been finger painted and very unusual. At the time I looked at the house before we had all moved in, I went to that room with the painting many times. I knelt down on my knees in front of the painting and touched it with my hands to get a full feel of its characterization. 
I will say to this date that the painting that was on the wall at that very moment had changed once we had moved into the home. First, it was a painting of a turkey, very unusual. There were many things in this house that were strange, only we didn't catch the unusual things about them until we had moved in. To this date, I only hope to find who had lived here before we had, and I will, in time, find my answers. Now you will know the beginning of this unusual experience. It started with that painting. After we had moved into the home, we began to refresh our minds a little bit of what we thought was strange. I was in the process of unpacking and settling into our new home. I went back into that room with the painting and was in shock from what I had seen. That painting was a woman and there was writing above the painting of that woman and it said earth, hater, everything. The painting of the woman was on the wall, right on the outlet corner where a television had been sitting. I will explain to you what description I'd seen in that painting. It was a woman whose face was intensely beaten with blood flowing from her hair down through her face and then to her arms. Her hair was hung up as if she had been in an electric shock. Her face was bruised badly and cut up with scars on the side of her face. Her eyes were open and the smile on her face was extremely intense as if she was angry. I looked around the room more thoroughly and there on the other side of the wall were more paintings. One was of a butterfly, and a mushroom was the other. On the closet door was a poem written by the famous poet, Keats. I believe to this date, the same person who had written the poem on the door had to have been the same person who did the painting on the wall. I looked around the room closer and came upon some blood on the floor on the side of the room. It was not fresh blood because it looked like it had dried up and had been there for a long while. I closed the door behind me and left the room. I didn't go back to the room until later on through the next week. One of the rooms upstairs was right next to that room that we had turned into an office. Across the room was the bathroom. On the other side was another room we used for our bedroom. Of course. There was an attic located right across from the room with the painting. On the door that leads to the attic is a sign that says private. I always wondered who slept up there in that attic. In the attic, there were beds, two of them. The beds were built into the floor and the walls. Underneath the boards of the beds were pipes. I won't say what kind of pipes because I'm not sure. My only guess is that they are water pipes. The attic was made to be one of the five bedrooms in the entire house. This room, however, was among the most strangest thing I'd ever seen, the exception with the room being the painting. In this room, the attic was cross spaces large enough to fit almost ten or more bodies depending on the size. In one of the cross spaces was another painting. This painting was put together with boards. It was handmade, and the colors of the painting were the exact same colors used in the painting of the other room. It seemed to be the painting of the devil. However, it was never confirmed of what the painting really was. There was a sofa left in the room with strands of brown hair, which seemed to be the color of my own hair, and I never even sat on the couch when we found it there let alone had it belonged to me. Along with the sofa, there had been a brown recliner chair sitting next to the sofa. Underneath the recliner there had been a huge blood stain. In turn, could have passed to be a huge stain of grease. The attic could have been turned into at least two rooms by the size of the cross spaces, and that's an example of how big they were. When I left the room of the attic to go back downstairs, I noticed as I walked down the stairs, there had been names engraved into the carpet of each step that I walked down. I could not make out the names, but I was indeed visible to the eye. 
it was very strange to me. I wanted to find out some information about the house because I began to get nervous and anxious of the situation. I turned to our next door neighbor for info and hoped to find out all I could. One side of the house was cut off by a wall where the next door neighbor had lived. It was indeed unfortunate to us because that wall was separated from the neighbor and had not been closed off to him as he had all entrances into our part of the house. No door on our side had locks to keep him coming through our side of the home. This made me very nervous, especially throughout the night, with an exact total of four rooms upstairs in the bathroom and only one bedroom downstairs. We had turned that room on the bottom level downstairs into my son's room. It was not safe enough to put my son upstairs due to the stairwell and the fact that I was afraid that he would get hurt. Therefore, the only room downstairs we had used for his room, just outside of my son's bedroom, was the basement door and another door that led to the next door neighbor's bathroom. We were told that the door that led to the neighbor's bathroom had not been used because the bathroom toilet was broken. To this date, I don't believe that theory which had been said to us. I noticed on the side where my son's bedroom was, each door had locks on them at the top, which made me nervous because I was concerned that someone could get locked in and would not be able to get out. However, the only door without a lock was the bathroom door to the neighbor's side of the home. That seemed a bit unusual to me, as if it was purposely set up that way so that the next door neighbors could have entrance into our side of the home whenever he wanted to come on our side. Another entrance that our next door neighbor had to our side of the house was in the kitchen right where the pantry closet is. In the process of unpacking, I had sat some pictures against the door until I got around to hang them up. Other entrances the neighbor had to our side of the home were upstairs and in the basement. There was a storage place located right between the office and the bathroom, which had two doors inside the storage space that the next door neighbor could use on our side of the home. On our side of the storage space were locks, therefore, we're fortunate for the matter. The doors to the storage space were made of glass, and therefore, it would have to take someone to break the glass or professionally remove the glass in order to enter on our side. As for the basement, the neighbor would have to break the chain on our side to come up the stairs on our side. Anyway, after having suspicions of what may have happened in this home, or what could have happened, I had to talk to someone and find out something. That's when I started questioning the next door neighbor. One day, I ran into our neighbor outside, not literally, and asked him about the painting that was on the wall. I asked him if he had known of the tenants who used to live in the home before us, and possibly all he could tell me about the painting and who stayed in the home where the painting was. The neighbor claims that a girl by the name Anna stayed in that room at one time and told me that she was the one who did the painting. At that very moment, I felt that there was more that he had known that I need to know now. With having a few supernatural experiences previously, the feeling that someone would lead me to some kind of answer clinged to me to ask him more about what he could tell me. He told me that Anna was about the same age as me and knew that she had been involved in many serious circumstances with others dealing with gothic rituals, practicing witchcraft, and had camped out with others in the back of the house at a campsite where most of the rituals were being performed. He offered to take me back to the campsite one day although I never was able to get around to it. Thereafter, I insisted on letting him take a look at the painting himself, as well as the poem from Keats that was written on the door in the room. We also went to the attic to look at the stain that was on the floor. He could not agree with me that it looked like anything like a blood stain. 
I showed him the names engraved into the carpet on the stairs to the attic. He couldn't make a vision of what I had been seeing. Therefore, he wasn't able to discuss that matter with me. As far as the blood in the room on the floor of the room with the painting, he did in fact agree with me that it appeared to be bloodstains. However, he could not give me any explanation of why or how it got in there. The neighbor explained that he rarely paid any attention to anything in the home and hadn't been in the home but a few times to do some work to it. I didn't agree with that theory at all. I knew there had to be a lot of info missing that he wouldn't tell me then. The neighbor insisted on finding someone to come look at the painting. I told him that it would be a good idea for someone to come out to take a look at everything I had seen and to examine the home in case there was any signs of supernatural crisis. When the neighbor left, I assumed that what he intended to do was not going to happen only because I felt that he knew more than he was willing to tell me at that time. I left the matter alone long enough for me to stumble across anything else that seemed unusual to me. The day after, my fiancé and I, along with our son, left the home to take care of some business, and when we had returned to the home that evening, we saw the neighbor coming out of our house with a cooking pot. It was quite unusual to us knowing that the home had been locked up, and could not understand how he had gotten into the home without having a key. My fiancé and I got out of the car and the neighbor walked over to us, explaining that he went into the house. He told us that we made him quite nervous about the discussion with the painting as well as everything else we talked about. Therefore, he decided to speak with his cousin on how to bless the home. The neighbor explained that he blessed the entire home, using some ancient herbs that were given to him, and told us that he was trying to help us out because he felt that it would resolve the situation. After his explanation, he continuously explained that he would not go back into the home without us knowing about it first. We left this incident alone, being as it was a first time offense, and he said he was trying to help. When we walked into the home after speaking with him, we could smell the scent of the herbs he used all through the home. It was a very strong and painful scent, almost as if it was the smell of marijuana. The smell was in a long stretch throughout the home. I was more concerned for my son. We had to leave the house for a few hours more in order to escape the smell and painful irritation of our eyes. Finally, once we returned to the home, the smell settled and we could breathe again. I wasn't actually pleased for the matter that he had came into the home uninvited and blessed the home with no knowledge of what he was doing. Still, I left the matter alone, believing that he would not do it again. In order to concentrate on other things, I used my time trying to unpack my things and cleaning one room to the next. It wasn't until the next few days later, I had an incident of my own. It was in the middle of the night, we were all asleep, and I was awakened by a man who laid there on top of me with all his weight pushing on me, so tight that I couldn't breathe. I thought I had been having a nightmare, although my eyes were open, and the force I had been using to fight and pull to escape this man's weight, and the fear he had been pouring over me, was only a nightmare in my life. In reality... I looked beside me as I laid there fighting to escape the fear amongst the man's desire to hurt me, trying to wake my fiancé from a sleep to save me. My fiancé laid there in a deep sleep as I could not hear a peep from my crying screams of what I had left to breathe. I had been played with that very night, if you know what I mean, laying there in my own head my fiancé laying right next to me. With one heroic scream, I used all my weight to escape this man's arms 
and pushed him off of me. Frightening. All I could see was his brown hair and his back that turned to my face as he walked away with not even two seconds and disappeared. I sat up in my bed next to my fiance, waiting there, holding my body, hoping he would be awake and hold me. I could not make sense of this. Not then and not now. Even after, I knew it wasn't over. I couldn't even call the police because let's face it, I wouldn't be able to explain to them of such an incident. Even so, they wouldn't be able to believe me. Amongst other things, they would turn it on my fiance and I would not take that route. Not then and not now. After my fiance had awakened, I told him about what happened. He just held me tight and he was worried. I'm thankful he believed me. After a while, I was too angry to sit there and do nothing. I was determined to get my answers. Even then, why me? I know I'm not the only person in the entire world who has had this exact same incident. There are others. I know because I've read about them. I know that there are others out there who have been hurt multiple times in incidents like this. I've now moved out of that home and only lived two minutes away from there. I've not been back since we moved. There are others who I'm aware who live in that same house right now as I'm telling you this. Four of them I am aware of are girls. I fear for them. I worry for them. Even though this isn't the only incident that happened to me in that same home, they live in there as I speak. As there have been many incidents, not so much severe to this one. I worry for anyone who lives there. This will come back to me one day. In some form, some way, it will find me and I will find my answers. I've had the experience of the supernatural ever since I was a young child, around the age of seven years old. It has followed me. I'm 22 now. This house I lived in in Buma Point, New York was said to be over 100 years old. The supernatural experiences I've had are real. And maybe some kind of gift that I've been given, but it's frightening at the same time. I only seek to understand it. Even so, it's frightening to know the answers I'm looking for. I can only do what I can to accept this the best way I find reasonable. I will tell you that the man who messed with me that night is in no way comparison to any person I've ever met or come across my entire life. This will be one of the many experiences I will never forget. I know that there are others out there who wonder just the same as I do. Why me? Is there ever really an answer to that question? And if you ever wonder whatever happened to the painting, the handmade artwork that was found in those rooms, I won't be able to explain that to you. All I can tell you is that the neighbor that lived next door to me went into the house without telling us, carved that painting off the wall, literally, and told me that he burned it. As far as the handmade artwork made out of boards, I won't ever know. The neighbor took that too. To this date, that painting exists as well as the handmade artwork made of boards. Everything in this house exists to me, and as far as the girl I was told that did the painting on the wall, Anna, what does she know? Where is she today? My last question in regards to the landlord, John, do you always allow your son to go into the home whenever he wants to, especially when other tenants are renting the home from you? Trust me, one day it could end up being a big mistake for him. My guess is, is there something to hide? I live in Arlington, Washington. When I moved into my house, the forks started bending. Now when I'm there by myself, I can hear people walking upstairs. When I'm upstairs trying to sleep, I can hear people or things running up and down the stairs. 
If I get up and look down the stairs, I can't see anything, but I can still hear it. Soon after we started moving into this home, our pets started disappearing. One of our cats came back, covered in what looked like blood. He was gone about an hour after he came back. All of our pets were inside pets. My aunt saw a little girl in my yard and in the house with blonde hair. Nobody I live with or live near has even blonde hair. When my mom lived with me, she saw her too. My sister loved to listen to her stereo, but then the stations started changing by themselves. We could actually watch the bar move back and forth across it. Recently, my dad's stereo started doing that too. I got an eyes on sticky film camera for my birthday one year. I took a picture and there was an orb in the corner of it. When I'm home alone, it can totally be silent. I'll be reading a book and my dog will start barking. I can get her to calm down, but as soon as I sit down again, she starts barking again. My cousin and I got really big chills right before we hear any of the noises upstairs. We look at our attic doors, but every morning the lock is unlocked and sometimes on the ground. Sometimes at night, I can even hear faint talking. I had a friend stay with me once and she tried to get out of bed, but she said she felt something heavy on her. There was nothing that I could see on her. My dad went into the kitchen in the middle of the night to get a glass of water and the freezer was wide open. This all started in 88. My aunt even had someone come and bless the home. I guess it didn't work because it is still happening. My name is Eric and I have a couple of occurrences that are rather interesting. Nothing amazing, but definitely weird. I've always been interested by dark things. Like to dress in black, and I like to listen to extreme metal and such things like that. So I've always kept an open mind on such things. Well, anyways, when I was about six years old, me and some of my brothers slept in the floor of the living room for about a couple of years. Well, one night... I awoke for no real reason, I guess. I was still tired, so I didn't want to get up or open my eyes when I felt something unexplainable. It was the feeling that someone was near me that wanted to hurt me. I can't explain it. I just felt that. Well, being curious, I opened my eyes and I saw an older woman crouching down next to me and her face was right in front of mine as if looking right at me. I closed my eyes again in sheer terror, but I was still curious to see if it was still there. So I looked, and the woman's face was still there. I didn't actually see her body. I just assumed she had a body or something. I closed and opened my eyes several times, and she was still there. I was more scared than heck, but somehow I went back to sleep. It never happened again, and I never told anybody because I really thought it could have been my imagination. But I know what I felt, and I'll never forget that terrible feeling I got. Another interesting experience I had was the same year, a few months later. I woke up for no real reason, and when I opened my eyes, I saw an older looking woman standing on the base of my brother's feet that slept next to me. I didn't close my eyes because I wanted to see if it was real. At one moment, I felt that same threatening feeling, but not for myself. But I actually feared the well-being of my brother. I went to sleep again, and it never happened again after. I never told anybody for the same reason as last time, because I'm skeptical. So I could have been either a real apparition or just my stupid imagination. I guess I'll never know. I've been looking at your website for the last couple of weeks, 
and have read some of the experiences people had with the supernatural. I've had several experiences in my life. The first one that I can really remember is when my grandmother died. I was 16 years old and lived most of my life with my grandma. The night she passed away from cancer, I was devastated since I never got to say goodbye to her. But the night she passed, she came back to say goodbye to me. I remember being in that state between wake and asleep. I remember her coming to my bed, sitting beside me, and telling me she was perfectly fine and so happy to be with my grandpa. I told her I loved her, and she left. The second thing that happened was about two months after I had my third child. We moved into a beautiful home in Northwest Ohio. It had been totally remodeled, except for one room upstairs, in which we made into a toy room for the kids. My daughter, who was two at the time, was in that room playing when she started screaming for me. I ran up the stairs to see what was wrong with her, and she was in a corner with her hands protecting her head and screaming for the bad man to go away. I did not see a man. I picked her up and headed back downstairs, and when I was on the third or fourth step down, I felt as if someone was behind me and very angry with me. Needless to say, I ran the rest of the way down. Also in that home, I was in the kitchen washing my son's bottles, and directly behind the sink was our stove. I would placed my son in the carrier by the stove. My daughters had brought in their stuffed animals that my mother had gotten them for Easter, and laid them down beside the stove. Now, these stuffed animals were the kind that make noise, as in the duck quacked, the pig oinked, and the cow mooed. I know my son was just a little bit too young to be able to reach over his carrier and play with the toys, let alone make them talk. While I was washing his bottles, the duck started in. I thought nothing of it. I thought maybe it was just malfunctioning. But then the cow started in, and a few seconds after that, the pig. I turned around and my son was just all smiles. Needless to say, I hightailed it out of the home. I always hated to go into the basement of that house. It just felt wrong for me to be down there. But one afternoon, I had no choice but to go down. I had to take a bag of old clothing down to be stored. I thought I would just leave them on the floor, right at the bottom of the steps. So I leaned down to retie the bag, and as soon as I look up, I saw two little girls standing right in front of me. They were not my little girls. They looked about seven and five years old, and let me tell you, I didn't waste any time getting up these stairs. They did not make me feel very safe. I did some research on the home, and found that the house was built in the mid-1800s. A man and his family lived in the home, and he had two daughters. The man owned some money to a loan shark, and when he couldn't repay his debt, the loan shark killed the two daughters and buried them in the basement. My family and I didn't stay long in that house. The longer we stayed, the more evil it seemed to be. The most recent experience has been for the last two and a half years. My father passed away, and I've had a very hard time dealing with his passing. I was made to make all of his decisions when it came to taking him off of life support. I felt, and still feel guilty for letting him go. I know that my dad comes to visit me, and I hope he never stops visiting. I don't let anyone smoke in my home, and my dad hated it. He hated to go outside in the garage. He was always on my case about it. Well, now that Dad has passed away, there are many nights and even days that you can smell cigarette smoke so plainly 
like it's right next to you. I know it's my dad, and I tell him to take it to the garage, and he does. I know that he's looking out for me and my family. I just wish he would show himself to me just one more time. Thank you so much for your website. It's a comfort knowing that I'm not alone and definitely not crazy. This story involves my aunt and uncle and took place in the late 70s and early 80s. My aunt and uncle and then baby cousin lived in a nice modest house in Upland, California, a very nice little city near Panola in Ontario. The niceness of the house didn't last long, and almost immediately, my family began experiencing weird things. Every night on the way to bed, my uncle would latch close the door to the spare bedroom across the hall from he and my aunt's master bedroom. Every morning, as he passed the same door, it would discreetly unlatch and push itself open on its own. This same room once locked in my uncle's sister, with her and my uncle both frantically turning and pushing and pulling on the door as things flew out of the closet at her. All at once, everything stopped, and they both jumped back to have the door unlatch and push itself open, as it always did. Needless to say, my uncle's sister didn't stay much longer in the bedroom, let alone the home. When my aunt would leave the home to run errands in the daytime, she would return to find all the pictures from the wall on the ground, not knocked over, but propped against the wall, directly under the nail it was once hanging on. This would happen nearly every time the house is left empty, no matter how many times they would put the items back on the wall. Another nightly struggle is the pounding up and down the walls, like someone banging their fist across the center of the wall, back and forth, back and forth. My own grandma, as well as my mom and dad, witnessed this and hightailed it out of there ASAP. One day in the summer, my cousin, who was about two or three, was sitting in a high chair next to a long hallway. My aunt was just outside the back door. My cousin asked, Mommy, who's that man in the hallway? My aunt, not quite listening, aspect somewhat distracted. What man? My cousin proceeded to explain that the man looked like her uncle Mike, who lived out of state. When my family had finally decided that enough was enough, they decided to sell the home and moved to Calamansa, just outside of Yucapica, California. On one of their last nights in the home, it seemed as if everything was going crazy. The pounding was out of control, there were loud bangs and unusual noises everywhere, and their dog was at the front door, its hair on end, and growling out the front porch. My aunt and uncle looked outside to the wraparound driveway and saw their van, rocking back and forth as if people were inside jumping around. Within seconds, everything had stopped. Once my family had moved out, they eventually learned that their house was built over an old Indian burial ground. I've tried to ask my aunt more about this story, but she'll rarely talk about it, and I think is subconsciously trying to block it out. My aunt and uncle are very straight-laced and don't make up these sort of things, and I think that if my other family members had not been there to witness a lot of them, I would not even know about these occurrences in Upland. I've had to rely on my mom retelling me what she remembers, my aunt telling her as it was happening. There are probably many more things that went on that I would love to find out. I still don't even know the address of this old home see if the place still exists. As for the significance of Uncle Mike, my cousin's Uncle Mike had long, black flowing hair with darkly tanned skin and often wore a leather band across his forehead. Think 70s rocker fashion, looking somewhat like an Indian perhaps.
This happened quite recently. Well, a few weeks ago, actually. Apart from what I think are a few cases of what I think are more likely sleep paralysis with the resulting hallucinations, this is the only experience I felt that was truly, well, weird. A bit of background first. I live alone and rent an apartment in a newly built block, one of three, of low-rise units. These were built on the grounds of an old public primary school, which is over a hundred plus years old. The far end of the strip of where the school used to be is preserved, and still has the school hall, a beautiful sandstone building, and is used for public functions. My particular block is built where the playgrounds etc. used to be. I know this as I grew up in the area, and remember the school when I was a teenager though I did not go there, and remember what it used to look like beforehand. I'm personally unaware of any hauntings in the area, nor am I unaware of the history of the site, as I have not researched it. There is a fairly modern funeral based directly across the road containing offices, a small chapel, and a large garage with several hearses. Whilst I assume bodies are prepared there, etc. there, there are no burials. The story. I had a very hard day at work. I have been under a lot of stress. It was a Friday night, fairly late, and I eventually decided to go to bed. I had a lot of trouble sleeping, as my mind was working 100 miles per hour. You know the feeling. I simply couldn't turn it off. After staring at the ceiling for an hour, I became frustrated, and finally, I thought I'd open my mind and try to meditate. It was an effort, but after almost half an hour of this, I drifted off. Shortly after, I had an odd feeling, and I woke up and opened my eyes. I immediately noticed a web of white mist floating above me. This network of yellow-white colored mist was basically sort of like a spider web about a meter above my bed and almost stretching across the entire room. Actually, the whole room was a bit foggy in general. I blinked, and then did a I don't think so, double take, and rubbed my eyes. No sleep paralysis this time. It was still there. I tried to focus my eyes on it, and it was not easy. But what I saw was what I thought were transparent faces outlined in the mist. The effect was very like the outline of an invisible person in smoke. One moved through on my right side and looked directly at me. The fear started to hit me now, but I tried to calm myself down and think rationally. Just hold on here. I might be seeing things just because I am so tired and stressed, and I've just woken up too. I forced myself to be distracted and take my attention away. I shifted position in bed, closed my eyes, rubbed them, blinked them several times, and looked over at my clock radio. It was about 1.10 I think. Then looked back up, and it was still there. I then started to feel a slight vibration in my bed. Not a strong one, just like you'd feel the ground at a station as the train went past. I remember thinking what the and thought at first it was just my body shivering because I was cold or I had a muscle twitch. My attention on this now I flexed my muscles a few times and then tried to hold still and feel it was still there. The bed was definitely vibrating, even a bit more pronounced now. I was getting quite frightened and not knowing what else to do short of running out of the bedroom. I began to recite a prayer softly and also verbalized what I wanted any spirits to leave the place, basically anything that came to mind, just in case I wasn't imagining things. After about a minute of this, it faded. After a while, I wanted to go back to sleep as I was super tired, but every minute or so, I was worried it was still there, so I snapped my eyes open to check. It had gone. A few minutes after that, I fell asleep again with no more events that night.
Now after the events when I think about it, I wonder if it was just my imagination or something else. What surprised and concerned me is that I felt very lucid. I felt quite clear-headed. The only other event which is vaguely similar, which I dismissed at the time, was about a year ago when I woke up in the early hours of the morning to see a similar face above and to the left of my bed, no mist, looking at me. I rather sheepishly recall the shock yelling and then punching it. Honestly, who punches a ghost? Seemed to work though. The action either jolted me out of my sleep hallucination or made whatever it was go away. I'm not sure what to make of the above event to be honest. As a general comment in my apartment itself, I don't typically feel anything strange or a presence, and other than this, there have been no odd things going on. Plenty of unusual sounds, mind you, but I'm fairly sure these come mostly from the neighbors, etc. Usually from what I read about hauntings, they tend to be more or less repetitive, and don't just hit you like that and go away. So I'm still not 100% convinced it wasn't a half dream. But still, what a freak out. I now believe that I officially have a poltergeist in my home. At first, my living boyfriend thought I was nuts. Now, he believes it too. The first day I moved in, I was doing laundry in the basement. My cats both began acting strangely encircled me whenever I was in the basement. I thought they were just hungry and trying to get my attention. But when I waited out to go upstairs, I had this terrible feeling that someone was standing behind me, staring right through me. The 12 year old inside me told me to run up the stairs like I did when I was a kid. And I did. Then, one day, I was looking for my favorite tank top. I couldn't find it anywhere, and could swear that I brought it to this new house. I dismissed it as having it left somewhere. The third day we lived in this house, I broke my ankle playing softball. I ended up having to sleep on the couch in the living room. Throughout my two months stay on the sofa, I could swear I heard someone going up and down the basement steps, cold breezes, etc. I just thought that the pain medication was kicking in, and that my mind was playing tricks on me. After I could walk again, and venture into the basement to do the laundry, I still had the same feeling that someone was standing behind me and staring at me. One night, I was getting ready to fall asleep in the bedroom when my boyfriend was out of town fishing. I had both dogs in the room, one on the bed and the cats too, and the dog on the floor next to the bed. Out of nowhere, I heard a loud thump, like a book had just fallen off a bookshelf and onto the hardwood floor. Well, I don't have any bookshelves in the bedroom, nor was anything on the floor except for clothes when I turned the light on. Just this last week, I came home to discover the bed neatly made, pillow stacked just so, and the blankets pulled up neatly and turned down. When I thanked my boyfriend for making the bed, he just stared at me. He said, what are you talking about? And I said that I didn't know what got into him to make the bed so nice, but it was a nice thing to do. He said though that I came home on my lunch hour and made the bed. He had been gone all day and didn't come home until I was already home. The basement lights continually go on and off, the light switches don't work, and the light bulbs are new. The circuits have been checked and everything is fine, I never know when they will work. The other night, the toilet handle in the bathroom jiggled for 10 minutes straight at 3am and we both heard it. The night before last, my boyfriend witnessed the light come on in the hallway outside our bedroom and had heard the light switch flip. The light faded 
and later when he got up to go to the bathroom, the kitchen light was on, which had been off when we went to bed. Last night, I saw a light come into our bedroom from the hallway and then fade. I also heard a very loud thump at the foot of my bed. When I got up, only my tennis shoes were in the floor, hardwood floor, and nothing else had fallen off or was out of place. It was so loud, I physically jumped when I heard it. My boyfriend was sound asleep. I am convinced that someone or something is totally screwing with me. This is a very personal story to my family, but I think your readers might find it as fascinating as I do. My mother grew up in an infamous mental institution in Massachusetts, now closed, and I won't name the facility for privacy's sake. She was placed in state custody in 1948 at six years old because my grandmother, a Portuguese gypsy immigrant and closet psychotic, claimed she was mentally disturbed. In actuality, my grandmother was just not capable of raising her, so she successfully pawned her off on the state. My mother was not only a beautiful and innocent child, but was totally mentally capable and 100% sane. In those days, there was no system in place to accurately assessing a child's medical condition. They simply took the parent's word for it. After living at various orphanages and state facilities, she ended up at this institution just outside of Boston. The place is notorious for paranormal activity, even on the outer grounds where some of the buildings once stood. She was about 12 when she got there. She said that there were many physically and mentally incapacitated young people there, and the story she told us about the school or institution were both heartbreaking and terrifying. There were mental abuses, deprivations, beatings, medical experiments on patients, and cruel punishments galore. So-called professional care was barbaric, and even the terminology was outdated. My mother's own records, which I've seen myself, showed her mental assessment as moron even though she said she was never really tested by any mental health professional. When she was around 13, she began helping the patients whenever she could. She would bandage their injuries, break up fights, and speak to the matrons on behalf of those who could not speak. This created enemies among the staff, who knew she wasn't handicapped, and who felt she was a threat to their employment. Therefore, Whenever they could, they punished her severely. One such punishment led to a horrifying encounter with the supernatural. One dark stormy afternoon, mom had words with a matron, trying to tell her that certain handicapped children were frightened of the thunder and that they should not be forced to go outside to exercise that afternoon. The matron appeared to give in then asked my mother to please go down into the cellar of the building to get to the rain gear for those who wanted to go outside. Mom was terrified of that cellar, and the matron knew it. There was this long, steep, narrow and rickety stairway, ending at a long dark hallway with no windows and just a tiny yellowish light bulb in the ceiling. At the end of the hallway, there was a cabinet that contained raincoats, boots, etc. When my mother hesitantly stepped onto the stairway, the matron slammed a door, bolted it shut behind her, and shut off the light. My mother screamed and pounded on the door for an hour, only to be laughed at by matrons who had been instructed to let her spend the entire night down there. The stairs being steep and dangerous, she decided that she would rather creep to the bottom and at least huddle on the damp floor. As she descended, she noticed a dim light coming from the long hallway beneath her. She came to the bottom of the stairs and looked around. 
She said she saw a man in a dark jumpsuit about 20 feet from her, leaping against a wall and just smiling at her. She thought he must have been a custodian, so she walked towards him, asking him to please let her out. But as she approached him, he kept getting further away. She realized he was not a sullen being and that the dim light seemed to be coming from his outline. The light began to fade, and she found herself screaming again, only in the total dark of the dingy basement. She was disoriented, and stumbled forward, until she bumped into the cabinet which held the rain beer. As she squinted in the dark, she began to make out shapes forming on either side of the cabinet, what appeared to be a pair of detached hands forming a clawed shape were each coming from around opposite sides of the cabinet and heading for her. She turned and ran, faint with terror, until she tripped on the bottom step. Frozen with fear, she could only sit at the bottom step and cover her face with her hands. After a minute or so, she peeked through her fingers down the hallway. The strange dim light was back. She chanced to look down, and what she saw filled her with horror. One of the smoky floating hands were reaching for her skirt, as if to pull at it. She again screamed and ran back up the stairs, tripping and falling several times in the dark, convinced she was being chased. The air was cold, and she heard a strange rustling sound behind her as she frequently climbed. When she reached the top of the stairs, she pounded furiously on the door and found that it had been unlocked. She never found out who unlocked it, but she didn't care either. She ran all the way to her room and hid on her bed. She never told the school staff what had happened, fearing reprisals, and she never set foot in that cellar again, despite the punishment of defiance. She's fine today, despite her horrific youth. There were many other strange things happening during her stay, but I'm considering a book about them, and I want her to reap the benefits of the sales if it happens. I'll save the creepiest stuff for that. I've had many paranormal experiences since I was a young child. At the age of four, my mother and grandmother would visit the graves of my father and grandfather, staying all day. I would play with the little girl there, while my grandmother and mother sat and talked. They believed I had imaginary playmates. Both are now dead themselves. I decided to check the records of the cemetery, and had little trouble since it is a small place. I found one girl that could have been the one that I played with. Her name was Mary Jane Walker, and she died in 1866, at the age of nine years of age. My husband and I decided to see if we could find the girl's grave. I told him to check the back of the cemetery because that was where we played. He found the grave. I asked Mary Jane if I could take her picture. I took three of the grave, and one of my husband, sitting on a tree stump not far away, I had the pictures developed. All the pictures were normal, except for the one of my husband where there appears to be a vortex in it. I've looked for all the usual problems, but can find no rational explanation for this. I now feel that I have proof of my friend's existence. My husband and I rented a home in southwest Detroit in the 1980s that was very haunted. The first thing that happened was when I was waiting for the gas company to come turn the gas on. I felt as though there was someone watching me, and I smelled pipe tobacco. I figured okay, I'm alone in a strange place. I also thought that maybe the people who lived in the front part of the house used pipe tobacco. I found out later that these people were from India and were visiting that country. They moved out within a week of returning to the U.S. All the problems in the house seemed to originate in the attic. 
there was a log cabin built up there for children to play in. It was complete the glass in the windows and a drawstring latch for the door. I was only in there once, but the feeling of uneasiness I felt was real. We never allowed our children to play in it. The attic door had no lock, but my five-year-old daughter got locked in and was screaming for us to let her out. Although you could hear any noise from upstairs, we never heard her. The door opened on its own. I started to dream about an old Indian woman with a pockmarked face. Since this was a dream, I never told anyone about it. One day, a woman I had become friendly with asked me if my mother was visiting. I told her I sure hope not, since my mother was dead. She said that she saw a woman with long black hair in my bedroom window. This sort of freaked me out since I was dreaming of that Indian woman and she had long black hair. One day this friend was visiting me and we were sitting in the kitchen having coffee and talking about nothing really. She seemed to go into a daze and was starting to go up to my attic. In fact, she was insisting that she was going. I got her back to the table and sitting down when something punched her head hard enough to leave a red mark. She left and refused to come visit anymore. My husband and I had cleaned out the basement and my kids found a Ouija board down there. They showed us where it was and we got rid of it right away. We don't mess with that thing. Things seemed to quiet down for a couple of weeks when the apartment in front of us was rented to a young couple. They started to have problems right away. The keys hanging on the wall would begin to sway. The rocker in the front room would start rocking by itself. At first, things only happened at night, but people decided to contact this thing, and things got bad from then. She would get phone calls, and when she answered, no one would be on the line, except one time. She told me a voice told her to get out. We are Christians, and decided enough was enough. We had to have help. I turned on the radio to listen to evangelical echoes, and called a prayer line for suggestions on what to do. This program wasn't on yet, but another one was, and someone on that program was praying in the spirit. Suddenly from the basement came an unearthly howl. Needless to say, this woman and I got out of the house and waited on the front porches for our husbands to get home. While all this was going on, my husband never noticed anything. One night, my nephew was spending the night, and while he was praying, this thing shot from our apartment to the other one, banging things in its haste to leave. My nephew refused to stay another night. One night, my husband was in bed sleeping, and I was on my way up when I asked a man in the next apartment to go wake him up and tell him to come sleep on the couch. He asked me what was wrong, and I told him I could see my husband in pieces. He did, and the couch was occupied that night. The only thing my husband noticed was that one night, we were watching TV, and it sounded like a dresser was being dragged down the stairs. He heard that. We moved from there, and the next place was no better. Whatever was there caused arguments. My nephew and his then-girlfriend were constantly fighting, and it got so bad that my husband and I started fighting as well. This was something we normally didn't do. We had the normal arguments that married people usually have, but this was getting serious. Even one of my children was being affected by this thing. It was appearing to her as a little girl talking to her. At first it was nice to her, but as time went on, it was starting to get mean. We had bought this one house, and it might sound silly, but the best thing that ever happened was that an arsonist burned us out, and we had to move. We have had no problems since. I don't believe this was a ghost, but rather a demon, 
and why it hasn't followed us. I have no idea, but I thank God that it hasn't. I have more stories, but I have taken up enough time as it is. I'm glad that I can finally tell his story without fear of people ridiculing me. There's a place in Smithfield, Virginia called Bacon's Castle. It's not really a castle, just a gigantic plantation home. They give tours there on a daily basis. It was in the summer of 2003 that I went with a summer creative writing group to tour this magnificent home and plantation. As we toured the home, the tour guide told us all of the kinds of stories of happenings and how the house was shifted from family to family. When we went up the stairs, we were greeted by a sudden draft. As my friends and I sauntered through the home, it didn't get warmer. In fact, it got colder. The best part was when we reached the room where the woman and her husband would have stayed. There was also a small cradle in the center of the room. The tour guide spoke of a woman during the Civil War who stayed in the room for months after her baby was born because something went wrong with the birth and the child was terribly sick. When the child died, the woman wouldn't leave the cradle. She remained there, convinced she had to rock her to sleep. She wouldn't eat her sleep and eventually she too died. As I stared into the room, I didn't notice anything. My friend Crystal had asked me if I felt a breeze. When I said I didn't, she said she didn't either and pointed at the cradle, which was swaying back and forth noticeably. I didn't really think much of it. And after everyone left, I took a picture and then followed my friends up the stairs to the attic. A few weeks later, I was looking through my pictures and something caught my eye in the picture of the room with the cradle in it. Sitting in front of the cradle was a woman dressed in Victorian style dress. She was transparent and a wispy hand had gripped the cradle. I looked even closer and it looked as though she was smiling. Hello, my name is Ray and I would like to share with you the experiences that happened to my small family in 1996. We had been transferred to the Houston area from San Antonio and found a two-story four-bedroom home in the Clear Lake City area, a real fix-it-upper, and it was the worst-looking home in a very nice community called Green Acres. My brother-in-law Robert and her sister helped us for six months in remodeling, cleaning up, and making the place a nice home. Robert had sold his own home two years earlier and lived in a travel trailer but missed his home. He jumped in and was happy to do most of the work and was proud of the results. A month after the house was finished, we found out that Robert had terminal cancer and had less than six months to live. The trailer was small. And so my wife and I decided to bring Robert into our home for his final days. We put him downstairs in the formal living room. And with the help of hospice, we knew we could help Robert with a peaceful and quiet death. This was not the case. Robert fought hard for his life and was terrified of death because he had fought in Vietnam and had killed many. He didn't know what was waiting for him on the other side. The end came with Robert fighting to get out of bed. The look on his face was one of horror. As per his request, he was left in his room for six hours after his death. And then the funeral home was called and Robert left. Or did he? The week after the funeral, things started not being right. Odd bumps and sounds from downstairs. Late at night, our dog would not go downstairs after dark and furniture being moved. One morning, the living room sofa was standing on end with all the cushions still in place. 
and dining room chairs would be taken and lined along the living room wall, and mirrors would vibrate. We called the hospice minister to the house, and he blessed every room, but Robert still didn't leave. We did. The house stood vacant for a while, and new people moved in, for their stay was short. Neighbors say two families came and left. It has been eight years now, and just a while back I was in the area and went by the home. It sits vacant again with a sale sign in the front yard, standing in front of the window of the room in which Robert died. As I stood there, remembering our last few months that home, a chill ran down my back, and I quickly got into my car to drive away. I sent a story to the site about two months ago. Is it my imagination or something paranormal? Well, since then, some new things have happened, and I found out some interesting information that I didn't know before. When I first sent out my story, I told my sister-in-law Jenna about it. She's a Jehovah Witness too, but a little bit more open-minded than my mother-in-law. Anyway. I told her what I had wrote, and she told me she had a girlfriend when she was a teenager, about 15 years ago, that lived next door to her. The side where I heard the whispering, and the house where the old couple had died. I believe her family bought the house after the couple died. Anyway, she told her that her friend was a little odd, because she had been sleeping with her parents at night, but Jenna had found out later why. One night, she had stayed the night at her friend's house, and they slept in her friend's bed. Early in the morning, Jenna had woken up for some reason, and noticed that her friend was squirming a lot, and moaning, almost like she was doing the deed with someone, but no one was there. Her arms were at her side. So Jenna thought maybe she was having a dream. Then she thought that maybe she had seen imprints in her friend's body. She got startled with this, and woke her friend up, and told her what she had witnessed. Her friend got so upset about it, that she didn't want to talk about it at all, and never did. To say the least, Jenna never got asked again to stay another night. Then there is the other story that my mother-in-law told me recently, about my other sister-in-law's house, Linda which is ironically across the street from my mother-in-law's, in the other house. About a shadow that lingers in her hallway, shaped like a person. They have all seen it, including my mother-in-law. She swears that there is an explanation for this, but even she has admitted that she can't find one. When she told me about the shadow, I got real nervous and I started to get goosebumps and got real cold. I told her sometime last year when I stayed the night at Linda's house. I was sleeping on her couch in the living room, my back to the hallway. There was a small light on where the fish tank was, so it wasn't completely dark. For some reason I woke up and turned around, and I saw this dark shadow move from the open hallway and disappear into the instance of Linda's kitchen. I was startled at first, but then got up to investigate things, to see maybe it was the shadow of the fish tank, but there was no way it could have been with the position where the tank was. So I went back to sleeping, thinking it was just my imagination, and I never told anyone of that incident. That was until my mother-in-law said something. She told me not to say anything about it to Linda because she gets freaked out about it, and she said she'll still be looking for a logical explanation for it. Good luck on finding one in all three houses, I was thinking to myself. But one last thing, back at my mother-in-law's house, a couple of weeks ago my niece Christine was staying the night, and my niece told me that when she got to the bathroom in the middle of the night, she came out running, screaming and petrified out of the hallway. She told my niece crying hysterically that when she turned the corner to go into the hallway, 
that she saw a shadow figure walking towards her. My niece went to look, and nothing was there, and my two-year-old daughter will not go near that hallway at all. One time I went to carry her down there to show her nothing was down there at all, and she started crying real hard, and grabbing my neck, and wouldn't let go, shaking badly. So whatever is in my mother-in-law's house is probably the same thing that are in the other two homes. Makes me wonder if it goes on in the other neighbors' houses. I was doing some just for fun ghost hunting with a couple of my friends one night in a cemetery on an old gravel road. Two of my friends were out in the cemetery looking around, and my other friend decided to stay in the car. As the two guys were out in the far corner of the cemetery, I looked to the center of the graveyard and seen something that made me lose my breath for a few seconds. A blurry gray figure floated above one of the gravestones and then looked to run through the air across three other stones and then drop right behind another stone. After it disappeared, I asked my friend in the car with me if he had seen it too and he said he did and he was just as freaked out as me. It was not light that created this, because it was pitch black out there. It was my first, and so far only time, I've seen something like a ghost. Thank you for letting me share my story. I know this one was kind of short, but I appreciate it anyway. Hi, my name is Louise, and I live in Oxfordshire, England. The story I'm about to tell you happened only a few weeks ago and scared me and my friend to death. It was about 9.30 on a Sunday night and I was bored so I decided to call my friend Heather. We were talking about the usual when all of a sudden you could hear someone on the line breathing. Heather and I both said at the same time, do you hear that? As we listened, it got louder until there was complete silence. At first we thought maybe one of our brothers or sisters were messing about and picked up the phone on the other end. We both checked our houses and no one was in there. My parents had gone out for a meal and my brother and sister were out and Heather didn't have any siblings and there's only one phone in their house. Anyways, we forgot about it and after about 10 minutes of talking, we heard it again. And this time, the voice said, help, I'm close. We both really freaked out and said what the voice repeated it again and then went. I told Heather that I would phone her later. And about an hour later, I phoned back and we didn't hear anything for a while until the shriek came from the phone from what sounded like a girl. We got so scared, and as soon as our parents got home, I told them what happened, and they said maybe our phone lines got crossed with someone else's. We still don't know who was on the line to this day. I know this wasn't very scary, but thanks for reading. Well, I've been a ghost hunter for quite some time now. I've submitted a few areas under the California section of the haunted places. I recently moved to Arkansas and bought a home in April. Three in one rock house with a huge pond on 1.6 acres in Boonville, Arkansas. I fell in love with this house as soon as I saw that it said for sale by owner sign right in front of it. I called the number and they were selling it for $48,000. I thought, my God, this is cheap for such a beautiful home. I moved in. I have a nine-year-old son and one cat. About the end of July, I started hearing and seeing things. To begin with, I was laying in bed one night, and my nine-year-old and six-year-old, who was visiting from California, were asleep in their rooms. 
All the lights were out. My bedroom door meets the living room. I was lying on my left side looking out into the black of the living room. And I heard what sounded like someone walking in it. Now, my son sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and come sleep with me. So naturally I thought it was them. I called out their name. No answer. Then I thought maybe it was my cat. But then I noticed her laying at my feet on the bed. It really sounded like someone was walking from the kitchen in the living room entrance towards my room. Second, my television is hooked up to the stereo because the speaker on the TV is blown. Well, when I have to be at work at 11 p.m., I usually take a shower around 9.45 p.m. and my nine-year-old goes over to his father's house. One night, I turn my stereo on and put a disc in it. Five disc CD changer. It was on disc four, song number 11. There were two songs, and it should have switched to disc five after it was done with song 12. I took my shower and had the stereo loud enough to where I could hear it. All of a sudden, I didn't feel the vibration of the music anymore. I thought, well, maybe it's at a quiet part. When I got out of the shower, I still heard nothing. I put my ear to the door. Nothing. I went out and looked at the stereo, and it was not on CD anymore, but on FM radio on 100.1, and that is not a station at all. It's just fuzz. There was no one else in the house but me and my cat. That was on a Friday night. Two days later, on a Sunday night, my son and I were watching television around the same time, between 9.45 and 10 p.m., in the middle of television. The radio goes from auxiliary to FM radio, 100.1, fuzz. My son says, Mom, what did you do? I was watching that. I told him I didn't do anything. On a Saturday, my son was at his father's, and I was there alone with a cat and she started going crazy. At one point, she was standing in the doorway of my room in the living room, looking at me. She meowed and took off like crazy into the back bedroom, belonging to my youngest son. She came racing back into the living room. Just then I heard a loud boom coming from the room, like something fell. It shook the entire house. My stomach had butterflies in it then, and I got up to go see. My son one tall dresser with small bionicle toys on it, but they were still all on there. There wasn't anything else that could fall from any place. I have always heard pipes rattling under the house since I moved in. Out of the corner of my eye, I always see things dart quickly about. I haven't seen it fall on, but I know it moves quick. I haven't took pictures of my home yet, or of it for that matter. Also, I have a two-car garage. Sometimes when me and my son pull up from school, both garage doors are closed. In the morning, sometimes the right one is open. I've never really been a great believer. But for the past eight or so years, since me and my mom moved from our old flat to our new house, I've experienced numerous experiences. The first one I was about six. My bedroom is the box room, and so it's small. My bed touches each side of the room with the door to the left. I was laying in bed waiting for my grandma, who was babysitting, to bring me water. I looked up at the wall and saw a strange shadow. It was like a side profile of someone's head. I could see the nose, mouth, and hair clearly. It could have been my own shadow, since the only light came from the ceiling, and I was lying down in bed. I watched it for a few seconds, then it seemed to fade before my eyes. I thought it was just because I was tired, and so I ignored it. I had no further experiences until seven years later, 
in 2003, I was laying in bed once again, the light off about 12 o'clock at night. I was really tired and was trying to fall asleep. My bedroom had been rearranged so that the door was opposite my bed, and one side of my bed was pushed against the wall. I had my back to the wall and was staring into the darkness when I felt a cold breeze in the back of my neck. Thinking it was just a drought, I rolled over the face of the wall. On the wall, probably three inches from my face was another face. I could tell it was a man and he had a black hood up. All I could see of his face was a pair of cold eyes and what I can only describe as green paint, a face paint on his cheek. I closed my eyes for a few seconds, thinking I was just seeing things, and when I opened them again, the face was still there. I don't know how long I stared at it, but in the end, I fell asleep, and in the morning, could find no trace of what was there the night before. These sightings carried on for weeks, always appearing on the wall at night. I didn't tell my mom about the face, but asked if I could move my bed back to the original place. We moved it, and I slept peacefully that night. The following night I went to bed about 2 o'clock, since I had been up watching a movie on television. I got in bed as usual, and rolled over to face the radiator, like I had done for years, but the face was there again. This time, however, it was more vivid and real. It seemed to be snaring in the dark and more threatening than before. I rolled over so my back was to the wall, but I could feel the cold breeze that I had felt the last few weeks whenever the face appeared. I pulled the covers around me, refusing to look back at the face. The incidents got less frequent over the weeks, and I believed that the face was going. One night, I was sat at my computer in the corner of my living room. I have a cockatiel whose cage is right next to the computer desk, who was asleep, and my mom was in the kitchen making a drink. I didn't really notice anything until I heard my bird start to hiss and back away into the corner of the cage. Wondering what frightened him, I heard a scraping noise. I looked to the side of the computer to see my glass moving towards the edge of the desk. There was no way it could be moving because of our house being set on a rise. Because it is where it should be sliding the other way, I lifted my hand to stop the glass from falling off the desk. When I touched it, the glass was cold even though I hadn't had a cold drink in it. The strangest thing was, was when I went to push the glass back, I couldn't. Something was trying to push the glass. I had to shove it quite hard before I could get the glass to move. When I did, my bird came back to the front of the cage and looked as though nothing had happened. I had gone to bed earlier than my mom that night and must have been asleep when she came up. Once again, the face was there, but this time, the presence was really strong. My bedroom was icy cold when it normally is the hottest room in the house. Almost one o'clock I wake up shivering and could feel something gripping my arm, but as I come to it released its grip. I rolled over to see the face once again, but it looked different. The smirk had gone and it looked more angry than anything else. I didn't sleep that night, and I couldn't sleep in the room, so I spent the night sat on my sofa with the lights on downstairs. When my mom came down in the morning, she was shocked to see me up, but I just said I had woken up early and came down. I didn't want her to know. Later that afternoon, we were having dinner, when she asked if I had a nightmare last night, I couldn't recall anything but the face and cold hand, so I asked why. She said she had heard me talking in my sleep, which I had never done before that. She said I was telling someone to get away and don't touch me over and over. Then after about five minutes, I was quieter and mumbling things like, 
why are you doing this? And just go away. When I asked her what time, she said it was about half past 12. Just before I woke up, with a hand gripping my arm, I haven't seen the face or had any strange experiences since that night, and I'm not quite sure what happened after. I don't know if I did something to make it all go away, and that was why the man's face looked so angry, but I'm glad they're gone. I still expect to see the face every night, but so far I haven't. I finally told my mom about it all, and she asked if I wanted to have the house blessed, but I said no. Although the scary face did no harm to anyone, and it's gone now anyway. About 40 years back, I became interested in tracing my family's ancestors. This is how I discovered the Tilly Bend Settlement. Situated in the Appalachian Mountains, it really is a beautiful place. The Dakota River flows down from the high mountains, winding its way into the Blue Ridge Lake. Tillybed Settlement is nestled back in these same mountains. One must cross the Tacoma River and travel down a one-lane dirt road that takes you deep into the forest. As you drive along, one begins to notice, windows rolled down, how quiet the deep woods become. This was my first impression of this area 40 years ago. This place has been lost in time because it looks like the same now as then, with the exception of the renovation of Tilly Bent Church. I've been here many times, many, many times over the last 40 years. I suppose you could say I'm drawn to the mystery of this place. I will only share a small portion of my research. However, you need to understand this. Tilly Bent Church sits right in the middle of this haunting. This church is not part of the haunting. This church is the house of God, and services are held here on a regular basis, and demands the respect as being the house of God. In 1756, the Creek Indians lived in this area, and got along quite well with this white folk that came to this area from North Carolina. There are census records showing that the white men intermarried with the Creek women, the Cherokee did not get along with the Creeks and forced them out of the area. The intermarried Creeks did not leave, and neither did their customs. In 1820, the Stanleys had formed a settlement over the mountain in a place known then as Stanley Gap. This being told, I can now share with you what I know is fact. Searching for my great-great-grandmother's grave, I ended up in Tilly Road Cemetery. At this time, the church only had services on decoration once a year. The church building was very old, but still in fair condition for its age. There were no glass windows, only wooded shutters, and that was common in the days before air conditioning. The doors to this church is what I remember most about this old country church. There was in both of the old doors what appeared to be like someone had shot the doors with a rifle of some sort. My first impression was that someone had done this out of pure meanness. I then proceeded to walk around the side of the church and walked up and peered through one of the cracks between the shutters. Of course, with the shutters closed and there being no windows, the inside was dark. I could, however, make out the old homemade church pews and the pulpit. I also noticed a high ceiling with the rafters showing. Yes, I thought this church is old, and the welcome sign out in front of the church stated the church was established in 1858. After I looked the old church over, I then headed up the hill to the cemetery. I noticed there were a lot of field stones marking the graves, which is not unusual for very old graveyards. Right in the center is a very old and large oak tree, the only tree that is in the graveyard. I started looking around at the grave markers for my great-great-grandmother's grave. Well, to my surprise, her grave was also in the center of the graveyard, and 
her grave was the only one under the oak tree. The name on her marker is Elizabeth. So I'm looking around at this graveyard, thinking it looked as if no one wanted to be buried anywhere near her grave. I then wrote the information for her marker down. And that is when I noticed the head of her grave was facing west. Which is very odd, because all the people here bury the dead facing to the east, because the Lord will return in the eastern sky. I finished getting the information, and I caught a glimpse of someone out of the corner of my eye. I did not hear a car come down the dirt road, and there were no houses close by. I turned very quick to see who it was, and there was no one. I laughed at myself thinking, yeah, I'm jumping at my own shadow. You see, I don't believe in ghosts, but I did believe in mean people. As I started back down the hill, I noticed another grave. It was called Mary. The birthday was the same as Elizabeth. They both died on October 26th. Elizabeth died 1905. Mary died 1906. I thought, boy, somebody messed up on the dates. I reached my car at the foot of the hill, and as I got in, I looked back up towards the cemetery, and at the tree, I saw what appeared to be a woman. Her dress was long and black. She had on a hat that I can only describe as a granny bonnet. I thought you have got to be kidding. Then it looked as if she stepped back behind the tree. I was curious, so I went about halfway back up the hill and shouted hello. Of course, no answer, so I walked all the way back to the tree, and there was no one there. I hurried back to the car and left. A couple of weeks later, my grandfather asked me if I had went to his great-grandmother's grave. I told him I had, and asked why her grave was facing to the west. My grandfather said, well, she was a witch. I laughed, and I said, really, Grandpa, why is her grave turned around? He went on to tell me this. She was Creek, and also a witch doctor for the Creek Indians. The whole settlement was afraid of her. Now she had a daughter to marry, a Tilly, and another daughter to marry, a Stanley. There had been a family feud between Tilly's and the Stanley's, so the two sisters became enemies because of their husband. The feud escalated, and on Sunday morning, the Stanleys went to Tilly Church and started shooting through the doors of the church, killing the preacher, he was Tilly, and several others in the church, including the one sister who married a Tilly. Now, the Tillys didn't let this go, and one night, they went to Stanley Gap and killed some of the men while they were asleep. Now the sister that married a Stanley, her husband was killed that night. A few months later, she died having a baby. Elizabeth Bradley vowed revenge on both the Tillys and the Stanleys for the death of her two daughters. After that, every baby born to the Tillys and Stanleys died at birth. I said, come to think of it, there was a lot of little baby graves, rows of them. My grandpa said, well... After a year of this, the Tillys went to Elizabeth Bradley's house and got her. She was then taken to the center of Tilly Graveyard and hung from the old tree. They cut her down and buried her right where she fell. Right before they hung her, she told them she would come back. Now, after a few months, the little baby started dying, all at birth. People in the Tilly settlement started claiming the witch had come back and had taken up residence in a very old and mean woman. Elizabeth Bradley's sister-in-law, Mary. So on the anniversary of Elizabeth Bradley's hanging, the men went and got Mary Tilly Bradley. They hung her from the same tree. They would not bury her facing west because she was, after all, not at fault because the witch came back through her and she was a Tilly. I said, Grandpa, that didn't really happen. He said, you saw the graves, and I'm telling you it did happen, and the older folks here 
will tell you that it's true. He said, and I'll tell you something else that's true. I saw one of them witches one time when I was a small boy. My grandpa went on to say that when he was about nine years old, he went to decoration at Tilly and he described the same very woman that I had seen. This happened 40 years ago, and my grandpa has been long gone for many years now. I've seen a tintype, old picture of Elizabeth Bradley, and I've also seen Elizabeth Bradley at Tillybent. I've kept a record, and I've seen her eight times in the last 40 years. There has been two occasions that I heard a little baby crying as I walk up the hill. Of course, it quits when I get to the tree. Strange how one would think you could only see a ghost at night. I've only seen her in the daytime. Of course, I don't go there at night, and I never will. I've always believed in paranormal things. I've had many encounters with ghosts, and it's never really bothered me. My daughter was born in 2006. Around the time she was one and a half, we moved into a nice older house. The first night in our new house, we were camping out downstairs because our beds hadn't been unloaded from the truck yet. Around 2 a.m., I was woke up because you could hear the sounds of someone walking around in a room above the kitchen. I just blew it off as an older building and such. I walked upstairs when I continued to find her closet doors open and things scattered around her room like someone had been in the boxes. Again, I just blew it off as my kid brother playing a trick before he left. The next morning we were setting up her room and I noticed her sitting there acting like she was playing with someone. It sort of gave me chills because she was actually talking to someone. I just ignored it, but later she started mentioning the man. Three days into living there is when things started happening. Her room has never been warm. I can turn the heater up to 75 degrees. I've bought a space heater. The landlords have came and checked the windows and insulation. Everything's normal. Her closet doors open at random times by themselves. Now at almost three, she still talks about the man in her room. She's informed me that the man tells her she can do things, be bad, and do things after she's told no. She still sits around and talks to no one. We live 14 months, with just little things happening all around 2 a.m. Her bedroom door slams shut, and you hear stomping down the stairs. The laundry room doors open and slam shut. The water in the bathtub turns on by itself, but lately, Things have become more aggressive and frequent. I decided to decorate her room. I put new curtains up, her new blankets on her bed, and hung clothes in the closet. I walked downstairs, leaving all the lights on, but shutting the closet doors. I was downstairs maybe five minutes. As I entered the hallway, I noticed her door closed. Nothing new, but I opened it and there was this rush of cold air. Again, nothing new. The light was off, and you could feel someone in the room. It was an angry sort of feeling, like someone was glaring at me. I ignored it and turned the light on. The curtains I'd just hung had been ripped off the rod and lay in the middle of her room. Her new blankets and sheets were off her bed, and her closet doors again wide open. My daughter refuses to sleep in her room now, saying the man scares her, that he yells at her. I've placed crosses and went as far as to have my house blessed, and nothing. In the last two months, I've been woken up to someone screaming in my ear. The sound of my front door opening and slamming shut, and my bathroom shower turning on, all in the 2 a.m. hour and on nights my daughter's at grandma's house.
There are some stories that my family and friends have passed on, and I think you might find them quite interesting. I'm a great fan of your website. I have some stories that I've heard from family. Here's one that my grandpa encountered. His father had recently died in 1993, and the night of his funeral, he was awoke by something. He didn't know what it was. He was just awoken by whatever it was. He looked over, and his father was standing there, saying, I'm okay. Please do not worry. My grandpa got a drink of water, and his father left. He went right through the door. Then, I have one from family friends. This was when friends Steve and Rita had moved into a new house. They had seen several apparitions that they have not really explained, or really just blobs. Then, here comes the scary part. Here are two stories that I've also inquired from the same person. Rita and her husband and two friends were in the family room in the middle of the day, talking, and all four of them saw a shadow jump from the balcony, slide across the family room, and go under the couch. Steps have also creaked, and toilets have flushed for no apparent reason. This was also a new house, with no history of violence on the property. Now for the second story. A couple of nights later, Rita was sleeping and woke up to feeling like someone was sitting on top of her, trying to choke her. Steve woke up to Rita's screams and flipped the lights on. She told him there was a man with a plaid shirt in the room, trying to choke her. No one was in the room. She got up out of bed and went to the dresser, looked in the mirror, and he was behind her. A lumberjack looking man in a plaid shirt standing right behind her. This also might sound kind of weird, but my mother Bernadette lived in a new neighborhood when she was little. Outside of the development was a field with a very small house, almost a shed. Whenever my mom took a walk with her grandma, a little girl would come running out of the house and shed and talk with them. She was always dressed old-fashioned with a dress on. She resembled a little girl like Shirley Temple. She said her name was Judy. My mom saw her several times. Her grandma also did too. Years later when she mentioned Judy to her mother, her mother said that nobody had ever lived in that house. It was used for storage, a shed, and said my mother was making it up and that it was a story. We have never figured out if it was a ghost or not. My great-grandmother remembered her too. As a side note, I've passed this particular field many times and have seen the shed, but have not had any strange things happen to me when passing the area. Like my grandmother has said, no one has ever lived in that shed, so I don't know. My name is Rodney, and I would like to share a story with you that happened to me and a friend of mine. First, I'll give you some background. It's the early 70s in Inan, Ohio. My friend Mike and I were very close because both of our parents had gotten divorced around the same time we were in our early teens. We shared similar interest in magic and trickery in the occult. We used to save our money and either buy magic tricks from magazines or make magic tricks from plans that we would buy for our act. We appeared on a local after school show for kids a couple of times and in doing so we got to meet a local famous person named Dr. Creep. He had a Saturday night show where he would host and show scary movies and he also did magic. Dr. Creep was really knowledgeable and had a lot of content. He told us of a local magic shop in Dayton and gave us directions. We couldn't drive at the time, but I would beg my older sisters to take us there. Discovering that magic store opened us up to a whole vast world of new tricks and illusions. The shop also sold paraphernalia for smoking, and it had a lot of what we now refer to as goth, 
type of clothing and jewelry. Well, as we were getting a bit older, the movie The Exorcist came out, and we thought that what a neat idea it was to put some drama and stage production into the act to make it more of a show. We both attended a vocational school, so there were a lot of talented people there, and we found a couple of girls that liked to dance. We added dancing demon girls to the beginning of the show using black lights, dark jumpsuits to conceal the girls under the sheets. The music was Mike's Oldfield's Hearst Trench. I think that was the title. The stage was very barren when the show started. Only a small table with dimly lit candle and the dancing girls could be seen. The dancing girls dance ended with the meeting in front of the table and Big Flash exploded. And as the lights slowly illuminated, they would reveal a transformation in the whole look of the stage. There was now a 10 by 12 painted dragon silk tapestry hanging beyond the table and two silk banners of Belizebuth artistically lit with airy lighting. And I would be standing where the dancing girls had disappeared in my cape. Most of our tricks and illusions were dark in nature. My friend Mike moved to Houston a year before we graduated high school. He got a job at the Galleria Mall in the fun shop. After I graduated, I moved to Houston and stayed with Mike at his mother's house. I also got a job at the fun shop. Eventually, we pretty much ran the place and again, we found a lot of new outlets for magic and the occult. Eventually. We moved into an apartment together as roommates. Our interest in the cult grew, but only out of curiosity, and it gave us an air of mystery to other people. As we made more friends, and our reputations as being a little different spread, we decided to really mess with people. Mike's bedroom had a huge closet, and being young, he didn't have a lot to put in there. We decided to dress it up, and make it look like a devil worship after with the banners we had and with the skull shaped candles and the magic tricks. Our plans were when our friends would come over, we would show them that and they would freak out. The very night we did this at about 12, I awoke to a pounding on a wall between Mike's room and my room. I sat up and yelled, what are you doing over there? The pounding continued unrelentingly. I got out of bed and went over to the wall and yelled, Knock it off! I'm trying to sleep! The knocking got louder and didn't show any signs of stopping, so I went over to Mike's bedroom door and knocked and said, Mike, stop it! The pounding continued, so I opened the door to see Mike sitting up in his bed, looking at the closet. My eyes went across the room towards the closet, and as my vision passed his dresser, I saw the door slowly closing. I asked Mike what he was doing banging on my wall. He said it wasn't coming from the wall between our rooms. It was coming from the closet. I continued looking onto the closet. As I saw the door, it was breathing and jostling as if someone was trying to get out. Then it stopped suddenly. We were scared witless. We gathered up enough courage to both walk over, and we pulled open the door with ease. The closet was freezing. We looked around and saw no one or anything. The apartment we lived in was brand new. No one lived next door. Our neighbor downstairs was gone for the weekend. We asked the people behind us the next day why they were banging on the walls, and they said that they had it, and that they didn't hear anything the night before. We immediately started ripping all the decorations down. I'm still very much fascinated with the paranormal, but I will not invite it in. I have another story I will share with you later, but as for now, I hope you enjoyed what I gave you. My parents own a lake house in northern Indiana, and we used to have a neighbor named Mr. Campbell. Sadly, 
Mr. Campbell was quite old and depressed, and one day he left a note and enough food and water to last his dogs at least a week. He said his body could be found in the lake. I couldn't remember if it was ever found though. This story has many parts, all leading to the same conclusion. Mr. Campbell's ghost haunts this property, but he seems to be quite calm and docile. The first incident. Well, a rich man, Richard, bought his property, tore the home down, and built a $2.5 million house. Richard was extremely nice and was always coming over for dinner. One day, he told us that he thought his house was haunted. He had an entertainment system installed that requires him to climb a ladder to fully turn it on or off. For that reason, he always left it on and left the ladder in the garage. One day he had guests over and was going to put on the Indy 500, but the system was powered down. He said he watched TV the night before and no one had been in the house. At first he just assumed it was a power outage or something. He got the ladder and turned on the system. However, all of the settings were messed up. The volume was turned down very low and the radio was on and set to a 50s station. The TV was off because of the radio. When he turned on the TV, it was tuned static rather than the Discovery Channel Richard had been watching the night before. He said he played it off as an accident to his guests, but that it kind of spooked him. Later, after this happened, again Richard assumed Mr. Campbell wanted to listen to music but didn't want to disturb anyone because no one had heard the music. Richard also had a roommate named James. The thought is that they were lovers, but no one really asked. Richard would travel to Chicago a lot and James would be home alone. One night, my sister and I were watching TV in our room and saw lights shining outside and heard men talking. We looked out our window and saw about three police cars and about six policemen walking all over the house, looking at windows and knocking on the door. We went outside with our dad to see what was going on, and the police asked if we had heard or seen anything suspicious. We said no. Why? They told us someone had called 911 from the house, but only breathed into the phone for a couple minutes and then hung up. We told the police that Richard was gone, and usually when he was gone, James would visit his mother down the street. My dad called James' cell, and he was at his mom's for a dinner and a movie. He said he was planning on leaving soon anyways, and came to talk to the police. James let him in, and they searched the whole house, but no one was there. However, in the kitchen, a burner was left on high. James said he made pasta to bring to his mom's and must have forgotten to turn off the burner. After the police left, James said he sometimes got a strange feeling in the house, like he wasn't alone when he knew he was, but that he never got scared. It was more like being watched over than stopped. My sister and her friend were sitting on our screened in porch one Friday night after we got to the lake house late. They saw a man walk from the pier to Richard's house, and my sister called out, Hi, Richard, or James, whoever it is. But the figure didn't stop or reply. He just walked up to the house and disappeared. The girl said a light never came on, and he never heard a door open. The next day, Richard was doing yard work, and my sister mentioned the night before, and jokingly accused him of ignoring her. He told her he had not been home last night, and that he had just gotten back from Chicago early that morning. He also said that James was in North Carolina for the week for his sister's wedding. My sister and her friends were confused, because they had both seen the man, and they were worried they had seen a robber. Richard asked if the outdoor lights turned on, and they said no. Why? He said he has motion detector lights, 
So if there was a person by the house, the floodlight should have come on, and his alarm didn't register entry last night. The next incident, Richard had to move to Chicago. It had gotten to be too much for him to constantly be driving back and forth. So he bought a flat in Chicago and put the house up for sale. James left too. The new owners were really quite annoying and full of themselves. So no one ever told him about the possible haunting or the house's past. One day Janet came over and asked us if the house had a story. I asked why. She said she had been in the shower when she saw an old man staring at her. She screamed and he just disappeared. We told her about Mr. Campbell and everything and she sort of freaked out. They tried to sell the house but couldn't. She still says the old man watches her every now and then. The housekeeper says she has never seen the old man while she was showering but that she thought she saw him one day while she was cleaning. He was in the entertainment room, listening to music. She also said that the five dogs will stare at all the same spot for several minutes on end, tails wagging, as if they were being talked to. We still talk to Richard, and he has told us many stories about the house, rearranged pantries, the entertainment system being changed multiple times, and other various things. We think Mr. Campbell haunts the home because he can't move on. My mom says my experience must have been Mr. Campbell trying to get away from Janet for a while. That incident was before the shower, but Janet was already in the home with her husband. We still hear the beeping every once in a while, and we all just say, Hi Mr. Campbell, you can visit as long as you like. The dog stopped staring and following him after about the tenth time. They'll look up just after the beeping, and just before we hear him leave. I'm a bit of a baby, so I still get creeped out when I'm alone at night, even though I know he has never done any harm. My parents are the last people I think would believe it, but with so many incidents, we think he is there living out his days watching others. Maybe he regretted saying goodbye prematurely, and because of this, this is what keeps him from going to the other side. I was visiting my mother and some friends in Florida, and stayed with my mother while vacationing to cook costs, of course. She works nights at the local hospital, so I'm there alone from 7pm until 7am when she works. It was a Friday evening and my mom had just left for work. I was hungry, so I went out to grab a bite to eat. I got back to the house around 8 and called my friend, who was supposed to come over to keep me company, but he was running a little late. So, I decided to keep myself entertained as I waited. I was in my room listening to music and stuffing my face when I heard what sounded like church bells. Now, these bells would have had to be kind of loud because I listened to my music on blast. I turned down my radio to hear the sound more clearly, all the while thinking to myself, there are no churches in the area that I know of, which made this all the more strange. As I listened, I heard the sound fade off into the distance, as if traveling away. I sat for a couple of minutes and turned my music back up and continued eating. About 15 minutes later, I heard something like someone trying to get in through the back door. My mom's house is a little older, I'd say about 40 to 50 years old. For someone to pry open the back door would not be a difficult task, so naturally I ran to the back door to see what was going on. Once there, I saw that no one was there, but the glass in the door near the knob was fogged up like cold water would do in a glass cup. Thinking that was a little strange, I grabbed the handle to open the door, and I let the scream bloody murder. The handle on that door was sub-zero cold, 
you know, really caught me by surprise, just from how incredibly cold it was. I stepped out into the porch, turned on the light, looked around a bit for anything suspicious, and when I saw nothing, I reluctantly went back inside. Concerned, I kept my music to a minimum, just in case anything else happened, as it surely it did. About an hour later, I got a call from my friend. Now this is strange. He lives about five minutes from my house driving and about 20 minutes walking. Apparently, he came over to the house and rang the doorbell, heard my music playing, and figured that when I didn't answer, I was in the bathroom or something. He called my phone, but it kept getting cut off after the first ring. So he decided to go back home and come back since it's not far at all. He claims that as he was backing out of my driveway, he saw the front door open. He rolled down the window to see if it was me. He said as soon as he got the window all the way down, the front door violently slammed shut so hard that my friend thought for sure that the front window should have shattered. I heard none of this. Around the time that he came over was coincidentally the same time I heard the strange bells. So, I was a little spooked and told him to come over. So he said give him about 15 minutes and he would be over. Well, a lot can happen in 15 minutes. I got off the phone with him and went to the bathroom to freshen up a bit. I washed my hands and face and dried them. I was heading back to my room when I heard a faint sound in the living room. I was a little apprehensive to see what was making the sound and started thinking that perhaps I wasn't alone in my mother's house. From my bathroom to the living room, there is a long hallway. As I walked the hallway, I sensed a presence and it felt like a large presence, however that feels. Upon entering the living room, I looked up and saw what looked like a clergyman. I could see him clear as anything. My reaction wasn't what one would expect. Looking back on the incident, it seems unusual to me as well. I began to cry, almost uncontrollably, and I still have no reason as to why. That's when I heard a knock at my door. My friend had arrived, and as I stood there, I saw the apparition seem to fade to nothing as he continued to knock and rang the doorbell. I opened the door to my friend, who seemed a little shaken himself. He asked me why I had been crying, and unsure on what to tell him, I simply said that I saw something sad on TV. He asked if anyone else was in the house because he saw someone leave out the back door. I told him it was my neighbor. I've had many things happen to me. Dreams and visions have been a part of my life for as far back as I can remember, but none of them compared to this incident. Weird, huh? I was only about three years old when I first started seeing things in my old house. It started with the noises in the attic. I would hear a rocking chair rocking in the attic directly above my bed. However, that portion of the attic had nothing in it at all. The floor wouldn't even have supported the weight. My old house was a 1950s home. The basement still had an old coal room. However, the coal chute was sealed shut to prevent breaking in. The coal room was directly below my bedroom and was the only part of the house no one ever went into. I can only ever recall even seeing the door open once. It was an empty, depressing kind of room. In addition to the noises above, I would sometimes hear footsteps in that old room below me or footsteps on the basement stairs. The first time I ever saw anything was, as I said, when I was around three years old. I woke up from my sleep in the middle of the night 
to see a young girl standing by my bed. She had brown hair and green eyes and wore a 19th century style green nightgown. She looked to be about eight years old. She frightened me at first, but I didn't get malicious feelings from her. And gradually, I accepted her. She appeared to me often throughout my childhood, and even now, I see her occasionally. The other ghost I saw was much scarier. I wasn't the first one to see him. My younger brother was. He was a tall man who held a knife in one hand and wore black. My brother began seeing him when he was about five years old. The man would appear in his closet began to walk towards him, and then my brother in his fear would scream, and the man would disappear when my parents came running. I have never told anyone about my experiences with ghosts, for I was afraid I would be called crazy. But my brother told us all about what he saw. He saw the man a total of four times, once in each of our bedrooms, and twice in mine. I saw the man twice, but I didn't begin seeing him until I was much older, around nine years old. I always got a fairly bad feeling from the man, and Victoria, the name I gave the little girl, would always disappear before he appeared. I got the sense that she was scared of him for some reason. In addition to this, when my great-grandma passed away, I inherited her jewelry box. The first night I had it, I'd have left it sitting open on my bedroom floor. When I went to bed, I was around six years old. I was lying awake in bed when suddenly the movie in my VCR fell out of the VCR and onto the floor. A few minutes later, my TV turned on. There was no one else in the room at the time. As I got up to turn it off, it turned itself off. A few nights later, I'd once again been playing with the jewelry in the jewelry box. I awoke to find my basketball bouncing itself repeatedly against my dresser, sideways. There was no one else in my room at the time, and I kept it up for over a minute. After that, I became frightened and stowed the box away in the back of my closet. To this day, I will not open it, even though I'm now 16. The scariest thing of all happened when I was 11. I awoke in the middle of the night, unable to move the lower half of my legs. Terrified, I sat up to see a strange black shadow sitting on my feet. It was blurry. That may have been partly because my glasses were sitting on my bedside table. At first I thought it was my black cat, but quickly realized that it was much too big. It was transparent. It was about half the size of a small child. But the thing itself isn't what scared me. It's the feeling that I got from it. I felt terrified, like I've never felt before in my life as if the strange shadow was pure evil. I struggled to move my legs and then ran into my parents' room and woke them up. It's the only time I've ever told them of my paranormal happenings. My dad came into my room and turned my light on, but of course, the thing was gone. He insisted I was dreaming and tried to get me to go back to sleep. But I slept on their floor for a week straight after that. I've since moved into a new house. My grandma died here, and we moved in afterwards. Because she left it and everything else of hers to us, I don't have as many experiences here. But there is one that really stands out in my mind. I awoke in the middle of the night, and I could feel someone laying against my back. Their knees curled under mine, and their arm around me. I freaked out and literally jumped onto my floorboard and flicked my light on, but nothing was there. My mom was woke up from the commotion, and I told her about it. She told me it was my grandma, 
who was keeping me safe as I slept. And then a few days later, we drove to the cemetery where my grandma is buried. We took my grandma's dog with us. Once we got to my grandma's grave, the dog went crazy. She began to bark and whine and paw the windows frantically. We thought it must have been a squirrel or something, but there were no animals in sight, not even a bird. My mom thinks that the dog saw something we couldn't, and I have to say I agree. I've had many experiences, and these are just ones I was reminded of by reading other stories on your website. I wrote a lot. I tried to narrow it down a bit. I've tried seances and things with my very good friend, who has similar experiences to mine, and we've been successful at this. It really shocks me sometimes, because we'll both get an image in our head, or see something, and we can finish each other's sentences. That's how precisely we see things. I definitely believe in the paranormal, and I hope to show other people the truth. I lived in this area for over 30 years. Robinson Woods is the home of the Chief Chichi Pinque, as it is spelled on the sign, in the site of his burial marker. He was the last chief of the Potawatomi Indians, and he was related to the Robinson family. He died in 1953. There have been numerous ghost hunting expeditions conducted here, with reports of drums and shadowy forms of an Indian in pictures in the woods surrounding the memorial marker. These woods are connected to Catherine Woods, west of East River Road, south of the Kennedy Expressway. There's a trail that leads from behind the Chief's memorial marker, going to a small branch of the Des Plaines River. It is along this river that John Wayne Gacy buried several of his victims. Additionally, there have been numerous bodies found here over the years. In the late 1950s, two brothers went missing and were killed, and their bodies were discovered here. The area of these woods, more towards the Catherine Woods side, just south of the expressway, is where the American Airlines flight went down, killing all on board. On the east side of the East River Road, there used to be a horseback riding stable called Happy Day Stables, which was the site of many illicit doings. John Wayne Gacy was known to be friends with one of the stable hands that worked there in the 50s and 60s, and he was a frequent visitor there. This stable hand is the one who was responsible for killing the two brothers in the late 1950s, and it's local legend that Gacy participated in the murder. Of course, both Gacy and the other man died without ever revealing the truth of this. These woods have been the site of more phenomena than can be counted. Generations of kids have gone there to dare each other to face their fears. I personally experienced the drums in the woods. The face of an Indian behind the marker felt overwhelming fear, anger, and sadness, and evil along the river behind the trail, in horrifying fear around the airplane crash site. That's my story, and many others, and the rumors surrounding this area. When I was around seven or eight years old, I lived in Norwalk, California, with my mom and my soon-to-be stepfather in a two-bedroom apartment. There are two things I remember most about living in that apartment. One was the beautiful princess Kenobi bed I slept in, and the other was the floating woman's head I would see coming into my bedroom from the hallway. I have, and will never forget that image. It looked like an older woman with long, coarse gray messed up hair with some kind of hat. The first thing I think of when I remember her face was she looked like a witch, pointy nose, moles on her face. 
From the moment I started seeing her float in, she just stared directly at me, went around the poles of my bed, and coming right at me. I would always put the covers over my head knowing she was right on top of me and shut my eyes hard and pull my fingers in my ears until I felt ready to look again. I've always believed and been interested in paranormal and ghost stories. After my grandmother died, I felt her hand on my shoulder in my then boyfriend's house. I turned around and nobody was there. But for some reason, I knew it was her, and I didn't feel scared. I felt she was letting me know she's okay and with me. Lately, my sister and I have been looking at paranormal sites and researching videos and pictures of ghosts, paranormal stories. Your site is my favorite right now. A few years back, I was at the White Horse Bar in Maloa and was doing a gig. When I was done, I left the back room and walked through the kitchen area, passed by a guy in a white outfit who was preparing food, or so I thought. I put my stuff out of my vehicle, came back in, and was going to get a bite to eat. I asked for a menu, and a barmaid gave me one. I ordered food and the barmaid headed back to make me my food. After a while, she came back with my food. Her and I talked, and we started dating shortly after that. Well, a week or so later, I met the whole crew, three girls, and the owner. I asked where the chef was, and the owner told me they're right here. I laughed and said, what about the guy? They all gave me a funny look, and said there is no guy. I had explained the guy I had seen a week back that appeared to be a cook dressed in white clothing that's similar to a chef and was facing the kitchen stove that I walked by. They all gave me a weird look and from there, the owner talked about seeing shadows going across the back room area late at night and no one was there. He told me the owner prior said a ghostly head was said to appear down from above the bar one time in the past. There was a time that I had to change the light bulb and it had to be replaced. The old one was loose and burned out. I tightened the new one in place and tightened down the fixture. And we were sitting down my girl at the time. And the owner and another of the bar ladies and I joked. The ghost will probably be here to flicker the lights, and the light will burn out. The crazy thing is, a couple seconds after that, the light flickered and went out. The owner got another light bulb, and I took the fixture and closure off to find the bulb loose, but still good. One of the bard's maids researched the property and told us the place a long time ago, back in the past, was a feed store and that a guy in his teens got crushed to death from fallen feed sacks. I was born in Singapore in 1951 to British and Australian parents. We lived in various cities in Malaysia during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. In 1957, we arrived in Kuala Lumpur, where we stayed until mid-1975. We moved into a company-owned house at Freeman Road, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. The history of the house is as follows. It and the house next door, number 17, were built just before World War II by the late Dato Gunlay Taik, a then well-known architect who became an early Malaysian high commissioner to either Australia or Canada. He built them for his daughters. During World War II, the two houses, along with the large semi-detached house immediately behind, on what was then known as Gulf View Road, were taken over by the Japanese Army secret police and known as the Kentapai, equivalent of the Nazi Gestapo. 
The two houses behind were used as Kompai Thai offices, and the three in jail in Freeman became senior military officers' brothels. The women in the brothels were both Asian and European, the latter being drawn from a pool of captured civilians and military nurses. Comfort women was the term used by the Japanese. Male military POWs were used as gardeners and cooks, etc. These staff, if they fell from favor, were executed, and some were obviously buried in the ground surrounding the houses. As some years later, we did find scattered human remains when excavating the gardens for our new orchid beds. On the advice of our doctor, who identified them as human in origin, we quietly reburied the remains. He said that if word got out as to what we had found, we would never get any Malay or Chinese domestic staff to work for us. After the war, the houses were returned to their owners who, knowing what the Japanese had used them for, promptly put them up for sale. They were all bought by large companies, at bargain prices, who used them to house senior expatriate staff. Gunlight take was no different, and in 1947, sold his two houses to the company my father worked for. The two company houses were three bedroom houses of two stories, double brick construction. There was also a long narrow room, forming a roof over the carport at the front door. This room was to play a significant role in what we were to experience over the following 10 years. In our house, this room was turned into a large walk-in linen press and storage area. To enter it, one would take one step down. When we moved into the house in early 1957, the first thing my mother noticed was that this room was extremely cold, as if it was air-conditioned. In tropical Malaysia, a non-air-conditioned room this cold is not even practical. Our dogs would never go into this room and when passing the entrance to that room, always hurried past with tails between their legs. Nobody would really stay in that room for very long. It had a very uncomfortable atmosphere. However, sometimes after running around and playing and getting very hot, I would go and sit on the step at the entrance to the room to cool off. I was five years old and knew nothing about ghosts at this time. The main bedroom on the extreme right hand side of the upstairs part of the house, as one faced out towards the main road, had its own full bathroom, and the other two, also upstairs, shared a bathroom via separate doors leading from the bedrooms to the bathroom. These latter two were adjoining each other. One was on the extreme left hand side of the house, and the other at the back with the windows looking out over the back lawn. This eventually became my room. All the doors were heavy solid, with solid brass latches. Windows were hinged teak framed, and had a bamboo awning type blind that rolled down over the window to give shade from the sun. Downstairs was a separate formal dining room, lounge room, kitchen, toilet, and downstairs storage room, as well as a storage area under the staircase. The lounge room opened up onto a rear veranda area. Remember, the temperature was over 85 degrees Fahrenheit plus all year round. As per usual, European expatriate practices of the times in India, Malaysia, Indonesia, Hong Kong expats had domestic servants to look after the household chores. All expat houses built prior to the early 1960s had separate servants' quarters on the property. This house had a three-owned building with shared kitchen and bathroom, and it had a car garage building sited at the rear of the property, about 20 meters from the main house. About three months after we moved in, funny things started to happen. The first incident was the appearance of a white cat. Interestingly enough, it always followed the last person who went into my parents' bedroom at night, the bedroom at the right-hand side of the house. This cat made no sound, but appeared from nowhere and scuttled into the room as the door was opened. 
this bedroom was air conditioned. A thorough search of the room failed to find the cat, but next night, there it was, entering again. At the time, we had no cats. This cat was seen every night until my parents moved to the middle bedroom, which was nearer to the room that my younger sister and I shared. Their old bedroom was then turned into a guest room. Over the years, visiting guests who stayed overnight with us also saw this cat. One evening, about dusk, my mother, looking through the lounge window, witnessed a woman with long red hair, wearing a sort of white nightgown, standing near the front gate. She thought that this was unusual and walked out the front door to go talk to the woman. As she walked across the lawn, the woman walked away and went behind the hedge, which formed our front fence. When my mother got to the gate, she looked in the direction that the woman had walked and saw nothing. Three nights later, my father saw the same woman walk into the entrance of the servants' quarters. He followed her, but found no sign of her when he entered the building. She was never actually seen in our house, only on the front and back lawn and in the servants' quarters but she was regularly seen in the house next door, number 13, and also in one of the houses behind. The occupants of both these latter houses often saw her sitting on the edge of the bed brushing her hair, but there was never a reflection in the mirror. When spoken to, she would turn her head, smile, and slowly fade from view. We also saw an emaciated man in a military uniform, he was seen in our house, both upstairs and downstairs, as well as outside. One evening, my mother saw what appeared to be a body lying under a shroud in the front garden. About eight years later, I also saw this figure, for lack of a better word, on the back lawn at first light one morning, and again at about 3 a.m. on another morning. From time to time, we would also see an old Chinese woman in the lounge room. She was wearing a white starched linen top with black pajama pants, cut in a traditional Chinese style. This used to be the standard Chinese domestic staff uniform in the immediate pre- and post-World War II era. We referred to them as black and whites. By the 1960s, the next generation of Chinese female domestic staff had abandoned this tradition for more colorful pajama suit type clothing. One would look up from reading a paper or a book and see this old woman standing in front of you smiling. She would then fade quickly from view. She was only seen in the lounge, in broad daylight, but never when there were a lot of people around. One evening when in my mid-teens, I arrived home from visiting a friend. As I walked down the drive, I noticed that the lounge room was lit up and a man was shiny neatly combed black hair and wearing a khaki uniform was sitting in a chair with his back to the window and reading what appeared to be a newspaper. I got the impression that he was Asian and thought he was a friend of my father come to visit. Later, I recollected that the furniture in the room was different to what we had in there. When I entered, I found the whole house, including the lounge, to be in darkness the rest of the family having gone out and the servants retired for the night. Thinking back, I think this man was probably a Japanese military officer. I only experienced this once and my parents never did. Occasionally we would also hear a woman's voice calling out in terror. We couldn't figure out what she was saying because she was saying it in Japanese. It was then that my parents realized that what we had seen and experienced were most likely the spirits of those who suffered there. After finding this out, we began to suspect that the cold room I described earlier in this narrative may have been used as a place for the ill treatment and execution of prisoners. My father learned that after the war, health authorities advised that the original septic tank was too close to the house and a new one had to be installed. While digging the new pit, workers had dug up human remains. 
We left the house in 1967 to move to a new house nearby. The next occupant, also working for the same company, also experienced funny things, but didn't actually see anything strange. This family's dog on several occasions also dug up human bones from the gardens. In the interest of preserving the local peace, they also quietly reburied the remains and said nothing. I didn't find out about what they experienced until many years after they had left Malaysia and returned to England. The company sold the houses in the mid-1970s after my family had left Malaysia. The houses at 15 and 17 were torn down, and a large mansion was built across the boundaries of both properties. However, this was demolished after a few years, and since then, the two blocks have remained vacant. In 2008, they are still vacant. This is a prime land in an inner suburban area, but the land is still vacant. The house at number 13 is still standing, but is abandoned and half the roof is collapsed. We wonder just what was found when the site was excavated for the new building. Also. The reason why the new mansion was also demolished and the blocks left vacant, maybe the souls of those poor victims still occupy the site and are not at rest and reappeared in the new building. I was shocked to see that in Lovejoy, Georgia, there were apparitions. I too had an experience but didn't think much about it especially after everybody looked at us. My mother-in-law also saw it, as if we were crazy. We used to live in a new apartment complex. One day, I was sitting on the counter eating lunch, and my mother-in-law was in the living room. As she came towards me to get to the kitchen, we both saw a man going towards the room at the end of the hall. Our first instinct was that one had broken into the apartment. We did get a chill, but at the same time, we didn't seem it was a big deal. We just figured it was the fact that we had gotten scared. I grabbed the phone, and we walked towards the hallway. When we looked, we saw nobody. We thought they had gone into the bathroom or the laundry room. When we saw nobody, we looked in the closet of the room, but again, didn't see anybody. After we came to our senses, we realized that nobody could have entered because we would have heard the door and the alarm would have went off anyway. Two guys that slept in that room told us afterwards that they would have trouble sleeping for a long time. On occasion, they would hear the water running, but they thought it was the other one. After sharing these experiences, we have come to the conclusion that this was in fact paranormal. We called the leasing office and asked them if anything had happened in that apartment or if they knew of anything of this nature in that area. They obviously thought we were crazy and replied that they didn't know anything. Now that I have found this, I feel relieved that now thanks to this, my family believes us. I'm of course referring to your son. Thank you for letting me share my story. There's a lot of things in my life I've seen over the years, but nothing has disturbed me quite like this. It was the weekend of break for myself and my mom, and we decided to go up to Oklahoma City to see my cousins. Everything was great. I got to see some relatives, and nothing seemed quite out of the normal. That is as far as normal went that night. While taking the four-hour drive back, I noticed that the moon was very huge and blood red. Of course, I didn't know about the eclipse that day, so it was cool to watch as we drove to Ferris, which is a tiny town between Lane and Antlers. I remember that my mother pulled into the Veterans Bridge in Aloka when a couple miles down the road, I happened to look up and an elderly couple was standing on the side of the road staring across as if watching something. It reminded me of the Grant Wood painting of the farmer. 
I remember looking at a clock a moment before, and saw it was midnight. The moon was still out, and still red. What makes it even worse for myself is that my mother also caught a glimpse of them. I turned around shocked, and I felt like if I turned around, they would be flying behind us screaming. I've passed by several times since then, and every time, I get a shiver up my spine, remembering what happened that night. I still get teased a bit about it, even to this day, even though my mom was pretty spooked out herself. My dog and I have been traveling the mountains of upstate New York and Pennsylvania for 17 years. So when he left me last February 2007, I brought him to his favorite spot. There was still snow on the ground, and tracking through the woods at this time was very difficult. I tried to pick ground with the pick that I carried, but the ground would not permit me. I found a nice spot and laid him under some brush beneath some trees. I told Dylan I would be back. Three weeks passed before I was able to get back to him. When I was driving up the dirt road, all I could think about was how I was going to find him. Being where I'd laid him down, I thought I'd find him in pieces. I was getting sick to my stomach. He was my boy, and this had to be done. When I reached him, it was just like I had laid him down. Thought this was weird. He wasn't even stiff. It was like he was waiting for me to come back. It was nice being with him, even though he had passed. The rest of the afternoon off and on, I dug his grave, going very deep so the wild animals couldn't dig him up. I took off my coat and wrapped it around him and laid him in the grave. Dusk was setting in, and all of a sudden, I heard children moving all around me, laughing and giggling. I knew this wasn't natural for children to be where we were, for the closest house was at least 10 miles away. I still dismissed this in my mind, as the circle we were using around me kept getting smaller. I would stop every now and then and listen, but I would hear no breaking branches which should have been happening. Thank God I already had a cross I made, for night was now upon me. When I was tracking up the mountain towards my car, the spirits were in a horseshoe behind me. Every now and then, I would turn around to keep them behind me, but this still didn't stop the giggling. Never heard this type of laughter before. When I made the clearing where my car was, the noise finally stopped. I popped the trunk open to put the pick and the shovel in. Then, I leaned over the hood of my car. There stood five solid white entities at the edge of the woods. They were not children. For the past 11 months, I've been visiting his graves to make sure his resting place is kept up and comfortable. Once, I saw a dark figure that drifted across the opening. Another time, this figure was floating seven yards from me. I even heard bullfrogs croaking. I'm an educated man. I'm not crazy. Can't talk to anyone about this without people thinking I'm weird or mentally disturbed. Either way, this was a tale that I thought you'd enjoy. It's 100% real. I swear my life on it. I know I may only have my word, but it's the best I can do. I've worked at St. Francis Hospital in Peoria, Illinois for over 20 years. I've seen some of the nun ghosts on the seventh floor where the laboratory was when I worked there. The morgue was also on that floor. I was working third shift one night. At times, we took the back elevator, the service elevator, to the floors to draw labs when needed. As I was walking down the hall to the elevator, I saw a nun getting onto the elevator. I yelled out to her, Please hold the elevator, sister. The door started closing. Thinking she did not hear me, I hit the down button as it closed. 
The door opened, but there was no one on the elevator. There was nowhere else she could have gone, for it was a dead-end hallway. To take the stairs, she would have had to walk past me. This was a strange night, and it took place many years ago. Another moment, it was fairly late, and I was again on my way to the elevator. This time, I made it inside alone. And as the elevator was closing, I saw a man in a white lab coat standing all the way at the end of the hallway. At the time, the hallway was pretty dark, but there was just enough light that you could see down it. I knew for a fact that there was absolutely no one else on the floor at the time. The image of the man in the lab coat and also the nun will always be engraved in my mind. This hospital has always had a reputation for having had ghostly visitations from previous employees who used to work there. Some of my co-workers have experienced this as well. When I was describing what I had seen to a current co-worker, she was a bit startled from the revelation. That's because one night, she had taken the elevator to the morgue, and when she got down to it, she could have sworn that she saw a figure or dark shadow in a praying position, kneeled over. She said the figure was an outline of a person. No distinct features, almost cloud-like, but could definitely tell it was made to be some sort of person. My theory is that the nun appeared once again to help with the newly deceased transition to the other side. I'd also like to think that the man in the lab coat was a former employee of this hospital. Either way, there's quite a bit of haunted history here, and I'm not sure how to deal with it at times. Since I'm fairly used to creepy happenings, it no longer frightens me like it used to, but there's always a bit of excitement in telling these tales to those who haven't heard them before. I believe there is a portal to the other side that humans have access to, and eventually, we'll transport ourselves to this world. As for now, we're just getting a glimpse of the afterlife. This is an authentic story, and it happened to me. I've already posted this on allaboutghosts.com, but I've not heard anything about this place other than my story. Maybe someone out there has had a similar experience, or even paranormal things happen at this place. What made me want to add my story here is when I read the story about Tacoma, Point Defiance Park, Five Mile Drive. This story grabbed me and was almost disturbing to me because it is so closely related to mine about a little girl. However, this was no ordinary looking girl. She was looking real, of course, except she had no eyes and was smiling and then all of a sudden she disappeared. I was searching here to see if there was anything from my spot at Eagle Falls. When I went to this favorite swimming hole of mine on the Sakoa River, this is a very beautiful swimming hole, almost lagoon-like, where the river flows with falls into a pool of deep colorful water, and under the water, on the side of the walls, there are huge giant flat rocks that drop off down where you cannot see the bottom. The rocks above have been carved into the star-like settings that have become flat, and then go down into where the river wall is. Across the river, which is only about 50 feet or so, there are rocks where people can climb to. There is a rope swing tied to a tree on this side also. It's a popular spot for people to swim in the summer. I really like this place for swimming and floating on my raft of flippers, so I can move faster to swim up the currents of the falls better and ride the river down. This brings me to my story. I was headed towards the place where I was going to do just that, and noticed there were two people to the right of me, a man and a woman, one sitting next to the rope swing 
and the other climbing up the rocks. And to the left of me, there was this little girl, about six or seven years old, and standing about three feet away from me, on the edge of the rock by the water with her head turned slightly, and just smiling at me. I am swimming still almost to passing her, and notice she's still smiling, so I smiled. I waved to her and said hi. She still smiles at me, but says nothing back. I looked at her again, this time into her eyes. We locked eyes for a second, and that is when I noticed her eyes were very dark, to the point where I couldn't see her eye color. They only looked like black holes, almost hollow-like. Everything about this girl seemed normal, except for her eyes. She had a cute little swimsuit that was lime green, with little white flowers on it, and a little ruffle around the waist. She was tan, and had golden blonde shiny hair that came down past her shoulders, and also had bare feet. She was alone. There was nobody above her or next to her. I was thinking that maybe she was standing there watching her mother swing from the rope swing or something, but as I swam a little bit past her, I suddenly turned to look back because I feared her being too close to the edge and wanted to let her to know to step back. But as I turned to do this, she was gone. Now, I was wondering how she could climb the rocks that quickly and how she could be completely out of sight when I only turned for a second, then looked back. Surely I would have noticed her walking away, at least if she did climb the rocks, or even if she had fallen in, I would have heard the sound of water splashing. I was only a few feet away from where she was standing, and I quickly went to the area where I saw her, and nothing. I looked above and further back where some people were sitting by some trees, and looked down along the banks where other people were sitting, and with kids, and no one looked like her, or had blonde golden hair, or the same bathing suit on. At this point of feeling very confused, I felt a cold chill come over me, and my hairs and my arms were standing up. I felt a sadness and chilling feeling, and had a vision of the same girl falling into the water and drowning. I even felt some pain and a little bit of anger type emotions. Right there, where she stood, while I was still trying to see if I could find her, I thought, where are her parents? Why is she all alone? So I swam back up to my spot by the river and told a friend I was with what happened, and I pointed to the rock she was on. He said it sounded and even looked like I saw a ghost from the way I was acting. I asked him if he would go back with me to look for her, and he said, no way, that is way too creepy. I don't want to go over there with you. I'm thinking about how this situation is so crazy and the fact that it's daylight even. I'm going back to see if I can see her, I said. Determined to find her, I swam back to the spot where it happened and looked all over the area where people were sitting and still, no little girl in a green bathing suit. I started looking in the water to see if I could see anything from down there, nothing. And the girl across the river that I thought was her mother was not. She was with the guy on the rock still. Then again, I get the chill and I'm feeling sad and start becoming afraid of the spot and even swam away from it again, thinking this doesn't make any sense. Then wondering if I'm the only one who saw her. Did the people across the river even see her? This is a wide visible area where you can see everyone around you. Am I losing it? Then I remember those eyes she had were actually hollow. The smile she made and just kept smiling at me. How she didn't even move from the time I swam towards her. Stopped, made eye contact and said hi. Then kept swimming only a few feet further. Then turned around to say she was close to the edge. Or, where is your mother? Somebody should be with you. 
I truly believe what I saw was an entity of some sort, and perhaps this little girl might have fell into the river and drowned, right where she was standing. I've heard some stories from here of people dying at the spot by swinging from the rope swings and jumping from the high cliffs, which happened right across from where she was. I also believe I wouldn't be so disturbed by this if it all seemed normal, but it didn't, and for some reason, she didn't seem to fit in. I wrote to ease my mind, and maybe to just get it out somehow. If anything at all, I will probably never know why she picked me to see her, but I will never forget what she looked like, or how she stared at me and smiled for so long. Maybe she was looking out for some people swimming in the river. Who knows? Well, this is the end of my story. Up until I was around 10, my mom, sister, and dad and I lived in a house called Filders Green, which was in Lanark, Cornwall. The house must have been around 50 years old and was originally two cottages joined together, meaning it was fairly big. To begin, the only things that would happen would be the odd cold spot, and often, I felt like I was being watched. Another time, my mom went to use the downstairs bathroom, leaving my dad in the kitchen, when she heard a man cough loudly outside the door. Thinking it was my dad using the study, she shouted something, only to hear no reply. She left the bathroom. There was no one outside, or even in the study. When she went back to the kitchen, my dad was at the same place. She asked him if he had followed her to the bathroom, which incidentally wasn't near the kitchen, and he said he hadn't moved. There was no one else at the house at the time, apart from me and my sister and we were in bed. Another thing that happened was when my mom, my dad, and my dad's friend were sat in the kitchen late one night, when they suddenly heard an almighty crash from my bedroom upstairs. My mom said it sounded like a full-grown adult being thrown to the floor, thinking maybe my wardrobe had toppled over or had fallen out of bed. They ran upstairs and found me fast asleep, with nothing out of place. Later on, they even got someone to check the chimney in my room to see if a stone had fallen down it, but they found nothing. To this day, we don't know what the crash was, or indeed, who made it. The most unexplained incident, however, was the sound of a singing lady. My mom and dad were asleep in bed, and they were woken by a tuneless humming outside their bedroom door. There was no way it would have been me or my sister, as we were only young, and it was quite clearly the sound of a woman. The sound came along the corridor from my room and gradually disappeared downstairs. Another time, my mom, sister, and I were inside my mom and dad's bedroom helping my mom fold up some laundry. My dad was outside mowing the lawn, and we could see him from the room. After we had finished, we went to open the bedroom door, which was shut. We couldn't get out. The door had no lock on it and wasn't jammed. There was no draft in the room, as it was an airless summer's day. It felt like someone was standing outside, holding onto the handle to prevent us from leaving. My mom, who was obviously stronger than me and my sister, tried the door too, but there was no lock. In the end, we had to shout outside to my dad to come and let us out. He opened the door easily, and there was no sign of it ever being stuck. We left that house when my parents separated. And I found out from someone that knew the current inhabitants that they too were experiencing strange things, such as their child's toys being turned and turned off during that night.
My friends and I went to Cypress Valley Cemetery in Villanoa, Arkansas. We come to your site and have tried out some of the places and have gotten good responses. We parked our car out front and went into the gates around 3 in the morning. There were four of us, there were two guys, and then my best friends and I who are girls. The guys went in first and we followed them soon after. Immediately entering, we all had a very strange feeling come over us. My best friend and I decided to go back to the car and let the guys walk around and explore some more. We were alone in the car for nearly 20 minutes with the windows rolled down because we were smoking when we started hearing screams from the distance. They sounded like they were coming from a woman. We saw no one else there. Then a few minutes later, my best friend saw the outline of two men walking on one end of the cemetery. She assumed it was our guys, so she called their cells, which when they answered, the lights from the phone showed us that they were on the complete opposite end. There is no way that they could have made it over there that quick. When we finally decided to leave, they got in the car and we sat for a minute. We had the windows rolled down, but it was about 68 degrees outside, so it wasn't cold at all. We all felt as if the air conditioning was blasting on us, but there was no source of air. It was very strange. Strange things kept happening to us later the next day. We go ghost hunting almost every weekend and have been to many places and this one was by far the scariest place. It just felt very uneasy, very dark. Just thought I'd let you know. Here is one of my stories of paranormal activity. From being very young, my brother and I had always experienced things we knew were not normal, but of course, our grandparents, whom we had lived with since we can remember, brushed it off as childish imagination. As we were growing up, we saw less and less unusual happenings. It all began when I was 15 years old. My brother at the time was 17, and our grandfather passed away. My entire family reported seeing him the night after he passed away. Now, my family has its skeptics and its believers, and every one of them reported seeing him laughing and looking much younger and healthier than they'd ever remembered. He smiled at them all and said goodbye. Now, my brother and I had not seen this apparition, so we brushed it off as their subconscious, projecting an image they all wanted to see. Of course we were believers, but we thought if anyone would have seen him, it would have been us, for we had been there for him when nobody else had ever been. Well, our thoughts came to reality one night, around five months after his passing, and this supposed collective haunting. My brother and I were up in his room playing on the PC. My grandmother was out and my little sister in bed. Now my grandfather, or daddy, as was his nickname, always enjoyed his music and always had it on extremely loud. We were laughing at something on the internet when John Lennon, imagine, began playing very loudly downstairs. Well, at first, we thought it was a cruel joke by our neighbors. This particular song had been his first choice for his cremation, and so I, being the braver of us, stormed downstairs to find it was indeed coming from the office room that was my grandfather's. I walked into his old room to find it was freezing, and there were no windows or doors open, and the CD player was not on, and the music was still going. Then, there was a knock on the back door. Usually our neighbors used our back door, and the music stopped. My brother was now downstairs with me, and we thought it must have been our neighbors there to complain, and the noise so, 
He unblocked and opened the door. Opposite the door was an outside toilet. And as my brother opened the door, he froze. His face paled. And I could tell there was something wrong. I looked outside to see nothing. But incredibly shaken by the music, I slammed and locked the door. Turned every light on in the house. Bar my sister's as she was seemingly sound asleep, and sat downstairs waiting for my grandmother. To this day, my brother will not tell me what he saw outside, but I doubt it was the friendly spirit of my grandfather coming to say goodbye. The reason I believe this is because the morning after, my little sister said, Do you believe in ghosts? I didn't react, and merely asked why. She then replied that the night before daddy had been in her room when she was crying about his passing, telling her the shush that everything was okay and he was happy. Also, my neighbors, who were really quick to complain, never mentioned any loud music coming from our house. So I really want to know why only us heard this music and more importantly, who had been outside my brother had opened the door. There is a two-story house right in the center of town that I lived in, in 1958 or 1959. It is known as the Old Van Delzim House. Both my cousin and I experienced odd things in that house. There were many times that we would hear footsteps such as a man wearing boots walking from the upstairs front bedroom towards the back bedroom to the left of the stairs. My cousin also said that she saw an old apparition in the backyard. I went to see the psychic Carol Pete this week and showed her a picture of the house. She said she felt it was a soldier from the Civil War era. Also, she said that many horrible things happened on the property. No one ever died in the house, so it is connected with the land it sits on. We stayed there only about two or three months and moved to another location in the same town. I also found out that I am a psychic medium, have had many unexplained things happen through the years. This soldier is not threatening. He does not know he is dead. Wish the house was mine, so I could try to help him. All this has been burned in my memory for nearly 50 years. Hi, my name is David. I'm a French student, and I wanted to share some eerie things that happened to me and to some of my friends with you readers. My grandfather died last year. He was a total atheist and believe that supernatural is just some bullcrap, and that people who got interested in it were pitiful fools. What's more, he was a convinced internationalist communist, and often led some speeches against God and the church. I was the contrary of my grandfather, a conservative Christian-loving God and fatherland, so the situation often led to arguments between my grandfather and me as we were obviously on a different wavelength, but it didn't matter. He was my grandfather, I was his grandson, he loved me, and I loved him as well, and we would often laugh together. Well, as a Christian believer, I believe and still believe in hell, and I feared that my grandfather would go there after his death because of his resolute anti-God feelings, so I said a lot of rosaries so that God would put him on the right way. One day, as I went back from the university, I got a phone call from my mother. She told me that my grandfather had been sent to the hospital in order to cure a little pain on a knee. But when the doctors started to inspect his general state of health, they found out that my grandfather had a generalized cancer and that is why he felt so tired. I got so upset hearing that, that I rushed to the church and put a candle to the Holy Virgin so that she would get the forgiveness to my godless, communist grandfather. 
I went to visit my grandfather in the hospital, where he was sadly ending his life, and I could notice no changes in his mind and moral, and his calvary in the hospital bed lasted for months. Here is the moment when my story becomes interesting. In my prayers, I would always ask the Holy Virgin to save him and let me know by a sign that she had taken him to the right place, near the God and far from hell. It was an ordinary night. I was reading in my bed with my bed light and listening to the outside noises as usual, and I closed my eyes to sleep afterwards. Oh God, I can never forget what I lived this night. It was about 5 a.m. because it happened just a moment before I woke up. I had a very powerful dream and it looked so real that it is still sculpted in my memory. I dreamt about a giant curtain of red velvet with a portrait of my grandfather hanging on it. I looked at this picture and my eyes looked leftwards and saw that the curtains were open like on a theater. Behind these velvet curtains, I could see the sky filled with orange clouds, lit like on a wonderful sunset, or dawn, I don't know. And suddenly, I saw a boy kneeling in the darkness in front of the scene, and I recognized myself. I can't figure out why, but I know that the boy in this dream kneeling was me in person. A short moment after, a young woman went out from behind the curtain, from the lit side. She had a blue dress and a blue veil. Both were blue, one dark, the other clear. She looked like Raphael's Holy Virgin in the painting. I remember her peaceful face that made me feel peaceful and tranquil. The lady sat in front of the kneeling boy, me, and started talking to him. I would see the lady's lips moving, but no sounds coming from her mouth. But I distinctly remember her beautiful eyebrows. After talking, she showed me something behind her. It was a ladder, a beautiful multicolor ladder, the one in the orange clouds. The ladder went through a hole in the clouds, and this hole had incredibly powerful light coming right from it and it thrilled rays of light It was noisy like a storm, though not frightening at all, not at the contrary. My dream stopped with this vision of delight. I had forgotten the dream on the following morning and went downstairs for the coffee. My mother was standing in the kitchen, and her eyes were painful. As I held my cup, she told me that my sister called from the hospital and then my grandfather passed away. I was waiting for this event with pain, but I got psychologically ready. Anyway, tears began to go out from my eyes, and I began to cry and go in the garden to think. And as I was walking through the trees in my garden, I suddenly remembered that strange dream of the night, and I was thinking that it was the sign I was waiting for and that I beseech the Blessed Virgin to send me. I was so grateful. I went to the church and told the Holy Virgin thank you, but I wasn't expecting such an intervention, but another prayer of mine had been made. However, if you're thinking that this story is going to be about light and positivity, you thought wrong. Because one day, a few days before the funeral, I was visited by a spirit with horns. That's right. I was lying in my bed asleep when the door slightly opened a little bit, and I was greeted by this creature, this horn figure. It was definitely a black mass, but it was just standing there as I was trying to regain consciousness in the middle of the night. It stared at me with its red glowing eyes. That's all I remember, the dark outline of this dark mass and the horns protruding out of its head. It was there for about 40 seconds and I'll never forget the sight and it just slowly disappeared. 
I have no idea what connection this is to my grandfather, or even if it means something, but it definitely rattled me to my core. I started to get a lot less sleep, and on days that I would get sleep, I would have these terrible nightmares of the same horned figure. In one of those dreams, the horned figure would be seen off into the distance with again those glowing red eyes, and there would be candles scattered about with the only source of light coming from the candles. They were all lined up row by row and in a line that eventually led to this horned figure. I remember waking up instantly after that dream and crying profusely. I yelled out to my grandfather. I said, please save me from these nightmares. I'm sick of these nightmares. Fast forward a few days after the funeral and the most spectacular thing happened, though it was a little unsettling, not even going to lie. And I feel like this was truly confirmation that God was answering my prayers. We have this massive full body mirror that rests in the living room. This is where I saw my grandfather in the mirror, standing right behind me. It happened so fast, and it disappeared so quickly, that I had to regain my composure and not freak myself out too much, because I knew deep down inside that my grandfather was here to tell me it was okay and that I shouldn't fear evil. Was it a possibility that I was so distraught over losing my grandfather that I thought I was losing my mind in the process and I was just imagining everything that I was seeing? I don't know. I can see why people would think that after this story, but what I do know is that I contacted my grandfather and maybe some unruly spirits, maybe deep below the surface, that we can't always reach, and it's really terrifying, but also comforting to know that my grandfather has my back, even in the afterlife. One early morning I had been sitting in my family room, reading the newspaper. It was a very quiet morning, and I was all alone. The sun was coming through a bedroom window off the family room and shining down the hallway. It was one of those extremely bright sunrises, the kind where you can see dust particles floating through the air. I glanced up as I was turning the newspaper page. I then saw in the sun rays the outline of what looked like a man. It had a light black to gray color. It had no details, just the outline of its body. It was about three feet off the floor and had no legs from around the knees down. I could see the arms. It had no hands either. I just remember telling myself, wow, it's a ghost, and I took it all in. I told myself not to turn my head or blink. The ghost appeared to be looking into the bedroom. It turned its head slightly to the right. At that point, I had to blink. My eyes were drying out. When I did that, it was gone. I then got up and put my hands through the spot where it was. I guess I wanted to see if it would be cooler or something, but it was the same temp. I just stood there in amazement of how cool that was. I also needed to add, it was no one's shadow, and it's hard to describe, but it was not a shadow. I could see the dust particles going through the figure, and the figure was in the middle of the hallway. It was three-dimensional. It actually looked like a hologram. I really love those rare ghost encounters. My parents bought a house in Newborn, North Carolina. In 1970, it was a brand new home in a new neighborhood. I lived in this house with my parents and younger sister until I went to college in 1994. The house was a three bedroom, two full bath ranch with a carport. Before I was born, my father enclosed the carport 
and turned it into a large den. The original steps, carport door frame, and window frame remained and led up into our kitchen. It was an interesting layout because you could look through the open window frame from the kitchen and see into the sunken den or vice versa. The bedrooms were on a long hallway at the back of the house. The hallway could be reached by two doorways, the kitchen and living room, actually one big circle. The first bedroom in the hall faced the street. The bathroom was next, another bedroom, and then my parents' bedroom at the end of the hall. The room next to my parents' room was mine until my little sister was born. I was five years old. I was moved down to the first bedroom. This room gave me the creeps. The closet door would slide open a bit on its own, which my parents said was probably a draft from the heat or air conditioning. However, after someone broke into my bedroom window while I slept and stole a few things from my room, I never stayed in there again, usually sneaking into my little sister's room and sleeping with her or sleeping on my parents' bedroom floor. I constantly slept with the bathroom light on and a bright nightlight or a lamp. I would wake up in the middle of the night and hear odd noises that made me feel paralyzed and cold all over. One would think these irrational fears would subside with age, but they seemed to intensify over the years. One reoccurring incident that still bugs me occurred in the kitchen, den area. Whenever I would be sitting on the couch watching TV, I would see the silhouette of a person walk by the window frame from the old carport. I would assume it was my mom or dad because the shape was tall. What would scare me to death was the fact that no one would appear at the door leading to the steps after I would see the shape walk by. Many times I would call out to my parents, thinking it was one of them, but no one would answer. And then I would walk up the steps and look into the kitchen. There was never anyone there. Most times, this would happen when I was home alone. On numerous occasions, my parents would come home to find me sitting on the front porch steps or sitting in my car with the doors locked. This went on for years, and I was very excited when I moved out to go to college. Years later, I went to visit my little sister and stayed with her in her college dorm room. We were telling ghost stories with some of her friends when I told her my accounts of the shadow. I was in mid-sentence when my sister finished my thought and described the incident in perfect detail. I had never told my sister about this because she was much younger and I didn't want to scare her. Needless to say, we were both shocked and had goosebumps. We compared stories and it seems we had very similar experiences in that house. My parents eventually built a new house about 10 miles away and sold that house. I wonder to this day if the new owners have ever experienced any of the oddities that my sister and I did. I'm 28 years old now. The paranormal has always interested me, but only recently have I started to research it. I've come to believe now that some things I've experienced as a child were probably more than nightmares. I believe my encounters were that of the paranormal, edited with a touch of child's imagination. Contrary to what you might believe, I think my touch of a child's imagination is what scared me the most. I decided to share with you those experiences that could be considered nightmares for your entertainment, but also those that I truly believe are paranormal. At the age of five to seven, I can't recall for sure. One night, I was lying in my bed, asleep. I felt something moving at the bottom of my bed, and the next thing you know, I felt like I was being dragged out of my bed. 
my covers had tightly wrapped themselves around my legs, so tight that I couldn't move them. I yelled, my bed is eating me, help, mommy, daddy, help. By the time it stopped and parents got into the room, half my body was hanging off the side of my bed while the other half was hanging out for dear life. You know what my parents' response was? That's what happens when you don't fix your bed every day. Your bed eats you. No, really, I still never fixed my bed after that. I disproved that theory fast. It never happened again. I look back now and realize that whatever it was in that house had a weird and somewhat morbid sense of humor. Check it out. Several other times, I would wake up from a rather deep sleep, turn over, and open my eyes as if something told me, wake up Steph. Sure enough, I would open my eyes and one of two things would be sleeping next to me. A. Bo Duke. He was like a hero to me at the time. Or B. An orange mummified witch with a cone-shaped hat and empty eye sockets. Now. You would think waking up next to Bo Duke saying hi, Steph, would be cool as all heck, but no. I would freak out, jump so high I would fall off my bed, and thump, and run to my mom's room screaming, Bo Duke is in my bed, help. It was way more dramatic when I saw the witch. Now, here is what really makes me think it was actually a spirit playing games with me. As I got older, about 10 years old I would say, the occurrences were not so graphical. I would still hear a voice say wake up Steph. I would open my eyes and see a pitch black silhouette of a man standing in the far corner of my room, about 6 feet tall. I would blink my eyes a few times, he was still there. I would pull the cover over my head and then peep out. He was still there. Of course, I then freaked out and ran to mommy's room screaming, the boogeyman is here to get me. Help mommy, the boogeyman is here. This would happen several times a month, for a good year or so it seemed. The last occurrence was years later, when what believed to be the same silhouette mentioned above ran across my room. First, I saw a blur run down the hall to my left and stop at the middle of the wall near the footboard of my bed. It took a moment for it to take shape, but it was definitely the silhouette of a human. I started to dart, and the moment I moved, it darted towards the other wall and vanished. I freaked out and flew to my dad and told him that there was someone in my room. Years later, when I was old enough to understand, my dad told me of the ghost of an old lady that dwelled in the house. She was a nice, but sometimes grumpy old gal. However, that doesn't explain the man that was in my room. I still can't figure out if the Bo Duke, which thing was truly a nightmare, or a spirit messing with my head using the touch of a child's imagination. I've been to Gibbs Bridge twice, and we have seen something every time. The first time the signs kept changing, there would be a lot of writing on the signs, or not every time we came around. I looked back and thought that someone was messing around with us, and I saw a figure standing alongside of the road, ran by the guardrail, and disappeared. Then, I kept seeing something black out of the corner of my eye. My cousin was with me, and she started to scream, and me and her both heard moaning over her screaming. Then, it was me and my sister and her friend. The sides again kept changing, but only a few, not at all like last time. We took pictures and got orbs. Then, we saw a figure again by the sign and disappeared. We went all the way down the street 
and turned around and saw a big bright light. I told my sister it was probably a car, so flash your lights to let them know that you are coming. She did that, and the light was gone. It kind of looked like a motorcycle light with handlebars. I know the whole story about it. Then, we turned around again and saw it again. It was not the street light at all, because we turned around going back to the bridge about 10 to 15 times, and only showed up about 3 times. The weirdest part of that night was we left, and my sister's phone was in the center council. Nobody was touching it. Somebody that we know called us and wondered why we called. Nobody did it. It was in the center council the whole time. My sister looked down and saw her phone hanging up, and they said we left a message. It was all three of us talking, and it was muffled. Tell me what you think, and go out there some time again. Thanks for reading my story. Back in the early 90s, a wealthy family who lived in Corona owned two homes. One large home they owned was on the south side of Corona, overlooking the 15 freeway. The other home, used later as an office, was the old in-town district on Corona's famous Grand Avenue. As the story goes, before the husband and wife met and got married, the husband lived in the large house on Grand Avenue. The house once been a funeral parlor, and almost nightly, the husband would hear talking and other noise coming from the room next to him. He would check the room, only to find it silent and nothing out of place. After he met his wife, they purchased the large house on the south side and turned the Grand Avenue mansion into an office. One of the children of the family went to my school and he claimed that their family had experienced all kinds of strange phenomena in the old mansion. One instance, a soda can was completely knocked off of a nightstand, right next to a bed that he was sleeping on, and constantly, they would hear footsteps upstairs. And the mother once said she was in the bathroom, and the door suddenly flew open. All of the windows were closed, eliminating any chance of a drift. Another night, the family drove past a mansion, as they often would, to make sure it was secure. Remember, nobody lived there at this time. It was only used as an office. As they drove past the house, they noticed every single light in the house was turned on. They went in, turned out the lights, and left. They checked with everyone who had a key to the house and everyone assured them they had not turned on the lights. It is claimed that the atmospheric pressure in the backyard is different from the rest of the area. These stories were all interesting to me, but I still had some skepticism. Until, one year, the family was going to go on vacation to visit relatives in Texas, and they asked my mother and me if we would watch the mansion for them while they were gone. Keep in mind, neither my mother nor I knew anything about the house, including the strange phenomena. So Monday morning, we got to the house and settled in. My mother, a school teacher at the time, was grading some homework assignments, and I, only about five at the time, was fast asleep on the couch. My mother got thirsty, so she stacked the homework assignments in a pile went to the kitchen for some water, came back, only to find the paper strewn all over the table and on the floor. I was still fast asleep, and there were no open windows. Later on that day, she was in the kitchen again, and she heard me crying in the other room. She ran in to see what was wrong, but again, I was fast asleep. I did not appear to be restless, as if crying in my sleep. Later on that week, we both occasionally would hear footsteps walking around upstairs. It is a very old house, 
as you can see from the attached photo, so naturally, the floors are very creaky. These were definitely solid footsteps. We constantly went upstairs after hearing the steps, only to find the place empty. After the family returned from their vacation, my mother had mentioned to them the phenomena we experienced. They laughed and explained to us that it happens all of the time. They described the entity as a friendly ghost who likes to play pranks on people, hence the bathroom door flying open. The family eventually moved to Texas and sold the mansion to somebody else. I never return to ask the new owners if they have experienced anything. Perhaps somebody around this area might want to. My name is Prenta. I lived in Hamtramck, a suburb of Detroit, Michigan, in a two-story flat on Crailing Street. The apartment itself has a long and bloodied history of violence and death. Not only did I experience multiple ghostly apparitions, such as a man in a long beard that resembled Abraham Lincoln, but demonic possession, as well as poltergeist activity. The demonic possession was incredibly startling. It wasn't something that occurred inexplicably. I had a boyfriend who was connected to negative energies, and an evil spirit named Harold latched onto him. My boyfriend had never been once an aggressive or temperamental person. However, after staying together in that apartment for a lengthy period of time, our relationship began to sour. He would often talk in his sleep, which was something he had never done in seven years previous, and we had lived together for a long time. One night, he was sleeping right next to me. For some reason, I remember I had a difficult time trying to rest, so I was tossing and turning in bed. My boyfriend was dead asleep. Not a second later, he starts whispering. He keeps repeating, Harold's here. Harold wants to play. Although it scared me half to death, what he said after that truly shook me to my core. He uttered some unnerving words something about how he was going to take care of my suffering soul. At that point, I couldn't take it anymore, and I woke my boyfriend up. He was in a pure state of delirium. I told him he was talking in his sleep, and when I told him what he said, he looked at me as if he were terrified. That's because he said he had a dream about a man named Harold. My boyfriend told me that in his dream, he was in the Mafia, and Harold was his mob boss. He wore a pure white suit and looked like a traditional mobster from the 1920s. Well, a couple days later, I was cleaning my apartment when I discovered a secret room that I never noticed before. It was basically a walk-in closet. The room was empty except for a small cabinet with a drawer. I opened the drawer and in it was an old newspaper from the 1930s. I kid you not, in this newspaper was an obituary about a man named Harold. The obituary didn't say he was part of the Mafia, but he was a World War I veteran. I believe that Harold used to live in this apartment. My boyfriend told me that Harold appeared once while he was in the shower and I was away at work. I often worked a night shift at a hospital, so I'm often away at night. He heard a crash coming from the kitchen that startled him. When he went to investigate, the dishes that were on the countertop somehow fell to the floor. He then returned to the bathroom to brush his teeth. When he saw the face of a young man staring back at him in the mirror for a second, right behind him. It was so quick, but long enough to notice. He then had an idea to photograph the bathroom, a picture directly facing the mirror, and then the bathroom itself while standing from the doorframe. What he saw was incredible. 
It was an orb, clear as day, appearing right in the mirror. Either way, I was convinced that later on, my boyfriend was possessed by Harold. He became a shell of his former, laid back and friendly self. He transformed into a vicious, aggressive, and easily agitated person. We eventually had to have a priest come over to bless the apartment and to perform a prayer on my boyfriend to release the spirit who could be inside of him. After we moved out of the house, the feeling of intense rage and negative energy seemed to subside almost entirely. He stopped talking in his sleep. He was more easygoing, and he started to become the man I fell in love with years ago. Still, there was one experience that I had while in that apartment that I'll never forget as long as I'll live. It was the evening, and I was starting to settle down on my first night off from the hospital in days. I walked to my bedroom to change. In the bedroom, there was this huge mirror that I often use. As I was walking through the bedroom, I was looking at myself in the mirror. That's when I saw a woman dressed all in black with a scarf. It must have been some kind of babushka woman. I instantly closed my eyes out of pure fright, and as I opened them back up again, I returned to look back at the mirror, only to see that this woman had disappeared. I only saw myself. All of these events are 100% true. I know sometimes when people tell these types of stories, they are often met with a high degree of skepticism. I should mention though, that I have high integrity, and I think it is foolish to tell pointless lies just for attention, or to have a good story. The possession, Harold, the poltergeist activity, and the babushka woman were all signs that something awful wouldn't leave that apartment. At this point, I'm just thankful that I don't have to experience that ever again, and that my boyfriend isn't being used as a vehicle for paranormal entities. I would say this is a story of a haunted house, but it isn't. Until about 10 years ago, it was just a haunted house in my book. I met my husband over 30 years ago. He told me about a house that he used to live in that had some very strange things happening in it. It was local, but he never wanted to go anywhere near it. He said that it was very old and had been built by a young person who had some of the wood and granite that made the fireplace sent from Ireland. Anyway, the story is that when he married his wife, she came with her mother, a real shrew. She harped at him and distressed his wife to the point where he went mad and killed them both, then ran screaming that the demons of the house had made him do it. My husband's family moved into the house in the early 60s. During the years they lived there, they heard doors closing and footsteps on the stairs, as well as the smell of coffee and frying bacon in the middle of the night. His mother was quite a gardener, but could never get flowers to grow in the yard. He said the whole family was quite uncomfortable in the home, and eventually moved. We had been together for a few years, when we heard that the property had been sold for a mini storage lot. We were talking about it with my sister and some friends, when my husband told the story. The friends asked to see the house. I'd never seen it to this point, and I'll admit, was more than a little bit curious. We finally talked him into going, and away we went. When we turned onto the street, we got a really creepy feeling, but when we pulled up to the house, I was absolutely terrified. There was not a living blade of grass, or anything else on that lot. We live in Washington State, and this was March. The house was dark and very ominous. I refused to get out of the car, so did my sister. The guys, three of them including my husband, 
took a flashlight and headed around to the back of the house to see what they could see. After a few minutes, we saw a flash of light on the second floor. A few minutes later, we saw the front door open, but nobody came out. After a few minutes more, they returned to the car. We commented on the fact that we had seen the light, and they told us that they had never turned it on. Then we asked them why they didn't come out the front door. They told us it was locked, and that they tried it before going around back. I was always skeptical about the stories connected with the house, but after they tore the house down, the mini storage was plagued by problems and eventually went out of business. The property sits abandoned and barren, still nothing lives there, and it's still as creepy as it was years ago. I've got a story to add to your website. I've gone back and forth about someone having come check it out, just not sure I'm ready for it. But here goes my story. My husband and I moved into a new house built on a minor Civil War battlefield. We know there was another house in the vicinity. There was also a tree that was referred to as the hanging tree, not far from our backyard, on which about Union soldiers were hung. Soon after moving in, we noticed odd shadows and white lights that seemed to move across rooms with no apparent source. We tried to account for them by cars passing on the road, but never could pinpoint anything. One evening, we were watching TV when a shape ran past a door to what eventually would be our deck. The door was a good four feet off the ground, but the person running past ran level with the door itself. My husband and I ran for the door, flung it open, and my husband jumped down and ran in the same direction. At that time, we were the only house on the end of the street, and being a very small town, it's very quiet at night, and sounds carry for quite a distance. We didn't hear anyone running, nor did we see anyone. We were spooked, but figured it was a kid, and our eyes played tricks on us. Not long after that, my husband jumped off the couch and ran for the door again because he said someone was standing there looking in. Again, level with the door and no deck. There was no one we could see when we went outside. Some months later, I was up around midnight cleaning the kitchen. My husband had gone to bed and shut the bedroom door. The bedroom was at the top of the steps, and the door in plain sight. I was watching TV across the great room, when I saw out of the corner of my eye a man leaning around the corner of the hallway wall and smiling at me. As I turned my head, I was ready to yell at my husband for sneaking up on me, when I realized the man's hair was long and blondish, and my husband's is dark brown. In short, I also realized the man was wearing a white t-shirt with full sleeves, nothing my husband owned. I couldn't see anything from the waist down. While I stood there staring, he simply vanished. I immediately ran to the hall and noticed that the bedroom door was still shut, and if anyone had gone out the front door, I would have heard it. There was nothing no sign of anyone. When my husband got up for work, I told him what happened. He said it was my imagination. I didn't think so, but we left it at that. However, I started turning on the lights when he left the house for work, since he left at 3 a.m. A few weeks later, though, my husband was in the front room at the computer left as a table with the antique mirror hanging over it. My husband saw movement in the mirror and turned thinking it was one of our cats on the table. Instead, he saw a man's shoulder and arm wearing a white shirt walk past in the mirror. My husband simply got up and walked outside until I got home. 
during this time, my son, who knows no fear, would never stay downstairs at night by himself. He said he was creeped out, like someone was watching him from outside the door. My daughter, a typical teenager at the time who kept to her room, would often come downstairs to hug me and sit close to me. When I'd ask her if something was wrong, she told me that sometimes she felt someone was sitting on her bed and that she saw things move out of the corner of her eye. The strange thing is that my husband and I never told the kids what we saw until they were 18 and 19. There was a time when activity seemed to stop after my husband, getting the idea from my friends, stood in the center of the house and asked whoever was there to not show themselves to him. He was left alone after that. However, recently, we've been experiencing marital problems and my husband moved into another bedroom. I'm now hearing footsteps in my room and I'm constantly woken up by what feels like someone sitting on my bed. I'll roll over, but there won't be anyone there. One night was unusually bad, and I had to get up earlier than normal the next day for a class. Around 10 p.m., I said out loud that I needed to sleep, and he wasn't letting me. If he wanted to bother someone, to please go harass my husband. Strangely enough, it got quiet, and I fell asleep, only to be woken at 11 p.m. by my husband, who was in the bathroom, frantically looking for someone to stop an area on his leg from hurting. He has psoriasis, but this particular time, he said it felt like someone was poking him with needles. The area was deep red and gave off heat, a very odd coincidence to say the least. We've also had things go missing, a tablecloth, a 15th century style costume, and various little things that turn up in different areas. We have yet to track down the tablecloth or the costume. I did tell the ghost not to hurt my husband. My uncle and aunt now live in a house near the bank in Auburn town. When I was a little girl, my best friend Stephen and his family lived there. They bought the house and were told that the previous owner, an elderly lady, still haunted the house. They put little faith in the story and never let it bother them. I remember playing in Stephen's room and smelling an old lady smell, like medicine and Lilyic perfume. We never felt threatened by a presence at all. The smell would usually fade away just as quickly as we smelled it. However, one night, after the family had gone to bed, Stephen's mother was awakened by the sound of toys making noise in Stephen's room. Stephen had one problem. He was highly susceptible to nosebleeds. The slightest bump would set off a massive flow of blood. Stephen's mother thought it was strange that he was awake and playing with so many noisy toys at once in the middle of the night. Also, the rocking chair in his room where she would often read him bedtime stories was rocking so hard that it was banging against the wall. She ran down the hall to his room, and when she opened the door, the toys went silent. The rocking chair slowed down. She looked at Stephen in his bed and saw that his nose was bleeding very badly, and it was going down his throat. He might have drowned in his own blood if the very sweet lady's ghost had not raised such a racket that night. My grandmother Emily was a hard-working wife and mother, and during the Great Depression, she held her family together, even when her husband, Grandma William, died suddenly. He left her widowed with several children to raise. She was a down-to-earth person and a practicing Catholic, so was not given to superstitions, but nevertheless had some encounters with the otherworldly. One time, for example, 
she was on her way to visit one of her brothers, an elevator repairman. On the way there, getting off the train, she had a sudden premonition of his death. She got a hold of herself and rushed to where she was supposed to meet him. It didn't take long for her to arrive at his workplace, an elevator station, where he had to do a repair job. She saw a noisy crowd assembled there, and she inquired what was happening. She was told that a repairman had been killed in an accident. It was her brother, the very one whom she had gone to meet, and about whom she recently had a deathly premonition about. I explain this as a prelude to our ghost story. Among her other siblings, she had a brother who was a decent man and a barber by profession. Unfortunately, they had a disagreement, which escalated into a parting of ways. He uncharitably held a grudge against her all the while. Time passed, and one night, while she was asleep and her husband were asleep in bed, she was suddenly awakened out of a sound sleep and noticed the person kneeling near the side of the bed. It was her estranged brother, garbed in his brother's smock and weeping bitterly. He was apparently suffering. She was startled and confused and didn't know how he got in her house and bedroom in the middle of the night and why he suddenly showed up after choosing to cut himself off because of a silly grudge against her. She began to speak to him and ask him what was wrong, but he interrupted his sobs to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And with that, he completely vanished. She was amazed and woke up her husband, relaying to him what had just occurred. As they lay there discussing it, the telephone rang. Her husband answered, and it was for her. When she got on the phone, she was informed that sadly, there had been a death in the family that very night. It was her estranged brother, the barber. They understood this ethereal visit from beyond the grave to be the soul of the departed brother, and that he was given the grace to appear from his purgatory to his sister in order to make up for his uncharitable bearing of a grudge. A requiem mass was offered for him, and they prayed for his soul. He never appeared again. I come from a long line of psychics, and I must have been about seven when during an afternoon nap, I woke up after a very frightening dream. At the time, we were living in Mount Butler in Hong Kong Island, and mom's family lived in Capiz in the Philippines. I ran out of my bedroom into a room full of family and friends to tell my mom about it. I saw this Filipino man in a wooden box, dressed in a cream shirt and brown trousers, and lots of her family were around him crying. As a young child, I'd never seen a dead person before and was distraught by the experience. My family consoled me and told me not to worry, but it brought to their attention that I too had the gift. It was only a few years later that I was told that the person I saw was my uncle who had been shot by the local militia in my mom's village in the Philippines. And it surmises that the clothes I saw him in were the clothes he was buried in. So it turns out that I had a psychic snapshot of the actual Filipino funeral rites, whereby the body is kept in the family house for a period of weeks so grieving people can pay their respects to him. This brother of my mom's, she had been having prophetic dreams around the time, warning him to leave town because something bad was going to happen to him. He didn't believe her, and was shot by the local militia after a dispute. It is Filipino superstition that during this period that the body was stored in the family house, the spirit visits the family on the third, fifth, and seventh day after their death. 
This, as it turns out, was during this time that we both had these visitations. Mom was in the kitchen washing dishes when she heard who she thought was Daddy coming back from work. That's when she saw a man from the corner of her eye standing in the doorway wearing a light shirt and brown trousers. So she chatted to Daddy for about five minutes about his day and what he had been up to when it occurred to her that he didn't answer her back once. She turned around to ask him a question and then she realized that there was no one in the doorway at all. It was at this point she was a little bit spooked as she remembered my description of Uncle Fred in his coffin and hurriedly went to check on Daddy. He had come in when she had heard him come in but had just fallen asleep on the bed fully clothed in knit wearing brown trousers and a white shirt. So it was her brother's way of saying goodbye and I guess to say sorry for not having listened to her when she warned him. A few years later, it was 1987, around about the time that Edward Yule, Hong Kong's governor at the time, passed away. We were still living in the same flat in Mount Butler, but my sister and I had moved from the room we were in, as that had been converted into mom's nursery, where she looked after preschool children during the daytime. We were now in the room where I would have my bedroom, until we moved over to the new territories. I must have been about nine, so my sister would have been four. We shared a bunk bed, and her being smaller stayed on the lower bunk. I awoke to pitch black, and the sound of flip-flops walking up and down our corridor. I thought, this is strange, as it is custom to remove your shoes at the front door and to wear slippers around the house. As I heard these flip-flops getting closer and closer to my door, sheer terror took over. I whispered to my sister, Chris, can you hear that? No one answered back. So I was trapped on the top bunk with nowhere to go, with this noise coming closer and closer. I hid my head under my blanket, like most kids do, wishing it to go away. I said this time, more incessantly, Chris, can you hear that? And something hissed back at me, yes. That did not sound like my sister at all. At this point, I was terrified. I tried to gather all my strength to get out of the bed, but I was too scared. After what felt like a millennia, I eventually gathered enough courage to jump off the top of my bed, ensuring by no means that I touched the lower bunk and charged into my parents' room across the corridor from our room. I was so embarrassed being so old and being scared, I didn't actually get into their bed, but spent the rest of the night curled up in a ball at the foot of their bed. It turns out that my sister wasn't in our room at all that night. My question was, what was that in the corridor and in the bunk bed with me? The strange pink light. Around this time of the strange occurrences with the flip-flops, we were still living in flats in Mount Butler. My daddy, a complete atheist, had an experience of his own. Daddy does not believe in the supernatural, and if God actually spoke to him, he still wouldn't believe it. He was lying in bed one night, when he woke up for no reason, to this pink sphere to appear on the wall opposite their bed. It seemed to come out of the wall, and sit there and go back into the wall again. He was puzzled by this and went to investigate. He checked out where the possible light source could be coming from, the curtains. No, we were on third floor, 
lights, what could have been vehicle lights. He went into the bathroom. All lights were off and couldn't have come from there either. He got back into bed and tried to wake mom up to show her. She was having none of it and kept her head under the sheets. Well, this fear appeared again and came out of the wall, suspended somehow, then sunk back in and disappeared. He never did figure out what that was or where it came from. Running Ghost When he was working in the Royal Hong Kong Police, he had another experience. At this point, he was the superintendent and managed a section of the traffic police. They were doing their rounds when a speed camera on the road flashed for no reason. They went to investigate and it flashed again with no cars in the near vicinity. They thought nothing more of it until the pictures were developed, and on one of the photos, there is a distinct picture of a person, blurred apparently running very fast, so fast it set off a speed camera. The Ghost Dog When we were living in Mount Butler, I had one other experience that reaffirmed my belief in the supernatural and two other people I was with experienced it also. I must have been about 14 when my sister and my best friend at the time decided to go for a walk in the countryside. So where we lived was surrounded by Hong Kong countryside, which was perfect for me as I was a tomboy and spent as much of my time as possible out and about exploring and climbing trees. Just before I started university in the UK, I was visiting some friends in Cardiff. I was feeling very odd that night, and as we are heading out into town, a premonition hit me. I turned around to my friend and said, something very big is going to happen tonight. He just looked at me like I was stark raving mad, so I dropped it. So when we went out and had a lark and came back, thinking nothing more of it, imagine our surprise when we woke up in the morning and splashed all over the news was coverage on Diana's death. This of course, being the famous Princess Diana of Wales who died tragically in a car accident, but I predicted it the day before, at least I feel like I did. Could be a coincidence, but I don't think so. Udalexer Cemetery Experience So, I started uni in Derby in the Midlands, and where I was living was student digs on Udalexer New Road. I was heavily into my goth influence back then, not so much now, but I still love old cemeteries and dramatic clothing. There was this beautiful one on our road that I used to visit regularly and read and draw with many beautiful statues and old, old gravestones. One day, my ex-boyfriend and I went to visit it as it was a lovely day turning to evening. So I wandered around looking at all the gravestones and the statues, trying to find the oldest tombstone we could find. It must have been coming up to winter time as the sun set quickly, and we realized in a panic that the gate had been closed so we were locked in and had to find another way out. So we walked along the perimeter looking for a likely tree to help us over the wall when the sun just disappeared and we were pitched into almost complete darkness. Then, for no reason at all, the mist appeared over the headstones, so it was hard to avoid the graves themselves. So it suddenly looked just like a horror movie set, trying to avoid broken tombstones and holes in graves and that danged mist in the dark. By this point, I was pretty panicked, 
frantically trying to get out, with this feeling of overwhelming dread descending over me, and all cells in my body telling me to leave right now. We eventually scrambled over a wall into the student bar, and that feeling just lifted, just like that. It's only a few months ago that I was looking online about Ghost and Derby, that I found out that very cemetery is haunted. Brilliant. My dreams. I thought that was the end of my experiences, but looking at the dream section, I've remembered some more I want to share with you. I've always had very vivid dreams, some not necessarily all coming true, but all seem to have symbolic importance in the coming days, weeks, or even sometimes years. I more often than not have deja vu experiences, even if I haven't ever A. done this before, or B. seen places or people before, or C. really ever thought about these things when I am conscious. I haven't really wanted to tell people about them, as most people, I worry that most people think I'm quite mad. Haunted house. So this also happened just before I finished university in Derby, I think. It was just before my ex-boyfriend and I broke up. The importance of this dream is one that I've been able to break it down and understand it in its composite parts. So both of us were walking around this dark woods, and I was taking all that I had learned from watching horror movies into mind, and was very careful of not wandering off my own, made sure I had a weapon in hand in case anything happened. We eventually came to this clearing where this ominous house stood at the end of this garden. However, I needed the bathroom. And even though we knew it was a haunted house, I was not one of those people who would go to the loo in a haunted forest. So we walked in, and there were people there. Thankfully, none looking like psychopaths or zombies. Strangely enough, they were people we knew too. There was a feeling of dreaded sadness throughout the house though, and I refused to go anywhere by myself. We are directed to the bathroom, which was at the end of this corridor. He decided to sit and chat with people whilst I did my business. So, I started walking, but the corridor was like the one from the poltergeist. It just kept getting further and further away, until I had to break into a run, desperately needing to go, and leave this house as soon as possible. I eventually made it, and threw the door open, and did what I needed to do. Then I woke up, and realized that I still needed to go, so I ran for the loo. Luckily, I had the foresight to write this dream down once I had gotten back to bed, and knew that we were doomed. The haunted house was a reflection of our relationship, being hounded by our mutual bad doings, and that the end was near. It was just a matter of time. And so it was. Finally, before I finish another of my epic storytelling sessions, I have one more prophetic experience to share with you, but not one from my dreams. It has to do with my pet dog. Sophie. Her name was Sophie. She was lovely, with her white and black patch over her eye and black patch in her back. She was only six months older than me, and had been with her family for 16 years. She was the loveliest, sweetest dog in the world, apart from having a penchant for biting socks, eating tissues and rubber bands, and attacking the hoover. She was suffering from basically her insides giving in. She had serious kidney problems, and she couldn't walk very well because of arthritis in her back legs. And because she couldn't help herself anymore, she was kept outside. 
one evening when her parents were out. My sister and I were playing with her in the garden and I had this weird feeling come over me. I seem to be able to predict death, unfortunately, amongst other things. I turned to my sister. When I saw the shadow fall on her Sophie, that looked like a cross. It was like it was a sign saying she was going to die tomorrow. So that's what I told my sister, and she kind of brushed it off. She didn't believe me, being much younger than me. But sure enough, after a hard day at school, I was only 14 or so at the time, we came back and our parents were in pieces. And that's when I knew it had happened. They had to take her down to the vet and have her put down as it was too cruel to keep her suffering like that. I've never seen my daddy in pieces like that, but because I was strengthened by my foreknowledge, I supported him in his time of need. My poor cat was distraught as she basically brought him up from when we adopted him as a very small kitten. On a happier note, I had a dream after this terrible day. I was watching my crazy dog run from the front of the house, in and up the stairs with much zest and energy like she would have had as a younger dog, running up to our level of the house, looking like she was having the time of her life, back and forth, giving little yips of happiness, grinning in her quintessentially silly Sophie way. As because of her health problems and her incontinence, she was not allowed in except for very cold weather. I think this was her way of saying that she was free and happy at last, and I knew she was in peace. She still does come and visit us occasionally, when we walk by the front of the house, and you can, still after all these years, smell her, and we know she's still looking out for us. I keep meaning to write a dream diary. I'll do that this year as these dreams seem to be too important to miss. My husband and myself and my brother were all watching our mother's house while she was out of town on vacation. We had been there for a few days and all happened to be on this particular evening and night. Well, we had finished dinner and we were all just hanging out in the living room watching TV. My brother said he was just going to sleep on the couch, and my husband and I said goodnight and went to bed in my mother's bedroom because that's where we had been sleeping. We kissed goodnight like usual and turned off the bedside lamp. I myself just can't close my eyes and go right off to sleep, so I was just laying there, looking off into the darkness and trying to wind down. Suddenly. I noticed a very, I mean very dark black mass, right by the bedroom door. I blinked my eyes a few times, trying to make them adjust to the dark better, but realized they already had, because I could make out the mass that was so much darker than the dark. I began to feel afraid when I saw it moving. I laid there and watched it approach the bed over our bodies. It looked larger than it had by the door. I began to nudge my husband, but I decided to lay there a little bit longer to see if it continued to move or even get larger. I laid there and marveled at its darkness and its extremely dark color as opposed to the regular darkness. It was pitch black and just floated there above us. Unbelievably, I fell asleep. The next day at lunch, my brother said, Hey, last night I saw the weirdest thing when I was trying to fall asleep. A large black mass was hovering above my head and scared me half to death. I stuck my hand in it and it was freezing cold. Before I had a chance to speak, my husband said, 
Me too. I thought I was seeing things. I spoke up, and I said I saw it as well, and was frightened by it. They both said, wow, I wonder what it was. I had read some more that these could possibly be evil. Needless to say, we didn't spend the night there again. I'm a nurse and run our family's assisted living, and recently, we had some strange things happen in our care home. I understand with caring for the elderly that sometimes strange things occur in doing this for almost a decade. Recently, I had a resident that started to decline at the age of 93. One night, after helping her get into bed, she asked me if Bernie, her husband, who died 10 years before, knew where she was. I reassured her that he did. It caught me off guard since her mind was intact and she was not forgetful. A week went by and again I assisted the woman into bed. She says to me, I hear Bernie in the hallway. Can you tell him that I'm in here? I told her to call for him and he would come in. She refused and asked me to. So, I went out to the empty hallway and said, Bernie, he is in here if you would like to visit with her. As a nurse, sometimes you do things out of the better judgment for yourself, as long as it helps your patient. Later that night, I heard the elderly lady talking to no one quietly. I've had some odd things happen in my personal life through the years since childhood, but that is another story. I was once told by an elder Japanese woman not to talk to the dead or invite them into my home. Another week goes by and my resident took a drastic turn for the worst by refusing to eat or drinking fluids. After a week's stay in the hospital, she returned on comfort cares in hospice. The end was near and we knew it. However, while she was in the hospital, I received a frantic call from one of her nursing assistants asking if I would please come back to work because she was really scared. When I got to work, all the lights in the house were on and she was sitting on the couch with her back up against the wall. When I asked what was wrong, she told me wide-eyed and pale that she had seen a mist down at the end of the hallway and was hearing weird popping noises coming from the residence room that was in the hospital. After checking the entire house and silently saying the Lord's Prayer, the house felt calm. He spent her last days being pampered and showed care and compassion from staff and family. Many of the staff came in on our days off to sit with her, including myself. The last couple days of her life she was sedated for pain and hallucinations. When no one was in her room and she didn't know we were checking in on her, she was reaching up towards the ceiling and mumbling. The day before she died, we had XM music playing on our TV. A couple of the nursing assistants were performing for their evening cares. When the TV changed to CNN for 30 seconds, and turn back to the music by itself. The TV remote was on top of the TV. Since our favorite lady passed away, things have stopped for the most part. My mother passed away June 5th, 2007. Me and my husband were in New Jersey at the time, waiting to get unloaded. We drove an 18 wheeler for a living. My sister had called me the day before and told me that my mom was in a coma and the home health care people said she only had about 24 hours to live and that I needed to come home. So I called our dispatcher and said we needed to be routed back to the Chattanooga terminal so that I could see my mom before she passed. 
He said no problem. After you and your husband have put tires on, go pick up that load and head for Chattanooga. Well, while they were putting tires on our trailer, we decided to get some sleep. The cell phone rang, and it was my sister. She told me that mom had come out of it. It was sitting up and laughing and talking to everybody, and that she was okay. So I called my dispatcher and said we don't have to go home. We can do one more load out here. So it was late that night when they finally got the tires on the trailer, and we decided to just stay there in the parking lot till morning so we could get some much needed sleep. We get up that morning and pull out. As we're heading down the highway, my cell rings, and it's my sister. She's crying. She tells me that mom passed away that morning early. So to make it a little shorter, our dispatcher gets us home 36 hours later. Now at this time, we are at my mother's house, and she has already been picked up by the funeral home before we got there. Later that day, my husband's cell phone rings while we are nowhere near it to answer it. So when we do pick it up to see if our dispatcher is called, it shows we have one voicemail and no number. So my husband listens to the voicemail, and it's my mother, the day after she died. The message said, Connie, this is your mother. Call me. We decide to check if it was a delayed message, but it wasn't. I even took it to the cell phone company, and they said it was June 6th at 1.25 in the afternoon. My mom died June 5th, 2007, at the times between 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. It has really bothered me that we missed the call, even though she was already dead. She might have been trying to say goodbye to us. A few nights ago, a friend and I took a drive up Angeles Crest Highway. It was a clear night, and it wasn't too cold. As we entered the parking lot, we noticed there were no other cars there. As I made a U-turn in the lot to face the small building, there, we saw a man walking. What got my attention was the fact that my headlights shined bright on the building, yet we only saw the person from the waist down. The rest of his body was a shadow. The man was walking around as if he were looking for something. It appeared he had a flashlight in his hand, the way he was moving, but there was no light coming from it. The closer we got to him, the smaller the image got. When I shined my brights on him, it looked like he went down a small hallway. Even then, we could not see his upper body. We went back the next day to see if we could find anything. One thing we did notice was the hall we saw the figure walk through was now a wall. Not a wall that was just put up, but one that looked like it was part of the structure since it was built. Three separate spirits are said to walk the halls of the soon-to-be-abandoned Middle Tennessee Medical Hospital in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, as a new more modern hospital is being built right across the city. In the older section of the third floor, one room is said to be haunted by the ghost of a mental patient who jumped out of a window in the 1960s in the psychiatric ward. Thirty years later, in that section, Administrative offices were constructed, and employees reported hearing running down the hall of someone with bare feet in a light outside the room where the man was said to have jumped, turns on and off periodically on some nights. The switch that turns that light on can be found only inside the room, which was not even in use at the time. When the lights were checked by maintenance, they seemed fine. Later, some orderlies enjoying lunch on that same floor reported seeing an IV stem being rolled up the same hallway. They left their food there and didn't return. 
in what was the pediatric area. The ghost of a red-haired girl in her early teens in a white hospital gown has been spotted at one point by a nurse who also had long dark red hair when the room was used for pharmaceutical storage. She claimed to see the spectral image of the girl staring at her through the glass observation window of the room. The nurse was also a redhead. Finally, the third spirit has been chronicled by the hospital's own sad history and has been spotted in a newer section. A young nurse, who had just started, was leaving for the night to go out with friends. As she hurried down the stairwell, she dropped her purse over the guardrail, a lunch too far, and fell down the center of the stairwell, landing on her head. She died three days later due to massive brain drama. Ironically, one of the hospital's employees who had the task of cleaning up the bloodstains was the son of the woman who had seen the red-haired girl's ghost as her family worked in the hospital. It is sad that sometimes you can see the girl repeat her fatal fall. I have many stories to share with you, but I'm going to start at the beginning. I grew up in Lawrence Harbor, New Jersey. From the time I was a very young child, I knew that something was not right in our house. Our house was the last house in a dead-end street that faced the marsh. In the winter, you could see Highway 35. The surrounding woods were equally as disturbing. I was the only girl in our neighborhood. All my friends were guys. They were like brothers to me. I was a tough kid and I did not scare easily. However, being alone in our house and going to sleep at night frightened me to death. My father died when I was a baby and it was just my mother, brother and myself. There was quite a difference in age between my brother and I. For years, I kept my experiences to myself because I thought it was my imagination and I also thought that if I told my mother and brother that they would think I was crazy too. It took me a long time to realize that I wasn't crazy. It was not my imagination and the hard part was that I was a gifted child whose family could not relate to me on that particular level. These are my experiences while I live there. My mother and father bought the house in 1962, and I was born in 1963. We owned the house right up until 2005. To this day, the events are burned into my memory. From the time I was about five years old, there hardly was a time that the house was at peace. I would lay awake in bed at night and watch orbs dance across the walls and ceiling. Then, I could feel someone sit on the corner of my bed. It was not a faint feeling either. In retrospect as an adult, you could actually see the corner of the bed being pressed down. My heart would pound in my chest so loudly that I couldn't hear anyone else, and I could feel every hair stand up on my entire body. I would pull the covers and pillows over me in such a way that only my eyes and nose would stick out, even in the summer with no air conditioning. Shadows were commonplace everywhere in the house. You could smell flowers in the middle of the winter as well. Then, just as I would start to fall asleep, I would be jolted awake because something pulled the covers of me so violently that they were on the floor at the foot of the bed. That would send me screaming out of my room to my mother. There wasn't a time that you didn't feel as though you were being watched or that you didn't feel that something was following you from room to room. If you came home and put your car keys down, turn your back for two seconds, they were gone. And then after searching the entire house, they would suddenly reappear where you originally put them in the first place, and you were the only one home the entire time. When I was in high school, I would come home and shower because I played sports. 
I always locked the bathroom door. Every time I would pull the curtain back when I was finished, the door would be wide open. Once again, no one was home, and our interior doors had no keys. Until now, I've been very vague with you about my experiences, but now I will tell you in detail my most frightening experience. I was engaged to Mitch. We were just both out of high school. My mom was out, and so was my brother. Mitch and I decided to go to my house to watch TV and eat some pizza. From the time we entered the house, I could feel that something was really wrong, really out of sync. The air seemed electrically charged. It was as though us being there had interrupted some unseen gathering. I ignored it, even though I was goose flesh from head to toe. Even with all the lights on, my mother's house always seemed dark. Mitch was sitting in the room watching television, and I went into the kitchen to heat some frozen pizza. We were having a conversation as I did so. My back was to the living room as we were talking, and I was placing the pizza on the baking sheet. I heard what I thought was Mitch leave the living room and walk into the kitchen. I became aware that he was standing directly behind me as I was still talking. I turned around to ask him something, but to my shock, it was not Mitch standing there. I felt all the blood drain from my face. My knees went to jello, and I gasped and screamed at the same time. Standing face to face with me was a huge black solid apparition. I could make out a head and shoulders, but the rest became more see-through as it went towards the knees and feet area. It felt like slow motion. I think that when I turned around and screamed, I scared it as much as it scared me. As I stood there screaming, the black figure literally whooshed through the kitchen wall. Mitch ran into the kitchen. I was shaking and white as a ghost. It took me a while to collect myself. I shut the oven off, and we left, and went to the local pizza place, where I told them what happened. We didn't spend much time at my mother's house after that. This is just one story, out of countless stories, that I'll be glad to share with you. I'm now 46 years old. My entire life has been one foot in this world, and the other in the spirit world. Years ago, I'd contacted Sylvia Brown, who told me that my mother's house had many spirits in it, but two stood out. There's the ghost of a baby, and its mother. She also said that I was a medium and a psychic, and she was right. This is what I now do. I'm no longer afraid. It gives me pleasure to be able to connect with grieving spirits with the departed loved ones. I consider this wonderful gift that I will not trade for anything. Thank you for listening. All of my life I had reoccurring experiences of the paranormal, starting at age 7, as far as I can remember, when my father died. I used to believe the experiences were dreams or imagination until recently. I was telling my fiancé of my experiences, voices, mists, noises, marks in my body, being touched, shirt tugged on, hair pulled, etc. His suggestion was that maybe I am a sensitive. So I started thinking about this possibility and decided to explore it further. My fiancé and I previously tried going to paranormal meetings, which would go on ghost hunts. There was one in particular that appealed to me, and we signed up. The building the group was going to was in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, at an old building that was previously the Elka Club, built in 1914. This information was given to us by the leader of the hunt, when we arrived, 
We went into a room to get the speech about which rooms to be careful of. They would be marked by the yellow tape. Nothing else was told to us about the history of this building. But as I stood there, a name entered my mind, and it kept repeating itself. Sarah, 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 over and over again. Well, as the group entered the basement, we divided into small groups of two or three. My fiancé and I were in a small room, in the back, and I felt nothing, so we decided to head out into the main part of the basement. And just as we stepped out of the room, a man that was on tour with us, who has been there before, said, Sarah, if you are here with us, give us a sign. I was flabbergasted. I looked at my fiancé and explained the utter shock on my face, and we continued in to other parts of the area. I had entered a room just of the entrance of the basement and instantly was bombarded with intense sadness, so much so that I got tears in my eyes. I informed the group leader, and they took pictures around me, but by this time, I already knew that what they were searching for in the building wasn't correct. I knew that what I was feeling was the past, and the child Sarah intended on proving just that to me. She, in what I would call it, attached herself to me. She started flashing images in my mind about what the building was before the Elks had been built there. It was her home. It was a beautiful Victorian with a large porch, parlors, a library, you name it, she showed me. She told me that she was sad because of the remodeling that was about to happen in the building. She got her point across by telling me certain rooms did not belong. I also picked up a persistent man in a room on the first floor. I was flashed an image of a podium and people sitting and listening intently to this man. In the ballroom, I was given images of people dancing, only black shadows of such. And at last, the third floor, I approached the end of the main hall and was shoved by something not seen. I took a moment and continued on into a grand circular room with benches attached to the circular walls and had the feeling of being watched. And I kept saying, this feels like judge and jury. It was like you were being persecuted, watched, and the spirits were getting angry. So I wanted to step out of the room for a moment, and I took a step forward towards the door and received a sharp blow to my middle back on the left-hand side. I went out of the room and was telling the crew about the incident and decided to give it another try. And as I entered, I again got another blow to the right side of my back. At that point, I wanted out of there for good, so the group agreed to leave the third floor. And as I entered the hallway again, I got pushed in the same spot as the first time, which happened to be in front of a very large window. The interesting part was, I said before, I knew nothing of the place, but when we were leaving, I told the owner all the stuff Sarah had told me. I told her of the man in the room that in my mind, I'd seen the podium. I told of getting pushed and hit in the back. Well, she surprised me, not only, but many in the group as well. Come to find out that this is where Sarah's home was. The rooms I was seeing were the rooms in her home. The man at the podium would have been the black preacher that occupied that room after the elk club closed down. That night, I came home exhausted. I fell asleep and dreamt of Sarah. In the dream, she told me her last name. So I searched for her on the internet. I then found something more shocking. Not only did I find her, 
the year she was born, but I also found the names of her parents. Well, I'd spoken with someone that has been to the club and knows things about it, but they never knew her parents' names, which happened to be the same names I came across. And as far as the room on the third floor, the owner informed me that this room was the judging room for the Elk members and where they would hold their remembrances to the dead brothers. The interesting thing was, the women were not allowed in this room, and there was also an EVP that picked up stating, you are being judged. So needless to say, I'm no longer doubting my ability, and I'm more open to my experiences, which have been many since that night. Growing up in rural Michigan, I had several what the heck was that experiences. Most were minor, a moving shadow or an uneasy feeling, but one stands out. I was eight to 10 years old in the mid eighties and my family had just returned from a vacation. When we got out of the car, my dad headed to the mailbox, my mom to her garden and I lugged my suitcase inside the house. All of the windows were shut and I pulled the garage door closed behind me. Walking through the house, I passed the bay window from which I could see my dad still on the road and my mom picking some vegetables. The house was silent except for my footsteps on the carpet. I walked into my room and put my suitcase down in the corner. I heard a male voice laughing behind me, maybe in the doorway eight feet away. It was a hearty laugh, loud and clear. I spun around and there wasn't anyone in the doorway. I ran back to the garage, through the door and outside. My father was just grabbing his suitcase from the car and my mother was pulling weeds. I wasn't scared when I heard the voice, but not having a tangible body to put it with did unnerve me a bit. Following the event, I was able to forget and had no issues in the rest of the house. It was only after I got older and interested in the paranormal did I realize that I must have had a run in with something. About two years ago, I bought a 126 year old 8,000 square foot mansion in Missouri, just outside of Kansas City where I grew up. My mother had owned and lived in the house for the previous 15 years, slowly maintaining it. She had done a great job maintaining its mid 1800s character, slowly bringing the woodwork back to life, adding insulation and replacing all the plumbing and wiring. I mention this because I've heard that a disturbance in the environment can cause spectral activity to begin. I'd seen the house only once as I live over 2000 miles away, but I fell in love with it immediately. The first night I stayed over, I woke in the middle of the night to huge blobs, about a dozen from golf ball to basketball size floating around the room I was sleeping in. This is the one and only time I've ever experienced anything like that. I closed my eyes, said a prayer, and fell back to sleep in time. I said nothing to my mother the next day until she asked me, well, did you see the blobs? One of the workers stayed down there the other night and said he wouldn't stay in the house after dark because of the blobs floating around him, she had not seen them and still hasn't. However, the previous owner told my mother a few years later that he loved what she had done to the front room, but he could never stay in there while the house was his because of the blobs. During the summer of 2007, I went back to see my family. I stayed downstairs again and had several things happen. 
It is important to note that I've never felt in danger, only uncomfortable. My mom and her boyfriend went upstairs to go to bed. I stayed downstairs in the first floor master suite. For the next 45 minutes, the heavy footsteps above my head were attributed to the two of them settling in for the night. Finally, I decided I would go up and find out what was going on. The entire upstairs was dark and still. They were both long in bed. I returned to my bedroom to hear the continued walking above me. So, I went out on the living room to sleep on the couch. The walking continued above me. Although there is only one attic above that living room, I could also hear a distant, quiet talk between a man and a woman. But I couldn't make out what they were saying and it seemed to always be somewhere else from where I was. The next morning, I decided maybe I would have a chat with myself out loud, and if anyone else heard it, then maybe it would be for the better. I sat on the end of the bed. It was now daylight, so I felt comfortable to be in the bedroom again, and said that I was the new owner and the son of the woman they probably knew very well by now. I really liked the house, and hoped to continue my mother's good work, but for now, I lived elsewhere. I also mentioned something that I don't suggest, but in this situation, I felt comfortable in doing so. I told them that they seemed to have been there a long time, and so long as they agreed to stay out of the bathroom while I was in there, we could get along just fine together. The following night was as quiet as it could be. I think their interest in me was satisfied. This past summer, 2008, was my third visit back. Absolutely nothing happened. I was ready, and nothing. Hey, that's fine with me. But one side note, my mother sat down to look at an album she had kept for all these years she had been doing the refurbishing. She was showing me the huge change in the house, from walls being ripped out and then rebuilt and so on, and well over half of the pictures, there were huge light anomalies. There were smears, blocks, and strange twists of the image. I mentioned this to my mother, who looked right at me and said, You know, I haven't taken a decent picture since I've lived in this house. I've owned one crappy camera after another. All the pictures look like this. I have to throw most of them away because they are no good. I just smiled. Right, Mom. Every digital and disposable camera she has ever had in the past 15 years has had the same problem. I grew up with a mom who is wicked, and she is very psychic. She has told me accurately if a lover and I will break up, when, if I will meet someone new, and accurate descriptions of people I will meet. My mother told my roommate that the child she was having would be a girl, and she was correct. My mom, to my amazement, is the real deal. On Halloween, our house is the most popular because the altar my mother sets up outside is very real. It's very fun, and I grew up with the easygoing view of the paranormal. I do tend to be very logical and I believe in a paranormal experience if it does not seem like someone is BSing me. I keep my mind open. My mother does have headaches if she is around haunted houses. She has migraines that will make her sick for days after being in one. She's had this happen to her several times in her life, including once when I was a kid a few years ago. When I was 23, I started having heart palpitations and take a cardia. 
At one point, my heart rate went up to 181. I spent night after night in the emergency room, and I was recommended to a cardiologist. I went through that for several months before finally someone realized there was a sedative that I took that helped me sleep. And the doctors took me off the sleep medication, and I soon found out that I had become dependent on sleep aids. At the same time, I had to get on a Greyhound bus for a two-day trip to move back with my parents because of the health problems. If you've ever traveled on a Greyhound, you know it's really hard to sleep on it. I was sleep deprived. I was told that I was sleeping, but I didn't realize it. I wasn't sleeping through the night. I was exhausted. I was depressed, and I developed a phobia of the sound of a beating heart, heart medication commercials, etc. In short, my mental health was suffering. I had to make the choice to go into a psychiatric ward because it took a month to get an appointment with a psychiatrist. I didn't want to wait that long. The ward was in a regular city hospital. All the patients were quiet and were there to heal. Nobody was dangerous. There were patients with bipolar and other types of mental illness, and nobody was dangerous. There are different levels of hospitals. This was a ward for anybody going through emotional difficulties. I started to sleep the first two days I was there. I was not dangerous, but they did have to give me something to sleep. I was having dreams in which in my bathroom, Patients had bathrooms in their rooms. I could hear a woman crying and throwing up all night. It was horrible and nightmarish. I could never see her because in the dream, I was laying in bed. How can I describe this? Even though I was asleep and dreaming, it felt like I was aware of everything going on. It never sounded quiet. It sounded like patients were throwing fits, and that someone would go by my room and rap on the wall with a walker, and that poor woman threw up and cried. She sounded miserable. The ward was actually always quiet, and nobody threw fits at night. My mom had taught me how to interpret dreams. I figured mine showed my anxieties, I'd been through hell. I wanted to sleep, and I never gave one thought to the idea that the place was haunted or had residual hauntings. I had greater concerns at the time. However, my mom came to pick me up, and she refused to enter the ward. I didn't think anything of that either. We were driving home, and she asked me how I had slept. And if I did at all, I told her about the nightmares and how it was completely loud and I was still very exhausted. My mother was shocked and it showed on her face. She said, Sarah, those were not just dreams. This psychiatric ward used to be a cancer ward. I was getting a migraine because there are patients who have not moved on. Wow, that shocked me. I never heard doctors mention that I had been a cancer ward. The idea was never put into my head. Like I said, I wanted to sleep again and to feel happy. I was concerned for my health. I believe my mom. She's usually incredibly accurate about these kinds of things. I honestly have gotten tired of finding out if me and a potential lover are not going to work out, she's that accurate. However, I could not tell you if that ward was the former cancer ward. I simply don't know because none of the doctors ever mentioned it. I was sleep deprived 
and going through hell at the time. My emotional state could have been reflected in my dreams. However, if I've learned anything about the paranormal, is that it can be a very small world. The hospital in question is in Iowa. It is a regular city hospital with an emergency room, surgery room, etc. It is not a psychiatric hospital only. If a former nurse ever writes you, or even a former patient, I am here to tell you that there may have been something to their experience. The ward in question is still open. This was a few years ago that I was there. This is just a quirky experience that I wanted to share. My story has been going on for a couple of years now. When I was nine, we moved into our house. It's a nice little place, back by a large ditch. Behind the ditch is a large forest that I used to play in. The house itself is unremarkable. It's three bedrooms. The master bedroom is the first room you come to when you open the front door straight in. To the right, there's a door to the garage, and to the left is the room we use as our living room. To the right of that is the dining room with the entry into the kitchen. From the left of the living room is the hallway with the bedrooms and the bathroom. From the time when I first moved in, I've never liked the bedroom at the end of the hall. It has a window that looks out into the front yard. The room I shared with my sister has a window that looks out into the backyard. I'm not sure what it is about the room, but it's a creepy feeling. I was around 11 when my older sister moved out. By that time, it had been a while since I'd gotten any creepy feelings in the second bedroom. I was pleased with the idea of having my own room. I moved my bed in there, got everything set up, and prepared for the grown-up life that I wanted. The first couple days were okay. I had strange nightmares about something coming in from the ditch, something I couldn't explain. Finally, after about a month after I'd been sleeping in the room, I woke up suddenly from one of those dreams. I laid there for a while, not really sure of what woke me up. Then, I realized the music box my grandma had given me a year ago. It was odd. The music box was shaped like a carousel horse and had a switch on the bottom of it that turned the music on. I sat up and took it down from the shelf above my head and turned the switch off. I figured that maybe my cat went up on the shelf and brushed against it. I laid back down to go to sleep. It was lying there that I first saw him. I don't know what made me look up into the doorway of my bedroom. At the time, I slept with the door open, but I did, and standing there was a man, clear as day. For a moment, I was sure that someone must have broken into the house. With the light coming off the nightlight near the door, I saw that his mouth was moving quickly, and no sound was coming out. It was almost like he was screaming at me. He took a step forward and vanished. I slept in the living room that night. I finally got the nerve to sleep in my room again. After about a week of sleeping on the sofa, and that night I had the same creepy nightmares and woke up to find a child sheep sitting on the end of my bed, staring at me. It vanished when I turned the light on. I ended up spending the next year sleeping on the floor in my sister's room because my mom wouldn't let me move my stuff in with her. I also couldn't change my room without getting the feeling of being watched. I would glance at the mirror 
It's the type that sits on the dresser and see a face staring at me, one that wasn't my own. My older sister finally moved back home, and I ended up back in the other bedroom with my sister. I thought that would make it go away, but I would sometimes see the man standing in the doorway late at night. He'd stand there staring at me, mouth moving, forming words I didn't understand. Three years ago, some major changes happened. My oldest sister broke up with her husband, lost her house, and had to move in with my mom and dad, along with her two kids. My youngest oldest sister had her boyfriend living in the house with her. The living arrangements were this. My two oldest sisters slept in one room, along with my youngest nephew belonging to the first sister I talked about. My oldest sister's kids slept in the second bedroom with me, and my sister and her boyfriend had the living room. It was weird at first, but we all got used to it. The weird things had calmed down since I moved to the other bedroom, but it picked up again when my sister moved in. I was trying to get some sleep, it was around 1 in the morning, and I saw the child's shape again, but this time, it was sitting at the end of my niece's bed. I sat up, but before I could say anything, my niece woke up screaming. She said it was a nightmare, and I had a feeling it was probably the same one I had when I was younger. They moved out last year, and things calmed down for the most part, until my youngest oldest sister moved away. I now had a bedroom all to myself. I was trying once again to get some sleep. I've always had trouble sleeping in this house, and I looked at my doorway, and the man was standing there, but this time I could hear him whispering. It was gibberish. I turned over and pulled the pillow over my head, but the room got so cold, I ended up turning my TV on and closing my bedroom door. Another time, I was messing around with a couple of the other teenagers in the area. We were crossing the ditch and going over to the woods behind the houses. The way we crossed is there's an area with two large pipes that stick out in the water. Surrounding the pipes are these rocky things that you can slide down, but also grip with your hands. They're kind of smooth and hard to hold when wet. We were coming back. The others had crossed just fine. I was the last one over. The first thing that happened that was really odd was my hand slipped and I started sliding down. I felt as if someone had grabbed my arm and stopped me before I reached the water. I was about to step down into the water to get across when I heard someone yell my name and say very loudly in my ear to stop. I looked down and there was a snake in the water right where I was about to put my foot. My friend came back across and got rid of the snake. I got home okay, when I went to take a shower later that night, I looked at my arm, and I had a hard handprint bruise on my arm. I don't know if it was one of the ghosts from the house, but something stopped me from falling and from getting bitten by the snake. So I guess even if the ghosts scare me, they're looking out for me too. Bonito City, a rather grand name for the cluster of log buildings that housed a saloon, post office, schoolhouse, church, general store, a hotel called the Mayberry House, and a number of comfortable residences. Set amid lofty peaks 12 miles northwest of Rizzuto, apple orchards and livestock of the Bonito settlers 
flourished in the 7,000 foot meadows at the edge of the forests. Trout fishing was excellent in the Bonito River. God was in his heaven and all was right with the world, or so it seemed, when two events took place that would cause the serene and pleasant community to literally disappear. The centerpiece of Bonito City was the two-story log hotel called the Mayberry House, operated by Mr. and Mrs. John Mayberry. They had three children, John, Eddie, and Nellie. On the night of May 5th, 1885, the Mayberry House leaped into the record books with one of New Mexico's most bizarre crimes. Earlier that evening, a number of miners ate supper there and left. Only two guests had rooms, Dr. R. E. Flynn from Ohio and a youth named Martin Nelson seemed to be pleasant and inoffensive rumors. All were in bed by 10 o'clock. About 1 o'clock in the morning, Nelson arose and knocked on the bedroom door of the two Mayberry boys. John awakened and opened the door, at which point Nelson fired two rifle shots, killing him instantly. He then turned on the seven-year-old boy Eddie, who was screaming in bed. Nelson killed him with a single blast. Dr. Flynn, hearing the shooting, rushed from his room and was shot through the head. John Mayberry, after hearing the screams, was making his way up the dark stairs from the first floor when a shot through the heart dropped him on the landing. Blood was everywhere. Mayberry's daughter, Nellie, appeared and was shot through the side and left for dead. She later recovered. Miss Mayberry ran upstairs where Nelson shot her in the chest, but failed to kill her. She stumbled downstairs with blood streaming all the way to her feet, leaving bloody footprints visible on the stairs, even years later. She fled to the nearest cabin for help, but Nelson followed, executed her, and threw her body into her irrigation ditch. Nelson the saloon key no relation to Martin Nelson, appeared on the scene, grappled with the youth, who was no match for the murderer. Martin Nelson shot him to death and left his body bleeding in the sandy street. The next victim was a storekeeper, Herman Beck, who came out to learn the cause of the gunshots. Nelson killed him with one bullet. Bonito's terrified citizens locked themselves in their homes until morning, while Nelson roamed at large, finally climbing up a nearby mountain. Next morning, as Charlie Berry, Rudolph Schultz, and Don Campbell were standing in the street discussing the murders, they sighted Nelson returning down the mountain. He saw the man, brought up his rifle to fire, it was an instant too late. Barry failed him with a bullet through the heart. Nelson's last shot went harmlessly into the air as he fell. Total fatalities were eight killed, including the murderer and one wounded. It was years before the people of Bonito City recovered from the shock, and for 15 years, nobody set foot in the log hotel. Folks said it was haunted, told stories of shrieks and groans in the dead of night, of seeing lights flicker from room to room, or hearing muffled shots. Those who peeped through the dusty windows could see the bloody footprints left by Miss Mayberry's feet. The murderer was buried at Bonito, with his head pointed down. Folklore say, that this custom was to prevent the buried persons from walking as a ghost. The victims were also buried in Bonito, side by side of each other, in a reasonable distance away from the murderer Martin Nelson. Gradually, 
Onito City died. The final blow came when the railroad arrived in the desert below and took a business-like approach to acquiring water rights in the Bonito Valley, and later on, buying out the land in which the remaining residents of Bonito City lived. In 1930, Bonito Dam was built by the Southern Pacific Railroad. The remains of the victims were moved to Angus Cemetery. A large stone marks their resting place, and as for Bonito City, it is presently resting under 75 feet of water that is now known as Bonito Lake. Since then, Bonito City has become an old memory and a murder mystery of the past. Some people have claimed that during a well moonlit night, they can see the top of the church steeple shining below the serene resting water of the night. Is it really the church steeple being seen 75 feet below the water surface? Or is it a haunting image reminding us of the presence of the city below? You decide. In early November 2006, I went over to visit my grandparents' house and my grandpa wasn't feeling well. He eventually went to visit the hospital. I thought he would just get out in a day or so, because he survived a heart attack before. For the first few days I wasn't worried at all, but after a week in the hospital, I was getting a little worried. About two weeks later, he passed away. I was absolutely devastated. Before his funeral, his brother and sister came down to visit. While they were sleeping in my grandparents' house, this is two days after he had died. My uncle was leaving. He looked back to see if things were all right, and saw a rather tall figure, wearing a hat, walking in a room. At first he thought it was my grandpa's brother Robert, but he was fast asleep in a different story of the house. He went looking in the room and the ghostly figure was gone. We all think the figure was our grandpa. He was about 6'1", and always wore a hat. Every time my grandma went to go get food, or to pick up my little cousins, we would get a feeling someone was watching me, but in a good way. In early December, I was decorating the Christmas tree and I saw a face peek out at the top of the stairs at me. It looked exactly like my grandpa a few years before he died. It kind of feels like a little bit of him falls every one of us. All of these accounts have happened in Lake Hathazio, Arizona, each in a different house. My mother and I were driving around town, looking for a house to rent, when we found a large house in Bayou Drive. This house was an old bluish color, with vines creeping up the outer walls and into the fireplace, with a large overhang on the front porch. As soon as we started walking up the driveway, a very strong feeling of dread started to creep through my body. I really liked the house, so I ignored the feeling and continued into the backyard. As I entered the backyard, I remembered a dream many months before. The exact backyard was in my dream, and the images of death and demons filled my mind. My mother had the same feeling, so we left without another word, deciding that a door had opened and a demon was dwelling inside the house. We moved into a different house, where everything felt normal at first. We lived there for seven years. I soon felt eyes watching me in the shower, which then led gusts of freezing angry wind rushing past my face and arms. Later I learned my mother was going through the same events, only she experienced only one of the gusts of wind. 
when we started talking about moving out of the house, things got worse. My mom once felt a figure sit down on the bed beside her and saw the indentation of the person on the bed. There were no dogs in the room, and the entire house was asleep. I saw blinds move to nothing in the room, and a shadowy figure walk across the kitchen. I was cleaning out a house, just about to move into it, when I repeatedly saw a figure of a little girl out of the corner of my eye. I could sometimes hear her talking softly to no one in particular. Later investigation proved that a little girl had drowned in the pool years before. I've had a lot of things happen to me in my life, from seeing eyes in the corner of my room to being slapped by something I couldn't see, so I'm very open to anything and everything that someone would think was weird or crazy. My mom, however, is not. So for her to tell me about what happened to her, I know it's true. I'm 28 now, and this happened a few years before I was born. My mom was an FHA teacher for 15 years, so she went to FHA meetings a lot. One night she was at a get together for school and it was getting light and as she was getting ready to go, one of her friend's cars wouldn't start, so my mom said she would take her home. As they were driving, her friend and her were talking, not even thinking about how far out in the middle of nowhere they were. Finally, they got to her house and my mom dropped her off and started home. It was a very calm night and very dark, almost eerily calm. As she was driving down the road, she started to feel uneasy, so she tried to blow it off until she turned down back road to the highway. I can't think of the name of the road right now, but I do know there was quite a few fatal accidents on that road because of how windy it is. So. As she was driving, she looked over and saw this thing running right beside her. It was as big as a cow and its eyes glowed green. She got so scared, she stepped on the gas and was going 85 miles per hour. And the thing then disappeared. It was almost as if it was there like a flash and it was gone. She never found out what it was, nor did she ever go down that road again. But she figured it might have been a banshee or something after a long look at things. She has only had two things ever happen to her in her life that she definitely couldn't explain, and that was certainly one of them. The other was when she went to bed one night, when she was a teen. She just got into bed and looked over at her closet, and there was something that looked like a man floating with a glow around it coming at her. She ran and told her mom, and her mom told her it was nothing. So she went back to bed, and she saw it again, and ran out and slept on the couch for the rest of the night. I'm a clairvoyant, and I'm used to not being alone. The last house I lived in had a number of distinctive entities, and will only share a couple of my experiences with you now. There was a young girl, probably around four or five, who was very prevalent around the time my son was three. One night, I had a contact dream. Usually my dreams are surreal and nonsense, but when I contact someone, they're usually set in whatever house I'm in and are more out of body experiences. I walked to the end of my hall and looked through the dining room into the kitchen and there was a small girl with waist length dark brown, not black, wavy hair. She had a flowered white nightgown on and she was pushing buttons on the microwave. 
When I asked her why she was here, she quickly, and I mean quickly, like Japanese horror crossed the room in a blink quickly, came up to me. I crouched down, but I couldn't see her face, and somehow I knew she had been badly injured. Think gunshot wounds to the eyes and cheek, so I didn't want to see her face. I explained to her that she needed to move on and go into the light where her family was waiting. And then I walked back to my room with her following behind me. I woke up, then went back to sleep. And a while later, my son woke me up, half ways anyway, enough to answer him and kind of remember. And he asked me to tell the girl that she was not his sister and to leave him alone. I told him to lay down in my bed and explain to her she was about three feet away, that I'm not her mother, and that she needed to move on, that it wasn't her house anymore. I thought that part was a dream when I woke up, until I realized my son was asleep beside me. The other very noticeable energy in my house was that of a woman who was very straight-laced and controlling. She would often sit on a window seat in my bedroom at night. My husband, who was a very skeptical man, would sit up in his sleep staring with closed eyes towards her and ask over and over, Who is that? Who the heck is that? Until I would tell him it's okay. Then he would lay back down. Well, this house was in Oklahoma, and every time there was a tornado weather outside, she would panic and really become agitated and very distracting to those who could sense her. So I'd have to calm her down and watch the storm. When my alarm clock didn't go off, she would bang loudly on the window in time for you to get to work. The only nice thing she would do. But when we were moving out, she really flipped, stirring up whatever else was there. So in the middle of the night, I would hear floor shakings and bangs from completely empty rooms. Tape would be peeled off boxes and placed across the room. Things would be removed from boxes overnight and put in different rooms. Like books stacked in the middle of the kitchen after they were packed. And sounds of the TV coming on after it had been unplugged and wrapped in protective sheeting. All in all, it was not a very fun move, especially when I was alone the last four weeks of packing, and she kept opening the valve on my air mattress at 2 a.m. My new house is nice, but I keep hearing a little boy talk to me from a corner of my bedroom. Oh well, I guess. I'm 25 now and have had strange experiences which, though I'm very analytical and skeptical, can't seem to find out how or why or what these things were. I will tell each encounter as simply and as accurately as I can. I used to live in Stockton and my house was built around 1910 to 1912. I was an only child and my parents were very busy doing their own things. I may have had an overactive imagination, but I don't believe so, because what I saw was too clear and not fake and reinterpreted by my brain. The sliding redwood doors that separated our living room from the dining room began to shake before my eyes as if it was locked and someone wanted in. I got up and walked around to the other side, thinking it was my cat, but I didn't see her paw, and she never shook the doors, just nudged them apart. I walked around to the other side of the doors to the kitchen. All the lights were off, and I saw no one. I felt very scared suddenly, and went to bed, closing my door. Another time I was laying in bed, and my mother was on her hands and knees sniffing the floor. 
a bathroom connected our rooms, and I assumed she had begun sniffing in the bathroom. I asked her what she was doing, and she replied, your father and I smelled rotten blood. I can't remember what happened first, but I saw a clear apparition in my living room as I tied my shoes. A man dressed in black with a top hat and coattails had a cane with a black long beard, walked briskly through the living room, and disappeared. I had a dream that I pulled the back out of the apartments in my parents' bedroom and saw bloodstains. I don't know if she was moving them. She denies it still to this day, but I know I wasn't moving them because I was determined to find the truth. The board told this story. A married couple named Mark and Melissa Twain live in the house with a woman's sister. One day, in jealous outrage, she killed them both in the room with a shotgun. I thought it was very fishy the wife had my name, and the husband's name was Mark Twain. But like I said, my cousin says she didn't make the Ouija tell the story. I was under the house one day, bored and playing around, when I found a small handful of large blast bullet casings. Not as large as a shotgun casing bullet, I don't think. Other things have happened. I heard a knock on my door late at night. One huge knock, but I was too scared to open it. I told my father in the morning, and he got very angry and shouted at me that I was too stupid. I don't know why that angered him. I surmised the knock was from my dog changing lying positions on the porch. Once a baby bottle just sitting on the counter just seemed to be thrown in the floor. My father said it was because I stomped into the kitchen, perhaps. But the powerful way it fell, I doubted it. I was never able to tear my parents' carpet or find any information on the house that could point me in any direction. Though I did get all the paperwork on who owned the house, and no name Twain ever owned the house. My aunt, who claims to be a psychic, came over to the house and said that several ghosts live here. But that was something I didn't hear myself. Another family member told me that. The house, which was always a bit odd, had a stained glass window on the front, not very large. It was of a cross. Later in life, I was in high school, living with a friend. I was trying to go to sleep and heard someone say my name very clearly right next to my ear. I got up and asked my friend what he wanted. He was in my grandmother's room, which they shared. I didn't call you, he said. The voice didn't sound like his voice. It had a lisp, as it was very girlish sounding. We went to the house in the Delta, abandoned and run down, as well as vandalized. I walked ahead of everyone, always ready to take on whatever. As I walked past a bush, these birds just exploded from it. Before, I heard no burn song, and they surprised. The house was elevated with a basement that had openings for water to flow through. Everything was pretty much ruined. A door opened nowhere, as the staircase had been brought down. It felt like a cemetery, not in a morbid sense, and just so quiet and hollow. We went to the basement, where trash was everywhere. On the door which had been removed then, placed back up, was a crude black painting of a devil or satyr. Being mischievous, I took a wooden bed frame topper. It was painted brown with a carved flower on each side, and it was painted red as well. After I took it home, that's when I heard the voice. My room was cold, and I saw something in the garage, and I had a really weird nightmare. The kitchen was being renovated, so we had to wash and get dishes in the garage. 
I went out to get a cup and felt very nervous in there. As I was walking to leave, I heard a loud boom in the wall to my right. I looked, not too long, but long enough, and this will be a very hard to explain situation and sound crazy. But this energy waved and glistened in the shape of something human turned its head and looked at me. I ran out, scared for my life. I'd never been so scared. I took the bed knob back and nothing happened like that again. The site has long since been destroyed. I'm not sure what any of this means, but I do know one thing for sure. I experienced it. Both of these accounts took place within the same week of each other, happening to my brother and I when we were on vacation in London. The Hyde Park Ghost. I was on vacation with my family in London for Thanksgiving, 2001. About 10 in the morning on Thanksgiving Day, we decided to go for a walk around London, starting with Hyde Park, which was about three blocks from the hotel. The park was beautiful against the autumn sky, and both my brother and I found it strange how time seemed to skip, as the park just lay kitty corner from a highly modernized tourist strip. As we waited on the corner for our parents to catch up, I turned to see a great black carriage standing behind us, pulled by a glamorous looking brown and white Clydesdale. I talked on my older brother's jacket and pointed, and we watched it for a while, thinking it was the coolest thing we'd ever seen. Others in the park didn't take much notice of them at all, walking by in a hurry to get wherever they were going, or that's what we figured. My brother, having his camera with him, took a picture of the carriage and the driver. A slightly portly man with a contented smile and a formal air. He looked at us as my brother snapped a picture, and I felt an unexplainable tingling. Shrugging it off as the autumn weather, I continued to watch the driver. Our parents called our names, and we turned back to look at them agreeing that we should all go for a ride in the carriage. My mom asked what we were looking at, and I turned back and pointed. What happened next is the strangest thing I've ever experienced. There was no carriage standing on the corner with us. My brother just looked as puzzled, and we continued the search about the corner, thinking it must have driven off after we turned to look at my parents. The carriage, driver, and horse were nowhere in sight. I found it odd also that we had not heard them drive off, as one would think a horse walking on stone could not be terribly quiet. A week or so later, we got the film developed. My brother and I searched through the pictures at least three times trying desperately to find the one he had taken off the carriage. But though all the exposures from his camera were present, we could not find the one of the gleaming black carriage, Mary Driver, and the magic Claydisdale. We did, however, find a startling shot of the corner it had been on, with the little glowing orb just right center. My brother and I prickled. The real start, however, did not come until about two days after that, when I was reading a book about the ghost of London I'd picked up at the Tower of London for some light reading. I felt the same familiar prickle as I read about a popular ghost in Hyde Park, that of a man driving a gleaming black carriage pulled by a huge brown and white Clydesdale. The Shadow in the Chapel a few days after walking in Hyde Park, my brother and I were wandering quietly through Westminster Abbey, enjoying the sights. We walked into the chapel that was open and sat for a moment, 
waiting for our parents to catch up. While we were there, he said he smelled something burning. I sniffed the air, recognizing the strong smell of incense. We looked around, not seeing anyone else in the chapel. My brother poked his head out the door, and he looked around, informing me that no one was there, and no one was burning anything nearby. Thinking this was strange, but not terribly creepy, we hung around in the chapel a while longer, chatting quietly. Our conversation was broken, however, when we heard someone chanting from the front of the chapel. We jumped, thinking we were alone. I looked up towards the front, certain we had been alone. The chanting continued in a foreign language I didn't understand. My brother, a Latin student, said later the chanting was a prayer or something. We stood there, watching the front of the chapel, looking around for anyone who might be chanting. I nearly fell over when I saw someone flicker to my left, a figure wearing a dark robe and moving slowly walked in front of us at the head of the chapel. I remember taking a sharp step backward and falling into my brother when after a moment's reflection, the being looked up and straight ahead. We couldn't see its face as its profile was towards us, covered by the robe's hood. That didn't matter, however, as in an instant, the being was gone. There was no more chanting, no smell of incest, nothing about me being supported by my pale and terrified looking brother. We didn't know what to think, neither of us thinking too much of ghosts before, but neither of us could really explain it. One minute, someone standing right in front of us, and the next minute, it was gone, completely and utterly gone, not a trace of it. Her story, I was 11 when this happened. I was spending the night at my best friend's house. It was a pretty Victorian house. It still had the original barn. It was in the back. But anyway, one night we were staying up well past our bedtime, down in the living room, watching TV and talking. Well, our room, which we were supposed to be in, was directly over the living room. Well, we were sitting there, and all of a sudden, we heard what sounded like something being dragged the length of our bedroom. It was something heavy. We were so scared, so we stopped talking and muted the TV to listen. It sounded almost like a dead body. All you could hear was thump, thump, slide, thump. It was freaky. We checked on everyone and everyone was asleep. In my second story, this is my fiance's story. He's in Germany right now. He would probably be mad at me for telling this, but I have to, because it scared me. Anyway, he's not the type of guy to get scared very easily. He doesn't believe in ghosts. We live in a town called Tacoma. It's south of Seattle. Anyway, a poor town of Tacoma is Lakewood. In this town is an old insane asylum that was torn down about, guessing, 30 years ago, and then rebuilt across the street. Go figure. It's called Western State. My fiance and a couple of his friends went to the hospital for the fun of it. The ruins are still there. They were down in the basement, which also happens to be the boiler room. They were walking down there and came around a corner and saw a bunch of bugs and such. They figured a bum was staying down there as they turned to leave. Dave is a pretty small guy, so he got pushed to the back. As he was about to leave himself out of the window, he felt someone tap him on his shoulder and heard someone whisper something to him. He 
figured it was the bun, so he turned around, but there was nothing there. He freaked out, because it was a split second that he'd heard something and felt the tap. So he started screaming for his friends to come and get him. His friends had to pull him out of the window, because he was freaking out the whole time. A third story. I was sleeping one time in my bedroom, and it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I suddenly woke up because I had the feeling that someone was in the room with me. I had my own room at the time, and it was pitch black in my room, but I looked in the corner where my door was, and I could just barely make out the outline of a man. He was just standing there and watching me. I couldn't breathe or think. I just stayed there for about two minutes, trying to figure out what to do. I finally got the balls to reach over and yank on the lamp. When I did, nothing was there. Fourth story. Me and my sister were at my grandma's visiting, and recently, my uncle had passed away in the house. He had gone missing for about two weeks. My grandma didn't think anything of it, because he did that sometimes. She went in his room looking for something, and there he was, lying on his bed, half decomposed. She said it took forever to get the smell out. On my grandma's TV was a plastic face with a flake flower in it. The TV was off, and my grandma was at work. So me and my two sisters were sitting around and talking. I believe we were talking about my uncle, when all of a sudden, the vase went flying off the TV. When I say flew, I mean flew. It flew like five feet. We all stopped and decided to go to bed. Fifth story. I was spending the night at my best friend's house. I was like 15 or something. My godmother had just told us to go to bed. We were just getting ready for bed when I hear my godmother yelling at me to get my butt in bed. I came out of my best friend's room and said we were. She then proceeded to tell me that she had seen me in the reflection in the window, walk by from the stairs to the kitchen, but the room we were in was right next to where she was. Freaky. The sixth and final story. I was babysitting my nephew one night. I was sitting on, listening to music and relaxing, when I heard my sister laugh. Thinking that was weird, because I hadn't heard them come home, I got up to check. There was no one there. I know my sister's laugh. About 30 minutes later, I heard my sister cough. Again, I got up to check. Nothing. I don't know much about this house. I've only been here about eight months. It's my brother-in-law's house. This house is kind of weird though. When all sounds have died down, you can hear clicking and sometimes even what kind of sounds like walking sounds. I sleep with my door open, so I'd hear if my sister had opened her door. But, they're like soft walking sounds. Odd. Anyway, I have tons more stories. I'm a very strong believer in ghosts. So if you want to hear more stories, just email me and let me know. I was reading your site around Halloween and noticed Green Man, and instantly knew what the reference was. I had heard this story dozens of times by my dad who visited Raymond. Then, I realized the legend was not correct. The legend states that late at night, you could witness a ghost wandering around the tunnels and bridges around town. There have been numerous reports over the years of a man with a green face, Walking after hours, he is known as the Green Man. This is because when people have seen this figure, 
The apparition has a terrifying green face as he floats by the local tunnels and bridges of the area. The real version is extremely depressing, but the real version in the least. The horrible accident occurred in Evans City. Raymond, unsure of the last name, and his older brother were flying a kite near some electrical wires next to a tree. The kite got stuck, and Raymond followed his brother up the tree to retrieve it. When Raymond's brother grabbed the kite, both brothers got electrocuted. Raymond's brother was killed, and Raymond was severely burned. He was extremely disfigured, and it was extremely hard for him to walk because of the accident. The residents of Evans City collected nearly 30000 for the boy for his care. His older sister and her boyfriend ran off with the money, leaving Raymond without the money he needed to get well. From then on, the townspeople took him under their wing and took care of him the best they could, but without the funds to do it. My dad's grandmother, who lived in Suiki, told my dad and his brothers and sisters the story of the green man when they went to visit her. Raymond, now an adult, walks down the road to and from the tunnel every night. The sun would hurt his eyes, since it only had a thin sheath of skin to cover them, so he did not go out in the daylight. He could barely walk but did so every night regardless. People from all over came to bring him money, gum and cigarettes, even while he was on his nightly walks to the tunnel and back home. The green man came from the color his skin looked when the headlights would hit him. He had been charred so badly, he was gray, so the headlights actually made him look a greenish gray color. Unfortunately, my dad couldn't confirm this because he is colorblind. Raymond had a hole for a mouth, no nose except for a hole, and holes for ears. My great grandpa, my uncle Carl, then a teen, got out and handed Raymond a pack of Lucky Strikes and a pack of gum. Raymond talked to them for a bit, though you could barely understand what Raymond was saying. Behind my great grandma's car were many more cars, waiting to see Raymond, as there were more every night. At this point, Raymond was a bit of a celebrity. Raymond was watched by the town and the police, and he never had any trouble with the visitors. My family left, and the next car pulled up to visit. My dad recalls hearing of Raymond's passing some years later. Must have been about 1985. The interesting aspect of the story is that years after Raymond's demise, I've had friends who have passed by the tunnels and have noticed gray mists, orbs, and other strange phenomena. Where that they witnessed phenomena near the very same tunnels that Raymond used to frequent. One of my friends is a non-believer and a true skeptic of the paranormal, and he had experience where he saw the green man years after his death. Just like the story, he shined his headlights as he was driving through the tunnel and nearly wrecked his car. He thought that he had saw a man wandering around who appeared to have a green face. He appeared so quickly that my friend had little time to react. His car came to a complete halt, but there was nobody in sight. Whether Raymond haunts the road and tunnel, I don't know. However, I'd like to believe that the legend is now true, after the experiences that my friends have had. A little ironic, but fascinating, nevertheless. These experiences all occurred at my grandmother's house, which is called Gwimmick Manor. Although the house isn't very big, it's around 200 years old. All my dad's family have lived there, and my grandmother now lives there alone. There have been many different events, things such as footsteps, 
dogs barking at something unseen, in the shower being turned on and off, or just a few minor things. One time, my uncle fell asleep in the kitchen at night, and the door he was sleeping next to was flung open, waking him up, even though there was no draft, and it was an airless night. The same uncle also had experiences as a young child. When he was younger, he would hear footsteps from outside his window late at night, as though someone was walking hurriedly over gravel. At the same time, he would see two big black dogs sitting by his bed. Another time my grandma was walking upstairs with some laundry. When she dropped something and bent down to pick it up, as she was retrieving it, she saw a pair of shoes on the steps in front of her, as real as a human's. She looked up in a long skirt in the start of a shirt, and then the figure disappeared. My grandma swears to this day that the story is true, and says although she didn't feel threatened, she certainly wonders who this woman is. There was no one else in the house at the time, and the stairs are curved, so if someone had walked down them, you would have seen. Most recently, my sister and I were in the corridor opposite the dining room, which is locked when it's not in use. There is a key on the outside of the door. We were standing there talking when the key started to move, as if someone was trying to get out from inside. We thought maybe someone was in there at first, but then we remembered that the key had been moving from our side of the door. Most recently, we were sitting on the lawn whilst my dad and uncle played badminton on the court behind us. The garden is raised almost on a hilltop, with steps leading up to it, so the grass we were sitting on was in line with the upstairs bedroom window, if that makes sense. We were facing the window, talking, and looking in at my grandmother's two dogs, who could have been sitting on her bed. My grandma had gone out shopping, and had left her dog shut in her bedroom. First, we saw one of the dogs start barking urgently at something in the far corner, which was out of sight from us. This continued, and the dog then jumped onto the bed again, and started barking directly at us. We thought this was strange, but what happened next couldn't be explained. A white mist, almost in the form of a hand, passed over the dog's head as though it were stroking her. She then stopped barking. We both looked at each other in horror, knowing that we both had seen the same thing. There was no sunlight that could have reflected through the windows, and I honestly can't think of another explanation for the hand we had seen. I still feel scared when I go into the house. January 1999, I'd been working for an American company in Evesham in the UK. The company was based in a small industrial state called Briar Close and East. On the edge of this estate is a small pub called the Oddfellow Arms. We all used to go to this pub now and then for a quick pint of a lunchtime. I personally used to have a pint, perhaps once or twice a week there. Anyway, as you go in on a fairly regular basis, you tend to get to know some of the locals. There was one couple in particular that the story is about. They were an old couple. He was an ex-counselor, and had to use a frame to walk with. He was always with his wife. She used to drive him everywhere. Obviously, he couldn't get anywhere without her assistance. It was just after the Christmas break, first week back at work in January. I decided to go for a sandwich and a drink at the pub. Funny thing was, I noticed that this chap was on his own sat in the corner. 
He tipped his glass to me as usual, to acknowledge me. I thought no more about it. Later that day, I spoke to my warehouse manager. He frequented the pub on a more frequent basis and knew all the regulars by name. So, I mentioned to him how odd it was that the old guy was on his own. Astonished, he replied that's impossible. The old guy had died over Christmas. I have never forgotten this. And some people, including my wife, have told me I must be mistaken. But I know what I saw. And I know when I saw him. For all those people who know the Oddfell's Arms Eve sham, perhaps some of you may remember this chap and his wife that frequented the pub. Or maybe someone else had seen him too. I'm recently going to a neighboring school by this house, and have visited it frequently. I never get a safe feeling while in there, and recently, we found a mutilated animal. Not like it was feasted on, but just torn apart, and left in front of the house, maybe for some sort of omen, or a warning. The body was ripped to shreds, and its skin on the hands were ripped off, to showing its appendages. Later, we found the skull of the animal adjacent to it, and we noticed the jaw was removed, but the skull itself was in a very clean fashion. No blood, or guts, or any kind of fluids, not even dirt marks. The skull almost looked like it had been washed. That not being the strangest thing, I have a friend of mine, who is a female, who is as well as extremely interested in the paranormal, and she has recently gone to the house, and the first encounter dealt with her, and her best friend, going into the house, and just walking around. The problem was that they did not even get to enter into the house. Right before stepping on the yard, the house is surrounded by large bushes, they heard a sound coming from one. Other times that I've been with her, we swore we heard footsteps beside us in the bushes, as if being watched. Her best friend saw a shadow, and became very frightened, and began to flee. My friend was not as scared and refused, and her being the determined person that she is, continued to go forth. The sound was continuing this whole time, her friend left sprinting, and so just to be a good friend, she decided to go catch up. She was not running so fast, and in her light jog, she turned around and noticed a woman with bright blonde hair, this being the only thing sticking out, chasing after them, and even got off the yard and continued in the pursuit. When seeing this, my friend began to run even faster and eventually ran to the church where they parked their car. She called me while this was happening, I guess to help us believe, and also, she knew I was very interested, and I could hear the fear in her voice. When she returned, she told us the story, and one of the girls who was a local asked about what she had saw, and when she said the thing chasing them had long blonde hair, the local freaked, and admitted that the woman who was murdered did in fact have long blonde hair. This scared and excited all of us because my friend who was chased had no idea how the woman looked or anything of that sort. Not being enough for us, we decided to go back with another group of kids who swear they know much about demons. We weren't allowed to go on because the demon group refused to get on because they swore they could just feel the evil. Well, they went back, and we ended up going another day with other friends. We just heard small sounds and footsteps. Other friends' stories deal with the chair in the living room that has two missing legs would be dragged across the living room. But one day, my friend, being the brave girl that she is, went into the house by herself one night, and she was walking around and really did not notice anything. She made a comment, 
expressing how upset she was that nothing was happening. And a few minutes later, she heard a high-pitched shriek, and right then she was pushed, what she guessed to be about four feet, and pinned to the wall. She stumbled out of the house, and when she got home, her best friend noticed the scratches on her forehead. She still has them right now. This incident is very recent. That same night, her friend later called me saying that she had fallen asleep and was not responding and that she was breathing normally, but her body was extremely cold. We haven't gone back yet, but we noticed that activity is much higher when fewer numbers are around. I look forward to giving you updates. Also, I'm from McAllen, Texas, and there's a building in that area that is rumored to be haunted. There's this building, and it is extremely haunted on the third floor. I'll go ahead and check that out as well, and I'll give you an update as soon as possible. My name is Andrew Pierce, and I'm a local ghost hunter here in Warwick, Rhode Island. Having experience in paranormal investigation helps every time I tell my story, because living with ghosts and experiencing ghosts are two different things for me. I moved into my home 15 years ago at the age of six. The first night in my new house, I slept in what is now my mother's room. And before waking that night, I had nightmares of bloody murder, massacres, and deadly beatings. At the time, I was just scared. But now, after researching, I've come to the conclusion that this was a ghostly encounter. Between the ages of 7 and 10, I suffered four experiences in my dreams where strange people would walk around in my house. The only problem is that they weren't living, and in each of these dreams, they were foreshadowings of what are now actual hauntings. The area with the most activity is my basement, which has been finished and where several phenomena have occurred. The first came when I was 12. I was headed upstairs from my computer room when I saw a figure out of the corner of my eye. When I turned around, it was a little girl huddled in the corner and looking at me. She was dressed in 18th century garb and looked like she had just left church or some sort of social gathering. She has never been seen again, but she has been felt throughout the house and even experienced once by someone who had never been in my house before. This occurred when a friend of mine was sleeping downstairs, waiting for us to get back from her on to CVS. She was asleep on the couch when a ghostly arm or hand touched her arm and then proceeded to knock over a couple of items on the table. When she had informed me of this, I knew it was the girl. Another haunting would be in my mother's room, where, if you are alone upstairs and my dog is not around, a growling sound comes from her room. It is entirely inexplicable, but I have a feeling an angry ghost lives in there, but cannot gather enough energy to support anything other than making sounds and haunting dreams. Shortly after my neighbor died, he built the house for his children and loved my family very much. Most of the hauntings disappeared, and a sense of comfortability ran through the house. Everything was at normal temperature, and there was no more dreaded sense of being followed or even watched. This has comforted me greatly, but it only lasted for a short time. Since that time, Several newer and less aggressive ghosts have entered the house, and they are seemingly very friendly with my dog. Where he used to bark at them, he is now okay with them, and can even be seen playing with them. This was witnessed when I saw him playing with his ball alone, but then noticed that the ball was rolling to him on its own. He would bring it back, and it would only roll once more. Also, this same ghost apparently hates breakfast because it disturbed us one time 
by knocking over a bunch of papers on the counter and spinning the trash can lid violently. No explainable cause was determined, as it was the middle of winter and no windows were open and we don't have a fan in our kitchen area. Another ghost prefers to walk around the foyer and up and down the stairs, but never seems to go past the hallways. That's really all that happens, but I wanted to report these since they are the only real, vivid ghost experiences I could ever recall. Thank you. We bought a house in Yucca Valley in 1988, built during World War II, from what we were told, two bomb shelters. House added on to the years to come. Interesting old place, but nothing special other than the fact we thought we could turn it into our dream house. Two-story, white picket fence, etc. A couple weeks after moving in, my husband and I were in the kitchen, talking, when I thought I saw something. A fog, an image of a lady going through the dining room, not saying a word, thinking my husband would think I was nuts. He said to me, did you see that? My husband and I choose to sleep in the downstairs bedroom, and the girls upstairs at that point. We were in a king-sized waterbed, framed firmly on the floor so it's not logically possible for something to be placed underneath it. After we began renovating the upstairs, we moved our bed up there, and the girls had the downstairs to sleep. Full-size beds, sitting on regular bed frames. There was nothing on the floor when we moved our bed out. A few weeks later, one of my daughters informed us that something was under her bed. My husband investigated and found a black and white photo as well as some silk scarves. We called the former owner to ask if he knew who or what it might be. He came to look, said the photo was of his dead wife and the scarves had belonged to her. A few months later, my husband found a painted portrait of a young man in his workshop. Again, called the former owner. He said it was of his dead son. A year or so later, one of my daughters saw the same image, the fog, image of a lady. He or she never caused us any harm, except for the fact that money we hid in one place or another had disappeared. After living there a while, we met the neighbors. They informed us. Former owner's wife had died from cancer in the bedroom photo, and scarves were found. His son, Porter Fount, had offed himself at the Yucca Valley Inn. Ashes had been spread on the property, according to them, the neighbors, but these facts were not disclosed to us at the time that we bought the house. After living there some 19 to 20 years, we decided to move, not because of spirits, just now that the kids have grown up and moved out on their own and wanted to downsize. I used to live the house of a thousand stairs in Redlands, California. I lived there for about 10 years off and on with my godparents. They lived there full time. I came on the weekends and during the summer. This place is very active at night. My god sister and I would see the spirits of ghostly nuns walking down the stairs. They would stop to ring the bells in the bell towers and then evaporate into a mist. After a while, we removed the bell that connected to the stairs. There were other spirits as well. Some were pleasant, while other spirits we believed were demons. I think the scariest experience we had was one night, when I was sleeping in one of the rooms. I woke up to seeing multiple green lights floating aimlessly around me, before disappearing. They had to have been orbs. I remember there was a closet which was slightly open, 
when I looked at the closet, I noticed the head of a figure peeking out with red eyes. If you've seen the famous Amityville horror picture, that's how it looked to me, except with red eyes, of course. There are tunnels that run under the property, and rooms as well, all made out of dirt. Some of the room's doors have been covered over with dirt and rocks, so that you cannot get in. If you stay down there at night, you will see nuns going in and out of these rooms that have been covered over. I'm not sure what the nuns did in this house, but there are many restless spirits here. I also believe this place draws mentally unstable people to it. While we lived there, on multiple occasions, we had to call the police because people would break into the property, knocking at our door, telling us the spirits told them to come here. There are so many stories I could tell you, but it's a very unusual place after a while. My god sister and I would sleep in the game room next to our parents' room because we were too scared to stay in our room. That's about all I'm willing to share for now. But I hope you enjoyed these stories. I know that most high schools claim to be haunted, but my old alma mater has everything from restless Indian spirits, students that died on campus, as well as the spirits of some priests that passed away at the campus. Its name is Bishop Almy High School. It's located immediately next to the San Fernando Mission, San Fernando Mission Cemetery, and is directly across the street from Eden Memorial Park, a cemetery for Jewish believers. To make this easier, I will list the different stories I've heard and my own limited encounters. 1. Our school's built on what used to be an old orange grove. It was also used as a burial ground for Native Americans who built the mission. Several different faculty members have heard the sounds of an old woman crying right inside our alumni hall, and one claiming to have seen her pacing back and forth. I myself went there late with three friends one night in an attempt to see if we could prove anything for ourselves. We heard the same crying noises and saw a brief glimpse of a black silhouette through the all-glass walls of the building. Other faculty members have claimed to see an Indian chief in full ceremonial garb near the school's chapel and the hallways behind it. 3. Members of the water pole, swimming team, and marching band have heard a young boy crying from the old archives located underneath the buildings on the west side of campus. The water polo and swimming teams used to use the old showers that were built for the priests when the school was a seminary, and the band used to store its equipment in spare rooms down there. One story of an eyewitness who saw the spirit is one of the creepiest our school has. A few of the girls on the swim team went down to the showers after practice and found all of the shower heads on and a little boy standing in the middle of the room. The boy didn't respond to any attempts at conversation. The girls left to get a coach to try and get the boy to talk. When they got back, all of the shower heads were off, and the boy was nowhere to be found. This part of the school is directly next to the graveyard. Only a chain-link fence separates the two properties. Our pool's technically rented space from the graveyard. In the new school archives, located on the second floor of the building over the old archives, there have been reported sightings of a priest in his uniform, reading or filing books. This same hallway, nicknamed the Forbidden Hallway by students, because as all the permanent records in school's computer's mainframes and is off-limits, to any student without permission, was once the dorm rooms for the young priests in training when the site still served at the cemetery. A lot of men of God passed on at this location. 5. 
The hallway behind the school's chapel has had several sightings. The Indian chief, the little boy, and shadowy silhouette have all been seen here. The boy's bathroom is a hot spot for strange happenings, late at night. I would be there late for extracurriculars or what have you, and one night when I was there, the door to this bathroom closed and opened twice. No one else was there to do this, trying to test the spirit. I said, is someone here? And the stall door I was in flung open. It didn't feel like a bad spirit but it was definitely wanting to make itself known. There were plenty of other stories at the school from all different sources. Those are just the ones I've heard the most in my own little two encounters. I really hope this haunting hotspot gets a slot on this website, because I don't think spirits are going anywhere. Yes, great website. When I was a little girl about four or five years old, I remember this clearly as if it happened yesterday. I did something bad to be sent to my room as a punishment. I was laying in bed, not sleeping mind you, just laying there, looking up the ceiling. As you may have guessed, I was bored out of my skull. Anyway, a few moments later, I looked at the head of my bed and saw two white heads, round shaped with red eyes, no teeth or any body for that matter. They just kept staring at me. I screamed as loud as I could and my mother came running into the room. As soon as she did, the image or ghostly figure or whatever it was had vanished. This house that this happened in was known to be haunted. I'm not sure by what. I asked my mother years afterwards if she had any odd experience in that house. After I told her what happened, she said yeah. When she was down in the basement doing laundry, she heard someone call her name. No one was in the house at the time. I'm not sure where I was or my brother were at the time, but I know we didn't call her. We call her mommy, not by her first name, as this thing did. She answered it. Now as I recall, if something unknown calls out your name and you answer it, isn't that an invite? This house is located in Vermont on West Road in Burlington. I forget the number of the house. My mother said I was a gifted child, gifted, meaning able to sense things as well as sometimes able to predict the future, which I've had in the past. It's not something that happens to me all of the time. Just once in a blue moon, I'd get visions in my dreams that had come as warning signs. For example, my brother was going on spring break during the days of his high school years, driving his Jeep over to coastal beaches in Florida. I recall having a dream of him doing this, and his jeep caught fire while he was driving down the road. Odd how this dream came about. I told my brother not to go. He thought I was crazy of course, and he didn't believe in that sort of thing, nor does my husband. Anyway, my brother called me up one day and said that his jeep caught fire. He had a flat tire and parked on the side of the road. He wasn't going to spring break. He was just heading over to a friend's house when this happened. Come to find out, some punk started the fire to his Jeep. In 1977, my friend and I were driving on Old Pleasanton Road during the night. We were heading south when we came upon a woman wearing a black wedding dress. All she was doing was standing there, not moving an inch. We decided to pull over to see if she needed assistance, but didn't go too close, 
in case it could have been an ambush. No response from the woman. We didn't see that she had a vehicle anywhere around. It was beyond sketch. So we ended up not helping the woman out and continued to drive down the road. As we're driving down the road, we could have sworn we saw the lady through my rear view mirror. She was following us. The only difference was she was not walking. She was floating towards us. This was after we had driven a mile from where we originally saw her, and there was no way she could have caught up with us in time. Within seconds, the lady disappeared, and she was nowhere in sight. We had to stop the car on the side of the road to gather ourselves, because it almost felt like something out of a movie. When I got home, I told my grandma what happened to us, and she was stunned just like I was. A week after this incident, around the same time period, I received a phone call that my friend was found murdered with a knife through his heart at the same location where we spotted the lady a week ago. My grandma told me that it could have been death coming for him. I still tremble at the thought of reliving all that happened that dark night in 1977. Great Aunt Amy, she lived in a small two-room shack in the middle of a very remote wooded area in northern Michigan, next to her brother and his wife. I remember her writing to me in the mid-60s and telling me they had a road name and a sign now. My younger sister and I loved going there to visit. We would walk in the woods and explore an old cabin and trailer in the woods north of them. They lived very primitively, an outhouse with magazines for toilet paper, and slaughtered their own pigs and cows. There was a great green apple tree down the road, and we always stopped to get our pickings before heading home. One time, we heard a weird noise, and my mother told us to hurry up and get in the car. We had to get going. It was a bear calling for a cub, and we were downwind. Mom feared we may have been between the mother bear and her cub. Whenever we went to visit, we went to see the uncle and his wife first, then great aunt Amy. Although we would see her peering over the tiered kitchen curtain when we arrived, great aunt Amy was very short and stout and you could just see the top of her head from the eyes up, over the lower curtain, and I'm sure she was on her tiptoes at that, but she was always so surprised to see us, and just happened to have cookies or rolls just out of the oven. The day of her funeral, the late 1970s, my sister Kathy and I got out of the back seat of the car on opposite sides, I looked at Great Aunt Amy's cabin and then looked over the top of the car at my sister. I knew she saw her too. Great Aunt Amy's little head, eyes peering up over the curtain, as she always did when we came to visit. I could almost smell those rolls baking that she just happened to be making. Recently, my sister and I took a random trip to the area and went by to see the little old cabin again. But this time, it was gone. A new home stood just to the east of its location. I was very disappointed. My sister turned to me and said, that's all right. She's still there. Can you feel her? I could. My father remarried three years ago, and when we moved into his wife's house, I began experiencing paranormal things. I've experienced things ever since I was a child. My mom and siblings were always sensitive to the paranormal. My siblings were pretty used to it, but I'd never seen anything significant until we moved into our new home. It started slowly. 
I couldn't sleep well at night and had been hearing bangs. I dismissed it all at first as being in new surroundings, but it continued. My sister moved in and we began sharing stories about things we had heard in the house. They were matching up pretty well. One night I was laying in bed and I heard hand slams against my window and slide down it. I freaked out because my window had a screen on it. So I went into my sister's room to sleep with her and kept hearing banging from my room. There was no one in there. I slept in my sister's room a couple of times before I could sleep in my room again. I began seeing black masses for brief moments after a while and my sister had one in her room that was about 8 feet tall and human shaped. We began doing all that we knew, which was praying. After a few years of this, I got a little used to it, but couldn't wander the halls at night without being terrified. One night, I was playing on the computer and heard a very loud bang like a door slamming, so I went to my room. I shut my door and leaned against it and heard running up and down the hallway. Things like this began happening on a regular basis, and at the time, I felt like my sister was the only one I could talk to. Then one day, something on a different level happened. I was in bed at night, and I had a bunch of glass carousels on my dresser. I'm a firm believer in 3am being the witching hour. And at that time, all my carousels went off playing music, and a couple fell off the dresser. Once again, I played and slept with the lights on. I had one final major experience before I moved out. My dad's room stayed locked during the day, so when we heard scratching on the walls, it sounded like something was scratching the walls in the ceiling. I ran to the bedroom door and it stopped, but could see a shadow moving around under the door. The scratching then continued, so I went outside. I moved and don't experience things like that anymore, but sometimes hear noises in my apartment. I just ignore it because I know my family and I are skeptical to these kinds of things. Just keep my faith and know that I know it's human in my apartment, my dad's house. I'm not so sure. This happened to my mother's uncle in the 50s. Her aunt and uncle were coming back to San Antonio, Texas on Highway 87 when their car broke down during the night. Uncle Steve went walking during the midnight hour to get help before he told my aunt to lock all the doors. She did just that. About 3 a.m., three men in a car stopped to help her. They told her that they would help her, but she told them that her husband had gone to get help and he might be coming back. So, the men told her that they will leave and they were going to leave her some food in a brown paper bag, which they left on the hood of her car. Hours after she thought about the food in the bag, but she was too scared to get out of the car. Soon, a highway trooper arrived. She told them that her car broke, and her husband had gone, and never returned. The trooper asked her if she had seen a few gentlemen in a 57 Chevy. She told him about the three men that stopped, and before he left, he asked her about the bag on the hood of the car. She told him that the men left her some food in case she would get hungry. The officer grabbed the bag and peeked in it, and out of the bag, her husband's head came out. She has not been the same ever since then. I live in a small town in Kansas. I've lived in several houses in this town, and in just about each house 
have had strange experiences. The first I can recall was in a small farmhouse in the country. My sister and I shared a room and had bunk beds. The head of the bed was the opposite of how most people would set a room up. The head of the bed was by the window, and the foot of the bed was flush to the wall. I was in the bottom bunk, and my sister on the top bunk. I recall waking up one night, and looking out the window to the shed that was across from me. In the top window, the second floor, I noticed a black human figure, no discernible facial features. It had a pale yellow light glowing around it, just purely out of fear and not wanting to experience this alone. I asked my sister, who was supposedly asleep on the top bunk, if she was seeing what I was seeing, not expecting to hear her to really answer me, and she said yes. We still joke about our psychic connection. When I was in high school and living in a small town as I do, my friends and I would drive around the countryside, mostly because we heard that there was some scary haunted place outside of town, and we always liked to investigate. But one night, I was sitting in the front seat of my friend's car and noticed that there was a small boy running in the road ahead of us. It was rather late at night, at least sometime after midnight, a very strange hour for young boys to be running out in the country. I noticed that he had on a red and green striped shirt and brown pants. What was really creepy though was the way he just kept looking back at us, almost begging to be hit. I could only see this boy at the middle point of the curve in the road. Just as we were rounding the last corner, he would disappear. It would only last several seconds. I questioned whether or not I was losing my mind or if I really saw it because no one else did. Another story I have was when I bought the house I live in now, still the same town. I'd fallen asleep on the floor in my living room. My dog was sleeping next to me. I'm not even sure what exactly woke me up when I looked towards my bedroom, I could see a small girl in a white nightgown. She had blonde hair, and next to her was a white cat. I could see through them. They had a mist around them. And again, just as it registered what I was seeing, they vanished. A few months later, I was in my room, standing on the edge of my bed which is right next to the bedroom door. I was reaching for the light fixture to change the light bulb with my arms extended. I noticed a man, dark short hair and in his thirties, he had dark rimmed glasses and he walked past me through the living room into my room. As soon as he got past my arm, so he would be standing right in front of me he disappeared. I've also noticed small dark figures. A possible dog like roaming around me when I was walking in my house at night. I always try to jump over them, thinking that it was my dog, but she was in another room when this happened. In 1978, my parents purchased a relatively new house in Niceville, Florida. The land the house had been built on had previously been a swamp that was drained to make way for the housing subdivision. Nothing bad had ever happened in the house, yet after living in the house for a short time, we all began to notice odd things. It started the night I broke up with my fiance. My parents had got out for the evening, and I was in my bedroom crying. Suddenly, I realized I was not alone. I looked up, and I saw a woman dressed in the turn-of-the-century clothing. 
She had a look of extreme empathy on her face. I did a double take. Never take your eyes off of them. I've learned. And my visitor was gone. My brother brought her engagement ring into my room so that I could take it to work the next day and have it sized. When I woke up from my nap, I got the ring off the dresser and noticed that it wasn't quite right. I got on my lupe and discovered that the ring had been squashed. I took the ring to my parents and showed it to them. Dad examined the ring. As a scientist, he was a little more observant than I was. He pointed out that the ring appeared to have been squashed from the right beside the head that held the diamond, as if it had been sitting on the rear shank of the ring, and an incredible force put on it that literally broke the head from the shank without leaving a single scratch or gouge mark. That kind of spooked me since I had been sleeping with the ring on the nightstand next to my head and it had been fine prior to being placed by my bed. However, events would soon unfold that made us all realize that the house was indeed haunted by the lady, but she was a friendly ghost, provided you were nice to her family. After having moved to the house, my mom was in a terrible car accident, which almost killed her. She was in the hospital for over six weeks, and even after she got out, she was in and out of the hospital repeatedly. By this time I was married and out of the house, but my middle sister's kids would stay over while my sister worked nights. My niece slept in my old room, which seemed to soon become the epicenter for activity, perhaps because of the pre-adolescent age. It started with her being awakened by the feeling that someone was sitting on the bed. She turned on the light and saw depression in the bed, as if someone were sitting there. As she watched, the depression slowly lifted out, as if the person sitting there had stood up. She was too frightened to sleep in the room. After that, so her brother slept there for her. He was awakened every night by the sound of a dresser drawer being pulled out and rattled. At first he thought it was Granny, but then he turned the light on and there was no one there. The final straw for my sister's kids came when they were sleeping over one night. Mom had just been released from the hospital yet again and was sitting up in the den. Dad had gone to bed. Suddenly, Dad was awakened by the sound of the smoke alarms going off. He ran into the den and found Mom passed out. She had been in incredible pain since her accident and had begun stashing pills for a grand escape. That night, she had gotten so depressed that she ended up taking all the pills that she had been hoarding. There was no evidence of smoke in the house, not even Mom's usual cigarette smoke. By this time, the smoke alarms had stopped blaring their alarms, but Dad stood there, surveying the scene and thinking about how much pain Mom was in and how horrible her life had been since the accident and even going as far as to whether it was even right for him to decide that Mom was not entitled to escape the horror her life had become. Then the smoke alarms went off again. Dad figured somebody was trying to tell him something, and he called 911. The next day after we had all been to the hospital to make sure that mom was going to be okay, we all gathered at my parents' house. I asked Dad why he had called the paramedics. I felt like the doctors who had saved my mom's life after the accident had not taken into consideration the lack of quality of life she would have, and I felt like mom was entitled to a reprieve from the constant torment she was in. 
Dad looked at me kind of funny and explained about the smoke detectors. Then he said that when he had gotten home later that night, he had torn each of the smoke detectors apart, and there was nothing wrong with any of them, nor was there any reason they should have gone off in the first place. Once Dad told us this, we all sat there with odd looks on our faces and started talking about the lady. By this time, I'd seen her twice. My older sister had seen her once, and my skeptical scientist dad even admitted to having seen her. We began comparing notes and found us finishing each other's stories and descriptions. We had all seen the same lady dressed in the same clothing, and none of us had mentioned it to the others for fear of being ridiculed. As time went by, the lady continued to watch over her family. After my dad's death in 1998, my then husband and I were in the den of the house after we had cleaned out the possessions and cleaned the house up. I'd left a book on the counter, and X went back to get it. Our marriage was on the rocks, and he was becoming increasingly abusive to me. Something that the lady didn't seem to care for. He had always laughed at our family ghost stories, up till the day. But when he went back in the house to get my book, he came out of the house shaking and white. He had felt a cold hand brush across his face. Then, when he didn't leave fast enough, he felt the same cold hand pushing him in the back, propelling him to the door. The lady was trying to tell him that she did not appreciate the way she was treating one of her kids, nor was he welcome in her home. After that, the lady began dropping by my house. I always knew she was around because the stove timer would go off for no reason and the dresser drawers would rattle. After I left the abusive hobby and moved to the Midwest, the lady would come by and visit me there from time to time, always setting off the timer on the stove, rattling drawers, playing tricks with the blinds, anything she could do to let me know she was keeping an eye out for me. I realized that this is unusual for ghosts to leave their primary residence and to actually follow people from home to home, but I talked to some friends who all felt like the lady was probably a female ancestor who had died in childbirth, so she felt responsible for looking out for her family. After going through the family archives, we found a photo of my great-grandmother. She had died of appendicitis when she was pregnant. The baby also died. The woman in the photo looked like the lady. My sister is now living in the house. When she first moved in, she put some pots in the cabinet, then went to the bathroom for a minute. When she came back out, the pots were sitting on the floor Earrings and rings that have been lost for years, some in different houses that we lived in, suddenly appeared on the cabinet or in my sister's jewelry box. Unseen hands frequently pull back the curtains to look outside, and my sister's dog loves to romp and play with the unseen visitor. I could go on and on about all the poltergeist activity, some that seemed to be coming from the lady others that seem to be coming from my deceased dad. From fax machines that go off when they aren't plugged in, my deceased dad's voice calling me to wake me up when the gas fireplace developed a leak, even luggage being set on its end. Weird stuff just follows my sister and I around. Just two nights ago, while laying in bed, I was awakened by the bed shaking. I sat up and looked around and found my husband sound asleep and the door securely closed against kitty visitors. I laid back down 
and snuggled up to my hubby, thinking that he just had a chronic jerk that shook the bed when it suddenly hit again. The whole bed kind of went whop, as if a 20 pound weight had been dropped on it. This time, I knew that there were no cats in the room, and since I had been snuggled up to my hobby, I knew he had not jerked in his sleep. It's nice having your own guardian spirit to watch over you, but it can really interfere with your sleeping. I know that some people think that we're all nuts, or engaging in what shrinks call magical thinking, but every time I start to question my own sanity, I get another visit. It should be interesting when we move to my dad's hometown this spring. I imagine the visits will become a regular thing. Growing up in rural northern Wisconsin, there were few opportunities for earning cash, aside from service positions and agricultural work. Coming from a farm family myself, as a youth, I would hire myself out to farmers to help with the work on their respective farms, mostly crops and dairy cattle. If you never have this experience, it may come as a surprise that these farms are usually isolated and could be quite unfriendly, creepy, and sometimes dangerous. Physical injuries like losing an eye or a limb or even a life are not uncommon. This is the setting for my story. One January, I was a hired boy at a dairy farm owned by an elderly couple with whom I was acquainted with through our parish church. The farmer's house was heated by a wood furnace in the basement where I was lodged and among my other jobs. I had to bring in the wood and tend the fire. One day, while carrying wood down the steps, I felt pushed, which caused me to slip and fall down the stairs, landing on the concrete floor, which knocked me out temporarily. I must have been out only a minute or two as I awoke in pain and found the wood scattered all over. The farmer was very stern and I feared how you would react to a mess and me not being busy with the work to which I had been assigned. When he did see me, he asked where I had been and what I had been doing and so I explained it to him. As I suspected, he was cross with me. Later that night, over supper, he told me a story which made me rethink my staying there. He related that some time ago, his wife, although a Catholic like me, had been dabbling in the occult. Things like divination, astrology, cards, etc. Odd things began happening around the farm, and it was no longer prospering. He told me that the last straw had been when he awoke to find her levitating above their bed in the middle of the night. They decided to call the parish priest. The priest whom I will call Father X in this story was a mature, spiritual, and virtuous man whom I knew and respected. His brother was likewise a priest and an exorcist. The couple explained what was happening on their farm and house. Father X had to get rid of the occult books and the paraphernalia, and after hearing their confession and absolving them, offered to bless and cleanse the house with a kind of minor exorcism. Before getting out his handbook of rituals and his stolen holy water, he had them close and lock the doors and windows for some reason. He went through the residence, leading the couple in prayers and reciting the house blessing in minor prayers of exorcism, all the while sprinkling each room with holy water. When they reached the last room, which was the kitchen, Father X was finishing the prayers, and after everyone said Amen, the kitchen door, which led outside, 
unlocked by itself, opened, and then slammed shut. Father X then explained that this is why he had locked the doors previously, to make sure that by the door opening and closing by invisible force, he could tell by that sign that the spirit had really left. The farmer went on to explain that he liked the instruction that Father X had left him with, namely, that the devil is like a dog on a leash. The demons are all restrained by the power of God, he said, chained, as it were, and they cannot really hurt you, directly, unless you come within their reach. Occult practices, blasphemies, and even grave sins can put people in places within the perimeter of the influence of evil spirits, and so if you want to avoid being harmed by them, don't come near them any more than you would approach a vicious dog that has been chained. I asked the farmer if the basin where I was lodging was also blessed. The farmer thought for a moment and said he did not recall that it was. The door to the basin was right outside of the kitchen door. After the experience with my fall that day, in the story that the farmer told me about what had transpired, I determined that I would not stay there another week. I left and didn't return. I didn't explain why, except to say that I wanted to be closer to the parish church and I wanted to go to daily mass. I did not have my own transportation at that time, except my bicycle. The farmer was unhappy that I left as I was hardworking and well behaved, but for me, there were plenty of other farms where I could work that did not have such problems. Throughout my life I had seen and experienced a few things that I can only describe as supernatural. Everything I'm about to tell you about actually happened and I will describe each experience as I remember them. The first thing I can remember happened whenever I was only a young boy, growing up outside a village in Northern Ireland called Besbrook. It was during the winter because we had a heavy snowfall the previous night and I was outside playing with my two brothers. After a while, I went inside to warm up because my hands were frozen. My mother told me to take off my boots so that I wouldn't tramp snow all over the house. I sat down at the table with a bowl of soup in front of me, and it was then that I noticed something out of the corner of my eye in the hall leading from the kitchen to the living room. I turned to see what it was, and what I saw absolutely terrified me. I saw the figure of a woman walking down the hall towards the kitchen. I just got up and ran out the door without putting on my boots and jacket into the snow and refused to come back inside, even though my mother insisted that there was no woman in the house. Over the next number of years, nothing happened except what sounded like somebody walking around the house even when the rest of the household was in bed or away. Everyone heard the noises, but chose to ignore them. Then one Saturday morning while I was still in bed, I was shooken awake and told to get up and come down to breakfast. Whenever I opened my eyes, there was no one in the room, so I assumed that they had already gone downstairs. While I was getting dressed, a voice was calling from downstairs for me to hurry up. When I did get down to the kitchen, there was no one around. Everyone else was still in bed. A few days after, my youngest brother claims to have saw a young boy standing in my parents' bedroom who just stood there looking at him. Shortly after this, Someone unknown tacked my brother in his bed, leaving him with a black eye. The next few years were quiet, except for the noises. Nothing else that I know of has happened in that house, 
except for the noises. But I did tell you it. I lived outside a village. The best way to get to the village is through a wooded area. In this place, it's a very strange place. I could distinctly remember a moment when I had to walk through these woods to get to the village. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I saw a circle of people in white robes just standing in a circle and holding hands. I was so scared about what was happening that I ran the other direction and no longer wanted to run through those woods ever again. I actually had a friend of mine who was walking through the woods and he swears to this day that he saw a woman just flying from the distance from one side to the other. Looked like a witch, but she was floating, had really dark black hair, and it just looked like she faded out. These are the only things I've seen in my life, and with that last story, my friend has seen, but I've heard other stories by people I know. The shop at the bottom of the road is said to be haunted by the ghosts of the seven British people killed there in the 80s whenever the original patrol station was blown up. I mentioned earlier, I'm from Northern Ireland. There is a high viaduct in the area, which is used as a railway line. 18 people died constructing it, one for each arch, and numerous others have off themselves off of it. The stories are that at times, you can see these people, and they all look sad. There is also the blood on one wall in a friend's house, and no matter how many times it is painted over, the blood still comes through. All this is true, and has happened within a square mile of where I live. My friend from Arizona and I made our first trip to the Queen Mary together. We happened to run into a paranormal researcher when we were on a tour and decided to stay the night. We rented a room with two beds so the researcher could stay with us and show us around the old boat in the middle of the night when the most activity had been reported. We attempted to fall asleep around 11 p.m. I managed to sleep quite easily and wasn't scared about sleeping in one of the reported haunted rooms. About five minutes after I fell asleep, my friend wakes me up. The first thing I remember was hearing a staticky voice and thought it was a radio. It wasn't until she asked me if I heard the voice. That was when I realized there was no radio anywhere in my room. My instant reaction was to turn on the light and look around the room. I reached up and tried turning on the light and nothing happened. We were really freaking out now. The light had just been on. My friend finally turned her light on and we laid there in bed for a few more minutes and I decided to try the light again and this time it turned on no problem. We tried to fall asleep again because we wanted to wander around the ship at 3 a.m. to avoid security guards. As soon as we turned off the lights and laid down, I saw my blanket pushed down and felt something on my arm. My friend also reported feeling things brush against her arm. As tired as we were, we just decided to ignore it all and go to sleep. Three o'clock rolled around and we went to the pool room, reported to be the most paranormally active area on board. We took several pictures and the researcher and my friend called out to the known ghosts. I didn't want to because I really felt like I was intruding. I felt sad and angry feelings throughout the whole area. I was looking around when we all heard a man moaning. My friend and I booked it back up the stairs and stood against the wall. After a few minutes, we joined the researcher again 
and he continued to call out to a little girl named Jackie. I wasn't paying attention at the time, but I heard my friend gasp, and I looked over, and she asked me if I heard that. I missed it. The researcher heard it too. It was the voice of the little girl. She was singing for them. I will never forget my experiences at the Queen Mary and actually plan on going back soon. I came aboard not believing and left a member of a paranormal research group. My girlfriend Liz and I haven't been together for very long, but we share a passion for ghosts and hauntings. On our second date, we went to a couple sites in our county that are supposed to be haunted. The scariest one has to be the Jericho Covered Bridge, located in either Falston or Jarrettsville, depending on who you ask. As Liz and I drove up to the bridge, a heavy fog rolled in, almost like the ones you see in the old movies, set in places like London. This was weird, because Liz and I have been driving around the county for the last two hours, and we had only encountered fog in this one place. Maryland was a neutral state during the Civil War, but racism ran deep here. The Jericho Cover Bridge is a grim reminder of that. It is a well-known local legend that runaway slaves were hung from the rafters of the bridge and sometimes left there for days. As we drove over the bridge, we both felt a chill and a sense of terror in the air, like the bridge had been in fact the scene of unspeakable horror. Neither one of us really wanted to leave the safety of the vehicle to take the pictures we were so willing to take just a few minutes prior. Eventually though, we did take the pictures, and when we got them developed, we found only two pictures had turned out. In the first one, you can see some kind of disturbance in the air towards the rafters, and in the second one, we can definitely see an orb in the area where just a minute before, the unidentified disturbance had manifested itself. A couple of months ago, I was living in a house with similar history as the Hanging Bridge. It was a super old Victorian style home, very big, wide and spacious, multiple rooms. A few things happened that I thought was very spooky. The first incident happened when I was sleeping with my girlfriend in bed. In one of the rooms upstairs, we had an old music box that was in the dining room. It came with the house. I was awoken by the sounds of the music box playing by itself and could see that the door was slightly opened. Needing answers, I hopped out of bed to investigate, not understanding how the music box could play by itself. Needless to say, I made a gigantic mistake. As I opened the door and faced the stairs, I saw a dark shadow move directly up the stairs and then disappear. I froze for a second, almost chickened out, but decided to go downstairs anyway. To my surprise, there was nothing there, and all was silent. The music box had stopped playing. Another time, I was standing in the kitchen with one of my friends, and we were the only two people in the house at this time. We decided to use a spirit box and play with the Ouija board to conduct a session. I was fairly convinced that there was a spirit that needed guidance and was lost. We asked the spirit box multiple questions, but at first, no response was given to us. After nearly an hour, being frustrated, we nearly gave up. That was until we asked the spirit to give us a sign that they were still there. My back started to hurt, like some kind of pressure was being applied to it. I said to the ghost, is that you on my back? Now get this, the spirit box sounded like it said death on the bridge. This immediately startled us, knowing that down the road was the hanging bridge, 
we tried asking it follow-up questions after that. The spirit didn't say anything. And just like that, the pressure on my back disappeared. I was starting to think that the ghost was trying to tell us that they were one of the ghosts that tragically passed on the bridge. The last incident happened in the kitchen. The kitchen door was slightly opened, and all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a girl's whisper in my ear. As I looked towards the door, I saw a lady, I think, walk past the door. At first, I thought it was my friend Laura, who always used to wear jeans. So, I popped my head around the corner to try and scare her, but there was no one there. I wasn't scared, because it was in the middle of the day. I actually found the experience quite exciting, but also unexplainable. To this day, I've always thought these incidents were all related to the hanging bridge. The Job Corps in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was a student there in 1973. Since then, there has been a lot of renovation on the buildings, but when I was attending the Job Corps, it was pretty much the same as it was when it was an orphanage. One night actually at 2am in the morning, when I came back to the dorms after babysitting, I had to walk across the campus to get to my room at the far end of the campus. While walking down to my room, all was very quiet in the dorms. Out of nowhere, I hear what sounded like children laughter in the distance. It was very faint, but I could definitely hear something. Yet, through the faintness of the sound, you could still hear shouts of glee and anger, as little children would do on a playground, if that makes sense. This happened behind the little chapel that was there, but... The sounds came right there from behind the old chapel, and while I looked and squinted, I didn't see anybody there. I thought to myself at the time, why would parents allow their children to play so late outside? It was cold, and it was dark. Meanwhile, my hair was standing on end, and I tested the wind to see if the noise was carried from another place. Noises can carry long distances. There was no wind at all. At the time, I didn't know that the job corps used to be an orphanage until the next morning, when I was talking to my friend about hearing those children. This service worker told me that she used to work there as a service worker for the orphanage. She told me the voices I heard were probably the little children that died of broken hearts while she had worked there, her face went pale as she told me that the children she thought were treated cruelly. There are two versions of this legend that I know. It's called the Devil's Footprint. The first is about a construction worker that was aggravated with a boulder that would not budge. The man stepped on the boulder and said, I will give my soul to the devil, this boulder will move. By the next day, the boulder had moved, and there was an imprint of a human foot and a hoof print of the devil. The man was never seen again. The other version is about a farmer that was having a terrible harvest. He then said, I will give my soul to the devil if I had a bountiful harvest. Indeed, the farmer's harvest was bountiful, and he made plenty of money. The farmer was quite pleased with himself, until the day the devil came to collect. The farmer refused to give the devil what he wanted, and a chase ensued. They ran all around the farmer's land, and the chase ended when they reached a cliff. I believe the footprints happened when they had their final fight at that cliff edge. I've heard many stories about the devil's footprint being haunted. My fiancé told me about a occurrence that happened when he was there with his brothers when he was about 13. 
He said that his brother was contacted by a ghost, according to him, and his brother swears this very day he was standing in front of the church doors, and being a rebellious young man that he was, he attempted to kick the doors open. At the moment his foot hit the door, it swung open and knocked him off the steps. Now, you may be thinking, that there was probably someone on the other side of the door playing a prank. But keep this in mind, the doors open inward, not outward. I also know someone that was there very late at night, and she swears that she saw hooded men walking in the edge of the woods. I myself had an experience of sorts. One night, a friend and I decided to go find the place. We drove and drove, and we couldn't find it. When my friend was so sure she had driven too far, she turned back. We figured we'd better wait until daylight to look for it, so we turned on the road that we thought would take us home. And what did we see? The old cemetery, and that unmistakable white church. Of course, we freaked out. My friend swerved and barely escaped going off the road. By this time, we were both feeling a little unsettling feeling in our chests. Now whether this was due to some unwelcome presence or fear, I'm not certain. I'm assuming the latter. However, needless to say, we didn't stop there that night. My name is Bobby, and I was checking out your website and I decided I should send in my own story. We live in Gross Point Shores, Michigan. This event happened on Monday, August 15th, 2005. One day, my brother named Vince was on the computer at about 4 o'clock when he heard a scream. He ran upstairs to find me and my older brother named Sam. Vince asked what was wrong and we asked him what he was talking about, and he said he heard a woman scream, and we said nobody screamed. We were also the only ones in the house. We got scared, but eventually thought that Vince was probably hearing things, and forgot about it. But a week later, me and Sam saw this website, and decided to check if something was haunting our house. We checked everywhere, but found nothing. But just as we were about to give up, Sam said to me that we never checked the attic. This was the first time that anyone was up there in the attic in a very long time. We got to the attic door and opened up the hatch, and a ladder came unfolded from the top of the door. We started climbing up the ladder and got to the attic, and it was all dark. I felt the wall right behind me and found a light switch. I flipped the switch, and a dim light turned on. There was this old rocking chair rocking back and forth, the one that my grandmother used to have before she died. We totally forgot that we had gotten it and threw it up in the attic. Either way, we were freaked out. After about two seconds, we heard a scream so loud that it knocked me backward against Sam. We climbed as fast as we could down the ladder and shut the attic door. We were so scared that we didn't tell anyone except Vince about what happened. We checked the time and it was exactly 4.06. We now know that Vince heard the scream from the attic a week earlier. All we know about the people that lived here before us is that they were the Andersons and that they were an old couple that lived here and raised their kids here. I don't think it was my grandma's spirit, because she was always a gentle soul and wouldn't scare us like that. Anyway, after all the kids moved out and Miss Anderson died, a short while after that, he sold his house to us about four years ago. I believe Miss Anderson was the one who screamed, I guess she was mad that we stole her house from her.
When I was a freshman in high school, my parents moved us from the city in central New York to a big, empty house in the country. Little did we know that the house is haunted. So many things happened there that even my skeptical dad began to believe that we were sharing the house with someone or something else. My best ghost encounter occurred in the middle of the day. I walked into the bathroom and saw from the corner of my eye someone that I thought was my youngest sister. I said, hey, Lori, but she didn't answer me. Annoyed, I turned to find out what her problem was, only to realize that it wasn't her at the sink. An old woman with gray hair up in a bun, a pink flower dress, and a white apron was drying her hands. She turned to look at me, and then she disappeared. We weren't often frightened of the ghosts and missed them when things seemed to be quiet for too long. We would lament that they didn't like us anymore. One day, I was in the house, and I went into the shower. All of a sudden, there was a huge noise. I thought a plane hit the house, or at least there was a terrible car accident outside. I jumped out, grabbed my rope, and went to investigate. I found nothing out of order at all, so I got back into the shower. Not two minutes later, I heard that huge noise again. I jumped out, shaking this time, and checked everywhere, but again, there was nothing to find. I decided to skip my shower. I had a ghostly nightmare about this house before even moving in. My family moved into the house, and from day one, things were creepy. People before had moved out in a hurry, and their family broke apart almost instantly in four months. They all spread to four different places. When we moved in, we all got terribly sick within the first month. My mom had a life-threatening experience. My sister ran away. All the pets in the house died mysteriously with no known cause of death. My parents divorced. All of this happened in only four months. I walked into the house after school one day and I heard my name being called. I knew no one was home because none of the cars were in the driveway. The voice calling my name sounded exactly like my mother, and I looked all around for her, even though I knew that she was presently in the hospital. Within the next few days, and a few more creepy paranormal events, all four of us left in just as much of a hurry as the one before us, leaving most of our personal belongings. We all split, each of us in a different car, to different places away from each other and away from the house. I will never go back to see it, nor would I wish the haunting of the house on anyone else. Hello. I lived at this house from 97 to 99. It was in Atlanta. My family and many of my friends were witnesses to the occurrences, voices, electronics malfunctioning, dark figures. It happened day and night, but mostly at night. It is an older white home near the river, and for a while, we had a rat problem. The plumbers had left a hole under the bathroom sink. The rats, who were fond of shiny objects, left two human molars, complete with silver fillings, on the bathroom floor on two separate occasions. The back of the home had a foul odor off and on, and the crawl space had been cemented over. I'm an investigator for the state, not a hysteric. But the place made a believer out of me, my family, and half a dozen friends. My then four-year-old son complained of the man in the mirror with a string around his neck. Voices were male and female, also a small child. I have often felt the crawl space needed to be examined. 
just never could figure out a way to ask the officials to do such. I truly think that there is a body, or bodies under that house. Myself and a girlfriend watched as a man-shaped shadow moved across the dining room wall into the kitchen where the light turned on. Well, we're checking out if you can get the new owner's permission. So when I was about 17, my family had just moved back to Canada from living in the USA. It was a bit sudden, and being a family of six, it was a little bit of a scramble to find a place to house all of us before the snow hit. So, my mom and dad decided to live in an old house that my grandpa had on his property, just for the duration of the approaching winter ahead. The house was my great uncle's, and my grandpa skidded from my brother's property to his place. Now my grandpa has two quarter sections, and this house is tucked way back away from the main house, so the powers ran for the main house, and with it being so far away, there is no running water. This house is old, so to add to the running water, there also is in heat, only a wood stove just to give you an idea of where we were living in. Me, being a 17 year old, I often stayed in town and didn't stay there very often. I specifically remember the first time it happened. I was in my bed. I was the only one who would stay downstairs with the wood stove. Everyone wanted to sleep upstairs since it was warmer. So I was just starting to fall asleep and I started to feel the room get really heavy. I remember the feeling of not being alone. The doorway didn't have a door on it. It only had a beaded curtain, and I could feel it standing there. I then remember having the feeling of total fear rush over me and frozen to my core with it. Then, it moved closer, and I felt the bed move, and someone crawl right beside me. Not in a way that was super noticeable, but in a sneaky, slow, sloth-moving type of way. I specifically remember wanting to vomit with fear. Then, I felt it. The feeling of an unshaven face rub against mine. I scrambled out of bed, holding my blanket, and ran up the stairs to my parents' room. I was so out of my mind with fear that I couldn't even scream. I slept on the floor with my dad's side of the bed. The next morning, mom was wondering why her 17-year-old daughter was curled up at the foot of her bed, and I told her what happened. Later that morning, we walked over to my grandpa's house to have breakfast and go chat. My mom brought up my wild story. My grandpa and grandma silently listened as my mom was laughing at the last bit of the story, my grandparents got really serious and turned to each other. Apparently, this has been an issue in the old house and they didn't want to tell us, hoping we didn't acknowledge it, then it wouldn't bother us. I can honestly say it didn't feel angry or upset, it just wanted to cuddle. I didn't stay there much after that. I moved in with a cousin in town. Ghost stories are the most popular types of stories to talk about in the curious world that we live in. Some of us are skeptics, while others truly believe that the supernatural world is real. I truly believe that entities are real, and this is a true story involving my cousin. He didn't see a ghost, but he felt our presence, and is now fully convinced that we are visited by spirits, even though this event happened years ago, and at the time, he was truly skeptical. My cousin is a doctor, and he lives in the USA. A few years ago, he went out of the United States to Vietnam on business ended up visiting Hanoi, Vietnam. 
which is Vietnam's capital city, and stayed in a hotel with his wife at the time. Immediately after entering the hotel, they were both surprised to see a woman sprinting out of her hotel room and screaming bloody murder. It was such a shock to us at the time, it immediately gave them bad vibes about the property. Nobody knew what happened to her, and for a while, she refused to speak to any of the staff about why she felt so horrified or what happened. She looked sickly and pale, as if she had just seen something grisly. She was breathing heavily and hyperventilating. My cousin, out of curiosity, came up to the front desk and asked what happened. The staff said they weren't sure exactly what had happened, but my cousin mentioned that he was a doctor and if they needed assistance, he would be happy to help. After a few minutes had passed, she collected herself. My cousin approached her and had a little chat. She swears that she wasn't just having a wild episode of hallucinations and insisted what she witnessed was real. It was early morning and the sun was barely starting to shine through the windows. The room was still dim and the light was off. The woman had just woken up from her sleep, again still dark, but light enough to see the room. The hotel room she was staying in was massive, and she was in the kitchen making tea. From the kitchen, you can see into the living room. That's when she saw a man standing right next to the bed. It was the ghost of former president, Nuko Dim Dam. He was president of South Vietnam in the early 1960s, who passed away in a very terrible way. She also said that, the night before, she saw a former Vietnam soldier staring at her from the window during the evening. My cousin, being a practical person, kind of dismissed it and advised her to just go home, take some medicine, and relax the rest of the night. Even after she had just calmed down a little, it was obvious she was still visibly shaken by this whole ordeal. My cousin and wife didn't take the room, but there was another couple that checked into the same room. When my cousin woke, he went down to the hotel lobby and noticed just outside the main entrance was an ambulance and a stretcher pulling two bodies into it. He asked front desk attendant what happened. They said, that the couple that checked in mysteriously passed away in their sleep and nobody knew the cause. They suspected it was a heart attack. At this point, my cousin was starting to act a little apprehensive about staying the rest of the week there, but he continued to sleep at this hotel. His mind never let him believe that it was related to the last incident with the previous lady or tied to the paranormal. Until a couple nights later, all was silent. My cousin was a few doors down from the cursed room at the hotel. This is where it gets freaky. It was late at night and my cousin was reading a Vietnamese book when the power started to go off and on. He looked out into the hallway to see if there was anything going on and all seemed okay. He thought that maybe there was a problem with the electricity, so he called the front desk from his room. What he heard over the phone started to finally freak him out. He said that when he picked up the phone, all he could hear was heavy breathing and someone hung up. Concerned, my cousin rushed to the desk. A woman was standing right there. He asked her why she didn't say anything over the phone after he had called. The woman said that he didn't make a call. 
My cousin insisted that he did, that he heard heavy breathing, and that someone else was on the other line, but the woman refused to accept his story. He also said that the lights flickered, and the woman began to grow pale. She urged him to bless his room, because there is something evil, and it's disturbing the room. My cousin refused, saying that it was just a coincidence. Finally, a few minutes later, his wife screams. My cousin rushes to the room and asks her what happened. She tells him that she was walking out of her room when she heard voices talking as if the chatter were coming from inside the hotel room where the couple had passed away. The doctor then demand the staff open the room, but to their surprise, nobody was there. The staff even claimed that when they went into the room, the bathroom door was open and a dark shadow moved out of the bathroom and then disappeared. My cousin still dismissed everything. He said that things were just chaotic because of the first lady that stayed in the room and everyone was on edge because of the death of the couple in the same room. He admitted it still creeped him out, but chalked it up to merely a very scary coincidence. However, if it were a coincidence, then how can anyone explain what happened in that room? It seemed to be the only room having issues, aside from the one my cousin was staying in, where he heard the voice over the phone. Either way, this was a pretty insane experience, and I don't know how I would have reacted if I was the one who was there instead of my cousin. I don't remember the year that this happened, nor the age that I was. I still remember it though, as if it were yesterday. So. My aunt just got a new computer. She was never a technology ace or anything, so she had no idea how to get it started. When all else fails, call my mother. My mom was a whiz at computers, so my aunt asked her to come over and hook up the darn thing. My mother, being the lovely lady that she is, agreed to do it within the week. It was actually that weekend that she decided to do it. So, mom decides she wants to go over my aunt's house, kind of late for some reason. I was very young and couldn't stay by myself, so she took me along since calling a babysitter at the last minute would be very rude. We finally got there. I look up at the house, admiring its large size. I did think it looked pretty scary though. We struggled getting inside because my mom couldn't see the keys. As soon as we did get inside, I was frightened. All of the lights were off and nobody was there. Or so I thought. My mom wanted to get started with her work since it was maybe 9 o'clock already. She told me to stay upstairs and watch TV while she was in the basement hooking up the computer. After a while of whining and staying upstairs all alone in the large house, I totally agreed. My mother stayed with me for about five minutes, showing me how to work the TV. I begged and pleaded for her not to go, but it was her duty as a sister to fix the computer. She finally went downstairs, and I was left alone in the huge living room. I decided to turn on the cartoons, thinking it would cheer me up a little. I finally started to calm down and even laughed at the silliness of the cartoons. Then, all of a sudden, I heard the loud noises in the kitchen. Apparently, my mom didn't hear it, and to me, she was God, so anything she said went. After she said nothing, I proceeded to ignore the noise, but then it happened again. I ignored it. It happened again. 
I ignored it again. It happened once more. By that time, I was so annoyed at the noise because it was disturbing my cartoons. I was so mad, I forgot my rule about my mom, and I jumped up from the couch, turned around, and almost yelled, shut up. When I saw this mist in the kitchen, it seemed like it was in the shape of an elderly woman with a long white dress and long white hair. I was so shocked, I couldn't scream. So I ran as fast as my little legs could carry me downstairs into the basement and into my precious mother's arms. I didn't tell her what happened as I was still in shock, awe, oh, and amazement at the creature that had stood before me. I only explained about the noises. She said she was hearing little noises, not loud noises, around where she was. I stayed down there with her because she said I could, especially when she saw my little white face. As I was sitting on the couch, playing with numerous toys that were scattered about, I heard a soft bark. Then I heard a whimper, and then another soft bark. I knew it was coming from the room that held the water tank and such. I thought about the dog, Oreo. It must have been him. But then I remembered he died about a couple months before. My aunt and uncle at the time owed no animals, not even a bird, and it was way too late for someone to let their dog out. Besides, I don't think I would have hurt a dog, as I don't believe anyone in the community even owned one. What frightened me the most was that poor little Oreo, a dog that had been banished to live outside for no reason and was never fed, died on the ground right above where I had heard the noise. I told my mom about this. She said that she heard nothing. I told her to hurry up with the computer, which she did because she was hearing things too. We both ran up the steps and out the door. After we looked, we ran to the car and got in. I was scared because the car was not starting up. Then all of a sudden, it did. I was so happy to be out of there. My cousin had heard noises such as the one I had heard in the kitchen, except they were outside of the room. Also, my other cousin claims that he heard a noise in the oven, like something was in it. He opened the oven, and nothing was there, but he swears to this day, he did hear something. Now, I mentioned in the title of this story, that this was a traveling ghost. I say this because most, if not all, of that family's houses have had some sort of scariness to them. My cousin's current residence is just as haunted. Doors will open and close by themselves. One time, we were watching a movie. It was over, and I wanted to turn the lights on. When I turned them on, I heard a strange buzzing sound in the laundry room. It sounded like when the dryer is done trying clothes, only it was a steady, non-pausing sound. I walked over to the doors and started to put my ear up to make sure the sound was coming from that room. As I did so, all of the lights went off and the DVD player suddenly turned on, much louder than we had it on, but the thing was, the DVD player had been turned off the whole time. When everything came on, I jumped five feet into the air onto my poor cousin, where I proceeded to scratch her neck, holding on for dear life. I don't remember ever watching a movie down there ever again. Later, we asked his mom if she was doing laundry. She asked why, and we told her about the sound. She said she didn't even think about doing a load of laundry. To this day, I'm still scared to stay over my cousin's house. When my sister and I were young, we lived in a newer duplex in California. 
It was a small place with only two bedrooms, so my sister and I had to share a room. We had our beds on opposite walls, but they both faced the hall. On one side of the hall was my parents' bedroom, on the other was the bathroom, and in the middle of the ceiling was a big square fluorescent light. I think that's where it lived. I can't exactly remember when it started. All I remember is waking up in the middle of the night and seeing what I remember as the electricity man. It seemed to come out of the light, which my parents left on to help us sleep. It looked like a person, but seemed to be made from the light. This happened several times over the next few years we lived in the duplex. I never told anyone about what happened until about 15 years later. My sister and I had come to visit my parents. We were all sitting in the living room talking about our childhood when my sister had asked if I would remembered anything strange about the duplex. I asked what she meant by strange. She asked if I had ever seen anyone in the wall. I then told her about my experience with the electric man. Turns out, she saw the same thing. This is an old story, pushed out of my mind for years and years. It was 1964-65. I was four or five years old. Our family, because of my mother's recurrent mental illness, bounced around from apartment to apartment, from shelter to shelter, with or without one or both of our parents in tow. There were four of us. I do not recall if any of my siblings were with me when this happened. It might have been at a foster parent's house. I just don't know. I remember sitting on the side of a small cot in the waning light of a Chicago winter. There was an odd, really dark shadow on the wall to the left of me. It was the size of a small man, and I stared, and I stared in disbelief because it had a hat on and was in profile. The outline of the lips, the nose, the forehead was perfect. I was a pro at discerning what was real and what was not real even at that age because of my mother's problem. And I tell you, I knew that what I was seeing was real, that I was not asleep and that no shadow could have occurred that so accidentally duplicated the perfection of the human figure that I saw before my eyes. We stared at each other for a very long time, the figure never moving. I never told a soul, as I didn't want to be thrown in a loony bin too. This is the first of many encounters of the years. My mother had the gift. My sister really has it, much more than I. About 18 years ago, I was in the Jacksonville Cemetery with my husband and three-year-old son. We were reading headstones. I believe it was in June or July. The sun was out and there was not a cloud in the sky. As we were walking through the headstones, we saw a woman walk through the trees. Both my husband and I saw her. We thought there was something odd about her, but couldn't figure out what exactly, though. We were walking towards her, and she was probably about 80 yards away. She was walking away from us and stepped behind a tree. Then, we didn't see her again. I said to my husband, where did that woman go? He said, she stepped behind the tree. We continued to walk towards the spot where we saw her. All of a sudden, rain poured down on our heads. We both looked up into the blue sky and water continued to drench us. We ran back towards the car 
and it was like the rain just disappeared. We got back to our car, and we were all soaking wet. The sky was still blue. We left right away. Hello, my name is Wanda. I've experienced a few things in my lifetime. This one recently, not scary or anything, but just strange. I lost a pet two years ago when he was still a puppy. Bernie got hit by a car and died all alone in the road while at my mother's care. I came home from work and we buried him. My brother and I loved him so much I painted a stone on his grave that I'd done one year. Well, like I said, that was two years ago, and twice recently, I've experienced the oddest sensations. Both times I was laying in my bed trying to fall asleep, when I felt something like little feet walking on my leg and settling in down around my knee area, like a cat curling up or a small dog. It felt so real, but I tried to explain it away, thinking maybe my circulation was doing something weird in my leg. Then a couple weeks later, it happened again. It walked up my leg and curled up on my knee area. This time, I had no delusions. I was sure it was Bernie, came back to lay down and be with me. Since then, I shared my experience with a girlfriend, and she claims that when she spent the night here on my couch, she felt the same thing. We even got a ghost picture. My sister's dog was here, and my friend Yuri took a picture with her disc camera of the dog, and there is a big white circular mass over the dog, with what looks to be a foot appearing, or taking shape rather. I've no doubt it's Bernie, and he's been playing with that dog even as spirit. Sign me up as a believer. Yours truly. I've experienced quite a bit throughout my life when it comes to the paranormal, and it all started at my old childhood house. It was a three bedroom, one bathroom home in Garden Grove, California. If you were to drive by, and look at this house. It's cute, and it's a little home in a good environment. However, the things I've experienced spark my interest and curiosity about the afterlife. Everything in every room in the house felt awkward whenever I walked into it. I shared the middle bedroom with my younger brother, who was only four at the time. Once a month, I would have a nightmare of a girl sitting on her picket fence with red eyes aglow, staring at me with such a playful expression. She didn't seem happy that her family was there. Nonetheless, us kids. The strange part about that was, whenever I would have these awful dreams, I would wake up to find my little brother crying as if someone had really hurt him. I never really took the nightmare seriously though. We had an old, rusty swing set that we loved so much. I was only 10 at the time. During the daytime, everything would be fine and no strange feelings would occur. However, once nighttime falls, our backyard would be off limits. My mom wouldn't let us go to the back and play on summer nights and she, well, never told us why. One night, my mom forgot to turn off the water hose so she kindly asked me if I would do it for her. The idea of it was already bothering me, but I didn't take anything paranormal into consideration. So, I went down, straight to the back of the house, and the walk there felt like eternity itself. I had a strong, eerie feeling that I was being watched and even followed. I bent down to turn off the hose and had a fear so strong that it made me tear up. I ran into the house and swore never to do the favor for my mother again. What made this incident particularly eerie was the fact that I swear I heard a sobbing. It was like in my mind, but I swear it was outside. 
and another awkward time. My mom was taking a shower, and I was in my room watching TV with my little brother. I heard her call my name, so I came to see what she wanted. She asked if I could go to the towel cabinet and grab her one. When I did, I walked up to the door in pure darkness, and I swear I saw a ghostly hand, but it was still a woman's hand with red fingernails. I immediately thought it was my mom's hand at first. The strange thing was, it was translucent, like I said, a ghostly hand. But I mean, you could see right through this person's hand. So, naive as I was, I thought I said mom, and instinctly handed her the towel. The towel dropped to the ground, and the hand disappeared. My mom then opened the door and looked at me, saying, Barbara, what are you doing, honey? That's when I told her I was giving you the towel you wanted. My mom looked at me with such confusion and said, You know I was in the kitchen, right? When I look back at that instance, I know it terrifies me now. But at that moment, I was simply not afraid. I just chalked it up to something non-paranormal. And maybe my eyes were just playing tricks on me. But at that moment, it was pretty obvious that I was both hearing and seeing things come to life. Paranormal things at that. There was much more that went on in that house. Such as, if you are sitting in a living room watching TV, at the corner of your eye, you will see a dark figure walking up to the front door. Immediately, you would assume someone was here. So... You trot over to the door to find that no one is there. It happens almost every week to everyone in my family. I love that house, but I didn't love being followed or the feeling of being watched while taking a bath. After spending most of my childhood in that house, we moved to another city nearby. Now this house is quite dramatic. I'm 19 years old now and I lived in Georgia for three years to finish up school. Coming back, strange activities started happening, especially in my new room. My grandfather passed away three years ago, and my room used to be his room. At night, getting home from my boyfriend's house, I would hear the floor creaking. I just assumed there was someone walking around, but to find that no one was out there at all, I remember one night laying on my bed with the lights out and just the TV glaring. I fell asleep and woke up to see a pair of transparent, veiny legs pointing in my direction. I knew immediately who they belonged to. Grandpa. Grandpa was watching over me and that didn't and still doesn't scare me. But there's another presence in the house. A girl. I assume. I came one night from staying at my boyfriend's the previous night. I left the door open because I was planning on changing and going to say hi to my parents. While changing, I have a habit of looking at the door to see if anyone will walk by and see me change. So, I looked a few times and when I looked the last time, at the right side of my door, I swear I saw the apparition of a girl, her bright blue eyes, glowing and bulging right at me through the crack of the door. The eyes then disappeared. I trotted to the door, looked to my right, and nobody was there. Just then, it was my teenage cousin, Diane, but I looked towards the left, the left side of the hallway, and there she was. I was absolutely freaked out in that moment. Well, those were some documented instances of my family's paranormal history. I hope for future sake that I never have to experience any of this again, even though the first few incidences weren't that scary. And even my grandpa incident, yeah, I wasn't scared. However, if it were any kind of other ghost, like the one I was just talking about, I might be a little bit more frightened.
I'd like to refer to this haunting as the haunting in Duxbury, Vermont. We bought the house from the niece of Leo Morse in the fall of 1999. Leo lived here his entire life. Shortly after we moved in, we heard strange footsteps on the second floor when we knew no one was up there. During one such incident, my husband, myself, my two children, and a couple friends heard someone walking across the floor in the upstairs bedroom as we all stood in the living room below. One night, when I was taking a bath and was lying back in the tub with my eyes closed, I suddenly felt very uneasy, like someone was staring at me. I looked behind me to where the door was and saw this transparent mist, and it disappeared within a second. The door creaked open just an inch, and I screamed my head off. My son, while still in high school, had similar experiences of being watched by someone who couldn't be seen. Our television has also turned on by itself on more than one occasion. Our channels have changed, with the remote sitting out of everyone's reach. In the fall of 2007, my husband had just walked upstairs to go to our bedroom. When I heard him hollering at someone and asking him what he wanted, we all ran upstairs to where my husband stood in the doorway to our bedroom. He was staring at the back wall of the other bedroom, pointing to no one and yelling, tears in his eyes, for someone who no one else could see to get out. This lasted for several minutes until the man, who my husband said was in his early 30s, brown hair, clean shaven with round, wire frame glasses, dressed in a flannel shirt, and blue jeans with the bottoms of the legs rolled into cuffs, disappeared. It was a very restless night that night, and my husband, who is not drunk or on drugs, and isn't prone to hallucinations, doesn't like to talk about it much, but is very adamant that it truly happened. We haven't had any more sightings since then, but I still hear footsteps and unexplainable bangs and thumps coming from upstairs every morning after I get up, and I know my husband is still sound asleep in our room. My name is Andrea, I'm from New Mexico, and I'm 17. I've had numerous experiences throughout my life with the paranormal. I'll start from the beginning, I suppose. Before moving to Deming back in 2000, I lived in Hatch, which is about an hour away. We used to live in what was called the White Brick House, near the park, and not even a half mile from the schools. Hatch is very small. Anyway, living in the house was my mom, my very abusive dad, who I call Alex. I don't even call him dad. My two-year-old sisters, and my older brother, and me, the youngest. I don't remember the experiences in any specific order, but I remember them as if they happened yesterday. They are all very true. Believe if you want. We had a certain room called the back bedroom that no one really liked to go to, at least not alone. This room had an extremely strong presence in it, and it was only when you entered it you could feel its presence. You could stand in the doorway and look in the bedroom and feel nothing, but as soon as you stepped, that all changed. You feel like you're being watched by one great evil spirit or a great number of evil spirits. You would have to leave, it was so uncomfortable. We couldn't even get any of the dogs that we had throughout the time we lived there to enter that room. While there was that room, there was also other things that happened in the rest of the house. One night, my mom swears up and down this happened, and so does Alex. They were getting along. The rare occasion, I love these nights. My mom put all four of us to bed. So her and Alex had some alone time and were relaxing together in the spa, talking one night. In the middle of their conversation, both my mom and Alex saw the shadow of someone walk past the doorway of the spa room. My mom thought it was one of us that had gotten up in the night 
and went to check in on us, only to find us all snoring in bed. Her and Alex then asked us the next morning if we had gotten up, and none of us had. Another time, me and my oldest sister were playing in what we called the second kitchen that had a room off called the craft room. My mom paints ornaments in there. We suddenly smelled a strong perfume that didn't smell like any perfume made today. Then we heard a conversation between maybe four or five people. We looked in and saw five older upper class people in clothes from the early 1900s time. I remember one man specifically. He was bald with a brown beard and a looking glass eyepiece like the rich people will wear back in the day. He was wearing a black penguin tailed suit with a white button up underneath. He looked somewhat pale but not very transparent. He turned his head slowly and looked straight at me, not my sister, and nodded his head. Shortly after, he continued to speak with his company. I ran to my room and stayed there for the rest of the day. We had an organ in the living room along with a drum set and Alex's guitars. We were all musicians. Amps would turn on even when they were unplugged. The organ played as though a very experienced pianist were playing it. Piano was one thing none of us really learned how to play, so it was obvious none of us was playing it. There were times when the dogs would follow something we couldn't see down the hallway to my room and Alex's room. My older brothers one night got up to get a drink of water in the second kitchen, and that's where the laundry room also was. He's 22 years old now, and still swears this is true. He saw a tall figure standing by the washer and dryer near the back bedroom, and he felt it as an evil being. It just stood there, glaring at him, but never moved, as if it was frozen, but with the evil expression looking at him wherever he moved. He figured it was Alex. He shouted out Alex's name, but didn't hear a response, so he figured he was mad and went back to bed. The next morning he asked Alex why he was so mad at him. Alex just looked at him and said he was at the bar. My other sister said she was walking by the back bedroom one night and swear she saw a black figure out of the corner of her eye standing straight up against the wall and it tried to grab her with its arms but couldn't reach as if it was restrained. After Alex left, we moved out of the house and into a little apartment. There's only been one thing that has ever happened to me there. I got up in the middle of the night to get something to drink and as I was going back to my room, I saw what looked like a little blue orb glowing in intense blue. It moved around for a few minutes before ultimately dissipating into thin air. Aside from these apartments we lived in, we also moved into a trailer not too far from the white brick house. This house was always said to be haunted because the man who used to live there died of a heart attack in either the yard or the bathtub and he had two dogs that died of mysterious causes after he did. It was almost as if they died of a broken heart. There would be nights when we could hear the clicking sounds of a dog's nail on the tiles. I was in my room reading one night when my whole dresser just fell over. No reason for it just to fall over. My friend and I, Rosario, and my sister were all in the living room one night when we heard a window shatter come from my room. We never found a single shard of broken glass in the house or even outside even though the sound came from inside. Finally, I would always see the shadow of someone walk into the laundry room and no one would be there when I looked. All of these incidents were fairly alarming to all of us and I'm convinced that they were being followed by the same evil spirit that resided in the red brick house. These days, I never experienced any hauntings and I'm very glad that this is all over. In the fall of 2001, my parents bought an old Victorian house in a quiet suburb. It was a huge relief for us 
because that year was a very tumultuous time for our family. We couldn't find a house that was affordable, and nearly every house we found in the area was either in need of major repairs or super expensive. When we moved into this home, there had been mumblings around town that nobody wanted it due to its supposed hauntings. By the way, I'm 21. The house had a history of violence and death. The city is very safe now, but years ago, it was considered one of the worst cities to live in. It was said that a man who had lived his entire life as a loner took up residence in the house in the early 1920s. One night, he apparently hired a prostitute to stay the night with him. She was unaware that he had no money to pay her for her services. He led her into the kitchen, playing off that he had some spare cash lying around the house. He ultimately ended up strangling her to death and chopping up her body. He was apprehended months later and ended up dying in prison. When the cops questioned him, all he could say was that he needed love. In the first months, we had stereotypical noises that any house would make and dismissed it as nothing more than just noises. However, doors would open and close, lights would flicker on and off, and there was this funky odor that always seemed to linger throughout the house. It was very hard to describe, but it smelled a lot like rotten eggs on a very subtle level. The most terrifying thing that occurred was when I was in the kitchen in the middle of the night. It was about 11 p.m., and I had just come home from work and entered the front hallway of the house at first. That's when I heard whispers, which sounded like the word lonely. I figured I was just exhausted from a long day's labor, so I decided I needed to get to bed. But before I did, I fixed myself something to eat in the kitchen. I walked into the kitchen, but that's when I heard moaning sounds, almost like someone was struggling. As I sat on the chair by the kitchen table, I saw the transparent figure of a woman with an anguished look on her face. She appeared for a few moments, then disappeared. She looked like she was from another era and wore all black. Her face looked disfigured and beaten. It terrified the living hell out of me, so I ran upstairs to get my parents. I guess I just needed some comforting, and I found out they weren't home yet. There were other incidents that occurred in the house. My mom actually told me that she was in the laundry room, when she could distinctly hear the sounds of a growling man in the laundry room late at night. This was something that seemed to happen quite frequently around the same time and always only in the laundry room, nowhere else. It was never something really loud and startling. It was always faint, but insanely scary. There were times that we would see two shadows in the corner of our eyes, constantly walk back and forth from the kitchen to the living room. Again, this was subtle. When anybody would actually turn to directly look, these shadows would be gone. Most of the time, we always thought it was just our eyes playing tricks on us, and even after my incident, I still thought that. Anyway, that's my story. It might not be too exciting compared to others, but it is creepy and insane. I'm glad I don't live in that house anymore. Sadly, my parents still do, but it seemed that nothing happens anymore, besides the subtle doors creaking open slowly from time to time and the continuation of lights flickering. Thanks for reading. I feel kind of silly writing this, since I haven't talked much about it since it happened. I'm 17 now, and still can't come up with any explanation other than spirits. I've always been a believer, and hope to one day have my own encounter with ghosts. I never thought it would be as terrifying as it was, Eight years ago, summer of 2000, my dad's family was having a reunion, and we all decided we would stay at Oak Island Beach in North Carolina. I'm not sure if that is the exact name. I know it was something to do with Oak in it. The week we were there, the weather was very fickle, 
It rained most days, and the sun was only out three or four times. Most of our time was spent indoors. My parents, sister, and grandparents shared one condo. My dad's brother and sister and her family shared another, and his step-siblings were in the third with their children. One night, while it was storming, my cousin Josh and I went to the condo to play video games and watch TV. Everyone else was in our condo, playing cards and drinking. We played Dino Crisis in an X-Men game and decided to watch cartoons after about an hour. We spent another couple of hours just goofing off when the storm really started picking up. We were sitting on the couch, talking and laughing, when we heard a creak on the balcony outside. Neither of us is scared easily now, and we weren't then either. I looked out of the sliding doors, but everything was pitch black. We went back to our conversation and had no interruptions for a couple of minutes. When a bolt of lighting lit up the beach, we saw a man standing on the balcony dressed in a trench coat. He seemed to be looking out at the sea. It all happened so suddenly, we didn't believe what we saw. No matter how skeptical we were, we weren't about to go and check like I had with the noise. After a couple of minutes, we noticed the door was fogging up. Not the entire thing, just a little patch about six feet off of the floor. We were very spooked now, during the next bolt of lightning, we both saw the man standing against the door, looking in on us. He screamed, and I screamed, and we jumped over the couch, headed for the door. We yanked it open, and as we did, we heard the sound of glass breaking. We didn't look back, just ran across the parking lot to the other condo. When we came in, we were soaked and out of breath. Our parents started the freak, asking us what was wrong. When I told them, they just laughed and brushed it off. We kept begging them to call someone, but they refused. After about a minute, they got fed up with it. They grabbed us and their umbrellas and dragged us over there. When we went in, the place was just as we left it. The door was intact and no one was on the balcony not even a footprint. I know I didn't imagine it. I believe that the spirit was drawn to me for some reason. My cousin has had no other experiences that he has told me about, and I've had quite a few, but not as intense as the first. Anyone that has had a similar experience, know that you are not alone. Finding the sight has opened my eyes to the world of ghosts, and those that have been affected by them. Thanks. My Aunt Terry, from my father's side, lived in Oklahoma. When I was about 16, she came here to Memphis, and she told me about a house that she lived in. She said that when her husbands and kids moved in, there was a barn out back, and she said when she walked in there, there was an upside down pentacle on the barn floor. After she saw that, she never went back out there. One night, when everyone went to bed, my Aunt Terry heard the dogs barking in the kitchen. She went into the kitchen and watched her dog bark at a corner in the room. The next night she went to bed and the TV in the living room came on by itself and she said it did it every night. So one night, she decided to unplug the TV, and she went to bed as normal, and the TV still came on. Then another day, after everyone ate dinner, they were all sitting in the living room. My aunt looked out the window and saw a pair of red eyes. Her husband saw them too, and it really freaked them out. On yet another night, my aunt and uncle and the kids were leaving to go see a movie. And on the porch stood a beast with red eyes, and half his body was human, 
but the rest of him was like an animal. She described his hands and feet as hoofs. Well, after they got home that night, my aunt and uncle made the kids sleep with them, and Catherine started to get really sick. When my aunt and uncle tried to take her to the hospital, the car wouldn't start, so they had to push the car all the way down the street, and it started right up. The doctors couldn't find out what was wrong with Catherine. My aunt and uncle decided to move, and every morning the car wouldn't start when my aunt had to go to work until my uncle pushed it down the street. After my aunt and uncle found a new place to live, when they got everything they owned out of the house, Catherine got better immediately, and the car never gave them a problem, and the TV never came on by itself again. Some strange occurrences, but I swear they're true. Thanks for reading. The Hampton Inn on Warner Road, off Route 279, has a haunted room, which is number 417. My husband stayed in this room while on a business trip in March 2008. He frequently stays at this hotel while in Maryland, but never had an experience like this until he stayed in room 417. This was his room for three nights, and for the first two nights, he was very restless and didn't sleep well, which was not a normal occurrence for him. On the third restless night, he realized that he was hearing noises inside the room, not from adjoining rooms. These noises were hangers moving around in the closet, the refrigerator door opening, noises from the bathroom, and the sound of glass being set on the nightstand next to the bed. Final thing that really spooked him was that something grabbed his side as he laid on the bed, trying to ignore the sounds and fall asleep. He was not imagining any of this. He could still feel the sensation of his side after jumping out of bed. He looked around the room and checked the deadbolt lock on the door and all was secure. He considered packing and checking out, but it was 3 a.m. He finally fell asleep and checked out the next morning. He has since stayed at the hotel and was offered the same room upon check-in, but he refused it. The hotel clerk wanted to know why, but he didn't want to sound foolish and wouldn't elaborate on his experience. For the record, he didn't believe in ghosts or spirits until this happened. We believe that someone must have died in this room, heart attack or something, and their spirit is trapped there. We dare anyone to stay in this room. It is creepy. Last year, I was living in apartments on the far northwest side of town in Chicago, Illinois, and had one experience in an apartment that for the most part was pretty quiet, but for this experience. I lived in a frighteningly active apartment on the northeast side before this occurrence, so this didn't really totally freak me out, but I was sitting in my living room on the couch reading. The sun was reflecting through the blinds, which I halfway closed, in the TV, which was directly in front of me, and perhaps 8 to 10 feet away, was off. I sat reading for quite some time, and at one point, looked up and into my reflection on the TV screen. Sitting a few inches from me was a woman with a page boy hairdo, perhaps in her early 40s, with glasses on. I could see her curves as she sat, so there was no mistake that she was a woman. I turned instantly to my left side, irrationally expecting to see someone sitting next to me in my locked down apartment where I knew no one but myself had been the entire day. No one was there of course. I looked back into the TV reflection again and she was no longer there. May I point out that there was absolutely nothing in that apartment that could have made such a reflection. I was on the second story, so there was nothing inside that could have reflected that way, no nearby trees, etc. It was a bona fide experience. There was this one terrifying experience though, that has haunted me ever since, 
while being in the apartment. I was sitting in the bathroom, doing my business, as usual. I left the door open because I felt very uncomfortable with the door closed. I don't know why, it just gave me that feeling. I saw that same lady, early 40s style, with the page boy hairdo, right outside the door. It was like she was fixated on me, and she appeared momentarily, just staring at me. Although the bathroom light was obviously on, the hallway outside the door was pretty dim so you could just barely make out the outline of her face and her body. There were some slight changes with her this time. The only difference being this time was that she looked like she was in some kind of nun outfit. It was really creepy. This was the moment where I was terrified. I didn't know what to think. She kind of looked like Mother Teresa in a way. It also looked like she was trying to open her mouth, but somehow couldn't like she was unable to speak or something. Maybe she was in danger. Just like that, she disappeared. And later on in that day, I also saw Orb float around. It was pretty eerie. For the record, this was a highly Polish neighborhood and had been for years. So I have a feeling it was some old Polish lady that couldn't leave her building. I lived there for a year and am now gone. I also have a theory that because she is Polish, that she was wearing the nun attire due to her religion. You see, Polish people are Roman Catholics usually, so it all made sense to me at the time when I thought about it. Thanks for reading. I had a personal experience at this bed and breakfast, and it was so exciting. A friend of mine and I were staying in this B&B, the Henderson House, while we visited her daughter at a nearby Baptist University, where she is a cheerleader. We stayed in the downstairs guest bedroom by the dining room. When we arrived, they were setting up for a big sit-down dinner and reception with round tables covered in white tablecloths. It was a big affair that went on for a while, while we were at a football game. When we arrived back at the B&B later that night, it was late, and the staff was cleaning up and putting up the tables. They apologized for making so much noise, and said that they'd be finishing up for the next hour or so, washing the tablecloths and putting them away. We were exhausted, so we each took a shower, and my friend crawled into this beautiful mahogany bed, and I pulled out the sleeper sofa and settled in, and watched TV for a little while. Finally, it quieted down somewhat out in the parlor, so we turned off the lights and immediately fell asleep. I woke up some time earlier as three women in gowns brushed by my bed, carrying things. We had gotten quite friendly with the innkeeper and her staff earlier, so I really didn't think that much about it and wondered why they had put things away in our room before morning. The next morning, I asked my friend what the women were doing in her room the night before. She said, what women? No one came in here. And she motioned towards the door where the deadbolt was still locked. She went out to the dining room for breakfast a little before I did. And as I was walking out into the hall, she walked up to me and said, come here, the owner has something to tell you. When I walked into the kitchen, the owner looked up and said, So, you saw them, huh? I told her I saw three women in gowns, and she said, They are dressed in wedding and bridesmaid dresses. She then walked into the parlor and opened the big old photo album and turned to the page that showed a wedding party lined up on the staircase. It was them. They are seen from time to time, getting ready for a ceremony. And the bedroom where we stayed at was once a porch that leads around to the front of the house. Because it is a Baptist college, they don't promote these ghost stories as the college frowns on it. But she said many people see them. There is also a ghost of a captain, army or sea, I didn't quite get. But he haunts an upstairs room with a big bay window and is seen often too. 
It was not a frightening thing. I loved it, in fact, and hoped to go back again. They were not see-through people, and had I reached out, I could have touched their dresses. Maybe. In the year 2000, my husband and I moved to LaGrange, Georgia, to a fairly new apartment on Old Airport Road. His job had transferred him from New Hampshire, and he was able to be on a five-day shift, five on and five off. That meant he would not be home every other week, as he was a truck driver for a major store chain. Anyway, after being there a month or so, we decided that it was a great little town to settle down in, and began looking for a house. During this time, we had no incidents at the apartment. After another two months of searching, we finally found the house we wanted. It was a three-bedroom ranch with a small underground pool located in a rural part of LaGrange. When our offer was accepted, we were ecstatic. This is when my four-year-old son began falling out of bed at night something he had neither done before or after living at this apartment. Eventually, this led him to waking up in the middle of the night, and I would have to go in and confront him, which was usually fairly easy to do, and he'd go back to sleep, only to wake up later again in the night. When I put them to bed, I would sit in the hallway between both of their doors. Daughter's bedroom was at the end of the hall, which was about 10 feet long, but their doors were close together. I would have all the lights off, except the hallway, and once they were asleep, I'd go and get on the PC in the dining room, adjacent to their hallway. This hallway had a bathroom at the opposite end of the bedrooms, and a laundry closet, where my washing machine were. One night, my son insisted I lay with him in bed, so I laid down behind him, closest to his closet, with him closest to the door. My eyes were closed, and we were both resting quietly, when suddenly, he half sat up in bed, and said, who is that? Naturally, I asked, what do you mean? He said a woman in a long skirt just walked by his bedroom door, and headed to his sister's room. Of course, this is the week my husband's gone, so I'm alone in the apartment, thinking someone must have broken into our second floor apartment. So I got up and looked. My daughter, who is nine years old, thankfully was sound asleep, so I checked her room, closet, and under her bed to make sure no one was in there. I questioned my son again, and he said no one passed back by his door, and there's no exit from my daughter's room, just right by my son's room. I brought both kids to sleep in my bed on the other side of the apartment that night. Another night, I sat in the hall again until they were both asleep. Now keep in mind, all the lights are off except the hall, which includes their big walk-in closets. No lights on. When they were both sleeping, I got up and used their bathroom at the end of their hall. While in there, I heard what sounded like a toy hitting the wall in my son's closet which shared a wall with the bathroom. Thinking that he woke up and started playing, which was not like him at all, by the way, I went to his room to find him sleeping cozily, but the closet door halfway open and the light inside open. Okay, so now I'm freaked out because I know that the door was closed and the light was off, and yes, his bed's right next to that closet. So yeah, I took them into my room again. Again, on another night, my son wakes up again, but this time my husband's home, and we're all asleep in our own beds. I can hear my son crying, so I go to comfort him, but he's not there. My husband and I can't find him, but he's still crying, sobbing, a terrified cry actually. In a minute or two, we find him hiding under the sink in the bathroom at the end of his hallway. He told us the mean lady won't let him pass. He had tried to come in her room, but she stood in front of him. Again, he described her exactly the same. Long skirt, hair up behind her head, and she makes faces at him. Now I know for a fact I'm dealing with a ghostie here, 
a husband thinks I'm just going nuts and putting stories in the kid's head. My daughter, meanwhile, never notices any of this and is not disturbed. While on the computer one night, late around 2 a.m., I hear three distinct loud knocks under my feet, one on the left in the small kitchen, one directly below my feet, and one to my right. Sounded like someone downstairs used a broom to knock on the ceiling in extremely rapid succession. I sincerely doubt that anyone can move as quickly in the downstairs apartment and get by the furniture they undoubtedly had there, just as I had mine arranged. I know for a fact the lady and her kids were in bed by 10 at night. So the bank has decided that they will give us a loan on any house in LaGrange, except that one, because it's rural. So we try another place and another. One night, I'm sleeping and have a more vivid than any other dream I've ever had. Kind of like a dream nightmare. In it, we live in the house and I'm looking for my son, only to find him floating face down in the pool. I woke up crying and made up my mind that there's no way I'm ever moving into the house. So now I must convince hubby, who thinks I'm nuts anyway, and is determined to get to the house. Well, having bought a puppy when we started looking for a house, this collie is now almost fully grown size, but he still has accidents, so we keep him penned in the kitchen with a large baby gate. When we go out, this doggy somehow gets past the gate by pushing a corner or whatever, and is running around our apartment. So one night, we're going out to dinner, and Hubby and I lock up Poochie and set two high back dining chairs against the gate. Keep in mind, our apartment is carpet, thick, and plush everywhere, except the kitchen. When we return, Hubby is looking at me from my kid's hallway, and the gate is still exactly as we left it, and the chairs are too. Not one thing had moved, but somehow, according to Lovey Hubby, I'm supposed to believe the dog vaulted over the chair backs and somehow landed without killing himself or breaking my dining room table, which was a mere foot or two from the chairs. Yeah, okay. My downstairs neighbor's kids told me that their mom was upset because I let my kids run around my apartment, banging at all hours of the night, mostly after 10 p.m., and she can't believe I let my kids stay up so late. She has to get up early, yada yada yada. Except, my kids are in bed every night at 9 o'clock, and asleep no later than 9.30ish. I see a shape leaning out of the kitchen door, watching me as I watch TV and tell it, come sit by me and leave my son alone. It didn't sit with me, but it didn't bother my son that night. I never noticed my dog noticing anything. The only cold spot in the house was the kids' hallway, and not always, just mostly. Hubby slept in son's room one day, in the afternoon, and, even though we had central air, complained that he sweat like a hog, and had the worst nightmares ever, but the place still isn't haunted, and yes, he steadfastly refused to ever sleep in there again. I saw blinds move on their own, doorknobs that rattled when I was alone, in the place, and no, it wasn't a teeny shake caused by some truck rumbling by, which was there some 50 to 100 feet between the side of our apartment and the road. This was a defined and voracious shaking, a definitive hello, I'm trying to open the door, but no one in the apartment but me. Finally, my husband grew tired of trying to get a loan for that house, and mysteriously, everything stopped. No more rattling of this or that, no shadows, but by now, it is also true that the four of us were sleeping in my waterbed, in the one room that never seemed affected by the haunting, but I noticed everything in the apartment changed and felt cozy again, but by then, I had also decided that tornadoes, large cockroachy looking bugs, and the ghost belt were too much for me, and we packed up and came back north. Interestingly enough, when we returned home to my parents' house, which we later bought, which has never ever felt anything but perfect there, there were three knocks on the bottom half of my bedroom door one afternoon. 
I was alone in the house. Immediately, I felt that was the spirit or something, telling us we made the right choice by not getting the house. My father believed that it was his mother who had lived and died in North Carolina, who knew something bad would happen to my son if we bought that house, especially since it all seemed to stop when we stopped trying to get financing for it and gave up on the house. My son has never been affected by any other ghosty type stuff since then, and he's never fell out of bed again either. Feel free to email me if you choose. Earlier this year, I attended a camp in Rubin County, Georgia. There, I was told the story of Timothy Dalton. The story is that, in the late 1970s, the Daltons lived in a rural area of Harbison County, Georgia. Supposedly, Timothy was about 11 years old, an only child, and his parents didn't really like him. They abused him in every way possible and kept him in the basement due to them not thinking it was worthy of a room upstairs. This wasn't even really a basement, more just like a cellar with one small window that was about two feet in length and a half foot up. Mr. Dalton's wood workshop was down there, so at night, Timothy would work on whatever he could. His father didn't mind him working with his wood, because his father would take whatever Timothy made and sell it without giving Timothy any of the money. Well, one day, Timothy was at home, alone weeding the field, when the postman came. His parents had got off into the next city over to get some supplies for the upcoming fall. Now, Timothy knew that there was such a thing as mail, but since his parents didn't tell him where it came from and neglected to send him to school, he never knew what it honestly looked like. The postman approached Timothy and asked him if his father was around. When Timothy answered no, the postman handed over a package. He had never seen a package before and was informed not to open it, or even shake it. It was his father's, and not his. Timothy went inside the house, and set the package down on the kitchen table. He couldn't stop thinking about it, so he opened it, and made sure that he could seal it again. Around this time, power tools started to come out, and Timothy's father figured that he should have one, since he does work on wood sometimes. Timothy saw that it was a power drill and was in awe. He couldn't wait until that night to start making something. So, for the rest of the day, he just went around and collected logs and sticks so that he could make something. Once he found them, he set them by the window and at night would open it and pull them in. That night, once his parents locked him in the basement, he started the work. He worked and worked for about three hours until he came up with this beautiful rocking chair. He had never seen something this beautiful and never been this happy about something like this. So every night throughout the summer and the fall, he would sit and rock in it until he would fall asleep. Well, a horrible blizzard blew through and it was a horrible sight. All the crops of the city had died and nothing was left of them. So one day, Mr. Dalton told Timothy to go and find firewood for the fireplace since they didn't have electric heating. Timothy knew that all the firewood would be wet, but decided not to fight with his father. After about two hours, Timothy had found some dry pieces to possibly hold them over for the night. So he turned back and started the walk back towards the house. As he approached the end of the woods, he noticed that there was a smoke coming out of the fireplace. He found this very odd and didn't quite know why his father would send him out to find firewood if he already had some. So Timothy walked into the house and as soon as he walked in, he was horrified. He saw his rocking chair, the only thing he had ever been proud of, chopped up in the fireplace burning to little bits. Timothy snapped, that's all to say. He didn't start to yell at his dad or anything. 
he just mentally snapped. So he sat down the firewood and did his chores. Before he was locked down in the basement, he managed to sneak some chicken wire under his shirt. So he took it down to the basement and was locked in there. After about an hour, he knew that his mom and dad had just turned off the light to go to bed. After maybe three hours, he had constructed this power drill into this killing machine. He had found an X-Acto knife and bound it to the power drill so that when he turned the trigger on it, it would spin around and around. So he used some chicken wire to unlock himself and walked up the stairs to his parents' room. He slowly bound his parents' hands and feet to the bedpost and footboard. It took him about an hour just to do this without either of them stirring. So, once that was done, he just stood over his father, staring him dead in the eye with his hand and power drill behind his back. As soon as his father awoke, he started yelling at Timothy, calling him a freak and wondering what he was doing there. So, Timothy didn't do anything just pulled out the power drill and jammed it straight into his father's heart and turned it on. His mother was screaming bloody murder, so he pulled it out of his father and slowly walked around the other side to his mom. She was crying and was in absolute hysterics. Timmy looked over at her, then revved the power drill once and shoved it straight into her neck. He just dropped everything, didn't wash his hands didn't even try to clean up. He didn't care if he was caught. All he cared about was that rocking chair. So he went over to the fireplace and sat down in front of it and stared into it for three days until the police got suspicious and noticed that they hadn't seen them for a while. When they came to the house, they didn't even have to ask any questions. They knew what happened. So they admitted Timothy into the psych ward where he stayed into the late 90s. Now that you know the story, I can get to my experience. It's important to understand that story so you can understand the experience that happened to me. When I was with my camp, our cabin of 20 boys and girls were on a bus headed to Helen to go tubing on the hooch. It was really rainy, so they didn't want us going in the water, so they took us to go bowling in the Habersham County. The night before, we had hiked up Blood Mountain and was told that story, so we were all pretty freaked out. Well, me and my friend Kelly and her boyfriend Jake decided to go walk around the bowling building since a lot of the counselors were already back there. So as we're walking back there, there was an old man with slightly grayish hair standing out there and smoking. We had been informed that if you see anyone outside your camp, that you kindly say hello. Don't say your name and only tell where you're from, camp-wise. The man did what any other person would do and ask us our names. We sat down on a curb that was parallel to him, but the length of a car away from him. We told him that we were from CHH Lake Burton and that we were here with a camp. Well. That still doesn't answer my question, he said. Kelly spoke up. I'm sorry, sir, but we're not allowed to tell you our names. He looked at her and laughed a little. <laughs> well, Kelly, my name is Tim. We're all completely shocked and confused. How do you know our names? I asked. He laughed again and put out his cigarette. Let's just say that I know a lot of things. Harbison is a very quiet town, and as of last night, for you guys, it was a very innocent town too. We were all in shock and awe. How did he know that he knew about the murders? We all got spooked, and Jack led the way back around the building, but every crazy person has some parting words. Just remember this, he said to us, as we all halted the stop. I wouldn't have had to kill him if he just kept his eyes closed. To this day it still haunts me, the wheezing laugh of that man and the wondering of the story. Is it honestly true?
a few weeks ago. My grandparents and I went to a Mormon pioneer cemetery a few miles from where I live to get a picture of an ancestor's gravestone. While driving into the cemetery, I noticed a particularly tall gravestone. As soon as I saw it, I got the chills. Normally, I'm not scared of cemeteries or things like that, at least not in the daytime. As we left the cemetery, my grandmother pointed out the creepy headstone. She said it was her grand aunt's grave, and that this lady had crossed the plains to come to Utah when she was about eight. She later went north to help settle in the town of Richmond, Utah. Then grandma told me the following story. When my aunt Andrea was about 15, she was home alone in the kitchen right after school. She heard a woman's voice and turned around. She saw an elderly lady in a long, old-fashioned style dress with her hair in a bun. Andrea ran out of the house into a neighbor's where she called my grandmother at work. Grandma thought she was trying to get attention, but told her she could stay with the neighbors until she got home from work. The same thing happened twice over the next two weeks. My grandma requested a picture of my great aunt from my great grandmother so she could copy it and hang it up on the mantle. It was lying on the counter the next day when Andrea came home. As soon as she saw the picture, she jumped. She asked grandma who it was, then told her it was the ghost. Andrea never saw the woman again, but says it wasn't scary. More like a lady that wanted to help. I know this one's kind of short, but thanks for reading. I have a story to tell you of a sight which will always be engraved into my mind for life. A friend of mine and I were avid hunters, and we were returning from a duck hunting trip in a place called Dunmurray. We were trying to remain as quiet as possible so that we could catch and hunt as many as those ducks as possible. As time wore on, we weren't able to find too many, but still decided to have a look by the river to check for those elusive ducks. Before we crossed the fields back to the house, we made our way across the M1 motorway at Dunmurray and had our guns loaded as well. It was then when my heart thunderously stopped and noticed something far more terrifying than a simple duck. I put my last shell up the spout and noticed a tall, light tan colored figure to the right of me. It seemed to be about seven feet tall and off of the ground by about two feet and scared the crap out of me. I couldn't speak and I warned my friend to stay away. At the time, my friend was right behind me when I saw the figure but didn't quite understand what I was so terrified about since he didn't see it himself. I told him to start running and running as fast as possible so we could be as far from this mysterious figure. My first instinct was to point my gun at it, but I urged my friend to stay away from this thing. I thought by pointing at it with my gun, I would scare the figure away. Of course now, looking back, it was a ghost so it sounds silly now. We eventually made it out of there without incident and explained to my friend what I saw. He called me crazy, he called me insane, but I swore to him that is exactly what I saw. A seven foot figure floating directly at me from the distance. This happened about 14 years ago and neither of us went hunting at night again. I told a friend of mine the story and he explained that a figure not unlike a monk had been reported on the motorway from as far back as 30 years ago. Huh, <laughs> wish someone could have told me, then I wouldn't be as spooked. My grandparents used to own a home in New Hartford, Connecticut until about five years ago. It was a huge house, mostly built by my gramps and it sat centered on about four and a half acres of land. It was really nice, in the daytime, anyhow. It was a two-story house with a huge attic and a basement as well. 
There were a total of five bedrooms in the main part of the house, and there was a two-bedroom apartment connected to the house. Now, just as a bit of a background, my gram and gramps were some really cool old people. They traveled a lot. In fact, they've been to many different countries. They've been to all 48 continental states, plus Alaska, in their RV. A few years before I was born, they went to Heidi, and they bought this freaky little wooden statue. Ever since I was a little girl, anytime we went up to Connecticut to visit them, I hated that statue. A giant pillowcase used to have to be put over it so that I couldn't see it. One night, when I was about 13, I was sleeping in the bedroom that was converted into my Graham's needlepoint in sewing room. I woke up to go to the potty. A little freaky statue man had the customary pillowcase pulled over him and was standing in his usual corner across the short, squared hall from my room. I went potty and came out. First thing I always did was I had to check and make sure that the little man hadn't moved. I ended up wetting myself when I looked and saw the pillowcase on the floor in the corner where scary statue man was and then looked at the corner by my door and he was there. I was only in the bathroom for two minutes and that statue was way too heavy for anyone to move it and me to not hear it. Everyone else was asleep anyhow. My older brother, the one who would have been sick enough to pull a mean prank like that, was not at my grandparents' home. He was in Bark Homestead with my cousin Sean and my Aunt Joni and Uncle Jim's house. As soon as I saw that Mr. Man was waiting for me by my door, probably waiting for me to walk by so that he could grab me and eat me or something, I immediately took off running down the stairs, which was an incredible feat for me in and of itself. If you've never seen a fat 13-year-old girl run before, and run through the family and living room, through the kitchen, into the foyer, and up two steps to the attached apartment where my mother was sleeping with my little sister Hannah and my baby brother Ryan. The next morning, bright and early, we went upstairs to investigate and where was the statue? Back in the corner it was supposed to be in with the pillowcase pulled over it. Hmm. I've had many encounters with the paranormal since I was about five or six years old, and I've seen ghosts, and I've even heard and seen the presence of demons. I wanted to share two of these experiences with you. People can think what they will, but I take these things very seriously, and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are real and walk among us. First ghost to ever cross my path was that of a woman. I was five at the time and had gone to the kitchen to get a drink while my family was watching a movie on the hydro bed. I was standing there drinking my water when I see in my peripheral vision a woman in a white dress floating down the hall from my aunt's room right into the room occupied by my mother and myself. Being as I was a child, I thought only that this lady didn't belong in our house surfaced in my mind. Well, for some reason, I decided to throw a kitchen knife at it, and you guessed it, the knife went through it. I always believed that she was hiding in my closet as well. There would be numerous instances where I'd be sleeping in my room in the middle of the night. That's when I would hear the closet door and see it open a crack. It was very terrifying, and I didn't know what to do, but to stare in absolute terror. There were more than a few instances where it felt like something was trapped inside there and was trying to claw its way out. So much so in fact, that actually the door was splintered in a few places. My second encounter was with the Phantom Miner. Sounds weird, huh? But let me just say that this was in Sacramento, California, where gold was discovered. Sutter's Mill was about 10 to 15 miles from our house. I saw the specter in our backyard, digging in the ground. He was dressed as a miner, 
would have dressed in the 1840s. He even had a mule with him, loaded down with things. It was at about 10 p.m. at night. I guess he found what he was looking for, because he pulled something out of the ground, put it in a pack, grabbed the mule's reins, and started to walk away. About three seconds later, he had vanished from sight. The thing that was odd to me was that a water pipe that was in the spot where the phantasmal miner was searching at, that very next morning, mysteriously began to leak. Strange series of events, but I'm glad you were able to read them, and I appreciate your readership. Since I was a little girl, my sisters and I had frightening experiences with ghosts. When I was six, my family and I moved to a fairly new house, only eight years old at the time, in West Texas. As far back as I can remember, we had strange things going on in that house. First off, at night, if you were to go through the hallway to get to my parents' room, you would always hear what sounded like a TV. You could hear voices and sometimes music. Most of the time, my parents' TV was off. If you left the room and stood in the hallway again, the sounds would be gone. Secondly, when I would try to go to sleep at night, I would always have that classic someone's watching me feeling. I always blamed it on me, being a young child. The house was a very scary place to be at night. Wherever you went, someone was watching you. Friends who have spent the night rarely stayed twice. The areas of the house that scared everyone the worst were the hallways to my parents' room and my older sister's closet. The closet always had a feeling of hate radiating from it. I tried to spend a night in there with my scared sister and didn't last. I was sleeping on the floor with my head next to the closet and that just wasn't a good feeling. I went back to my room after she fell asleep. A couple years after we moved in, my younger sister had a frightening experience. Her and I shared a bedroom with our beds parallel to each other, with a nightstand in between us. We were about three feet apart. One night, I woke up to her screaming my name. I woke up and asked what was wrong. She told me that, for no reason at all, she woke up and looked over at my bed. Laying at the foot of my bed, she saw a light blue, glowing figure of a woman. Her eyes were gone, and her mouth hung open. My sister described her as looking dead. My sister also added that she couldn't see me anywhere on the bed, so she started screaming my name and closed her eyes. When she opened them, I was awake, asking her what was wrong. She told me, and I looked down at the foot of my bed, and my huge stuffed animal that I had there every night was sparking like it had really bad static electricity. I took it off my bed and threw it in my bathroom sink and ran water over it. Being young, I thought it would help. Years later, my family and I moved to southern Louisiana and moved into a gated subdivision. One night my two sisters were mad at me and left the house to go on a walk. I followed them without them knowing. I followed them up to the front gate of the subdivision and talked to them for a minute. They quickly left in a huff, being that they were still angry with me. For what, I don't remember now. I stayed by the gate for a couple of minutes afterwards and then decided to run to the end of the main street and hide behind some bushes that faced the gate. I waited for my sisters to walk by and when they did, unaware of where I was hiding, they stopped remotely in front of the bushes. I heard my younger sister say, what is Jenny, me, doing, sitting on top of that stop sign? The stop sign is located next to the gate. After that, they walked on. I was a bit confused. It was about to chase after them. But then, through the leaves, I saw a shadow of someone running past the bushes I was behind. I could also hear the sound of footsteps. I stood up quickly to see who was there. No one was in sight. After this, 
I ran to my sisters and told them what I had seen. They then told me that they saw me, or what looked like me, sitting on top of the stop sign. They said I had a very angry, disfiguring grin. After we traded stories, we ran home quickly. Later, my younger sister told me that the ghost she saw in my bed and the ghost she saw on the stop sign both looked exactly like me. Possible doppelganger? I don't know. It all began around the 1st of June, this very year. This incident took place in my grandmother and grandfather's house. My grandfather had been diagnosed with cancer in the summer of 1998, and I didn't know that, that these last few months would be the last time I would ever see him alive. During that period of time, I had spent a whole lot of time with my grandparents, and had felt like I had actually gotten a little closer to them both, but especially my grandfather. At the end of the summer, I left and went back home. Subsequently, about five months later, our family received a disturbing phone call. It was from my grandmother. Unfortunately, she informed us about the passing of our grandfather. He had passed away in the hospital. We went back to our grandmother's home, which was the very last place that our grandfather lived in before his passing, a month and a half after we had been staying there. I noticed that something just didn't feel right. The whole atmosphere had changed. I decided to take the guest room. For some reason, I always got the feeling that I was being watched in the guest room. Then, other little occurrences started to evolve. The very first was, I always felt like somebody was standing over my shoulder. I started to notice scars on my back after I would awake in the mornings, and I would feel light touches on my back. My mom and brother both complained about the door handles being rattled and opening and closing really fast. Cabinet doors would fly open and the pots and pans would all fall out. My hair would get pulled in the night. Objects would fall from midair, such as paper, and I would hear voices, one of which said, wake up, very loudly in my ear. I would see mist and rays of light shoot past me extremely fast, and so fast in fact, I could feel a whoosh of air. I would notice some of my belongings missing, such as my CDs, jewelry, and money to name a few. Usually the belongings that I would use around the house a lot. I would feel my bed move, as if someone were to bump into it during the night, flickering lights, and last, but certainly not least, since animals can sometimes see things that humans cannot see. My cat would turn her head really fast, and just stare at something, which I would not be able to see for a significant amount of time. A little while later, about a month after being there, I saw the unthinkable. After I had sound sleep for about seven hours or so, I woke up suddenly to a spirit at the foot of my bed, and it was my grandfather. I could not believe what I was seeing, but I will describe this to you in full detail. There was no doubt in my mind that this was actually a spirit. He was shadow-like, but his clothing was colored. He would always wave at me, and sure enough, he was waving my direction with a smile on his face. It was plain to see that he was trying to get my attention. He just wanted to see me. I was too afraid to move a muscle, and fear that in spite of everything else, that he would approach me. I had never seen anything like this before in my entire life. I didn't want to tell this to anyone though. I thought that nobody would believe me, or even listen. About a week later, I was in the kitchen with my mom, and she told me that the guest room was where our grandpa had stayed before he died, because he was too ill. And that explains the reason why that very room felt like the most eerie room in the house. I almost fainted whenever I discovered that, but I knew that a spirit can travel anywhere in the home, even outside or in back of the house. But it wasn't until a month later that I decided to come out with the news. I first confided in my mom and brother, and my mother believed me because she said that before I brought up anything that I had said. Our grandmother had experienced the exact same thing, that he was at the foot of the bed watching over her and smiling. I had a phone conversation with her, and I let her do all the talking fast, and everything that she told me measured up with my experience, and 
It only happened to my grandmother and I, whom he was the closest with, before he passed away. Everyone was wondering why I didn't scream or attempt to run out of the guest room as soon as I saw him, but I was too afraid. Whenever you're that close to something like that, it just takes your breath away completely. I was in my own little quad. I felt very uncomfortable. It wasn't until I started sleeping in the living room sofa that I felt appeased. Albeit, this has not been my first experience. Ever since I was the age of five, my family and I started traveling around a lot, and we would move here and there. I've went to nine different schools total. I'm 17 now. In previous homes, I've experienced a whole lot. I lived in a haunted house for a total of three years. Not only by all the experiences that I've endured, I've been doing many researches involving the paranormal. I'm really good at picking up on things too, which I've found out. There was this one house that we went into that we were thinking about purchasing, but I felt like something was wrong. There were many rooms in the home that I could just not stop venturing off into. The main ones were the master bedroom in the study. After I left the house, I told my parents that someone from the house must have passed away. Someone that used to stay in the master bedroom. So, my mom went to go look up the history of the house. And sure enough, the owner and his wife on a trip to California got killed in a car wreck and they lived in the master bedroom and the owner spent most of his time in the study. After I was enlightened with that information, I was in disbelief. I still am, even to this day. My mom told me that it goes back to her being Jewish and Indian. She said that she can pick up on and see things too. She claims that it's an Indian thing, but I don't know, maybe it is. Anyways, God bless everyone and thank you for your time. Great website by the way, I'm a current visitor. Hello, I have a lot of experiences to share. I've been told that I'm more in tune with the spiritual world and that's why a lot of stuff happens to me. Anyways, I'll just share some that I can remember. One night, my friend Amanda was having a sleepover with three other girls and someone brought along a Ouija to play. We were playing and having fun because it was spooky. After that, we went to sleep at about 12 and we slept on a trindle that came out of the couch. We were the only ones in the house because her mom was out. Anyways, I woke up and shook everyone awake because I had a bad feeling and I heard the closet door slamming all night. It was pitch black so I told for my friend to turn on the light. She did, but it blew out. She tried it again, but it blew out once more. I thought bulbs can only blow out once. We were really scared, and we saw this black mass approaching us and closing in on us. We jumped up and all ran out of the house. We were really spooked and didn't go back inside for like two hours. One time, when I was about seven, I'd been staying in my grandparents' house for Easter vacation. I'd got up to sleep in this one room, but for some reason, I didn't like it. Well, one night, I woke up because I felt someone watching me. There's a door that leads to my room, and right next to it is a door that leads to the backyard. I sat up in bed, and right in front of the back door was this figure. It was about six foot, and they appeared to have armor on. I was afraid because I knew it was bad, but I wasn't able to run away because the door to get out of the room was right next to where the spirit was. I just looked at it and it wouldn't let me go. Finally, after like two minutes it faded away and I ran out of the room and refused to sleep in there again. Another time, at my mom's house, I was home alone and I was watching TV in the living room. I heard the bath water running and so I ran to the bathroom to turn it off. I thought it must have been loose or something, so I tightened it. I closed the door and resumed watching TV again. It somehow turned on again, so I tightened it again. This continued on for another four times, and I still didn't know what it was. In my dad's house, an old lady supposedly died there. I never sleep with the light off, 
because I like to be able to see who and what is in my room. Anyways, I always get knocks on my door, even though it's open, and one night, I felt like someone was sitting on my chest while I was sleeping. My older sister seems to get bugged more. Someone tickles her feet, pokes the bottom of her mattress while she's sleeping, and breathes behind her when she's on the computer. In this same house, in my bedroom, I hung this picture about six inches across and three inches wide of this rapper Dr. Dre on my wall. The next day, there were scratches that had torn through the picture, although it was still on the wall. This freaked me out because I was the only one visiting my dad that weekend, and he doesn't have any pets. I put tape over it just to cheaply laminate it and see if she could or would scratch it again. The morning after that, I was surprised to find it scratched again. It freaked me out, but I left the picture there. I don't think she likes rap very much, and I think she and they take and hide things. These may not sound scary, but when they happen to you, it is. I have many more, but I can't remember anyone right now. Thanks for listening, and I'm sorry it was so long. I am not asking for help. I just thought this would be an interesting story for all of us that have experienced things. I live in front of a mountain that is named Sims Mountain. The mountain can take you to various towns in West Virginia. I will tell of all the experiences I have experienced, or some of the ones I have heard, starting with the most famous in my town. Well, an old tale that is common with the locals in my town is the Sims Mountain Ghost. The story takes place when West Virginia was still a part of Virginia. There was a widow living in a cabin with her three children. One day, the children went to pick berries in the woods. When the children did not return that evening, the woman went on a search. For days, the widow continued to search for her children. Well, one night she came home from searching and went to bed. That night, her cabin caught on fire and the woman was burned alive. Now the locals say that in the evening, you can see the woman now in what are fields or huge group of fireflies going in the same direction. It is told that it is the spirit of the woman looking for her children. The story I'm about to tell you takes place three years before I was born. One evening, my brother, sister, mother, father, and grandmother took a ride around the mountain. When they saw a woman dressed in thin clothing and barefoot walking around, a few feet from where they had seen her, my father stopped and got out of the car to offer this woman a ride. She was nowhere to be seen, and there was nowhere to hide. He looked and said that there were no footprints in the light snow that had fallen early that day. He was spooked. My experience is very different. At the end of every summer break, I would have my friends come stay and my father would take us on a night truck ride. We would always leave when we could still see a little. We were in the bed of the truck and joking around when we all got a cold chill. We have looked to see that there were a group of fireflies in the fields. We just laughed and said it was here to snatch one of our new friends who had come along. When we looked again, the fireflies were gone and nothing was there. Later on that night, we had seen another spirit on our way home. We had just passed some woods when a bright light with a dark figure had appeared in the place we had just driven over. It scared us and it followed us until we got off the mountain. My brother and his friend were up four-wheeling one afternoon when they stopped in front of an old cabin that had been there for years. There were no ceilings for floors on the second floor because they had been in there before. My brother's best friend started to head down the path first. While my brother was making sure everything was all right with our ATV, his friend had ran back 
jumped on the back and said, leave now. My brother was shocked. After all, his friend had never been scared by anything. He had asked him what was wrong. His friend just said that he had seen a young pregnant woman looking from the top window. He had told my brother she looked angry and was just yelling, but he could not hear what she had said. Then he had seen that her finger was moving, as if she was telling him to come into the cabin. My brother went and saw the same thing. He had run back to the ATV, where his friend stayed. He jumped on, and they were gone. He has taken many people back to the cabin, including me. None of us had ever seen her. We had just got an eerie feeling. The funny thing is that my brother's friend has never returned back to the cabin. We all now believe that he triggered the spirit. All I can say now is that this mountain has many lost souls, I believe, and they all just have unfinished business. It seems to me that they died before their time and will continue to stay there until they have found their peace. Strange Sights and Sounds Living by the coast, I grew up spending a lot of time on the beach. Summers and holidays zipped by with hours of swimming. One particular Sunday in May, I decided to stay in the sun the entire day, and that earned me a pretty nasty sunburn. Swimming and moving out of the house for the following week was forbidden. Much to my grief, I was under house arrest. The next day, my parents decided to spend the evening by the pool along with some of their friends and took my brother along. I was 13 and my mom thought I was old enough to stay on my own for a few hours. She promised to be back by sunset. I was okay being alone in the house as long as there was daylight. The big sprawling house would turn into a nightmare once dusk turned into night. There was a huge neem tree just outside the kitchen. For some reason, it would instill fear in me. I switched on every possible light downstairs and waited over anxiously for my parents to return home. I walked to kitchen to get a drink of water. It was a sultry summer night, not a hint of breeze. I heard the neem tree shaking violently. I left my drink on the counter and rushed outside. My next door neighbors were out as well, and the street I lived on was empty. Chanting prayers in my head, I walked gingerly to the street light. I slowly turned towards the incinerator. Earlier in the evening, I put out every single mark there was by chucking fistfuls of sand into the grid. A few seconds after staring at the incinerator, it suddenly was a light. The flames danced four feet high. Now, I was really scared. It was close to 8 o'clock. The fire had been put out at 5.30. I stared in disbelief at the fire, watching the flames grow higher and shrink and then grow higher again. I thought the garage wall would turn black by the way the fire kissed the walls. As mysteriously as the fire was started, it disappeared. There was no trace of it. I convinced myself it was my imagination. The prayers did not seem to be working. I tried distracting my mind. I was hoping for some summer breeze, but the night was as still as a church mouse. My eyes stared ahead of me at the entrance of the sprawling mansion I hated. My heart was pounding painfully against my ribcage. My mind was racing faster than a locomotive. I heard the rustling of leaves, as though branches were being shaken rather violently. The night was still not showing any signs of any wisps of wind. I, very reluctantly, turned my head towards the neem tree. The tree was still, but I could still hear the leaves rustling. I turned my head upwards, and I saw a small, 
shadowy figure on the top of the tree, shaking the tree with all its might. The shadow turned my way. By this time, I was so frightened, I didn't know whether I wanted to stay rooted to the spot or run away. My heart felt like it would explode. I had goosebumps all over my body. A chill ran down my spine. At the top of the road, heading towards me, was a pair of headlights. I was going to flag the vehicle down and make whoever was in it get out and wait with me until my parents returned home. The vehicle stopped in front of me. To my utmost relief, it was my father's jeep that had halted. My mother was shocked to see me standing on the road. She walked over to me and noticed I was trembling. I told her what had happened. She was aware of my experiences from the past, and she was sympathetic. The next morning, I rushed to the incinerator to inspect it inch by inch. Equipped with my trusty magnifying glass, I studied the entire grid diligently. There were no marks on the wall. The garbage had been turned to ashes. I spoke to my parents' maids when they came to work. They told me that all the neem trees are owned by gins. I pestered my dad to cut the neem tree down, and finally he agreed after much debating, haggling, and cajoling. That was the end of that experience and the gin. I still don't know for sure what was out there that night, and I probably will never find out. Union Cemetery Spirits Hang Out by Tree This uncomfortable feeling took place in the fall of 2004, when me and a friend took a ride up Route 59 on Sunday afternoon to the intersection of 59 and 136, arriving at the historical Union Cemetery. Now, usually I go to these historical burial grounds in Connecticut to look at the gravestones and absorb all the rich history the state has to offer. But this time, we just went there to see if we could get a thrill being near the Halloween season. Nothing was happening, no ill feelings, no sense of discomfort while walking around the grounds. If you have or have not been there, there is a small dirt parking area just in front of the main gate on Route 136 to the corner of Route 59. You can walk straight into the property and go left towards Route 59 or right towards the church. Straight into the left in the distal part of the property, there are a few trees set along the back edge of the property near the creek that runs along the back to or from behind the small church that is also located within the gated area. One tree in particular that is quite large, I'd say, is surrounded by a few heads scattered headstones. As I looked over in that direction, it looked like a nice place to explore. I commented to my friend, that's where I would hang out. We soon walked into the area and proceeded to walk around the tree. It was shaded with headstones placed strategically around the tree. I don't remember if it was an oak tree or maple. It's the largest tree in the cemetery. After about a minute, we were both bombarded with overwhelming sadness and anxiety that we left immediately and fled for the car. Because we both felt strange, we believed on that day there was a lot of activity in the Union Cemetery. The Legless Man in the Cemetery I came across this website recently, and I figured this could be a good place to tell about my experiences, which I had around 10 years ago. The majority of my family lives in northwestern Minnesota, and I lived in Minneapolis at the time with my immediate family. We would go visit my family up north a couple times each summer and do things like hunting, fishing, going off-roading with ATVs, etc. Oftentimes, 
Me and my cousin would go off-roading on our ATVs in an area west of a town called Thief River Falls. It's mostly farmland, some forest plots, highways, a few farms, and houses along with some gravel roads. One summer evening around 7 p.m., I was out with my cousin on our ATVs, and the radio which we had on his ATV was set to the NOAA weather radio station, which was saying that a severe thunderstorm warning was issued for Pennington County, the county in which we were in, and it was scheduled to arrive in about an hour. Since he lived about 10 miles south of where we currently were at that point, we decided to start making our way back before the storm hit. About five minutes later, we decided to stop right by an old cemetery in church situated about 50 yards ahead of us on the right side of the road to look at the giant cumulimbus cloud that was quickly moving towards us. By this point, the sky started to get a little dark and we could hear the thunder starting to rumble, but we figured we had enough time to kill before the storm arrived. A couple moments after we stopped, I started getting this strange feeling. The best way to describe it was that it was like someone was watching us. In fact, I even checked all around me out of instinct, but there was no one there except for us two, of course. I then heard my cousin fire up his ATV and telling me that we should get going. I started up my ATV and proceeded to follow him, but I still had this strange feeling that I was being watched. As we got closer to the cemetery, I started to slow down because that feeling I was having was getting stronger and stronger. As I passed the cemetery gate, I see a man in his 50s or 60s wearing a white short sleeve button up shirt and a pair of black slacks standing next to a grave looking south, which is the same direction we were headed. However, I quickly noticed that his legs were missing from his knees downward. I immediately hit the brakes as I could not believe what I was seeing. He then turned his head to look at me, and I will never forget that scornful look he had on his face as he stared at me for those few seconds. As he stared at me, I started getting this cold, clammy feeling that one usually gets when scared. After a few seconds, he starts to slowly float towards me, at which point I gunned it and got out of there as quickly as I could. When I checked my rearview mirrors, I didn't see anyone or anything behind me, but I wasn't going to wait around to find out. My cousin noticed I had stopped and was waiting for me about a quarter of a mile up the road from where I had stopped. I lied to him that I had just seen a couple of deer run across the cemetery and was just watching them frolic about. That night, I couldn't sleep because I kept thinking about that legless man. From that point on, whenever I visited, I always made sure to never go by that cemetery again because I'm honest to God afraid that he will follow me home if I go by there again. Cemetery Rescue I had some interesting paranormal experiences growing up in the Las Vegas area. One is kind of funny, and while it may or may not have a paranormal component, I thought it would be a good one to share. When I was 18 in the early 80s, a friend and I had been spending the evening downtown. That meant the Vermont State Area in the early 80s. Walked around, ate some 50-cent shrimp cocktails, played a bit of 21 at the Horseshoe, where it was easier to get away with underage gambling at the time. We'd pretty much had our fill, so we decided for some unknown reason to stop by a cemetery since it was 1 a.m. and likely to be creepy, and we were basically kids doing what kids do. We pulled into an empty and dark parking lot, and I turned off the car engine. We got out and stood by the car. It was a cemetery off of Main Street, I think, and totally quiet. 
There was no traffic on the road adjacent, and not a soul to be seen. As a matter of fact, it was eerily quiet. We stood there, maybe 20 seconds, and both decided we wanted to leave. Now. We jumped back in the car, and I tried to start it, but it wouldn't start. This hadn't happened before. I kept trying, and it wouldn't start, and I think I flooded the engine. So here we were, stuck in a dark cemetery, with nothing around. Back then, nothing was nearby. I was just starting to see how much trouble we were in, when all of a sudden, there was a car next to us. A cop car. It wasn't the typical LVPD car, but something that looked like it belonged in a small town, off the highway, with tumbleweeds blowing around. I didn't even notice it pull up. The cop, who looked more like a sheriff, walked to my door and asked if we needed a ride. We eagerly took him up on his offer. He drove us to my friend's house on 8th Street, and as he turned the corner of the street, he turned us around to us in the back seat, smiled devilishly, and said, Watch this. Your neighbors are going to love it. And he proceeded to turn on his flashing lights and briefly hit his sirens. By that time, it's about two in the morning. The turkey, he laughed, then laughed again as we tried to open the door from the back seat. Finally, he let us out. We thanked him and ran inside. His lights were still flashing in the driveway of the house. I went back for the car the next day, and it started up on the first try. Why did this cop show up right then and appear out of nowhere? Why were his uniform and car so old-fashioned looking? Was he for real, or was he somehow sent to save us? And last... Why the heck did my car pick that moment in time to stop working? I'll never know, but I'm thankful to this day for the rescue. Hey guys, if you could share this video, hit the subscribe button if you're new, and comment below. It really helps the channel grow. Push it into algorithm. Honestly, I'm, I, I, I don't know what to say. If you think I'm hilarious and funny, put it in the comment section below because I'm not really that funny. I'm, I'm just, uh, I feel like my cat is judging me every second I speak to him. So 